If you're interested in learning about blockchain, this is the course for you. Patrick Collins is a veteran software engineer and longtime finance industry developer. Be sure to leave a comment with something you learned from this course. Welcome to the ultimate Solidity Smart Contract and Blockchain Developer Course JavaScript Edition. We recently did a version of this video in Python that has over 2 million views right now, making it the most watched smart contract tutorial on the planet. We've learned a ton from doing that first course. And if you love the Python language, definitely be sure to check that one out. We've taken all the learnings we've got from making that first course, wrapped it up and put it into this JavaScript video for you. If you're looking to get started in Web3, blockchain, smart contracts, or any of these terms, this is the course for you. And it's for anybody and everybody, no matter your experience level in programming or in blockchain. Ideally, you know a little bit of JavaScript before starting this, but if you don't, no worries, we will help you along the way. And in case you do wanna learn a little bit of JavaScript before starting here, there are some fantastic courses on Free Code Camp to learn more, but you absolutely don't have to. And really any experience with any object-oriented programming language will work great. So if you're brand new to coding, or if you're brand new to blockchain, this is exactly where you should be. And if you already know a lot about blockchain or coding, this course will give you even more deep fundamentals on the space. So welcome to the edge of the rabbit hole. So for those of you who don't know, my name is Patrick Collins. I'm a smart contract engineer, developer advocate on the Chainlink protocol, and I live and breathe smart contracts. I also make YouTube videos on my own channel, Medium, Twitter threads, and more, teaching people about smart contracts, about coding, and about this new technology. I love helping developers learn, grow, and learn about this new advent that's blockchain and smart contracts. And I'll be taking you on your journey to becoming a blockchain expert and wizard of the smart contract developing world. And even if you don't wanna become a developer, the first section, our blockchain basics, will give you a lot of fundamental knowledge about how blockchains and smart contracts even work. I am so excited for you to be here and I hope you enjoy the journey. This is a data dump, passion, educational project of everything I've learned working in this space. And I am 100% certain that if you follow along, you'll come out the other side of this armed with the knowledge to be a positive force in this incredible industry. Solidity and smart contract developers are massively in demand with an average salary of being around $145,000 a year. There is massive economic opportunity from learning this course. And this technology has the ability to revolutionize everything that we interact with. And you can be one of the pioneers ushering in this new age. In our courses, we already have a track record of giving people these educational needs and sending them into their careers in the blockchain and smart contract space. And we are going to give you all of the cutting edge tools and how to use them, including working with things like DeFi, NFTs, DAOs, ERC-20s, upgradable smart contracts, and more. We're gonna teach you the skills necessary to build DeFi applications like Aave, Synthetix, and Compound, billion dollar decentralized applications, or massively successful NFT projects like CryptoPunks or Bored Apes, DAOs like MakerDAO or DeveloperDAO, and any of the amazing things you've seen in the cryptocurrency world. In learning these skills, you will have all these economic opportunities at your fingertips and the ability to be a pioneer in completely changing the way we interact with each other in a fundamental way. Building decentralized smart contract applications is building a world that's more accountable, a world with unbreakable promises, a faster, more efficient, financially free world. A collaborative community combining the prowess of philosophy and technology into a new system. We'll learn more about the purpose and the value of smart contracts and decentralized applications in lesson one of this course and why they're so exciting. Finish this course and you'll be ready. So again, I wanna give a major thank you and a major kudos to you because you've taken the first step to enter this realm. So welcome to Web3, welcome to the blockchain, welcome to smart contracts, and I'll see you at the bottom of the rabbit hole. So let's jump into some best practices for this course so that you can learn most effectively and learn with this course as best you can. You do not wanna skip this part. It'll help you solve 80% of your issues. Now, while going through this course, be 100% certain to follow along with the GitHub repository associated with this course. We have a link in the description of this video 
for you to absolutely click on, follow along, have open in a tab as you're doing this because it has all the code samples, timestamps, a community to interact with, and more. It is going to be your Bible for watching this course. And yes, we have a discussions tab. This discussions tab is a place where you can ask questions, engage with other developers who are going through this course as well, get some help, and etc. Be sure to say hello and meet other like-minded individuals like yourselves. Now, blockchain and smart contracts move really quickly and things are constantly being updated. So to make sure you're always up to date with the latest, when I open up some documentation, try to open up the documentation for yourself as well, and maybe even have the code sample next to you. And as you're writing code, be sure to refer back to make sure that you are keeping pace and that you have the most up-to-date samples. Sometimes technology might change and there might be a way to do something a little bit better. So we have this file called chronological updates. Be sure that this is the first place to check when you run into an issue to see if maybe something was updated that you missed. It'll be chronologically ordered so it's easier to find updates. Basically, this is to say, always refer back to the GitHub repo first. And if you do find a mistake or something isn't working the way you expected, jump into the conversation, leave a discussion, leave an issue, ask questions here. Take breaks. I cannot tell you how many people tried rushing through our entire first course in one sitting and didn't retain as much information. Your brain remembers information much better if you take breaks. So every 25 minutes or half an hour, maybe take a five minute walk. And then every two hours, take a much longer break. And if you really wanna make sure something drills in, try to go back and reflect on what you did from the lesson prior before continuing to the next lesson. And at the same time though, learn at your own speed. There is no right speed for this course. If it takes you a day, a week, a month, or even a year, it doesn't matter. Learn at the pace that's right for you. You can change the speed at which I talk using the little gear icon in the YouTube video. If I'm talking way too fast for you, you can slow me down. And at the same time, if I'm talking too slow, you can speed me up. You also don't even have to go in order. You can bounce around topic to topic. If you don't wanna learn full stack, you can skip the full stack stuff. If you don't wanna learn coding, well, you can skip the coding stuff. If you only wanna to go to the advanced stuff, go to the advanced stuff. You are highly encouraged to pause, come back and ask questions. The blockchain and smart contract world is incredibly collaborative. So be sure to use tools like the discussions tab of our GitHub repository, asking questions on Stack Overflow and Ethereum Stack Exchange and tagging relative technologies, making issues on different GitHub repositories that you're working with, jumping into discords, Reddit, Twitter, and any other place that these communities and technologies are congregating. And the reason I'm putting so much emphasis on these community aspects is that becoming a Solidity and blockchain engineer is so much more than just the Solidity part. Being comfortable with all the tools in this space, including the ones to get help and to give help, are essential to being successful here. Networking is massive and it makes it a ton of fun. As you continue your journey and you get more advanced and you're looking for places to meet other developers, hackathons are one of the best places to connect with other engineers. The Chainlink hackathons, ETH Global hackathons, and Devfolio hackathons are three great hackathon suites to connect. And no matter where you are in your journey, they're great places to flex what you've learned. All right, so those are some of the best practices for this course. You're standing at the edge of the rabbit hole, looking down, peering into the world of Web3 and smart contracts and blockchain. If you're like me, once you jump in, you'll want to keep going further. Let's begin our journey into the world of smart contracts. And it all starts with the blockchain basics. Now, I know you're excited to get coding, but before we jump in, we want to learn some of the fundamentals of blockchains and smart contracts. Understanding these ideologies and these basics are so important because it'll dictate how you architect your decentralized applications. Learning the basics of blockchain and Solidity is critical. But if you already know the basics of a blockchain, feel free to jump into lesson two. Now, since you're here, you've probably heard of Bitcoin before. Bitcoin was one of the first protocols to use this revolutionary technology called blockchain. The Bitcoin white paper was created by the pseudo-anonymous Satoshi Nakamoto, and it outlined how Bitcoin could make peer-to-peer -peer transactions in a decentralized network. This network was powered by cryptography and decentrality, and it allowed people to engage in censorship-resistant finance in a decentralized manner. Due to its features, which we'll talk about in a little bit, people took to this as a superior digital store of value, a better store of value over something like 
gold, for example. And that's why you'll also hear people commonly refer to it as a digital gold. Similar to gold, there's a scarce amount or a set amount of Bitcoin available on the planet, only so much that you can buy and sell. You can read more about the original vision in the white paper. We have a link to the white paper in the GitHub repo associated with this course. Now, this was an insane breakthrough. And in a little bit, we're going to learn exactly how this is all possible and how this actually works under the hood. Some people, though, saw this technology and wanted to take it a little bit farther and do even more with this blockchain technology. And a few years later, a man named Vitalik Buterin released a white paper for a new protocol named Ethereum, which used this same blockchain infrastructure with an additional feature. And in 2015, him and a number of other co-founders released the project Ethereum where people could not only make decentralized transactions, but decentralized agreements, decentralized organizations, and all these other ways to interact with each other without a centralized intermediary or centralized governing force. Basically, their idea was to take this thing that made Bitcoin so great and add decentralized agreements to it, or smart contracts. And in fact, technically, these smart contracts weren't even really a new idea. Back in 1994, a man named Nick Zabo had actually originally come up with the idea. Smart contracts are a set of instructions executed in a decentralized autonomous way without the need for a third party or centralized body to run them. And they come to life on these blockchains or these smart contract platforms like Ethereum. And it's these smart contracts that are going to be the core thing that we're going to be working on in this course and that we're going to be developing. You can think of smart contracts in the same way you think of traditional contracts or traditional agreements. They're just a set of instructions between parties, except instead of written on pen and paper or typed up in Microsoft Word, they are written in code and embodied on these decentralized blockchain platforms. And that's also where they're executed instead of being executed by the two parties or three parties or however many parties that are involved. This removes this centralized issue that we'll talk about more in a bit. This is one of the main differentiators between the Ethereum protocol and the Bitcoin protocol. It's these smart contracts. Now, technically, Bitcoin does have smart contracts, but they're intentionally Turing incomplete, which means they don't have all the functionality that a programming language would give them. This was an intentional move by Bitcoin developers. Bitcoin developers viewed Bitcoin as a store of value versus Ethereum developers viewed Ethereum as both a store of value and a utility to facilitate these decentralized agreements. Now, these smart contracts on blockchains alone are absolutely incredible. However, they do come with a huge issue. If we want these digital agreements to replace the agreements in our everyday lives, they probably are going to need data from the real world. Blockchains by themselves actually can't interact with and can't read or listen to data from the real world. This is what's known as the Oracle problem. These blockchains are deterministic systems and they're deterministic on purpose. And we'll learn about more about how that works in the sessions to come. So everything that happens with them happens in their little world. But if they're gonna be these agreements, they need external data and they need external computation. And this is where Oracles come into play. Oracles are any device that delivers data to these decentralized blockchain or runs external computation. However, if we want our applications to stay truly decentralized, we can't work with a single Oracle or a single data provider or a single source that's running these external computations. So we need a decentralized Oracle network similar to our decentralized blockchain network. Your on-chain logic will be decentralized, but you also need your off-chain data and computation to be decentralized. Combining this on-chain decentralized logic with this off-chain decentralized data and decentralized computation gives rise to something called hybrid smart contracts. And most of the biggest protocols that we interact with today are some type of hybrid smart contract or interact with hybrid smart contracts to some extent. This is where the protocol Chainlink comes into play. It is a modular decentralized Oracle network that can both bring external data and external computation into our smart contracts to make sure they're decentralized end to end while giving them the feature richness that we need for our agreements. Chainlink allows for us to get data, do upkeeps, get random numbers, or really customize our smart contracts in any meaningful way. Now, throughout the course, we're going to use the terminology smart contract. However, whenever we say smart contract, we're often using it a little interchangeably with hybrid smart contracts. But just know that when we say hybrid smart contract, we're talking specifically about smart contracts that have some type of off-chain component. Now, since Ethereum's release, a number of different blockchains or smart contract platforms have come to light, such as Avalanche, Polygon, Phantom, Harmony, and more. 
for the majority of this course, we're going to be assuming that we're going to be deploying to the Ethereum network. However, everything that we learn here is going to be applicable to the vast majority of the blockchains out there, like Polygon, Avalanche, Phantom Harmony, etc. And understanding everything from Ethereum fundamentals will give you the skills that you need to switch chains very easily with literally one line of code. So don't worry about learning a specific tool or with a specific chain because most of them work together seamlessly. Now there are a couple of smart contract platforms that don't use Solidity, but still learning the fundamentals here will make you much better at those as well. And Ethereum by far has the most value locked and is the most used blockchain and smart contract platform out there. You'll also hear those two terms used a little bit interchangeably as well. Sometimes I'll say smart contract platform, sometimes I'll say blockchain, they kind of mean the same thing. Obviously blockchains could mean store of value and smart contract platform, but you get the idea. Similarly, Chainlink is the most popular and powerful decentralized Oracle network is the one that we're gonna be focusing on for this course as well. Chainlink is also blockchain agnostic. So it'll work on Ethereum, Avalanche, Polygon, Solana, Terra, or really any other blockchain out there. Now, throughout this course, you'll hear the term DAP or decentralized protocol or smart contract protocol or decentralized application. And they all kind of mean the same thing. A decentralized application is usually the combination of many smart contracts. And when we get into Solidity, you'll see what a singular smart contract really looks like. And like I said, learning all these core fundamentals will make you a better Solidity and a better smart contract developer. You'll also hear the term Web3 a lot in this video and in the industry. Web3 is the idea that blockchains and smart contracts are the next iteration of the web. Web1 being this permissionless open source world with static content. Web2 being the permissioned web with dynamic content, but all the agreements and logic runs off of centralized servers where they control your information. And then Web3 comes back to the permissionless web, but once again with dynamic content. And instead of centralized servers running your logic, decentralized networks run the logic, creating these censorship resistant agreements that these smart contracts enable. It is also generally accompanied by the idea that the users own the protocols that they work with and it's an ownership economy. You'll see what I mean later in this course. Now we've talked a lot about the history and about the high level of these protocols and of these smart contracts and what they can do. But what do these smart contracts really mean? What is it when I say trust minimized agreements or unbreakable promises? What is the real value add of these smart contracts? Before we look under the hood and take a peek at how this all works from a technical standpoint, let's learn what all the value of this is. What is the purpose of us building all these technologies of you taking this course? What problem does this technology solve? In my mind, a technology is really only as good as the problem that it solves. If it doesn't solve a problem, then why bother? Smart contracts, blockchain, Web3, cryptocurrencies, those are all just different words that encapsulate the idea of what we're doing in such a unique paradigm. I think the easiest way to sum up what these smart contracts do is that they create trust minimized agreements. And if you might be scratching your head to that, a much easier way to think about it is just they give rise to unbreakable promises. Yes, you heard that right unbreakable agreements and promises. Additionally, they give rise to speed, efficiency, and transparency, and a number of other things. I made a video pretty recently about exactly this. So let's dive in and take a listen to the purpose, the undeniable value of smart contracts. Cryptocurrencies fundamentally re-landscape markets and agreements as we know them. Unfortunately, you've probably only been bombarded with people screaming about NFTs and money. Now, some of the memes are fun, but let's forget the bullshit and get down to the essence of this space. If you're already in Web3, this is the video to send to your friends to explain why you're so excited about this space and explain why we're here. And then if you're not into crypto, you've come to the right place. And yes, there are fun memes and markets and there's some money stuff and there are all these things. But outside of all that, the purpose of blockchains relates to the age old elementary school unbreakable promise, the pinky swear. Let's get froggy. Nearly everything you do in life is the result of an agreement or a contract. Your chair was the result of an agreement to buy and sell lumber, to assemble and sell the chair to a real tailor on Amazon. Then you made an agreement to buy the chair for $40. The lights in your house are powered by electricity, which is an agreement from you and the electric company. You agree to pay them in return. They'll keep the lights on. The electricity that they generate is agreements between them and engineers who built turbines to generate the electricity. 
with insurance, you agree to pay some amount of money to them every month, and in return, they will do nothing. I, or I mean, I'll, they'll cover your medical bills. Almost everything you do and everything you interact with is the result of some form of agreement or contract in some aspect. Now, agreements and contracts can feel kind of abstract and boring to really grasp onto. So to simplify, we can also refer to them as promises. When you get an oil change, they're promising that they will faithfully change your oil in exchange for money. When you put money in the bank, they promise to keep it safe in exchange for them to use your money to give out loans. When you buy a lottery ticket, the lottery promises to give you a fair chance at winning a ton of money in exchange for you buying the ticket. Whenever you make one of these agreements, in a way, you're asking them to pinky swear to not screw you over and to treat you fairly. But this doesn't always happen. Let's look at a real world example of someone breaking the pinky swear. Back in the 80s and 90s, McDonald's ran a promotion for people to win money by collecting McDonald's Monopoly game cards. The idea was simple. You buy McDonald's and in return you get a chance to win one million dollars. You can imagine McDonald's literally going, hey everybody, I promise if you buy our McFood and McNuggets, we'll give you a fair chance of winning this money. Woo! But they ended up breaking this promise. Instead of having a fair chance of winning, your chance was in fact zero. In the mid 90s, between 13 and 24 million dollars went into the pockets of not people playing the game honestly, but a group of corrupt insiders who had rigged the game. Meaning that when you played the McDonald's Monopoly game, you were buying into a set of lies and promises that were 100% always going to be broken. And the thing is, it doesn't really matter if this was McDonald's fault or not. They were the ones making the promises that they ultimately could not keep. Another way you could think about it is that that's $24 million that they essentially stole from you and I. Now, if this system was deployed on a blockchain with something called a smart contract, it would have been impossible to defraud this $24 million due to smart contracts being immutable, decentralized, and transparent. But I'll get back to that in a minute. In all the agreements and contracts we make, imagine making a pinky swear with a 10 year old and imagining how that agreement would hold up. Hey buddy, could you, could you please keep my money safe? You can play with it if you like, but just, just please have it when I come back. Immediately, you might get that worrying feeling in your chest. Something might go wrong. This 10 year old might lose your money. You might be thinking, how could I trust them? Will they break their promise? And this feeling of, I can't breathe because of untrustworthy situations happens to us all the time. Can I trust this used car salesperson to give me a good car? Can I trust this tag that says machine washable or will it make my shirt shrink? Will my insurance provider break their promise of covering my medical bills when I get hit by a bus? When Patrick promises he'll go on a hike with me, will he actually? Yes, Becca, I, I, I actually will. The issue with our current agreements and contracts is we have to trust the people who are making them to do the right thing. However, often they're actually incentivized to not do the right thing. Insurance doesn't want to pay out money. Sometimes salespeople just want to get the shit off their shelves. And with my girlfriend, I promised to go on a hike, but I hate hikes. Where else has this happened? Now you might be thinking, okay, Patrick, this seems cool, but like, where has this actually affected me? Well, the McDonald's lottery that we just spoke about above, during the Great Depression, with the run of the banks, banks promised to keep our money safe, and that when we went back to go get it, they would actually have the money there. And well and behold, there were times that they didn't have the money there. Just last year, Robinhood painted this amazing picture. Come use our application. We will give you access to the markets. We promise we will give you, a retail investor, a fair chance of interacting with the world of finance. <laughs> Psych. But not this asset, this asset, this asset, or this asset. The 2008 financial crisis, remember that? Shady deals behind closed doors combined with lies about financial product brought the world to its economic knees. How are you f***ing us? Hyperinflation in Zimbabwe, hyperinflation in Brazil. Fair enough. History is a relentless lesson of trustworthy entities being notorious promise breakers. And we finally have a way to fix it with smart contracts. Now, before I jump into smart contracts, a lot of people might be thinking, hey, cool and all. However, we have systems in place to protect against a lot of these things, which is true and which is great. And that is a very helpful step forward. But these systems often break. The ones in 2008 definitely didn't work. The ones with the Robinhood crisis definitely didn't work. And even if these systems apply and you go to court to try to work them out, maybe you're in court for years before you actually see a resolution. And by that time, what you needed the money for is 
long gone. So what is this technology? What is this tool that can fix this fundamental problem in our agreements today? This tool is smart contracts, and this tool is what the blockchain was built for. Now I'm going to give you a quick overview of what a smart contract is. However, I'm leaving some links in the description for more in-depth explanations. But the basics of them is a smart contract is an agreement, a contract, or a set of instructions deployed on a decentralized blockchain. And once the contract or set of instructions is deployed, it cannot be altered. It automatically executes and everyone can see the terms of the agreement. The real basics of it is that the code is executed by a decentralized collective, like a group of people, but a group of people running a certain software. This means that no one person or entity can actually alter any of these agreements or change the terms of the arrangement. In these traditional agreements, whoever owns the contract, whoever owns the execution of the contract can flip a switch and say, eh, we're not gonna do that anymore. In smart contracts, in Web3, in blockchain, you no longer can do that. Typically, these smart contracts are on a decentralized blockchain and used in combination with a decentralized Oracle network to get the real world assets and information. And if these words sound like I'm conjuring up a magic spell, well, again, check the links in the description if you wanna learn more about the technical implications. If you're not a technical person and you're not interested in getting to the nitty gritty, you can kind of think of it like HTTPS. I bet the vast majority of you don't even know what HTTPS stands for, and yet you use it every single day whenever you log onto the internet. So how does this fix the McDonald's monopoly issue? In its traditional form, the lottery was executed behind closed doors. Somebody operated and owned the code and the contracts and the agreements that ran the lottery, and they had the power to alter it, and nobody other than the people internal on the lottery could audit this altering happening. Now, if the code for this lottery was deployed onto a blockchain, every time a hacker attempted to alter it, everyone would be notified. Not only that, but you couldn't even alter it because the terms of a smart contract cannot be altered once deployed. Combine that smart contract with a Chainlink VRF Oracle to get a verifiably random number, and presto, you now have a perfectly decentralized, unalterable agreement that is impossible to hack, commit fraud, or manipulate. We have just saved the public between 13 million and $24 million just by fixing the issue of trust. How does this fix Robinhood? Well, the problem with Robinhood is already fixed, right? Again, the problem is that there's a centralized body that can flip a switch at any time and say, yeah, you can't access these markets anymore. We're breaking our promise of actually giving you access to the markets. This is already fixed with something called decentralized exchanges. And these exist today. One of these exchanges is one called Uniswap. You can swap ERC-20 tokens, which are kind of the equivalent of stocks, but some aren't, some are, it's a little confusing. I won't get into that here either, but it doesn't have that centralized body that can flip a switch and ruin access to the markets. And had these investors been on a decentralized exchange, it would have saved them hundreds of millions of dollars. And it would have prevented fraudulent market manipulation. How does it fix run of the banks? With transparency built in and automated solvency checks, you can build a bank light -like smart contract that has insolvency checks built in that make it impossible to get there. Insolvent means broke as f Any agreement or any history lesson where there was a trust assumption that was broken, smart contracts can be applied to and should be applied to, especially in a time where big money runs, owns, and controls everything. We desperately need to move to a world where some self-interested centralized entity can't flip a switch and ruin people's access to the services that they need. We can move away from a world that is brand-based to a world that is math-based. Right now, if you interact with a service that you don't like or that they break their promise, the only thing you can do is walk down the street to the next service that's gonna make the same set of promises and you have to hope and pray that they're actually gonna keep it. We can move from that to a world where we can just look at the math and say, oh, okay, one plus one equals two. This is what this agreement is going to do for me every single time guaranteed because it's a decentralized autonomous agent has no incentive to be evil and everything is transparent and out in the open. If I'm a big company and if it was better for me for one plus one to equal three, Maybe I would go behind some closed doors and fudge some numbers and come back out and be like, hey, one plus one equals three. But with smart contracts, that's impossible. Doing the right thing is infrastructural. Now, given the choice between two agreements, one where you have to trust a single centralized entity that they're gonna do the right thing for you versus a decentralized, untamperable collective, which one are you gonna choose? I'm picking the one that can't screw me over every single time for every agreement I can apply it to. Now, this technology is relatively new, but we have already seen it re-landscape entire markets and continue to do so. 
the traditional financial world is already getting its lunch eaten by DeFi or decentralized finance. There's already over $200 billion of people's money in these protocols to help have a more fair, more accountable, more transparent financial system. This DeFi movement is one of the main reasons I got into this space because we desperately need to move away from where we are right now and end people's chances for wealth being sucked up by some group that's bending the rules in their favor. And smart contracts are our ticket to that better world. More and more industries are also coming over to smart contracts and blockchain because of all the innovations and because of all the advantages that it has. As we grow and as we get better, we get closer to this vision of having this concept fulfilled. Trust minimized agreements. These smart contracts are minimizing the trust that we need to give other people in order for these agreements to be executed. If trust minimized agreements is too confusing for you, just say unbreakable promises. Now, I gotta be honest with you guys, blockchains and smart contracts and cryptocurrencies can actually do more than just trust minimized agreements. What? They have security benefits, uptime benefits, execution speed benefits, and a whole lot more. But it's a lot easier to just learn about one and learn the other ones later, right? It's kind of like sprinkles on top. So this is why we are here. This is why we're building this future. And this is why we are so excited about it. Whew. Even in just this introduction part, we've learned a ton. So let's do a quick summary of what we've learned so far. Bitcoin was the first protocol to take this blockchain technology into the limelight and take these cryptocurrencies into the mainstream. Bitcoin is a sort of digital gold or a store of value, able to make transactions between users in a decentralized manner. Ethereum and other smart contract platforms take this blockchain technology one step further, enabling people to make smart contracts and decentralized trust minimized agreements. These smart contracts and decentralized applications can access and interact with the real world using something called decentralized Oracle networks. Chainlink is a decentralized network that allows us to build these hybrid smart contracts, which combines our on-chain logic with our off-chain decentralized data and decentralized computation, giving rise to our logic being completely decentralized and our data and external computation being completely decentralized, giving us all the features that traditional agreements and traditional contracts have. Now, these digital currencies like Ethereum and Bitcoin have value even without the smart contract part, having a censorship resistant decentralized store of value is immeasurably powerful in its own right. We have some links in the GitHub repository that'll teach you how this decentralized store of value flips traditional finance on its head. And it's another one of the great reasons for building smart contracts. But again, the easiest way to boil it down is trust minimized agreements or unbreakable promises. But let's also go into some of these other features that smart contracts have over our traditional environment. The first feature, of course, is that they are decentralized and they have no centralized intermediary. The different individuals that run one of these blockchains are known as node operators. And it's the combination of all these thousands of node operators running the same software, running these algorithms, running these smart contracts that make the network decentralized. We'll dive deeper into how that works later. The next feature is transparency and flexibility. In these decentralized networks, since all these individual node operators run this software, everybody can see everything that's happening on chain, meaning there's no shady deals, there's no weird things happening. Anything that's gonna be unfair, people would be able to see and just not use. Everybody has perfect information and has to play by the same rules. Now, additionally, this doesn't mean that there's no privacy. The blockchain is pseudo anonymous, meaning that you aren't necessarily tied to an identity in real life. They also have the feature of speed and efficiency. For those of you who have ever tried to do a bank transfer or send money across seas, you know it sometimes can take two to three weeks when in fact, all these banks are really doing is basic math. They're subtracting money from your balance and adding it to some other balance. Why does it take so long? In the blockchain, all of these transactions happen instantly. Another instance for those in the financial world today know that clearing houses and settlement days can take a long time. In the blockchain, there's no need for any of that because they happen instantly. This obviously is much quicker, but it also makes for much more efficient interactions with each other. Security and immutability. Again, immutable means that it can't be changed. Once a smart contract is deployed, that's it. Whatever is in the code is going to be in the code forever. They cannot be altered or tampered with in any way. This means that the security is much easier. Whereas in a centralized world, somebody can hack into the server, jump into the database and change some numbers. You can't do that in the blockchain world. And since it's decentralized, in order to hack the blockchain, you'd have to take over half of the nodes, as opposed to in the centralized world, 
where you only have to take over one. In the regular world, if your computer and your backup computer go down, all of your data is gone. In the blockchain world, if your computer and your backup computer go down, all your data is safe because it's being run on all these other decentralized nodes. And even if a few hundred nodes or if a few thousand nodes go down, it doesn't matter because as long as one node has a copy of the blockchain, you're good to go. Hacking a blockchain is nearly impossible and leaps and bounds more difficult than hacking a centralized server. Not only that, but this is safer in the asset sense as well. All you need to access your credentials and your information and your assets is your private key, which is basically your password for all of this. And as we've discussed in the video, these smart contracts remove this counterparty risk, remove this centralized intermediary, remove these trust gateways that we have to do in Web2. When we engage with users and individuals, they don't always have our best interests at heart. Smart contracts remove this counterparty risk because once one of these contracts is created, they can't go in and they can't alter it and they can't let greed or ego or anything else get the better of them and alter the terms of the deal. And as we said, this gives rise to these trust minimized agreements or these programmatic unbreakable promises. We move away from brand based agreements to math based agreements. We can look at the cryptography, we can look right at the code and see exactly what something is going to do and how it's going to execute versus having to rely on a human being doing the right thing. With smart contracts and decentralized hybrid smart contracts, doing the right thing is infrastructural. All these pieces boil down to us having the freedom to interact the way we want to interact without having to be afraid that interacting like that is going to screw us over. This trust minimized piece, these unbreakable promises make interactions so much better. In the purely Web2 world, we're constantly bombarded with messages of projects and protocols pushing us to move or act in the direction that makes them more profitable. Versus in the smart contract space, we can see everything transparently and we can even engage and interact and be partially owners of the protocols and the interactions that we decide that we want to be a part of. So smart contracts have been around for a few years now, and what have they generated for? What industries have come about due to these smart contract platforms being around? Well, you've probably heard of some of these and some of these we've already mentioned, but let's give you a quick refresher. DeFi. DeFi stands for decentralized finance, and it gives users the ability to engage with finance and markets without having to go through a centralized intermediary. For example, like we said with Robinhood, you no longer have to trust that Robinhood would continue to give you access to the markets you instead would be able to see in the smart contract, yes, I have access to the markets. Or in the 2008 financial crisis, you never have to trust that these groups and institutions are giving you the correct things on the back end. You can see everything transparently right on the blockchain. You can engage with things like money markets and sophisticated financial products easy, effectively, and securely. At the time of recording, DeFi has around $200 billion in assets under management and is quickly growing. If you're really excited about DeFi, we have a ton of DeFi examples showing you how to build and interact with these protocols in coming lessons. DAOs or decentralized autonomous organizations are another group that we've already mentioned. DAOs are groups that are governed completely decentralized by a set of instructions or smart contracts on chain. There are some massive benefits here where engagement's much easier, the rules are black and white, and you can see everything directly on chain. Voting and governance technology is completely decentralized. And the blockchain space is one of the big ones pushing how we can evolve politics and how we can evolve governance to make it more efficient, fair, and reasonable. And you better know it, we have some examples of how to build DAOs and how to work with DAOs in coming lessons. So be sure to watch those. NFTs stand for non-fungible tokens and can really be kind of described as digital art or just a unique asset. They can do so much more, but we'll keep it high level for now. Projects like Bored Apes and CryptoPunks have revolutionized the way that People get paid for their work, show off their creativity, status, and so much more. And yes, of course, we have lessons showing you how to create and interact with NFTs as well. So many other groups and so many other industries are being created as a result of this insane technology. And maybe after finishing the journey with us here, you go out and you'll be the one to pioneer the next industry or the next billion dollar idea. You've learned so much already. But now that we've learned a lot of this high level information, Let's finally jump in and let's make your first transaction and let's get you set up to interact with this new world. In this next section, we're going to get you a wallet and we're going to show you exactly what a transaction looks like and feels like. Let's dive in.
This is the Ethereum website, ethereum.org. We are going to make a transaction on a test Ethereum blockchain. I'll explain what that means in a little bit. This is gonna be our first transaction that's made on the blockchain. Now, again, this process that we're gonna follow is gonna work the exact same with Polygon, Avalanche, Phantom, and all these other EVM compatible blockchains. I'll explain what that means in a bit too. For now, just follow along and have fun. In order to make a transaction on any of these blockchains, the first thing that we need to do is we need to set up a wallet. So I'm gonna go ahead and go to MetaMask because it's one of the most popular wallets and one of the easiest to use. We're gonna go ahead and download it. I'm using the Brave browser, but it works for Chrome, Firefox, or really any other browsers. And it's just gonna be a little extension in the top right hand of your browser. This way we can really easily see at any times what we have in our wallet. This will store all of our Ethereum based currencies. So I'm gonna go ahead and install MetaMask for Brave. Add to Brave, add extension. And now we can go ahead and get started with working with Brave. This is the first step you absolutely need to take when starting your journey and one of the easiest steps to take. So we're gonna go ahead and get started and we're gonna create a brand new wallet. So we're gonna go ahead and hit create wallet. If you already have a wallet, you can actually import it via I have a seed phrase and we'll talk about this seed phrase or secret phrase in a little bit. So let's go ahead and create a new wallet. And sure, we'll agree to help out MetaMask. Now we will create our password, make sure that this is really secure. For the purpose of this demo, my passwords are just gonna be password, but please don't have that be your password. You may also get a video like this, teaching you about your secret recovery phrase. This is the same thing as your mnemonic, but secret recovery phrase is a lot more clear as to what it is. And again, they give us a ton of different tips on how to actually store it and keep it safe. The main takeaway from this is never share this. Absolutely never share this. So we're gonna go ahead and click reveal secret words. I'm showing you guys here because uh, this is just a demo and I don't really care. However, if you show this secret phrase to anybody else, they will have access to all the funds in your application. So everything that we're gonna do in this tutorial, we're gonna use fake money, we're gonna use not real money, so it doesn't matter. Now for the purposes of testing and developing, I always recommend using a completely separate MetaMask, a completely separate wallet. So for going throughout this entire course, if you already have a wallet or if you already have a MetaMask, please just set up a new one, create a new profile, create a new MetaMask, and this will be your wallet that you use for the duration of this course. However, if you're gonna actually put money in here, you absolutely need to have this written down because if you lose access to this and or your private keys, which we'll talk about in a little bit, you will lose access to your wallet and you will lose access to all your funds. So they give some tips like store this phrase in a password manager, like one password, write this phrase down on a piece of paper, put it in a secure uh, location, memorize it, Whatever you wanna do, just make sure you have this backed up somewhere. I'm just gonna go ahead and hit download this for now. It's not best practice to save it to your computer. It is much better to use a password manager or write it down on a piece of paper or something. So we're gonna go ahead and hit next. And it's gonna ask us to verify that we actually have it written down. And we're gonna go ahead and hit confirm and great. And it gives us a couple other tips. Remember, definitely take these tips very seriously, especially if you're gonna use this for real money. Like I said, for this demo, we're just gonna use test money, so it's not as big of a deal, but if you put real money in, you absolutely need to back up this seed phrase or secret phrase, or we're going to refer to it as our mnemonic phrase. Awesome, now we can see the interface of our wallet here full screened. And depending on your browser, you can actually come up and pin it to your browser so that you can just click it up in the top right and it'll drop down and you can see the same interface here. Our mnemonic phrase, that secret phrase, those that secret 12 words that they gave us have given us access to a new account. The address of our account is located right here. In fact, if we click it and copy it to our clipboard and go to a tool called a block explorer called Etherscan, we can actually paste our address in here and see details about our account. Etherscan, like I said, is what's known as a block explorer. And it's a way to view different addresses, transactions, and other happenings that happen with a blockchain. If we look at this address that we just created on Etherscan for Ethereum mainnet, we can see no transactions have happened. There's really no analytics. There's no comments. There's no balance. There's no value because it's a brand new wallet. And this address that we just punched into Etherscan 
represents our unique address, our unique wallet, only identifiable for us. We'll talk about Etherscan a little bit more in a bit because it's a tool that we're gonna use quite often. In wallets like MetaMask, you can actually even click right here and create even more accounts. So let's go ahead and create a new account. We'll call this account two. As you can see, this one has a different address. So if we click this one, we go back to Etherscan, we paste the address in here, we hit enter, we can see another address, again, that's uniquely identifiable to us right here. It has zero balance, no value, no transactions. Now, if we go back to our MetaMask and we click the little button, we can see we have two different accounts in here. It's the same if we hit the extension in the top right. We click the button, we have two different accounts. The 12 word secret recovery phrase allows us to create multiple accounts all with the same secret recovery phrase. So that secret recovery phrase will give us access to both account one and account two and any other accounts that we create by hitting this create account button because it gives you access to all the accounts in your MetaMask. Now, these addresses of both of our accounts are the public unique identifiers, but they also have a private unique identifier only identifiable to us. Similar to the mnemonic, these are private identifiers we never want to share and we never want to give out. They're private. This is known as your account's private key. So the mnemonic will give you access over many of these accounts. The private key will give you access to just one of these accounts. We can see it by hitting these little three dots, going to account details and export private key. You'll just have to punch in your password here and you'll be able to see your private key. This is going to be your private key for your account. You can think of your private key as a password for your account that lets you create transactions. Now, the reason that I'm showing mine on screen is because I'm not gonna put any real money in here and this is just gonna be a burner account for this tutorial. And I highly recommend, once again, you use a burner account. You use accounts that you never put any real money into. And along the way, I'll show you how to make sure that you don't do that. But normally, it's not a good idea to show or share your private keys or your secret recovery phrase. If somebody gets a hold of this private key, they will have access to my account one. However, they won't have access to my account two. If they get a hold of my 12 word recovery phrase or mnemonic, they'll have access to both accounts. And this is why when people say, keep your private keys safe, your keys, your Bitcoin, your keys, your Ethereum, they're talking about both your mnemonics or your secret recovery phrases and your private keys. Keep those private. Your public addresses are totally public and anybody can view your accounts on something like Etherscan or any other Explorer. And it's totally okay for people to share their public addresses. If you lose your private key, you lose access to one of your accounts. If you lose your mnemonic, you could potentially lose access to all your accounts. Uh, basically, what I'm trying to say is back these up and keep them in safe places. For this course, it's okay if you lose one since we're not putting any real money in them, but in the real world, be sure to do this. And great, those are some of the main security considerations here. Now, if you look up in the top right, right next to that account button that we've been clicking, you also see this thing saying Ethereum mainnet. This is our networks tab. And if we click it, we can see a list of all the different networks that we currently have access to. Ethereum mainnet is the main network of Ethereum. And this is where real money is spent and used for transactions. For this course, we're not gonna be working with Ethereum mainnet. We're instead gonna be working with something called a testnet. Since we're engineers, oftentimes we're gonna want to test and see what our code is actually gonna do and how to interact with it. We're gonna use a combination of local networks and test networks to actually do this, to actually test our smart contracts. We're mainly gonna use local networks, but we'll get to that in a little bit. To see some of the test networks that come default with MetaMask, we hit show slash hide test networks. This will bring us into the settings page and we just hit select this to show test networks in the list and we just hit on. Now, if we scroll back up, We'll close out of the settings. We hit the networks tab again. Now we can see all of these other networks here, like Robston, Coven, Rinkaby, and Gorelli. These test networks are networks that resemble Ethereum or Polygon or Avalanche or Phantom or any of these other blockchains. And we can actually switch our accounts to one of these other test networks. Let's click Rinkby, for example. 
we can see that on the RinkB test network, we also have zero Ethereum. We have no money or nothing in here. We have a blank RinkB wallet. These test nets work nearly identical to how Ethereum mainnet works, except for they run with not real money. They run with fake money as a way for us to learn and interact and see how these different smart contracts actually work together. At the time of filming, RinkB is one of the most popular test networks, along with Coven. So we're gonna work a lot with RinkB in this tutorial. However, be absolutely sure to check our GitHub repository to make sure that you're always up to date with the best test network for following along with the tutorial here. Since they're test networks, people are running them out of the goodness of their hearts. And sometimes the best ones actually change. So, so be sure to follow along with the GitHub repository. We might also use Coven from time to time, or maybe even Gorilla. So we're gonna show you how to use a couple of these different test nets. In fact, if we go to the GitHub repo associated with this course, we can see recommended testnet is indeed currently RinkB. So that's what we're gonna work with. Should this change, you should be able to follow along with another testnet and we'll leave notes as to how to continue. Now, what we can do actually is we can go to RinkB Etherscan. So we can go to, we can look up RinkB Etherscan and it looks like it's the first thing that shows up. RinkB.etherscan.io. We can punch in this same address, copy it, paste it, and we can see some of the details of this address on the RinkB Etherscan. Like I said, right now it's totally blank. This network's interface later on is also how we're gonna be able to work with Polygon, Avalanche, et cetera. We'll just have to add networks, but we'll get to that in a bit. And just to reiterate, test nets are free and for testing our smart contracts and mainnet networks cost money and are considered live. Now, I also do wanna put a caveat here that we do want to keep in mind that these test nets are being run at the goodness of people's hearts. So we don't want to abuse them. We want to use them to learn and then move on. So try not to send a billion transactions on one of these test nets. In fact, what we're going to do right now is we're going to send a transaction on the RinkB test net. And this will show us exactly what it would look like on a main network. In order for us to simulate one of these transactions, we're going to go to what's called a faucet. And if you go to the GitHub repository associated with this course, right underneath the recommended testnet is gonna be a testnet faucets, which is gonna show us where the most up-to-date faucet location is for us getting testnet Ethereum. So here we are at faucets.chain.link, which again is the recommended faucet. And what we can do is we can actually put our wallet address in and get some testnet link or testnet Ethereum. Now, what we are gonna to have to do is we are gonna to have to connect our wallet to the RinkB network. So we're gonna come down, we're gonna switch from Coven to Ethereum RinkB, and then we're gonna make sure our MetaMask is on the RinkB test network here. Once both of those are set up, we're gonna go ahead and hit Connect Wallet, and we're gonna choose MetaMask. Once we do that, our MetaMask is actually gonna pop up and say, would you like to connect to this website? Connecting to a website is how we give these websites an interface to interact with our wallets and interact with our MetaMasks. Don't worry, we're not sending any transactions like this. We'll get to that in a bit. So we just, we can pick an account we wanna connect. Let's choose our account one, we'll hit next, and then we'll go ahead and connect. Now that we're connected, we can actually see our account connected up here and that little warning is now gone and our wallet address is automatically placed into here. We're gonna make our first test transaction. And for now, we don't need test link, so we're gonna leave that off. But later on, we're gonna come back and get that test link. For now, we're just gonna need 0.1 test Ethereum. So let's go ahead and complete the security by choosing the traffic lights. And we're gonna hit send request. What this is gonna do is we're asking this faucet to send us 0.1 test Ethereum. Testnet faucets are ways for us to get money into our wallets on a testnet. And this is why this testnet Ethereum isn't worth any actual money, since we can get it for free. These don't exist on mainnets. You can't get real Ethereum or real money for free on a main network. So we're on RinkB, we're getting fake RinkB Ethereum, and we're gonna go ahead and hit send request. Once we hit send request, this transaction hash is gonna pop up here and it says transactions have been initiated waiting for confirmation. This means that some other wallet is actually gonna send us 0.1 test ETH 
And this is the transaction that it's doing to do that. Now we just have to wait for our transaction to finish verifying and finish going through. So now if this doesn't work right away, I would recommend wait a minute and then just try it again. But what we can do is we can click this transaction hash. If that transaction doesn't show up, we can also just close this and we can copy our address here. And actually we already see 0.1 ETH in our wallets here, but we can go back over to rink B ether scan, paste our address in, and we can see that we now have 0.1 ether as a balance. We can also see that we have a transaction with all this information going into our wallet. That's what this green in is for. If you click that transaction link, you'd get something like this. But if you didn't, don't worry because on the ether scan, if you click the transaction hash in the transaction list, you can also see all the details like that. So now in our MetaMask, we have 0.1 ETH. Again, this is fake Ethereum, and we have a transaction associated with our wallet now, which is awesome. Again, though, if we switch networks, if we switch networks back to Ethereum mainnet, you can see that we have nothing on Ethereum mainnet. Or if we go to Robston, we also have nothing. We only have this 0.1 ETH on the Rinkby test network. If you want to practice working with another test net and the faucet that we're using has multiple test nets, let's go ahead and try it. Doing this section right now is completely optional. You can watch or you can follow along. But for example, I can see in my wallet that we already have Coven supported. So maybe I'll switch to Coven. Maybe we'll switch to Coven in the drop down here. We'll remove test Ted link because we only need test ETH. We'll hit I am not a robot and we'll send request and the same things will pop up. This time, this is going to be for the Coven testnet. And once our transaction finishes going through, now, same thing on Coven here, like what we did with Rinkby, once our transaction finishes going through, we'll see 0.1 test ETH on the Coven network. If you want to go ahead and try working with another one of the test nets, like maybe for example, Coven, I recommend you go ahead and giving it a try, but it's completely optional. And I would always refer back to the GitHub repo to make sure you're working with the most up-to-date faucet and testnet. And if we look back at Etherscan, we can actually see more details on what actually just took place. What actually just happened? How did our MetaMask get a balance of 0.1 ETH all of a sudden? Well, if we look down in the transaction section, we can see that there's a transaction here. Some address sent us 0.1 Ether. And if we click the transaction hash, we can see more details about what actually went down with this transaction. Now, understanding what's going on in this transaction is essential to learning and being a smart contract developer or just engaging with the ecosystem. So let's learn. The first bit at the top is this transaction hash. This is a unique identifier for this blockchain or this testnet that identifies this exact transaction. This transaction hash identifies sending 0.1 ETH to our address. We can see that the status of this transaction was successful. It didn't break in any case. We can see the block number that this transaction was included in, and we'll get to blocks in a little bit. We can see the timestamp, which of course is when this transaction occurred. We can see which account it was from, which if we go ahead and open in a new tab, we can see that this is the account that this transaction came from. And it's got 3 million ether. Of course, this is fake Rinkby ether, so it doesn't really matter. We can also see who it was to, which again is just us. This is our wallet address, 0x1066, blah, 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 0x1066, blah, 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 right? The value of this transaction, of course, is 0.1 ether. Now, what's all this that we see past the value. So obviously the value is 0.1 because that's how much we sent. But we see this transaction fee and this gas price. We hover over the tooltip. We can see if you zoom in on your Etherscan, we see amount paid to the miner for processing the transaction. And we see a gas price, which is cost per unit of gas specified for the transaction in Ether and GUE. The higher the gas price, the higher the chance of getting included in the block. Now, if we scroll down even more and we click see more, we can also see a ton of other information here. For now, we're just gonna click to see less and just focus on these two. I'll explain all of these in a later session. Let's talk about just the concept of transaction fees and gas for a second. Remember how I said the blockchain is run by all these different nodes? Well, all those different nodes are running this blockchain 
because they actually get paid for all the transactions that happen on these blockchains. Whenever you make a transaction, there's a node or a miner or, or a validator. Somebody running the blockchain software is gonna get paid a tiny bit of Ethereum or Polygon or whatever blockchain that you're running on, they're gonna get paid a tiny bit of that native blockchain currency. This payment is obviously to incentivize people to continue to run nodes. And they calculate how much you pay and how much the node operators get paid based off of how much gas you use. So there's this concept of gas. Gas is a unit of computational measure. The more computation a transaction uses, the more gas you'd have to pay for. For example, we do hit click more just really quickly. We can see this section saying gas limit and gas usage by transaction. There was a limit of 60,000 units of gas on this transaction and 21,000 were actually used. So this transaction used 21 units of gas. Now for very simple things like sending ether, the units of gas are usually pretty cheap. But maybe for more complex things like, like minting an NFT, depositing to some DeFi contract, etc., maybe those will cost more gas because they'll be more computationally expensive. If this is a little confusing right now, don't worry too much about it. But just know that we use 21,000 gas here. And if we pull out the calculator, 21,000 gas times this gas price right here, times the gas price, we get the exact same as we see for the transaction fee. So gas price times how much gas you used is the transaction fee. So whoever sent us this 0.1 ether also paid 0.0000525, et cetera, rink the ether to make this transaction. Now, each blockchain has a different way of actually calculating how this gas stuff works. So that's basically gonna be the high level of it. So we're gonna focus just here for now. There's a total transaction fee, and then there's obviously the gas price. After we cover how blockchain works, I'll explain what this burnt stuff is, these gas fees and all these other stuff. For now, just know that anytime you make a transaction on chain, you have to pay a little bit of what I call transaction gas. So for example, if we go to our MetaMask, we have two accounts right here. We have account one with 0.1 ring ETH and account two with zero ring ETH. If I were to send 0.05 ring ETH from this account to my other account, how much ring ETH do you think I'd have left? Well, let's go ahead and try it. This will be the first transaction that you're actually creating that you are going to spend the gas for. So if we go ahead and hit send, we'll hit transfer between my accounts. Account two, we'll do 0 0.05. Next, we can see some information here about what's actually going on. MetaMask has some new advanced gas fee UI and settings. We're also gonna turn this on. So go ahead and click that, enable enhanced gas UI, turn that on, and then go back. And again, this is gonna be the experimental tab, but it could also just be in the general settings tab, depending on when you actually run this. We can see a little notification here. Again, this depends on what version of MetaMask you're using. And we, we get this little drop down that says, here are some of the different type of gas fees that you can actually pay. The reason that gas fees might change, as you can see here, is that depending on how busy the blockchain is, you have to pay more gas. If a lot of people are sending transactions, that means there's not gonna be enough space for everyone's transaction to get through. That's a bit of an oversimplification of what's happening, but don't worry too much about it for now. Now, if we wanna send this 0.05 ether to our second account, we can see this gas estimated section, which is saying it's estimating we're gonna pay 0.00004792 gas, in addition to sending the 0.5 ETH. So at the bottom, we have amount plus gas fee, and this is gonna be the total amount that we're gonna be spending on this transaction. 0.05 is what we're sending, and then we also have this gas piece. So we go ahead and confirm. We now see we have a transaction pending in our Rinkby Ether scan. And if we click on it, we can even hit View on Block Explorer, and a Rinkby transaction hash will pop up. And depending on when you click it, it might say indexing. This means that Etherscan has received your transaction and is trying to place it. If you don't see anything here, it means that maybe the transaction hasn't gone through yet. Maybe you need to wait a little bit more, or maybe you need to go back to the GitHub repo and pick the recommended testnet and faucet. So you might have to wait a minute or so for this to actually finish indexing. After a minute or so, we can see that this transaction has indeed passed, and we can see a lot of the same information that we saw on our last one. 
this time with 0.05 ether. And now if we look in our MetaMask, we'll see, we can see account one has 0.05. It's rounding up a little bit. If we click on the big button, we can see it actually has 0.049953, et cetera. And our other account, account two, does have exactly 0.05. This is because we spent a little bit of Ethereum on gas to send this transaction. And now with just this little bit of information, you know how to actually interact with applications that use the blockchain, how to send transactions and a lot of the non-technical details. Now here's something that's incredibly exciting. With just this little bit of information, you now know how to interact with blockchains and interact with the Ethereum protocol. So if you don't wanna learn how to code anything, you can go and you can start interacting with Ethereum and interacting with protocols with just this much information. However, I know most of you guys are here to learn how to code. So let's look under the hood of Ethereum and what is actually going on with these transactions and with these gas and with these blockchains and what's really going on. Let's learn all the fundamentals of a blockchain. Now, if you wanna just go ahead and jump into the coding, go ahead and grab a timestamp from the description. However, learning exactly how the blockchain works is gonna make you an incredibly powerful developer. So let's take a look at that first. So we're gonna be going through this blockchain demo on this site right here. Now, the creator of the site has a fantastic video and a fantastic walkthrough, Blockchain 101, it is right on their site. So if you're looking for another explanation, definitely check out his video, it is absolutely fantastic. But the first thing that we really need to do in order to understand blockchain, in order to understand really anything and everything that's going on here, we first really need to understand this SHA-256 hash or hashing just kind of in general. Let's first understand what a hash is. A hash is a unique fixed length string meant to identify any piece of data. They are created by putting some piece of data into a hash function. In this example, uh, the hashing algorithm used is SHA-256. Now, Ethereum actually uses uh, this, uh, this right here for its hashing algorithm, which isn't quite um, SHA-256, but is in kind of this SHA family. But it's, it's really just another way to hash things. And uh, the specific hash algorithm doesn't matter uh, so much. So uh, this example uses SHA-256, but you can imagine it's the same as the Ethereum hash. They're just going to you know, result in a different hash. So what's going to happen in this application here is whatever data or whatever information we put into this data section here, as you can see below, this hash changes. So what's happening is this data is running through the SHA-256 hash algorithm and it's outputting this unique hash. So this hash is a unique fixed length string that's going to identify like a blank data piece here, right? So if I put in, you know, my name, like, you know, Patrick Collins, this is the hash that's going to represent Patrick Collins, right? And you can see, even when I put, you know, tons and tons of data in here, the length of the string doesn't change, right? So it's always going to be the same amount. We can put almost any amount of data in here, there is an upper limit on the max size of the data. But for all intents and purposes, we can pretty much put any length in here. And you'll see too that you know, every time I type in Patrick Collins, this hash is always gonna be this 7E5B, right? I'm gonna delete it, I'm gonna do Patrick Collins again, you know, 7E5B. It's always this, this unique hash is always going to be unique, right? It's always gonna be this fixed length string here. So now we can take this idea, right, of putting this data in here, and we can move on to uh, this concept of a block. So with this block concept, we're going to take the exact same thing with this hash, this, this data section, right? But instead of having everything just being this, this singular data area right here, we're going to split this data up into block, nonce, and data. So, all, so what we're going to do is we're actually going to hash all three of these to get, to get this hash, right? We're going to put all three of these. We're going to say all three of these are combined. Uh, together, we're going to put every all three of them into this hashing algorithm uh, to figure it out. So if I type a bunch of stuff here, we can see that block one with nonce, you know, this nonce and this data, we're going to get this hash. And as you can see, actually, the screen turns red, this block turned red. Now, what happens when I hit this mind button? When I hit this mind button, it's actually going to take some time. It's going to think for a little bit. And we can see that the nonce here actually changed. Right, the nonce is different from what it was before, and this hash now starts with four zeros. Okay, and then it, it, the, the back turned green. When we're, when we're talking about mining, we're talking about miners solving some type of very difficult problem that takes a lot of time to do. Now, in this example here, 
the problem that uh, the miners had to solve was they had to find a nunce or, or a value in this nunce section that when hashed with at block number one with this data, it would start with four zeros. So the problem here the miners had to solve was to start with four zeros. And the only way for them to really do that is kind of this brute force, you know, trying stuff. So they tried one, okay, one didn't work. Okay, two, nope, two didn't work. Three, no, nope, four, or five, six, okay, five. Well, that started with one zero, but that's not four. And they have to keep trying all these numbers until they uh, get to this one where, you know, let's hit mine again, where it has four zeros at the top, at the start. Now, this specific problem changes blockchain to blockchain, right? Ethereum has a, a different problem for miners to solve. Um, Bitcoin has different problems for miners to solve, but this concept is going to be the same. So they have to take it, um, one block is going to be this, this, uh, this concept is going to be all this data. It's going to be the block number and it's going to be this nunce, right? And so this nunce is the solution um, is, is going to be the, the number that they use to get like the solution to the problem, right? So if I go to one, here, you know, when I do this again, I'm gonna hit mine. And the nonce has changed, right? It went from one to 33,128, because this is the nonce that allowed this hash to start with four zeros. And so that's what's happening when uh, blockchain miners are mining, they're going through this process, this very computationally intensive process of trying to find a nonce that fulfills whatever the problem is. So that's really it actually. So that's a block and, and that's really what's happening when miners are mining. They're just looking, there's trial and error, brute force trying to find this nut. So, so now that we know what a block is, let's go to the next step and figure out, okay, well, what's a block chain? So here we have an example of what a block chain is gonna look like, right? We have a combination, you know, we have back here in the block section, we have one, what one block looks like. Now here we have multiple different blocks, right? Each one of these represents a different block, but we have an additional column here, or we have additional uh, variable here. So like before, you know, we have block, nonce, and data, right? We have block, nonce, data, but we also have this thing called previous, right? And so this is actually gonna be pointing to the previous hash of the last block. So for example, if we go to the, the last block in this blockchain, it says previous is 0008E8, and if we look at the hash of block number four, it's 0000AE8, and then we look at its previous, it's uh, four zeros B9, we have four zeros B9 and so on, all the way back to our first block, which has previous of just all zeros, right? And so the block with the previous of all zeros is going to be known as the Genesis block. So you've probably heard that before, the Genesis block, it's the first block in the blockchain where the previous hash points to a hash that uh, doesn't actually exist. Now, as you can imagine, kind of the same as how this block worked, how the block, nunce, and data all go through the hashing algorithm. In the blockchain, the block, nunce, data, and previous hash all go through this hashing algorithm to figure out, you know, what the hash is, okay? So if we go to over here, you know, for example, if I type in, you know, Patrick, obviously this is now no longer valid, right? Because this nunce uh, combined with the block, the data, and the previous hash aren't going to solve, you know, our problem of having four zeros at the, at the start, right? So I'm going to go ahead and fix that. And, and that's that's kind of an easy way to, to see it being broken. But, but let's take a look. If I break this block right here, what happens if I if I break the data in here? If I do like Patrick in here, you can see that both of these are now red. Both of these are now invalid, right? Because the block hashed with the nunce, hashed with the new data, which is my name Patrick, hashed with the, pre hashed with the previous block, is now a brand new hash, right? And this block is still pointing to this previous hash right here, right? Is pointing to this previous block, and now it is wrong and it is messed up, and now um, and now its nonce with this previous hash is also wrong, right? And this is where when we talk about uh, blockchains being immutable, this is exactly how it's immutable, right? Because if I go back and I change anything, you know, if I just typed A right here. The entire blockchain is now invalidated because none of these are going to have uh, nunces that solve this equation anymore. So this is why blockchains are immutable is because anytime you change one thing, you ruin the rest of the blockchain. Okay. So however, though, you know, if, if an A was here originally, we can go ahead and mine these, we can mine all these, but as you can see, you know, this is going to start getting very uh, computationally expensive because I have to go redo uh, basically the entire blockchain 
Uh, and the farther and farther down the line you get, the harder and harder it becomes to, you know, rehash and, and redo all these different blockchains here. Now, this makes a lot of sense, right? So we have this blockchain, it's really hard to change something in the past. But if we do, we can just go ahead and remine it. Now, if I'm the one who controls the blockchain, right, if I'm the one who controls this, you know, and, and I want to change something in the past, well, okay, great, all I got to do is change this data here. And then, you know, mine each one of these, you know, obviously, it's going to be very computationally expensive, but it's something that I can do, right, if I'm the one who owns the blockchain. Now, here's where the decentralized nature or the distributed nature really uh, makes it incredibly powerful. So we're going to go to the distributed tab here, which uh, I also refer to as the decentralized tab here. Uh, and it's going to show us what a blockchain looks like uh, in a decentralized manner. So we have this exact same uh, initial setup here. We have distributed blockchain. We have you know the, our first blockchain, which is kind of exactly as the one from here. But we also have more than one. So we have peer A, peer B, and peer C. And when people are talking about peer-to-peer, peer-to-peer -peer, peer -peer transactions, they're really talking, uh, this is kind of that concept that they're talking about, right? So we have a number of different peers who are running this blockchain technology. They're all weighted equally, right? Each one of these peers or each one of these nodes, each one of these entities running a blockchain has the exact same power as anybody else, right? So the way that we can tell very easily which blockchain is correct or which ones are correct are by looking at this end hash here, right? Or by looking at where we are uh, in the blockchain. Because again, remember, because again, remember this this hash that this this in this last block here is going to encompass all of the blocks from before, right? Because this last hash is going to have the previous hash here, which includes the previous hash here, which this hash includes the previous hash here, and which so this last hash is encompasses everything in here, right? And we can look. We can look at the hash of peer C, which is four zeros and then E four B. We can look at the latest hash of peer B, which is four zeros E four B, and then peer A, which is four zeros E four B. So all of these peers, all of these nodes, all of these decentralized, you know, these independent, um, all these independent users running this blockchain software, they're all matched up. It's very easy for their nodes to look at each other and say, hey, great, we are all matched up. Now, what, let's say that A decides that, you know, something happened on the blockchain that they didn't like, and they wanted to go back and change something, right? So let's say they change here, you know, obviously, uh, the rest of their blockchain is invalidated, and they have to spend a lot of computational power to catch up to speed. So let's go ahead and humor it. Let's say that they they did, they ended up catching up. Uh, they ended up catching up, you know, they ended up mining everything. And now they have a valid blockchain, right? It solves the equation. Awesome. However, in block number three, there's something new, right? This is here, and it shouldn't have been here. This is something that peer A put in by themselves. All that happens now is we look at all the blockchains that are running the software, and we're looking at all the hashes at hash at block number five. So peer A has this new hash now, 0009BC, but peer B has a different hash, 000E4B, right? So who's right? Is it is it peer A with their new stuff or is it peer B? Well, that's where the decentralized nature comes in because then we can look at peer C and peer C also has E4B. So peer B and peer C both say, hey, peer A, you're wrong, get out, right? And peer A will stop being able to participate in the mining rewards because they have essentially forked uh, the blockchain and started their own little blockchain, right? With their own history because they're the only ones with this, this piece of data in block three whereas peer B and peer C have nothing in there. So that really shows why uh, in these blockchain worlds, in this decentralized world, there really is no centralized entity. You know, peer A, you know, might have been maliciously motivated to change, you know, this, this block number three. However, democracy rules, right? The majority rules in the blockchain. Peer B and peer C both say, hey, you know, that, that's cute and all peer A, but you're wrong, right? That, that's not right. Now, it might be a little abstract to just look at data and, you know, us typing kind of random stuff in here and think, okay, yeah, that's that's data, right? That makes sense. You know, it, just kind of random strings in here doesn't really do anything for us. So if we actually go over to the token section here, this is where everything really starts to make a lot of sense. So we have the exact same setup here uh, with peer A, peer B, peer C, except the difference is instead of having kind of this, this data section, we have this uh, TX, this transaction section, right? And this represents all the transactions that are happening in this block, right? So we're, we're sending $25 from Darcy 
to Bingle or to Bingley, uh, for uh, four dollars and twenty seven cents here, uh, nineteen twenty two, right? And it's the exact same thing. So this, all these transactions are going to get hashed in the exact same way uh, that the data is going to get hashed. And and this is why it's so powerful because again, you know, if I want to be malicious, right? If uh, if I want to say, hey, I, I really wanted to give Jane a lot more money from Elizabeth, so I'm pure A, and I go back and I change it to 100. Well, now, you know, not only do I does my whole blockchain uh, get invalidated because that was so far uh, so long ago, but I'm not going to match any of these other chains, right? And so my blockchain is going to be excluded from the overall blockchain. So and let's let's go ahead and fix this. And it's the same thing. If down here, if I, I become malicious and I want to send, you know, I want uh, Miss Audrey to have less money, maybe I want to send a dollar, and I go ahead and mine it, the same thing here, this hash now, this 2A1 is not going to match peer B's, peer B's hash of BBA, and it's not going to match peer C's hash of BBA as well. So the two of them are going to say, hey, this, your blockchain is invalid, it's not matching the majority, you know, you're out, right? So that's really how uh, these blockchains work at a low level. And it all goes back to this, this understanding this hash idea, and using it in this very sophisticated manner, uh, to kind of cryptographically prove, um, you know, where where stuff lies. Now, the way the blockchain works is that instead of random stuff put in this data section, it's actually going to be solidity code in here, defining ways to interact with different blocks and different protocols that are on chain, or, as we've said before, different smart contracts. Now, the next question that you might be asking is, okay, well, how do I know, how can I be sure that I'm the one, uh, you know, let's say this is, let's say I'm Darcy, right? How can I be sure that I was, that Darcy was the one to actually send this money here? How do we know that Darcy sent $25 to uh, Bingley? Well, this is where we get into uh, private keys and public keys, and that's what we're going to go into now. Let's just do a quick recap of what we've learned in this section so far, right? We've learned that Ethereum actually runs on this Ketchak 256, but you know we used SHA-256 for this demo. It doesn't really matter. We're just talking about hashing algorithms. So again, a hash is a unique fixed length string meant to identify any piece of data. A hash algorithm or a hash function is a function or algorithm that computes any type of data into a unique hash. Mining is going to be the process of finding the solution to the blockchain problem. In our example, the problem was finding a hash that starts with four zeros. Nodes get paid for mining different blocks, and the problem is going to be different blockchain to blockchain. A block in a blockchain is basically a combination of a block, nonce, transaction, and a previous hash to create this unique hash for this block. And again, depending on the blockchain implementation, this might have a couple other fields or might have different fields, but this is essentially what's going on. Blockchains are decentralized and distributed because many independent users are going to run this blockchain software and they will check and they will compare against each other to see which blockchains are acting honestly and which ones are acting maliciously. In the blockchain world, majority rules. The nonce here is the answer used or the number used to get this hash. Now, nonce is kind of an overloaded term. It's actually used for a number of different reasons. In this case, we're using it to solve this problem of getting, you know, four or five zeros at the stop of the hash. However, in Ethereum, it'll also be often used as the number of transactions from a given address. So now we're going to talk a little bit about signing these transactions and, and private keys and, and some other cryptography pieces, right? Because in this blockchain demo here, we can see we have all these, these fantastic transactions, right? All these things went through. But how do we know that it was Darcy who was the one to send $25 uh, to Bingley, right? How do we know that actually happened? And this is where all those pieces that we just learned about uh, in our, our test net, in our MetaMask account, are really going to start to to come to life here a little bit here. So here we have an example of public and private keys, okay? At the top, we have this private key, right, that was that was randomly generated. Uh, a private key is, is you know, as it kind of states, is a key that you really want to keep secret because you're going to be using this uh, as kind of your, your secret password for all your transactions, right? I can really pick, you know, any 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 private key, anything that I want. And with it, uh, this algorithm, uh, they're going to use an algorithm, you know, for Ethereum and Bitcoin, they both use this elliptic curve, 
digital signature uh, algorithm. It's it's a variant of just a, a digital signature algorithm, and it's going to create this this public key, right? I'm really not going to go at all into kind of this digital signature algorithm, but just know it, it does use some of these uh, some of the hash uh, knowledge that we just learned combined with some other pieces uh, to kind of get this this public key here. So I'm not going to go too deep into it, but we have this private key that we create, and we get this public key. Now this public key we want everybody to have access to, right? This is, yeah, whole world can see this, this private key, we really want it to be uh, private. We don't want people to see this. We're going to use this private key as like a password to quote unquote, digitally sign transactions. And then people can verify them with this public key. So let's let's see what this actually looks like. Let's pick a, a random key, a more secure key, right? Because the longer it is, the, the more secure it's going to be. And if we go to signatures now, Right. Um, let's say we have this uh, this message that we want. Right. We say "Hi world." Right. We want this to be the message. What's going to happen is this private key that we've created. We can use to sign this data. Right. Remember how in the blockchain demo, you know, we were kind of we were hashing stuff. Right. We were we we're using this SHA two fifty six hash to to get this hash. Well, we're doing something similar, but instead of hashing, we're we're using this digital signature algorithm to create this message signature. Now, what's really powerful about how this, uh, this algorithm works, is that you can create this message signature with your private key, but somebody else can't derive your private key from the message signature. And that's what makes this really, really powerful. However, if we go to verify using this public key, right? Uh, and so this is the, this is that 0403, this is that same public key, using this, uh, using this public key, Anybody can verify, oh, let's go ahead and sign it again. Anybody can verify that this signature is yours, right? So you have a public, a private key just for you. So you can sign things and a public key so that anybody can verify something, right? So anybody can verify this. And let's say somebody tries to fake a transaction from you. They say, hey, you know, this is, this is, this is their transaction. Um, all they have to do is verify that this signature against your uh, public key and very easily this whole thing turns red because uh, it isn't verified right the the algorithm says hey uh -uh, that's wrong so we can go ahead and take that into transactions in this exact same way so if i want to send money you know if i want to send four hundred dollars from you know my address to another address using my private key i can sign that transaction and anybody else in the world can then verify this transaction, right? And this is why when people say, hide your keys, you know, protect your keys, this is what we're talking about. In our accounts here, right? If we go to uh, settings, and again, the only reason that I'm showing you guys my mnemonic and my private key is because this is a, uh, this is a, a dumpster account, I'm gonna throw this away at the end of this video, or I'm just not gonna put any real money in it. Um, but, when we look at our, our, our MetaMask here, we have this mnemonic phrase, which allows us to easily get these different private keys, right? So uh, mnemonic phrase combined uh, with, you know, uh, whatever account number will get us a private key. So mnemonic phrase combined with one, we're gonna get this private key. And this is when we look at account details, export private key. Password confirm. This is gonna be the private key that we're going to use to sign our transactions, right? This, if anybody else gets access to this private key, they then can sign transactions for us and they can send transactions for us. And that's why we want to keep these private. So uh, they, it works the exact same way, right? And if, so this is why it's so important to hide your private keys and hide your mnemonics. Now, your Ethereum address is actually uh, a piece, uh, is actually a piece of your public key. Now to get our address in Ethereum, all we have to do is take this public key that we've created with our private key, hash it using that same Ethereum hashing algorithm, and then take the last 20 bytes. And that's how we'll actually derive to our, um, to our address here. Now knowing the exact methodology of how to get the address doesn't really matter because it could change blockchain to blockchain and could even change in ETH2, um, but just know that that is essentially how kind of these addresses are derived, right? There's some derivative of the public key, right? Because the public key is public. And you know, uh, using the public key in kind of any public way is, is totally fine, um, but not the private key.
So that is how we sign our transactions. Note though, this isn't how we send the transaction. So, so this is just going to assign it, create a transaction for us to send. Uh, we'll learn later on how to send these transactions. Whew, so that was a lot of information there too. Let's do a quick recap. Your public key is derived by using a digital signature algorithm on your private key, right? And you want to keep your private key private at all times because you're going to use your private key to sign transactions. Signing transactions with your private key, you are the only one who can actually do this because you can't get the private key from a message signature. However, using your public key, you can anybody can very easily verify that a signature that's signed by you is in fact signed by you. In our MetaMask, our private keys are located in this account details section. You just hit uh, show private keys and type in your password and you'll get your, your private key here. A quick note here is oftentimes when using your private key somewhere, they want it in hexadecimal form. So if we're going to use our private key um, for something like Brownie, which we'll go into later, we need to actually append in a zero X to the front, but we'll get into that later. And the address of your account is derived from this. So if you think about it, your private key creates your public key, which then can create your address. And there's a little barrier here, or a big barrier here. Because your private key you want to keep private and your public key and your address can all be public information. Now that we know a little bit more about what's going on underneath the hood of these blockchains, let's go back at our transactions and look at this gas thing again. And we'll look to see what's actually happening here. Gas in particular can be a little bit tricky to wrap your head around. So if you don't get it right away, don't worry. As we go through examples, it'll start to make more sense. So before I was saying, let's just look at this transaction fee bit, which is the cost associated with running this transaction. If I scroll over this on Etherscan, I can see this thing that says block base fee per gas plus max priority fee per gas times the gas use, which might be a little bit confusing here. Let's actually break down what's going on on Ethereum with EIP 1559 in place. And again, this is going to be specific to Ethereum as every blockchain might do it a little bit differently. But if we click to see more, we can see a number of useful values here. We can see gas limit is 21,000 and usage is 21,000. So this transaction used 21,000 gas and we sent 21,000 gas along with it. Sometimes when sending a transaction, depending on when it's sent and depending on what the specific instructions are, it might actually use way more gas than what you want it to use. So with your transactions, you can actually set a limit. Hey, I don't want to use more than X amount of gas. I don't want to do more than X computational units. And in fact, if we go to our MetaMask and we click send to transfer between accounts again, and we pick, you know, 0 0.01 ETH or something. Next, we can actually hit this little button here, go to advanced, and we can actually edit some specifics of this transaction. One of them is going to be the gas limit. We can change this gas limit to maybe 2200, 2300, or more or even less. Since sending Ethereum takes exactly 21,000 gas, MetaMask just defaults to setting it to that. But we also see these other interesting things. We see a priority fee and a max base fee. Let's reject this transaction and let's look back at Etherscan to talk about these. So currently in Ethereum, according to e EIP1559, every transaction on Ethereum comes with something called the base fee. This is the minimum gas price you need to set to include your transaction. And you'll notice that these are priced in something called GUI. So what is a GUI? If we come to the site ethconverter.com, and again, there's a link to this in the GitHub repository, we scroll down, we can see GUI, GUI, and Ether. If I put one Ether in here, I can see how much one Ether is in terms of GUI and in terms of way. One Ether is equal to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine zeros. So that's that's one billion GUE is going to be one ether. And then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, and then eighteen zeros is a way. These are just easier ways of referring to really, really small amounts of Ethereum. So if we look at our gas fees, we see that the base fee is 0 0.0000004 GUI. And this obviously would be an even smaller number if this was in units of way. So if we take this number and we put it into our calculator, we can see that this is equal to 40 way 
or 0 0.00000, a whole bunch of zeros for Ether. The max fee here refers to the maximum gas fee that we're willing to pay for this transaction. And you can actually see that our max fee is a little bit higher than what we actually ended up paying. Our max fee was 2.21322 something something, and the gas price we actually paid was up here. Now your transaction might, of course, be a little bit different. Then additionally, we have a max priority fee. This is gonna be the max gas fee that we're willing to pay, plus the max tip that we're willing to give to miners. Now currently in Ethereum, this base fee ends up getting burnt. And we can see on Etherscan exactly how much is getting burnt here. And if we pull up our calculator again, we can grab this gas fee, multiply it by the amount of gas we used, and we can see that this is indeed how much Ethereum we actually ended up burning. We go back to Ethereum converter, paste it in, we can see that these two numbers are indeed equal. This means whenever you send a transaction, a little bit of Ethereum is removed from circulation forever, or it's considered burnt. So currently in Ethereum, part of your Ethereum, part of your transaction fee actually gets burnt, and then the other part goes directly to miners. So to figure out exactly how much went to miners, we could do this number minus the burnt amount, and this is how much Ethereum was paid to an Ethereum miner for this transaction. You'll see down here, transaction type two, EIP-1559. This is the EIP-1559 version of these transactions. Like I said, every blockchain is gonna have a different fee burning and, and fee and gas process, and they're all gonna be a little bit different. But the sum of it is, blockchains have limited block space for transactions. The gas price that costs for your transaction to be included in one of these blocks changes based off how much demand there is. The base gas fee for Ethereum will go up and down depending on how many people are sending transactions and how many people want to be included in a block. If a ton of people want to be included in a block, that means a ton of gas is obviously going to get burnt. We've left a link to a video in the GitHub repository with this section from this YouTuber who does an amazing job breaking down this EIP-1559 and more about how this gas model actually works. I highly recommend you pause this video and watch that video to understand more. The base fee gets programmatically, algorithmically adjusted to try to target for all the blocks to be 50% full. If they're more than 50% full, this base fee automatically goes up. If they're less than 50% full, this base fee goes down. Now, this is a lot of the basics of how this transaction works, and it can be a little confusing. So let's do a quick refresher of everything in here. There's a unique transaction hash that uniquely identifies this transaction on this blockchain. We can see the status. We can see the block number that it's confirmed on. One other thing we wanna look at, if we scroll up, we see block number and block confirmations. This is how many blocks have been mined since this block was included. Like we saw with our blockchain demo, the longer the blockchain gets, the harder it is to tamper with and the more secure it is. Typically, you'll see some processes say they'll only do something after 20 block confirmations, 30 block confirmations, or, or et cetera. The reason that they wait for these block confirmations is because they wanna make sure that that transaction is actually included. And we can actually see the block that our transaction was included in and all the other transactions with it, different details about how much gas was used, the gas limit, et cetera. Timestamp is when the transaction happened. We can see from and to, we can see the value, and then we can see the transaction fee, which we see right here is block base fee per gas, plus the max priority fee per gas times the gas used, and we see all the details of the gas down here. Gas price is the cost of one unit of gas, Gas limit is the max amount of units of gas that we're willing to pay in this transaction. The usage is how many actually got used. The base fee is gonna be the base network fee per gas, so 40 way per one gas used. The max gas is the max gas price we're willing to pay. And max priority is gonna be the max gas price plus the tip that we give to miners. And then we can see how much is burnt. And then we see transaction savings, which which is the difference between how much was actually used or paid for and then returned. So for example, in this transaction, the gas price we ended up picking was a little less than our max gas price here. So the gas price we ended up using was a little less than our max priority fee here. So we had some savings compared to that. 
We can also see that this was an EIP 1559 transaction. We can see our nunce here, which was nunce zero because the transaction that I'm showing is our first nunce. And then of course we can see the input data. For transactions that are just sending Ethereum, the input data is gonna be blank. But you'll see that when we get to smart contracts, the input data is not gonna be blank and it's gonna be one of the most important features of these transactions. You'll also notice that there's a state tab. This is an advanced tab and it shows the different states that are changed based off of this transaction. We're gonna ignore this one for now. Now that we know how the blockchain itself works under the hood, let's talk about some blockchain fundamentals. And we actually covered all these topics in a previous Free Code Camp video. So let's go to that. If the first time you listen to this, some of these concepts seem a little bit hard to grasp, don't worry about it. As we continue and as we move on with this course, they'll start to make more sense when you see them used in real examples. I definitely would recommend going back and re-watching and re-listening to the parts that you don't quite get and asking questions in the discussions tab of the GitHub repository. Awesome, so now that we know all the cryptography pieces and all the little nitty gritties of how the blockchain actually works and how our signatures work and how everything sticks together, let's talk a little bit about how this works in actuality and what's really going on. Now for a lot of this, each different blockchain has slightly different algorithms and slightly different metrics and criteria for doing a lot of this stuff. So when we're talking about these specific implementations, keep in mind the exact algorithm might be a little bit different, but the concepts are all still gonna be exactly the same. Hashing and a hash function is gonna be the same no matter where you look. A decentralized blockchain is gonna be the same no matter where you look. How it's actually implemented is gonna be a little bit different. Now, traditionally, when you run an application, you know, be it a website or something that connects to some server, you are interacting with a centralized entity. And unlike how we saw with the blockchain with multiple different peers, it's going to be run by a single centralized group. Now, it still could be run on many different servers, but all those servers are still gonna be controlled by the same centralized group. Blockchains, as we saw, run on a network of different independent nodes. When we saw peer A, peer B, peer C, those were different examples of different independent users running the blockchain technology on their own node. Now, when I use the term node, I'm usually referring to a single instance of a decentralized system. So when I say a single node, when I'm talking about a blockchain, I'm talking about one of those peer A's, peer B's, peer C's running that blockchain software. I'm talking about one server running this technology. And again, it's this network, it's this combination of these nodes interacting with each other that creates this entire blockchain. What makes these so potent too, is that anybody can join the network and that's why there's decentralized. The barrier to entry is a little bit of hardware requirements, you getting the correct materials to run the software and then you running the software. Anybody can join these networks and participate and that's what makes it truly decentralized. In fact, you can go to GitHub right now and run your own Ethereum node in a few seconds. Now in the traditional world, applications are run by centralized entities. And if that entity goes down, or is maliciously bribed or decides that they wanna shut off, they just can't because they're the ones that control everything. Blockchains by contrast don't have this problem. If one node or one entity that runs several nodes goes down, since there are so many other independent nodes running that it doesn't matter, the blockchain and the system will persist so long as there is at least one node always running. And luckily for us, most of the most popular chains like Bitcoin and Ethereum have thousands and thousands of nodes. And as we showed in our demo, if one node acts maliciously, all the other nodes will ignore that node and kick that out or, or even punish it in some systems because they can easily check everybody else's node and see, mm, okay, this one is out of sync with the majority. And yes, majority rules when it comes to the blockchain. Each blockchain keeps a full list of every transaction and interaction that's happened on that blockchain. And we saw if a node tries to act maliciously, then all their hashes are gonna be way out of whack and they're not gonna match everybody else. This gives blockchains this incredibly potent immutability trait where nothing can be changed or corrupted. So in essence, we can think of a blockchain as a decentralized database. And with Ethereum, it has an extra additional feature where it also can do computation in a decentralized manner. Now let's talk consensus, proof of work, and proof of stake because you've probably heard these before and they're really important to how these blockchains actually work. When we went through that blockchain example and we did that mining feature, this is what's known as proof of work. Proof of work and proof of stake 
fall under this umbrella of consensus. And consensus is a really important topic when it comes to blockchains. Consensus is defined as the mechanism used to reach an agreement on the state or a single value on the blockchain, especially in a decentralized system. I briefly alluded to this consensus mechanism in our blockchain example when I said, if one changes something and the other two don't, then majority will rule and kick that one out. This is part of that consensus mechanism. Now, very roughly, a consensus protocol in a blockchain or decentralized system can be broken down into two pieces, a chain selection algorithm and a civil resistance mechanism. That mining piece that we were doing, or, or the proof of work algorithm, is what's known as a civil resistance mechanism. And this is what Ethereum and Bitcoin currently use. Please note that depending on when you're watching this, if ETH2 is out, then it's no longer proof of work. Now, proof of work is known as a civil resistance mechanism because it defines a way to figure out who is the block author? Which node is going to be the node who did the work to find that mine and be the author of that block so all the other nodes can verify that it's accurate? Civil resistance is a blockchain's ability to defend against users creating a large number of pseudo-anonymous identities to gain a disproportionately advantageous influence over said system. And in layman's terms, it's basically a way for a blockchain to defend against somebody making a bunch of fake blockchains so that they can get more and more rewards. Now, there are two types of civil resistance mechanisms that we're going to talk about here, namely proof of work and proof of stake. Let's talk about proof of work a little bit more in depth first. In proof of work, this is civil resistant because a single node has to go through a very computationally expensive uh, process called mining, which we demonstrated earlier, to figure out the answer to the blockchain's riddle of finding that correct nonce or or whatever the blockchain system has in place. In proof of work, this works because no matter how many pseudo anonymous accounts you make, each one still has to undergo this very computationally expensive activity of finding the answer to the proof of work problem or the proof of work riddle, which again, in our demonstration, it was finding a nonce with that first four zeros. But again, each blockchain might change the riddle or, or change the problem to be a little bit different. In fact, some of these blockchains make this riddle intentionally hard or intentionally easy to change what's called the block time. The block time is how long it takes between blocks being published. And it's proportional to how hard these algorithms are. So these problems actually can change depending on how long they want the block time to be. If a system wants the block time to be very, very long, they just make the problem very, very hard. If they want it to be very short, they make the problem a lot easier. We'll talk about Sybil attacks in a little bit and how they can affect the system. But with proof of work, it's a verifiable way to figure out who the block author is and be civil resistant. Now, you need to combine this with a chain selection rule, create this consensus. Now, there are some consensus protocols that have more features, but very, very roughly, these are the two pieces that we're going to look at. The second piece is going to be a chain selection rule. How do we know which blockchain is actually the real blockchain and the true blockchain? Now, on Bitcoin and Ethereum, they both use a form of consensus called Nakamoto consensus. And this is a combination of proof of work and longest chain rule. The decentralized network decides that whichever blockchain has the longest chain or the most number of blocks on it is going to be the chain that they use. This makes a lot of sense because every additional block that a chain is behind, it's going to take more and more computation for it to come up. That's why when we saw in our transaction, we actually saw confirmations. The number of confirmations is the number of additional blocks added on after our transaction went through in a block. So if we see confirmations as two, it means that the block that our transaction was in has two blocks ahead of it in the longest chain. Now, I do want to point out that a lot of people use proof of work as a consensus protocol. And I do want to say that this is a little bit inaccurate, but sometimes people use it interchangeably. Proof of work is a piece of the overall consensus protocol, which in Bitcoin and Ethereum 1's current case is Nakamoto consensus. Nakamoto consensus is a combination of proof of work and this longest chain rule, both equally and very, very important. Now, proof of work also tells us where these transaction fees and these block rewards go to. Remember how when we made this transaction, we had to talk about gas and a transaction fee. So who's getting paid? Who is getting this transaction? And this transaction fee is going to the miners or the validators. In a proof of work network, they're called miners. And in the proof of stake network, they're called validators there are a little bit different. And we'll get into that when we talk about proof of stake. In this proof of work system, all these nodes are competing against each other to find the answer to the blockchain riddle. Remember, in our example, it was to find a hash that has four zeros at the start. And again, depending on the blockchain implementation, that riddle is going to be a little bit different. 
but all the nodes are trying as many as possible to try to get this answer first. Why? Because the first node to figure out the answer to the blockchain rule is going to get that transaction fee. They're going to get paid from that. Now, when a node gets paid, they actually get paid in two different ways. One is going to be with a transaction fee, and another piece is going to be the block reward. Remember how we talked about alternating the gas price or the GUI on our transaction? Well, that's the transaction fee that we're going to pay to these blockchain nodes for including our transaction. The block reward is given to these nodes from the protocol, from the blockchain itself. You've probably heard of the Bitcoin halving before. The halving is referring to this block reward getting cut in half, and it's supposed to be cut in half roughly every four years. This block reward increases the circulating amount of whatever cryptocurrency that is being rewarded. For example, on Ethereum, the block reward is giving out Ethereum, and on Bitcoin, the block reward is giving out Bitcoin. So these nodes are competing against each other to be the first one to find this transaction, to be the first one to find the answer to this problem so that they can be the ones to win both this block reward and your transaction fee. Some blockchains, like Bitcoin for example, have a set time when they're no longer going to give out block rewards and the miners or the nodes are only going to get paid from transaction fees. Now this gas fee, again, is paid by whoever initialized the transaction. When we got our funds from the faucet, there was some server and somebody else was paying the transaction fee for us. However, when we sent Ether from one account to another, our first account actually paid some transaction fee to send that Ether. In proof of stake, there's also a gas fee, but it's paid out to validators instead of miners. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Now let's talk about two types of attacks that can happen in these blockchain worlds. Let's talk about the first one being the Sybil attack. The Sybil attack is when a user creates a whole bunch of pseudo anonymous accounts to try to influence a network. Now, obviously on Bitcoin and Ethereum, this is really, really difficult because the user needs to do all this work in proof of work or have a ton of collateral in proof of stake, which again, we'll talk about in a bit. The other more prevalent attack is what's known as a 51% attack. Now, as we saw as part of our consensus protocol, these blockchains are going to agree that the longest chain is the one that they're going to go with, so long as it matches up with 51% of the rest of the network. This means that if you have the longest chain and you have more than 51% of the rest of the network, you can do what's called a fork in the network and bring the network onto your now longest chain. Now, Sybil attacks obviously are when a single node or a single entity tries to affect the decentrality of the network by pretending to be multiple different people, although they're just the same person or entity. And like I said, it's really difficult to do in proof of work and proof of stake. So you can see now that blockchains are very democratic. Whichever blockchain has the most buy-in and is the longest is the blockchain that the whole system is going to corroborate. When nodes produce a new block and add it to the longest chain, the other nodes will follow this longest chain that the rest of the network is agreeing with, add those blocks to their chain, and follow up. So very small reorganizations are actually pretty common when a blockchain picks a block from a different longest chain, puts it on, and then has to swap it out for another block and, and continue with a different blockchain. However, if a group of nodes had enough nodes or enough power, they could essentially be 51% of the network and influence the network in whatever direction that they wanted. This is what's known as a 51% attack, and it's happened on blockchains like Ethereum Classic, which is not Ethereum. This is why the bigger a blockchain is, the more decentralized and the more secure it becomes. So after you watch this video and you become a blockchain engineering expert, I definitely recommend you run a node as well because you are going to increase the security of the network as a whole by running a node. So proof of work is fantastic because it allows us to very easily protect against these Sybil attacks and keep our blockchains decentralized and secure. However, it has some drawbacks as well. Proof of work costs a lot of electricity because every single node is running as fast as they can to win this race to get the rewards. This leads to obviously an environmental impact. Now, since proof of work and Nakamoto consensus, a lot of other protocols have taken this idea and gone in a different direction with a different civil resistance protocol. A lot of them with the intention to be a lot more environmentally friendly. And the most popular one right now is proof of stake. There are some chains that are already using this proof of stake protocol and that are live and thriving. Some of them are like Avalanche Solana, Polygon, Polkadot, and Terra. And additionally, Ethereum has decided to upgrade to ETH2, which will have this proof of stake algorithm as well. It'll also have some other features, which we'll talk about in a bit. Now, as a quick aside, all the tools that we're going to learn here are still going to work in ETH2. So depending on when you watch this, everything here is still valid. So let's talk about proof of stake now. Again, this is a different civil resistance mechanism. Instead of solving this difficult problem, 
proof of stake nodes put up some collateral that they're going to behave honestly, aka they stake. In the example of Ethereum 2, nodes put up some Ethereum as a stake that they're going to behave honestly in the network. If they misbehave in the network, they are going to be slashed or removed some of their stake. Obviously, this is a very good civil resistance mechanism because if you try to create a whole bunch of anonymous accounts, then each one of those accounts, you have to put up some stake. And if you misbehave, you're going to run the risk of losing all the money that you put up as collateral. In this system, miners are actually called validators because they're no longer binding anything. They're actually just validating other nodes. Now, unlike proof of work, which every node is racing to be the first one to find the block, in proof of stake, nodes are actually randomly chosen to propose the new block. And then the rest of the validators will validate if that node has proposed the block honestly. As we saw with our cryptography lesson, it's usually very easy for other nodes to verify if a proposal or a transaction is honest. Now, randomness is a really important topic when we're talking about blockchains, because keep in mind, these blockchains are deterministic systems. They're walled gardens from the rest of the world. And as you know, a deterministic system, by definition, can't have random numbers. So how do we choose the random validators in the system? Well, it changes from blockchain to blockchain, and actually choosing the node will change blockchain to blockchain, but in ETH2, they're using what's called RANDAO, at least for the original implementation. This is a decentralized autonomous organization that collectively chooses the random number and collectively chooses which node is going to run next. We aren't going to dive too deep into this because there's a good chance that this might change in the future, but we will go into randomness solutions in blockchain later on in this course. Now, proof of stake obviously has some pros and cons as well. Pros are that, again, it is a great civil resistance mechanism and a great way to figure out who the author of a block should be. The other pros are that it's way less computationally expensive to figure out the new block. Because instead of every single node on the network trying to do this, only one node needs to do this. And then the rest of the nodes just need to validate it. The cons are that it's usually considered a slightly less decentralized network due to the upfront staking costs it costs to participate. Now this gets into a little bit of a philosophical battle on how decentralized is decentralized enough. And I think that's up to the community to decide. And as we progress, I think we'll learn more and more about how decentralized is decentralized enough. The general consensus amongst blockchain engineers though, is that proof of stake is very, very decentralized and very secure. This massive environmental impact improvement is one of the two main reasons why ETH is shifting to ETH2. It reduces the environmental impact by up to 99%. Now these are the main pieces of proof of work and proof of stake, but I did want to talk about another concept that's really important in these ecosystems, and that is scalability. When we were talking about gas prices, we were saying that the gas prices can get really high if a lot of people want to send a transaction, because a block only has so much block space and the nodes can only add so many nodes. So when a lot of people want to use a blockchain, the gas price skyrockets. This is not very scalable, because if we want to add more and more people to these blockchains, it's going to cost more and more to use the blockchains because more people are going to want to get into these blocks. This means that there's kind of a ceiling to how many people can use the system because of the financial constraints that will get imposed as gas prices keep rising. Ethereum 2 is not only attacking the environmental impact of proof of work by switching to proof of stake, but they are also implementing this new methodology called sharding. And sharding is a solution to this scalability problem. A sharded blockchain really just means that it's going to be a blockchain of blockchains. There is a main chain that's going to coordinate everything amongst several chains that hook into this main chain. This means that if there's more chains for people to make transactions on, effectively increasing the amount of block space that there is. Sharding can greatly increase the number of transactions on a blockchain layer one. Now, there's another term that might be the first time you heard it, a layer one. We're going to talk about layer ones and layer twos in terms of scalability really quickly as well. A layer one refers to any base layer blockchain implementation. Bitcoin's a layer one, Ethereum's a layer one, Avalanche is a layer one. These are the base layer blockchain solutions. A layer two is any application that is added on top of a layer one, added on top of a blockchain. Some examples of layer twos are going to be Chainlink, Arbitrum, or Optimism. Arbitrum and Optimism are very interesting because they are layer twos that also look to solve this scalability issue. Arbitrum and Optimism are what's known as rollups, and they roll up their transactions into a layer one, like Ethereum. We're not going to go too deep into rollups and how they actually work, but all you really need to know is that a rollup is kind of like a sharded chain. They derive their security from the base layer from the layer one, like Ethereum, 
and they bulk send their transactions onto the layer one. They solve some of the scalability issues by being another blockchain that people can make transactions on, still on kind of this base Ethereum layer. Now they're different from side chains because side chains derive their security from their own protocols. Rollups derive their security from the base layers. So Arbitrum and Optimism, for example, is going to be just about as secure as Ethereum. There's some fantastic guys in there that go a little bit deeper into rollups, and I've left a link in the description for you. All right, so we just talked about a lot of stuff. So let's do a quick recap before moving on. Ethereum and Bitcoin are currently both proof of work blockchains that follow Nakamoto consensus. However, Ethereum is moving to Ethereum 2, which will be a proof of stake sharded blockchain. Sybil attacks are prevented due to protocols like proof of work and proof of stake. 51% attacks grow increasingly harder with the size of blockchain. So you should run a node. Consensus is the mechanism that allows a blockchain to agree upon what the state of the blockchain is. Sharding and rollups are solutions to scalability issues on layer ones. A layer one is any base blockchain implementation like Bitcoin or Ethereum. A blockchain scalability problem is that there's not always enough block space for the amount of transactions that want to get in them. This leads to very high gas prices. And again, gas prices are how much it costs to interact with a blockchain. Whew. So that's it for the blockchain basics and the blockchain explainers. With just this information, you now can go off into the world and start working with blockchains and interacting with blockchains with at least some level of knowledge as to what's going on. You should be incredibly proud of yourself for just making it this far. Definitely be sure to give yourself a pat on the back and a round of applause. Now that we've gotten a lot of the basics and the fundamentals out of the way, Let's start jumping into the coding aspect. This is where you're going to learn how to actually build these smart contracts, how to build these trust minimized agreements in these blockchains and in these smart contract platforms. This next section, this solidity basics, the solidity fundamentals section will give you all the skills to start actually coding solidity and understanding how these smart contracts work underneath the hood. So at this point, Absolutely. Give yourself a high five. Maybe say hi in the GitHub discussions. Maybe say hi in the community on Twitter, on Reddit, etc. And be proud of just making it this far. The journey has really only just begun, but you've already learned so much. Let's begin the next section and let's jump into the code. Now that we're getting to the coding sections, I need to stress to absolutely use the GitHub repository associated with this course. If you come to the GitHub repo and you scroll down, and you click the lesson that we're on. Right now we're on lesson two, Welcome to Remix, Simple Storage. If you click on it, it'll give you a ton of timestamps and, and other helpful links associated with this lesson. Additionally, the biggest piece is that all the code will be available right underneath the lesson title. This will have all the code that we're gonna be working with, as well as some more additional information on how to work with the code. Please, when asking questions and entering in discussions though, please ask your questions in the full blockchain Solidity course repository. Thank you. And if we're at the top of the repository and we scroll down, we have this resources for this course section, which brings us to the GitHub discussions, which you can ask questions in the GitHub discussion section of this course. Additionally on Stack Exchange Ethereum or Stack Overflow. I'll talk a little bit about how to format questions and ask questions the best way so that you have the highest chance of getting a good answer in a later lesson. I highly recommend you pause and make accounts for Stack Exchange Ethereum, Stack Overflow, and GitHub right now if you haven't already. Links to them, of course, can be found in our GitHub repository. Typically, for each coding section, I'll start it off by giving a quick overview of the code of what we're going to be working with and what we're going to be building towards, since everything that we're doing is going to be project based, and that's how we're going to learn. For our first one in Remix, though, we're going to skip over that because there's a lot of stuff to get used to. Now, I highly recommend that as I'm coding this and as I'm doing all this in Remix, you follow along with me and you code along with me. Remember, you can change my speed if I'm coding too fast or if I'm coding too slow. To start, we're going to jump into a tool called Remix. If you're unsure how to get there, there's a link to Remix in our GitHub repository. This is where we're going to be writing all of our code. So welcome to the Remix IDE or Integrated Development Environment. This is where we're going to learn how to code and interact with our smart contracts. If you want, you can go ahead and accept to help out Remix. 
If you've never been here before, it'll give you a quick walkthrough of some of the tools that Remix actually has. We're going to skip over them for now because I'm going to explain everything that's going on. Remix is such a powerful tool because it has a lot of features that allow us to really see and interact with our smart contracts. Eventually, we're going to move off of Remix actually to a local development environment. However, Remix is absolutely fantastic for learning the fundamentals of Solidity, and I highly recommend everybody start with Remix when they're getting started. When you come to the Remix IDE, there's a whole lot of different things that are popping out to us. There's a lot of different plugins as well. Since we're going to be working with Solidity, which is going to be the language that we're using to develop our smart contracts, we can go ahead and get started by clicking the Solidity plugin. And a couple of other tools will show up on the side. Even if you don't click the Solidity plugin, you'll still be able to code Solidity smart contracts. The left-hand side is where we're going to start to actually interact with things. The button on the topmost of the left is our files or our Explorer directories. Remix comes boilerplated with some different contracts, some different scripts, some different tests, and different dependencies. We are going to minimize this a little bit. So if you want to go ahead and right-click and delete some of these folders, other than the contracts folders, feel free to do so. Or if you kind of like them there, feel free to leave them as well. We're going to leave our contracts folder and we're going to delete the different files inside of it just so that we can start from a blank slate. Most projects come with something known as a readme. Usually it's a readme.md, which usually explains how to actually work with code. But for our purposes, we're going to delete this as well. And you can just follow along with me. Now we have a blank Remix setup. Click on the Contracts folder and click the little page icon to create a new file. A little box will pop up and you can start typing text into it. We're going to type in simple storage.sol. .sol tells our compilers that this is going to be a Solidity file and that we're going to code Solidity in this. Solidity is the primary coding language of smart contracts. There are a few other smart contract languages as well, but Solidity by far is the most dominant smart contract coding language out there. And now we have a simple storage.sol contract on the right that we can actually start coding our Solidity with. So let's start coding some Solidity. Now, if you click on this button right below the files button, that looks like the Solidity logo, you'll see a bunch of stuff pop up in here. These are different parameters for us to actually compile our Solidity code so that we can run it. So the first thing that you're going to need in any Solidity smart contract is going to be the version of Solidity that you're going to use. And this should always be at the top of your Solidity code. Solidity is a constantly changing language and a constantly updating language because it's relatively new compared to other languages. We need to tell our code, hey, this is the version that I want you to use. We can add the Solidity version by doing pragma, Solidity, and then the version that we want to use. If we want to choose a very specific version, we could say 0.8.7. The most current version to date is 0.8. 0.12, but getting used to different versions of Solidity is good practice. And different versions of Solidity are considered more stable than others. 0.8.7 is one of those versions that is considered more stable. These double slashes here are what's known as a comment. They're places where you can type stuff that won't actually get executed and won't get compiled and isn't really considered part of your code. For example, I could write, hello all, I'm Patrick. And if we were going to run this code, this part of my code would get completely ignored. So this double backslash is how we do what's called comments. And as we're coding and as we're building our projects, be sure to use this comments tool to your advantage. Every time you write a new function or you learn something that you didn't understand, or you learn something new that you want to remember, put it in a comment in your code. You're going to be most effective at taking notes in this course by making them comments in your code and then saving your code so you can refer back to it later. So leave comments in your code, leave notes in your code, and that'll be one of the best ways for you to understand what you're coding when you wanna refer back to it later. Now, when it comes to the versions of Solidity, there's actually a few different ways we can actually write it. We can say we wanna use only 0.8.7, and this is how we would write that. But maybe we're okay if we use a more new version of Solidity than 0.8.7. To tell our code that we're okay with a more new version, we can put a little caret here. And this is how we tell Solidity, hey, any version of 0.8.7 and above is okay for this contract. This means 0.8.8 would work, 0.8.9, 0.8.10, etc. But if we wanted to use just 0.8.7, 
we would type it like that. If we want to use Solidity versions between a specific range, we could do something like this. We could say we want our Solidity version greater than or equal to 0.8.7, but less than 0.9.0. This means that any compiler between 0.8.7 and 0.9.0 would work. This means 0.8.8 would work, 0.8.9 would work, 0.8.10 would work, but 0.9.0 would not work because it is not strictly less than 0.9.0. 0.9.1 would also not work. To keep things simple for us, we're gonna use 0.8.8. .8. And every line of solidity that's completed, every completed section needs to end with one of these semicolons. This is how you tell solidity it's the end of the line. Also, at the top of your code, you're always gonna to wanna to put what's called an SPDX license identifier. This is optional, but some compilers will flag you a warning that you don't have one. This is to make licensing and sharing code a lot easier. We have a link to more about how licenses work in the section of this lesson in our GitHub repository. To do an SPDX license identifier, we just say SPDX license identifier, and we're gonna choose MIT. The MIT license is one of the least restrictive licenses out there. So we use the MIT license for most of our code samples. Once you have a version and once you have just this much written, we can actually go ahead right to our compiler tab and scroll down and hit compile. That little turn thing will go. And in a minute, we'll see this contract is attempted to be compiled. Since we actually don't have a contract, we see no contract compiled yet, but we see the compiler automatically switched 0.8.8. Compiling our code means taking our more human readable code like Pragma Solidity and transforming it into computer code or very specific instructions for the computer to use. We'll go over what a lot of this machine level code or this computer level code is doing in a later section. If you're using a Mac, you can also hit Command S and it'll run the compiler for you as well. On Windows, it might be Control S. We can actually choose the compiler version that we want to use. However, if we tell in our code to specifically use 0.8.8 .8 and we hit the compile button, it'll automatically switch to 0.8.8. .8. However, if we use the caret thing, we could specifically say, hey, we want 0.8.10. We could hit compile and it'll compile with 0.8.10. Because again, remember, the caret says we want to use at least 0.8.8 .8 all the way up to the latest version of 0.8. For now, let's stay on 0.8.8. .8. The next thing that we're gonna do in our code is define our contract. And to get a full screen view, you can go ahead and hit the compiler button to get rid of it there. To start defining our contract, we're gonna go ahead and write the word contract. This tells Solidity that the next pieces of code is gonna be a contract. Contract is a key word in Solidity. And it tells our compiler that the next section of this code is going to define a contract. You can think of a contract similar to a class in any object-oriented programming like Java or JavaScript. Let's go ahead and give our contract a name here. We're going to call ours simple storage. And then we add this little open and close curly brackets. Everything inside this open and close curly brackets is going to be the contents of this contract simple storage. Now, if we go ahead and hit Command S or Control S, we can see this little green check mark show up. And if you don't, you can always go back to the compiler tab, scroll down and hit compile and see the little green check mark. That little green check mark means that our code is compiling successfully and we don't have any errors. We could hypothetically deploy this contract right now and it would be a valid contract. So congratulations on writing your first contract. Now Solidity has multiple different types or primitive data types. And if you go to the Solidity documentation, which again is in our GitHub repository, you can read more and learn more about the different types that are in here. The four most basic types are gonna be Boolean, uint, int, and an address, or bytes, which is a lower level type, which we'll talk about a little bit later. A Boolean defines some type of true-false. A uint is gonna be an unsigned integer, which means it's gonna be a whole number that isn't positive or negative, it's just positive. We have an integer, which is going to be a positive or negative whole number. And then we have an address, which is going to be an address, like what we see in our MetaMask here. There are some other types as well that you'll learn later on. The reason that we have these types is we use them to define what different variables are. Variables are basically holders for different values. For example, we could create a variable called has favorite number. 
to represent if somebody has a favorite number. And we would put this bool keyword before has favorite number to say, okay, we have a variable called has favorite number and it's of type Boolean. So this has favorite number is going to represent a true or a false. To set its value, we could say has favorite number equals true. Now has favorite number is going to be true. We could also say has favorite number equals false. So this Boolean has favorite number is now going to be false. For a uint, we could say uint favorite number equals and then set a number, one, two, three. This means that our favorite number is going to be one, two, three. Uint is special because we can actually specify how many bits we want to allocate to this number. Bits and bytes are pretty fundamental pieces of information for computer science. We're not gonna go over it here, However, there's a fantastic video in the GitHub repository that explains it more. Basically, it's how much storage or memory to allocate to this number. How big can it get? If we say a uint 8, it can have 8 bits all the way up to uint 256. If you don't specify how big it is, it automatically defaults to uint 256. Oftentimes, it's better when writing our code to be very explicit. So usually you'll see me just do uint 256 to represent a uint 256. We could also do an int favorite number equals one, two, three, or an int 256. I'm just gonna go ahead and add this Boolean back here. We're gonna change this back to uint 256. And let's change our favorite number to five here. We could also do something called strings. String favorite number in text equals five. Strings represent basically words and you can represent them by putting them in these quotes. It's gonna be some word or phrase or really really just kind of any combination of keystrokes in here. Our ints can be positive or negative. So we could say negative five or positive five. Both are gonna be valid ints. We can also do address. My address equals and grab our address right from MetaMask and paste it in. You'll notice that we end all of these lines of code with the semicolon. We can also have bytes objects or a bytes 32. Again, representing how many bytes we want them to be. And this says that we have called favorite bytes and we're just gonna set it equal to cat. So strings are actually really interesting because strings are secretly just bytes objects, but only for text. So cat is actually a string but can automatically get converted into one of these bytes object. Bytes objects typically look like zero X and then some random letters and numbers that represent the bytes object, but cat can automatically get converted down to bytes. We'll talk about bytes more in coming sessions. You could also do bytes two, bytes three, bytes five, bytes 22, you get the picture. For our uints and our int 256, the lowest we can go is eight bits because eight bits is a byte and we can go up by steps of eight. So we can do eight, 16, 32, et cetera, all the way to 256. For example, down here, we can't do bytes 64. And if we go ahead and try to compile this, we get a little red thing here. And if we scroll down, we get a declaration error, identifier not found or not unique, byte 64, favorite bytes equals cats. And we even get a little red warning sign here in our remix. This is remix telling us there's something wrong with this line. So we can switch it back to byte 32 since bytes 32 is the maximum size that a bytes can be. You could also do just a bytes object, which means it can have any size, but we typically want to be explicit and we're going to stick with bytes 32 for now. If you want to learn more about the different types and how to use them and all the different features with them, be sure to check out the Solidity documentation. For now, for our simple storage, let's say we only want to store numbers. So let's go ahead and delete everything except for the favorite number section. Now in Solidity, if I do this and I remove the equals five, this favorite number actually does get set to a default value. The default value for Solidity is going to be whatever the null value is, which in Solidity's case is zero. So saying uint 256 favorite number is gonna be the same as saying uint 256 favorite number equals zero, since it gets initialized to zero. So for now, let's not initialize it to anything so that favorite number will automatically start off as zero. Now, if you get confused as you're coding along and you're following along with me, be sure to write comments in your code so you know what's going on. So maybe for example, a great comment here would be this gets initialized to 
zero. And then if that's even confusing you, you could say this means that this section is a comment. Now let's go ahead and create a function. Functions or methods are self-contained modules that will execute some specific set of instructions for us when we call it. If you're familiar with Java or Python or JavaScript or anything like that, functions work the exact same way. Functions get identified by the keyword function. Let's create a function called store that will change the value of favorite number to some new value. And the number that we're going to change it to is going to be variables that are passed to our store function here. So we're going to allow our store function to take a variable of type uint256 and we'll call it underscore favorite number. We'll make this a public function, which we'll get to in a minute. And all we're going to do is we're going to set favorite number equal to whatever variable that we just passed. So now we have this function called store that it takes some parameter that we're going to give it and it sets this favorite number variable equal to whatever number that we give this function. Now to see this actually in action, let's deploy this to an even faker blockchain than a testnet. We're going to actually deploy this to a local network or a JavaScript VM. And first, before we can even do that, let's just make sure that it's compiling correctly. Looks like we have a green check mark, which is good. And we'll come down to this button here, which is our deploy and run transactions tab. Our deploy and run transactions tab has a ton of different configuration pieces for actually deploying this contract. First, we want to make sure we are on the JavaScript VM London piece here. JavaScript VM means we're going to be deploying to a fake local JavaScript VM. The JavaScript VM is a fake local blockchain where we can simulate transactions really quickly without having to wait for them to go through on a testnet. Don't worry about the London versus Berlin piece here for now. Injected Web3 and Web3 provider we'll talk about in a little bit. We also have this account section here. When we run on our fake JavaScript VM, we're given a whole bunch of fake accounts from where to deploy from. And we're given 100 ETH for each one of these fake accounts. You can kind of think of it similar to our MetaMask account in MetaMask. Except for the difference here is that this is this fake JavaScript VM Ethereum that we're given. For our transactions, including deploying contracts, we're actually given a gas limit. There's also values we can send and we can choose our contracts. Right now, we only have one contract, simple storage. So that's going to be the one that we're going to deploy. So on the left hand side, to deploy this to our fake JavaScript VM, we're going to go ahead and hit the deploy button. And if we scroll all the way down to the bottom now, we can see a contract was deployed. It says simple storage at x blah, 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 blah. And we see this orange button store with kind of this gray text UN256 underscore favorite number. On our fake local blockchain, we're actually given an address. Every single smart contract it has an address, just like how our wallets have an address. So if we hit this copy button here, and we put it into a comment, we make this a little bit bigger, we can see that the address of this contract that we just deployed is located at this address. Additionally, if you pull up the slider over here, you'll be able to see this little green check mark with all this information about this deployment. And you can hit the little drop down and see a whole lot more information about this. Something you might notice is you'll see some familiar keywords like status, transaction hash, from, to, gas, etc. When we deploy a contract, it's actually the same as sending a transaction. Remember, anytime we do anything on the blockchain, we modify any value we are sending a transaction. So deploying a contract is modifying the blockchain to have this contract. It's modifying the state of the blockchain. And if we had sent this on a RinkB or a Coven or a mainnet network, we would have had to spend the gas to actually deploy this contract. And this is the simulation of how much gas and the transaction hash and from and to and all this other stuff about our transaction had we actually deployed it to a real network. But since it's a JavaScript VM, it's all fake information. Now we have this big orange button store. This big orange button resembles the store function that we just created. So if we add some number into this store like one, two, three, and we hit the store button, we actually call this store button and we actually execute a transaction on our fake JavaScript blockchain to store the number one, two, three for favorite number. And if we scroll all the way up to our account now, 
you'll see that we have a little bit less ether in our fake account. This is because we spent the gas to actually call this contract. And if we pull up this bottom bit here, and I call this with five, I call store, you'll see it flash for a quick second. We sent another transaction to store the value five in our favorite number. Now, the question you might be having is, uh, that's really cool, Patrick, but I can't see what favorite number actually is. How do I know that those transactions are actually going through? Well, right now, the visibility of our favorite number is set to private, so we actually can't see it. And we'll talk about visibility in just a second. To make it so that we can see it, we'll change our favorite number's visibility to public. So let's go ahead, we'll recompile, we'll go back to the deploy tab, We'll click the little X here, which is to say, let's get rid of this contract. And it just gets rid of it from our window here. It doesn't actually get rid of it from the blockchain because again, they're immutable. Well, kind of immutable since again, this is kind of a, a fake simulated chain, but we go ahead and compile. And now we hit deploy again. And if we scroll down, our new contract will now have two buttons. One is the orange button for store, but now we have a new favorite button. This button represents this public variable favorite number. And it resembles a function saying, hey, show me what favorite number is. So if I were to click this favorite number button, what do you think will show up? Well, do you remember what this gets initialized to? Well, let's click it now. We do indeed see that zero shows up. We see that this is a UN256 and the value stored in it is zero. Now, if I were to change that number to five by calling the store function and now hitting favorite number, we do indeed see favorite number gets updated to five. Functions and variables can have one of four visibility specifiers. We have public, private, external, and internal. Public is visible externally and internally, meaning anybody who interacts with this contract or sees this contract can see what's stored in this favorite number function. You'll see here in the Solidity documentation, it says it creates a getter function for the storage slash state variables. When we add this keyword public to favorite number, what we're actually doing is we're creating what's called a getter function for favorite number. We're basically creating a function that says to return the value of favorite number. And that's why this blue button pops up because this blue button is a function that says, hey, return the value of favorite number. Private means only this specific contract can call this function. Now for storage, it doesn't mean only this contract can read what's stored here. And we'll get into that a little bit later, but private means this is the only contract that can call the favorite number function. Private functions are only visible to the current contract. External functions are only visible externally, meaning somebody outside this contract can call this function. And then internal means that only this contract and children contract can actually read it. But we'll get into that a little bit later too. So oddly enough, variables are just function calls. Now, the reason that we didn't see favorite number show up on the left-hand side when we first deployed this without the public keyword, when we don't give a visibility specifier to functions or variables, they automatically get deployed as internal. And as we know, internal functions and variables can only be called by this specific contract or derived contracts, which again, we'll get into later. So let's just keep it public for now. The reason that we're prefixing our parameter here with an underscore is a way to tell us, hey, this variable here is different from the favorite number global. There are some different naming conventions that are used for parameters. And as we get later into the course, we'll understand more and more of what good names for parameters are. Every time we call this store function and we change the value here, we're actually sending a transaction because remember, every single time we change the state of the blockchain, we do it in a transaction and we can see all the details here. If you go over to the transaction details in the logging area of your remix, you can actually scroll down and you can see the transaction cost in units of gas. You'll see a number, something around this, and you'll notice it's more than that 21,000 number from sending Ethereum. That's because we're doing something more computationally expensive. We're actually storing a number over here. Now, what do you think will happen if we do more inside of this store function as well? So instead of just storing this number, maybe what else we do is we will store the number here and then we'll update our favorite number. We'll say favorite number equals favorite number plus one. Since we're doing more stuff now, we should see this store function actually become more expensive. So let's go ahead and recompile. We'll delete this, we'll redeploy. We now have a new contract. We'll store five again. 
Now, if we look in the details of this transaction and we scroll down the execution costs, we do indeed see the amount of gas has greatly increased. And that's because we're doing more things. This store function is now more computationally expensive. And like I said, each blockchain has a little different way of how they actually calculate gas. But the easiest way to think about it is the more stuff you do, the more expensive that transaction is going to cost. So let's go ahead and delete this line to continue our example. Now let's talk about scope for a second. Our favorite number is basically in something called the global scope, meaning anything inside of these brackets can access this favorite number variable. But what if I did something like this? What if I made a, a uint 256 called test var and I set it equal to five? And then I created a new function called something. We'll have it take no parameters and be public. Could I access the test var and then change it to something like six? Can we do that? Well, let's go ahead and see what happens when we try to compile this. We actually run into an error. We had expected primary expression right here. Oh, well, that's because I have the double question mark. <laughs> Let's try it now. We get undeclared identifier. Our something function doesn't know about this test var. When you create variables, they only can be viewed in the scope of where they are. Now, if that's a little confusing, just look for the curly brackets. These two curly brackets encompass this whole section here, right? The opening one is up here. The closing one is down here. So if I create a variable directly inside of these curly brackets, that means everything in here can access it. However, test var was created inside of these curly brackets, which means that only stuff inside of these curly brackets can access test var. Since our function something isn't inside of store, our something function won't know about test var. So that's how scope works. You want to look to see if your variable that you created is inside of these curly brackets. And that's how you can know if other functions can work with them. So this is why this fails. Now, like what we saw in the documentation, when we add this public variable to favorite number, we're secretly adding a function that just returns this favorite number. We can also add our own function that also returns the favorite number to resemble the function that's getting created in the back end. So we could say function, we call it retrieve, and we make it a public view, and we'll say it returns a uint256. I'll explain what that means in just a second. And we'll say return favorite number. Now I'm going to hit command S, which again, I'm going to do that a lot throughout this section. But just remember that that's equivalent to me going to the compile tab and hitting compile. Now, if we go to the deploy tab, delete our last one, deploy a new one, we now have a retrieve function, which is going to return the exact same thing that our favorite number is going to return. Again, if we update this to five, call favorite number and then retrieve, they both now return five. Now, as you can see here, these two functions are blue, but this function is orange. What's the difference? Why do these have these different colors? Well, the key lies in this view keyword here. There are actually two keywords in Solidity that notate a function that doesn't actually have to spend gas to run. And those keywords are view and pure. Oh, and let's also get rid of this variable up here. A function that is a view function means we're just going to read state from this contract. We're just going to read something off of this contract. For example, our retrieve function right now is just reading what favorite number is. A view function disallows any modification of state. So you can't update the blockchain at all with a view function. Pure functions also disallow any modification of state. So we couldn't update our favorite number. Not only that, but they also disallow reading from the blockchain. So we couldn't read favorite number either. Instead, what you might do with a peer function is maybe something like function add public pure one plus one or return one plus one. This would be returns u in two fifty six. Maybe something like this. Maybe there's some math you want to use over and over again. Maybe there's some specific algorithm that you want to implement that doesn't actually need to read any storage, et cetera. Now, if we call a view function or a pure function by itself, we actually don't need to spend any gas since we're just reading from the blockchain. Remember, we only spend gas. We only make a transaction if we modify the blockchain state. So you'll notice in our little console down here that if I call retrieve, this call thing comes up. However, it looks different than when we call the store function. 
When we call the store function, we get this little check mark, we get a hash, we don't get the little check mark, and we don't get a hash with the calls. That's because clicking these blue buttons doesn't make a transaction. This is saying, hey, we're just gonna read off chain. We're just gonna read this value. However, if you look in the details of this call, there's this execution cost bit here. So what's going on? Well, we can read this part right here. Cost only applies when called by a contract. If we do have a function that calls retrieve, if there's a function that is updating state that calls a view or a peer function, that's the only time it'll cost gas. So for example, if our store function, which is not a view function, were to call retrieve at some point, then we'd have to pay the cost of the retrieve because reading from the blockchain costs this computation and costs gas. Calling view functions is free unless you're calling it inside of a function that costs gas, in which case it will cost gas. So if we leave it here, we delete this, we recompile, we redeploy, we hit favorite number, retrieve, they both still cost nothing. But if we add, if we store eight in here, we can see, we can see our execution cost has gone up from what it was without retrieve, which we can go ahead, we can compile. I hit command S to compile here. We can deploy. Let's go ahead and store again. We'll click on that transaction. We can see that it's much cheaper without that retrieve function in there. And again, our favorite number variable, as long as it has this public visibility, it also is counted as a view function that returns a UN256. The returns keyword means what is this function going to give us after we call it? So we say this function is going to give us, this function is going to return a uint256. When we call retrieve, it's going to return or give us a uint256. This is the result of calling the function. This six is the result of calling our retrieve function. Now our contract is good as it is. It allows us to store a single favorite number. But what if we wanna store a range of favorite numbers? Or maybe we want to store a whole bunch of different people who have different favorite numbers. Well, how do we do that? There are several different ways that we could approach this. One of the ways we could start approaching this is by creating what's called a struct of people. Or we can create a new type in our Solidity. We can create a people object that holds both someone's name and their favorite number. To do that, we say struct people, you went 256 favorite number and a string name. Now we've created a new type called people, kind of like you and 256 or Boolean or string. Now we have a people type that we can use. Now, similar to how we created a you and 256 public favorite number, we could do the exact same thing, but with a people. We could say people public. We can call this person and we can create a new people and assign it to this variable person. So we'll say equals people public person equals, and we'll add parentheses here to signify we're creating a new person. And since we made this a struct, we add little curly brackets here to let Solidity know that we're gonna be grabbing from these struct variables. We'll say favorite number is gonna be two and then name is going to be Patrick, semicolon. And then we can hit Control S, or we can go ahead and compile. Now, if we go ahead and deploy this, we now have a new person, since this, again, is a public variable. It has a getter function called person. And if we click person, we see our new object. The favorite number is two, and then the name is Patrick. You see this zero and this one, because these are showing the index of the different variables. For those of you new to computer science, typically in computer science, lists start with the number zero. So at our zeroth index, we have a UN256 called favorite number, which is saved at two. And then at index one, we have a string, which stands for the name of Patrick. Whenever you have a list of variables inside of an object in Solidity, they get automatically indexed. So favorite number gets indexed to zero, and name gets indexed to one. Interestingly enough, if you have a whole bunch of variables inside your contract, like we have public favorite number, this favorite number actually technically is getting indexed at the zeroth storage slot. And if we were to make another one of these, maybe you and 256 public brother's favorite number, this would technically be indexed at the first slot. And then if we were to make one more, maybe sister's favorite number, this would be indexed at the second slot. 
So favorite number at zero, this at one, and this at two. But we'll learn more about that much later in the course. Similarly, favorite number is indexed at zero, name is indexed at one. Now what we have is great, but if we want a whole lot of people, are we gonna have to keep copy pasting and changing the people's name, person two, their favorite what number will be three, we'll name them Ali, person three, their favorite number will be seven, their name will be Chad or something. Oops. This obviously isn't a great way to create lists and large number of peoples because we have to statically keep typing them in. So a much better way to create a list, and let's actually just go ahead and delete Patrick too. A much better way to create a list is to use a data structure called an array. An array is a way to store a list or a sequence of objects. Creating an array works the exact same we've seen to initialize other different types. Typically we do the type of the object, the visibility of the object, and then the variable name. We do the exact same thing with arrays. We'll say we want a people array. These little brackets represent that we want an array of people. We'll give it a visibility of public and we'll call it people. You can do the same thing with uint 256, for example. You could say uint 256 public favorite numbers list and just add this little array key here. And now favorite numbers list is going to be an array or a list. We're going to comment that out for now. Now, if I were to go ahead and deploy this contract, let's go ahead and delete the last one. Let's redeploy. We now have this blue people button here. Remember, since it's public and it's a variable, it automatically is given a view function. It's given one of these blue buttons. And instead of just having it be a single button where the value shows up, it's giving us a form to fill out. It wants to take a uint256 as an input parameter. So if I put zero, I get nothing back. If I put one, I get nothing back. No matter what you put in this box right now, we're going to get nothing back. This is because our people array or our people list is currently empty. And the value that it wants is going to be the index of the object that you want. So for example, if at index zero, I had Patrick, it would show Patrick for zero. If at index one, I had John, or actually better yet, two Patrick, um, seven John, etc. This is what it would show, but since it's empty, it's going to show nothing. And let's go ahead and remove the public variable from favorite number so that we don't get the duplicate functions at the moment. We'll just get the retrieve function. We'll show you how to add to this array in just a second. This type of array is what's known as a dynamic array because the size of the array isn't given at the array initialization. If we were to say a people array and add a three in these brackets here, that means that this list or this array of people could only be three people big. If we don't give it a size, it means it can be any size and the size of the array can grow and shrink as we add and subtract people. If I add three, it can only have a maximum of three in the array ever. We're going to work with a dynamic array because we're going to want to add a arbitrary number of people to this array. So let's go ahead and create a function that's going to add people to our people array. So we're going to say function add person, and we're going to take string memory name as input parameter, and I'll explain that in a minute, and a uint256 underscore favorite number. We're going to make this a public function. What we're going to do is we're going to call a push function that's available on our people object. So we're going to say people dot push, and we're going to create a new person, a new people object, which is going to take in the favorite number and the name. Now this might be a little bit tricky to you. So let's break this down. People here is capitalized. So we know that since it's capitalized, it's referring to this struct people and not our variable people. The lowercase people here is referring to this lowercase array. So we're saying our array dot push or push is the equivalent of adding basically a new people that grabs favorite number and name. Another way that we could actually do this is we could create a variable of type people and then add it like so. So we could say people new person equals people. And then we could put those brackets the same way we did before. We could say favorite number is going to be this input value, this parameter, and we could say name is going to be this parameter. 
Now, if you hit save, you'll get this error set here. The data location must be storage, memory, or call data for variable, but no one's given. For now, we're just gonna add the memory keyword here and I'll explain what it does in a little bit. And then of course, we need to add the new person into our people.push right here. So this is how we're actually gonna push people into our people array. And I'll get to this memory keyword in a bit. Now, if we go back to our deploy tab, we delete our last contract. Let's deploy this new one. Right now, if we try to look at the zeroth person in our people array, we get nothing, but let's go ahead and add a person. We'll call it Patrick will be the name and seven will be the favorite number. We added Patrick, we added seven. Now, if we look at people zero, we should see the zeroth person has a name of Patrick and a favorite number of seven. Boom, and that's exactly what we do see. We see a favorite number of seven and we see a string name, Patrick. We tried to add John and do a 16 and we hit add person. We can see our transaction go through. And now if we go to people at zero, it's still Patrick with a favorite number of seven. But if we look at the people at index one, it's gonna be John with a favorite number of 16. And if we look at two, this of course should be blank. And we do indeed see nothing actually happens here. Perfect. Now there's actually a couple of different ways to create this new person here. Like we showed before, we can use this bracket notation or what we can do is we can actually just add the parameters in the order that they show. So the first parameter for people is gonna be favorite number. So we could just do favorite number, comma, and the second one is gonna be name. And the second one is gonna be name. So if we save this, this, this line we just created is the exact same as the last line. We're being a little bit less explicit here. So the other way is generally a little bit better because it's more explicit as to what variables are what. Or we don't even need to save to this variable here, we could take out this whole line, replace new person with exactly what we just saw, like so. And now we don't even need the memory keyword. Now you've probably seen this by now, but if I go ahead and compile and I see a little, little red one here and I roll over it and it says something about an error, expected semicolon, but got bracket, all these errors mean that your code isn't compiling. It's not working as expected. So now I can go over here and do a little semicolon, recompile, and I get a green. Now, if I delete this top line, for example, and I compile it, I actually get a yellow thing. Yellow stands for warnings. The warning that I get is warning, SPX license identifier not provided. You should add it. So let's go ahead and add that back. I recompile and the warning goes away. Warnings don't stop your code from compiling. So if you get warnings, it's okay but it's usually a good idea to listen to the warnings because often they'll give really insightful information about how to improve your smart contracts. So to summarize, if it's red, it's broken. If it's yellow, you might wanna check it out, but it won't stop you from continuing to code. So one thing that you'll notice here is that we have this memory keyword. And you'll notice if you try to delete it from our function here, and you try to compile, you actually run into an error. Data location must be memory or call data for parameter in function. Now, there are actually six places you can store data in Solidity. You have the stack, memory, storage, call data, code, and logs. We're not gonna go over these right now, but we are gonna focus on three of the big ones or three of the important ones for this section, which are call data, memory, and storage. So for this section, we're gonna talk about call data, memory, and storage. and this is a little bit advanced. So if you don't totally grasp it the first time, that's totally okay. Please continue, even if it's not crystal clear what's going on here. Call data and memory mean that the variable is only gonna exist temporarily. So this name variable only exists temporarily during the transaction that this add person function is called. Storage variables exist even outside of just the function executing. Even though we didn't specify it up above, our favorite number is automatically cast to be a storage variable since it's not explicitly defined in one of these functions. Since we don't need this name variable anymore after this function runs, we can keep it as memory or we could keep it as call data. You can have a parameter as call data if you don't end up modifying the name. For example, we couldn't reassign name to equal cat here. If we compile, we run into an error. Type literal string cat is not implicitly convertible to expect to type string call data. However, if we have this as memory and we compile and save it, that error goes away. Call data is temporary variables that can't be modified. 
Memory is temporary variables that can be modified. And storage is permanent variables that can be modified. Now, even though I just said there's actually six places where we can access and store information, we cannot say a variable is stack, code, or logs. We can only say memory, storage, or call data. You'll learn why in a much later section. Now, this is a bit of an oversimplification of this, but that's essentially what's going on. The next question you might have is, well, why do I need to say memory here, but I don't need to say memory here? Well, let's go ahead, put memory here, and hit Control S or Compile, and let's see what happens. We get from Solidity, data location can only be specified for an array, struct, or mapping types, but memory was given. Arrays, structs, and mappings are considered special types in Solidity. Solidity automatically knows where a UN256 is going to be. Solidity knows that for this function, a UN256 is gonna live just in memory. However, it's not sure what a string is gonna be. Strings are actually kind of complicated. Behind the scenes, a string is actually an array of bytes. And since a string is an array, we need to add this memory bit to it because we need to tell Solidity the data location of arrays, structs, or mappings. And a string is secretly an array. So that's why we need to tell it it's in memory. You'll notice we can't add the storage keyword here. Solidity also knows that since this is a function, this name variable isn't actually getting stored anywhere. So it says, hey, you can't have that. You need to have it be memory or call data. And those are the only two that it accepts. So this is what we want our function to look like here. So the summary of this is structs, mappings, and arrays need to be given this memory or call data keyword when adding them as a parameter to different functions. We'll learn more about storage, memory, and call data in later sessions. Now, this list is great, but what if we know someone's name, but we don't know their favorite number? Well, what we could do is we could look through the whole array looking for that person. For example, in our contract, we could say, okay, I'm looking for John. Okay, let's start with zero. No, okay, that's Patrick. Okay, let's go to one. Ah, okay, that's John. Ah, great, his favorite number is 16. Well, this was really easy because we only had two people, but what if we had hundreds of people in this array? Well, we'd keep half to iterating all the way up to the index that that person was in. It's obviously really inefficient. What's another way to store this information so that it's much easier and quicker to access? Well, another data structure that we can use is something called a mapping. You can think of a mapping as sort of like a dictionary. It's a set of keys, which each key returning a certain value associated with that key. And we create a mapping variable the exact same way we create all of our other variables. So this is gonna be a type mapping of string to UN256. This is gonna be our type. Our visibility keyword is gonna be public and we'll call it name to favorite number. And now we have a dictionary where every single name is gonna to map to a specific number. So let's add some capability to our add person function. So we, we are gonna add our people to our array, but let's also add them to our mapping here. What we'll do is we'll say name to favorite number at key name is gonna to equal to the favorite number. So let's go ahead, compile this. We'll go to our deploy screen. We'll deploy this, we'll click. We have a new button named a favorite number. If I type in Patrick, nothing shows up. If I type in Patrick, you'll see I get a zero response. If I type in John, I also get a zero response. If I type in Becca, I also get a zero response. When you create a mapping, you initialize everything to its null value. Every single possible string on the planet right now is initialized to having a favorite number of zero. So if we want to change that, we'll have to go in and manually add that. So let's go ahead and add a person to our mapping here. So we'll add Patrick and we'll say my favorite number is seven. And it looks like that transaction did go through. We'll also add Becca and we'll say her favorite number is 13. We'll add John and we'll say his favorite number is 16. Now, if I look up Patrick, I'll immediately get back what Patrick's favorite number is. I get seven back. If we look up John, we immediately get back 16. Becca, we immediately get back 13. And we also can see them in our array because we kept in this people.push bit. So at zero, we see Patrick's there. At one, we see Becca. And at two, we see John. 
in our mapping, we're saying the string name is being mapped to the uint256 favorite number. And a lot of my variables, I like to make them explicitly named like that. So this is name to favorite number. So now we're in a space where let's say that we really like our simple storage contract right now. We have a favorite number global variable that we can save a favorite number to with our store function. We have a mapping of name to favorite numbers, and we have an array of a new type that we created called people. We can add to both the array and to the mapping using this add person function that we've created. We're able to save multiple people's favorite numbers as well as kind of a global favorite number as well. Let's say we really love this contract and we're ready to send it to a test net to have other people interact with it. Now in future sections, you'll hear me say that you shouldn't do this until you write tests and until you do some really simple auditing. But for now, let's go ahead and learn how to actually deploy this to a test net or to a real network. Now, remember, test nets are run out of the goodness of people's hearts. So if it's a little bit funky or maybe it doesn't work exactly as we show here, that's okay. As long as it works with the JavaScript VM, you'll be all set. But it is good practice to learn how to deploy these to a real test net. Let's go ahead and do that. Our contract is here, simple storage.sol. It's compiled. Compiling is passing. We get this little green check mark here. We go to the deploy section. Let's go ahead and delete this. And now we're going to change the environment. So we were working with a JavaScript VM or kind of this fake simulated environment. We want to now move to either Injected Web 3 or Web 3 provider. If you hover over Injected Web 3, there's this really, really small text here. But this basically means we're going to inject our MetaMask or our Web 3 wallet into our browser to use, similar to what we did with the faucet. We'll pick our account we want to use. So I'm going to go ahead and pick account one. And now we actually see our account in the account section of Remix. Injected Web3 means we're using our MetaMask or whatever Web3 wallet. Web3 provider is when we a little bit more manually choose an endpoint. And we're not going to go over this right now. But as we get later into the course, you'll understand what this means. So we're picking Injected Web3. Whatever network our Injected Web3, or in this case, our wallet is connected to, is going to be the network that we deploy to. So for this section, we're going to be deploying to Rink B. But again, depending on whatever the recommended testnet and the recommended faucet is, that will dictate which testnet you should actually deploy to. For us, it's going to be Rink B. To deploy to a testnet, remember, we're going to need gas. So we're going to need some test Ethereum, or if you're deploying to a mainnet, main Ethereum, which you shouldn't be, come to the top of the GitHub repo to make sure you have the most update faucet. The other place you can go is link token contracts page in the Chainlink documentation and scroll down to Ring B, and you can see testnet link available here, testnet ETH available here. So this is the other location you can always look to find the most up-to-date faucets. And both of them point right back here. So now that we're working with Injected Web 3, we can just go through the exact same steps to deploy to a testnet as to deploy to a virtual machine. And remember, if you run out of gas to deploy this, be sure to check back to the faucets to actually deploy this. So we're going to do the same thing. We're going to go ahead and hit deploy. But this time, MetaMask is going to pop up and ask us if we want to actually deploy this. This is the exact same as what we saw with the blockchain example, where we sign transactions. We are signing and sending this transaction. The data of this transaction is this massive, massive data thing here, which represents the contract that we just created. We can see all the payment information for this transaction for deploying this contract we see it's going to cost around this much Ethereum to deploy. But again, we're on the RinkB test network, so this is going to be fake Ethereum. We're going to go ahead, hit confirm. And if you pop up the little console in Remix, you'll see that after a, a slight delay, it'll actually say, have this green check mark that it's confirmed and that it went, actually went through. We can go ahead, right click, open a new tab, and view this on Etherscan. And after a slight delay, we'll actually be able to see the transaction details here exactly the same as our transaction details for sending Ethereum. We have a hash, we have a status, we have block, block confirmations, we have timestamp from, which is going to be us, to, which is going to be the address of the contract that we just created. We didn't send any value with this, so this is going to be zero Ether. And then, of course, we see the transaction fee. 
and as well as the gas price. Because again, deploying a contract to the blockchain is modifying the state of the blockchain, so we have to pay gas, and we can see all the different pieces here. As we can see, gas limit and gas usage is much higher than just sending Ethereum, since we are putting a lot of data on chain and adding a lot of computation. So this number is much higher than the 21,000 number of just sending Ethereum. Now, if we come back to our remix and scroll down, we're able to see our simple storage contract at this address. If we hit this copy button and we go to the Rink B ether scan, and we paste it in the search bar, we will get the contract that we just deployed. And we see this first transaction is gonna be the contract creation transaction. So this contract that we just created, one transaction, which is contract created. So now that we have this contract created, we have all the exact same functions that we saw when working with the JavaScript virtual machine or the our fake environment or our super fake environment. Now we can do all the exact same things that we did with the JavaScript VM, but on a real test network. So you'll see if I hit retrieve, MetaMask doesn't pop up because again, this is a blue view function. If we look people at zero, this is also a view function and nothing pops up. Name to favorite number should be blank. So if I type in Patrick now, absolutely nothing happens, right? I get, I get zero returned because mappings initialize every single key with a blank or a null value, which for unit 256 is zero. Now we can go ahead and store a favorite number. Storing a favorite number is gonna modify the blockchain. So our MetaMask should pop up for us to confirm the transaction and sign that transaction to modify the blockchain state. So I'm gonna store my favorite number of 16. We'll hit store. MetaMask will pop up and we're gonna go ahead and actually confirm this. Hitting confirm is equivalent to us signing this transaction and sending it to the blockchain to modify the state. So we're gonna go ahead and confirm this. We should be able to view this on Etherscan. And again, it might take a little bit for it to actually index or actually start working. So please be patient with these test nets. And again, this is why when building your applications, you want the testnet piece to absolutely try to be your last step because you have to wait a really long time and it puts a burden on these people running these test sets who are running it out of the goodness of their hearts. So please try to make this the last step of your actual building process. For us learning right here, it's okay. And after a slight delay, once we hit refresh, it looks like it's indexing on Etherscan. The Etherscan website is still figuring out where this transaction is. According to Remix, it looks like on the blockchain, this has actually already gone through. So now if we hit retrieve, we do indeed see our favorite number is 16. Of course, these two are still gonna be blank. And it looks like that transaction has gone through and Etherscan has indexed it. So now let's go ahead and add a person. We'll add Patrick. And our, my favorite number is gonna be 16. We'll go ahead and add person. Again, since these are orange, a transaction is gonna pop up because we're modifying the blockchain state. We'll go ahead and hit confirm. And we're gonna be a little bit patient here and wait for this transaction to go through. And we should see this update and this update. Now, if I hit name to favorite number of Patrick, I get 16. And if I hit people of zero, I get favorite number 16 and the name is Patrick. Awesome. So you've actually successfully deployed a contract to an actual testnet and actually seen on Etherscan what these transactions look like. You should be incredibly proud of yourself. Be sure to give yourself a high five, a pat on the back, send a tweet saying exactly how excited you are, but make sure to celebrate these little wins. Celebrating these little wins will give you the motivation to keep going and really excite you for learning each new thing. So a huge congratulations if you've got this far. You've deployed your first contract to a test net. Congratulations. Now, if you want to see what it looks like to deploy to a different network, all you need to do in your MetaMask is switch to a different test net. See, if we switch to Coven, Remix automatically updates and says, ah, the injected Web3 is now the Coven test network. We could switch again, maybe to Gorelli. We say, ah, the injected Web3 is now the Gorelli. This is the testnet that we'd be deploying to. Of course, we need actual testnet Ethereum to do any deploying, so we wouldn't be able to here. And if we go ahead and hit deploy right now, MetaMask pops up, but we get this little red thing saying insufficient funds, of course. Later on, we'll learn how to add new networks like Polygon, like Avalanche, like Phantom into our MetaMask so we can deploy from any one of them as well. Now, I mentioned this term before, but all this code that we wrote, when we hit this compile button, it compiles it down to the EVM or the Ethereum virtual machine. Don't worry too much about what this means. 
EVM is a standard of how to deploy smart contracts to Ethereum like blockchains. And any blockchain that implements a type of EVM, you can deploy Solidity code to. Some examples of EVM compatible blockchains are gonna be Avalanche, Phantom, and Polygon. Since these are EVM compatible, this means we can write our Solidity code and deploy to these blockchains, which again, I'll show you later on how to add these new networks into your MetaMask and then how to deploy them. Let's do a quick recap of our first smart contract and then you should absolutely take a break, maybe get some ice cream or a coffee because you absolutely deserve it. Congratulations. The first thing you always need to do in your smart contracts is tell Solidity what version of Solidity that you're gonna be using. And additionally, you wanna add an SPDX license identifier. Then you have to create your contract object and name your contract. A contract in Solidity is similar to a class in other programming languages. And everything inside the squiggly brackets is a part of that contract. There are many different types in Solidity, like unsigned integer 256, Boolean, string, bytes 32, etc. If we wanna create a new type, we can create what's called a struct in Solidity. You can create arrays or lists in Solidity. You can create dictionaries or what's called mappings in Solidity or hash tables, which when you give it a key, it'll spit out the value that that key represents. We can create functions in Solidity that modify the state of the blockchain. We can also create functions in Solidity that don't modify the state of the blockchain. View and pure functions don't modify the state of a blockchain. We also can specify different data locations in our functions. Call data and memory mean that that data is only temporary and will only exist for the duration of the function. Storage variables are permanent and stay there forever. Function parameters can't be storage variables because they're only gonna exist for the duration of the function. All the Solidity code that we work with, when we hit compile, it actually compiles down to this Ethereum virtual machine specifications. We'll learn more about those specifications later. And last but not least, another huge congratulations on your first contract here. Awesome. All right, let's get started on our lesson three. Remember, everything is in the GitHub repository and we can scroll down, hit lesson three and see all the code here. I'm building up this repo as I film. So underneath this lesson three is gonna be a lot more information than just the code here. All of our code samples end with dash FFC, which means dash free code camp. So if you see a GitHub repo that ends with dash FFC, know that that repository is associated with this course. I'm gonna do a quick high level walkthrough of what we're gonna be building in this lesson. So you don't need to code right now, just sit back, watch and enjoy. In this lesson, we're actually gonna to expand to having three different contracts. Let's say we want to be able to deploy simple storage contracts from a contract itself. Yes, contracts can indeed deploy contracts. We are gonna create a contract called storagefactory.soul that's gonna be able to deploy and interact with other contracts itself. So what we could do is we could go deploy this to a JavaScript VM. We're gonna choose storage factory and we're gonna go ahead and hit deploy. In our contract down below, we have a number of different functions. Our top function is this function called create simple storage contract, which we can click and it'll actually create a simple storage contract for us. Then we can go ahead and interact with it. At an X zero, we'll save a favorite number of one. Now, if we hit SF get zero, we get one back and we can see the address of the simple storage contract that we just deployed. Additionally, we're gonna learn about a number of Solidity features such as importing, inheritance, and so much more. So let's go ahead and jump in. And remember, all the code is available here from the GitHub repository. So be sure to refer back to these contracts if you get lost. So here we are back in Remix and we have our simple storage.sol. If you skipped over the last section, be sure to go to the full blockchain Solidity course JS and scroll down to lesson two, welcome to Remix, and grab this code, go to simplestorage.sol, and copy paste this code into Remix because this is where we're gonna be starting from. We have this simple storage contract, which is great. It allows us to store a favorite number and it allows us to store favorite numbers across different people in both mappings and arrays. But let's say we wanna get even more advanced with this. We actually can have a contract actually deploy other contracts for us and then go ahead and interact with those contracts from other contracts. Contracts interacting with each other is an essential part of working with Solidity and working with smart contracts. 
The ability for contracts to seamlessly interact with each other is what's known as composability. Smart contracts are composable because they can easily interact with each other. This is especially awesome when it comes to things like DeFi, where you can have really complex financial products interact with each other incredibly easily since all their code is available on chain. So we're gonna learn how to do that. So let's keep our simple storage contract exactly the way it is. We're gonna create a new contract called storage factory. So we're gonna hit the new file button and type in storage factory.sol. And let's close this off for now. So let's go ahead and get this contract set up. From what we learned before, first thing we're gonna to wanna to do is the SPDX license identifier which we're gonna do MIT. And then the next thing we're always gonna need is our Solidity version. So we'll do Pragma Solidity, and we could do 0 0.8.7, but for this one, let's do 0 0.8.0, and then just add the caret, meaning any version of 0 0.8 point something will work. And then let's add our contract name, which is gonna be Storage Factory. Now hit Command S or Control S, or go to the Compile tab and hit Compile, and boom, we have our regular setup here. Now we wanna create a function that can actually deploy our simple storage contract. So we'll create a function called function create simple storage contract. We'll have it be public so anybody can call it. We'll have it deploy a simple storage contract and save it to a global variable. But before we can do it, how can our storage factory contract know what our simple storage contract looks like in order to deploy it? If our storage factory contract is going to deploy simple storage, it's going to need to know the code of simple storage. One way we can do this is we can actually go to our simple storage.sol and copy everything underneath Pragma Solidity and down and paste it into our storage factory.sol underneath our Pragma Solidity. If we go ahead and compile and save this, it actually works. Our storage factory.sol contract actually now has two contracts in it. It has the simple storage contract and it has the storage factory contract in it. If you actually go to the deploy tab and scroll down to deploy while you're on the storage factory.sol, not the simple storage.sol, on storage factory, you can see that you can actually choose which one of these contracts to deploy. A single file of Solidity can hold multiple different contracts. Now that we have our simple storage.sol in our storage factory, we can actually go ahead and create this function to deploy a simple storage.sol. We're gonna create a global variable the same way that we would create any other global variable. We'll do the type, which is gonna be type simple storage contract. We'll give it a visibility, a public, and we'll give it a variable name. Type simple storage contract, it's gonna be public. The name of the variable is gonna be simple storage. Now in our function, create simple storage contract, we're gonna say simple storage equals new, simple storage. This new keyword is how Solidity knows, ah, okay, we're gonna deploy a new simple storage contract. So we go ahead and compile this. We'll go to the deploy tab, make sure we're on the JavaScript VM. We'll scroll down to the contract and we'll choose storage factory. And remember, you need to have storage factory.sol selected in order for that to show up. Storage factory. We'll go ahead and hit deploy. And now, we see our storage factory contract has two buttons. One is create simple storage, and the other one is gonna be a view of our simple storage contract. If we click it right now, it's gonna show us that it's currently at address zero because it gets initialized to being blank. It's saying there is no simple storage contract currently deployed. Now, if we pull up our console and click create simple storage, we see we created a new function call storage factory dot create simple storage contract and in doing so, we called this function, which created and deployed a new simple storage contract. We can now see what address the simple storage contract is at by clicking the simple storage button, and we see the address associated with it. So now we know how a contract can actually deploy another contract. But the thing is, having this massive chunk of code above our storage factory is a little bit redundant, especially since we have our other file called simplestorage.sol. And let's say we have a contract that has got a ton of other contracts in it, always copy pasting all these contracts is gonna be a lot of work. So instead, what we can do is use what's called an import. So let's go ahead and delete our contract simple storage. And now we're just gonna type import dot slash simple storage dot sol. This import dot slash simple storage dot sol 
is the exact same as our copy pasted version of simple storage.sol. It takes the path of another file, it takes the path, package, or GitHub, which we'll get to in a minute, of another file, and says, okay, we are going to paste that contract into the top of this contract here. And we actually see, if we go back to compile, we go to deploy, let's delete our old contract, we can actually see storagefactory.sol again, we can deploy it, click the drop down, and once again, we can run those functions exactly the same. Importing our contracts like this is much nicer than always copy pasting the code. This way, if we want to change something in simple storage, we have one canonical place to go ahead and change it instead of having to change it in multiple different places. Now, additionally, you'll notice the pragma solidity. If we have our contracts in two separate files, we actually can have different versions of solidity. Right now, our storage factory has caret 0.8.0, which means that anything within the 0.8 range of this contract is okay. But for simple storage.sol, it says anything in the 0.8.8 and above range is okay. So if we were to try to change the compiler version to 8.5 and then go ahead and compile, a remix is going to automatically bump it up to a better version that is compatible with both of them. In this case, 8.13. But if we, for example, changed our Solidity version of Storage Factory to 0.7.0 and then tried to compile them, we actually end up getting an issue. Parser error. Source file requires a different compiler version. This is because our storage factory is saying, hey, anything in the 0.7s is okay. However, our simple storage is saying anything in the 0.8.8 .8 and above is okay. So those two versions are not compatible. So what we need to do is we need to make sure our versions of Solidity are indeed compatible. So let's change the version back, recompile, and now we're looking good again. Now, since we have this create simple storage contract, Every single time we call it right now, it'll just replace whatever is currently in our public simple storage variable. Let's go ahead and update this so that we can actually keep a running list of all of our deployed simple storage contracts. So instead of having this be a single variable, we'll make this a simple storage array or list public simple storage array. Now, whenever we create a new simple storage contract, instead of saving it like this, what we're gonna do is we're gonna save it as a memory variable by saying simple storage, simple storage equals new simple storage. And we're gonna add this variable to our simple storage array. So same way we did it before, we're gonna do simple storage array dot push simple storage. So I should spell storage, right? Let's go ahead and compile this. Looks good. We'll deploy the storage factory, deploy, click here. We now have a simple storage array view button. We'll do create simple storage. Now we can view the simple storage contract at zero. Right now there's nothing at one, but if we create another simple storage contract, we can see the new simple storage contract address at index one. All right, so this is great. We can now keep track of all of our simple storage deployments, but how do we actually interact with them? Let's say we wanted to be able to call the store function on all of our simple storage.souls from our storage factory. You can think of the storage factory as almost like a manager of all of our simple storages.soul. Let's create a new function that can do exactly that. So we'll create function and we'll call it SF store, which is gonna stand for storage factory store. And it's gonna take a uint 256 simple storage index and a uint 256 underscore simple storage number. It'll be a public function as well. Now, in order for you to interact with any contract, you're always gonna need two things. And we're gonna refer to this a lot. You're always gonna need the address of the contract and the ABI of the contract. The ABI stands for application binary interface. The ABI will tell our code exactly how it can interact with the contract. We'll go deeper into ABI as we move on, but if you go to your compile tab, you hit compile and things are actually compiling, you can scroll down and you can see compilation details and you can see a whole bunch of information on your different contracts. You can see the name of your contract, which for our simple storage contract is simple storage. You can see a whole bunch of metadata like the compiler, the language, output settings, all this other stuff. You can see the exact bytecode 
and the opcodes, which we'll talk about much later. But you can also see this ABI. This ABI tells you all the different inputs and outputs and everything you could do with this contract. For example, in our simple storage, if we look at the zero width index of our ABI, we have a function add person. If we look at one, we see our name to favorite number. If we look at two, we can see our people. Three, retrieve. Four, store. It tells us all these different ways we can actually interact with our contract and the different functions that we can call. We know where our addresses are because we're storing them in this array here, our simple storage array. We can also get the ABI because we're importing simple storage.sol. When you compile simple storage.sol, as you saw in the compilation details, whenever you compile it, it comes prepackaged with the ABI. We automatically get the ABI just by importing it like this. In the future, we'll see other ways that we can actually get ABIs really easily. So to call the store function on one of our contracts, we're first gonna need to get that contract object. So what we can do is we can say simple storage variable named simple storage, variable named simple storage of type simple storage is gonna be equal to a simple storage object. And instead of doing new simple storage like we did last time, we're just gonna put the address of this simple storage object in here which again, we can get from our array. And in this function, we're passing the array index. So we can say simple storage contract at address, simple storage array at index, simple storage index. This bracket notation here is how you access different elements of arrays. So if we want the zero width element of our list here, simple storage index would be zero. And we pass it into this bit here, and then that'll give us the address of our simple storage contract, which we pass into simple storage here. Since this is an array of simple storage contracts, we can just access that simple storage contract using the index. So we would say simple store edge array at index underscore simple storage index. Now we're saving the contract object at index simple storage index to our simple storage variable. Our array here is keeping track of the addresses for us and it automatically comes with the ABIs here. If this was just an array of addresses of the contract objects instead, we would have to wrap the address in a simple storage object like this. But we'll get to that much later. So for now, all we have to do is this and we now have a simple storage contract object. Now that we have it, we can call our store function on the simple storage contract. So we'll call simple storage dot store and we'll store the simple storage number to it. So this is perfect. And if we were to deploy this right now though, we wouldn't be able to read this store function. So let's create another function that can read from the simple storage contract from the storage factory. So we'll create a function called SF get, which stands for storage factory get. It'll take a uint256 underscore simple storage index. This will be a public view function since we're just gonna be reading from our simple storage contract and it's gonna return a uint256 and we'll say simple storage, simple storage equals, we're gonna use this same syntax from up here to get the contract, simple storage array at the simple storage index. And then we're gonna do return simple storage dot retrieve to get that number that we just stored up here. And I should spell retrieve correctly so we get no issues. Perfect. So now we'll compile, we'll deploy JavaScript. We're working on a fake account. We're gonna use our storage factory. Let's go ahead and delete all the contracts we have so far. Let's go ahead and deploy, hit the drop down. Great. Right now, if we do SF get at zero, we're gonna get nothing. Simple storage at address zero is gonna be nothing. Let's create a simple storage contract. Now at simple storage list, we get an address at zero. If we hit SF get right now at index zero, we get zero. So let's store a value on this contract here. So the index of that contract is zero. So we're gonna pass zero as a simple storage index and we're gonna save the number seven. So we'll go ahead and do SF store. And if we did this right, this is gonna store 
the value seven into this contract. So if we do S of get of zero now, it does indeed return seven. If we do S of get of one, we're gonna get, nothing's gonna happen. And we're actually gonna get this revert error here. So let's create another simple storage contract. Now, if we do S of get of one, we get zero because we're gonna get that default value. Let's go ahead on the simple storage contract at index one, we'll store the number 16. We'll hit S of store. Now we'll do S of get of one and we get 16. Feel free to pause right now and play around with this so that you really understand it. The quick recap is our storage factory contract allows us to create simple storage contracts. It then saves it to our simple storage array, which we can then call different functions on. We can store values from our storage factory contract, and then we can read values from our storage factory contract for any of the simple storage contracts that we've created. This is incredibly powerful. We can additionally make these two functions even easier. We can call the retrieve function directly on this. When we call simple storage array, and then we add these brackets and add the simple storage index, this returns a simple storage object. So what we could do is we could actually delete this whole part and just do dot retrieve right here and then delete this line and say return and just have it be just like this. If you go ahead and save or hit compile, you'll get the green check mark there. We're calling the retrieve function on whatever this is and whatever this is, is a simple storage object. So perfect. We can do the same thing up here by deleting this part and just doing dot store underscore simple store edge number. Ta -da. We save it and this will work exactly the same. Awesome. We now have a simple storage contract that can store variables and a storage factory contract that can be almost like a manager of these simple storage contracts and deploy and interact with them themselves. This is fantastic. Now, let's say that we really like the simple storage contract, but it doesn't do everything that we want it to do. Maybe we want it so that whenever we actually store a value, it doesn't store the favorite number, it stores the favorite number plus five. For some reason, you want a contract that, that everyone's favorite number is five numbers bigger than what they think it is. But you really like everything else that this contract has to offer. Let's create this new contract and we'll call it extra storage. So we'll say extra storage.sol and we'll create this new contract. We're gonna set it up the exact same way we normally would. SPDX license identifier, it's gonna be MIT. We'll give it pragma solidity and we'll just do 0 0.8.0 with the caret and we'll say contract extra storage like so. If you save or compile, you'll get the green check mark. So what could we do? Well, the first thing we could do is we could copy paste all this code back into here and then modify our extra storage contract as we see fit. This seems a little bit redundant and a lot of work though. So what's another way we could actually get our extra storage contract to be like our simple storage contract? Well, this is where we can do something called inheritance. We can have our extra storage contract be what's called a child contract of our simple storage contract. And we can have extra storage inherit all the functionality of simple storage with two lines of code. So first, in order for our extra storage contract to know about simple storage, we once again need to import it. So we'll say import dot slash simple storage dot soul. And we'll say our contract extra storage is simple storage. And we save or compile. Now our extra storage contract is going to be the exact same as simple storage, and it's gonna do what's called inherit all the functionality of simple storage. And we can actually even see that. Let's go ahead and make sure this is compiled. And we'll go and deploy this. And now in our deployed contract, we can see we have extra storage deployed with all the functions that simple storage has. If you want a contract to inherit all the functionality of another contract, you can just import it and say your contract is that other contract. Now we can add additional functions to our extra storage contract that'll include all the functionality of simple storage. Now let's say that we inherit simple storage to extra storage. However, one of the functions in simple storage we don't really actually like. So if we go back to our simple storage contract, 
Our store function, all it does is take a favorite number and then it assigns the global favorite number to whatever new number that we give it. In our extra storage, we want the store function to do something different. We want it to add five to any number that we give it. How can we achieve this? Well, we can do something called overriding the functions. And there are two keywords that we're gonna use. Those are virtual and override. Right now, if I were to try to implement a store function for extra storage, let's see what happens. We'll say function store, you went 256, favorite number. It'll be a public function. And let's say, instead of just storing favorite number, we'll say favorite number equals favorite number plus five. If we try to compile this right now, we'll actually run into two different errors. First one is gonna say overriding function is missing override specifier. If the parent contract, which in our case is simple storage, has that same function, we need to tell Solidity that we're gonna override this store function. And instead, we're gonna use this store function. But additionally, we get this other error saying trying to override non-virtual function. Did you forget to add virtual? In order for a function to be overridable, you need to add the virtual keyword to the store function. Now it can be overridable. However, if we save and compile, we still have this issue. Overriding function is missing override specifier. And then all we need to do is add override to our store function. Now, if we save, everything compiles correctly. Let's go ahead and deploy this. Let's delete our old contracts. JavaScript VM, write account. Great, we're gonna choose extra storage. Let's go ahead and deploy. And here's our extra storage contract. Right now, if we hit retrieve, we get zero. Previously, our store function would store the exact number. However, if I were to store five, it'll store five plus five. So we should have 10 stored here. Let's go ahead, call store. Looks like that went through and we'll hit retrieve now. And we do indeed see 10 is in here. So this is how we do inheritance and we override functions. And that's it for this section. You've just learned a ton of incredibly powerful Solidity for having multiple files. Let's do a quick overview of what we learned. We learned that we can actually deploy contracts from other contracts using the new keyword. We learned that we can actually import other contracts into our contracts and into our code using the import keyword. And the import keyword is the same as copy and pasting that file to the location of the import line. We learned that we can interact with other contracts as long as we have the ABI and address. We didn't learn too much about the ABI, but we'll learn more later. We learned that if we want to create a child contract and inherit the functionality of some other contract, we can use something called inheritance. And the way to inherit functionality is using the is keyword and saying our contract is some other contract. However, if we wanna change some of the functionality of the parent contract, we have to override that function. And additionally, we have to set the function we want to override to virtual. Now we can have our own store function do whatever we want it to do. That is the end of this lesson. Once again, give yourself a huge round of applause, a pat on the back for making it this far and for finishing this section. You're getting more and more advanced with Solidity so quickly. So be sure to celebrate the little wins by getting some ice cream, maybe going for a walk or tweeting about it or posting on Reddit. Congratulations, you have completed this section. All right, everybody, welcome back. We are now headed into lesson four, Remix Fund Me. And of course, all the code can be found on the GitHub repository associated with this course. We're gonna be working with two contracts here. One of them is fundme.sol, and then one of them is priceconverter.sol. Fundme.sol is gonna be a contract that allows people to actually fund a collective good. So people can send Ethereum, send Ethereum or Polygon or Avalanche or Phantom or whatever blockchain native token into this contract and some owner of the contract can then withdraw those funds and do whatever they want. After deploying this to a testnet, we can see the list of functions this contract has. This will have two red buttons, which are used to notate two payable functions in fund, in our fund function, and in our withdraw function. Withdraw allows users to withdraw the funding and fund allows users to send money to the contract. What we can do is we can send some value along with our transaction and we call this fund function. And then what we can do is we can actually fund this contract with a certain amount of ETH or way by pasting some value 
into the way value section and then hitting fund. We will now have sent money into our deployed contract. And we can see a list of the funders and a mapping of those addresses and how much they've actually sent into the contract. We can then withdraw the funds out of the contract with a special exception with only the person who deployed this contract can actually withdraw the funds back out. Once the funds are withdrawn, the amount of all the funders is reset back to zero. Are you excited? Well, you should be. And if you finish this section, you'll have completed most of the basics of Solidity and you'll be ready to start making even more powerful smart contracts. We'll be using Chainlink price feeds to actually set the value of how much these people should be able to fund in USD as opposed to just in terms of Ether. We're gonna go over a lot of advanced sections here and I'll let you know what parts might be a little bit harder to digest so you don't have to spend your entire time trying to figure out exactly what's going on. Be sure to use the GitHub repo to your advantage here and the discussions tab to stay connected with other people taking this lesson. All right, let's jump in. So at this point in Remix, you'll have a couple of contracts here. Simple storage, storage factory, extra storage. Maybe you refresh Remix and these have gone away. In any case, make sure that you just don't have any of those tabs open. We're going to create a new contract called FundMe. So let's go ahead and start creating our FundMe contract. Again, we want it to be able to get funds from users, withdraw funds, and set a minimum funding value in USD. This is what we're going to get our contract to do. But first, let's set it up. SPDX, license identifier, MIT. We'll do pragma, solidity. We'll do caret, 0 0.8.8. .8, and we'll do contract, fund me. Awesome. And we'll compile, see if things look good. And they do. Great. Let's keep going. So before we actually embark on creating all of our functions here, Let's just add the different functions that we're going to implement. So we want a function fund for people to actually send money to. We want a function withdraw for the owner of this contract to actually withdraw the funds that different funders actually give us. And that's pretty much it. These are the two main functions that we want this contract to do. We will be implementing more functions to help facilitate these two functions. But let's get started by looking at fund. Let's comment out withdraw for now and let's just start with fund. So we want anybody to be able to call this fund function. So we'll make this public. So as we mentioned, we want to be able to set a minimum fund amount in USD. So there's a lot of things to think about here. First thing we probably want to think about is how do we send ETH to this contract? Whenever we create a transaction on the, on any of these EVM blockchains, there's this value field that we can set. Value represents how much Ethereum we're going to be sending with our transactions. For example, when we transferred Ethereum between our different accounts, we were actually populating this value parameter with different amounts of Ethereum. In fact, every single transaction that we send will have these fields. It'll have a nonce or the transaction count, the account, the gas price, the gas limit that we've seen on Etherscan, a two, aka the address that the transaction is sent to, a value, which is going to be this amount that we're talking about. We'll also have data, which is going to be what we send if we make a function call or deploy a contract. And then we'll have this VRS components. We're not really going to go over these VR and S because this is that cryptographic magic that's happening when a transaction is signed, but just know that that's in there. For sending value, we can populate some of these fields. The gas limit, for example, is populated to 21,000. Data is going to be empty. And then that two is going to be the address of the transaction we want to send to. For a function call, we can also still populate the way that we want to send. So we can call a function and send a value at the same time. In Remix, it has a little drop down here for way, gway, finny, and ether. We're going to ignore finny for now. But of course, we have our way, gway, and ether again, where one ether is worth this much gway and this much way. The first thing we need to do in order to make a function payable with Ethereum or any other native blockchain currency is we need to mark the function as payable. It's this payable keyword that makes our fund function red as opposed to having it normal orange. Just like how our wallet can hold funds, contract addresses can hold funds as well. Since every time you deploy a contract, they get a contract address, it's nearly the exact same as a wallet address. So both wallets and contracts can hold native blockchain token like Ethereum. And you'll see that when we deploy this later on in the lesson, 
that it actually will gain a balance of Ethereum. Now that we have it payable, we can access this value attribute by using one of the global keywords in Solidity with message.value. To get how much value somebody is sending, you use message.value in your function. Now, let's say we wanted to set our message.value to a certain value of Ethereum. Let's say we wanted it to be, let's say we wanted people to send at least one whole Ether with all their transactions. Or put another way, if they sent Ethereum, they would need to send at least one Ethereum. How would we implement that? Well, we could use something called require. We would say we would want to require the message.value is greater than 1E18. There's a couple things to unpack here. 1E18 is equal to 1 times 10 raised to the 18th, which is also equal to 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. This is the value in way of one Ethereum. This much way is one ETH. So if we wanted the message dot value to be at least one ETH or one polygon or what avalanche, et cetera, we would set it like this. Require message dot value is greater than one. This require keyword is a checker. It says, hey, is message dot value greater than one? If not, it's gonna revert. It's going to do what's called revert with an error message. And we can say, didn't send enough. We can try deploying this on a JavaScript VM. We'll deploy FundMe. We'll hit deploy. Look at FundMe. We see this fund button is now red. If we call FundMe right now and we look at the console, you can see we actually get an error here. Call it again. We get an error. We get an error here. We know that the error is going to be this. Didn't send enough. So what we need to do is we need to send at least one ETH with this fund transaction in order for this require statement to be fulfilled. So back up in the value section, we can change this value to one. So that's gonna be one ether or this much way or this much way. Now we can hit fund. Oh, actually it needs to be greater than one. So let's send two, for example. Now we'll scroll down and now we'll hit fund. And we see that that actually passes. The require statement says, if our first section is false, then go ahead and revert with this error. What is reverting? Reverts can be a little bit confusing, so I wouldn't let this section hold you back if it's a little bit confusing. Revert is when it undoes any actions that happened before and sends the remaining gas back. So what does that actually look like? Well, let's say for example, we get a uint256 public number. And in our fund function, we said number equals five. If we were to go ahead and deploy this, let's delete our old contract deploy this new contract, our number right now is zero, but if we were to call our fund function, number gets set to five. However, if we call fund and this require isn't met, this transaction would revert and undo setting number to five. So let's go ahead and look at our logs here. We'll keep value to zero so that our fund function reverts. We'll call fund. We'll see that this transaction failed because this require ended up reverting and number is still zero. So then the question becomes, did we actually spend gas? Yes, we spent gas to change number to five, and then any remaining gas, we would get returned by this require. For example, if we had a ton of computation here, a ton of computation here, we would have need to send a ton of gas with our fund function. But all of the extra gas that we send after this require gets returned to the original user after it gets reverted right here. If reverts are a little bit confusing for you here, don't worry too much about it. We'll go over it in future modules. All you need to know right now is that when you do a require statement, if this first section isn't met, the transaction will be canceled and any prior work will be undone and it'll send an error message. So cool. Let's delete this number for now and we'll delete it from the global scope. There's actually another way to do these reverts, which we'll go over later in this contract. So what we've done so far is great. However, we're checking message.value in terms of Ethereum. We're looking for one whole Ethereum instead of $50. We want to check that message.value is greater than some number like $50. Let's go ahead and first set the minimum USD value we want people to send along with the fund function. We can do that at the top of our contract. We can say UN256 public minimum 
USD equals 50. Now we have some place to check for minimum USD. We're going to update this minimum USD to make it more gas efficient in a little bit. Now that we've set our minimum USD, we want to be able to require the message.value is greater than, or let's say greater than or equal to the minimum USD. But minimum USD is in terms of USD and value is in terms of Ethereum. So how do we convert Ethereum to USD? This is where oracles and Chainlink are going to come into play. The USD value of Ethereum is something that we've assigned outside of the blockchain to each Ethereum or any other layer one currency or any other native smart contract platform currency. So in order to get this value that is outside the blockchain, we have to use a decentralized Oracle network to get the price of one Ether in terms of USD. So before we can continue on here, let's learn a little bit more about the architecture of these decentralized Oracle networks and the different solutions that they have so that we can create this FundMe contract in the most advanced way possible. As we've talked about, blockchains are deterministic systems, which means that they themselves can't actually interact with real world data and events. They don't know what the value of an Ethereum is. They don't know what random numbers are. They don't know if it's sunny outside. They don't know the temperature. They don't know who's president. They don't know any of this information. These blockchains also can't do any external computation. Maybe you have some amazing artificial intelligence model that you want to integrate with a smart contract. Smart contracts by themselves can't do anything with that. As we've mentioned, this is because blockchains are deterministic by design. This is so that all the nodes can reach consensus. If you start adding variable data or random data or values that return from an API call, different nodes could get different results and they would never be able to reach a consensus. This is known as the smart contract connectivity problem or the Oracle problem. And this is bad news because we want our smart contracts to be able to replace traditional agreements and traditional agreements need data and they need to interact with the real world. So this is where Chainlink and blockchain oracles come into place. A blockchain oracle is going to be any device that interacts with the off-chain world to provide external data or computation to smart contracts. However, the whole story doesn't even end there. If we use a centralized oracle, we are reintroducing a point of failure. We've done all this work to make our logic layer decentralized, but if we get our data through a centralized node or through a centralized API, or we decide we want to make the API call ourselves, we are reintroducing these trust assumptions that we've worked so hard to get rid of. We're essentially ruining the entire purpose of building a smart contract. So we don't want to get our data or do external computation through centralized nodes. Those are bad news. Chainlink is the solution here. Chainlink is a decentralized Oracle network for bringing data and external computation into our smart contracts. As we mentioned before, this gives rise to these hybrid smart contracts, which combine on-chain and off-chain to make incredibly feature-rich, powerful applications. Chainlink is a modular decentralized Oracle network that can be customized to deliver any data or do any external computation that you like. So for example, a lot of people say, oh, I can just make an HTTPS call to some API and we'll be good to go. The blockchain nodes can't make these HTTPS calls because they wouldn't be able to reach consensus if they called the node at different times or they did something else, all the consensus would be broken. So instead, we need a decentralized network of Chainlink Oracles to do this. And then in the transaction, this network of nodes will return the data to our smart contracts for us. Now, Chainlink networks can be completely customized to bring any data or any external computation as, that you want. However, doing the customization can be a little bit extra work. There are a ton of Chainlink features that come out of the box, completely decentralized, ready to plug and play into your smart contract applications. What are those features? The first one is going to be Chainlink data feeds, and that's the one we're actually going to be using for our application here. Chainlink data feeds currently at the time of recording are powering over $50 billion in the DeFi world. The way they work is a network of Chainlink nodes gets data from different exchanges and data providers and brings that data through a network of decentralized Chainlink nodes. The Chainlink nodes use a median to figure out what the actual price of the asset is and then deliver that in a single transaction to what's called a reference contract, a price feed contract, or a data contract on chain that other smart contracts can use. And then those smart contracts use that, that pricing information to power their DeFi application. We can see an example, we can see an example at data.chain.link. And you can change networks, you can change price feeds, you can change a whole bunch of different information to see some of the most popular price feeds. 
let's look at ETHUSD, for example. On ETHUSD, we can see this whole network of independent Chainlink node operators that are each getting different answers for the price of ETHUSD. They're getting aggregated by the network and then delivered on chain. We can see how often they're updated. These ones are updated for a 0.5 deviation threshold or a few hour heartbeat, whichever one hits first. We can see when the last update was, we can see the number of Oracle responses, etc. We can see the contract address directly on chain. And we can even look at the contract on Etherscan. We can see some of the history. We can see all the responses of the different oracles. And then at the bottom, we can see the different users and sponsors keeping this network up. Similar to transaction gas, whenever a node operator delivers data to a smart contract, the Chainlink node operators are paid a little bit of Oracle gas in the Chainlink token. Right now, these users of the protocol are sponsoring keeping these feeds up and are paying the Oracle gas associated with delivering this data on chain. Here's an illustration of what the current model of these data feeds look like. A network of these Chainlink nodes each reaches out and gets the information about an asset and then signs the data with their own private key. In a single transaction then, one node will deliver all the data with all the different signatures to a reference contract. If that node doesn't deliver the data, another node will send it instead. Reputation is incredibly important when you're a Chainlink node operator. If you miss data updates, if you forget to send transactions, you'll probably be quickly kicked off these networks and have no chance of making any more money in the future. These data feeds are used by some of the largest protocols in the space, such as Synthetix, SushiSwap, Compound, and Aave with several billion dollars each. We can take a look at an example over at docs.chain.link. Work with EVM contracts. We're gonna hit EVM chains, scroll down to data feeds. We'll scroll down to the Solidity section and we can see an example of an entire contract that uses and reads from one of these Chainlink price feeds. We can even open this up in Remix and work with it in Remix. It looks like this example is reading from a price feed on Coven. The reason we're actually going to use a testnet to see this work is that there's a set of Chainlink nodes monitoring the test network to, to show you exactly how this works out. Once we get deeper into the course, we'll show you how to actually run tests and work with Chainlink nodes without actually being on a testnet, which will make your development much faster. But I highly recommend walking through this section along with me so that you can see firsthand how this actually works. So let's go ahead to faucets.chain.link slash coven. We're going to switch to the coven network and we're gonna get some Coven ETH. But remember, look at the network flag and use whatever network is in the documentation. So to get some Coven, we're gonna to come to the faucet. We're gonna turn off test link. We'll just stay with ETH. I'm not a robot. And then send request. Once our Coven Ethereum has reached our wallet, we can go ahead and close. And we can take a look in our wallet and see that we do indeed have 0.1 ETH on Coven. Now let's go back to our remix. We'll compile this contract. We'll go and deploy this on Injected Web 3. And again, the reason we're going to use Injected Web 3 instead of JavaScript VM is that there's no network of Chainlink nodes watching our little fake JavaScript VM. There are a network of Chainlink nodes watching the testnet. So we'll scroll down. We'll switch contract to the price consumer v3 and we'll hit deploy. MetaMask will pop up. And after a brief delay, we can see our price feed consumer down here and we can hit get the latest price, which shows us the latest price of Ethereum in terms of USD. You may be wondering why the number looks so weird. That seems like a really large number for the price of Ethereum in terms of USD. And this is because decimals don't actually work so well in Solidity. And we'll get to that in a little bit. There's a decimals flag associated with this price feed address that tells us how many decimals to include with this price. It's also in the documentation. However, I know that this one has eight decimals. So this is saying the value of Ethereum right now is $3,262. It may of course be different when you go ahead and try this. Now there's a number of things that happen in this contract that I'll explain in our fund me example. But if you wanna take a look now and see if you can figure out what's going on, I recommend you do so. Price feeds are one of the most powerful out of the box decentralized features you can use in your smart contract to level them up, especially for decentralized finance. If you're looking for different addresses of different price feeds, you can check the contract addresses section of the documentation, choose the network that you want, and then scroll down and then look some of the different addresses of the different price feeds. For example, this address will give you the price of one inch token in terms of Ethereum. This address will give you the price of the Apple stock in terms of USD 
and so on and so forth. The next decentralized application right out of the box is going to be Chainlink VRF or Chainlink Verifiable Randomness Function. Once we do our lottery example a little bit later, we'll talk about how randomness can be manipulated in blockchain. Blockchains are deterministic systems, which by definition means that they can't have randomness. If you can determine what a random number is, it's not really random anymore, is it? So we need a way to get a provably random number by looking outside of the blockchain. And oracles are perfectly positioned to do exactly that. Chainlink verifiable randomness function is a way to get provably a random number into our smart contract to guarantee fairness and guarantee randomness of applications. Many protocols like Pool Together, Axie Infinity, Ethercards, Avagochis, and more use Chainlink VRF for lotteries, for randomizing NFTs, for gaming, and for more. We're gonna do an example of Chainlink VRF in a later section once we get to the lottery section. If you wanna see if you can play with the randomness yourself right now, I recommend you going to docs.chain.link, EVM chains, and scroll down to get a random number. And this will teach you how to get a provably random number into your applications. The next decentralized out of the box feature of Chainlink is Chainlink Keepers, which is decentralized event-driven execution. As you've seen, in order to kick off some type of transaction, somebody needs to spend the gas and somebody needs to sit down and hit the go button or hit the transact button or hit the send button. This is obviously a centralized vector if you have a decentralized application that needs to run at specific times or after specific events are triggered. Chainlink keepers are the solution to this. Chainlink keepers are Chainlink nodes that listen to a registration contract for different events that you specify to fire. Maybe you say every 10 minutes you want to do something or once a week do something. Or if the price of some asset hits some number or maybe a liquidity pool is at a certain level, whatever event that you want to code, you absolutely can. The Chainlink nodes constantly listen for these triggers to happen and check the different contracts for these triggers. Once a trigger returns true, the Chainlink nodes will then perform whatever action that you tell the Chainlink nodes to do. We're also not gonna go over the Chainlink Keepers examples right now because we're gonna get to them in a later module. However, if you wanna try them out, go to docs.chain.link slash Ethereum, going and go to making compatible contracts and feel free to read the documentation and try it out yourself. The last out of the box feature of Chainlink is the most customizable, but also the hardest to get correct. End-to-end -end reliability is the ultimate promise of our smart contracts. And we want and need them to be able to do anything. We want to be able to take any input and get any output. Making HTTP GET, HTTP POST requests is an easy way to customize our Chainlink nodes to be able to do anything. Remember how we talked about making API calls that blockchain nodes themselves can't do that? Well, Chainlink nodes can do that. Chainlink nodes can make direct requests to any API that you specify. In order to do this, you both have to choose the Chainlink node and the URL slash data to send the request to. This is a little bit trickier than Chainlink VRF, keepers, or price feeds because you then have to be responsible for creating the Chainlink network that gets data from many different Chainlink nodes and many different data providers. But let's look at an example in Remix anyways. For this section, feel free to just watch since we are working with a testnet here. And testnets, as we've seen, can take a little bit of time. As long as you're familiar with the, what this process looks like, that's good enough. You don't actually have to try it if you don't want to. So we'll open up in Remix. We'll read through. It looks like this example is on the COVID network. So we'll go ahead and compile API consumer. We're gonna go ahead and deploy on the injected web three, we're gonna make sure that we're back on the COVID test network. We're gonna scroll down and we're gonna change the contract to the API consumer. And we're gonna go ahead and hit deploy. We're gonna deploy this contract to the COVID test net. And now we can call this function called request volume data to actually make an API call. Now, like I mentioned before, whenever we request data from a Chainlink node, we have to pay a little bit of Oracle gas or link token in order to pay some link token, we're going to need to have link token in our API consumer contract. This is what's known as the basic request and receive model. To get link token, we go back to our faucet and this time we'll select 10 test link for our contract. Let's go ahead and verify that we're human and we'll hit send request. This time, instead of sending us Ethereum, they're sending us 10 test link, which is what's known as an ERC20 token or more accurately in ERC-677. We'll get to understanding that a little bit later. We can see the asset in our MetaMask by importing the token. In order to get the token, we're gonna come back to the documentation and we're gonna look up link token contracts like that. We're gonna to go to the network that we just got the tokens on, which for us was Coven. 
We're going to copy this address. And we're going to go to MetaMask, hit Import Tokens, paste that address, and hit Add Custom Token, and then Import Tokens. And now we can see in our account one, we both have Ethereum and 10 Link. Now that we have our Link or our Oracle Gas, we're going to send it to our API consumer. We're going to copy the address of the API consumer, open up our MetaMask, we're going to hit Send, paste the address of our contract, switch the asset to Link. For now, we'll just send 0.2 Link. We'll hit Next, we'll hit Next, and we'll hit Confirm, and we'll wait for this transaction to go through. I chose 0.2 Link because in this contract, there's a fee character, which tells us how much making an API call for this is gonna cost. This one is actually 0.1 link. I send 0.2 just in case we wanna make that API call twice. Everything that's going on in this function will explain in a little bit later section. But for now, I just wanna show you what it looks like to use. Once we send the link to our contract, we can first check to see what the volume is. The volume is zero. We wanna get the volume of the last 24 hours of the Ethereum asset. We're gonna be calling this API, which has a ton of raw data, including one in specific, called volume over the last 24 hours, which is gonna be this number right here. Say we want to get this into our contract from this API. We're gonna make an HTTP GET call to this API. And what's gonna happen is we're gonna make the request in one transaction, and in a second transaction, the Chainlink node is gonna return the value and store it in this volume variable in the global scope. So let's go ahead and hit request volume data. MetaMask is gonna pop up. We're gonna go ahead and hit confirm. And you'll notice right away, volume doesn't update. This is again, because we actually need to wait two transactions. We're sending a transaction for the request. And then in a second transaction, the Chainlink node is actually going to respond. And after a slight delay, the Chainlink node has indeed responded with the result of making that API call back to our contract. We'll go over this process a little bit more in depth in later sections. The reason that I wanted to show you specifically the API calls is because we're going to show you a real life example of how to use Chainlink VRF and Chainlink Keepers in a later lesson. Now, I know we've already gone over a ton, so let's do a quick review. In order to send Ethereum or whatever native blockchain token with a function, you need to mark it as payable. If you need something in your contract to happen and you want the whole transaction to fail, if that doesn't happen, you can use a require statement. To get the Ethereum or native blockchain token value of a transaction, you can use the global keyword message.value. Chainlink is a technology for getting external data and doing external computation in a decentralized context for our smart contracts. Chainlink data feeds or price feeds are ways to read pricing information or other pieces of data from the real world that's already aggregated and decentralized for us. Chainlink VRF is a way to get provably random numbers from the real world into our smart contracts. Chainlink Keepers are a way to do decentralized event-driven computation. We can set some trigger, say, if this trigger hits, do something. And we get to define what the trigger is and what the do something is. Chainlink Any APIs is the ultimate customization of Chainlink nodes and allows us to connect to anything on the planet. To make this one production ready, we have to do the most work. Because it doesn't come already with a decentralized Oracle network, like Chainlink Keepers and Price Feeds. We'll learn more about these Chainlink services as we continue in this course. Now, in order for us to figure out if our message.value is actually greater than the minimum USD that we set, we actually have to convert our message.value from its layer one slash Ethereum to the USD equivalent. So how are we actually gonna do that? Well, first we're gonna need to get the price of Ethereum or Phantom or Avalanche or whatever layer one blockchain that we're working with. So let's create a function to get that price, to get that conversion rate. So we'll do function get price. And this is going to be the function that we use to get the price of Ethereum in terms of USD. So we can convert our message.value to USD. And then we're also going to do a function called get conversion rate. And these are both going to be public functions so that we can go ahead and call them and test them and do whatever we want with them. So in order to get the price, we're going to have to use one of these Chainlink data feeds to get the pricing information. And we can look right here at this contract to see what using one of these Chainlink price feeds looks like. What we're actually doing when we're interacting with this Chainlink price feed is we're actually reading 
from one of these contracts. There's a contract out there called the aggregator contract that is a function called latest round data, which returns a whole bunch of data, but namely this int price. And this int price is what we are interested in. Let's look at our get price function and figure out how do we actually call this? Since this is an instance of us interacting with a contract outside of our project, we're gonna need two things. What are those two things? We're gonna need the ABI of the contract and also the address of the contract. So the address of the contract is gonna be easy. We can get the address of the contract from the contract addresses section of the Chainlink data feeds. Let's scroll on down to rink B and we can find the ETH USD address on rink B and we'll create this contract so that it works on rink B. So we're gonna grab this address, we're gonna copy it and we're gonna move back to our, to our code here and we're gonna paste the address here. So great, we have the address now. We have the address of the other contract that we wanna interact with. Now, how do we get the ABI? Well, what we did before with simple storage was we imported the entire contract into our code here. That's something that we could do, but that's actually a lot of code. So what's something that we could do instead? Remember, if we're looking at Remix and we look at one of the contracts that we compiled before, the ABI is really just kind of this list of the different functions and interactions you can have with a contract. The ABI itself doesn't actually need to include any of the logic. It just needs to include, hey, here are the different functions that you can call. For example, in this contract, we can call fund, we have get conversion rate, we have get price. They're not implemented yet, but they will be eventually. Now there technically is another way to interact with contracts without the ABI, but for now, we're just gonna ignore that. So how can we get the ABI? There's a concept in Solidity called an interface. And let's look at an example of an interface. If we go to github.com slash smart contract kit slash Chainlink, we can see a number of different contracts in the Chainlink repository. We can go to contracts, SRC, V0.8, interfaces, and we'll go to aggregator v3 interface.sol. And if we look at the Solidity in here, we can see a whole bunch of function declarations but none of the logic is actually implemented in this. This is what's known as an interface. If we compile this, we'll actually get the ABI of a contract because it defines all the different ways we can interact with a contract. It doesn't actually say what these functions do, which is fine though, because we don't need to know what the functions actually do. Those are gonna be stored in the contract. So what we can do is we can grab this interface from the code and paste it into our remix. Now, hold on, if you're following along, you don't have to copy paste this with me because I'm gonna show you an easier way in just a second. So for now, feel free to go ahead and just watch. But once we have this interface aggregator v3 interface, we can now use this to make API calls. So now we could say aggregator v3 interface at this address and the combination of these two give us that aggregator v3 contract with whatever code is here. If at this contract address, this aggregator v3 interface is valid, we can do something like dot version. Let's look at this interface. Is there a version function? There sure is. So that means we can call the version function on this contract. So let's actually go ahead and copy this into a different section. I'm gonna create a new function called get version just to illustrate this. It's gonna be a public, it's gonna be a view, and it's gonna return the uint 256, and we're gonna split it up into two steps here, but we're gonna say aggregator v3 interface price feed. So we're creating a variable of type aggregator v3 interface equals aggregator v3 interface at this address. And then we're gonna return price feed Dot version. Now I'm going to go ahead and deploy this contract to Rinkby just to show you what this get version is going to return. But you don't have to follow along here if you don't want, because again, we're working with the test net. You can just watch if you like. For this section, we are going to test a little bit more sparse since we're going to be mainly using the test net since we're going to be working with an actual Chainlink Oracle network. Once we move over to Hardhat and with JavaScript, all this testing locally will be a lot easier and a lot faster. You're more than welcome to go ahead and fiddle and try and test a lot of this stuff as we go along, but just note that it might take a little bit longer to do some of the testing on a test net. Let's delete that last funding contract. We're gonna deploy this one. We're gonna scroll up. We're gonna switch to Injected Web 3. We're gonna switch from Coven to Rinkby. 
And the reason we want to make sure we're on Rink B is because this address is specific to Rink B. The contract that we're looking to interact with might not be at this address on every single chain. We want to make sure we're on the Rink B chain for this because if some other contract is there on a different chain, this version function obviously won't exist and this function could error. So let's go ahead. We'll go to fund me. We're going to deploy this for the Rink B chain. Again, you don't have to follow along with me here. You can just watch. And once that contract has been deployed, we now have a view function called get version, and we can see it's returning the variable four, showing us that this is the fourth version of a price feed. So this is a really easy way for us to interact with contracts that exist outside of our project. We use one of these interfaces, which can get compiled down to the ABI, and then we combine that ABI with the address to call a function. As we work with these interfaces more and more, they'll start to make more and more sense. So if it's a little confusing to you right now, don't get discouraged. The more you work with it, the easier it'll become. Now though, now that we know how to call these functions in here, we can start working with this interface. However, as you know, if we have a whole bunch of interfaces, we're gonna have to stick a whole bunch of interfaces at the top of our code, which looks pretty ugly. What's a better way for us to do this? Well, before we used import, right? We imported from simple storage dot sol. For this one, what we could do is we could import from aggregator v3 interface dot sol. We could go ahead and create a new contract with this aggregator v3 interface or what we can do is we can import this directly from GitHub. If we go back to the documentation of these Chainlink data feeds, we go to using data feeds, and we scroll down, we see at the top, we have this import statement, import at Chainlink slash contracts slash src v08 interfaces aggregator v3 interface. This, this import is, has the same path setup as the GitHub repository for the Chainlink code. Instead of us directly adding all of the code right into our remix, what we can do instead is we can import directly from GitHub or what's called an NPM package. Remix is smart enough to know that at Chainlink slash contracts is referring to the NPM package at Chainlink slash contracts. We'll talk about NPM a little bit in the future. It's what's known as a package manager and can keep versions of different contracts for us to directly import into our code bases. At Chainlink slash contracts is created directly from the Chainlink GitHub repository. So Remix downloads this code from NPM, which is created from this GitHub. So now we know that if we import at Chainlink slash contracts, SRC v0.8 interfaces aggregator v3 interface dot sol, this is the same as if we had just stuck this whole contract right at the top of our FundMe contract which makes our code look a lot nicer. And now we have this aggregator v3 interface that we can work with. Okay, great. So now that we have a minimalistic interface, which will give us the ABI, how do we actually go ahead and get the price here? Well, documentation has a good example if you wanna play with it and try to reverse engineer it as well. Here's how we're gonna do it. In our code, we're gonna create an aggregator v3 interface object called price feed, an aggregator v3 variable called price feed, which is going to equal to aggregator v3 interface contract at address this address, exactly the same as what we're doing down here. We're assuming a contract at this address is going to have all the functionality of this aggregator v3 interface, which again means it has this decimals function, this description function, version, get round data, and the important one, latest round data, which has the latest price at this answer piece. What we can do now is we can call that latest round data function on the price feed. So we'll say price feed dot latest round data. Now, if we look at the interface, we see that this latest round data actually doesn't return one variable. It returns a whole bunch of different variables. And that's what we're going to return in our contract. So we're going to put these parentheses and we're going to say, you went 80 round ID. We can even look right at the documentation to see what else it returns. Int price, you went, you went started at, you went timestamp, and then you went 80 answered in round. Oh, now there's a lot of code here. Since this function returns so many different variables, we have to set something up to capture them. However, all we care about is price. We don't care about round ID, started at, timestamp, or answered in round. So what we can do is just remove them and just leave the commas.
And now we have int price equals price feed that latest round data. The reason that price is an int 256 and not a uint 256 is because some prices or some data feeds could be negative here. So that it's an int 256 so it can stay flexible. Now that we have the price, this is gonna be price of ETH in terms of USD. And we saw an example of this before. It was around 3000 and it returned this number because Solidity doesn't work with decimals for a number of reasons, but we just need to know that there are eight decimal places uh, associated with this price feed. If you wanna double check how many decimals there are, this contract has a decimals function that you can call as well that will tell you exactly how many decimals are in this price feed. Now, as we know, message.value is gonna have 18 decimal places. Why does it have 18 decimal places? Well, because one ether is equal to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight is this massive number in way which has 18 zeros, which is equivalent to one point one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we want these to have the same decimal places, right? Because right now this has eight, this has 18. They're different units right now. So to get them to match up, all we need to do is return price times. 1 e 10 or 1 raised to the 10th, which is equal to 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Message.value though is going to be a uint 256. And right now, price is an int 256. So why do we convert this value from an int 256 to a uint 256? Well, we can do what's called typecasting. All we need to do is add uint 256 and wrap this whole thing up between these two parentheses. You can't typecast anything, but there are some values like in 256 and uint 256 that can be easily converted between the two. Now, of course, since we're not modifying any state with this get price function, we can make this a view and say it returns a uint 256. And if we save and compile, we go ahead and we get that check mark. Now, math can be a little bit tricky the first couple of times you do it in Solidity, but the more you do it, the easier it becomes. And in the future, we can always reference a function like this to figure out, okay, here's the easiest way for me to get this number. Awesome. So now we have a get price function, which is going to return a uint 256, which is going to be the price of Ethereum in terms of USD. All we need to do is convert the message.value from Ethereum to terms of dollars. Let's create this get conversion rate function. For this one, we're going to take an input parameter of uint 256 of ETH amount. It's going to be a public view function and it's going to return a uint 256. We're going to pass it some ETH amount. And on the other side, we're going to get how much that ETH is worth in terms of USD. So we're going to do a uint 256 ETH price equals get price. So first, we're going to call our get price function that we just created to get the price of Ethereum. Then we're going to do uint 256 ETH amount in USD equals ETH price times ETH amount. And then we're going to divide it by 1 E18. When you're doing multiplication and division math in Solidity, you always want to multiply and add first and then go ahead and divide. Since ETH price and ETH amount both have 18 additional decimal places, if we were to just let them rock without this, they would have an additional 36 zeros tacked onto the end. We need to divide by 1 E18. Now, when we get to the hard hat sections of this course, testing all this math is going to be a lot easier. And if you're really struggling with some of the math bits right now, I wouldn't let that slow you down because once we get to hard hat, it's going to become a lot easier to actually test this than working on a test net. And this ETH amount in terms of USD is the number that we're looking for. So we can just go ahead and return ETH amount in USD. This needs to be returns here. And boom, now we have a get conversion rate function. To walk you through the math real quick, Let's say the ETH price is going to be $3,000. So it's going to be 3,000, but it's going to have an additional 18 zeros tacked on the end. It matches the message.value way units. And let's say, for example, we send one ETH or one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight ETH into this contract. One ETH should equal $3,000. So to get the price, we're going to now do the ETH price, which is 3,000 times the ETH amount, which is this one, and then divide by one raised to the 18. So math it out, we'll do three, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, times 3,000, 
one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And now we divide that by one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, which equals two point nine 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 E twenty one, which the calculator kind of messed up the math a little bit, but two point nine not two point nine nine E twenty one means this has 21 decimal places. So it'd be 2.1234567891234567891 or 1234567891234567891 and this is actually exactly the reason why we don't do decimal math in solidity. Our calculator saw that massive number was having a hard time getting it so it ended up rounding that number to 2.999999 when we work exclusively with whole numbers in Solidity, we don't have a chance of losing that precision. And in Solidity, this is gonna return exactly $3,000, which is correct. One Ethereum at $3,000 per Ethereum is gonna be $3,000. And like I said, since we're building this contract, assuming we're gonna be working on this testnet, we're not going to test this function on the testnet because we're gonna to have to wait for that transaction to go through. If you wanna go ahead and deploy this and play around with it yourself, you're more than welcome to. Okay, great. Now we have a function called get conversion rate that we can use on our fund function to make sure we've sent enough message.value in our fund. So what we can do now is all we need to do is do get conversion rate of message.value needs to be greater than the minimum USD. Of course, right now our minimum USD is just in terms of 50 and we know that get conversion rate is gonna return it with 18 zeros to represent the decimal places. Our minimum USD amount needs to be upgraded. 10 250 times 1 e 18 or again 1 times 10 raised to the 18th i'm going to deploy this to a testnet just to demonstrate it but again you don't have to if you don't want to wait for this so i'm going to go ahead and deploy this confirm and now we have this fund me contract if i don't say anything in value and hit the fund button we're going to get this gas estimation error failed this is kind of a blanket error, basically saying, hey, you can go ahead and send this transaction if you want. It's highly likely that it's not gonna work. And the reason that Remix knows that it's probably not gonna work is because it can see this require and simulate the transaction and say, hey, you didn't send enough money with this. However, even if we send some money, like 5,000 way, it'll still give us this error because that's not enough. Let's do the calculation right now based on what the price of ETH is. So we can actually go to data.chain.link we look and see approximately what the price is. So it looks like the price of Ethereum right now is about $3,000. And this might be different for you depending on when you do that. So if the price of Ethereum is $3,000 and our minimum is at least 50, we could do 50 divided by 3,000, 0 0.016 ETH should be approximately enough. So if we go to our Ethereum converter and we do 0 0.016, we'll get how much that is in way. Let's do 0. 02 just to make sure that we're going to be over the amount so we'll paste that in we'll change this to way and now if i hit the fun button instead of us getting that error popping up it's going to actually go ahead and let us do the fun function and we could confirm it and it wouldn't fail i'm going to reject it for now just because i don't really feel like waiting for the transaction to go through but great we've confirmed that our get conversion rate is working as intended awesome great work so what's the next bit of this funding contract that we want to do? Well, when people actually send money to this contract, we want to keep track of all the people who send us money. So let's create some data structures to keep track. Let's create an array of addresses called funders, and we'll keep adding all the funders who send money to us. So we'll say an address array or an address list. We'll make it public funders. And anytime somebody sends us money, and this actually does indeed go through, we'll add that funder to the list. So we'll say funders.push message.sender. Like message.value, message.sender is an always available global keyword. Message.value stands for how much Ethereum or how much native blockchain currency is sent. Message.sender is the address of whoever calls the fund function. So if we're on ring B, message.sender is going to be equal to whatever address is calling that function. Since our address is sending the ether, we're going to add our address to this funders list. This way we can keep track of all the wonderful donators who are donating to our contract. 
then maybe we want to even make a, a mapping of addresses to you and 256s of addresses to how much money each one of these people have actually sent. So we'll do address to you and 256 public address to amount funded. And when somebody funds our contract, we'll say address to amount funded of message.sender equals message.value. Now we have a function where people can fund our contract and we can set a value in terms of USD and we keep track of the different funders who actually fund our contract. This is fantastic. Now I know we've gone over a lot of really intense math and intense stuff here. So, so let's do a quick refresher of what we've learned so far. Whenever we work with a contract, we always need the ABI and the address. When compiled, an interface gives us that minimalistic ABI to interact with contracts outside of our project. When you combine these compiled interfaces with an address, we can call the functions on that interface on that contract. Chainlink data feeds are a decentralized way to get information about the real world. In this case, we're getting the price of Ethereum in terms of USD from a decentralized collective of Chainlink nodes. When working with math and Solidity, decimals don't work. So we need to keep that in mind when doing any type of math in Solidity. And we need to make sure we always have the correct units so that our math makes sense. Message.value and message.sender are globally available variables where message.sender represents the sender of the message or transaction and message.value represents the number of way sent with the message. There's a whole bunch of different special variables and functions that we can access at any time. And these are available in the Solidity documentation. All right, great. We've got a great way that we can actually start funding our contract, but our code looks a little bit messy. We've got a couple of different functions for getting the price and working with these prices. Is there a way to make this math a lot easier to use? This is where we're going to introduce the concept of a library. So what is a library? I definitely recommend checking out soliditybyexample.org as you're going along with this course as well. They've got some fantastic examples. One of such example is gonna be about libraries. Libraries are similar to contracts but you can't declare any state variables and you can't send ether. We can also use libraries to add more functionality to different values. What do I mean by that? Well, what we can do actually is we can have get conversion rate be a function of a uint 256. So we could do something like message.value.get conversion, conversion rate. And we can add functions as if uint 256 was an object or a struct or a contract that we actually created. So how do we do this? Well, let's create a new contract in our contracts folder. We create a new file. We're gonna call it price converter.sol. And our price converter.sol is gonna be a library that we're gonna to attach to a UN256. So how do you actually create a library? And what is a library? Well, a library is gonna be really, really similar to a smart contract. It's gonna start with SPDX license identifier. MIT, we're going to give it a pragma solidity 0 0.8.0. And instead of typing contract for the name of the contract, we're going to do library for the name of the library. We're going to call it price converter. Now libraries can't have any state variables and they also can't send ether. And all the functions in a library are going to be internal. So what we can do is we can go back to fundme.sol. We can grab get price, get version, and get conversion rate copy them all, delete them from fundme.sol, and paste them into our library. And of course, since we're using aggregator v3 interface in here, we can also copy the import from fundme. And since we're not using the aggregator v3 interface in our contract anymore, and we're using it in our price converter, we can paste it into our price converter. Now, if we compile priceconverter.sol, we see that it actually passes. Now, all the functions inside of our library need to be internal. And we're going to make this library price converter different functions we can call on UIT 256. For example, we're going to be able to do message.value.getConversionRate. rate. We're going to directly be able to get the conversion rate of a value of a UIT 256 as if that was a function for it the whole time. So first, let's make this internal. Let's make get conversion rate internal, and we'll make get version internal. Now that we have this library price converter back in our FundMe, we can now import this price converter and attach it to uint256. So we'll do import dot slash price converter 
Soul. And in Fund Me, we'll do using Price Converter or Uint256. Of course, if we compile our Fund Me now, this line is getting an issue because it's saying, hey, get conversion rate isn't defined. Now in our library, the first variable that gets passed to the function is going to be the object that it's called on itself. So in fundme.soul, let's go ahead and comment out this line for now. If we do message.value.getConversionRate, this is secretly the same as if we did get conversion rate of message.value. In our price converter library, the message.value is going to be passed as the input parameter to get a conversion rate. For get price and get version, we don't really care about the number, so we're just going to leave it blank for now. So instead of require get conversion rate of message.value, we can now do message.value.get conversion rate and compile that. You'll see that here we're not passing a variable, even though our get conversion rate function says, hey, I'm expecting a variable. Again, the reason for this is, is this message.value is considered the first parameter for any of these library functions, and that's how it works. If we wanted another variable in here, like u256 something else, now we would want to pass something else in here, 123, and this 123 would get assigned to this something else. But we're going to delete that for now. Okay, great. And in doing that, we've minimized our FundMe contract a lot by moving a lot of that math and price conversion stuff into our price converter library.sol. One of the most common libraries that was used for the longest time was this library called safemath.sol. And you'll probably see it a lot of different places. We're going to go off on a quick little tangent here and teach you about safemath. So let's close FundMe and close price converter. Now let's create a new file called safemathtester.sol. And let's start with some basic stuff in here. Safe math was all over the place before version 0.8 of Solidity, and now it's almost in no contracts. What happened? Why is safe math no longer used as much? Well, let's create a sample contract. This is a section that you don't have to follow along if you don't want to code along with me, but if you want to, you absolutely still can. This is going to be a contract we are going to deploy on a JavaScript virtual machine. Uh, we can use any version of Solidity before version 0.8 of Solidity. So, for example, we'll use Pragma. Carrot 0.6.0 and we'll create contract safe math tester dot soul. Now, if I create a uint eight and I set it to public big number and I set this to 255, oops, safe math tester. Let's go ahead and compile safe math tester with 0.6.7 pragma solidity. The maximum size of a uint eight is going to be 255. This is going to be the biggest number that we can fit in a uint 8. And if I were to deploy this to a JavaScript VM or even a test network, safe math tester, let's go ahead and deploy it. If I hit big number, we're going to get 255. But what happens if I create a function called add that sets big number equal to big number plus one? Let's save that delete that old contract and deploy. Well, right now, big number is 255. What happens when we add one to big number when 255 is the max size a uint eight can be? Well, let's hit add. Now let's check what big number is. Big number gets reset to zero. So what's going on? Well, prior to version 0.8 of Solidity, unsigned integers and integers ran on this concept of being unchecked which means that if you passed the upper limit of a number, it would just wrap around and start back from the lowest number it could be. So if I call add a whole bunch more times and hit big number, now it's eight. If I were to hit this add button a ton more times and get it back to 255, it would then continue to wrap over to zero. So one of the most popular libraries that was out there was this safe math library, which would basically check to make sure that you weren't wrapping around a uint 256 or an int 256. Basically, it was a way to say, hey, you've reached the max this number can be, and now your transaction is going to fail. If we switch this to 0 0.8 of Solidity, delete the old contract, we'll go switch this to 0 0.8, we'll go ahead and compile it. And now we deploy this to a JavaScript VM. If I hit big number, we get 255. 
But if we hit add, it actually fails and we still get 255. In version 0 0.8 of Solidity, they added this bit where it automatically checks to make sure if you're gonna do what's called overflow or underflow on a variable. We can actually revert back to the unchecked version by using an unchecked keyword. So if we wrap this big number equals big number plus one in this unchecked bracket, let's delete our old contract, we'll compile, we'll redeploy. We hit big numbers, 255, now we hit add, we hit big number again, it reverted back to zero. So that's a little bit more about safe math, checked and unchecked. So in version 0 0.76 and below, this code that you see in front of you is gonna be the exact same as this code in 0 0.8 and above with this unchecked keyword. Now you might be thinking, in newer versions of Solidity, why would I use this unchecked keyword? Well, you'll find out later that this unchecked keyword makes your code a little bit more gas efficient. So if you're absolutely positive that your math is never gonna reach the top or bottom limits of a number, then it might make sense for you to use the unchecked keyword. Let's head back over to our FundMe contract, where we are now using the price converter library that we just created. All right, great. So now we've got a pretty minimalistic contract here for actually doing the funding. And we have all of our math for getting conversion rates done in our library price converter, which we're gonna import at the top of FundMe. Cool, so at this point, we've got our fund method. Awesome, and so we can allow anybody to go ahead and fund this contract and send this contract, Ethereum or any native blockchain currency to this contract. Well, now what do we wanna do? Well, once all the funders have gone ahead and funded, we're going to want the project to be able to withdraw the funds out of this contract so they can actually go ahead and use those funds to buy things for this project. So let's go ahead and create a withdraw function. So we'll create a function withdraw and we'll make this public. Since we're gonna be withdrawing all the funds out of this contract, we probably also want to reset our funders array and our address to amount funded. Since we'll be withdrawing all the funds, those amounts should go back down to zero. So let's go ahead and loop through the funders array and update our mapping object so that each of these funders now has zero because in just a second, we're going to withdraw all the money from them. So to do this, we're gonna use something called a for loop. So what is a for loop? A for loop is a way to loop through some type of index object or loop through some range of numbers or just do a task a certain amount of times repeating. So for example, let's say we have an array or a list. And on that list, we have one, two, three, four. If we wanted to get all of the elements in this array, or in this list, AKA one, two, three, four, how do we get all the elements in this list? Well, we're, we would use a for loop to loop through each one of these objects. So at zero width index would be one, at the first index would be two, and at the second index would be three, and at the last index would be four. So we would loop through the indexes zero through three to get all these elements. Or maybe another example, as if this was A, B, C, D, A is at the zero width index, B is at the first index, C is at the second, and D is at the third, and we would loop zero through three to get to each one of these elements. We're gonna do that exact same thing, but with the funders array. So how do we actually do that? Well, we first start with the for keyword. The for keyword says, okay, we're about to start a loop. And inside of these parentheses, we define how we want to loop through it. Also backslash star and star backslash is sort of like brackets for comments. Anything in between these two will be a comment. So in a for loop, first we give it the starting index, then we give it the ending index, and then we give it the step amount. For example, maybe we wanna start with zero, we wanna to go to 10, and we wanna go up by one each time. So we'd go zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Or maybe we start at zero, we wanna end at 10, and we go up by two each time. So we'd go zero, two, four, six, eight, ten. 10. Or maybe we wanna go from zero to five, we wanna go from two to five, with a step of one, we'd go two, three, four, five, et cetera. So this is what's gonna go inside of this for bit here. So 
for our starting index. And let me even just put this above so that you can reference it. So our starting index is going to be UN256 variable, and we're going to call it funder index. And we're going to start with funder index being equal to zero. So we're starting with zero here. And we're going to end with the length of our funders array, since we want to loop through all of the funders. So we're going to say funder index needs to be less than funders dot length. So our ending index is going to be whenever funders index is no longer less than funders dot length. And then finally, we're going to say funder index equals funder index plus one, which means that every time the code inside of this loop finishes, we're going to increase funder index by one. That's how we go from zero to one to two to three to four to five, etc. Another way you can type funder index equals funder index plus one is you can just do funder index plus plus. This plus plus syntax means funder index equals itself plus one. So let's start looping through our funders array. To access the, the zeroth element or the first element, we're gonna say funders of funder index. So we're saying we wanna access the zeroth element of our funders object. And this is gonna return an address for us to use. We're gonna go ahead and say address funder equals funders at the funder index. So now we have this funder address and we wanna use this to reset our mapping. So we're gonna say address to amount funded at, at the funder key is now equal to zero. Because remember in fund, we update the amount whenever we fund the contract when we withdraw the money from the contract, we're going to reset it back to zero. Now let's walk through this. Funder index starts from zero. So we're gonna get the zero with funder. We're gonna grab that funder at the zero with index and we're gonna reset the address to amount funded of that funder to zero. Then this for loop is gonna update by one. It's gonna move from zero to one. It's gonna check then if funder index is less than the length. Let's say funders has 10 people in it. If funders has 10 people in it, it'll still be less. So now funder index will be one. Address funder will equal funders of one now instead of zero. And we'll grab that address and we'll reset that address's amount funded to zero. Then we'll continue to two, to three, to four, all the way up to the length of our funders array. And this is how we can loop through our objects. So saying this middle one is the ending index isn't exactly right since we're really checking for a Boolean to see if this is still true, but hopefully you get the idea. So we've reset the balances of the mapping. However, we still haven't done two things. We still need to reset the array to make the funders a blank array. And then we also need to actually withdraw the funds. Since when we funded this, we sent message.value along with calling this fund function. However, we didn't actually withdraw the funds. So to reset the array, we could loop through it and delete objects from this address array, or we could just totally refresh this variable. So instead of looping through the array and deleting objects, we're just going to say funders equals a new address array, we're going to completely reset the array by saying this funders variable now equals a brand new address array with zero objects in it to start. If we were to put a one here, this would be there'd be one element to start in the array, two would be two, three would be three, etc. We're just going to start it as a completely blank new array. So great, we've gone ahead and reset the array, but how do we actually now withdraw funds from this contract? How do we send the funds back to whomever is calling this? Now to actually send ether or send native blockchain currency, there are actually three different ways to do this. We're gonna look at all three and say what the differences between the three of them are. The three different ways are gonna be transfer, 
send and call. Let's go ahead and start with transfer, since transfer is the simplest and at surface level makes the most sense to use. So if we want to transfer the funds to whomever is calling this withdraw function, we would do, we would say message.sender.transfer, and then we'd get the balance of our contract here by saying address this, so this keyword refers to this whole contract dot balance. And we can get the native blockchain currency or the Ethereum currency balance of this address like this, and we can just do that. Only thing that we need to do is we need to cast, we need to typecast message.sender from an address type to a payable address type. So message.sender is of type address, whereas payable message.sender is of type payable address. And in Solidity, in order to send the native blockchain token like Ethereum, you can only work with payable addresses to do that. So we just wrap it in this payable typecaster. So this is the first way that we can actually send Ethereum or send tokens from different contracts to each other. We wrap the address that we want to send it in, in this payable keyword. We do dot transfer, and then we say exactly how much we want to transfer. But there are some issues with transfer. Here we are on Solidity by example for sending ether, which again is a fantastic resource to refer to if you get lost. The method that we just looked at was this transfer method. Now we saw way earlier in the course that if I sent Ethereum from one address to another, it cost about 2,100 gas or 2,100 gas. Our transfer function is capped at 2,300 gas, and if more gas is used, it throws an error. The next one that we're using is gonna be send, which is also capped at 2,300 gas, and if it fails, it'll return a Boolean. So with transfer, if this line fails, it'll error and revert the transaction. With send, it won't error. It'll return a Boolean of whether or not it was successful. So using send, we'll do payable message.sender, dot send address this dot balance. But we don't want to finish our call here. If this were to fail, the contract wouldn't revert the transaction and we just wouldn't get our money sent. So we want to do Boolean send success equals this whole bit here. And then we want to require send success and if this send fails, we'll throw an error saying send failed. This way, if this fails, we will still revert by adding our require statement here. Transfer automatically reverts if the transfer fails. Send will only revert the transaction if we add this require statement here. So great. What's the third way that we can actually send Ethereum or native currency? Well, it's with this call command. Now call is going to be one of the first lower level commands that we actually use in our Solidity code because this call function is actually incredibly powerful and we can use it to call virtually any function in all of Ethereum without even having to have the ABI. We'll learn the advanced ways to use this call much later. For now, we're just going to learn how to use it to send Ethereum or your native blockchain currency. Call is going to look very similar to send. We're going to do payable message.sender.call. And this is where we'll put any function information or any information about the function we want to call on some other contract. We actually don't want to call a function. So we're going to leave this blank. We can show that we're leaving it blank by just putting in these two quotes here. We instead want to use this like a transaction. And as we saw in our deployment, there's always this message.value bit. So we're going to use this call function as if it's a regular transaction and we can add stuff like message.value. So in here, we're going to add these squiggly brackets and we're going to say value address this dot balance. This call function returns actually two variables. And when a function returns two variables, 
we can show that by placing them into parentheses on the left hand side. The two variables it returns are going to be a boolean that we're going to call call success and also a bytes object called data returned. Since call allows us to actually call different functions, if that function returns some data or returns a value, we're going to save that in the data returned variable. It also returns call success, where if the function was successfully called, this will be true. If not, this will be false. And since bytes objects are arrays, data returns needs to be in memory. Now, for our code here, we're actually not calling a function, so we don't really care about data returned. So similar to what we saw with the price contract, we can just go ahead and delete that and leave the comma to tell Solidity, yeah, we know this function returns two variables, but we only care about one. And then similar to the send piece above, we're gonna do require, call success, call failed. Meaning that we're requiring call success is true, Otherwise, we'll revert with an error that says call failed. Now, if learning the difference between these three is a little complicated for you right now, don't let that slow you down. Feel free to come back to this after you've learned more about how some of these lower level functions work and a little bit more about how gas works. Solidity by example does a fantastic job though of saying what the differences between all three are. Transfer has a maximum of 2300 gas and throws an error if it fails. Send has a maximum of 2300 gas returns a boolean if it fails, call forwards all gas so it doesn't have a capped gas, and similar to send, returns a boolean if it is successful or if it fails. As of recording, right now, using call is the recommended way to actually send and receive Ethereum or your blockchain native token. For now, if this part's a little bit confusing for you, for now, just look at this and see, ah, that's how we send and transfer Ethereum or native blockchain currency tokens. And I'm gonna delete this part for the video, but I'll keep those comments in the code repository associated with this course. And okay, perfect. If we hit compile of fundme.soul, we do indeed see that it's passing comp compilation. However, there's a bit of an issue here. Right now, anybody can withdraw from this contract. So anybody can fund, which is what we want, but we don't want anyone to be able to withdraw. We only want the person who's collecting the funds to be able to actually withdraw the funds. So how do we set this up so that the withdraw function is only called by the owner of this contract? Well, to do that, we're gonna set up a couple new functions. So when we deploy this contract, we want to automatically set it up so that whomever deploys this contract is gonna be the owner of this contract. And then we can do some parameters to set it up so that only the owner of this contract can call the withdraw function. So how would we do that? Well, maybe we could create a function called like call me right away. And right after we deploy this contract, we call this call me right away function which will set up us as the owner. Now that's gonna take two transactions and that would be really annoying if we had to do that. So instead, Solidity has something called a constructor. And if you're familiar with other programming language, a constructor is exactly the same as other programming languages. Constructor is gonna be the function that gets called when immediately whenever you deploy a contract. So if I were to deploy fundme.soul and I were to say, minimum USD equals two, minimum USD would no longer be 50 times one E to the 18th, it would be immediately updated to two because constructor is a function that gets immediately called in the same transaction that we create this contract. This constructor function is gonna be incredibly helpful for us because it'll allow us to set up the contract the way we want it to be. So for example, if we want the withdraw function to only be able to be called by the owner of this contract, we can have the constructor set up who the owner of the contract is. So let's create a global variable called address public owner. And then in our constructor, we'll say the owner is gonna be equal to the message.sender. The message.sender of the constructor function is gonna be whomever is deploying the contract. 
So owner is now gonna be whoever deployed this contract. And don't worry, we're gonna demo all this very soon and show you everything that's going on with Etherscan and everything. Demoing this all right now might take a little bit of time because we're using a testnet. So if you wanna test it all right now, absolutely go for it, but just know it'll take you a little bit longer to do so. Now that we have the owner set up, we can modify our withdraw function to make it so that only the owner can actually call this withdraw function. So at the top of the withdraw function, maybe we wanna add a section. Maybe we wanna say require message.sender equals the owner. A note about double equals versus equals. You can think of this single equals as a set parameter. So when I say owner is now set to message.sender. Double equals is how you check to see if these two variables are equivalent. So we're saying is message.sender the same as owner? So this is checking to see equivalence. This is setting. Checking to see equivalence, setting. So we're gonna say require message.sender is equal to owner. Otherwise, we're gonna throw an error saying sender is not owner. Perfect. Now we have a quick way to make sure the withdraw function is only called by the owner of this contract. Now let's say that there's a lot of functions that we have in this contract that are gonna be required to be the owner. Maybe there's a lot of functions in this contract that need a whole lot of different requires. We don't wanna to have to copy paste this line to every single one of our functions. So what can we do? Well, this is where something called modifiers come in. So for now, we're gonna go ahead and delete this line. And below, we're gonna create something called a modifier. Our modifier is gonna be a keyword that we can add right in the function declaration to modify the function with that functionality. We're gonna create a modifier and call it only owner. And we're gonna paste that line that we just made in withdraw. And underneath it, we're gonna put a little underscore. What I can do now is I can take this only owner modifier and stick it in the function declaration of my withdraw function. So what's happening with this modifier? With only owner in this function declaration, we're saying, hey, for this withdraw function, before you read all this code inside of it, look down at the only owner modifier and do whatever is in there first and then do whatever's in the underscore. This underscore represents doing the rest of the code. So now when we go call the withdraw function, we actually do this require statement first and then call the rest of the code. If this require statement were below the underscore, this would tell our function to go ahead and do all this code first and then run the require. Because again, we have this only only keyword. We're saying, great, we've got a function, it's withdraw, it's public. Oh, only owner modifier. Let's look at how that works. Ah, okay, it tells us how to do all the code of the original function first. So let's go ahead and do that. Okay, now we're done. Now what do we do? Ah, okay, now we'll run the require. We wanna go ahead and put the require here first. So this is how modifiers work and how we can use them to improve our functionality. All right, awesome. We have all the basic functionality of our contract that we need here. Now we're finally actually gonna run everything on a test net and see everything happen live before our eyes. Are you ready? Let's do this. So let's go over to the deploy tab and we're gonna switch, of course, to injected web three. Remember, we're using injected web three because our price converter .soul is using Chainlink oracles that actually exist and are actually monitoring the RinkB network for us. Now we're gonna scroll down to, and we're gonna choose the FundMe contract, and we're gonna go ahead and deploy. Once again, we wanna make sure we're on the RinkB testnet, and we have a little bit of RinkB ETH in our wallet. Let's go ahead and deploy, confirm, and we'll wait a little bit, and I'll pull up our log here, and we'll wait a little bit for our contract to get deployed. All right, great. It looks like our contract has indeed been deployed. If we scroll down, we can see all of our functionality. Minimum USD is gonna be that $50, but with 18 zeros so that the units are the same as Ethereum. The owner of our contract was set to our address. The instant we deployed this contract, it was deployed by calling our constructor function. So this address 
0x1066 is going to be the same as the address in our MetaMask. Your address here, of course, is going to be a little bit different than mine. We have our funders array, which of course is going to be blank. We have our address array, which is also going to be blank. And then we have two functions that we can use to modify the state of the blockchain. Withdraw is going to be orange because we're not paying any Ethereum. We're actually gaining Ethereum or whatever native blockchain currency. Fund is going to be red because fund is a payable function that we are going to be sending Ethereum to or sending whatever native blockchain currency that you're working with. So let's go ahead and see how this all works. So first, let's go ahead and fund this contract. Again, funding, we got to do a little bit of math. Right now, since the price of ETH is around $3,000 and we're looking for $50 minimum, we do 50 divided by 3,000. We do 3,000 divided by 50. We do 50 divided by 3,000. So we know that around 0 0.02 Ethereum should be enough for this contract to work. So 0 0.02 Ethereum is this much way. We can copy that, paste that into here. So when we hit fund, it should actually pass. And we do indeed see MetaMask pop up and we'll go ahead and confirm. Once this transaction goes through, we'll be able to see this contract on Etherscan with the funds in it. Now, if we don't add way here, if we don't add a value, once again, we hit fund, we'll say gas estimation failed because we're not sending enough here. And in fact, we even see execution reverted, didn't send enough. We can absolutely send this transaction. However, it's going to fail. Great. So now that our transaction has gone through, if we go on to the Rinkby Ether scan, once we wait a little bit for it to finish indexing, here on the Rinkby Ether scan, we can see that transaction actually went through for doing the funding. We can actually see a lot of different details going on with this transaction as well. And if we scroll down, we once again, we can see all the information about us calling this fund function. Gas limit, gas usage, the gas fees, gas price. And we can see the input data as well. We can see that we called the fund function down here. We'll learn more about the input data later. If we go to the contract that we deployed, we can now see two transactions. We can see our contract created transaction, and we can also see we called a fund method. And if we look at the balance of our contract, it now has 0.02 Ether, which makes sense since we just sent it 0.02. If we put that at 0.02 ETH in terms of way back into the value section and we call fund again, after this transaction goes through, we should see this number go from 0.02 to 0.04. Now, after we wait a brief delay, we do indeed see the balance has gone up to 0.04, which is exactly what we'd expect. Awesome. So our funding mechanism is working correctly. And if we go down into our array and our mapping, we do address to array and we paste our address, we should see the four number show up. And if we go to funders of zero, we see our address. And if we go to funders of one, we also see our address and we see that and we see this call going through. If we go to funders of two in our log over here, we actually see that we get an error. An optimization that we could make to our contract in the future is to check to see if an address is already in the funders array and then not add it if it's already there. Now let's go ahead and try to call this withdraw function, but let's try to call it with a different address than the address we originally deployed this contract with. So to do that, scroll all the way to the top of this here, and I'm going to go to my MetaMask, and I'm gonna to switch to a second account and hit connect. Now, our remix should be updated with the new account that's in here. You'll see that if I switch back to account one, it switches back to account one, so long as they're both connected. You can see which accounts are connected to applications by clicking this connected button and see which ones are connected. If you ever want to disconnect that account, you can click the three little dots and hit disconnect the account. And now we can see that this account is not connected. However, account two is connected. Let's go back to account one and connect account one so that both of them are now are connected. But we'll switch to account two. Let's switch to account two 
because again, account two isn't the owner of this contract. If we scroll down to owner, we can see owner is 0x1066 something something, and account two is 0x043 something something. Awesome. So what do you think will happen when we hit withdraw here? Well, our modifier only owner should kick in and we should get notified that if we send the transaction, we'll get this error, sender is not owner. So let's try it. Ah, gas estimation failed. We do get this error, sender is not owner, which is perfect. This is exactly what we want. We could absolutely send this transaction if we wanted to, but that would just be a waste of gas because this transaction is going to fail. However, if we switch back to account one and we hit withdraw, MetaMask will pop up, enabling us to hit confirm and withdraw the Ether out of this contract address. Now, if we look at this contract address on Etherscan, after a brief delay, we'll see the balance go from 0 0.04 back down to zero, and we'll see our wallet balance go up from what it is back to 0 0.04 plus what it was. And after a brief delay, you can see our balance is indeed back down to zero. In our contract now, if we do address to amount for our wallet address that was doing the funding, it's back down to zero. And if we try to check the address of funders at index zero, we get call to funders.fundme error, execution reverted. We've completed all the basics of this section that I wanted to go through. And you should be incredibly proud of yourself for getting this far. You've just deployed a really advanced smart contract. We're using a library and chain link contracts to build some of the most powerful applications on the planet. We've learned to use a library for any type we want in our smart contracts. We've learned more about multiplication and then units of measure in Solidity and smart contracts. We've learned about mappings, more about arrays, what the constructor does. We've learned how to send money. We've learned about for loops. We've learned about the different ways we can actually send money, at least from a low level. And we've learned about modifiers. This section is one of the tougher sections in this course. So if you completed this, you should be incredibly excited. We're gonna go through our code now and we're gonna make a number of tweaks. Now this section, we are gonna do a little bit more advanced solidity here. So if you get a little bit lost, don't sweat it too much. And feel free to try some of this stuff in the future on your own. We're gonna modify this contract to make it a little bit more professional. It's not gonna be end to end amazing, but it's gonna be a little bit better and you'll see why in a minute. So the first thing that we're gonna do is we're looking, we're gonna look at some of these variables here. In particular, owner and minimum USD. Owner gets set one time in our contract here and then it never changes again. Minimum USD gets set one time, even outside of the constructor. If we have variables that only get set one time, we can actually use some tools in Solidity to make them more gas efficient. For now, let's compile our FundMe contract and then deploy it to a JavaScript virtual machine. Remember, we can go ahead and deploy it right now. However, funding and withdrawing and doing any of the money stuff isn't gonna work. Because again, we don't have a chain link network on our JavaScript VM. So those aren't gonna work so well. But for what we're gonna do right now, we don't really care so much. Here's what we do care about. We do care about how much gas this costs to actually send. We do care about how much gas this costs to create. Right now, creating this contract costs about 859,000 gas. And we're gonna add a couple of tricks right now to bring this number down. We're gonna add some stuff back in in a bit, which will bring it back up. But for now, we're gonna learn some tricks to bring this number down. The two tricks that we're gonna learn are the constant keyword and the immutable keyword. In their Solidity, there are two keywords that make it so that your variables can't be changed. And those keywords are constant and immutable. You can learn more about them in the Solidity documentation. If you assign a variable once outside of a function and then never change it, so if, if it's assigned at compile time, you can go ahead and add this constant keyword. We'll learn later about storage, but when you add a constant keyword, this minimum USD no longer takes up a storage spot and it's much easier to read to. So now if we recompile this and we deploy this new contract, let's see if we saved any gas. If we look in the transaction logs now, we can grab the transaction cost of how much this costs to deploy. 
and let's compare it to how much it was before. Wow, we saved almost 19,000 gas. That's almost as much gas as it cost to send Ethereum. Typically, constant variables have a different naming convention. Typically, you'll want to do them all caps, like min, emum, underscore, USD. So all caps with underscores. So now let's just find minimum USD and replace that with all caps as well. With this interaction, we know that this variable is a constant variable and it's much cheaper to read from. Now, if we go ahead, compile this and redeploy in our fund recontract, even though this is a view function, remember view functions do have gas costs when, when called by a contract. As a constant variable, we can see the execution cost of this variable, 21,415 gas. So let's put a little note right underneath it. If we remove the constant variable, we delete this contract, we redeploy, we collect FundMe, and we hit minimum USD again, we can now see how much gas this was cost if it wasn't a constant variable. We can see the gas cost did indeed go up. Now on chains that are much cheaper, this gas difference probably won't make it that much of a difference, but on more expensive chains like Ethereum, this is gonna make a big difference. For example, on Ethereum, we can actually see current gas prices on Ethereum here. We can see the current gas price of Ethereum is about 141 GWAY. So we'll go to our converter, way to way, we'll copy the way price, times this, we'll get the gas price of calling our minimum USD, which is this number here, which if we put back in our Ethereum unit converter, we can see it costs this much gas. And if we times that by the approximate current price of Ethereum, which is around $3,000, Calling minimum USD as a constant is going to cost $9. Calling this at a, at a non-constant is going to cost almost a, an entire dollar more. You, you can see how all these little gas optimization tricks are going to make your life a lot better. So let's keep this constant keyword in here. We'll learn more about constant and storage in later sections of this course. Now, as you're just getting started with this course and with Solidity, do not struggle and do not worry about making your contracts as gas efficient as possible. In the beginning, and especially right now, just write your contracts as best as you can. Once you get really good at gas, and once you get much later on in the course, and much more advanced with Solidity, then you can start going back and working on gas optimizations. But do not let gas optimizations hold you back, or if you start stressing over it, just let it go, don't worry about it, and just write your code as best you can. So long story short, do not stress about gas optimizations right now. Now, another variable we only set one time is gonna be our owner variable. Owner equals message.sender. We set this one time in the constructor. Variables that we set one time, but outside of the same line that they're declared, and we set them, for example, in the constructor, we can mark as immutable. Typically, a good convention for marking immutable variables is gonna be doing I underscore so that we know that these are immutable variables. They have very similar gas savings to the constant keyword. Owner, of course, is a variable that we can't set on the line here because inside the global scope, there's no function going on. However, inside functions, because inside the global scope, there's gonna be no message.sender. There's only gonna be a message.sender when we're inside of a function. So inside here, we might say I owner equals message.sender. And then of course, we'll scroll down and we'll change this require only owner now equals I owner. Now, if we compile that and deploy it, we can see how much gas, we can see how much gas calling I owner is gonna be by with the immutableness. We get 21,508, which we'll go ahead and copy for now. And we'll put right here, we'll say immutable. Now, if we remove the immutable keyword, let's close this, redeploy, now, if we scroll down to iOwner, scroll up the logs, we go down to the call, we scroll down, we see the execution cost was much more. So we'll do double backslash, paste that in here. Gas for non-immutable. So you want to keep some of these tricks in mind when it comes to storing variables. The reason that these two save gas is because instead of storing these variables inside of a storage slot, we actually store them directly into the bytecode of the contract. And like I said, don't worry too much about that for now. Later on in the course, we'll teach you more about storage and a lot of this low level stuff that it comes with these contracts. But for now, just know that these exist 
and they're nice gas savers if you're only setting your variables once. All right, great. So we've just made our contract a little bit more gas efficient. Little gas efficiency improvements are going to be concepts I sprinkle throughout this course. And when we get to the more advanced section, I'm going to break down exactly what's going on and why all these gas efficiencies exist and what's going on behind the scenes for these gas efficiencies to occur. It's a little bit in the weeds, which is why I'm going to gloss over it right now. So if it's confusing, don't worry. I wouldn't let these gas efficiencies be the thing that slow you down. Awesome. So we have these two gas optimizations. How else can we make this contract a little bit more gas efficient? Well, one of the ways we can make this more gas efficient is by updating our requires. Right now, with our require statement, we actually have to store this sender is not an owner as a string array. Every single one of these characters in this error log needs to get stored individually. This, this string may not seem very big, but it's a lot bigger than the alternative with what we can do. As of 0.8.4 of Solidity, you can now actually do custom errors for our reverts. We declare them at the top and then use ifs instead of require and then just add our revert statements. This ends up saving a lot of gas since we just call the error code as opposed to calling the entire string associated with the error. So for example, with our require down here and with actually with all of our requires, what we could do is instead of having this require, we could create a custom error. So at the top, what we could do is we could say error not owner. And you'll notice that this is actually outside of the contract here. Now what we can do is we can take this error not owner, scroll down into our only owner. Instead of doing a require, we'll do an if statement. We'll say if message.sender is not I owner, then we're going to go ahead and revert with a not owner error. This ends up saving us a lot of gas since we don't have to store and emit this long string here. Now, in a lot of code today, you'll still see require a lot of places because these, these custom errors are pretty new in Solidity. So you'll want to get used to writing it both ways. I wouldn't be surprised if in the future, the syntax for some of these errors looks like this so that it's more readable. But for now, if you want to do a more gas efficient way than requires, you can use something like this. We could update all of our requires here for these custom errors. But for now, I'm going to leave both in just to show you the differences. This revert keyword does the exact same thing that require does without the conditional beforehand. So you can actually go ahead and, and revert any transaction or any function call in the middle of the function call. Now let's look at one more way to improve this contract. Sometimes people will try to interact with a contract that takes Ethereum or the native blockchain token without actually going through the required function calls that, that are needed. For example, on a JavaScript EVM here, I could actually try to send this contract money without calling the fund function. However, if I were to do that, what would happen? Would our fund function get triggered? No, it wouldn't get triggered. We wouldn't keep track of that funder. We wouldn't have that person's information updated in this contract. So if later on we want to give rewards or something, we wouldn't know about those funders. And this wouldn't be great because people would send our contract money without us ever knowing. And we wouldn't be able to give them any credit or anything. Additionally, maybe they called the wrong function by accident and they, they weren't using MetaMask and they weren't using a tool to tell them, hey, this transaction is likely going to fail. So what can we do in this case? What happens if someone sends this contract ETH without calling the fund function. Right now, if we were to send this fund me contract ETH, it would just go to the contract, right? And this contract just wouldn't keep track of those people. But there's actually a way for when people send money to this contract or people call a function that doesn't exist for us to still trigger some code. And now there are two special functions in Solidity. One is called receive and one is called the fallback. Now in Solidity, there are actually a number of special functions and two of these special functions are the receive special function and the fallback special function. A contract can have at most one receive function declared using the receive external payable without the function keyword. This function cannot have arguments, cannot return anything and must have external visibility and a payable state mutability. What does that actually mean and or look like? Well, let's create a separate contract to go ahead and play with this. So in here, we're going to create a new file called fallbackexample.sol. And in here, we're going to add our basic pieces. 
SPX license identifier, MIT, Pragma Solidity, 0.8.7. And we'll do contract fallback example, like so. Feel free to pause the video to catch up to this point. Once we create our fallback contract, let's create a variable to go ahead and try to test this function. We'll create a UN256 public result variable. And let's create this receive function. So we'll say receive is going to be an external payable function. We don't add the function keyword for receive since Solidity knows that receive is a special function. Whenever we send Ethereum or make a transaction to this contract now, as long as there's no data associated with the transaction, this receive function will get triggered. What we can do in here now is we can say result equals one. So let's go ahead and test this out on the JavaScript virtual machine. So we compile this. So we're gonna go ahead and compile this. We'll go deploy it on the JavaScript virtual machine. We're going to deploy our fallback example and we're going to see what result is initialized to since we haven't set anything for result result of course is initialized to zero but what if we were to send this contract some ethereum well receive would go ahead and be triggered here we can actually send this contract some ethereum directly by working with this low level interactions bit here don't worry about what call data means for now just know that this area down here is a way we can send and work with different functions. And we can add parameters to this transaction by going up here and adjusting the variables up here. If we keep call data blank, it'll be the same as if we were in MetaMask and just hitting send and then choosing this contract address. Again, we can't actually use MetaMask since this is a virtual machine and not one of the networks that we're working with. So if I do, for example, I change this value to one way and I keep everything blank, and I go ahead and hit this transaction button, which again, is going to be the same as hitting this send button, but only sending one way. What do you think will happen? Well, let's try it. We can see in the log area that we did indeed send a transaction. And if you look at the description here, you can even see it says from so and so to fallback example dot receive. It looks like it called our receive function, which should have updated our result to one. So if we hit result now, we can indeed see that result has been updated to the value of one. Well, let's go ahead and delete this. Let's deploy this contract again. And this time let's have value be zero. Does receive get triggered this time? So let's pull this down. Let's hit transact. Let's leave the call data blank. We'll leave value at zero. So this will be the same as if we had sent zero Ethereum to this contract. Let's hit transact. Looks like that went through. Do you think result is gonna be one or zero? If you thought one, you were correct. A receive function gets triggered anytime we send a transaction to this contract now, and we don't specify a function and we keep the call data blank. When working with any other contract, like FundMe, for example, when we call one of these functions, we're actually just populating this call data bit with certain data that points to one of these functions up here. If we send a transaction and we add data to it, we could actually call one of these functions. Now let's try this again. Let's delete the contract again. We'll redeploy, open this up. Result is currently zero. Receive, like I said, only is triggered if our call data to it is blank. Now this time, if I add some call data to this transaction, do you think receive will be triggered this time? If we hit transact and remix, we actually get a pop-up saying fallback function is not defined. This is because whenever data is sent with a transaction, Solidity says, oh, well, since you're sending data, you're not looking for receive, you're looking for some function. So let me look for that function for you. Hmm, I don't see any function that matches the 0x00. Zero zero zero. So I'm gonna look for your fallback function. Remix is smart enough to know that we don't have a fallback function. The second special function in Solidity is called the fallback function. This is very similar to the receive function, except for the fact that it can work even when data is sent along with transaction. So our fallback will look something like this. Fallback, external, payable, result equals two. Fallback is another one of these functions where we're not gonna put the function selector because Solidity is expecting this. Actually, you're already familiar with one other special function. If we go back to our fund me, 
Our constructor, for example, is another type of special function. There's no function keyword. Solidity knows that this constructor is immediately called when we deploy this contract. So now we have our fallback function. Let's go ahead and compile this. Let's delete our old contract. Let's go ahead and deploy this new contract. Let's click here. If we hit result, we do indeed see it's set to zero. Now, if I add this 0x00 and I send this and I hit transact, this is equivalent to calling our contract here without a valid function. So our contract goes, hmm, I don't recognize what you're trying to tell me here. I'm gonna refer you to our fallback. And now if we hit result, we see that it's been updated to two. If we take this away, Solidity will go, hmm, it looks like you're trying to send some Ethereum or call this contract without specifying what you wanna do. Well, I have a receive function, so I'm just gonna go ahead and forward you to that. So if we call transact, we hit result, we see it updates back to one. Add some data, hit transact, we see it updates to two. No data, updates to one. Soliditybyexample.org has a wonderful little chart that we can use to figure out whether or not receive is gonna get triggered or fallback is gonna get triggered. If it is empty and there's a receive function, it'll call the receive function. If it is data and there's no receive function, it'll just go to the fallback function. And if there's no fallback function, it might just, it might error out. So this is a lot of really fantastic information here. How can we apply this to our FundMe contract here? Well, what we can do now in our FundMe is we can add these fallback and receive functions just in case somebody actually sends this contract money instead of calling the fund function correctly. So what we can do is let's add a receive function. So if somebody accidentally sends it money, we can still process the transaction. We'll say receive is gonna be external payable, and we'll just have the receive function call fund. And we'll do the same thing with our fallback function. We'll have fallback external payable. We'll just have it automatically call fund. Now, if somebody accidentally sends this money without calling our fund function, it'll still automatically route them over to the fund function. This means too, that if somebody doesn't send us enough funding, it'll that transaction will still get reverted. So let's go ahead now and let's switch to RinkB to test this on a real test net. I'm on RinkB in my MetaMask. Let's switch over to Injected Web 3 and we'll scroll down. We'll choose our FundMe contract and we'll go ahead and deploy this. MetaMask pops up. I'm gonna go ahead and confirm the transaction and we see our FundMe contract here. Right now we can see the own, we can see I'm the owner, we can see minimum USD, and we can see of course that it's a blank contract and there's nothing funded in here. If we copy the address and then go to Rinkby Etherscan, paste the address in, we can see that there's no ether in here and the only transaction associated with this has been the contract creation. We saw what happened before when we hit the fund function. Our contract was updated with a new balance and that funder was added to our array. Let's see what happens now if we just directly send this contract money without calling the fund function here. If we did this right, our receive function should pick it up and kick the transaction over to fund. So let's copy this address. We'll go to our MetaMask. We'll hit send, paste the address in here. We'll do 0 0.02 ETH again, because this should be more than the minimum amount in USD. We'll hit next. I'll go ahead and confirm this. And after a slight delay, if we did this right, we should see this transaction having called the fund function here. Now that our transaction has gone through, and after a brief delay and waiting for Etherscan to update, we do indeed see that our balance has updated to 0 0.02, which of course, this makes sense. And we see in the transactions list here, we see that this actually went through as a, tr as a transfer instead of us calling the fund function. Let's go ahead and remix and see if our funders was updated. It looks like it was. At the zeroth position of funders, we have our address. And if we take our address and pop it into address to amount funded, we can see exactly how much we had funded. This means that since we added this receive function in here, we automatically had it call our fund function up here. So awesome work. We were able to add a receive function to help people who accidentally call the wrong function or accidentally send this contract money instead of correctly calling the fund function. Now, if they had directly called the fund function, 
it would have cost them a little bit less gas, but at least this time they're going to get credit and add it to our funders array for having sent our funding contract money. We've even learned some advanced sections of Solidity. And this is going to be the last time that we start our projects in Remix. We're going to be moving over to a code editor now where we can get even more advanced with our Solidity and our setups. For the most part, you've gone over the vast majority of Solidity basics. There are a number of things that we still haven't learned yet. And the reason we haven't gone into them is because they get more advanced and understanding their real use doesn't really make too much sense until a little bit later. Some of the things that we're going to go over are enums, events, try catch, function selectors, ABI encoding, hashing, and then Yule slash, and then Yule slash assembly. However, if you've gotten this far, you probably can read most Solidity code and understand what's going on, which is absolutely fantastic. So you should give yourself a huge round of applause for getting this far and doing this. Let's do a quick summary of this more advanced section and make sure we understand what we learned. In Solidity, there are a couple special functions. Some of them are receive, fallback, and constructor. These functions don't need to have the function keyword and instead can just be called like so. Receive and fallback are two very special functions. If data is sent with a transaction and no function was specified, the transaction will default to the fallback function if that fallback function exists. If data is empty and there's a receive function, it'll call the receive function. There are a couple of keywords that can help us save gas in the long run. Some of those keywords are going to be constant and immutable. Constant and immutable are for variables that can only be declared and updated once. Once we say minimum USD is 50 times 1E18, this minimum USD can never be changed again. And this helps us save gas. Immutable can also save gas similar to constant. However, immutable variables can be declared one time in the constructor. Once an immutable variable is declared, it can't be changed later on. In fact, if we even tried to update an immutable variable or a constant variable and we compiled, our compiler would give us an error saying, can't write to immutable here. Or if we tried to change a constant variable, our compiler would say, hey, you can't assign to a constant variable. Sorry. In Remix, if we want to send Ether to a contract that's on the JavaScript virtual machine, we can deploy that contract. And then in the contract, we can just hit the transact button without any call data and update the value that we send with the transaction. If call data is blank, it'll trigger a receive function if it exists. But if there's data that doesn't specify any of the other functions, it'll trigger the fallback function. Awesome, you've done fantastically to get this far. And for this section, before we get started, actually moving over to hardhead and moving over to JavaScript and understanding why we need to do that, let's understand a little bit about getting help and running into problems. So let's say we have our, our fund me contract here that we just worked on and we run into an error. Let's say, for example, we forgot the payable keyword, right? And we go ahead and compile this. We'll compile fundme.sol. And we scroll down and we see, obviously, we have two errors here right? We're getting some errors and we scroll down and we see type error message dot value and call value can only be used in payable public functions. Make the function payable or use an internal function to avoid this error. And then it goes ahead and gives the line that's erring. Now this error is pretty clear. This error code is pretty clear. It's saying, Hey, make the function payable or use an internal function to avoid this error, right? It should be pretty easy to, to add payable and then recompile and be good to go. And this is actually a good example of what to do when you run into errors. When you run into errors, the first thing you want to do is you want to try to figure out exactly what's going on yourself based off of what the error says. This one's pretty straightforward, but some of them can be a little bit more obscure. Step one, when trying to get unblocked, trying to tinker and figure out errors yourself, right? Because maybe you go, ah, oh, okay, I'll make this payable, right? And you go to save and then it gives you a different error. It's saying, hey, you know, payable doesn't go here. Um, you resave, you recompile, it goes, hey, we're, we're still missing that payable thing. First step is always going to be try to tinker and figure it out yourself. For this course, I want you to limit tinkering slash triaging to 20 minutes. If you take more than 20 minutes to tinker and triage, then move on to the next step. But I also want you to take at least 15 minutes yourself or be 100% sure you exhausted 
all options. You're completely out of ideas. So typically try to tinker, try some stuff for 15 minutes. And if you're under 15 minutes and you're saying, hey, I'm 100% certain I've tried everything that I can think of, then you can move on to the next step. So step one, when you run into errors is always going to be tinker and try to pinpoint exactly what's going on. Try to pinpoint exactly what's going wrong. Step two, let's say you tinkered and you tried payable all over the place and you couldn't figure out what this error was and how to debug this error. Step two is always going to be Google the exact error and see if you can learn from that. So I'll zoom out a little bit. I'll roll my mouse over this, I'll grab this, I'll copy it, put quotes around it and do exactly that. And Google search that exact error and take some time going through Google, going through Stack Overflow, going through Stack Exchange ETH and look to see if somebody has asked this question already. And it looks like down here, it looks like somebody has type error message of value and call value can only be used on payable public functions. And if we scroll down, we see that somebody ran into exactly this and they went ahead and solved it. They go, I realized my mistake. I needed to add the payable keyword to my own implementation. And they go ahead in this question, they've added the payable. And hopefully this would give you the insight to say, ah, okay, great. I do need to come back here and add payable. Let's say this Stack Overflow question didn't show up, right? This form wasn't here. What do we do next? So step one, tinker. Step two, Google the exact error. I'm gonna do a step 2.5 that only is for this class. Go to our GitHub repo discussions and or updates. For this course specifically, go to this GitHub repo, full blockchain Solidity course JS. It'll look a little bit different when you all get to it, but come to this repo and look in this chronological updates section to see if there's an update on that section that you're doing. Obviously, since I'm recording right now, there's no update. And if you don't get anything, feel free to jump into the discussion section and ask a question in here, right? There's going to be a community of people looking to help each other out and looking to you know, make this a lot of fun. And the reason I say 2.5 is because in the real world, you're not going to have our GitHub repo. When working on stuff outside of this course, you're not going to have this GitHub repo. So instead, in the real world, I'm still going to give you the keys. I'm going to give you what it takes to still unblock yourself on anything, okay? So number three is going to be to ask a question on a forum like Stack Exchange ETH and Stack Overflow. Stack Overflow is a question and answering tech forum like this, right? You can ask tech questions and then you can answer them as well. And as you can see, when you search for these issues, they'll show up. So Stack Overflow is more for general programming questions and Stack Exchange Ethereum or Stack Exchange ETH, the Ethereum Stack Exchange. This is for more Ethereum or EVM based question and all the solidity code that we're going to be working with, whether it's Polygon, whether it's Avalanche, whether it's whatever, those questions are going to be valid here and you can ask here. So what you'd want to do is you'd want to sign up or log in and ask and format your questions on these forms. You'll want to sign up for GitHub. You'll want to sign up for Stack Exchange ETH. You'll want to sign up for Stack Overflow so you can participate in these forums. In fact, if you haven't already, let's sign up for GitHub right now and let me walk you through formatting one of these questions because the better you format your questions, the better chance you have of actually getting the answer. And remember, when asking questions on these forums, when asking questions in these discussion communities, people answer these questions out of the goodness of their heart, right? So if you don't get a response, there's a chance that maybe nobody knows, maybe it's your question isn't formatted very well, and et cetera. So we're gonna learn how to ask really good questions here. And if you're new to blockchain, do not skip this section, okay? This is gonna be that piece that's gonna give you the superpower to unblock yourself from any coding issue you run into. So don't skip this part, be sure to follow along. Okay, so if you don't have a GitHub already, you do need an email to get started. So I'm gonna go ahead and sign in. I made a burner account just for this video. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna go ahead and sign up, GitHub, enter your email. And we hit create account. They're gonna send us an email. So we're gonna come back to our email. We're gonna get our launch code here, paste it in answer a little bit of information. We're gonna choose the free version and fantastic. We've now created a GitHub profile. Now back over in the smart contract kit, full blockchain Solidity course JS, I'm gonna create a new discussion, a new thread that I want you all to comment on to make sure you understand how to format and how to ask questions, okay? 
general thread for practicing question formatting. Woo! And so let's go back here. So first, I'm going to format this question poorly two ways, and then we're going to format it really, really well. So the first way we're going to format it poorly is by not giving enough information. So what we're going to do, so I'm going to just copy this issue. What we're going to do is we would just say like, hey, I'm having trouble with remix and an error. Can someone help me? Why is this not a, a well formatted question? If this is my question, there's, there's not nearly enough information here. I as a helper have no idea what this person's asking. So let's do something else. What I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this entire contract, all of fundme.soul, paste it in here and go, hi, I'm having issues here. Can someone help? And I'm going to hit start discussion. Here, when I hit start discussion, it formats this all weird. And once again, there's not really enough information here. I don't know what the issue is. But at least with this one, we have some code, we have some way to actually debug. So this is a little bit better, but it's still not that good. Let's go ahead and edit this to make this even better. We hit three dots, we can hit edit. What we can do is we can use something called markdown syntax. And I highly recommend learning a little bit of markdown. It's basically some syntax to help make discussions on GitHub and then also questions on Stack Overflow and Stack Exchange a lot easier. So we're gonna format this code by adding these three backticks at the start and then also at the end of our code. And then additionally, next to the first three backticks, we're gonna type solidit, which tells the formatter to to use Solidity to format this code here. Now, if we update discussion, we notice we get some nice highlighting here so that this becomes much, much easier to read, right? This is way easier to read now than, than it was before. However, it's still not specific enough. We've given a ton of code here and we haven't given the specific answer. So this is gonna be really hard for somebody to answer. So let's make this more specific. So let's edit this question again and let's specify. So we see here, our issue is specifically on this function. So we're gonna copy this function and we're gonna delete everything else in here. And now we have just this code inside of here. Now we're gonna make this really specific. We're going to say, on this function, I'm running into an error. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna come back here, we're gonna roll the, over this, we're gonna copy this. We could have whole error code if we want, but we're gonna format this error like this. And then we're gonna say, can someone tell me what's going on? Update. Now this is a much, much easier question to debug, right? We have some minimalistic code. We have the error that we're getting and we have, can someone tell me what's going on? Obviously the answer to this would be to add payable to this. And that's what somebody would say, hey, like you need to add payable to this. I want you all to practice doing some formatting. Go ahead and, and add a comment on this with your own formatted question so that you understand how to actually do the formatting. And it's this markdown format, it's this format here that's gonna be the exact same for asking questions on Stack Overflow or Stack Exchange E. For this course, go ahead and practice. If you want to create more new discussions, feel free to create new discussions. If you wanna use Stack Overflow or Stack Exchange E, I actually highly recommend you use Stack Overflow or Stack Exchange ETH as well because those are gonna get indexed a lot better than GitHub here. Uh, however, feel free to ask questions obviously in this GitHub as well. Now that I've given you kind of the basics rundown, we're gonna watch a video that I made that goes even deeper into why and how to format all these questions and what to use. So let's go ahead and watch that. Every developer has run into this. Oh. Something breaks or maybe you don't know something, but you don't have time to let these stop you. There are a series of steps that one should take to maximize one's chances of solving any coding problem. But you'd be surprised at how few developers currently use the superpower effectively. Our first one will spend the least time on because it's just tinker and experiment. When you run into an issue, keep trying different things you think might work. Maybe try doing print statements throughout the file, learn some debugging tips, but don't be so cocky that you only do this first step. And this shouldn't just be random running around. This should be trying to pinpoint exactly what's going wrong in your code so that you can either ask an effective question or figure it out yourself. So pinpoint exactly what's going wrong because you'll need it for the next steps anyways. Next, check the documentation. Not all tools have good documentation. 
but taking some time to explore documentation can be a quick way to find your answer. You'll want to learn how to search a web page with Command F or Control F. That way you can look for specific keywords on a page or hopefully they have a good search bar that works well. Sometimes documentation can be really dense. So maybe you'll move to the next step, which is doing a web search. At the end of the day, good software engineers are secretly just professional Googlers. And this is one of their most powerful tools, being able to search the web for somebody else who has already run into the problem that you've just run into and then solved it. Most search engines like Google have tools you can use to get even more specific about what you're looking for. Often for specific errors, the best thing to do is actually just copy the exact error and paste it into the search bar with quotes or use the asterisks in spots your error might be too specific. Most of the results you'll get will be from forums and Q&A sites, which leads us to our next step, asking questions in these forums and Q&A sites. Just make sure that before you ask a question, you've done some ample Googling around yourself beforehand. This way you don't waste yours and anybody else's time. And by asking questions that you swear, you will promise me that at some point you will go back and help other people learn as well. Got it? Good. Before even asking your question though, we should learn where is going to be the best place to ask this. And this is why I've categorized four different types of forums and QA sites. Feel free to pause to read them over. And here are some specific examples of each one of these. Index code-based forums like Stack Overflow, indexed repositories like GitHub issues, indexed technology specific forums like r slash eatdev, or unindexed discussion platforms like a Chainlink Discord. One of the key differentiators in these categories is the indexed keyword. We typically want to ask questions on forums that web crawlers have gone through and stuck them in their database or index them. This way, in three weeks, when we look back at the code that we wrote, we can just Google what the f is going on when we forget what it does. And this will help out other developers who run into the same problem, which in turn, they might go ahead and help you out later. Ideally, most of your questions should be asked on one of these index forums for this reason, for their searchability and discoverability. However, some questions are better fit for DMs, Twitter, or Discord that aren't indexed, and we made a little chart here to figure out where's the best place to post your questions. Feel free to pause the video, take a look, or read our blog in the descriptions with the picture as well to take another look at it. And of course, before actually posting to any one of these forums, be sure to read their rules, as they might state that some kind of questions are specifically forbidden, but basically the breakdown looks like this. Theoretical, big picture, or opinionated questions can go great on general Q&A forums like Quora, or specific technical forums like specific subreddits or Discord forums. Specific coding questions can go on these forums as well, but will often get more eyes on coding forums like Stack Overflow or Stack Exchange communities. Often the question of, oh, should I post this on Stack Overflow or maybe a Stack Exchange community is incredibly blurry and sometimes it doesn't really matter which one you post on. Now, if you run into a bug or an issue with a technology you're really familiar with and you think it shouldn't be breaking, this is your chance to pop an issue into their open source code repository and potentially improve the tool. If they don't have an open source code repository, you throw that closed source piece of shit into the garbage. But just kidding, closed source tech has its place in our lives too. Additionally, if you're following a tutorial and they have a Git repo associated with it, like all of my videos that do, that's gonna be the best place to leave your issues. So as much as I hate to say it, putting your issues onto my GitHub repositories is gonna be much more effective for us answering your questions than posting it in the YouTube comments. Now finally, Discord, Element, email, text message, or any other of these unindexed chats are still good places to ask questions, but please try to use them as a last resort. And if they do end up answering one of your questions, maybe go back and add that question and answer to one of the other forums that we were talking about. This way it will be indexed next time you or somebody else Googles it. Now these quicker chat forums are places more for the community to congregate and have quick conversations with each other. They're places to theory craft, talk about new things coming out, new ideas, events, and other things that shouldn't be indexed by web crawlers. They're also great places to meet and network with people that you might be able to bounce ideas off directly as you get to know each other. Which leads into our last section, but before we do that, uh-oh, do you hear that? Oh, that's the video inside another video alarm ringing. When you ask a question in one of these forums, the better you format your questions, the better chance you'll have of getting it answered. Now, there's no bad questions out there, but there are poorly formatted questions. So let's teach you how to always ask questions as formatted as best as possible to give you the highest chance of making sure they get answered. Number one, before asking your question, make sure you followed all the steps in the parent video 
and you've done some research on this already. And make sure the question hasn't already been asked. Number two, make a title that summarizes the specifics of the question. Three, introduce the problem before you write any code. Add minimalistic reproducible code. Minimalistic code means it's not just a copy paste to your entire file. If you're having problems on one line, maybe just post that one line. Reproducible code means that others should be able to run into the exact same error that you're running into, or at least post the steps for them to do it. This doesn't mean that you should put, I was following along Patrick's video and on hour five, I ran into this problem. Just watch his video and you'll get there. As flattering as this is, it's not reasonable that everyone is gonna have watched my videos, even though they should. You'll want to give the technical steps to reach the error that you've reached. For those of you watching my free code camp video, you're kind of exempt from this, but you can only say, hey, I was on hour five on this part of your video inside of our discussions tab of the GitHub repo associated with this course. So you can do that, but only in that GitHub repo associated with this course. Learning Markdown to format your code especially using these three backticks and labeling of the language. This is a critical piece of formatting your code and will drastically improve on the number of people who answer your questions. Any errors or code should be formatted with this three backtick syntax. And finally, often people who care about certain technologies monitor specific tags and monitor specific questions being asked about the technologies that they like. And then finally, again, be sure to read the forum's guides before posting. Different forums have different rules about what they want and what they don't want. So being familiar will increase your chances of getting an answer. All right, so now back to the main video. Now a note about Stack Overflow in particular. Stack Overflow can be a little aggressive, which is why sometimes posting on specific community forums might be better for your specific technology questions. If you post on Stack Overflow and you get a ton of downvotes on your questions, don't let that bother you. Just take it as a learning opportunity to learn about what Stack Overflow likes and doesn't like and just keep going. But do not let that discourage you. Okay, well, now that we know where things should go, where questions should go and how to actually format them, let's practice. Let's look at some sample questions that you might have and we'll figure out where we want to put them. So this first one, where does this one go? Feel free to pause and guess yourself. So a question like this is gonna be great for a Reddit or a Discord probably more a Discord. Now, this is definitely something that you can search for, right? So you probably could search for this, find an answer and go from there, but maybe you wanna ask a buddy or maybe you wanna ask a very specific community like r slash ethdev. Now, of course, if you see this question, you obviously wanna recommend Patrick Collins' YouTube channel. Now, how about this question? Notice it's formatting, right? The title is nice and big. They have a technical command that is formatted properly. They have git commit, which is formatted properly. Where would this go? Something like this, would definitely do very well on a Stack Overflow or an indexed code-based forum. They're very clearly trying to do something technical. Their problem is laid out very clearly and they've given the command that they're looking to do. Now, how about this one? Something like this could go on either Stack Overflow, but it's probably more likely gonna go on a GitHub issue for this Brownie package. A big difference between code forums and in Git repos like GitHub is that when you make an issue on a GitHub repository, especially when you think there's a problem, you do want to be as in-depth as possible. So oftentimes, when making an issue on these repos, they'll even ask, what version are you using? Can you post all your code? Can you post all your files? And just be much, much more explicit. So now how about something like this? So this is going to be really good for the GitHub repo associated with this tutorial. It looks like this person is asking about a very specific tutorial. So posting this there is going to be best. Now, if your question is on a tutorial that doesn't have a GitHub repo, well, they probably should, but then maybe this is better in the comment section. Now, again, this is where this all becomes a little bit more art than science, because maybe this specific error that they're running into is a generic error that a ton of people run into, and maybe it is better on Stack Overflow, or maybe there's an issue with the package, so maybe it is better on GitHub. Or maybe the solution to this is opinionated. And finally, what about this? Yep, this is gonna be much better for a Discord or a DM with your buddy. Anyways, our last step on unblocking you from any question is gonna be join and strengthen the community of your tool. Now at the start, it's gonna be hard for you to give back since you're not gonna be very knowledgeable on these tools. But as you get better at these technologies, you'll want to try to answer some of these new questions that do come in. The reason is because this will give you a chance to actually learn more about the tools that you like. It'll strengthen the community of your favorite tools, meaning if you help answer questions in a tool, it'll actually encourage other people to use the tool because there's a strong following there and likely they might actually help you sometime in the future. You helping people will make you look like a good person and then you'll also feel like a good person. 
Additionally, in many forums like Reddit, oftentimes mods will actually look at how often you post versus how often you help others and comment on other people's posts. And some mods may actually start blocking your posts for abusing the forums and not giving back to the community and only trying to take knowledge. You and the community will be more successful if you join in and help others and not just try to extract things from other people. Additionally, by engaging with the community, I can't tell you how many people I've met and I've learned and been able to brainstorm with. And then the final step is gonna be iterate through these steps. Maybe you get to the end of these and you say, oh, I'm still blocked, but you'll likely be much, much more knowledgeable. So you wanna go back and try these steps again. Now, this is where this whole process is a little bit more art than science because some questions might not have been discovered yet, only very few people know, not enough people understand the importance of the questions or maybe people don't understand your question. And this is why it's important to go back and iterate on these steps. Now that you have the basic building blocks of this incredible superpower, I encourage all of you to go out there and try this and then let me know how it went. All right, awesome. So now that we know more about how to get unblocked, we can move on. The reason it's so important to learn how to get unblocked is because blockchain and Web3 is more than just everybody on their own. It is a very collaborative space. So as you get better and as you learn more, a massive way to test how much you've learned and give back to the community is to going to Stack Overflow and going to Stack Exchange Ethereum and trying to answer some questions yourself. So I highly recommend you all go to Stack Overflow and then you go to the GitHub repo associated with this course. You try to answer some discussions, try to answer some issues and help other people out because it's gonna help you become a much better software engineer. The other reason I wanted to do that part is because when we install some of the tools that I'm about to show you, sometimes the installation process is the hardest piece there. Once you get past the install process, it generally becomes much, much easier, but this can often be the hardest part of the course is just installing some of these tools that we're going to give you. And that's what we're gonna learn about right now. So we have been working so far with Remix. Remix IDE or Integrated Development Environment. As we've seen, it's this wonderful place where we can try out code, we can try Solidity out, we can compile, we can deploy, we can pretty much do everything that we need to do. It's, it's web-based, it can do testing, debugging, deploying, local JavaScript VM. It's very quick and easy to create and test our smart contracts. However, it does have some limitations. It can really only deal with smart contracts. It can't really integrate with other parts of projects has limited support for test or custom deployments, and you need an internet connection to even work with Remix. And it can be tricky to do a lot more advanced functionality. So it's a phenomenal tool and absolutely, if you're looking to do something very quickly, I absolutely recommend everybody just go to Remix to go ahead and try something out. However, now we're gonna move over to a more professional smart contract developer setup, and this is with Hardhat. This is known as a smart contract developer framework similar to Brownie or Foundry or and the likes. There's a number of these frameworks. And the reason that we're going to do Hardhat is because Hardhat is JavaScript based. It's a JavaScript based development environment. It's got JavaScript based compilation environment, deploying, testing, debugging. Now, for those of you who love TypeScript, we will also have TypeScript editions of every single one of our code examples for you. So if you love JavaScript, we got you. If you love TypeScript, we also got you. We're not always going to walk through us doing the TypeScript, but we will sometimes. And all of the code for the TypeScript will be available in the GitHub repo. Now, before we can actually learn Hardhat, we have to learn another package first. So we're gonna learn how to do everything with Ethers.js, which is a JavaScript-based library for working with smart contracts. And it's also what powers the next tool that we're gonna be working with, which is Hardhat. Under the hood of Hardhat, there's a lot of Ethers.js. So it's important for us to learn Ethers.js so that we can understand what Hardhat is actually doing. Now for the rest of the course, I'm gonna be using a code editor called Visual Studio Code. This is one of the most powerful code editors on the planet. And if you've already got it set up, feel free to go ahead and skip this part. If you already have a professional coding setup with Node.js and VS Code and Git and everything, feel free to use the timestamps in the GitHub repository to skip over this setup section. You'll often hear people refer to this as VS Code or Visual Studio Code or just Visual Studio. However, it's important to note that Visual Studio Code, this is different than Visual Studio, which you might see look like this. So Visual Studio Code is what you want, not Visual Studio. Visual Studio is a different application. Make sure you're on Visual Studio Code. Now, if you choose so, and you're a total hardo, you can absolutely work just with your terminal, 
or just with PowerShell or just with whatever coding environment that you want, like Atom or Sublime. However, for us, we're going to be working with Visual Studio Code. And I'm going to be going through setting up Visual Studio Code the way that I like to set it up. You can absolutely set it up whatever way that you feel comfortable. And of course, in our lesson six here, we have a link to installation and setup, and I'm going to be adding more links as we go about here. And once again, all the code that we're going to be working with is in this GitHub repository down here where it says code. Now we're going to go through three different installation processes and pick the one that's most appropriate for you. The first one is going to be for Mac and Linux users. The second one is going to be for Windows users. And then our third one is going to be a last ditch effort. If for whatever reason you can't get Windows or Linux or the Mac instructions to work, we're going to use a Git pod installation. Now I highly, highly recommend that you try to get everything working locally without using Git pod. However, if for whatever reason you can't get those installation pieces to work, we will have Git pod instructions for all of the repos that we work with here. But to get started, we'll start with the Mac and Linux installation instructions. The first thing you're going to want to do is download the Mac, or if you're working with Linux, download the Linux installation of Visual Studio Code. Once you have it installed, it'll look a little something like this. And if it's a fresh installation, it'll even give you some tips and tools to actually get started. If you've never worked with Visual Studio Code before, I highly recommend going through any get started or getting instructions tips that come with opening Visual Studio Code. Additionally, we have a Visual Studio Code crash course in the GitHub repo associated with this course. Once you have Visual Studio Code installed, the next thing that we're going to want to install is going to be Node.js. And again, we have links to all of these in the GitHub repo associated with this course. You can just go ahead and click download for Mac OS or download for Linux. I recommend using the LTS version. LTS stands for long term support, which means that they will be supporting this version for a long time. So go ahead and download Node.js. I've already downloaded this, so I'm not going to go ahead and re-download this. Now, one of the awesome things about Visual Studio Code is it has this thing called terminals, which are command line prompts that allow us to run scripts. Basically, it's where we're going to be running all of our code. The way we can open up the terminal is we can go ahead and hit terminal and select new terminal. And it'll get something like this. Now, you might have bash or ZCH or some other type of shell. The type that you have doesn't really matter because on Mac and Linux, it's going to be Linux based. We can now test our Node.js installation has been done correctly by running node dash dash version. And you should see something that looks like this. The exact version of node that you have doesn't really matter here, but ideally you're at least on node version 14 or higher. And if something like this doesn't show up, remember to go ahead and start looking on Stack Overflow, looking on the GitHub repo in the discussions tab, looking on the updated section, etc. And like I said, sometimes installing this can be the hardest part of this entire course. So, so don't get discouraged and please use Stack Overflow, Stack Exchange Ethereum, and the GitHub repo to move past any issues you run into. Now, if you're on Mac or Linux, you can actually hit control back tick to actually toggle your terminal mode. This will pull the terminal up and down for you. Getting familiar with keyboard shortcuts will actually make your life a lot easier because you'll be able to move around Visual Studio Code much more effectively. We have a link to a list of keyboard shortcuts additionally in the GitHub repository associated with this section. As we move along, I'll give tips on different keyboard shortcuts that you can optionally use. Otherwise, you can just go ahead and click as well. You can click the trash can to delete the terminal, go back up, terminal, new terminal to pop it back up. Now, the next thing that we're gonna need a little bit later, we're not gonna need it for this section, but it's good to install it now, is gonna be Git. Node.js is known as a JavaScript runtime, and it's a tool that we're gonna use to help run JavaScript code in our Visual Studio code. It's not exactly JavaScript, and the difference between Node.js and JavaScript can be a little bit confusing, but don't let that stop you for now. Next, we're actually gonna go ahead and install Git. We will have links to the installation instructions in the GitHub repository. Installing Git on Linux, you're going to use one of these two commands. And on Mac OS, if you just type Git on the command line, it should go ahead and prompt you to install it. So if we're back in our command line and we just type Git, it should prompt you to go ahead and install it. And if you do Git dash dash version, you should get something that looks like this. You can also use a Mac OS Git installer by clicking this link here and running through the installation process. All right, now that you have Node.js, Git, and Visual Studio Code installed, we can continue on to the next section. Awesome. 
If you're not planning on using Windows or Gitpod, feel free to skip the next two sections. I'm running this on Windows 11. However, it should work on most editions of Windows. So the first thing that we're gonna to wanna to stall is Visual Studio Code, which looks something like this. It should auto detect it. And we're gonna go ahead and download this for Windows. I'm gonna walk through all the installation process. Go ahead and create a desktop item. We'll add this just in case we wanna open with code. And we'll go ahead and install. And then we'll go ahead and finish. Once you've installed Visual Studio Code, you'll see something that looks a little like this. It'll go ahead and give you this Get Started with VS Code section where you can choose some themes and you can choose kind of the way it looks. Feel free to customize it the way that you want. If you wanna learn a little bit more about Visual Studio Code, I highly recommend you walk through this section to learn more about the shortcuts and making your development experience more efficient. When you're done, you can just go ahead and close the tabs at the top and it'll look a little something like this. Once we have Visual Studio Code installed, the next thing that we're gonna to wanna to install is Node.js. And of course, we have a link to installing this in the GitHub repository associated with this course. What we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and come to nodejs.org to download this for Windows. Node.js is a JavaScript runtime environment. It's not exactly JavaScript and the distinction can be a little bit confusing, but just know it's gonna help us run our JavaScript code for our development environment. Let's go ahead and download the LTS or the long-term support edition of Node.js. We'll go ahead and we'll run through the setup wizard. And we'll go ahead and make sure that this is clicked just in case we ever want to use some different tools with our setup. And then we'll go ahead and click install. You'll get a pop-up asking if you really want to install this on your device and we'll go ahead and hit yes. And then we'll hit finish. You might get a pop-up that looks like this. Go ahead and click any button to go ahead and install the tools. Go ahead and press any key again and you'll likely get a Windows PowerShell screen pop up asking you to go ahead and install a whole bunch of different projects and files. If you chose not to install this, that's totally okay. But in the future, this will be really helpful since we are gonna use a lot of tools that this package installs anyways. This might take some time to install, so go ahead and be patient. And if it gets stuck, it might just be waiting for you to go ahead and hit enter. So go ahead and, and hit enter for any prompts. But yes, please be patient with this. It can be a little bit slow to go ahead and install everything. Once you have all that installed, you can come back to your Visual Studio code and we're gonna go ahead and open up a terminal. To do that, we hit terminal and we hit new terminal. The terminal is gonna be our command line prompt where we're gonna basically run all of our scripts to work with our code. And if you run node dash dash version, you should see something that looks like this to know that you've installed Node.js correctly. Now this command line is known as Windows PowerShell. If you want to work with Windows PowerShell, you absolutely can. And in fact, if you wanna be a total hardo and write all your code through Windows PowerShell, you can absolutely do that as well. However, we're actually not gonna be working with PowerShell. We're gonna be using a tool that makes our Windows environments more like Linux. The reason that we're doing this is Linux is the standard for most development environments. And having everybody work on a very similar setup will make the rest of this course a lot easier for everyone to interact with each other, no matter what coding environment they're working on. WSL stands for Windows Subsystem for Linux, and it allows Linux programs to run natively on our Windows environments. To get this set up, we're gonna go ahead and go to the WSL install, and we'll have a link for this as well in our GitHub repository. So what we're gonna do, you must be running a Windows 10 version 2004 or higher, or Windows 11. If you're using an older version of Windows, you can absolutely continue with PowerShell but you might run into some issues where all the commands don't work exactly the same. So I highly recommend working on a newer version of Windows. To install this, back in your Visual Studio Code PowerShell or just the PowerShell app by running WSL dash dash install. Now, if you get this error, the requested operation requires elevation. It means that we have to run our Visual Studio Code or our PowerShell application as administrator. We close out our Visual Studio Code and right click it and say, run as administrator. We get a little pop-up saying, do you want to allow this app to make changes to your device? We'll go ahead and click yes. And then we'll reopen the terminal. And then we can run WSL space dash dash install. And we'll go ahead and install WSL. This may take a little bit, so please be patient. Once it's completed, you'll see something that looks like this. We're gonna be working with Ubuntu 
and we have a list of different commands to change your Linux distribution if you choose to do so. And you'll see the request set operation is successful. Changes will not be effective until the system is rebooted. So you'll want to go ahead and restart your computer. There's also a troubleshooting guide in the GitHub repository if you run into issues. After you restart your computer, you'll be prompted for a name for your new system and a password. This can be different from your Windows name and password. And then just follow through with all the prompts. And then once you're done, you'll be dropped into a Ubuntu shell and you can run Linux commands. And now you'll have a Ubuntu instance on your machine and you'll be able to run Linux commands in your terminal. Now that we have WSL set up correctly, we're gonna go ahead back over to Visual Studio Code. Once we have WSL, we'll wanna go ahead and install an extension. So in our Visual Studio Code, we'll go to Extensions and we'll look up Remote Development. You can install the whole thing or just Remote WSL. We're gonna install the whole thing. You can follow along the Get Started with Remote WSL if you like, or you can just follow along with me right now. Right now, if I go to the terminal and hit New Terminal, I'm still gonna get PowerShell. We actually want this to be our Linux shell. So there are a couple ways to open Visual Studio Code up in our Linux environment. One way is you can hit Control Shift P and type WSL and then click Remote WSL, New WSL Window. And you'll get a new window that looks like this. You can also click the bottom left and choose New WSL Window. Now, if we go to our terminal and hit New Terminal, we dropped into a bash shell and we can run Linux commands in here. Awesome. Another way we can open up Visual Studio Code with WSL on is we can go into our Ubuntu application. We can make a folder by typing mkdir folder. We'll cd or change directory into folder and type code period. We'll go ahead and trust the authors in here. And this will open up Visual Studio Code already connected to the folder that we're in. And we can create files in this folder like hi.txt and those will get created inside the folder in our WSL. Now that we're inside our WSL environment, you'll notice that node dash dash version doesn't work anymore. That's because we installed it on our regular Windows machine and not on our WSL or our Linux environment. The reason we installed it on our Windows environment first is so that just in case you wanted to go ahead and use PowerShell or use your Windows environment to run everything, you still can. But just remember, if you use the Windows environment and PowerShell, all the commands that we use might not work for you. So we're gonna go ahead and install Node.js on our Linux environment now. All the commands that we're gonna write are going to be in the GitHub repo associated with this course. We're gonna do a curl command to the MVM repository, which stands for Node Version Manager. and we're gonna pipe the install script into bash. And this will go ahead and install NVM. After running that, we go ahead and trash the terminal and then reopen it. And then we can type NVM dash dash version to see if it actually installed correctly. Once we've installed NVM, we can go ahead and install Node.js using NVM. Just type NVM install and we'll do 16.14.2. This is that same long-term support version we installed on our window machine. Once we have it installed, we can type in node dash dash version, and now we have Node.js installed. Now I know there was a lot here, but if you made it this far, this is fantastic. You've done a great job to push through to this point and get everything set up so you can code in the best environment there is. So if you've made it this far, huge congratulations. Now, the next thing that we're gonna install is Git. And now we're not gonna use Git for this lesson. However, we will definitely be using it in the future. See if Git's installed, type git dash dash version. Sometimes Linux will automatically come with Git installed and you'll see something output like this. If you don't have Git, we can just look up the Git install, which again, link to this is in the description and you'll actually run the installing on Linux. Now, again, now if you want to use PowerShell and you want to do everything with Windows, you can absolutely follow the installing on Windows instructions here instead. When you're working in WSL, you'll want to use the Linux commands instead of the Windows commands, even though you're on a Windows. Because WSL makes it so that you're basically running in a Linux environment. 
And now, if you've made it this far, you should be able to follow along with the Mac and Linux instructions as if you're running on a Mac and a Linux, even though you're running on a Windows. Just be sure that whenever you're in your VS Code, you take a look at the bottom left and make sure you're on WSL Ubuntu. Like I said before, if you want to run in PowerShell or in a Windows environment, you're more than free to do so. But like I said, if you've made it this far, huge congratulations. Awesome work. And then finally, our last setup is gonna be using a tool called Gitpod. Starting from lesson five, the lesson that we're on right now, Ethers.js Simple Storage, all of our code repos are gonna come with a button. In the repo, if you scroll down, it'll come with this open in Gitpod button. Now, Gitpod is a cloud development environment where you can actually run your code on a remote server. It's kind of similar to the Remix IDE, but it allows you to run Visual Studio Code in the browser or connected to another server. This is good because then you don't have to do any installation on anything since all the tools that you can want to use are just going to be running on this remote server. This has its downsides though, obviously, since you'll only be able to code if Gitpod is up and working for you. Additionally, when it comes to private keys, you absolutely do not want to run any code with a private key that has real money in it on Gitpod. Why? Well, once again, since you're running your scripts on a remote server, those servers have access to your private keys. But since you've pinky promised that you, for this course, you're not going to be using a MetaMask or a private key with actual money in it, it should be fine. The other downside is that these often cost money to use and Gitpod isn't free, but it's an option if you absolutely cannot get any of the installation working. So if you go ahead and you hit this opening Gitpod button, you'll get a welcome to Gitpod showing up. Uh, we're going to go ahead and continue with GitHub since you've signed up for GitHub here. You want to go ahead and authorize Gitpod. And it'll go ahead and start creating this workspace for you. And you'll notice it looks exactly like Visual Studio Code. Since I opened the repo up in Gitpod, it came with all the code. And you can even open this workspace up in VS Code Desktop. So this is might be a little bit confusing, but basically you can run off of Gitpod using your local Visual Studio Code. And if you see Gitpod here, that's how you know that you're running off of Gitpod. If you see this pop-up, do you want to open this workspace in VS Code Desktop? You can hit open and it'll ask you if you want to open up Visual Studio Code, which I'm going to go ahead and hit yes. And you'll get something that looks like this on your Visual Studio Code. It'll tell you that it wants to install the Gitpod extension and then open that Gitpod URL. So you can go ahead and install it, reload window and open. And it's gonna go ahead and start connecting to our, the Gitpod workspace. And this is gonna be the same as running Gitpod in the browser here. Or you can also do it manually by hitting the Gitpod in the bottom left and then type in open in VS Code. And then you should be able to run it in your Visual Studio Code. For now, I'm gonna recommend that if you're using Gitpod, just stay in the browser, just so that you know, okay, I am running this on a remote server. And just as a reminder for you that you're not actually locally developing. And hopefully this will be a trigger to not actually put any special private keys or anything like that. But you can make workspaces, you can make new folders, and you should be able to run all the commands on here as if you were running locally with Visual Studio Code. To open up the terminal, you can hit this little bar in the top left, go to terminal, new terminal, or use control tilde, exact same as Mac OS and Linux keyboard shortcuts. To create a new folder, you can change directory, cd dot dot, mkdir, new folder, mkdir makes make directory called new folder, and then we're going to change our directory into new folder and hit enter. And now we're in that new folder. For each section, you can either open up the entire source code right into Gitpod, or you can create a new folder for each section yourself and start from blank. And then you would just type code, period, and you'd be in a brand new folder. All right, this is fantastic. At this point, you should be set up with Visual Studio Code, Node.js, and Git. And I'm going to be working out of a folder called Hard Hat Free Code Camp. At this point, you should have node dash dash version git dash dash version. And if you're using Windows, this should say 
WSL or Ubuntu or something like that. And if you have all that, that means we're ready to go. Now, a quick note, something that you'll see me do a lot, and you can do this as well. Oftentimes, when my terminal gets really, really big, or there's a ton of commands in here, it gets a little bit overwhelming for me. So one thing that you can do is you can type clear and hit enter to clear it. Or what you can do is you can hit command K if you're on a Mac or control K if you're on a Linux or a Windows. And it's one of my favorite keyboard shortcuts that I use all the time. Additionally, the trash can and the X here are very different. If I go do a couple of enters here and we're down here, if I hit the trash can and then pull my terminal back up by doing the toggle or by doing terminal new terminal, you'll see all those lines are still here. But if I hit the trash can and then pull the terminal back up, you'll, you'll see it actually refreshes. Mine has a special command that prints stuff out. Trashing your terminal is basically deleting whatever is running in it and the X is just hiding it. And it's hitting control tilde or toggling our terminal or whatever command it is on your environment, that's equivalent to hitting the hide, not the trash. So if we want to remove and start a terminal over, we hit the trash can and then we pull it back up. All right, so now we're gonna start working with ethers and we're gonna start learning to code our transactions and our contract deployments and everything programmatically at a, at a relatively low level. And we're gonna learn how to deploy and interact with our contracts using the ethers.js package. Now, to get started, I'm gonna recommend you create a folder where you're gonna put all of your projects in it. I'm gonna create a new directory called hh-fcc, which stands for hard hat free code camp. And once we run the command, we can CD into hhfcc, and this is where we'll create all of our projects for this course moving forward, so that we have them all in one place. Now, to get started, whenever you create a new project, you, you always wanna create a new folder. So to create a new folder, we're gonna do mkdir, and we're gonna call this ethers simple storage, like that. And now, if you type ls, you'll see that there is one folder named ethers simple storage. ls is how you list all the contents of your folder. You might have a lot of other folders in here. Uh, I only have the one since I created this new folder for this. Now what you can do, you can type code, ethers, simple, and then if you hit tab, it should auto complete for you. And if you hit enter, Visual Studio Code should open up a new Visual Studio Code for you that is inside of ether simple storage. If you open up your terminal now, your home directory for this workspace is gonna be ether simple storage, as this is what pops up. If that doesn't work for you, what you can also do is you can hit file, open folder, and then open the folder that you just created or that you wanna open. This again will open up VS Code, and if we open up our terminal, we see we're inside of ether simple storage. This is so powerful because as we create files, we'll be able to see those files in our explorer here. This button here stands for the explorer. If we click it, we can see the different files in here. And I'm gonna go ahead and actually delete this file.txt because we're not actually gonna use that. Now it's this part of the course where we're actually gonna start jumping into some JavaScript. S since this course isn't a JavaScript course, if you're unfamiliar with JavaScript, it might be a little bit tricky. If you want to come into this with a better understanding of JavaScript and Node.js, there is a free code camp YouTube video teaching Node.js for beginners, and a link to this will be in the GitHub repo associated with this course. There's also a JavaScript free code camp video that I'm also going to put in the description for this course. Keep in mind that JavaScript and Node.js are slightly different, and we are going to go over some of the differences as we code along here, but for the most part, learning one means you've learned the majority of the other. So if you want to pause and go through these videos before continuing here, please feel free to do so. You don't have to, you can absolutely continue on with the course as is. And if you get confused or stuck on some JavaScript piece, feel free to pause, Google it and, and come back. But just to reiterate, you can check out the JavaScript programming full course and also the Node.js full course as those are both gonna help you. Like I was saying before, Node.js is a JavaScript runtime. So it's not exactly JavaScript, but we're gonna write our code in JavaScript. And if that's confusing, just don't worry about it right now. And as we go through this course, I'll show you where the differences are. But basically you can think of Node.js and JavaScript kind of being the same thing. 
The big thing about Node.js is it allows us to write JavaScript code in the back end, as opposed to running JavaScript on the front end. JavaScript is made to be a browser run language, like running inside of you know Chrome, Brave, Firefox, etc. Node.js allows it to become a, a scripting language, a back end language, which is why the syntax between the front end JavaScript and the back end JavaScript or the Node.js JavaScript are going to be a little bit different. Additionally, as we go along in this code, if you're familiar with TypeScript, all of our code is going to come with a TypeScript edition. TypeScript is what's known as a statically typed version of JavaScript. And it'll be it'll be this one, it'll be TypeScript, not TypeScript edition. I'll go ahead and fix that and remove this one to make it clear. TypeScript is a type safe version of JavaScript, which if that's confusing, don't worry too much about that. But we are going to do all of our programming in JavaScript. And then if the code is different enough, I'll show you how to do it in TypeScript as well. However, for most of them, we're not going to show you the TypeScript editions because it's going to be really similar. But you can always refer back to the GitHub repository to see all the code for the TypeScript. Now, if you're new to this space, I actually do recommend you go ahead and start with JavaScript and learn how to do TypeScript later on. TypeScript actually catches bugs early on, making it a lot easier to code your projects in the long run. However, it does take a lot of extra typing and it can be a little bit frustrating learning how types work for beginners. JavaScript is a little bit more loose as a language and lets us to kind of do whatever we want but it can cause for headache later on. So if you do run into some issues and you do run into some bugs, it might be a good idea to try TypeScript on for size and see how that fares. Well, let's go ahead and begin working on our local development environment and getting set up to do everything in Ethers.js and in JavaScript. Oops, and I actually went and renamed this folder to Ethers Simple Storage dash FCC. The reason I added this dash FCC is all the GitHub repositories associated with this course all the GitHub repos have this dash FCC to know that it is part of this hard hat JavaScript course. Awesome. Let's jump in and let's start working with Solidity in our smart contracts locally in Visual Studio Code. As you can probably tell by the name of this folder, and of course, if you looked at the code, this project is going to be our simple storage project, but developed locally using ethers. So the first thing that we want to do is we want to get in that smart contract code. So what we can do is make sure we have the Explorer selected. We can go ahead and right click and select new file and do simple storage dot soul. Let's close this for now. As we can copy paste our simple storage code from our last section into VS code. If you closed remix or you forgot where it is, you can just go to the ethers simple storage FCC repo, hit simple storage dot soul. And we can just copy all the code in here and then come back over, select simple storage that soul and paste it in. Now, an important note about Visual Studio Code is that when you see this little white dot up here, it means that this file isn't saved. To save, you can hit file, save, and it'll go away like that. Or what you can do is you can hit command S or control S, depending on if you're on a Windows a Mac or a Linux. Now you'll see here that this code is a little bit hard to read. The simple storage .sol. It doesn't have the syntax highlighting that we saw in Remix. So we want to go ahead and add a Visual Studio Code extension to give this syntax highlighting. So what we can do is come over to this bar over here. Looks like this. And if you don't see it on the left hand bar, you should click these three dots and it should be in here. But we'll go ahead and click extensions. And what we're going to do is we're going to look up Solidity plus hardhat. And we're going to install this Solidity plus hardhat extension for VS Code. Now that we have this installed, if we go back over to our simple storage.sol, you'll see that all the highlighting is back in. And now it's much easier to read. All right, so this is good. We have our code in here, we have our syntax highlighting. Now let's add an auto formatter or a default formatter. Right now, our code is pretty good with the way that it's formatted. But what if we uh, we accidentally do some stuff like this or like this or maybe even like this? We add a ton of new lines, etc. Our code can start to look pretty gross. And even though the code itself is fine and it'll run the exact same way with all this extra white space, it doesn't look very good, right? And, it, and due to that, it can be a little bit hard to read. What we want to do then, 
we want to open up our settings and adjust our VS code so that it auto formats whenever we save. So whenever we save, so that whenever it goes from the little white dot here to no white dot, this whole thing gets automatically formatted to something that looks really nice. Okay. So what we can do is we can open up our command palette to open up our command palette. You can hit view command palette and it'll get a little pop up that looks like this. Another way to open up your command palette is you can hit command shift P or control shift P depending on if you're on a Mac or a Linux or windows. And what we want to do is we want to type in settings and we're going to open settings. Jason, we don't want to open the default settings. Jason, we don't want to touch these, but we want to open our Jason settings. You'll also notice there are user settings and workspace settings. These are pieces that we can adjust as well, but we're going to just go right into the Jason settings. So, so I already have some stuff in here, but yours might be blank or you might have some stuff in here as well. So what we're going to do is if you have stuff in here already, we're going to add a comma, then we're going to do quotes, solidity, close the brackets. We're going to do a little colon and something like this. This means that we're going to apply some settings to our visual studio code whenever we're working with solidity. One of the things that we're going to add in here is going to be an editor dot default formatter. And you might even get a pop up that tells you some different things that we can use for a default formatter. Our default formatter is going to be nomic foundation dot hardhat hyphen solidity. This will mean that anytime we go to format our code, it'll use the hardhat solidity plugin as its default formatter. The hardhat solidity plugin comes with some formatting and a lot of other really useful tools for us writing our code. So now that we have this part in, the next thing we're gonna do is add format on save if we haven't already. We could add it in here in our JSON, but I'm gonna add it not in the JSON file, I'm gonna add it in the overall file. So if we open that command palette back up, we type in settings, open user settings, this is another really good place where we can look and add settings with a UI. So these two do essentially the same thing. It's just that this one has styles and a little bit more context versus settings.json just says, okay, give me the raw code for it. This tells us a little bit more. So you can use either one, but we're going to look for format on save. And you're going to want this checked if you haven't already. This means that every time we save, VS Code is going to try to format our code for us. So now that we have this checked, we have settings.json added in. And remember, we want to save this. Remember, if you see this white dot, that means it's not saved. So you're going to want to save it. Let me close it out. Let me close this out too. If we come back in here and we add a bunch of random new spaces or whatever you want to make it look a little bit ugly, and then we save it, it should automatically reformat to look much nicer, right? So if we do something like this, we hit save, it reformats it to look much nicer. This will make it more readable for you and more readable for anybody else who looks at your code. And it's just really nice. And this line of code for your settings.json is located in the full blockchain solidity course.js. So you could also just copy paste it. We are going to end up overriding that default formatter with another formatter called prettier pretty soon. But it's great to have a default formatter so that if you don't feel like adding the prettier code sometime in the future, you can just rely on your default formatter. Awesome. While we're doing formatting, let's also add a default formatter for our JavaScript code. And just to test it out, let's go ahead and create our new file. We'll call it deploy.js. And in here, we can do something like function high console.log hi, and then just add and then just make it look kind of gross. Maybe something like this. If you hit save and it does some auto formatting, that's great. You can actually turn that off by going back to your command palette and saying save without formatting. And that way it'll be saved and not formatted. The way we can add some auto formatting here is we're going to install another extension. This one is going to be called prettier. So we can just look up prettier in the extensions here. And you'll want to install this prettier code formatter. So we're going to go ahead and install this. And great. Now it's installed. Prettier is a form is a code formatter that works for many languages like Python, JavaScript, and even Solidity. 
And pretty soon, we're gonna use Prettier for both JavaScript and Solidity. But for now, we're just gonna use Prettier for JavaScript. We can enable this by opening back up our command palette. We'll go to Preferences, Open Settings. And the same way we added a Solidity section, we're gonna add a JavaScript section. So we're gonna add a comma here, some quotes, brackets. We're gonna type in JavaScript, close that, colon brackets. And we're gonna do the same thing, editor.default formatter. And then we're gonna do, and then in here we're gonna do es, b e n p dot prettier hyphen vs code. And this will make Prettier, the default editor for JavaScript. Now, like I said, pretty soon, we're gonna have Prettier override both of these for Solidity and JavaScript, and we're gonna give Prettier some parameters so that no matter who uses your code, they will always have the exact same formatting. But now that we have Prettier in here as the default editor, if we come back to deploy.js and we hit save, it should format to look a little something like this now. And we go ahead and we do something like this, we go ahead and do something like this, it'll reform it to look like look like that. And then additionally, if you want to go back to your command palette, open user settings, not in JSON mode, and we go to default formatter, you can actually even select a default formatter for all languages. If you want to use prettier for all formatters, feel free to go ahead. But all right, great. Got our JavaScript formatter in as well. Let's start writing some JavaScript code. Awesome, so now that we have our code in here, it's time for us to learn how to actually deploy our contract using JavaScript. This is gonna teach us a lot about transactions and what's going on under the hood, and even what's going on under the hood in Remix. In Remix, we usually just hit a compile button and then hit a deploy button, and that's really it. In JavaScript, we're actually gonna create our own functions that are gonna help us do both of those. And as I mentioned, this is the part of the course where we're gonna start working with JavaScript and optionally TypeScript if you like. Like I said, all of these sections come with a TypeScript edition as well. So let's set up our deploy.js script to actually deploy our simple storage.sol. So how can we get started here? Well, let's first learn how to run a script using JavaScript and Node.js. So if you want to do a print line or just print something out to your terminal, what you can do is something called a console.log. And if I do console.log high, I hit save, and I open up my terminal, I can now run node deploy.js, and it'll print out hi. Node is how we say, hey, we wanna run this JavaScript code using node.js. Other languages you might be familiar with, sometimes we'll do Python, you know, deploy.py, or Java C, deploy.java, you know, et cetera. But with JavaScript, since the front end and back end JavaScript are different, we run code on the back end with Node. And with JavaScript, you can do a lot of things that you'd see in something like Solidity with a little bit looser of a structure. If I wanted to create some variable, I could say let variable equals five. This is kind of similar into Solidity, like UN256 variable equals five. But in JavaScript, we use let or var or const. And then I can print this out. I can do console.log variable and I hit save. JavaScript is optional on whether or not you actually wanna have semicolons here. I think Prettier defaults to putting semicolons and we'll get rid of those in the near future. In your terminal, once you start typing the name of a file, if you hit tab, it could auto-complete the rest of the, the file name for you. Node, deploy, hit tab, it'll auto-complete. And if we hit enter now, we get high and then we get five since it prints out high and then it prints out five. JavaScript automatically starts with whatever code you put, have at the top of the file. So it does console.log first, then variable, and then this one as well. However, a good practice is to actually wrap everything you wanna do in a main function and then run that main function. So what we could do is up at the top here, we could say function main add some parentheses and some brackets, a closing bracket at the bottom and hit save for it to auto format. Right now, if we run this, nothing will happen because we've wrapped all of our code in a main function. So if I run it now, node deploy.js, nothing happens because I need something to call the main function. 
So if I then take this, this main function down here, and I call main, our JavaScript code is actually going to say, ah, the first line of this script is actually this main function here. So now if I do node deploy.js, it'll run high and five, which is what we want. Now, this is going to be the setup for most of our scripts moving forward, including the scripts that we write when we get to hardhat. However, there is going to be one major difference. Instead of regular functions, we're actually going to use something called async functions, and we're going to do something called asynchronous programming to do this. Now, if what I say next is really confusing for you, don't let it slow you down. Feel free to go ahead and watch that JavaScript course to learn more about this, but I'll also let you know, hey, this is an async function. Here's what we need to be aware of when working with it, okay? But I do wanna give you a quick bit background on asynchronous programming. So far, the programming that we've done has been synchronous. And Solidity is an example of a programming language that's synchronous. Synchronous means it just goes one line after another. If our code looks like this, this is synchronous, right? Our main function is the first thing that actually gets called. Then we do console.log, let variable equals five, and then console.log again. This is synchronous programming in JavaScript. All of our Solidity is synchronously programmed. There will be some exceptions to this when working with oracles, but for now, everything is synchronous. JavaScript can be asynchronous, meaning that we can actually have code running at the same time. Good example I like to use to understand the difference is with cooking. In synchronous programming, for cooking, you might put popcorn in microwave, wait for popcorn to finish, and then, and then maybe you'll pour drinks for everyone. And now this is synchronous programming. Now it might be a little bit weird for you just to put the popcorn in the microwave and then just stare at it, waiting for it to finish, and then pour the drinks. You typically can pour the drinks while your popcorn is in the microwave, and this is where asynchronous programming comes in. If setting up for this movie night were asynchronous, what you would do is you'd put popcorn in the microwave, and while the popcorn is in the microwave, pour drinks for everyone, and then you'd wait for popcorn to finish, since there's nothing left for you to do. But it doesn't make sense for you to wait for the popcorn to finish to pour your drinks. You can just go ahead and, and pour the drinks right away and then wait for the popcorn to finish. So asynchronous programming is a way for us to do stuff without waiting around for things to finish. And this is really advantageous. And JavaScript by default allows us to do this asynchronous programming. However, sometimes we do wanna wait for our popcorn to finish. For example, if instead of just pouring drinks, maybe the next thing instead of pouring drinks was place salt on popcorn. Of course, if we wanna place salt on our popcorn, we do have to wait for the popcorn to get out of the microwave. So even though placing popcorn in the microwave has this wait time, we need to be able to tell our code, I want you to actually wait for it or know you're good. You can go on and do another task. So that's kind of the difference here. And I'll leave some links in the GitHub repo associated with this course to understand this a little bit better. Functions that have, functions that come with this waiting period return something called a promise. If put popcorn in the microwave was a function in JavaScript, it would be a promise-based function. A promise can be either pending, fulfilled, or rejected. And this is how we know if our popcorn is done. If our popcorn was a method, uh, if putting popcorn in the microwave were a function in JavaScript, when we're waiting for the popcorn to finish, it's in a pending state. When, it's, when the popcorn is finished, it would be fulfilled. And if we aborted halfway through and we stopped waiting, it would be rejected. So putting the popcorn in the microwave returns a promise. With this promise, we have to tell our code, hey, we want you to wait for the popcorn to finish, or you can go ahead and you can just keep doing stuff. So let's put this all together with some JavaScript syntax here. Let's say, again, we're going to be setting up this movie night, and we need to cook popcorn, pour drinks for everybody, and then we need to start a movie. So let's write some pseudocode to, to pretend what this code would look like if this was actually a function. So we'd create some function called setup movie night. And in here, we would say, okay, what's the first thing we need to do? Okay, we need to cook popcorn. So let's say we have some cook popcorn function. So we'll say, okay, cook popcorn. Then the next thing we're gonna have to do is we're gonna have to pour drinks, pour drinks. So we'll call some pour drinks function. Now, here's the thing. We only wanna start the movie once our popcorn has been cooked and once our drinks have been poured. So if either one of these returned a promise, so if either one of these returns a promise, like cook popcorn, for example, 
we would need to tell our code here to actually wait for the popcorn to finish. Because cook popcorn is going to be a function where we could say let status equals cook popcorn. And while the popcorn is being cooked, the status is going to be pending. Once the popcorn gets cooked, it'll be fulfilled. If the popcorn breaks, the microwave explodes, the status would be rejected. But we don't want the status to be in a pending situation before we move on. We only want to start our movie once these two functions have completed. And let's say both of these return these promises things. So we need to tell our code, hey, you have to wait for you have to wait for cook popcorn and for pour drinks to finish. So what we can do now without getting too deep into the weeds on how all of this works, one of the easiest things that we can do, and you'll see us use this syntax quite often, is we'll turn this function into an async function. When our functions are async, we get access to a keyword called await. The await keyword tells any promise based function to wait for that promise to be fulfilled or rejected. So we say, okay, we want to await for our popcorn to put cook, and then we want to await to pour our drinks, and then we can just go ahead and start the movie. And we only start the movie here once these two have been completed. And this is why throughout all of our code, you'll see this await keyword used a lot, but it can only be used in async functions. So basically, whenever you see this await keyword, just know, ah, okay, the function that's being called is promise based. And we don't want to move on to the next step until that function has completed. So that's a little bit more about promises and asynchronous programming. Hopefully that's clear. If not, like I said, there's some links in the description to learn more about asynchronous programming. The reason I wanted to go through this is because most of the functions that we're going to be working with are going to be asynchronous. For example, when we deploy a contract, what do we have to do? Well, we have to wait for it to be deployed. If we don't use synchronous programming and we just leave our, our function main like this, what would happen is we would write some code like contract.deploy and we wouldn't wait for it to finish. Obviously, if we don't wait for it to finish and we try to run some code on a contract that hasn't finished deploying yet, it's not going to work. So we want to do this. We want to have our main function be an async function so that we can we can wait for our contracts to deploy. We can wait for things to happen. We can wait for our popcorn to finish. We can have the flexibility to tell our code to, to either wait for our popcorn to finish or continue on. So now that we have our main function uh, as an async function, uh, we're going to add some code to our main function down here. And the code that's added here is some syntax for working with asynchronous functions. And if this part is confusing, I'm just going to say for now, absolutely don't worry about this. If you want to try to understand it later, that's fine. But for those who are following along, we're just going to add a, at then catch error. That's the error error. You can follow along typing this yourself, or you can just copy paste it into your code. Basically, what this allows us to do is we have our, our main function that's an asynchronous function. So when we call the main function, this is some other syntax for waiting for it to basically finish and then printing any errors it gets. And that's why we do this. But again, if this big lump of code, if you're like, what is going on with this big lump of code? Honestly, for now, just copy paste it. So great. We have our asynchronous function main, we have some code, and then we have this lump of code, which basically just calls our main asynchronous function. Okay, great. I'm going to delete all this for now, but you can still find that comment in the GitHub repo associated with this course. Awesome. Okay. So now that we have our real basic setup, let's go ahead and start coding. And if, if this setup part is confusing and the async await stuff is confusing, don't worry too much about it. Uh, it'll make more sense as we progress. All of our code basically is going to be inside this async function main, which is going to be our main script for deploying our simple storage.sol. So our deploy script is going to replicate exactly what goes on in Remix. In Remix, what was the first thing that we always did? Well, the first thing that we would do is actually compile all of our code. So we're going to want to compile our code in our JavaScript project as well. In order for us to compile our simple storage contract, we're going to use a tool called sulk.js. Now JavaScript actually has a way to install projects directly into our setups and into our folders. If we scroll down, this sulk.js is exactly what we're looking for because it has a way to compile a contract that imports other contracts via relative paths. You can see a section in this readme and most documentation will have something like this if it's JavaScript compatible for Node.js usage. It says to use the latest stable version of the Solidity compiler via Node.js, you can install it via NPM 
npm install silk. npm is what's known as a package manager. And we actually installed npm just by installing Node.js, right? If we do node dash dash version, you should also be able to do npm dash dash version. Another tool that it comes with is something called core pack. You can type core pack dash dash version. Now we can install with npm using npm install silk. However, I like the yarn package manager a little bit better. So we're actually going to install the yarn package manager instead to do all of our package management. If you go to the installation page, the newer way to install yarn is just by running core pack enable. And the older way is to install with npm. If you go ahead and run core pack enable, after that finishes, you should be able to run yarn dash dash version. Alternatively, you can just run npm i dash g core pack, and then you can run core pack enable. The last option you have is you can run npm i dash g yarn. This will install yarn globally for your system, but this is considered the outdated way to install yarn. And ideally you run core pack enable, but in any case, after you run those, if you run yarn dash dash version, you should get something that looks like this. Now that we have yarn, we can actually use yarn to install all of our projects instead of NPM. Back in Sulk.js, where it says NPM install Sulk, we can do the yarn equivalence of NPM install Sulk, which is gonna be yarn add Sulk. This will actually go ahead and install Sulk to our project. If we open up our folders, you'll actually see that this added a couple of different folders. It first added a package.json. Package.json is a file that tells us a lot about our project and the dependencies that it works with. For example, we've installed the Sulk package of 0.8.13. Our yarn.lock tells us the exact version of all the different packages of our project. For example, the reason this is so important too is Sulk has a ton of dependencies as well. So yarn.lock tells us exactly what version of Sulk and all the different dependencies of Sulk and any other project that we add. This is an auto-generated file. Don't edit the file directly. The final bit is we get this node modules folder. This node modules folder is gonna be where all the installed code that we just downloaded is. For example, if we look in node modules, we can see there's a Sulk folder and inside this Sulk folder is all the code associated with this Sulk package that we just installed. And since we're working with 0.8.7 of Solidity, we actually want to install that specific version. So we're gonna do yarn add Sulk at 0.8.7 dash fixed. And you'll see in our package.json, you can now see 0.8.7 dash fixed in our dependencies section for Sulk. Normally you can just add your Sulk version like yarn add 0.8.7, but there was an issue with 0.8.7. So we had to do a 0.8.7 dash fixed. You can find the different releases and the different versions if you go to Sulk.js releases and then to tags. All right, great. Now that we have Sulk, we have the ability to actually compile our contracts. We could either compile them in our code and have it automatically run whenever we hit deploy or, or we could compile them separately. If you wanna go back after this section, there's an example in the Sulk.js repository that shows you how to actually compile Sulk right in your code. We are actually gonna compile them separately using a Sulk.js command. The yarn command is both used to install dependencies and it can be used to run scripts. If you go to Sulk.js and you scroll down, says in order to use the command line, you actually need to install it globally. If you want to install this globally using yarn global add sulk at 0.8.7 dash fixed, you can absolutely go ahead. However, since we're inside of this folder here, which has the yarn.lock, the package.json and the node modules, yarn will be smart enough to know, ah, you're looking for the sulk in this folder. So we can actually go ahead and compile our contract using yarn and sulk.js. If you wanna see all the different commands sulk.js allows, we can just run yarn sulk.js dash dash help. And you'll see it'll spit out a list of all the different options that sulk.js has. You can also run yarn sulk.js dash dash version 
to just make sure that we're on the correct version, which is indeed 0.8.7. Now, to actually compile our simple storage.sol, let's run the compilation command. We'll run yarn soljs dash dash bin, since we want the binary, dash dash abi, since we also want the abi, dash dash include path node modules, since we want to include any contracts or files in our node modules. We aren't using any for this project, but in the future, you will need to include this dash dash include path node module. We'll do dash dash base path of period. This period means that the base path is gonna be this folder dash O period, which means we're gonna output the compiled binary and ABI to this folder. And then finally, simple storage dot soul since this is the contract that we want to compile. I auto completed it from simple storage to simple storage.sol by typing simple and then hitting tab. But let's go ahead and hit enter. You'll see it's running this command to compile this contract. And you'll see two files get output, one called simple storage soul underscore simple storage.abi and simple storage soul underscore simple storage.bin. The ABI is obviously the ABI of this contract which we'll need in the future. And then the bin is gonna be the binary or the really low level of this code. Back in Remix, if you compile simple storage.sol, you can actually look at compilation details like the ABI, which we just got, or the bytecode, which if you look at this object, 60806, that's the same as the binary here, 60806. All right, great. So now we've compiled our contracts here. Now, obviously, now, if you hit up on your keyboard, you can actually cycle through your most recent terminal commands. And if you hit up enough, we can see this command that we just ran. Typing this out or hitting up a whole bunch every single time is gonna be really annoying to do anytime we want to recompile. So what we can do is we can add a, a scripts section in our package.json to shorten some yarn scripts for us. So what we'll do is back on our package.json, we'll add a comma, and we'll add a section called scripts. Add the, the colon and the brackets. And in here, we'll say anytime we say compile, we will run this long command. So we'll add compile, we'll put some quotes, and we'll paste that in there. So now, instead of typing that whole thing out, as long as in we're in the same folder that our package.json is in, we can run yarn compile, and this will run that whole script for us without us having to type the whole thing out. Scripts are a really useful way to make it easier for us to run long commands. All right, great. Now we have our code compiled. This is going to be equivalent to us have hitting this compile button for us to actually go ahead and deploy. So now we have our simple storage.sol compiled. Let's learn how we can actually deploy this thing. Remember in Remix, we actually deployed it to one of two different places. We deployed it to either a JavaScript VM or with our injected Web3 with our MetaMask. Let's learn first how to do the JavaScript VM, and then we'll learn how to use the injected Web3 or a MetaMask or some connection to an actual testnet. So in order to deploy this to a JavaScript virtual environment or kind of a fake blockchain, we're gonna to need to get a fake blockchain. Now in the future, we're gonna be using the hardhat runtime environment as our JavaScript virtual machine or AKA our fake blockchain. But for this section, I want us to use a tool called Ganache. There's a link to this in the GitHub repository. Ganache is similar to a virtual machine in Remix. It's a fake blockchain that we can run locally to actually test, deploy, and run code. It's also a nice way to see things that are going on in a blockchain. Let's go ahead and spin up the Ganache application after you install it. The Ganache application will look a little something like this. And to spin up a, a fake blockchain really quickly, you can just go ahead and click Quick Start. This will spin up a fake blockchain that's running locally on your computer right here, which is fantastic. It comes with a whole bunch of fake accounts, exactly like how Remix comes with a ton of fake accounts with 100 Ether each. Ganache comes with a bunch of fake accounts with 100 Ether each. They also come with the private keys that we can use in our applications to actually take control of these fake accounts. Remember, don't use these private keys on a public blockchain. They're for development purposes only because a lot of people know these private keys. In our code, one of the first things that we're gonna need to do is actually connect to our blockchain. Remix does this a little bit behind the scenes. 
If we're choosing JavaScript virtual machine, Remix chooses its own fake blockchain that it runs. If we choose Injected Web 3, as we know, MetaMask pops up and it connects to our MetaMask. This connection that Remix does is actually doing something really interesting. It's not just connecting to our MetaMask by some magical powers. It's actually connecting to our MetaMask, which has a connection to the blockchain behind the scenes. If you open up your MetaMask and you go down to, you select the networks and you select add networks, you'll get popped up into a UI that looks like this. If we go back and hit select networks over here, we can actually see information about these different networks. One of the main things that we can see is that all these networks have something called an RPC URL. RPC stands for remote procedure call, and then URL is uniform resource locator. This RPC URL stands for a connection to a blockchain node that somebody is running. This, this URL connects us to make API calls and to interact with a blockchain node. Blockchain nodes run with software and some of them expose an API call. If you look at the Go Ethereum website, there actually are instructions for you to run your own blockchain node for a real blockchain like Ethereum. Most of these have flags like dash HTTP.ADR to expose these RPC endpoints. So if you ever want to run your own node, your own real blockchain node, instead of using MetaMasks or any other of the providers that we're going to go through, you can use GoEthereum or whatever blockchain you're working with software to run your own nodes. But it's this RPC URL that allows us to connect to RinkBee if we're on RinkBee, Robston if we're on Robston, Mainnet if we're on Mainnet, etc. And it's going to be the way that we're going to connect to our Ganache blockchain that we're running inside of this application. So if you look at the top, of your Ganache here, there's a section called the RPC server. And this is the endpoint of our Ganache node right now. So what we can do is we can copy this and go back to our VS code and paste it in here to see if we can connect. Instead of HTTP with these capitals, we're gonna have it be lowercase instead of the uppercase because the lowercase is more correct and it looks nicer. But now that we have the endpoint, hypothetically with just this, we can start making calls and API calls to this endpoint. You go to this JSON RPC specification, again, link will be in the GitHub repo. We can actually see different calls we can make directly to our node to get different information. ETH get blocked by hash, ETH get blocked by number, and all of these wonderful pieces in here. Making these API calls directly is, is a little bit annoying to do ourselves. If you wanna do it yourself, you absolutely can using an API endpoint like Axios or Fetch. However, we're gonna use a wrapper to interact with our node and do things like deploy and interact and other such things with our blockchain node. This is finally where Ethers comes into play. Ethers.js is one of the most popular JavaScript-based tooling kits that allows us to interact with different blockchains. And it has all these wrappers that make all these API calls and do all these things with Ethereum and Polygon and Avalanche and any EVM compatible chain. The other incredibly popular package that does the same thing is gonna be web3.js. And you've probably heard about this and you'll probably see it a little bit more throughout this course and throughout your web3 journey. The reason that we're using Ethers is that Ethers is the main tool that powers the hardhat environment. And I really enjoy it myself. And remember, if you ever get lost with any of this, you can always come back to their documentation. To install it, as you can see here, you can just run npm install ethers. We're just gonna do yarn add ethers. And now you should see in your package.json, we now have ethers added in here. Awesome. Now back in our code, we're gonna import ethers into our deploy.js script so that we can use all the wonderful tools it comes with. So we'll say const ethers equals require ethers. For those of you doing the TypeScript edition of this course, this will be import instead of require. Now that we have ethers in here, we can create our provider object in our main function. The reason we, we pull ethers outside of the main function is because we do want to pull our package into our script before we call main. We want to make sure all of this is done first. So you'll see this is kind of the, the normal setup of our scripts. At the top, we import any dependencies or external packages. We'll have our main function and then we'll call our main function at the bottom. Const is a keyword similar to let. The const keyword makes it so that ethers can't be changed. So we can't change this our ethers variable anytime we use const. Require is a function for us to import the ethers package. Now Remix does all this behind the scenes, but the way we're gonna do it in our code here is we're gonna say const provider equals new 
ethers.providers.jsonrpcprovider. And then we're going to pass this string as our provider. So we're saying, hey, we're going to connect to this URL right here. Awesome. So this is the way that our script is going to connect to our blockchain, our local blockchain. Now let's get an actual wallet here with a private key and a balance and everything. We can see all of our wallets and private keys in our ganache here. So the way to get this set up is we can say const wallet equals new ethers dot wallet. And this wallet function takes in a couple of input parameters like a private key and a provider. So you got a private key, we'll go to ganache here and just choose one of these private keys. And we're gonna paste this right into our code. And then we're gonna do comma provider and save that. Now, pasting your private key directly into your code is a huge no-no. And we're gonna learn how to avoid this in the future. It's okay right now, since we're just using one of the Ganache private keys and you have no risk of having any money associated with this account. These two lines alone give us everything that we need to interact with smart contract. They give us our connection to the blockchain and they give us a wallet with a private key so we can sign different transactions. If you remember back to our blockchain basics section, this is the private key that we're using to sign all of our transactions to encrypt our transactions. Now that we have a provider and a wallet, let's go ahead and grab our contract objects from these two files here. In order to deploy our contract, we're gonna need the ABI and we're gonna need the binary compiled code of the contract. So we're gonna to need to read from these two files. To read from these two files, we're gonna to need to use a package called FS. So back at the top, we're gonna to do const FS equals require FS extra. I auto save all the time. You'll see like I'll do something and then my white dot will go away a lot. It's because my fingers have a habit of pretty much any time I stop typing, I save. <laughs> so, so please remember to save early and often. This FS extra should come directly with your node project, but if not, you can always add it with yarn add FS extra. You should see it in our package.json. Now we can get the ABI and the binary. We can say const ABI equals FS dot read file sync, which means we're gonna synchronously read from this file. We could do it asynchronously, but we wanna wait for this file to get done. So we're gonna say read file sync. And depending on your VS code, if you scroll over, you might even get some information about this function pop up like this, which can be really helpful. We can see that we need the path for the file we wanna read and then any options as well. Path of file that we wanna to read to get the ABI located at dot slash simple storage underscore soul underscore simple storage dot ABI. And then we're gonna do a comma of UTF-8. This UTF-8 is the encoding that we do for this file here. Don't worry too much about what that means for now. So we need the ABI and we also need the binary, which is in this second file, simple storage underscore soul underscore simple storage dot bin. So we're gonna say const binary equals fs dot read file sync. We're gonna give it the path here, which is gonna be dot slash simple storage soul simple storage dot bin. And then the encoding option, which again is gonna be, and it should look like this. Now that we have the binary, we have the ABI, we can create something called a contract factory, which is not to be confused with the factory pattern. In ethers, a contract factory is just an object that you can use to deploy contracts. So we're gonna say const contract factory equals new ethers.contract factory. And we're gonna pass it the ABI, the binary, and the wallet. We pass the ABI so that our code knows how to interact with the contract. The binary, obviously, because this is the main compiled code in our wallet so that we have a private key we can use to sign deploying this contract. Then I usually like to write a little console.log saying something like deploying, please wait. And we can actually deploy this contract with ethers by doing const contract equals await contract factory deploy. Now, this is the first time we've seen this await keyword, and you can only use the await keyword inside of an async function. 
The reason we want this await keyword, we're telling our code to stop here, wait for contract to deploy. And this await keyword means that this will resolve the promise contract. And this contract factory dot deploy with the await here returns a contract object. So now I can do something like console dot log contract. Let's see what happens when we run this code. Node deploy dot JS. We scroll up. We see deploying, please wait. And then we see this massive object that gets printed out. This is the contract object that we just deployed. And in fact, if we go over to our ganache, we can see that the address that we use for our wallet has a little bit less balance and has a transaction count of one. If we were working with Truffle, we'd be able to see the contracts here. We're working with Hardhat, so you won't be able to see the contracts in here. But if you go to transactions, we can indeed see the transaction that we just created. This is similar to Etherscan, but for our local blockchain. We can see the sender address, the creation address, the value, gas price, all this stuff associated with this contract. You can also see the different blocks. Since we've only made one transaction, only one block has been mined. And this is awesome. We have all this other stuff associated with it. Great job. You just deployed a contract to your own local blockchain with Ethers JS. This is fantastic. Awesome work. Now, let me show you what happens if we don't use the await keyword here. We're not telling our code to stop. We're saying, hey, deploy this contract and then just keep going. So we never actually check to see if this deploy function finished. So let's see what happens when we run this instead. Instead of that big contract object, we get this promise in its pending state because our code actually finished before our contract could finish deploying. So we see promise pending here instead. This is why the await keyword is so important. We're saying, hey, wait for this to finish. The await keyword also resolves a promise. So it'll wait for the promise to exit its pending state, and then it'll return whatever the pending promise returns. So contract factory to deploy returns a promise that returns a contract. In fact, if we go to the ethers documentation, we look up deploy in here, we can see contract factory methods, contract factory dot deploy. If we look at the definition of the function, it says contract factory dot deploy, takes a whole bunch of arguments and some overrides. This arrow is saying this is what it returns. It returns a promise that resolves to a contract. And that's why we need this await keyword because contract factory dot deploy by itself just returns a promise. But if we do await contract factory dot deploy, we're saying it returns a promise that resolves to a contract and we're waiting for it to finish deploying to resolve to a contract object. So that's going to be a major difference here. Awesome work. So that's going to be why this await keyword is so important. And again, you can only do that in asynchronous functions. So you need this async keyword at the top of your function names. Awesome work. So we've deployed a contract to our ganache chain. This is fantastic. Let's play with this a little bit more. So what else can we do? Remember how in Remix and in MetaMask, we could add a whole bunch of stuff. We could add a gas limit. We could add some value. When we were doing our transact, we could press the transact button. We know that when we're working with MetaMask and we want to send some money between our accounts, we can actually choose our gas price, our priority fee, all this other stuff. We can actually do all that in Ethers as well. So if we wanted to await contract factory to deploy, but with a certain gas price, we could add these overrides in this deploy function here. Another really neat trick that your Visual Studio code might have is if you click command or control, depending on your setup, you can actually click into a function and see where it's defined and see everything about this function. So if I command clicked, I could see that I'm now in node modules, ethers project, contract, source.ts, all this stuff. And I can see exactly the function definition of this deploy function on the contract factory object, which shows us the same code as what we saw in the documentation. We see we have a deploy function, it takes some arguments, and then it returns this little semicolon means it returns a promise that resolves to a contract, which is really nice. These args in here are actually a list of overrides that we can specify with some brackets. So what we can do is we can put some brackets in our deploy function here and specify certain things. Like for example, we can specify the gas price to being 
some number. And now if we were to run this, we would deploy this contract with a gas price of this. We could add a gas limit. We can add a whole bunch of different overrides in our deploy function here. Well, what else can we do? Well, we can wait for a certain number of blocks for our contract to finish with. So we've deployed the contract, but maybe we wanna wait one block to make sure it actually gets attached to the chain. So we can say const deployment receipt equals await contract dot deploy transaction dot wait and specify the number of confirmations that we wanna actually wait. So we'll wait one block confirmation to make sure that this happened. And then we can do console.log this deployment receipt option. So if we run the code now, we can see all this information about our transaction. And we can see exactly what our transaction looks like. We can see there's two is null because we're creating a contract. From is gonna be this ganache address that we got the private key for. We see the contract address that we created, transaction index, we can see gas use, gas use, log bloom, block cash, transaction. We can see all this information about our transaction. Something I want you to take note of is the deployment receipt and the deployment transaction. I want you to separate these two because it's gonna make your life a lot easier. So we're gonna do a quick console.log. Here is the deployment transaction. And we'll do console.log contract.deploy transaction. And then I'm gonna copy this whole line by just typing command C or control C right there. And then here is the deployment. Here is the transaction receipt. And then this deployment receipt is the transaction receipt. So I'm just gonna rename this to transaction receipt to make it a little bit clearer which one's which. And we'll run this one more time. You only get a transaction receipt when you wait for a block confirmation. Otherwise, you're gonna get the contract object which has the deploy transaction with it. This distinction will be more important later on, but I wanted you to know the difference between the two. Transaction receipt is what you get when you wait for a block confirmation. The deployment transaction or the transaction response, transaction response is what you get just when you create your transaction. So transaction receipt, transaction response, they're different. Receipt is what you get when you wait for a transaction to finish and then response is just what you initially get. Make sense? Okay, great. I'm gonna go ahead and delete those, but those lines will be in the code associated with the GitHub. Now you saw when we actually printed out those receipts, we got all this stuff in here because deploying a contract is actually just sending a transaction as we've said before. So if we wanna see what's really going on under the hood, we can actually create a transaction ourselves and create a contract ourselves just by specifying the transaction information. So how will we do that? Let's deploy this contract again, but only purely using transaction data. So we'll do a console.log. Let's deploy with only transaction data. And this is gonna be the way you can actually deploy or send transactions purely with transaction data. You can send any transaction. This gives you unlimited flexibility with the transactions you want to send. What we can do is we can say const or let TX, which is gonna stand for our transaction, equals, and we can just add all of our transaction information in here. So the first thing that we're gonna need is our nuts or the number that we only use once. If we go back to our transaction count, we're on four transactions here. So we'll use the nuns five because that's gonna be a nuns that we haven't used before. Every time you send a transaction, it comes with one of those nunces, right? So the nuns is a bit of a over, overused term. We saw it back in our blockchain basics that we use the nuns to, to solve that hard problem. Nunces are also used in wallets and in signers to send transactions and they use a different nuns for every transaction. So nunce, when we're talking about wallets, talks about a number associated with a unique transaction. Nunce, when we're talking about blockchain mining, is a value used to solve that hard problem. They both mean the same thing. They both mean a number only used once, but they're different in these different contexts. So we're gonna use this number only used once, this unique number for our transaction to send this. So we're gonna say nunce is gonna be five. We're gonna pick a gas price of, of this right here. We're just gonna use the gas price of ganache like that. We're gonna pick a gas limit of some big number. We'll use one, 
one, two, three, four, five, six. We'll just use that. We're going to say two is going to be null, right? Exactly like what we saw in our receipts and responses down here. Since we're creating a contract, value is going to be zero. Since we're creating a contract, we don't want to send any ETH or Polygon or Avalanche. And then data is going to be that massive binary object in our binary bit. So in the binary section, we're going to copy this massive binary piece and we're going to put some quotes in here. We're going to do zero X and paste that in here. So this massive, massive data piece is the binary that we're sending. Whenever you send a transaction, you have this, this data object that you can fill with stuff. We're filling our data object with the binary, with the code that tells Ethereum, that tells our blockchain to deploy our smart contract that's going to look exactly like this. And then finally, we want to add the chain ID. As we've seen before with MetaMask, if we go back over to our networks, each one of these EVM chains has a different chain ID. Ethereum mainnet is one, Propstin is three, Rink B is four, Coven is 42, etc. And other EVM chains like Avalanche, like Polygon, are going to have their unique chain IDs as well. For Ganache, we can see the network ID up here is 1337. And some people, so we can just paste that in here. Some people have run into some issues where the chain ID and the network ID are different. And the chain ID is actually 31337. So if you have a problem with this, try 31337 instead. But it should be 1337. Now this is a transaction with all this information propagated, which is awesome. However, this transaction isn't signed. So nobody's sending this transaction right now. This is just the transaction details of what somebody wants to do. We actually need to sign this transaction and then send it to our blockchain. Const signed TX response equals await wallet dot sign transaction. And we can pass that TX object and then we'll do a console dot log of the signed TX response. In JavaScript, same as Solidity, if you type two backslashes before some code, it won't run that code. So I'm going to go ahead and comment out these three lines above. And the way that I'm doing it is by highlighting the sections and hitting command backslash. Or you might hit control backslash, but this is a keyboard shortcut you can use to quickly comment out entire sections. And the reason I'm doing this is because I want to show you what happens when we just run sign TX response wallet dot sign transaction back in our ganache. We see that we have four blocks in here. So let me ask if we do this sign transaction and we get this sign transaction response, will we propagate another block? Well, let's find out. We'll run node deploy.js. We get this massive thing here. But if we go back to ganache, we refresh we actually don't see another transaction sent. That's because we're only signing a transaction here. We're not actually sending it. So this signed transaction response, this big number here represents a signed transaction, but not a sent transaction, which is different. We can actually send one of these transactions by changing this line a little bit. So instead of signed TX response, we'll change this to sent TX response equals await wallet dot send transaction TX. Then once we send the transaction here, we can do await send transaction response dot wait one. And we're going to wait one block confirmation to make sure this transaction actually goes through. Then we can run node deploy.js. And it looks like it's done. But if we actually scroll up, we actually got an error here. So there's this huge, massive thing here. And if we scroll up, we'll eventually see TX reject error. The TX doesn't have the correct nonce, which just for some practice, let's go ahead, type this into Google and see what we get. We actually get a web three JS from four years ago. I'm trying to call leaf picked, blah, 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 blah. It looks like this is a MetaMask issue that they ran into. And they said you have to reset your account in MetaMask, which we could do, but mm, let's make this a little bit more specific. Let's say Ethers JS. It looks like we don't get, it looks like as of right now from this recording, we don't get a Stack Exchange ETH or a Stack Overflow question for this. It's probably because this is pretty straightforward. We don't have the correct nonce for our transaction, but this would be a good time to actually make this a question on Stack Overflow or Stack Exchange Ethereum. 
so that it shows up first. So we actually don't get the correct nonce. We're gonna wanna make this a nonce of four. You can see here, account has a nonce of four, TX has a nonce of five. So we actually would want this to be four. Now, an easier way to always get the correct nonce here is gonna be actually just calling the transaction count from the wallet. So back in the ethers documentation, there's actually some good samples here on how to signing a message and then how to actually send these messages. So we can do await wallet.getTransactionCount to get the nuns. So back in our code, we could do const nuns equals await. Oops, I copy pasted it. Await wallet.getTransactionCount. And then we can just place the nuns right here. Now, let's try running this again. And it looks like this one did indeed go through. We can verify on Ganache here. We do indeed see we're currently on block five now and we have one extra transaction. Now we could go ahead and just run this again and we'll never have to worry about actually updating this nuts ourselves since we're just calling wallet.getTransactionCount to keep updating it. Current block is six and the, our additional transaction has indeed gone through. Awesome. I showed you how to actually sign the transaction, but we didn't sign the transaction for our send transaction. Well, why not? If you command click or control click, or you go to the documentation for ethers, we can see the code for send transaction. So first it does some check provider stuff, does some stuff to populate the transaction, but we can actually see that before it sends the transaction, even in ethers, it signs the transaction first and then calls this.provider.sendTransaction. So if you just call send transaction with the transaction details like we did here, it's the same as signing it first and then sending it with the provider. Okay, great. So we've learned how to send a transaction using pure JavaScript and using pure ethers. One of the main takeaways from this is that every time we change the blockchain, every time we change state, every time we use gas, we're sending a transaction that looks pretty much exactly like this. The data in it is gonna be the differentiator. The data for us here was data saying to create a new contract. When we make transactions like adding people or storing, the data that we're gonna be passing in our transactions is gonna be data associated with calling these functions. And when we actually call functions in ethers or in hardhat, we're not gonna do this kind of raw const TX and list out all this stuff like here and list out the raw data, right? Because that's really, really hard. Ethers and hardhat are gonna make this process a lot easier. So for now, Let's go ahead, comment out this whole section, which again, if we copy this whole thing and then hit command slash or control slash or whatever the shortcut is on your environment, that'll actually comment this out. Let's go ahead and uncomment this section so that we deploy our contract using kind of the ethers much easier to read way than this weird TX stuff. So cool. So we've changed our script back to deploying our contract like this. Now that we've actually deployed our contract, we can learn how to interact with our contract through code as well. The same way that we click these buttons in Remix, we're gonna code it out for ourselves here. So if we look at simple storage, we have a button for add person, for store, and then we have these view functions as well. The easiest one is gonna be the retrieve function, which grabs our favorite number. Retrieve returns favorite number. So we can call that in ethers by doing const current favorite number equals await contract dot retrieve. The contract object that we have is what's returned from our contract factory as long as we've awaited it. The contract object is going to come with all the functionality described in our ABI. That's why we had to pass the ABI to our contract factory. If we look inside our ABI piece here, we can see it has a ton of information on the different functions that we can call and the types that it has and and the return types and everything like that. For example, if I look up retrieve, I can see down here we have retrieve. We can see that the name of this function is going to be retrieve and the outputs are going to be a uint 256 of type uint 256. Now, this is a little bit difficult to read because it's not formatted. Since we call this dot abi, it's going to be a little bit hard to read, but we could change it to be dot json and then you'll see it's highlighted a little bit. You can even do format document with prettier and you'll see it actually formats to be a lot easier to read. Now we can go back to retrieve and we can see this block of code here defines what the retrieve function can and can't do. I'm going to change it back to ABI and it looks like my formatting has stayed, which is great. This is much easier to read than it was before. As I said, the ABI or the application binary interface is incredibly important for working with our contracts. 
if we give our code just this huge bytecode thing, it's going to be really hard for any processor to decompile this or understand what exactly what the functions are that are going on here. There are decompiler options out there like ethervm.io slash decompile that can decompile some bytecode into the solidity but it can be really tricky to get it exactly right. So it's much easier just to have the ABI to say, hey, this lump of code, this lump of numbers and jarbled nonsense is this. When we deploy this bytecode to the blockchain and we call functions on it, the code will automatically allow those functions to get called if they do exist. But in order for our code to know that they exist, it's much easier just to give it the ABI. So we can get our current favorite number like this. Let's go ahead and console.log the current favorite number. Now that we've edited this code, we're going to, let me zoom out a little bit. Now that we've edited this code, we're going to connect our ganache instance. We're gonna connect a wallet with a private key that we got from the top of our ganache here. We're gonna grab the ABI and the binary of our contracts and connect them to a new contract factory object, which is connected to that wallet. So that wallet will be the one to actually deploy the contract. We'll deploy the contract with const contract equals await contract factory dot deploy. We will wait one block for that transaction to finish. And in fact, we're not going to use transaction receipt. So for now, we're just going to delete that part. We're not going to do any of this here. So I'm going to delete it for now. However, I'll leave this section commented out in the GitHub repo. And then we're going to call contract dot retrieve, which should return our current favorite number. Since this is a view function, this contract call won't cost us any gas. If we look at simple storage.soul, we can see retrieve is a view function. And remember, view and pure functions, if called outside of a contract function call, don't cost any gas. We're just reading off the blockchain. We're not changing any variables on chain. We're not changing the state of the blockchain. So this won't cost any gas. So let's go ahead and run this. Perfect. We get deploying. Please wait. And then we get this big number response. So what's this big number response here? Big number is a library that comes with the ethers application that helps us work with numbers. If you actually scroll down, they even have a section saying, why can't I just use numbers? You'd expect the current favorite number to just be zero, but it returns this weird hex thing that says is big number true, this weird big number thing. So Solidity can't use decimal places and JavaScript has a hard time with decimal places. And this is kind of the more specific rationale for why not to use numbers. What you'll see a lot of the time instead of numbers is you'll see strings like zero. You'll see JavaScript use strings like this or big numbers. Now, if I were to try to pass a number like this in JavaScript, this number would be too big for JavaScript to understand. So we want to use big numbers or strings when working with ethers. Now we can make this more readable by adding dot to string at the end and printing out the string version of this big number. Now, if I rerun this code, we can see we get zero, which makes sense again, because our favorite number gets initialized to the zero value, if not specified. And we haven't called store yet. So awesome. So that is, that's working perfectly. So this is what our current favorite number is. Let's make this console.log a little bit more syntactical. We're going to use something called string interpolation so we can interpolate our string here with variables. Typically in JavaScript, when working with strings, you use double quotes. However, if you want to mix variables with actual strings, you can use backticks instead. So we're going to use some backticks here and we're going to say current favorite number, put a colon here. And to tell JavaScript that this is a variable that we want to read, we put a little dollar sign and a bracket around it like this. Now, if we run this code again, we're saying deploying, please wait. And we get current favorite number is zero because JavaScript goes, okay, this is a string. Ah, dollar sign curly brace. Looks like this is going to be some variable or some JavaScript that you want me to interpret and close it off and then back to it. Cool. So our current favorite number is going to be zero. Great. So let's update on the contract, the number by calling the store function. So we'll say const transaction response equals await contract.store and we'll add seven. Now, since seven's a small number, you can just pass it like seven, but passing it like seven in a string also works. Again, this is because if we wanted to pass some crazy massive number, JavaScript would get confused. So it's usually best practice to pass variables to contract functions as strings, even though that might be a little bit confusing. Ethers is smart enough to know that 
this seven string is actually seven the number. Then we can do const transaction receipt equals await transaction response dot wait one. So we'll wait one block here. This is similar to us doing contract dot deploy transaction dot wait. The syntax here is a little bit different than what we saw up here because this is using a contract factory and this is calling a function on a contract. So when we call the function on the contract, we get a transaction response. When we wait for the transaction response to finish, we get a transaction receipt. Now I can do const updated favorite number equals await contract.retrieve and then console.log updated favorite number is, and we'll do a little string interpolation, updated favorite number, like that. Now let's go ahead and run this. So in this process, what are we doing? We're deploying the contract, we're getting the initial value, we're gonna update our contract by calling store, which is gonna cost gas, so this is a transaction. We're gonna get the transaction response, then we're gonna get the transaction receipt. We're not gonna do anything with the transaction receipt, I want to ingrain in you all that these two are different. Transaction response and transaction receipt, and you'll see why in the future. And then we'll get the updated favorite number, and then we're just gonna print it out. So let's do this. Boom, and perfect. Deploying please wait. Current favorite number is zero. Updated favorite number is seven. And if we go to our ganache instance, we go to transactions, we can see we now have a contract call at the top. We have the sender, contract address, the gas price, all this stuff. And we see that our transaction data right here. So this transaction data is what gets sent in that data slot of our transaction object. Ethers is just doing that on the back end for us so that we don't have to make that big transaction object there. All right, awesome. You've successfully deployed a contract to your own local Ganache instance or your own JavaScript virtual machine. This is great. Now let's clean this up a little bit, because if we look up here, we have both our connection to the blockchain and our private key stored directly in our code. If we were to push this code up to a GitHub or some other code repository, people would be able to see our code. If we look in deploy.js of my code, ah, there's something else in here. We don't actually see the private key or the RPC URL in here. So what's going on? Remember, if you give out your private key, whoever has your private key owns your funds. So even though this is a fake private key that doesn't have any real money in it, we still don't wanna to have to hard code our private keys into our code just in case we accidentally share code with somebody. So what can we do? Well, one of the most popular methods is actually creating something called a .env file or an environment variable. And if you're familiar with environment variables, you can actually set them right in your terminal, but we're gonna set them in our .env. So what you wanna do is you're gonna to wanna to create a .env file and this is gonna be a file where you store sensitive information. And this is gonna be a file, we're never gonna share this with anybody. This .env file will stick variables of our choosing into the environment of our code. So for example, if I pull up my terminal here and I do echo cat, this is gonna reflect what the cat environment variable is for us. Right now, there is no cat environment variable. However, if I do export cat equals dog, and now I do echo dollar sign cat, I get dog output. This is what an environment variable is. It's a variable in our terminal or in our scripting environment. Since I don't wanna to have to type export private key equals blah, blah, blah every time, what we're gonna do instead is we're gonna stick them into this .env file. So in this .env, we can put private key equals, and we can grab this private key from our script paste it in like this. And a note, some tools look for the zero X at the beginning of the private key. Ethers and hardhat is smart enough that either one works, but if you run into some issues, just know that sometimes you might have to put your zero X at the front of this. Well, great, so now we have a private key in an environment variable. What do we do now? Well, in our deploy.js, we want to grab this environment variable and stick it into our script here so that our script can then stick it into our environment. So we're gonna add a tool called .env to make this easier. So we're gonna do yarn add .env. And if we look at the .env package, we can read more about it. We can read about how to add it with NPM. Again, we're just using yarn add. 
But then we can just call this require.env.config, and this will pull in all our environment variables. So we can just do require.env.config. We should see this on our package.json. We do, excellent. Now that we've pulled it in, we actually get access to our private key environment variable. You can access environment variables in JavaScript by using process.env. So instead of putting our private key here, we're gonna delete that whole thing and substitute it with key, And we'll save and it'll reformat for us. To make sure this is actually working, we can just hit up after we save, up, 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 up a bunch, and go back to node-deploy.js. And we see we get the exact same setup. And if we scroll back, we can see a transaction has indeed gone through. If you want to double check that this is actually printing out your private key, we could do console.log process.env.privatekey, we run, we see that that is indeed the private key coming from our environment variable here. Awesome. Now our RPC URL here is, isn't really something that we need to secure. However, maybe we're gonna use a certain API key or maybe a certain endpoint that only we want to have access to and we don't want anybody else to be using our RPC endpoint. So we're gonna add this to our .env file as well. So in our .env, when I copy this here, I'm gonna say, RPC URL equals, I'm gonna paste that in there, just like that. And we're gonna delete here, and we're gonna do the exact same thing. Say process.env.rpc URL. And now we're gonna run this again, and I'm gonna take out that console.log, and we should get the exact same response because all we did was swap out our RPC URL with our environment variable, which is gonna be exactly what it was before. So we go ahead and run this, and we get the exact same response. And if we go to Ganache, we see that we do indeed get a transaction here, which is perfect. Awesome. So we've learned how to add environment variables to our .env file so that, so that just in case we want to share our code or we push our code up to GitHub, which we'll do in later sections, we don't accidentally expose our private keys or our RPC URLs. Now, all the code that we have in our project here, if we push it up to GitHub or share it with somebody else, all this code will get pushed up, including our .env file. However, if you look at my code samples here for this course, we don't see a .env file in here. So how is that possible? Well, what we want to do whenever we have a project is create a .git ignore file. And in here, we want to put the .env, and we also want to put in node modules. This means that when working with Git and working with version control, which we're going to do a little bit later, we won't push our .env file up to GitHub, and we also won't push up node modules. So if we go back to my example here, we, we don't see we don't see a .env file, but we do see a .env.example just to show you what one would look like. So it doesn't really matter that I have them in here. Now, if you're really paranoid, there's something else you can actually do when running your scripts and running your commands. Let's say you didn't even want to put your private key into a .env file because you were nervous that you would accidentally push it up or something. What you can do is you can add your private key in your RPC URL as environment variables right in the command line. So before you run node deploy.js, what you can do, you can say RPC URL equals paste your RPC URL, and then you can say private key equals, and then paste your private key, and then do node deploy.js. Setting these right before we run our script is the exact same as if we had set them in a .env here. And if we hit run, we see the exact same output, which means that our RPC URL and our private key went through successfully. This way for key management is fine, but all right, so doing this is gonna be much better, but it still makes me a little bit nervous. In our development environments with our fake private keys, having our code in a .env file like this is, is okay, right? Because we don't really care if this key gets hacked, like nobody's using it. But when we move to a more professional setup, this can be a little bit scary. So how can we make this even more secure? Well, what we can do is actually we can encrypt our private key and store our encrypted key locally. That way, if for some reason somebody does get into our account, our private key isn't just sitting around in plain text. It's encrypted and you'll need to know a password that only you know to get into it. So how do we add that? Well, first, we're going to create a new file called encryptkey.js. And this is some code that we're going to use to actually encrypt a key, and we'll store that locally instead of our private key in plain text. This will make us even more secure so that we don't have our private key just hanging around in plain text here. So 
let's go ahead and build the script to encrypt our private key. So we're going to use the exact same setup as we did for our deploy script. So we're going to do an async function main. And then down here, I'm just going to go ahead and copy from deploy.js. We're going to use this exact same setup and paste it. Okay, great. We're going to be using ethers JS in our dot env again. So we're going to add these in const ethers equals require ethers const fs equals require fs extra and then require dot env dot config. All right. So right now in our dot env, we do have this private key. And again, if you don't want to have the private key in there, what you can just do is you can do private key equals and then, you know, node whatever script you want to run. So we're going to set this script up to run our encrypt key one time. And then we can remove our private key from anywhere in our workspace so that it's no longer in plain text anywhere. So what we want to do is we want to say const wallet, and we're going to create a new wallet, but a little bit differently. We are going to say it equals new ethers dot wallet process dot env dot private key. So we do need our private key to stick in here. But then once we create this wallet, we're going to say const encrypted JSON key equals await ethers dot encrypt. This encrypt function is going to return an encrypted JSON key that we can store locally and that we can only decrypt it with the password. And it takes two parameters. It takes a private key password and a private key. So in our dot env, just for right now, we're going to create a private key password. And I'm going to say it's password. But obviously, this is a terrible password and you should never use password as your password. But for now, we're just going to leave it as password since I'm encrypting this fake key anyways. So we're going to encrypt it by passing the password process.env.private key password. And we're also going to pass the private key. It's not going to be ethers, it's going to be wallet.encrypt. We're also going to pass it process.env.private key. Now let's go ahead and run this right now. And then we'll console.log out this encrypted JSON key and see what happens when we run this. So to run this, we're going to do node encrypt key.js and hit enter. And we'll see what happens when we console log it out. This JSON object here is what our key looks like encrypted. So it's got the address, this ID, version, all this other stuff. And all this other stuff is the encrypted version of this key. If somebody gets into our account and they see this, they'll have to know the password to decrypt this private key. They'll need to know the password to decrypt this JSON object back into a private key. So what we're going to do now that we've encrypted it, we're going to save it. So we'll do fs.write file sync. We're going to pass it to dot slash dot encrypted key dot JSON comma encrypted JSON key. So we're saving it to a new file called dot encrypted key dot JSON. And we're passing it this encrypted key that we just made. So if we open up our file explorer and we run this command, you'll see we get a new file called dot encrypted key dot JSON. And it's this encrypted key here, which is awesome. So now what we want to do in our dot git ignore is add dot encrypted key dot JSON so that we don't accidentally push this up to GitHub. And now we have an encrypted key and we can go to our private key and delete this from our .env file. We can also delete our private key password from our .env file so that the password isn't just hanging around in plain text. Now that we have an encrypted key back in our deploy script, we can change the way that we actually get a wallet. So at the top, we're getting our wallet just by passing in the private key like this. We're not going to do that. We're going to use our encrypted key that we just created. So what we're going to do is we're going to say const encrypted JSON equals fs dot read file sync dot slash dot encrypted key dot JSON comma utf eight. This fs dot read file sync is just going to read from our encrypted key dot JSON into this encrypted JSON variable here. Next, we're going to create a wallet from this encrypted key. We're going to say let wallet equals new ethers dot wallet dot from encrypted JSON sync. And all these commands that we're working with ethers, we can, of course, find them 
in the documentation from encrypted JSON sync takes the encrypted JSON and a password and returns a wallet object. So we're going to pass it that encrypted JSON that we just read. And then we're going to pass it our password, which we're going to do process.env.private key password. And then finally, the reason I use let here is because now we have to connect this wallet back to our provider. If you look here, we're not connecting our wallet with the provider. When we make our transactions with our contract factory, we need to make sure the wallet knows about the provider here. So we can just say wallet equals await wallet.connect provider. And now if we run our deploy.js with our private key password as an environment variable, it should still deploy. So we can do private key password equals password, which yes, we know is terrible, but <laughs> that's what we're using for now. Node deploy.js. We should get the same output we've been seeing this whole time. And we do. We're able to no longer have our private key in our .env file, not in plain text anymore. It's in this encrypted key so that just in case somebody hacks our computer, they still won't be able to send any transactions unless they know the password. This is awesome. One more thing to note, if you type history, if somebody got into your computer, a hacker could actually see private key password equals password in your batch history. If you run history dash C, you actually will clear your history. Now, if I type history, I can just see that the most recent command I wrote was history. This is really just some of the bare minimum for encryption and keeping your key safe. And it might seem ridiculous that somebody might be able to hack your computer and read your encrypted private keys and everything. But as your projects get bigger and bigger, it is really important to know about private key security and private key safety. And, and for this course, we're really just giving you the bare minimum here and showing you how to encrypt keys and how to be a little bit safer here. Now, for the rest of this course, we are gonna be just using this syntax with our private key in a .env file. The reason why we're doing it like this for the rest of the course is it is a little bit easier. I'm really hoping Hardhat adds some additional features to make private key encryption much safer and also easier to use in the future. And they probably will. And the other reason that we're okay to do this here is because you've solemnly sworn that you're not gonna use an account that has any real money in it. For the duration of this course, you're only gonna use private keys that have tests on Ethereum or are fake private keys like this one that we got from Ganache. In fact, just to really hone this in, in the smart contract kit slash full blockchain solidity course js github repo in the discussions tab if you go to announcements i've created one called the dot env pledge because recently i've seen too many people follow a tutorial that doesn't tell them about the security risks of doing this and i've made this dot env pledge i would love everyone to jump on and read and if you agree at the bottom leave a comment saying i will be safe i will be safe Make sure you read and you understand what's going on in here. And I'm not doing this to scare you because again, at the end of the day, if you use a MetaMask that only has testnet funds for the duration of this course, you will never have to be worried because if your key gets compromised, it's just testnet. So who cares? This is if you're using a MetaMask or you're working with a MetaMask that has real funds. So I'm going to read out the pledge because it is really important you understand this when you're working with real funds. And if you're like, hey, I'm not working with real funds, I don't care great, move past this, whatever. But when you do work with real funds, when you do decide, hey, I actually want to deploy this to a real network now, I need real money to do that, come back to this pledge, scroll to the bottom, say, I will be safe, and make sure you read and you understand this. Okay, so the pledge is, I solemnly swear that I will never place a private key or secret phrase or mnemonic in a .env file that is associated with any real funds. Basically, you... Basically, never have your private key or your mnemonic phrase in plain text anywhere. You'll only place private keys in a .env file that only have tested ETH, LINK, or other cryptocurrencies. Because again, if your private key has only testnet funds, then that's great. I don't care. We are aware that if we forget a .gitignore and we push our key phrase to GitHub even for a split second or even show our key slash phrase on the internet, wherever it may be, for a split second, it should be considered compromised and you should remove all funds immediately. So even if you deploy your private key to a website and then immediately delete your website and think, oh, nobody probably got to it, you should consider that private key compromised and you should remove all your funds. And again, this is just for real funds. If your private key with only testnet funds gets compromised, well, who cares? I do that all the time. You've been seeing me do that all the time because it only has testnet funds in it. If at the end of this course, you want to steal all of my testnet funds, I mean, have a blast. <laughs> it would be annoying to me at worst. <laughs> if I am unsure if my account has real funds in it, I will assume it has real funds in it. 
So if you don't know if it has real funds, assume it has real funds and you will not use it for developing purposes. And then finally, I am aware that even if I hit add account on my MetaMask or other ETH wallet, I will get a new private key, but it will share the same secret phrase slash mnemonic of all the other accounts generated in the MetaMask or other ETH wallet. So if I'm in my MetaMask here and I hit create account, I will get a new private key with the new account. However, all of these accounts that I've created with this create account button have the exact same mnemonic phrase or secret phrase. If I import an account with a private key, it's gonna have a different mnemonic phrase, but all of the ones that I generate inside that wallet are all gonna have the same phrase. Okay, great. Hopefully that'll make sense. I have some pledge additions here. For this course, I will only use funds associated with a brand new, never before used MetaMask or other ETH wallet. Again, this is not to scare you. If you just work with a brand new MetaMask, you don't have to worry about any of this and just refer back to this when you start looking at real money and real private keys. I'm aware that my account associated with my private key is the same on test nets that it is on main nets. So like I was showing you, my private key on RinkB is going to be the same as my private key on, on a main net. If I must use a private key associated with real funds in the future, until I am 100% sure what I am doing, I will always either use one of the encrypted methods that Patrick showed, use some better encryption stuff that I didn't show, or use the command line way to pass private keys and then delete the command line history right after. If I'm never actually deploying anything to mainnet myself or work with a private key with real funds, I do not need to be concerned. Take a look at this, read this, internalize it. This should make you confident now. Again, I'm not saying this to scare you. I'm saying this to instill confidence in you that these are some of the things that we want to think about. Okay, great. In here, I will be safe. Boom, I will be safe. And if you want to copy paste this on Twitter, put this in a huge tweet thread, go for it. The more people who know about this, the more people who understand the security risks of their .env files and their private keys, the better. So thank you for listening to this. I know I definitely belabored the point, but it is really important. Let's continue with the course. All right, so we're just about done here. However, there's one or two more things we want to do just to clean this all up. Right now, when we're auto saving, we're using the VS Code plugin for us to auto format. However, in the future, if anybody else comes across our repository, they might not have the VS Code auto formatter on. So we want to give users a way to format their code so it matches the styles that we use. So we have Prettier the extension installed. We can also add Prettier as a Node.js module that can tell other users who don't have a VS Code exactly how to format both their JavaScript and the Solidity. There is a Prettier plugin Solidity located here. There will be a link to it in our GitHub repo. And if we scroll down, we can see how to install with npm install dash dash save dev, which again, we're just going to use yarn. So we're going to do yarn add Prettier and then Prettier plugin Solidity. So we're installing both Prettier and the Solidity plugin for Prettier. And if we check our package.jsons, we can see that these two have been added. And what we can do now is we can create a, a new file called dot Prettier RC. And in this file, we can define some little curly braces in here. We can define what we want for both our Solidity and for our JavaScript. So for example, our simple storage has a tab width of four, one, two, three, four, four spaces. Maybe we want to change that. Maybe we want tab width to be two. So we would save it here. We come back to simple storage, save it here, and it would get auto formatted to our dot prettier RRC. So in our settings here, we have the default editor for Solidity, our hard hat Solidity plugin, and the default formatter for JavaScript being the Prettier VS Code one. When we add Prettier RC in here, this file will take precedent over the default configuration. So long as we have downloaded the module in our node modules, which we can see it right here, and we have this dot Prettier RC file. I'm gonna keep the tab with form, so we're gonna update it to that. One thing that we currently do have that I do not like is these semicolons at the end. So we're gonna do semi false. And I'm gonna save this, come back to deploy, hit save, and you'll see the semicolon automatically goes away. I'm also gonna add use tabs false, since I wanna use spaces for spacing, and then single quote 
false. This way we'll always use a double quote instead of a single quote. In JavaScript, you can actually use a single quote or a double quote to define strings, but we're gonna make it so that no matter what quote you use, it'll always be double quote. And then for all your open source repos and for all your projects that you make, you will wanna make a readme.md. Readme files are generally where people put instructions or information about your project or anything like that. This way, whenever anybody comes across your project, they'll know what it's about. Your readme.mds are markdown syntax again. Remember how when we made that trial discussion, we used some interesting tips to format our Solidity and our code here? Well, that formatting process is the exact same for .md files for markdown. They're both gonna use markdown. In fact, if we hit Control Shift V, you'll enter preview mode for the markdown. You'll see pound signed here in my preview of the hard hat, this ethers simple storage FCC is huge and looks like a heading at the top. So command shift V to view your .md files or, or it might be control shift V for Windows and Linux users. The last thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna deploy this to a test net and interact with this on a test net. We're gonna use the Rinkby test net but be sure to use whatever recommended testnet the GitHub repository for this course recommends. Now, looking at our code, you might already have a good idea of how to actually make this slight change. Based off of our last section, we know that all we need is an RPC URL and a private key, and we can begin making transactions on a blockchain. So we're probably gonna need a RinkB RPC URL and a RinkB private key. Where can we find both of those? If you wanna do everything on your own and in full decentralized context, we could run a RinkB version of Geth. We could run it locally and then just connect to our Geth node. We're not gonna be showing how to do this here. However, this is 100% something that you could do. Instead, we're gonna use a third party RPC URL. In the GitHub repo associated with this course, we go to lesson five, we can scroll down to get a link for Alchemy. Alchemy has a node as a service and allows us to connect to any blockchain that they have support for. Some alternates might be Quicknode, Morales, or Infura. These all have node as a service options, but we're gonna work with Alchemy because it's the one that I like the best. We can go ahead and get started for free or log in or create a new account. I'm gonna go ahead and sign up with our Harhat free code camp user. And we're gonna select the Ethereum blockchain ecosystem. Let's go ahead and create our first app. This is gonna be, we'll call it free code camp Hardhat. Our app name will be Ethers. Simple storage, FCC. And the network is where we're gonna choose RinkB. But you can see in here, we can actually choose more than just RinkB. We can choose Gorilla, Coven, RinkB, Robston, and layer twos like Arbitrum and Optimism. We're gonna be using RinkB. So let's go ahead and create this app. We're gonna choose the free plan. I'm gonna hit continue. We're gonna skip adding payments. If you want to tweet your referral code, feel free to tweet your referral code. We're going to skip for now and we're going to keep it at capped capacity since we don't have a we don't have a key in here. And then how did you hear about us? Go ahead and give me that shout out at Patrick and Free Code Camp and then hit let's go. Now we get to the Alchemy dashboard where we can see a ton of information about our node and different ways to connect to the nodes and and stuff like that. This is going to be really similar to to this RPC server endpoint of Ganache, except it's gonna be a connection, except it's gonna be a connection to a real testnet or a real mainnet. What we can do now is we can select our, our app that we just made and we can hit view key. And we can see here, we get an API key, we get an HTTP endpoint, and we also get a WebSocket. We're only concerned with the HTTP endpoint. This is gonna be our RPC URL that connects to RinkB. So what we can do now is we can copy this we can come over to our Visual Studio code and in our .env, we can substitute these out for their actual testnet values. So for RPC URL, we're gonna delete this and replace it with our RinkB RPC URL. And now how do we get a private key for an actual testnet that has actual RinkB on it? Well, here is where we can use our MetaMasks. So back in your browser, go over to your MetaMask, select the three dots, go to account details, Export private key. And this is where you can export your private key. Type in your password and boom, you now have your private key for your account on MetaMask. Now remember, please, please, please don't continue 
with a MetaMask that has actual money in it. A quick way to check is by going to your networks tab and seeing if on any of the main nets or the networks with actual money in it, you see any money. I don't have any money in this, so I know I'm good to go. If you have test net money, that's fine because that's fake money anyways. And again, most browsers have a profile mechanism where you can create a new profile for you to use. But here, now that I've copied my private key, we can come back to our Visual Studio code, paste the key in here, and now I have a private key that has actual RinkB in it. Awesome. And remember, if you ever get low, just come over to faucets.chain.link slash RinkB. We'll get some test ETH. I'm not a robot. We'll send the request. Now that we have our private key and our RinkB in here, we can now try to run this on an actual testnet. If we look at our code, we see we're grabbing an RPC URL, which is going to be from our .env. We're grabbing a private key, which is going to be from our .env which points to our RinkB MetaMask and our RinkB blockchain. So let's just add a console.log under our contract deployment so that we know what address it's at. So we'll do console.log. We'll do some string interpolation. Contract address. Contract.address. All right, great. And now let's go ahead and run this. So we'll do node deploy.js. Deploying, please wait. You'll notice this takes a lot longer because we're deploying to a testnet instead of our own fake local blockchain. Testnets and real networks often will take a little bit longer because they need to wait for the blocks to propagate, the transaction to go through, etc. But after a brief delay, we will indeed see that we get a contract address here. and We have a current favorite number. And it's being a little slow again because we're waiting for our next transaction to go through to update the number. And boom, it looks like we've successfully updated it. Now, something that's important to know, if ever you run command and you want to kill it, you can do control C and that will stop it. So any command in the terminal that you want to just abort, control C is your get out of jail free card and that will kill it, that'll stop it wherever it is. So we'll use control C a lot in the future. So now let's grab this contract address and go over to rank B etherscan. And paste it in. We can see our two transactions here. We can see we have a contract creation. And we can also see we call a store function. This is awesome. We've successfully deployed a contract to the RinkB chain using our own code. Congratulations, this is massive. Now on Etherscan, we actually can verify and publish our contract code. What is verifying and publishing your code? Well, right now, our code looks like a huge jarble of bytecode. And anybody looking at our contract directly on chain will just see this huge jarble of bytecode. We could use a decompiler to try to decompile the bytecode into what it looks like in Solidity, but this can often take a long time and, and a lot of processing power. So instead, we can just make it much easier by verifying and publishing the code ourselves. If you go ahead and hit verify and publish, we can scroll down and we can add compiler information to compile this on Etherscan and other block explorers. This is a single file. Compiler version is 0.8.7 and its open source is license is MIT. Let's go ahead and continue. And we're gonna copy paste our Solidity code into this large section. Paste. We don't have any constructor arguments, so we can skip this section. We don't have any libraries or any other miscellaneous settings. So we'll select, I'm not a robot, and we'll hit verify and publish. You might have to wait a few minutes, but awesome, our contract was successfully compiled. Now, if we go back to contract source code, we can see all the code in here. And if we grab our contract address, place it into, place into the search now, and we go to contract, we get a little green check mark, and we can see anybody can now read our source code. Additionally, those buttons that we saw in Remix for reading from our contract and writing to our contract are in this read contract and this write contract. If we read the contract and we retrieve the most recent number, we do indeed see that we have seven here because we recently stored seven. Awesome. A quick note, this might already be verified for you since Etherscan might get smart enough to notice that a lot of people are deploying the same bytecode. If it's already verified for you, just go ahead and walk through these steps anyways. Now the code verification we just did was pretty simple and straightforward because our code was pretty simple and straightforward. 
using larger and more complex code can make the verification process a little bit harder. Additionally, we don't always want to have to click buttons on Etherscan to verify our code. We want to do it programmatically. So in later sections, we'll learn how to verify all of our code directly through our code editor. You can imagine the process is this easy for deploying to any EVM chain. In our Alchemy, we could easily create a new app and change our network. And you can see how easy it would be to just switch out this RPC URL and your private key to work on a different chain. This process is also the same for Harmony, Phantom, Avalanche, etc. And if we wanted to switch chains, we would just switch the RPC URL and switch the private key and everything else would stay exactly the same. Now, Alchemy also shows us and can teach us a lot about transactions and about things that are going on behind the scenes, including a concept called the mempool. To help us understand a little bit more about those transactions that we just sent and how to work with Alchemy to see more about our transactions, we have Albert from the Alchemy team to give us a little demonstration. Hello, Albert here from Alchemy. I'm at that guy in tech on Twitter. Um, feel free to follow if you want to engage and ask any questions about this section of the video. But super excited to join Patrick here to explain a little bit of what goes on behind the scenes when you are using Alchemy to submit a transaction. And we have a ton of tools to actually provide a window of visibility into what's going on so that you can actually debug in case there are usage errors on your website uh, or there are pending transactions that are stuck. Whatever it is, we provide that window into the data that you control. Remember that all the transactions that you submit are recorded on the blockchain. They're not controlled by Alchemy. They're not controlled by any other service provider. Um, we are just a window. We're just the plumbing, the piping uh, to be useful to you. So let me show you exactly what that means. Right now, I have a bunch of applications in my dashboard. You can see here that there are different projects that I've used over time. Um, this one is the most recently active, and it is the one that I have currently set up to connect to my MetaMask. So I actually use a custom RPC provider here. And let me make my face a little smaller. Uh, and you can see here I've misspelled RinkB, but this right now my, my network is actually connected to the RinkB test network via Alchemy. So uh, this is actually this application. So if I click into here in the dashboard, you can see here a bunch of really interesting statistics. This is the first thing that you'll probably use if you're trying to understand more about your application. You'll go here and you can see how many compute units per second your application is currently using. And this is kind of great for specifically Alchemy usage understanding. Um, but then this is also really useful to see like what's the median response time. And so 33 milliseconds is pretty good. Uh, if that starts to increase, then you might want to figure out, you know, what's going on here. Success rate, it has been kind of low. So that is a, a, a clue for me to click on this tab to view recent invalid requests. And that I can actually see, oh, there's a bunch of um, uh, failed transactions where the transaction has already been sent or the nonce is too low or whatever it is. I can actually use this tab to debug. So that success rate is pretty useful. Throughput that's been limited. Uh, so if you are sending too many requests or your website is getting spammed, you might start getting some requests blocked. So that's uh, what's useful to view there. Concurrent requests over here, success rate in the past 24 hours versus the past one hour. Uh, the total number of requests in the last 24 hours. And this is different than compute units because each request can have a different level of computing cost. And computing cost is measured by compute units, total requests, is just the actual number of absolute requests. And then of course, the number of invalid requests. Cool, so uh, one thing I do wanna show you that's interesting is when I do submit a transaction, and I actually have one right here that I wanna send, so let's transfer between my accounts. And I'm just gonna send a tiny amount of rink ETH, but I'm gonna purposefully edit my gas fees to be super, super low so that the uh, node will actually not send the transaction to be mined, or there are no miners that will actually pick it up. So you can see here, I've divided the, the priority fee and the max fee by a ton, so it's super low. And if I confirm that, in the MetaMax UI, you'll see that the transaction has been pending for a bit. And we'll go over to this mempool tab. This is another really useful visualization. And what the mempool is, is a kind of a holding ground. I like to think of it as the waiting room of a restaurant um, where if you're a transaction and you're waiting to get mined, uh, the mempool is kind of like the waiting room where you're waiting to get seated. 
So uh, there are different statuses for your, each of your transactions. The ones that you always want to see are the mined transactions because that says that your transaction is successful and it's now part of the blockchain. Now the mempool, uh, every node has its own you know, holding ground. So I can actually show you this quick visualization. Remember blockchains are run by a network of nodes and uh, each node or each computer that's running the Ethereum software maintains a copy of the blockchain. And uh, as a developer, you have to use these nodes to make requests to the blockchain. You now you can use Alchemy, you can use another RPC provider, you can spin up your own node if you want to. But regardless, you need to use a node to communicate with the chain. Now each node, uh, beyond having a copy of the entire blockchain state, it also has a local memory of uh, transaction, and that's called mempool. So if there are pending transactions that are waiting to be mined, you can consider them as being in the mempool. Now that's what we're looking at right here. If we click on uh, the app that I am currently using for my MetaMask RPC, then you can see here that um, there are, oh, this is not the right one. Uh, this one is the right one for Rinkby. Uh, for all the transactions here, you can see some were drop in place, some were mined, and there's one that's pending. And this pending one actually matches up with the one that is pending here. It's being sent to 0xCBB. And if we click on this transaction hash, you get all the information that you need to debug. So you can see here that it's from my current address, uh, 0xF5F, and then it's to 0xCBB. And here's the value that I'm trying to send. Here's the gas fee that I'm att attached to this transaction. And you'll notice that that is super low, even for the Rinkby test network. So knowing this and seeing, wow, this transaction has been pending for one minute and 46 seconds. It was sent at this time. I should probably fix that. Um, and so over here, you can actually use the MetaMask RPC, uh, the MetaMask API um, and speed it up. And then I'm just gonna use the auto high speed up to update the gas fees. And then if we go back to our dashboard, back to our application, you can see that there are some new recent invalid requests. And this is because uh, we've resubmitted a transaction. And then in the current re recent requests, we have, uh, let's refresh that real quick. You can see that we are uh, sending a raw transaction. This one's already known. And there's another one before, but that's resulting in a get transaction receipt that is successful. And then if we go back to the mempool, you can see, boom, no more pending transactions, only dropped and replaced and mined. So this transaction nonce number five is now successful and you're on your way to developing and maintaining the rest of your application. So yeah, thanks, hope that was useful. Let me know if you have any questions. Now, other than the TypeScript portion, which I'll do at the end, you've successfully completed this section. And wow, you've learned a ton. Let's do a quick review of everything that we've learned. Well, first, we've learned how to create new projects with Node.js. We've learned what the Node keyword does and how we can use the Node keyword to run JavaScript in our local development environment. We learned that we can add different dependencies of external packages into our local package using Yarn or NPM. And we can see those dependencies added in package.json. We know that they've been installed because they get installed into the node modules folder. We can also create a script section where we can minimize long commands that we need to run into a single keyword. Like compile, for example, we can just run yarn compile to compile all of our code. We learned the basic setup of our JavaScript scripts. We import our packages at the top. We have some main executor function at the bottom. And then we have our main function in the middle. We use the async keyword so that our function can use asynchronous programming, and we get access to the await keyword, which basically means, hey, wait for this promise to finish doing its thing. We're able to connect to any blockchain we want using an RPC URL, and then we're able to connect our provider to a wallet or a private key in Ethers by doing something like this. Speaking of which, we've learned about the Ethers package, which is a tool that makes our life a lot easier to interact with the blockchain in JavaScript. If we decide to, we've also learned we can encrypt our private keys so that even if our computers get hacked, our private keys aren't lying around in plain text. And we've learned how to run scripts from our encrypted keys. We've learned how to get the ABI or the application binary interface and the binary of our code to deploy to a blockchain. We've learned how to deploy our contracts to a blockchain programmatically. And then we've learned how to interact with our contracts programmatically as well. Additionally, we've learned how to add a default editor in our settings.json of our VS code, but we've also learned how to override those settings by 
adding prettier using a dot prettier RC file. This way we can auto format our code to make it look a lot nicer and much easier to read. Finally, we learned how to deploy one of these contracts to a real testnet or a real network. And then we finally learned the manual way to verify our contract source code. Like I said, we're gonna learn a lot of shortcuts and a lot of ways to make this all a little bit easier in coming sections. Whew. You have done phenomenally to reach this section. Give yourself a pat on the back, take a break, go for a lap, and feel really proud about yourself that you made it this far. We've got a lot more to go, but you have come a phenomenally long way. Congratulations. Go take that five to 10 minute break and come back when you're ready. Now, the one thing left I want to show you all is the TypeScript edition of this. However, if you're not interested in the TypeScript edition, which you don't have to be, then you're done. There's only a couple of changes we need to make to make this TypeScript compatible. First, of course, we're going to change our deploy.ts and encrypt key. We're gonna change our deploy and our encrypt key from .js to .ts. And then we're also going to swap these requires out for imports. So we're going to import ethers from ethers. We're gonna import star as fs from fs extra. And then we're going to import .dmv slash config. And then we're just gonna copy these. And we're gonna come over and paste them into here, deleting or commenting out the requires. Okay, great. Now, if we try to run node deploy.ts, we're gonna get cannot use import statement outside of a module. In JavaScript, if we'd wanna use an import statement outside of a module, we'd come in here and do something like type module like that. But in TypeScript, we actually don't even need that. All we need to do is run this in TypeScript node. So to add TypeScript, we're gonna do yarn, add TypeScript. And we're also gonna add TS node. TS node is the TypeScript edition of node. So now that we've added that, we can try TS node deploy.ts, and we're still gonna run into an error. And if you scroll up, we're gonna get a couple errors here. We're gonna say, could not find a, a declaration file for module FS extra. We need to add the TypeScript version of that. So we're gonna do yarn at at types slash FS extra like that. And if we run it again, it still shouldn't work, but for a different reason. Yes, we're gonna get something like this. Type undefined is not assignable to type bytes like. The reason we get this is because process.env private key in TypeScript technically is type string or undefined. So we need to tell TypeScript and, and the wallet objects and the encrypt function is looking for type string, not string or undefined. So we just need to tell TypeScript that this will not be undefined. So we can just put a bang here and, and everywhere that we use process.env. Oops, I gotta do that on deploy as well. Bang, bang, looks good. Now that we've added everything in here, if we run ts node deploy.ts, we're gonna see the exact same output as we saw with just using regular node. And as long as our private key password is in our .env file, if we run ts node encrypt key.ts, we're gonna get the exact same fit setup as before and we're gonna get a new encrypted key.json. And that's all you need to do to make this TypeScript compatible. And you should give yourself a huge round of applause for getting this far and learning what's going on underneath Hardhat, the next tool that we're gonna learn, and learning all about these transactions and how to interact with these blockchains. This is absolutely massive, so huge congratulations. All right, so now that we've learned about Ethers.js and how to do some more raw JavaScript coding, we're now gonna move into Hardhat. We saw with our Ethers simple storage that deploying a contract can take a lot of code. And there's a number of things we didn't even do in here. Like we didn't save where this contract was deployed. So we'd have to go remember where it was deployed every time instead of having it just added programmatically. We didn't write any tests here and we'd have to build our own testing infrastructure. Maybe we wanna make this a cross chain application and we want more than just one private key and an RPC URL. You can absolutely work with your smart contracts in JavaScript purely through ethers and small scripts like this, but we want a more robust framework for doing all this. And that's where Hardhat comes into play. Hardhat is easily one of the most, if not the most popular smart contract development framework out there. It's used by massive several billion dollar protocols like Aave, Uniswap, SushiSwap, and more. In fact, I recently did a poll on Twitter, and even though a lot of my content has been more Brownie and Pythonic, Hardhat was well and beyond the most popular framework. 
and Hardhat has quickly become one of the most advanced frameworks out there. Hardhat is a development environment, which allows for JavaScript-based development, kind of like what we saw with Ethers. It gives us even more tools to integrate our code with common things that we want to do. It's incredibly extensible, and it has really nice debugging features as well. And it's just an overall fantastic tool. So let's go ahead and let's jump in. If you want to follow along with the code, come over to the GitHub repo and scroll down. Lesson six, Hardhat simple storage, and all the code is located here. And a quick note for the future, if ever you want to just download all the code from one of these repositories, the way you can do that is by doing a git clone. What you do is you come to the folder that you want to put this code in, and you run git clone, and then you grab the URL that you want to clone, paste it in. Now you can cd into your new folder here that has everything downloaded directly from GitHub. But only do that as a backup or to just download the code yourself. But for now, just follow along with me. Right, so let's do this. Let's create our next project using Hardhat. The project that we're gonna be making is called Hardhat Simple Storage FCC or Free Code Camp. This is going to be us working again with that simple storage contract, but in Hardhat. And we're gonna show you a ton of the fantastic tools that we can use to make our coding life way easier. So I'm in a brand new VS Code and we're gonna create a new folder for us to run all this. Now, what you can do to create a brand new folder is you, once again, you can do mkdir hardhat simple storage fcc. Now we can cd into hardhat simple storage fcd and type code period. And this will open up a new Visual Studio code inside of that folder. Now, if we open up our terminal, you'll see that we are indeed inside of that folder. Now, if that doesn't work for you, you can still, of course, do file open folder and select the folder you'd like to open and you'll be inside of that folder. Now that we have our folder set up for working with Hardhat, we can begin setting up our environment to be incredibly professional using the Hardhat framework. We've got a link to the Hardhat documentation inside our whole blockchain Solidity course JS. The Hardhat documentation is phenomenal and I highly recommend everybody have it up as they go through this section because it's gonna give you pretty much everything that you need to know for working with Hardhat. You can simply go ahead over to tutorial and get started. If you want to pause the video here and read through the tutorial, I recommend doing so. It'll give you a lot of information about how to work with Hardhat and more about Hardhat. However, we're just going to jump right into setting up the environment. We've already installed Node.js on Linux or Mac OS. And those of you who are using Windows, I set you up with WSL so you can just follow the Linux instructions. Now to create a new hardhead project, you can actually just go ahead and run these steps right here. Instead of NPM, we're gonna be using yarn, but if you wanna use NPM, you can absolutely do so. The hardhead docs say run NPM init dash dash yes. We're just gonna run yarn init, which is gonna create a new project for us in this folder. So let's give it a name, which if we want it set to this, hardhead simple storage FF FCC, we just hit enter. We'll give it a version. And when, if we want it 1.0.0, we just hit enter. We're going to skip the description for now just by hitting enter. And we're just going to hit enter for this as well. 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 <laughs> just to keep those as blanks. And if we look in package.json, we now see we have a name. Hardhat simple storage.fcc. We have a version. We have a main, which we're actually going to delete the main. And then we have a license as well. Yarn init just sets up this package.json for us. Now we're going to do yarn add dash dash dev hardhat. So far, we've just been running yarn add and then whatever our package name is. But for most of what we're doing, we really want to do yarn add dash dash dev. The reasons for this is a little bit nuanced, but we can see some of the information on this, this Stack Overflow question here. The main difference is that dependencies are required to run your project, whereas dev dependencies are required only to develop. For the most part, we're going to be doing just dash dash dev. When we get to the front end portion of this course, we'll be installing more packages that we don't need just for development. Now in the same directory where we install a hardhat, you can run mpx hardhat. So a quick note about mpx is that the yarn equivalent of npm is just yarn. So yarn equals npm. The yarn equivalent of mpx is also yarn. So pretty much any time you see mpx do something, you can just replace that mpx with yarn and it'll do the exact same thing. If you wanna run this with npm or npx, you can absolutely do that as well. So for us, we're gonna run yarn hardhat 
And we'll see, we'll get prompted to actually start creating a hard hat project. Run yarn, hard hat. And we'll get this wonderfully cute prompt right here and saying, welcome to hard hat. What do you want to do? Create a basic sample project, create an advanced sample project, create an advanced sample project that uses type script or create an empty hard hat.config.js. For us, we're just going to select create a basic sample project. And this is going to give us all the boilerplate for a really simple hard hat project. The hard hat project root is going to be this folder that we're in right now. Do you want to add a git.gitignore? Yes, we absolutely do because we're going to be using .env files. Do you want to install this sample project's dependencies with yarn at Nomic Labs hard hat, at Ethereum waffle, at chai? We're going to go ahead and say yes. And I'll explain what all these dependencies are in a bit. Let's go ahead and say yes for now. And we're going to install all of these dependencies. Now, if we look in our package.json, we can see we've added a number of dependencies like Nomic Labs hardhat ethers, Nomic Labs hardhat waffle, chai, Ethereum waffle, and ethers. Obviously, we're already familiar with ethers, but the rest of these might be a little new. We'll talk about those later. And great, we now have a sample hardhat boilerplate project. Let's walk through what we just installed here. The first thing we have is a contracts folder, which comes pre-populated with greeter.soul. It's a really minimalistic contract here. Next, you'll see node modules, which of course is our installed JavaScript dependencies. Something I want to note, because it was really confusing to me when I first started working with this, is some of these node modules start with an at sign and then a lot of them don't. What's the difference between those two? These at sign node modules are known as scoped packages, which effectively allow NPM packages to be namespaced or yarn packages. This allows organizations to make it clear what packages are official and which ones are not. For example, if a package has a scope at Angular, you know it's published by the Angular core team. So it's the same thing with this. Anything with at ENS domains, we know is by the ENS domains team. Anything with the at Nomic Labs is going to be by the team that created Hardhat. So that's why this at Nomic Labs Hardhat Ethers and at Nomic Labs Hardhat Waffle has this at sign because we know it's published by the Nomic Labs team. Then we have a scripts section. This is going to be where we're adding any and all of our scripts that we want to write, like deploying contracts, interacting with contracts, etc. And then we have a test folder. We haven't started building any tests yet, but tests are incredibly important for working with smart contracts. And this sample test folder gives us a minimalistic test for testing our smart contracts. We, of course, have a git ignore, which, of course, comes pre-populated with some important things to to ignore like .env and also node modules because node modules might get too huge to push up to GitHub. And one of the biggest changes here is it adds this hardhat.config.js. This file, even though it's minimalistic right now, you can think of as the entry point for all the scripts that we write. It's the configuration file that determines how the rest of our code is going to work and interact with the blockchain. Then of course we have package.json. We get started with a readme. Remember how the first time we ran yarn hardhat, we were prompted with this getting started piece. Now, if we run yarn hard hat, we're actually going to get an output of all the different options and commands we can use with running hard hat. Now, if you run into an issue where you run yarn hard hat and this pops up, but you don't see a hardhat.config.js in your folder, it likely means that there's a hardhat.config.js in a higher level folder, or there's a node modules with hard hat in a higher level folder. So if that happens, maybe CD down a directory and do a little LS and look to see if you've got a hardhat.config.js or node modules in an earlier folder. And because I've actually seen a number of engineers have a couple of different problems here, my friend Cami is going to explain a couple of different troubleshooting tips you can take to try to avoid these common errors. As a developer, the most annoying thing to deal with are environment setup issues. My name is Camila Ramos. I'm a DevRel engineer at Edge and Node supporting the Graph protocol. And I'm going to show you how to solve two common problems that you might see when working on this project. After installing Hardhat and running the command npx hardhat in your new project folder, you're going to expect to get back a menu of options like this. But sometimes you're not going to get that back. And when you run into this error, there is a solution for you. And it usually just means that you have a config file somewhere that it shouldn't be and deleting it will get rid of that error. What you're going to do in order to find this file that you need to delete is run the command npx hardhat space hyphen hyphen verbose. And this is going to spit out where this file is if you have one and it's going to tell you exactly where it is so that you can delete it. After you've deleted this config file, you should be able to run npx hardhat in your project folder and get back that menu that we were expecting. Another problem that is pretty common and I still run into all the time is forgetting to npm install. 
Whenever you're working with a repo that other people have been working on on GitHub, so let's say you're pulling down some code that you and some collaborators were working on together and then suddenly it's not working for you, you probably just need to npm install. So in your terminal, go ahead and navigate to where this project is located and then run the command npm install. If there are any new packages that were installed in the time that you weren't working on the code, those will get installed locally for you so that when you run the code, it'll be able to run successfully. What are some of the main things we can do with Hardhat? In its raw state here, these are some of the main tasks that we can run with Hardhat. Different tasks are just different commands we can run with Hardhat. For example, we can do yarn Hardhat accounts, which will print out a list of fake accounts we can use with Hardhat, similar to the list of fake accounts that we used with Ganache. We can compile our contracts by running yarn Hardhat compile. Very similar to what we did with Ethers.js and Sulk.js. You'll see when we run compile, we get a cache, which is just going to be a quick way to access Solidity files. And we also get an artifacts section. This artifacts folder contains all the information about our compiled code. If we look in here now, we can, for example, look in the build info and see a ton of information about our compiled contract. If we look in contracts, we can see more compiled information. And then if we look in the hardhat slash console.sol, we can see more compiled information. So all of our compilation information is going to be in this artifacts folder. And whenever you want to look to see what's going on on the lower level when you compile, this artifacts folder is what has everything. There are a number of other hardhat tasks that we can run as well, but we'll get to them as we go. So now that we have some of the basics of hardhat down, let's go ahead and try doing some of the same things we did with ethers before, but with hardhat. So one of the first things we want to do is we want to write and interact with our smart contracts. So let's go ahead and rename greeter.soul to simple storage.soul. You can click on the file and hit enter and should be able to rename it. Otherwise, you can go ahead and right click, delete it, and then create a new file and call it simple storage.soul. We're going to copy paste all of our code from our previous simple storage.soul into this file. We can make sure that our simple storage is compiling correctly by running yarn hardhat compile. Whoa, it looks like we ran into an issue. Project cannot be compiled. See reasons below. The Solidity Pragma version in the file doesn't match any of the configured compilers in your config. Huh, well, what's going on? Contracts slash simple storage dot soul 0.8.8. Ah, okay, let's go ahead and fix that. So we can open up our hardhat.config.js. Now, a quick note on opening files. If you're on Mac and you hit Command P, you can actually start typing in the names of files to get them to them quicker. Or if you're on Linux or Windows, you can type Control P. This will bring up, and interestingly, if you type Command P or Control P, and then you hit the greater than key, this will drop you into the command palette. No command palette, command palette. Search for files, search for commands. In our hardhead.config.js, we can scroll down to module.exports and change this to 0.8.8 so that the version that we're going to compile for a simple storage is going to be the same version that hardhead is looking for. Let's run that same command by just hitting up yarn hardhead compile. And awesome, we see compiled one Solidity file successfully. We should now see this in artifacts. If we go to artifacts and contracts, we now see two contracts in here, greater and simple storage. And we can see a ton of the information about simple storage. We can also see some more lower level information in build info. All right, so now that we have our simple storage contract in here, the next thing we probably want to do is learn how to deploy it. This is where we're going to write our deploy script. Now, for this section, I'm going to be showing you how to write a deploy script. But in the next section, we're going to do it a little bit differently. But this is still going to teach you how to write scripts and work with scripts in Hardhat. So we're going to come to our sample script.js and we're going to go ahead and hit enter and rename it to deploy.js. And if you want to read all the comments in here, you absolutely can. We're just going to go ahead and delete them all. A quick keyboard shortcut is if you hit command A or control A, you'll highlight all the text in your file. And we're going to go ahead and delete it all. So now we're just going to start from scratch here. Now the setup for our deploy script in here is going to look really similar to the setup of our deploy script from our previous section. We're going to do imports at the top. We're going to have our async main function, and then we're going to call the main function. So let's go ahead and define our main function. We'll call it async 
function main, like that. And then we'll call our main function. And if you want to just copy paste this from the last section, you absolutely can. So we'll do main dot then. Boom, just like that. And because these semicolons are going to drive me absolutely insane, we're also going to add prettier and our Solidity prettier plugins. So we'll do yarn add dash dash dev prettier and prettier plugin solidity. Then we can go ahead and create our dot prettier RC file. We're going to add tab width for use tabs false semi false and then single quote, also false. Now we're gonna be using this prettier RC file setup a lot. So in future sections, if you wanna just copy paste it, you can absolutely do that as well. We're also gonna add a dot prettier ignore, which tells prettier not to format some files, which we want. We don't want prettier to spend a ton of time formatting all of our files. I'm just gonna copy paste from the GitHub repo. So feel free to copy paste from the GitHub repo as well. You can find all the code for this section, like I said, in the GitHub repo associated with this course. Now, unlike in our last section, where we had to grab our contract code a little bit more manually, with Hardhat, there's actually a number of different ways to grab compiled contracts. This first way we're gonna do it, we're actually gonna use ethers. And now this is where one of the first confusing changes actually comes in. Previously, we did const ethers equals require ethers. And that was how we went ahead and worked with ethers. However, you'll notice in our dev dependencies, we have this dependency called hardhat ethers. Hardhat ethers is a package that actually wraps hardhat with its own built in ethers. This is really advantageous because it allows hardhat to keep track of different deployments and different scripts and all these other things for us. So instead of importing ethers directly from ethers, we're actually going to import ethers directly from hardhat instead. This might seem a little confusing at first, but just know if we want to work with ethers and hardhat, it's usually much better to pull it in from hardhat. You can still do this and ethers will still work the same, but hardhat won't necessarily know about different contract factories and different pieces. And, and you'll see that in action in a second. Now that we're pulling in ethers, we can actually immediately grab a contract factory using ethers. We can say const simple storage factory equals await ethers.get contract factory simple storage. So in order to get a simple storage contract factory, we can just do await ethers.get contract factory. Now, if we pulled right from ethers, the package ethers doesn't know about this contracts folder and ethers doesn't know we've already compiled simple storage.sol and it's in our artifacts. Hardhat, on the other hand, does know about the contracts folder and does know that it's already compiled, which is why this simple storage factory grabbing works so well. Once we have our factory here, we can do the same thing that we did in our previous section and deploy the contract. So we'll do a quick console.log, deploy, deploying contract, dot, dot, dot. And then we'll do const simple storage equals await simple storage factory dot deploy. And boom. With that little bit of code, we're already able to deploy our simple storage contract. Then to wait to make sure it gets deployed, we can do await simple storage dot deployed. And that's it. Now let's see what happens when we go ahead and run this deploy script. As you know, in our last section, we had to put in a private key and we had to put in an RPC URL. Right now, we don't have either one of those defined. So what do you think? Should the script actually work or do you think it'll break? because we, we didn't define what blockchain we're going to deploy to. We also didn't define a private key. Well, let's go ahead and try this out. We can run the script in our terminal by running yarn, hardhat, run, scripts, slash, deploy.js. And again, I'm hitting tab here to do a little auto-completion. Let's see what happens. Well, we got deploying contract. It says done, but that's really it. So what really happened? 
Well, let's add one more line in here. Let's do console.log. We'll do some string interpolation. Deployed contract to, and then we'll add simple storage dot address. Let's run this now. We get deploying contract, and then we get deployed contract to, and then we get a contract address. Huh, what's going on here? Hard Hat has this fantastic tool built in called the Hard Hat Network. Hard Hat comes built in with Hard Hat Network, a local Ethereum network node designed for development akin to Ganache that allows you to deploy your contracts and run your tests and debug your code. Whenever we run a command in Hard Hat or a script in Hard Hat or a task in Hard Hat, we by default deploy to this fake Hard Hat network. This Hard Hat network is very similar to Ganache, except for instead of having this UI, it runs in the background for our scripts. In fact, if we go to our hardhat.config.js, we can scroll down to the bottom to this module.export section and add more information about our default networks. So right now, if we don't have anything in this module.export, by default, it adds this piece called default network hardhat. So anytime we run a script without specifying a network, it automatically uses this fake hardhat network. And this fake hard hat network comes automatically with an RPC URL and a private key for you. So you don't even have to add one in. This is one of the major advantages of working with hard hat. It just automatically gives you this fake blockchain and these fake private keys. If we wanna be a little bit more explicit, and I always recommend being more explicit, we can add the default network in to the module that are experts. So now our default network is explicitly stated as hard hat. However, in any script you run, you can choose whatever network you want to work with. So if I want to explicitly say I want to run our deploy script on our fake hard hat network, I can do yarn hard hat run scripts deploy.js dash dash network hard hat. This is us telling hard hat, hey, we want to run this script on the hard hat network. Hopefully you might be able to see where this is going. Having this network flag makes it incredibly easy to switch across different chains, different blockchains, different private keys, etc. So we have our default network set to hardhat here. We can add other networks in here as well. The way we do that is we're going to add a networks section and we're going to define any of the network sections that we want. And remember to put a comma there so that your Visual Studio code doesn't get mad at you. So recently we worked with Rinkby. So let's go ahead and add a Rinkby network in here. So we're gonna say another network is gonna be Rinkby. Cool, so I should just be able to change the network flag to Rinkby now, right? Well, not quite. If you try to run that, you're gonna get invalid value undefined for hardhat config.networks.rinkby.url. It's expecting you to tell it, hey, what the URL is. Since this isn't the hardhat network, we need to tell Hardhat exactly how we're gonna to connect to Rinkby. And this is where a lot of what we learned before is gonna come in handy again. Exactly the same as what we did before, we're gonna create a new .env file and we're gonna add our Rinkby URL in this .env file. Just remember .env is in our .gitignore just in case. So in our .env, we're gonna add that RPC URL from Alchemy back in here. Before we just said RPC URL, but since we might want to work across multiple networks, it's usually good to specify exactly what network each URL stands for. So we're going to say Rinkaby RPC URL equals, and then paste that URL in here. Now, as you probably have guessed, we can add our URL to our Rinkby network here. For readability, I usually like to add them as variables right above the module.experts. So I'll say const Rinkaby RPC URL equals process.env.rinkaby RPC URL. And once again, we're gonna be pulling that Rinkaby RPC URL from our environment variable. Of course, in order to pull that environment variable in, we're gonna to need to use that .env package again. So to add that in, we're gonna do yarn add dash dash dev .env. And at the top of our hardhat config, we're gonna add require dot env and then do dot config to enable the config. Now this means we should be able to pull our rinkby rpc url from our dot env. 
Now that we have that in our RinkB network, we can add URL, RinkB RPC URL. Awesome. So we have an RPC URL for a different network, but what else do we usually need? Well, we usually need a private key to work with an actual network. Hardhat doesn't automatically give us a private key for RinkB because Hardhat can't just give us testnet Ethereum. We need to have an actual account. An actual testnets, Hardhat doesn't control those, so we have to actually give it a real URL and a real private key. So to add private keys, you actually add something called accounts. And you add a list of accounts that you want to give to Hardhat. For us, we're only going to add one, which is going to be our private key. And for our private key, we're going to do the exact same thing. We're going to say const private key equals process.env.private key. And since this private key is going to be a real private key for a real testnet, again, we are going to have to grab this from our MetaMask. So we'll go to our MetaMask, hit the three dots, account details, export private key, and we'll add our password in here. And then in our .env, we'll add private key equals, and then add our private key. Now, I know I've said this a hundred times, but please, 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 for learning this, do not use a real key that is connected to any real money, just in case. Please use a new MetaMask. I know I've said it a bunch, but some people go, no, I'm going to be okay. I'll be safe. Just to be super, super safe here, please use a brand new MetaMask. So now that we have our private key, we're going to add it in here, account private key, and now we have an account here. One more thing I like to do is I like to give the chain ID of the network, which for RinkB is going to be four. Every single EVM based network has a new chain ID. An EVM network basically just means Solidity works on it. This includes all test nets. There's a good site called chainless.org, which may or may not be going down at some point that has a list of all these different networks. For example, you can see on here, Ethereum mainnet has a chain ID of one. Binance Smart Chain is 56, Avalanche is 43114, Phantom Opera 250, Polygon 137, etc. Each one of these EVM compatible chains has their own chain ID. For RinkB, the chain ID is 4. Adding the chain ID is helpful here for later on, and we'll get to that in the future. But for now, just go ahead and make sure to add your chain IDs. Okay, now that we have the RPC URL, we have the private key, we can go ahead and test deploying this to an actual testnet. And I actually did something incorrect here. And we're going to get an error here. And I want you to go ahead and try to figure out and debug this error yourself. You ready? All right, let's do it. We'll do yarn, hard hat, run scripts, deploy.js, dash dash network, rinkaby. And we get this wonderfully weird error, which if we see, we have deploying contract, so we know that in our deploy script, we get to at least this line, but then we're getting an error highly likely here. So what's going on? It's saying, can I read properties of null reading send transaction? If you want, you can absolutely go to this spot, but it basically, it looks like it's having a hard time understanding what the private key or what the account of this is. And what do you think I'm gonna recommend we do? Well, if it's not clear after doing a little bit of triaging and debugging, we're gonna copy this error, and we're going to come on over to Google and paste that right in. It looks like we do get a question here from Stack Exchange Ethereum. And it looks like it's really similar to what we're doing. If we scroll down, they're running nearly the exact same script that we're running. They're using MPX instead of Yarn. They've got a pretty minimalistic deploy file. Let's scroll down and see what the answers have to say. I've seen this error when my private key wasn't properly populated. I would also use an environment variable. I'm pretty sure our, our environment variable is good, but we have a second one saying in your hardhat.config.js, it should be accounts instead of account. It works for me. Let's go back to our hardhat config and see if that's what's going on. Aha, we put account when this should be accounts. So let's swap that over to accounts. We'll clear our terminal and we'll run this again. Aha, and now it's waiting a little bit longer which is good. This means that we're probably deploying this to RinkB, which is what we want to see. Awesome. And now we can see deployed contract two, and we have a contract address here. So we'll grab this contract and we'll pop on over to RinkB Etherscan. That's not RinkB Etherscan. And we'll go ahead and we'll paste this in. Awesome. And we can see our contract was created about 26 seconds ago. Perfect. Now for this part, you don't have to deploy this to RinkB with me. If you follow along here, that's good enough. So remember, deploying to test nets can take a long time. So for this one, you don't have to deploy with me. 
All right, great. So we've deployed to Rink B using Hardhat. This is fantastic. Now, something that we notice once again is, oof, our contract isn't verified. Do we have to go back through and do this verify and publish and all that stuff again? Well, lucky for us, we actually don't need to do that. So what can we do? Well, back in our deploy script, we can add some code to automatically verify right after we deploy. So let's go ahead and do that. Right below our main function, we're gonna create a new function called verify. We're gonna say async function verify, and we're gonna have this function get past some arguments. We're gonna have it get past a contract address and some arguments for the contract. Since our simple storage doesn't have a constructor, the arguments for simple storage are just going to be blank. But in the future, when we have contracts that do have constructors, the arguments are going to be populated. And when we get there, you'll see what I mean. We need at least the contract address. And we're going to add some code in here to automatically verify our contracts after they've been deployed. This auto verification process works on block explorers like Etherscan. It might not work on block explorers like Ethplor or other block explorers, but if you want to verify on these other block explorers, I'm sure they have an API to allow you to do that as well. Now, Etherscan and most other block explorers have a section on their website called API documentation or something to do with APIs. These are ways for us to programmatically interact with Etherscan and do stuff with them. One of the main things that we can do is we can actually verify our contracts through this API. Etherscan even has a tutorial in here called Verifying Contracts Programmatically, and a link to this will be in the GitHub repo. They have an API endpoint that we can make some requests to to go ahead and verify our contracts. Now, we could absolutely make the raw API calls and follow the tutorial here, but there's actually an easier way than even going through this tutorial here. Hardhat is an extensible framework, meaning you can add something called plugins to it. There's even an advanced section in the documentation called Building Plugins. If we scroll down to the bottom, we can see some popular plugins that the Nomic Labs team or the Hardhat team has created, and also a number of community plugins as well. One of the most used Hardhat plugins is gonna be this Hardhat Etherscan plugin that makes this verification process much, much easier. To install it, you can just run npm install dash save dev at Nomic Labs Hardhat Etherscan, and then add it to our hardhat.config. Since we're using Yarn, we're just gonna go ahead and use Yarn. So back in our code, We'll do yarn add dash dash dev at nomic labs slash hardhat slash hyphen etherscan. Now that we have this plugin, we can go to our hardhat.config, scroll to the top, and add this plugin in. We'll do require at nomic labs slash hardhat etherscan. Now that we have this plugin, the hardhat documentation has some more information about the usage, how to actually use this plugin, and how to run different commands with it. In order for us to use this verification, we actually need an API key from Etherscan. This is basically a password for allowing us to use the Etherscan API. So we're gonna come to Etherscan, and we're gonna go ahead and sign in. And actually, we're gonna click to sign up and create an account. And we'll go ahead and create an account. We'll go ahead and verify our registration by clicking the verification link, and we'll click the login. Now that we're logged in, on the left-hand side, we can scroll down to API keys, and we can go ahead and create a new API key. We can call this hh-fcc, which stands for hardhat free code camp. We'll create this new API key, we'll copy this, and we'll go back to our code, and we'll add this somewhere. Since this API key is basically considered a password, where do you think we should add this? That's right, in our .env. So in our .env, we're gonna add a new entry called etherscan API key, and we're gonna add that API key that we just got. Now that we have our API key, back in our hardhat config, we're gonna create a new section in our module.exports to tell hardhat that we have this etherscan API key. Our new section is gonna be called etherscan, and in here, we're gonna say API key is gonna be etherscan API key, that we're gonna define up here the same way we define these other keys. So we'll say const etherscan API key equals process.env.etherscan API key. And if something like this pops up, you can generally just hit enter and it'll auto-complete it for you, which is awesome. Great, so now we have an etherscan API key. 
back in the hard hat documentation, it tells us by adding this, we actually get a new task called verify. Hmm, let's try that out. Let's open our terminal back up and we'll do yarn hard hat. And let's see what pops up. Wow, we did get a new verification here. When we run yarn hard hat, hard hat actually looks into our hard hat duck config .js and checks for any plugins. If there are new plugins there, it'll add them as a new task that we can do. You can manually verify your contract by doing yarn or npx hardhead verify dash dash network the deployed contract address and any constructor arguments yourself. But we want to be a little bit more programmatic than this. So what we're going to do is we're going to go back and create this verification function. It is good to know how to do it via command line so that if you want to verify something in the future manually, you can. Let's build this verify function though. So we're going to take the, our contract address and some arguments. And for our sake, we're going to do console.log verifying contract dot dot dot, just so that we know we might have to wait for a little bit. And in our code, we can actually run any task from hardhat using a run package. So up at the top, we're actually going to import run from hardhat as well. Run allows us to run any hardhat task. So in our code here, we're going to do await run. And then we can do ver if I. Now, hardhead allows you to add different parameters as well in this run. And it's usually best that you go ahead and add them in here so that we're really specific with what we're doing. So if we do yarn hardhat verify dash dash help, we can see what parameters we can actually pass. Well, it looks like we can pass the verify parameter. So we'll do colon verify. If you go to the actual GitHub for the verification task, you can actually see you can do more than just verify. You can do verify get minimum build, verify get constructor arguments, verify verify, which is what we're going to be working with, and a couple of other subtasks as well. The second parameter that goes inside run is going to be a list of actual parameters. This second parameter here is just kind of the subtask, if you will, of our verify task. And this is going to be an object that contains the actual parameters. And this is where we pass in an address which is going to be our contract address, and then our constructor arguments, which is going to be args. Now, normally just this right here should be enough for us to go ahead and use this verify contract in our main function. But we're going to add one additional thing to it, because in practice, sometimes there's some errors that can come up. One of the errors that often comes up when running await is that the contract has already been verified. And you'll actually likely run into this because Etherscan will get smart enough by seeing enough bytecode that is exactly simple storage that it'll start to just automatically verify any bytecode that looks like simple storage. And then this await will throw an error, which we want to avoid. So what we can do is we can add a try catch onto this await. So outside of the await, we're going to add a try. And we're going to add these little brackets that wrap around our await. And then we're going to put a catch E. This is known as a try catch. And Solidity also has try catches. But basically, this E is going to be any error that this section throws. So what we're going to do is we're going to say if this message is already verified, then we're just going to continue. So we're going to say if E dot message dot to lowercase, we're going to make sure it's to lowercase, dot includes already verified, then we're just going to do console dot log already verified, like that. Otherwise, we're just going to console dot log E. The reason we do this is because if this errors, our verification function will break and our whole script will end and we don't want our whole script to end we want our script to keep continuing if the verification doesn't work because it's not really a big deal. So I know this might seem like a lot of code. Uh, feel free to copy and paste it from the GitHub repo to just move along. But awesome. So we now have a verify function using the verify task in hardhat. Let's go ahead and use this now in our main function. Right below our deploy, we'll do console.log deployed contract to and then the contract address. But before we call this main function, let's think for a quick second. What happens when we deploy to our hardhat network? Well, remember, if we deploy to our hardhat network, will our contract need to be verified on Etherscan? Well, we know there is a we know there's a ring Etherscan, we know there's a Coven Etherscan, we know there's a mainnet Etherscan, but is there a hardhat Etherscan? No. 
Of course not, right? The hard at runtime environment is a network local to our machine. So it doesn't make sense for us to verify a hard hat network deployed contract on Etherscan. So we actually don't want to call this verify function when we're working with our local network. This is where these chain IDs are gonna come in quite useful. What we can do is we can check to see if the network that we're running on is a live network or it's a test net or it's a network that actually can be verified. We can actually get network configuration information by importing network like this and we can do something like console.log network.config. Now, if I run yarn hardhat run scripts deploy.js on our hardhat network, since I'm not passing a network flag, we get this massive output that looks like this. Our network.config contains a ton of information about the current network that we're on. You'll see here that the chain ID of the hardhat network is actually 31337. We have gas price, which gets set to auto, block gas limit, the current fork of Ethereum that we're working with, and all these other pieces here. This chain ID is really important because we can use this chain ID to figure out which one is a testnet or which one is a live network. And remember, running this script is going to be the same as doing dash dash network hardhat. You'll see our chain ID is still 31337. Again, that's because the default network in our hardhat config, it's hardhat, which is the same as saying every single time we run a script, we're secretly running it with dash dash network hardhat. So now we only want to verify on our test net. So what we can do is we can say if network.config chain ID equals 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 four, which is going to be rink B and and in JavaScript equals 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 is nearly the same as equals equals, except no type conversion is done which just means in JavaScript, four equals four, and four equals equals the string of four, but four, but if you were to use four equals 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 four, this is false. So this is true. Equals equals, four equals equals would be true. Four equals equals to the string of four would also be true, but four equals 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 to the string of four is gonna be false. So you can kind of do whatever you want here, equals equals or equals equals equals. So we want to say if the network.config.chainid is four, so if we're on rink B, then we can go ahead and actually verify. But we also want to make sure we only verify if our Etherscan API key exists. So we can also in here is say and, this double ampersand means and, we can say process.env.etherscan API key. This is some Boolean tricks that we're doing here, basically. So our first conditional, we're saying if network.config.chanity equals 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 four. This section can be true or false, obviously, right? The chain ID that we're running on can be the hard at network, which would mean this doesn't equal four, or it would be ring B, which means this does equal four. But there's no conditional on this side. So how does this side work? In JavaScript, if an object exists and you try to cast it as a Boolean, it'll be converted to true. If it doesn't exist, it'll be converted to false. So in JavaScript, basically, if Etherscan API key exists, if we have this in our .env, this will be true. And if not, this will be false. So another way to read this line here is saying if network.config.chainid is four, aka if we're on rink B, and our Etherscan API key exists, then do some stuff. And that's what we're going to do here. So in here, we'd want to run verify or verify function and pass it the contract address, which is going to be simple storage dot address and the constructor arguments, which we know are going to be blank. And since our verify function is an async function and it deals with promises and stuff, we want to add the await keyword here. Awesome. So we've added a way to actually verify our contract, but we're not quite done. See, on Etherscan and all these block explorers, the instant we deploy the contract and the instant we send the contract, Etherscan might not know about the transaction yet. It might take a hot second for Etherscan to be up to speed with where the blockchain is. So it's usually best practice to wait for a few blocks to be mined until you actually run your verification process. We've actually learned how to do this already with the deploy transaction. So before we actually verify, we, run, we want to run await simple storage dot deploy transaction 
uh, wait six. So we will wait six blocks and then we'll run our verification process. Now, if you want to go and test this out right now, you absolutely can. I'm going to keep going though, because again, testing all these on a test net takes a little bit of extra time. So I'm going to finish the rest of our main function and then I'm going to run everything all together. But okay, cool. So we've deployed our contract. We've automatically, programmatically verified our contract. What's next? Well, what did we do last time? We started interacting with the contract. So let's do const current value equals await simple storage dot retrieve to get the current value. Simple storage dot soul. We have a retrieve function which returns the favorite number. So let's get the current value. And we'll do console.log current value is, and then some string interpolation current value. And then we'll go ahead and update the current value by doing const transaction response equals await simple storage dot store. We'll store the number seven and then we'll await transaction response dot wait. We'll wait one block for that transaction to go through and we'll grab the updated value by saying const updated value equals await simple storage dot retrieve. And then we'll do console dot log. Updated value is updated value. Awesome. And this is going to be our whole script. So if I can zoom out for a little bit, I know it'll be a little bit small here. We've got this huge main function, which does what? Well, it deploys our contract. If we're on a test net, it then verifies our contract and then it updates the value to seven. And we have our verify function down here and we have, we have a section of our code that calls our main function. Now, if I run this on the hard hat network, what do you think will happen? Well, let's try it. Yarn, hard hat run, scripts, deploy.js. All right, awesome. We get exactly what we saw before. We get deploying contract, deployed contract two, current value is zero, updated value is seven. And there's nothing in here about verification. That's exactly what we want. Now, moment of truth, let's try this on rink B. We'll do yarn, hard hat run, scripts, deploy.js dash dash network rinkaby and it's going to go a lot slower because obviously now we're deploying to an actual test net where the blocks actually need to be mined and we see we have indeed deployed the contract now that our contract is deployed we know that we're currently waiting six block confirmations for us to go ahead and verify and actually I should add console.log waiting for block txs dot 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 so that we don't get kind of this weird, oh, wait, what are we doing now? Ah, and it looks like we ran into this error. No such file or directory. It looks like our code might not have compiled correctly here. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go ahead and delete our artifacts. Move to trash. I'm going to delete our cache as well. I'm going to try rerunning this. Whenever you run a script with the hardhead command, hardhead will automatically recompile it for you, especially if there's no artifacts folder. So we're going to rerun this command and hard hat's going to compile first and we can see that it does exactly that. And then it's going to go ahead and redeploy. Hopefully this time it should be able to find the contract that it just compiled. Looks like this time after I deleted the artifacts folder, we actually did indeed get some successful compilation and we can see here successfully submitted source code for contract for verification on the block explorer, waiting for verification results, successfully verified contract simple storage on etherscan. It even gives us a link that we can go ahead and command click or control click into, and we can see the contract indeed being verified. This is awesome. All right, this is perfect. We've now got a successful deploy.js script that can deploy, verify, and then interact with our code. This is fantastic. This hard hat thing seems pretty cool. What else can we do with hard hat? Like I showed you before, hard hat comes with these tasks 
and the number of tasks that hardhat can come with can be extended by us writing plugins. We can actually write our own tasks in hardhat. And in our hardhat.config, it came defaulted with this task account. We can see task accounts prints the list of accounts and just prints a list of accounts here. We can actually go to the hardhat documentation to learn more about creating our own tasks. One of the ways that you can define tasks is directly in our hardhat.config.js. But typically what people do is they have a new folder called tasks where they put all their tasks. So for now, I'm gonna go ahead and delete this section here and we're gonna create our own task. You'll notice that now that we've deleted that section, if we run yarn hardhat, we no longer see the accounts task in here because we've just deleted that task. So let's create our own new task. We'll call this block number.js. And we'll use this to get the current block number of whatever blockchain that we're working with. So let's create this task. First, we need to import the task function. We can get it by saying const task equals require hardhat slash config. The hardhat slash config has the task function in it. To define a task, we can now just say task, give it a name and a description. The name is gonna be block number, and then the description is gonna be prints the current block number. Now that we have this task, there's a couple of things we can actually do with it. We can add different parameters to it by using the dot add command, which allow us to pass parameters to the task. And then we can also set actions, which define what the task should actually do. For us, we're just gonna do dot set action and define what we want this function to do. So we're gonna set, make this an async function that's gonna take as an input the task arguments, which are gonna be blank for us, and the HRE, which I'll define in a second. Now, let me explain the syntax really quickly. This might look a little bit weird, but this is what's known as a JavaScript arrow function. In JavaScript, you can actually define functions without even using the function keyword. For example, if we go back to our deploy function, we have our async function verify down here. However, another way we could have defined this is, is without using the function word at all and actually turning this whole thing into a variable. We could have said instead, we could say, const verify is gonna be an async function that takes contract addresses and arguments. And here's the function definition. These two lines are essentially equivalent. There's some slight differences between, between using the function keyword and having your function be a variable. But for the purpose of this course, they're basically the same. Which means though, that this by itself is a function, just not assigned to a variable. But essentially, the two of these do are exactly the same. And that's the syntax that we're doing here. You can imagine this sort of being like const block task equals async function, which takes the params and then runs that arrow function. Or you can think of it as async function block task parameters and then the function definition. These are all essentially the same. The major difference is that we're never giving our function a name. We never give it this block task variable. This is known as an anonymous function in JavaScript because we, it doesn't have a name. Now that we have our function in here, we can now call some function to get the block number. Well, how can we get the block number? When we run tasks, we automatically pass our anonymous functions, the task arguments, which in this one, we don't have any, but we also pass this HRE object. This HRE is the hard hat runtime environment. Back in our deploy script, this is basically the same as this require hard hat in here. So this HRE can access a lot of the same, this HRE can access a lot of the same packages that the hard hat package can. So we can do hre.ethers, just like how you can import ethers from hard hat. And in our ethers package, there's actually a number of functions we can use like dot provider dot get block number. Let's save this to a variable const block number equals, and this is going to be asynchronous. So we're going to want to add a wait here. And then we'll just do console dot log block number, or better yet, we'll string interpolate this and say current block 
number like this. Now though, if I try to run this task, you'll notice it doesn't show up in the hardhat list of tasks. Let's do yarn hardhat. Huh, I don't see block number in here. Well, this is because we need to add it to our config. So in our config, we'll add require dot slash tasks slash block number. And in order for us to import it, and let's add a module that exports. I'll explain what this does a little bit later. But now that we've required it, if I run yarn hard hat, I now see block number is one of the tasks that I can use. So now if I run yarn hard hat block number, we get current block number is zero. And this makes sense because this is defaulting to our hard hat network, which gets reset every time we run it. But if I run yarn hard hat block number dash dash network rinkaby, what do you think I'm going to get? I get a much larger number. Current block number is right here because this is the actual block number of rink B versus the block number of our hard hat network is going to be zero because it gets reset every single time we run one of these scripts. Now scripts and tasks both can basically do the same thing. They both can interact with contracts. They both can deploy smart contracts. They can both pretty much do everything. I prefer scripts just as a general rule of thumb because I don't always think adding a special thing from the command line makes sense. So I prefer scripts, but you'll see a ton of tasks and examples out there as well. I think tasks are really nice for specific use cases, but for the most part, we're pretty much going to use exclusively scripts, but it is good to know what a task looks like and how to use it. I think tasks are better for plugins and scripts are better for your own local development environment. But if you want to do everything with tasks, you absolutely can. As you're starting to see, this config piece is pretty powerful. And we can use it to modify our entire code base and our entire project to give our project more functionality. What else can this do? Well, right now, as you can see, every time we work with the hardhat network, every time we run a script, we run that script and then the hardhat network is deleted, right? We can't interact with our contracts anymore. Well, there's actually a way for us to run a hardhat network similar to how we ran a, a Ganache network with a user interface. What we can do in hardhat is run yarn hardhat node. And what this will do is it'll spin up a node on a local network exactly the same as Ganache, but in our terminal. So you see here, start at HTTP and WebSocket JSON RPC server at this address. And just like Ganache, it comes packed with all these different accounts and private keys, which is awesome. You'll notice though, interestingly enough, that this node that we're running isn't on the hardhat network. Well, we can actually create a new terminal to try to interact with this just by hitting this little plus button and creating a new terminal. Again, I'm using bash, but based off of whatever your operating system is, you could be using a different shell. And in here, let's go ahead and run yarn hardhat run scripts deploy.js and see what happens. Well, our typical setup happens. We deploy a contract, we get a contract address, we update the value. But if we look at our node, it doesn't look like any transactions went through. We, we don't see any logging here. So what's going on? Well, our hardhat network is actually different from this locally running network here. This locally running network, we often want to refer to as our local host. So it's slightly different than the hardhat network. It's still using the hardhat runtime environment, but it's just not this default hardhat network. It's considered its own separate network when we're running a, a node that is going to live past the duration of a script. So we can actually interact with this by adding a new network to our hardhat.config.js. We'll create a new network and call it localhost. And exactly as we did up here, we'll give it a URL accounts and a chain ID. So for a URL, we can get that URL right from our terminal output of running yarn hardhat node by copying that and pasting it in here. We can then do a comma. We'll give it a chain ID of 31337 because even though it's considered a different network, it actually has the same chain ID as hardhat. Interestingly enough, I know I just said we were going to give it accounts, but we actually don't need to give it accounts. Because when we run with this local host, Hardhat will automatically give us these 10 fake accounts for us. 
So you can kind of think of, of the accounts here for this local host as, as Hardhat already placing them in. Thanks, Hardhat. But now, if we go back to our bash here, let's clear the terminal. Let's rerun this script and we'll do dash dash network localhost. Now we should be pointing to this node. And when I run this script, we should see some logging output at the end of this node. So let's go ahead and hit enter. Well, we see our normal stuff on our deploy script. We flip back to our node. Wow, we see a ton of logging here. Similar to Ganache, we can see a whole bunch of different logs on what just happened. We can see a contract was deployed. We can see the address, the transaction hash, from, value, gas, and the block number and everything. We can also see our contract call calling the store function to update the value of our favorite number. This is incredibly powerful for quickly testing and working with things on a local JavaScript VM or hardhat network to be able to see how your contracts will interact on a real test net. And this is much quicker than working with a real test net. Now, additionally, same as what we said before, any process that's running in the terminal, we can kill it with control C. So if you want to stop your node and then restart it, you can hit control C to stop it and then just up and then rerun that same command to re-spin up your node. Control C stops it and then you can hit up to start again. Another way you could stop it, of course, is if you hit the trash can, which deletes the whole terminal. You pull the terminal back up. We can run it again. And just remember, if you hit the X, that actually doesn't delete the terminal, that just hides it. So our hard hat node right now is still running because I just hit it. So if I pull it back up, I can see that it is indeed still running. But if I trash can it, and then I pull the terminal back up, I can see that it is no longer running. So running scripts is great, but what if I don't want to have to code an entire script to do some things? What if I want to just tinker around with the blockchain? Well, Hardhat comes packed with this thing called the console. The console is a JavaScript environment for us to run JavaScript commands to interact with any blockchain. We can jump into the console by running yarn, Hardhat, console, and then whatever network flag. If we want to work on RinkB, Mainnet, Polygon, Avalanche, etc. Dash dash network localhost. And now we're dropped into a shell here. In this shell, we can do everything that we do in a deploy script. And we don't even have to run these imports because everything with hardhat is automatically imported into our console. So for example, let's say I wanted to get a simple storage contract factory. Well, I could run exactly this line here. I could say const simple storage factory equals await ethers.get contract factory of simple storage. And now I can go ahead and even deploy this. So I can even just copy this line, paste it. And if we flip back to our node, we'll see that we just deployed another simple storage. And now I can do things like await simple storage dot retrieve. And I get the return value, which is going to be a big number of with a value of zero. I can also make transactions. So I can do await simple storage dot store. Let's do 55. If I hit up twice, I can go back to the simple storage dot retrieve, call that function, and I can see my big number has a value of 55. Now, this is a great way to quickly interact with any blockchain that we want. Now you can exit the shell by hitting control C twice to get out. Or you can also just you can also trash can your terminal if you get confused. This console works with any network, we can even do yarn, hard hat, console dash dash network hard hat and we'll get dropped into a hard hat network now this is not going to be the same node that's running here this is going to be one that only runs for the duration of this command so whenever we cancel this command this hard hat network gets canceled we can close out of that too we can also do yarn hard hat console dash dash network rinkaby Rink B or Polygon or Testnet or Mainnet or whatever we want. And we can do things like ethers.provider. We can do things like await ethers.provider.get block number. See the block number of Rink B. 
We can also deploy contracts. We can update contracts. We can do anything that we want. You can do anything in these consoles and they're great ways to quickly test and tinker and interact with contracts. Now there's a couple other tasks that are really helpful. You'll see before I went ahead and just deleted artifacts and deleted cache manually. Well, to do that yourself, you can also just run yarn hardhead clean. And that'll delete the artifacts folder and clear out your cache. We already know what compile does. But one of the biggest things that hardhead is fantastic for, especially is running tests. Now we haven't run tests yet so far. However, running tests is absolutely critical to your smart contract development journey. And we're going to spend a lot of time in the future writing really good tests. The reason that writing tests are so important is because we want to make sure our code does exactly what we want it to do, especially in the DeFi and the decentralized smart contract world. All of our code is going to be open source for anybody to interact with and potentially exploit. There are sites like rec.news, which go through a ton of previous hacks and how they actually got hacked and what happened in the smart contract to enable these hacks to occur. So testing, so writing really strong tests is always going to be our first line of defense. And we have this sample test.js that comes default with the basic package of hardhat. But as you probably already know, we're going to rename this and change it. So we're going to rename this to test deploy.js. And we're going to delete everything in here and start from scratch. We want to be able to test all of our Solidity code locally so that we know exactly what it's doing. And we can have a programmatic way to make sure that our code does what we want it to do. So let's write a basic test for our simple storage contract so that we can be sure that it's doing exactly what we want it to be doing. Hardhead testing works with the Mocha framework, which is a JavaScript based framework for running our tests. You actually can write tests directly in Solidity if you'd like to. There's a bit of back and forth on whether testing with pure Solidity is better or testing with a modern programming language. The argument goes that testing with a modern programming language, you have more flexibility to do more stuff to interact and test your smart contracts. But the argument for testing just with Solidity is that you want to be as close to the code as possible. At the time of recording, most projects do the vast majority of their testing in a modern programming language like JavaScript. So that's what we're going to be using here. So to get started with our Mocha tests, we do, we're going to write a describe function. Describe is a keyword that Hardhead and Mocha will recognize, and it takes two parameters. It takes a string, which we're going to just write simple storage for now. And then it also takes a function. We could make function test func and then write some stuff in here and then pass it to our describe here. But the common convention is going to be to do is to make it as an anonymous function, which we can create by typing function, putting an empty parameter here, and then some brackets like that. So our describe function takes a name, a string, and a function. Another way that you'll often see functions in describe is using that anonymous function syntax. So you might see just these parentheses, an arrow, and then some brackets. The two of these are going to be basically the same. There are some differences. And this second one is actually best practice. But just know that you might see this arrow syntax in other tests as well. We have describe a simple storage and then our function here, which is going to have all of our tests in it. Inside each one of our describe blocks, we're gonna have something called a before each and a bunch of its. Our before each function is going to tell us what to do before each of our its. So we're going to have a ton of its and then we're going to have a before each. All of our its are going to be where we actually write the code for running our tests. And before each is going to be some code that tells us what to do before each one of these its. We can also actually have describes inside of describes, which again have more before each and more before its. Having these nested describes can be really helpful for separating and modularizing our tests. But for this one, we're just going to have a setup that looks like this. And for, for this demo, we're only going to have one it. So in order to test our smart contracts, before we actually run our tests, we're probably going to need to deploy the, the smart contracts first. So inside of our before each, we're going to pass the, our before each a function that's going to tell our testing framework what to do before each test. So we're going to pass it an async function 
like this. And in here, we want to deploy our simple storage contract. So to do that, we're going to need to get the ethers framework and do exactly what we did in our deploy script. So in here, we're at the top, we're going to say const ethers equals require hardhat and import ethers from hardhat. Then in our before each function, we'll say await ethers.getContract factory of simple storage. And we'll assign this to a const simple storage factory. And then we'll run await simple storage factory dot deploy. All right, cool. And let's also assign this to a variable const simple now, since right now, our simple storage and simple storage factory are scoped just to inside the before each, we actually need to stick these variables outside of the before each so all of our its can interact with them. So instead of having simple storage factory and simple storage be constant variables, we're going to define them outside of the before each with the let keyword. And we're going to say let simple storage factory and we're going to initialize it to nothing. And then we'll say let simple storage. Now, if you have a whole bunch of lets just initializing, another way you can write them in JavaScript is just let simple storage factory, comma, simple storage. And that works exactly the same. And then we can get rid of this const keyword because it's because it's not a constant since we are assigning it. And now we have simple storage factory and simple storage that we can use inside of our it function. Now we have a before each section. So before each one of our tests, we're going to deploy our simple storage contract. So we have a brand new contract to interact with for each one of our tests. Now inside of the it, this is where we're going to say what we want this specific test to do, and then describe the code that's going to actually do that. So we're going to say it should start with a favorite number of zero. So this is saying what this test should do. And then we're going to add our async function to actually do that. So we'll say async function. And in here, this is where we'll actually write the code to make sure that our contract does exactly this. We're going to say const current value equals await simple storage dot retrieve. And now in this test, we want to say, okay, now check to see that this current value is indeed zero. So how do we do that? Well, we can say const expected value is going to equal zero. And what we can do is we can do either, we can use either the assert keyword or the expect keyword, which we're going to import both of these from a package called chai. We actually installed chai automatically when we downloaded the basic parameters, when we downloaded the basic packages for hardhat. So at the top, we're going to say const expect and assert equals require chai. I'm a big fan of using assert as much as possible because I think the syntax makes a little bit more sense, but there will be scenarios where we need to use expect instead. Now assert has a ton of functions that are built in that help us make sure this is what we expect it to be. So I can do assert dot equal current value dot to string, because remember, this is actually going to be a big number, comma, expected value. So I'm saying I'm asserting this retrieve to return zero, which is going to be our expected value. Now to actually run this, we can run yarn, art hat test. And we see we get an output that looks like this should start with favorite number of zero, and it's indeed passing, you'll notice that if I were to change this to one, and this wasn't correct, it would break and it would say our tests are not passing. Assertion error expected zero to equal one. It expected zero to equal one, which is not what we want. We want zero to equal zero. So let's run this again. Ta da! Should start with favorite number zero and it's passing. All right, fantastic. So that's how we, we wrote one of our tests. Let's write one more test just to make sure that things look good. So let's say it should update when we call store, because when we call the store function, we want our favorite number to update. And we'll make this an async function as well. And let's add our stuff in here. So we'll say const expected value equals seven. 
but we're expecting that when we call store, it updates to seven. Now we can say const transaction response equals await simple storage dot store. And we can even just pass it the expected value here. And then we'll do await transaction response dot wait one. And now let's get the current value. So we'll say const current value equals await simple storage dot retrieve. And now we're going to assert dot equal current value dot to string comma expected value. And now we can run all these tests by running yarn hardhead test. And you'll see we ran both of these tests. And now if I have 10,000 tests, and I'm only finagling with one test, I can actually just run one test by running yarn hardhat test dash dash grep. And I can search for any keywords in any of the text here. So I'm going to grep for the store function, because the store keyword isn't in this text for this it, it's only in the text for this it. So if I do grep store, it should only run our second test, which it does indeed. One other way we can run only specific tests is with the only keyword. So we can type it dot only like that. And then we can run yarn hard hat test. And it should only run this should update when we call store. And it does indeed, then we can go ahead and delete this, save, run it again, and it should run all two. Fantastic. Now the other way you'll see these tests written is with instead of assert, it'll use the expect keyword. So you'll see something like expect current value dot to string dot to dot equal expected value. The two of these lines do exactly the same thing. And it's sort of up to you on which one you want to use. And that's all we're going to do for our testing. Now this is fantastic. Great job. Now that we have some tests, we can actually start testing to see how much gas each one of our functions actually costs. One of the most popular extensions for a hard hat is the hard hat gas reporter. This is an extension that gets attached to all of our tests and automatically gives us an output that looks like this that tells us approximately how much gas each one of our functions cost. If we scroll down in here, we can read the instructions on how to actually install this. NPM install hardhead gas reporter, which we're going to use with yarn. So we're going to say yarn add hardhat gas reporter dash dash dev. And now that that package is installed, we can go over to our config and add some parameters in here so that we can work with this gas pit. But underneath our etherscan section, we're going to add a new section called gas reporter. To have it run, whenever we run our tests, we're going to do enabled is going to be true. And then up at the top, we can add it by adding require hardhat gas reporter. Now that we have it in here, we can do yarn hardhat test. And after we run our tests, it'll automatically run this gas reporter. So we see our tests go ahead and run. And then we get this output that looks like this that tells us how approximately how much our contracts and methods cost. So our store function looks like it costs approximately this much gas and our simple storage costs approximately this much gas. This is incredibly helpful for figuring out how to optimize our gas as best as possible. Now I usually like to take it a step further though. Having the gas outputted like that is nice, but we can make it even better. I like to output it to a file by doing output file gas report.txt. And then in my dot git ignore, I like to add it in here by doing gas report.txt. Since it's not really important for the gas report to get pushed up to GitHub, we'll do no colors is true. The reason we add this is because when we output to a file, the colors can get messed up basically. And then the biggest addition we could do is we can add a currency in here so that we can get the cost of each function in USD for a blockchain like Ethereum. Now, in order to get a currency here, we actually need to get an API key from CoinMarketCap. Just like we did with Etherscan, we can go to CoinMarketCap, CoinMarketCap API, hit get your API key now, and we'll go ahead and sign up. Choose a basic plan. 
will agree and create my account. We'll get an email verification and we'll go ahead and verify. Now in the CoinMarketCap dashboard, we can copy our key and yep, you guessed it, exactly what we're gonna do with this key, we're gonna drop it into our .env file. We're gonna say CoinMarketCap API key equals, and then paste it in there like that. Now that we have our CoinMarketCap API key in here, we can go back to our hardhat.config and add it in this CoinMarketCap parameter. We're gonna do the exact same way we did above. We'll do const coin market cap API key equals process dot env dot coin market cap API key. And then we'll take this and stick it in here. So what this is gonna do is it's actually gonna make an API call to coin market cap whenever we run our gas reporter. This is why sometimes you'll see me comment this out and uncomment it because I don't always want it to make this API calls. But now what we can do, now that it's enabled, we have an output file, we can see the currency and we have our API key. What we can do is run yarn hard hat test. And after all our tests pass, we're gonna see a gas report.txt that we can go ahead and read from, which has that gas report. And now it actually has the USD price of each one of these transactions. It looks like at current prices, with Ethereum being $3,000 per ETH and a gas price of 43 GUE, the store function would cost $6 and the simple storage function would cost $64. The, current, the hardhead gas reporter actually comes with some different options though if you're gonna be deploying to a different network. For example, with Binance, Polygon, Avalanche, or Heco. For example, let's say we wanted to deploy to Polygon. Let's see how much deploying to Polygon would cost. Well, in our .env, we would add token Matic, and now we'd rerun this test. And if we look at our gas report.txt, we'll now see the gas price of Polygon right now is around 37 GUE per gas, and the cost of Matic is 147 per Matic in USD. Now we can see the cost of calling the simple storage method is gonna be $0.00. Now this of course is rounded down, but it's gonna be really, really cheap to call store. Versus deploying the contract is gonna cost three cents. I make it a habit to select false for my gas reporter whenever I don't wanna actually work with the gas here. Awesome. Now, sometimes when we're working with our code, if we don't have these environment variables specified, hardhat might get a little bit upset with us. So oftentimes I'll add some code in here so that these variables are always populated because if we didn't specify our rinkb RPC URL, rinkb RPC URL is gonna be undefined and that might throw some errors below. So oftentimes what I'll do is I'll add an or parameter here. These double pipes mean or. And in JavaScript, if we say some variable equals something or something else, what is really happening is we're gonna say, okay, rink brpc url is gonna be equal to process.env.rink brpc url. But if this rink brpc url doesn't exist, it's gonna be whatever else is over here. And I might write something like HTTPS eth rink eb example or something like this just so that I don't make hardhat mad if I don't use rink B. And we can do something like that for all of these. So you'll see this syntax oftentimes in a lot of code setups. Now, the last thing that I'm gonna show you before going into the TypeScript edition of this is test coverage. And as we progress through this course, I'm gonna show you more and more tools that you can use to make sure that our simple storage contract is safe and secure, and we take all the steps we can to prevent any hacks from happening if we deploy in real life. One of those tools is a tool called Solidity Coverage, and this is also a hard hat plugin that we can use for our code. Solidity Coverage is a project that goes through all of our tests and sees exactly how many lines of code in our simple storage.sol are actually covered. And this could be a good tip off if we don't cover some line of code, Solidity Coverage will say, hey, you don't have any tests for this line, maybe you should write some tests for it. We can add Solidity Coverage the same way we've been adding all of our packages. npm install, dash dash save dev, or since we're using yarn, yarn add, dash dash dev, Solidity Coverage. And we can then add this to our config the same way we've been adding everything to our config. We'll go to our config and we'll write require Solidity Coverage. And there's some configuration pieces we can add down here below for this, but we're just gonna use the default. Now what we can do is run yarn hardhat coverage. 
And this is going to go through our tests and print out a file that looks like this. We'll also get a file called coverage.json, which is basically this chart broken down a little bit more. I'll often put my coverage.json in my .gitignore. And I know we haven't actually seen .gitignore do what it's supposed to do, but we will soon. We can see here that about 50% of the code, 50% of our statements in simplestorage.sol are covered. About two thirds of our functions are, and 50% of the lines. It'll even give us exactly what lines aren't tested right now, which we can see exactly 31 and 32 of simplestorage.sol aren't covered, which makes a lot of sense because 31 and 32 is this add person function, which we didn't call and we didn't add to our tests. If you want to take this time to pause and, and try to make this solidity coverage be 100% across the board by writing some more tests, I highly recommend you do so. It'll be a great learning exercise. I'll also add the coverage folder. So coverage.json and the coverage folder, which again, I'll explain what the dot get ignore folder does a little bit later. Now, the last thing that we didn't talk about in here was what is this Nomic Labs hard hat waffle? We talked about dot env, hard hat etherscan, tasks, gas reports, solidity coverage. What is this? Well, we can actually Google search this and find out exactly what this is. Hard hat waffle is actually a plugin to work with the waffle testing framework. Waffle is one of these frameworks that allow us to do some really advanced testing. We're going to be working with some syntax that looks really similar to this really soon. And we'll be showing you more and more of this waffle tool as we continue. All right, the next part of this section, I'm actually going to go over the TypeScript edition of this. But for all intents and purposes, you've successfully created your first hard hat project. You've done a ton of amazing things in this lesson. Let's do a quick refresher of what we've learned so far. We learned how to spin up our own hard hat projects. And now we can run yarn hard hat and see a list of the tasks and different things that we can do with hard hat. We learned that hard hat looks for this hard hat .config .js, And this is sort of the entry point for any task that we run that starts with hard hat. We learned we can add our contracts to this contracts folder, and then we compile it by running yarn hard hat compile. We learned that all the compilation goes into the artifacts and then the cache as well. And if we want a clean reset, we can either delete these two files or just run yarn hard hat clean. So we learned that we can use scripts or tasks to actually deploy, interact, and do things with our smart contracts. We also learned that I'm going to be using scripts for the rest of this course, but if you want, you could absolutely use tasks as well. I've asked this question a million times. What's the difference? Nobody really seems to, to know what the main difference is, but I think the main difference is that tasks are for plugins and scripts are for your local development environment. That is my delimiter. We learned that we can import a whole bunch of things, including tasks from hard hat in our scripts, and we can work with our async functions to grab our contracts and deploy them. We actually then can programmatically verify them using hard hat and using hard hat plugins. And then additionally, we can interact with our contracts very similar to how we did it with ethers. We wrote a wonderful verification script, and we also wrote our own task. We wrote our first tests for this whole space, and we showed what our tests are going to look like moving forward. And we talked a little bit about their importance, and I really should stress that writing good tests is going to be the difference between a really professional environment and kind of a side project. Whenever I audit smart contracts or whenever I'm given a project for someone to tell me to take a look at, the first thing I look at is the readme, of course. And then the second thing I, I look at is the tests. And if tests aren't good, I usually tell them, hey, you need to go back to the drawing board and you need to level up your tests. So tests are really, really important, especially for this space. We learned about a couple more environment variables we can use. Uh, we learned about a couple of tools to see how good our tests are, one of them being coverage. We also learned about a gas reporter to see how much it's going to cost us when we actually deploy to a real network. We learned a ton about the hardhat config and how there are multiple networks that we can add to our hardhat. So we can make our project, our EVM code, work with any network out there. We started working with dev dependencies instead of regular dependencies. Now, readmes are something that I'm not really going to go over too deeply in here, but readmes are sort of like the welcome page of your GitHub repository and really should give you an understanding of what your code does. Being a part of the Web3 space and being a part of the blockchain ecosystem is really more than just you coding your stuff by yourself. You want other people to interact and engage with your code and engage with your projects. I haven't showed you how to use GitHub yet, but don't worry, we're going to. But if you look at my hardhat simple storage readme, if you scroll down, 
Usually you really want to have a getting started section where you define how to set up all the code and how to set everything up, a quick start section, and maybe a usage section and some testing section, which teaches people how to actually use and interact with your code. Since we're just learning more of the code part and not so much the readme part, for now, we're not going to go over how to make a fantastic readme. However, I will leave a link in the GitHub repository associated with this course linked to this best readme template. It really is a fantastic readme template that you can copy to any of your projects to make them look really good and give them a really good setup so that other developers can come to your project and learn and participate with what you're coding. But all right, you have learned an absolute ton. You should be incredibly proud of yourself and incredibly excited that you've made it this far. Now I'm going to jump into the TypeScript section here. So for those of you who are coding along with TypeScript, feel free to follow along. For those of you who are not, you just finished the basic section on hard hit, but stick around. The next two hard hat sections are going to be the ones that really fine grain and hone your skills and give you all the fundamentals for working with these frameworks. So be sure to follow along with the next two sections. We've got a ton more fantastic content for you. We are just beginning to get deeper into the smart contract ecosystem. So take that lap, get that coffee, and I'll see you soon. All right, also now let's do this with TypeScript. So I am going to go ahead and just start this from our JavaScript section. However, if in the future you want to start a new hardhat project, you can actually start a new project with yarn hardhat and then do create an advanced sample project that uses TypeScript. You'll add a ton of plugins and you'll wait a while for everything to get uploaded. And you wait and you wait a little bit for everything to get downloaded. We're not going to do that though because I'm going to show you how to convert this to JavaScript anyways. If in future hard hit sections, as we're coding along with JavaScript, if you want to code along with TypeScript, you absolutely 100% can. But let's go ahead and show you what the main differences are. Now that advanced TypeScript thing is going to add a whole bunch of packages that you may or may not want. I will talk about some of them in our next lesson, but there are going to be some that you absolutely do need. Those are going to be at type chain slash ethers dash V5 at type chain slash hard hat at TypeScript at types slash chai at types slash node at types slash mocha TS node type chain and TypeScript. And I have a link and in the GitHub repo associated with this course, I've got this yarn ad that you can just copy paste if you want to just copy paste that into your project to run it. Whoops, and I should have added those as dev dependencies. So we're going to actually just make them dev dependencies real quick just by deleting these two lines and adding a comma here. Awesome. That looks much better. And then of course, what we're going to do is we're going to convert all of our JavaScript to TypeScript. So anywhere where we have JS, we're going to put TS. Obviously, if you're coding this from scratch with TypeScript, you would do the .ts from the get go. This includes our hardhat.config. That's also going to be TypeScript now. And additionally, we're going to add a tsconfig.json. This is going to be our TypeScript configuration. Typically for a setup, we're going to go with something like this. And you can copy this from the GitHub repo associated with this course. It's basically telling TypeScript what versions of TypeScript and what files to include for working with TypeScript. Now let's go ahead and start with our deploy.typescript. Per usual, instead of using require, we're going to go ahead and use import. So we're going to do the exact same thing. We're going to have import ethers run network from hardhat. And then in our verify function, we're going to add the, we're going to add the types for these arguments. So contract address is going to be a string and args is going to be an array of arguments. So we're going to say it's going to be any array because it could be string. It could be numbers. It could be booleans. It could be anything. We're also going to say for our E, it could be any, even though this is technically an error type, we're just going to put any for simplicity for now. All of our TypeScript scripts are included in our TS config or any TypeScript files are manually added here, which we have our entire scripts folder here, which is good. So now we need to add ethers in here. Well, if we look at our hardhat.config.ts, we're using require here still, and we need to swap this out for import. For .env, you can use .env slash config for it to grab your .env file. Now that we've imported everything, if we go back to our deploy.ts, we can see that that linting has gone away. If you want to be even more explicit, we can go ahead and add import at nomic labs slash hardhat ethers like so. The reason we don't need to import it here is because these two packages also work with hardhat ethers. So they automatically import it. 
But if you want to be super explicit, you can go ahead and add it like so. Now, we're almost good to go, but remember, our hardhat.config is also importing our tasks. So we're going to need to update our tasks, our block number, to be TypeScriptified. So, of course, instead of const require, we're going to do import task from hardhat slash config. And we're going to be sure to export our task from block number as the default. So we're going to do export default task like so. And now we should be good to run our scripts. So we can just do yarn hardhat run scripts deploy.ts. We can do network hardhat if we choose. And awesome. Now it's when we get to the testing that things get a little bit different here. So let's go ahead and change this require to import just to make it happy there. And let's try to run yarn hardhat test. We get a whole bunch of errors. And in VS Code, we'll actually go ahead and get these errors right from the linter. One of the trickiest things that you run into as a developer in this space is calling functions on contracts where those functions don't exist or vice versa. We're not calling functions on contracts that do exist. Right now, the typing for our contracts is just type contract, which isn't super helpful because type contract doesn't necessarily have all the functions that we want it to have. We want our contracts to be of type contract, but we want them to be of, of the type of our contract. Because if they're the type of our contract, they can have all the functions that we want them to have. So to give our contracts the correct typing here, we actually can use this tool called type chain, which gives our contracts correct typing. Type chain has a hardhead plugin, which allows us to use type chain and TypeScript natively together. Type chain slash hardhat was one of these things that we already installed. And to add it to our hardhat, we gotta just go to the hardhat config and add it in. Import at type chain slash hardhat. Now, once we import that in to our config, if we run yarn hardhat, we now get a new task here called type chain. If you read the description, it says generate type chain typings for compiled contracts. This will enable all of our contracts to have their own typing. So we can have a simple storage variable of type simple storage contract, which is much better because we're always going to know exactly what we can do with each contract. To create this, we run yarn hard hat type chain. And this is going to create a new folder called type chain slash types with types for all of our contracts. You can even go into our simple storage.ts, which is going to have all the different functions and everything you could do with our simple storage contract automatically coded into TypeScript and JavaScript for us, which is incredibly helpful. And again, I know I haven't shown you what this is yet, but in our dot get ignore, we usually want to add type chain and type chain dash types into our dot get ignore so we don't push them up to GitHub. Now back in our test, we're going to add the exact types of these different objects here. So we're going to import them from that folder that we just created. So we'll do import simple storage, comma, simple storage, underscore, underscore, factory, from dot, dot, slash, type chain, slash types. The simple storage factory is going to be simple storage factory. And then simple storage, of course, is going to be simple storage. So now we're going to do let simple storage factory, which is going to be of type simple storage underscore underscore factory. And then simple storage, which is going to be of type simple storage contract. And if we command clicked into simple storage, once again, we can see all the contract functions that we know and love are here. In addition, we have all the functions of the actual contract itself. Once we do that, we're pretty much good to go. We just need to add a couple of new things here. Get contract factory returns a type ethers.contract factory. So what we just need to do is we need to wrap this in a simple storage factory type. So we'll just do a little wrap like this and we'll say as simple storage underscore underscore factory. And that's good to go. Now that we've added all this, we can run yarn hard hat test. And boom, our tests run as normal, but with TypeScript and with this additional typing that makes our lives substantially, substantially better. And that's going to be all you need to know for TypeScript. For usual, all of the branches have an optional TypeScript branch that you can use to reference to work with TypeScript. We've learned really just the basics of all the different things we can do with Hardhat. And 
These next two lessons, Hard Hat Fund Me and Hard Hat Smart Contract Lottery, are really going to be the basics for all the fundamentals of all the tools that we're going to learn in Hard Hat. Lesson eight is going to be our introduction to full stack and working with front end and building full stack applications. Getting all the way through this course will give you all the tools to start your Web3 journey. But if you're looking to just learn just the basics, make sure you absolutely get all the way to lesson nine. And if you get all the way through lesson 18, whew, you are going to know all of the cutting edge tools for this space. And you're going to have the knowledge to become easily one of the best developers in this space. So I hope you make it all the way through to the end. Now, one of the most important parts of this section of this lesson is going to be pushing our code up to GitHub and then sending a tweet celebrating that we pushed our first smart contract, our first Web3 GitHub repository to GitHub. So before moving on to the next lesson, be absolutely sure to get to the end of this and push this code up to GitHub. And then optionally, if you want to celebrate by sending a tweet, but be absolutely sure to get to the GitHub section, because as I've said many times, the Web3 space is this incredibly collaborative community and working with GitHub or GitLab or any other version control tool is going to be essential for your success in the space. So be sure to get to that part. All right, now welcome back to the Hard Hat Fund Me section of our course. This is the section where we're actually going to upload our first code repository to GitHub if you've never done this before. This is going to be the section where we're going to learn even more about Hard Hat using a familiar contract base we've already worked with, which is the Fund Me contract. And again, if you're using the GitHub repo associated with this course, you can scroll down to the Hard Hat Fund Me and all the code is located in our repo. If you'd like to do a quick start, you can go ahead and git clone it, cd into it, and then run yarn, and then just run yarn hardhat deploy. For this, I'm gonna briefly show you what that looks like. So if you're in your VS code, you can do git clone, grab the package, cd into it, and then type code period to open it up in a new VS code. Once you're in your folder, you can go ahead and run yarn to install all the dependencies for working with this project. If you plan on working with the testnet or working with Etherscan or CoinMarketCap, feel free to fill out your .env with a private key, RPC URL, CoinMarketCap key, and Etherscan key. And then you can just follow along with the readme to use this repo. You can run yarn, hardhead deploy, and it'll show you deploying some contracts and some mocks, etc. So let's get to building this ourselves though. Now we're gonna make a new directory for this project. It's gonna be the same setup we've seen before. MKDIR, hardhat fund me, FCC. We're gonna CD into hardhat fund me FCC, and then type code, period. And if code period doesn't work for you, you can absolutely open this up by hitting file, open folder, like we showed you before. But now we're in a brand new folder here, and we're gonna go ahead and add hardhat here. And we're gonna run yarn, add dash dash dev hard hat. Now that we have hard hat in our package.json and in our node modules, we can go ahead and run yarn hard hat. And this will say, what do you want to do? I'm going to choose the advanced sample project here just to show you what's going on. And we're going to set this up in a way that I think works best. So we'll go ahead and do the advanced sample project. Yes, we're going to have that as the root. Yes, we want to add a gitignore. And there are a lot of sample product dependencies that it wants us to add. We're going to go ahead and hit yes, but we're going to end up not using all of these. And I'll show you which ones we're not going to use and why. But for now, let's go ahead and hit yes. All right, awesome. And now we have an advanced project in here. Let me walk you through the additional things that are in here. So we have a traditional contract, node modules, which is going to be the same, scripts is going to be the same, tests is going to be the same, but this comes with a .env.example already packed in for us. It also comes with .eslint files, .eslintrc.js and .eslintignore. ESLint is known as a JavaScript linter, which helps you find and automatically fix problems in your code. For the JavaScript that I work with, I'm not a big fan of ESLint, so I typically don't use it. So I'm going to go ahead and delete the two of these. If you want to keep them in, you absolutely can. .gitignore, we're going to finally understand what this file does in this lesson. .npm ignore helps ignore files if you want to push your project up to be an npm package, which we're not going to do. So if you want to delete this, you can as well. 
Prettier Ignore and Prettier RC. We already know what these do. Soul Hint and Soul Hint Ignore, which we're going to talk about in a minute, or Hard Head Config, which just comes already with a Robston network, a gas reporter, and Etherscan, package.json with all the additional packages. The README is a little bit more robust. And then, of course, our yarn.lock. So this advanced project looks pretty similar to what we're going to be working with anyways. Now, I do want to talk about this Soul Hint, though. So what is Soul Hint? Soul Hint is known as a Solidity Linter that we can use to lint our code. Linting is the process of running a program that will analyze code for potential errors. It also does a little bit of formatting oftentimes. ESLint is a way to lint for JavaScript code. Soul Hint is a way to lint for Solidity code. We use Prettier to format our code, and we can use Soul Hint to lint our code. They are often used a little bit interchangeably, even though that's not exactly correct, as they are a little bit different. We can run this linter on our code by running yarn, soul hint, and then type the name of the files that we want to lint. We do contracts, slash, and then you can just do star.soul. If everything looks okay, nothing will happen. But let's say we have a variable that we don't explicitly say the visibility of it is. This isn't the best practice because ideally we always say exactly what the visibility of some variable is. This obviously gets defaulted, but it's usually better to be more explicit. So now if we run yarn, soul hint, contracts, star.soul, it'll give us a warning saying we should explicitly mark visibility of state. This linter is a good way to check for some best practices for running our code. So we're definitely going to keep soul hint around. Now that we've got a repo here, let's add a couple of our common setup pieces here. So in prettier.rc, we're going to swap this out with what we've been using so far. Tab with a four, use tab is false, semi false, single quote also false. We're going to update our prettier.ignore for node modules, package.json, image, artifacts, cache, coverage.env.star, readme, and coverage, and anything else you want to add in here. And we're going to scroll up to our contracts folder. And we're going to swap this greeter.soul out with our fundme.soul. Now let's go ahead and add our contracts in here. If you're following along with the repo, if you go to the contracts folder, there's actually another folder in here and the contracts look a little bit different. So if you have those contracts still from Remix, let's actually grab them from Remix because we're going to make a couple of changes to them. If you don't have Remix up anymore, which you probably shouldn't because you should be taking breaks, you can jump back over to lesson four, Remix fundme jump into the repo here and grab the contracts from inside here. Just go to the fundme freecodecamp tutorial and grab the code from there. So we're going to grab just fundme and priceconverter.soul. So go ahead and delete that old file, create a new one. We're going to call it fundme.soul. Paste that in there. And then we're going to create the price converter.soul. Now we have both our fundme and our price converter contracts in here. Now, one of the first things that we want to do, one of the first things that we did last time was we ran yarn compile to make sure that our code is actually working the way we want it to. And before we actually hit compile, one of the things that we're going to need to do is come to our hardhat.config. We're going to make sure we're on the correct Solidity version. So we're going to do 0.8.8 .8 here. And let's go ahead and try to compile. So we can run yarn hardhat compile. And you'll see we actually get an error here library at chainlink slash contracts imported from contracts slash fundme.soul is not installed. Try installing it using NPM. In Remix, we went ahead and just imported at chainlink slash contracts right from our NPM and or GitHub. But in our local code, we have to tell Hardhat specifically where to get this from. We want to download this specifically from the NPM package manager at chainlink slash contracts. We can download it simply by running yarn add dash dash dev at chainlink slash contracts. Now that we've downloaded it into our file, we'll be able to see it in node modules here. Hardhat is now smart enough to know that at chainlink slash contracts is going to point to that node module that we have. So we can now run yarn hardhat compile. Boom. Now we can see compiled three solidity files successfully. So now that we have our contracts in here and our code is compiling successfully, we're probably going to want to deploy our code. Now in our last section, I know we used the scripts module and we made our own manual deploy script. 
However, something that you notice the more that you work with just raw ethers or even just hardhat is that keeping track of all of our deployments can get a little bit tricky. If you just use a deploy script, it's not saving our deployments to any file. Additionally, having everything in a deploy script for deploying can make the tests and the deploy scripts maybe not work exactly hand in hand. And there are a couple of other things that might be a little bit tricky to work on. We're actually gonna work with a package that makes everything I just mentioned and a couple other things way easier. And this package that I'm talking about is going to be the hardhat deploy package. There's a link to this package in the GitHub repository associated with this course. It's a hardhat plugin for replicable deployments and easy testing. And if we scroll down to installation, we can see we install it basically the normal way. They're using NPM and we're gonna go ahead and use yarn. So for us to add it, we'll do yarn add hardhat dash deploy. And then of course we're gonna do dash dash dev. Once it's done deploying, this require statement to our hardhat.config.js. Since once again, basically the config is our entry point, this is where we're going to get started. And we can go ahead and delete our deploy.js script. Now, if we run yarn hardhat, you'll see that we have a bunch of new tasks in here, with one of them being this deploy task. This deploy task is going to be the main task that we use to deploy our contracts. Instead of writing our deploy scripts in the scripts folder, we're actually going to create a new folder. We can create a new folder by just doing mkdir deploy, or you can always right click and hit new folder. This deploy folder is going to be where our hardhat deploy module looks to deploy code. And it's going to be where we are writing our scripts. To write our scripts, we usually need to add one more thing in here. Since we're going to be using ethers.js in all of our scripts, we want to add hardhat deploy ethers to our package here. Now, instead of just doing yarn add dash dash dev hardhat deploy ethers, we're going to do something a little bit weird. We're going to do yarn add or npm install dash dash dev, and we're going to install it like this. So let me just copy this and you can just copy that from the repo and we'll do yarn add dash dash dev and paste that in here. What we're doing is we're taking at Nomic Labs hardhat ethers, which we've used before, and we're overriding it with hardhat deploy ethers. Remember how in our last project, we used hardhat ethers so that hardhat could override ethers. To use hardhat deploy, we use hardhat deploy ethers so that hardhat deploy can override hardhat, which overrides ethers, which is kind of funny when you say it like that, but this will enable ethers to keep track of and remember all the different deployments that we actually make in our contract. So if we look on our package.json, and now we can see our Nomic Labs dash hardhat ethers. Now the version of it is gonna be npm hardhat deploy ethers. This is our package.json basically saying the hardhat ethers package is now overridden by the hardhat deploy ethers package, which is what we want. All right, great. So now that we have that set up, we can start writing our deploy scripts. The way that hardhat deploy works is all the scripts that get added to our deploy folder will get run when we run yarn hardhat deploy. So a good practice is usually to number them so that they run in the order that you want them to run in. So since we only have one contract that we want to deploy, the fundme contract, we're going to do 01 deploy fundme.js. And in this script, this is going to be where we define how to deploy the fundme contract. All right, so we're in our deploy fundme scripts. Now traditionally, what do we do? We did imports, we did the main function, and then we did calling of main function. But hardhat deploy is a little bit different. We're still going to import our libraries and packages, but we're not going to have main function and we're also not going to call the main function. When we run hardhat deploy, hardhat deploy is actually going to call a function that we specify in this script here. What we're going to do is we're going to create a function. We'll call it deploy func. We're going to export this deploy function as the default function for a hardhat deploy to look for. So we could say module.exports.default equals deploy func. To test it out, we can go ahead and do a console.log hi. And then in our terminal, run yarn hardhat deploy. Oops, get rid of the parentheses here. Sorry. Run it again. And we can see it went and it ran our deploy func here. Now, if this syntax is easier for you to understand, go ahead and use this syntax. And we're going to be passing the hardhat runtime environment as a parameter to this function. However, if we go to the hardhat deploy documentation and we scroll down to an example script, 
the syntax looks a little bit different. And let me just explain what's going on here and how we're going to be writing ours. So instead of kind of defining everything like this and defining the function name, similar to what we were doing before, we're actually going to be using a nameless asynchronous function. We're going to make it an anonymous function similar to what we've seen before. So instead, we're going to say async parameters like this. And we're going to pass our parameters, our hard hat runtime environment in here. And it's going to be an arrow function. And then we're going to wrap this whole thing in module.exports. So we're going to say module.exports equals this async function like this. This syntax here is nearly identical to what's up here. We just don't have a name for our async function. So this is how we're going to set it up instead. But if this syntax is a little bit confusing for you, feel free to use this above as the two of these are going to be the same. Now, the next thing that most of the documentation does is it pulls out the variables and functions out of the HRE that we're going to use. HRE is the hard hat runtime environment. Whenever we run a deploy script, hard hat deploy automatically calls this function and just passes the hard hat object into it. Similar to in back in hard hat simple storage in our deploy script, we had ethers run and network come from hard hat. Instead of coming from hard hat, we're coming from HRE, which is basically the same thing as hard hat. For our script, we're only going to use two variables from HRE. We're going to use const get named accounts and deployments. This syntax might look a little bit weird for you, but it's just a way to pull these exact variables out of HRE. Kind of the same thing as just doing HRE.get named accounts and HRE.deployments. But pulling them out like this means we don't have to add HRE at the beginning anymore. And then additionally, additionally, JavaScript has something called syntactic sugar. So instead of doing this on two lines like this, we can actually do that whole bit on one line. So instead, we just extrapolate those two variables right in the function declaration. So this line is the exact same thing as doing this line. This is an asynchronous nameless function using the arrow notation. We're working with our deploy scripts here. And we're default exporting it with module.exports. I know that was a lot. And I know there's kind of a lot of syntactic sugar here. But if that's really confusing for you, just feel free to use the above. And whenever we refer to get named accounts, you can also just do hre.get named accounts or hre.deployments. So hopefully that's clear that this top part is going to be the same as this bottom part right here, whichever one you feel more comfortable working with. But all right, now that we've gotten all that out of the way, let's continue with this script. So we're using this deployments object. We're using this deployments object to get two functions. Those two functions are going to be the deploy function and the log function. So we're going to say const deploy log equals deployments. So we're going to pull these two functions out of deployments. And then we're also going to do const deployer equals await get named accounts. So we are grabbing this new deploy function, this new log function, and we're grabbing this deployer account from this, this weird get named accounts function. What's this get named accounts function? This get named accounts is a way for us to get named accounts. When working with ethers, we saw when working with ethers, we can actually get our accounts based off of the number in the account section of each network. So for example, in this list of private keys, private key zero, private key one, private key two, it might get a little confusing to remember which one's which. So instead of working like that, we can add a section at the bottom called named accounts where we can name each one of those spots in the accounts array. So we'll do named accounts. And we'll say one of the accounts that we'll name is going to be named deployer. And we're going to say by default, the zero with account is going to be deployer. We can also specify which number is going to be the deployer account across different chains. For example, on rink B, we wanted the deployer account to be the first position, we could do something like this, or on hard hat, we could do it like this, we can create multiple users. Like for example, if we wanted to do a user for some test or something, and we can say the default is one or whatever we wanted in here. So back in our deploy fund me, we're going to say we're going to grab that deployer account from our named accounts. 
And then finally, we're going to grab our chain ID for reasons that will come clear pretty soon. So we'll do const chain ID equals network dot config dot chain ID. Now, how do we actually deploy this fund me contract? Well, let's think about this for a little bit. When working with Remix, it was pretty easy, right? We just deployed it to a testnet. Ah, that's kind of the issue there, isn't it? Deploying to a RinkB testnet is a little bit slow. We don't always want to have to deploy to one of these slow testnets or even a mainnet when tinkering and fiddling with our contracts, do we? No, that's going to be really bad. We really want to deploy to a testnet as a last stop after we've done all our testing locally. Or we can deploy to a testnet to see some very specific code work, like, for example, with the Chainlink documentation. So ideally, we deploy this to a local network first, but can we just do that? Well, if we look in our price converter.soul, we have this hard coded address in here, this 0x address. If we go to docs.chain.link, EVM chains, contract addresses for Ethereum data feeds, that address is the FUSD specifically for RinkB. What if we work on the hard hat network? For example, default network, hard hat. And then, like I said before, if you don't write this in, hard hat is automatically the default network. But if we're deploying to the hardhat network, the hardhat network is a blank blockchain and it gets destroyed every time our scripts finish. Or even if we're working with a local node, this price feed contract won't exist. It won't have the code there and won't be updated with data. So what do we do? How do we test and interact with our code locally? Is there a way we can do this? Well, one of the ways that we can do this that we'll learn a little bit later is actually forking a blockchain where you can keep stuff hard coded, but usually it's still better to figure out how to do everything with something called mocks. There's a great Stack Overflow question that just says, what is mocking? And mocking is primarily used for unit testing, which we'll talk about in a little bit. An object under test may have dependencies on other complex objects. To isolate the behavior of the object, you want to replace other objects by mocks that simulate the behavior of the real objects. In short, mocking is creating objects that simulate behavior of real objects. Now, this might seem like a lot of words, but basically what we want to do is we want to make a fake price feed contract that we can use and we can control when working locally. So back here, I'm just going to leave a note in here saying when going for local host or hard hat network, we want to use a mock. Okay, great. Well, we can use a mock and we'll learn how to make one of those in a little bit. Well, what happens when we want to change chains? For example, back in dots.chain.link, EVM chains, contract addresses, there are a ton of different blockchains that have price feeds on them. And on each one of these blockchains, the FUSD price feed is going to be a little bit different. For example, if we look at FUSD, the address of FUSD for Ethereum mainnet is different from the address of FUSD for Ringby, which makes sense. They're totally different contracts on different chains. They have very similar functionality and they do nearly the exact same thing, but they're still different. We're also going to need a way for us to modularize or parameterize this address in here so that no matter what chain we deploy to, we don't have to change any of our code. We can always have our code be exactly the same and we don't have to come in here and like flip values and flip variables and stuff. So let's keep that in, all of that in mind as we write the rest of this. Now, in order to parameterize this, we actually want to parameterize and do a little refactoring of our fundme.soul. Refactoring basically means going back and, and changing the way your code works. Right now, we have this constructor function, right? The constructor function is the function that automatically gets called whenever we deploy our contract. Right now, it's not doing a whole lot. Right now, it's just updating the owner variable to be whoever sent in the contract. But we can actually have it do much more than that. Since this constructor is a function just like every other function, we can actually have it take parameters. One of the parameters that we might like for it to have is going to be the address of a price feed. So let's go ahead and add this and figure out how to refactor all this code. So we're going to add constructor address price feed for the constructor in here. When we deploy our contract now, we're going to pass it the FUSD price feed address depending on what chain we're on. If we're on RinkB, we'll use this address. If we're on Polygon, we'll use a different one, BNB, different one, Gnosis, Heckle, Avalanche, et cetera. You get the picture. So we're going to modularize this like so. Now that our constructor takes a parameter for the price feed, we can actually save an aggregator v3 interface object as a global variable. In our price converter, we just create a price feed variable of type aggregator v3 interface, which again, we're importing from the Chainlink repo. 
which is an interface object, which gets compiled down to the ABI. And if you match an ABI with, up with an address, you get a contract that you can interact with. So we're going to do the same thing here. We're going to say aggregator v3 interface public price feed. We're actually going to call this price feed address so that these don't have the same name. And in our constructor, we're going to say price feed equals, and we're going to do the exact same thing we did with our price converter equals aggregator v3 interface of price feed address. Like so. Now we have this price feed address that's variable and modularized depending on whatever chain that we're on. Now what we can do is we can grab this price feed address and we can use it for our price converter. So where are we using our price converter? Well, just a quick reminder, we're using using price converter for UNIT 256. We're using this as a library on top of our UNIT 256 type. So we're calling message.value.getConversionRate. So we look in our price converter, we have this function getConversionRate, which takes an F amount as its initial parameter, which again, since this is a library, it automatically passes the message.value into this getConversionRate function. But we could also pass in this price feed and therefore, we wouldn't need to hard code it in the get price anymore. So let's go ahead and figure out how to do that. Well, what we can do is we can do message.value.getConversionRate. We'll stick price feed in here. And then we'll have to update our get conversion rate to do a comma so that it takes a second parameter. Because it, remember, again, the initial parameter is going to be message.value. And the second parameter is going to be what we define here. So we'll do f amount comma aggregator v3 interface and we'll call this price feed and now when we call our get price function we can pass the price feed to the get price function and up here we can have get price take you guessed it an aggregator v3 interface called price feed and now we no longer need to hard code in the price feed and we can just delete those lines and have it compile like this, which is awesome. So quick refresher, we're parameterizing that price feed address and passing it in with the constructor that gets saved as a global variable to an aggregator V3 interface type. We're passing it to a get conversion rate function, which passes it to the get price function, which then just calls latest round data. And we probably could have made this even easier. Probably could have just got rid of the get price function and stuck this code in the get conversion rate, but we'll leave it there for now. Now that we've done that refactoring, let's make sure it works. Yarn hardhat compile. Invalid value undefined for hardhat.config.networks. Oh, let's go to the let's go to the config real quick. That's because this default network needs to be outside of networks. It's my mistake. And let's try that again. I spelled interface wrong in the price converter. And a quick note, if it gives you an error like this, oftentimes you can command click or control click and open that file up right in the editor, which saves you some time from going to have to find the line and find the file. But yeah, let's spell that correctly and let's try this again. And awesome, it looks like it's compiling correctly and we just have some warnings. It looks like these warnings are just about this get version, which is because we're shadowing this, we're creating a new price feed variable down here, even though we just created a global price feed variable. Let's just go ahead and delete the get version function altogether since we're not even going to really need it. And we only use the get version to show you how to actually start working with interfaces. And then we'll compile one more time for good measure. Boom, compiled successfully. Awesome. So now we've just refactored our code so we can pass a price feed address depending on the network that we're on. Okay, great. With all that being said, let's come back to our deploy fund me script and let's learn how to actually deploy the rest of it. In order for us to deploy a contract, we remember from our last sections that we used the contract factories. With hardhat deploy, we can just use this deploy function. And to use the deploy function, we'll say const fund me, which is going to be the name of our contract, equals await, and we'll call this deploy function the name of the contract that we're deploying right now, and then a list of overrides that we want to add here. So we're going to say who is actually deploying this by saying from we're going to say it's from the deployer. We're going to pass any arguments to the constructor in this args piece here, which 
we just added a single arg. So these brackets, we're going to make it a list of arguments where we're going to put the price feed address in here, which we'll show you how to do in a second. Put price feed address. And then we're also going to do some custom logging here so that we don't have to do all that console.log stuff that we've been doing this whole time. Right, we, need, we need to put something in here. We need to put an address in here. And you can use this backslash star to put like a comment in between your code. We can't just do const address equals, you know, the address and stick it in here. Well, I mean, we could, but we're not really parameterizing now, right? We're kind of back to just hard coding it here. So what can we do instead? Well, what we can do is we can actually use the chain ID to do something like if chain ID is X, use address Y, or if chain ID is Z, use address A. So we can do something that looks like this. And to enable this functionality, we actually take a page out of the Aave GitHub. So Aave is another protocol that's on multiple chains and has to deploy their code to multiple chains and work with multiple different addresses. So what they do is they use a number of different useful tricks, but one of the main ones is using this helper hardhat config. Now they're using TypeScript, we're using JavaScript, but it's gonna be the same thing. With this config, they have different variables depending on what network that they're actually on. And depending on the network that they're on, they use different variables. So they use this network config almost to do exactly what we're trying to do here. So what we want to do is we're going to create a new file at the root directory. So just click down here, new file, and we're going to call it helper hardhat config.js. And this is where we're going to define that network config. And this is where we're going to say, hey, if you're on network A, use this address, network B, use this, use this address, et cetera. So we're going to create an object called const network config equals, and we're going to add a bunch of stuff in here. So our main network that we're working with right now is RinkB. RinkB has a chain ID of four. So we'll say chain ID four is going to be named RinkB and the FUSD price feed address is going to be the price feed address of rink B of the FUSD price feed. So we're going to copy it from the documentation or from the GitHub, whatever you want to do and paste it in here. Now we have a simple methodology of keeping track of different price feeds and different contract addresses across different chains. Let's say, for example, we wanted to deploy to Polygon as well. Well, first, what are we going to need? Well, we're going to need the chain ID of Polygon. So a quick little Google search brings us to the Polygon documentation and we can see the chain ID is 137. So I'll do 137, put some little brackets here. We'll say name Polygon, and then we'll do a comma, FUSD, price feed, and then we'll add the price feed of FUSD on Polygon. So docs.chain.link, Polygon or Matic, and then we'll look up FUSD and boom, we see it right here. We'd grab this address and we paste it in. Well, what about the hardhead network? We'll get to that in just a second. Don't you worry. And then at the bottom, we need to export this network config so our other scripts can actually work with it. So we'll do module.exports equals network config. And we're going to actually export a couple of things from this file, which is why we're doing it like this instead of that default way that I showed you before. So back in our script now, what can we do? Well, first, we want to go ahead and import that network config. So we'll say const network config equals require, and then we'll import it. We'll go down in directory to help our hardhead config and save. And I just want to mention this one more time, just so that it doesn't confuse anybody. This syntax here, const network config with the little curly brace that's around it, is the same as if I went const helper config equals this thing, which is helper config is now kind of this whole file and then const network config equals helper config dot network config. So again, this syntax is just kind of an easy way to extrapolate or pull out just the network config from this file. So that's how that works. And that's why we export it at the bottom so that we can do this please use the GitHub repository to ask questions and discussions, especially about some of this JavaScript stuff. All right, great. So now that we have this network config in here, we can now do this part of where we say, if chain ID is Z, use A, if chain ID is X, use Y. 
since our helper config is nicely in this kind of dictionary key value pair style, what we can do is we can say const fusd price feed address equals network config at the chain ID, because if we're on chain ID four, it'll be this object. If we're on chain ID polygon, it'll be this object at the FUSD price feed. We're going to save this to FUSD price feed address. And now no matter what chain we're on, whenever we run hardhead deploy, if I run yarn hardhead deploy dash dash network Rinkaby, this chain ID is going to be four. And so it's going to use this price feed address. If I do dash dash network polygon, and I remember to add both rink P and polygon to my network flag here, the chain ID is going to be 137 and it's going to use this price feed address. So this is awesome. This is exactly what we want. But is it everything that we want? Those of you who have been questioning while I have been coding and talking, you might be thinking, okay, well, you talked about this mocking thing. You talked about localhost and hardhat, and how do we test this locally? Like this is how we go to a test net and a main net, but what about a local network? And that is exactly what we're gonna talk about now. So we've modularized our code and parameterized our code so that we're gonna use the address based off of the chain that we're on. But what if we use a chain that doesn't even have a price feed address on it? What do we do there? This is where we actually create those mock contracts. The idea of mock contracts here is if the contract doesn't exist, we deploy a minimal version of it for our local testing, for our local testing. And deploying mocks is technically a deploy script. So what we do actually is back in our deploy folder is we're gonna create a new file and we're gonna call it 00 dash deploy mocks.js. We started with zero zero because this is almost like the pre-deploy stuff. We only do this sometimes. We don't always deploy mocks, right? We don't need to deploy mocks to rink B or Polygon or, or Ethereum mainnet because those already have these price feeds. We're actually gonna deploy our own mock price feed contracts. And in our deploy fund me script, we're gonna use our own contracts instead of already established contracts, if we're on a network that doesn't have any price feed contracts, like Hardhat or localhost, for example. So let's write our deploy mock script. So the setup of this is gonna look nearly identical to our deploy fund me. And again, if you want to set it up like this, you absolutely can. But I'm actually just gonna copy this, this part, paste it in here, because that initial part's gonna be exactly the same. Oh, and over here, I just realized that we're, we're calling this network thing without it being defined. JavaScript will kind of be smart enough to know where this network thing is coming from, but it can be a little bit confusing. So it's better to be really explicit and say const network equals require hard hat. This network thing is coming from hard hat. And we're going to grab this line and we're also going to use this at the top of our script here. And then our top section is going to look exactly the same as well. We're going to grab these three lines and paste them in. Deploy, deployer, chain ID. Boom. It's all going to be the same here because we're setting up to deploy some stuff. Now we want to deploy a new contract. But if we look at our contracts folder, this is all we have right now. So we're going to need to add this mock, this fake contract to our contracts folder. Now what we can do is in our contracts folder, we want to separate this file from the rest of our file so that we know, okay, this isn't part of our project, but it is part of our testing. So we're gonna right click, create new folder, and we can either call it mocks or test. I like to call mine test. And inside of this folder, we can go ahead and right click, create a new file, and we're gonna create a new file and call it mock v3 aggregator.sol. And this is where we're gonna define our mock price feed aggregator ourselves. So how can we create our own fake price feed contract so we can test everything locally? Well, one thing we could do is we go to the Chainlink GitHub repo and go through the contracts and find one of these price feed addresses. Source, V8, or maybe we'll go back to source. We'll maybe we'll check in V6. Looks like we could find some stuff and, and look around and we could probably copy paste all of this code, but that really seems like kind of a huge pain in the butt to have to copy all this code. Now we absolutely could, we could copy paste the code in here, but we're gonna do something a little bit more clever. So the Chainlink repo actually comes with some mocks. If we go to contracts, SRC, V0.6, tests, 
they actually have a mock v3 aggregator dot soul in here that we can use as our mock. So we could copy paste everything, but we'd have to revamp a little bit of it because it's doing some dot dot stuff. It's talking to other contracts that are locally in this file structure that are not going to be in our file structure. So instead, though, what we can do is we can use this node modules package to our advantage. We can just say pragma solidity caret 0.6.0. We'll use the same version that that package is doing and then just do import at chain link slash contracts slash SRC slash V0.6 slash tests slash mock V3 aggregator dot soul. And then we'll add, and then of course we'll add SPDX license identifier, MIT. And boom, this is actually all we need. If we just import the code like this, remember, this is exactly the same as copy pasting this contract into our project, of course, with this path resolved to where it actually is in our node modules. Now, actually, I can run yarn hardhat compile, and it'll also compile this contract, except for, of course, we have an issue. Hey, uh, compiler versions don't match, right? What's uh, what's up with that? Now you're going to get into situations where you will be working with contracts that are not the same version of Solidity as you. Why? Well, because contracts keep being deployed all the time, and there are a ton of contracts that are on version 0 0.4 of Solidity, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 7, 8, and probably 9, 10, or 15 billion, or however many Solidity versions will come to be. So in our config, in our hardhat.config, we can scroll to the bottom, we can scroll to where we're defining our Solidity version, and we can actually add multiple Solidity versions so that our compiler can compile multiple versions of Solidity. To do that, we'll say Solidity, and we'll turn it into an object here. And we'll make sure to put this comma here. And inside our Solidity object, we'll put compilers, and we'll have a list of compilers. Our first one, we'll say is version 0.8.8. .8. And we'll say our second one is going to be version 0.6.6. And then we'll go ahead and save that. And it looks like mine wanted to format it like this, which is fine. Now we can go ahead, rerun Yarn Hardhead Compile, and boom, compiled five Solidity files successfully. This means that our mock V aggregator should also have been compiled. And if we look in artifacts at Chainlink, we do indeed see this at Chainlink slash contract slash SRC bit. And in v0.6 in tests, we see this mock aggregator.soul, which has been compiled. Awesome. So now that we have our mock contract compiled, we now have a contract that we can use to deploy a fake price feed to a blockchain. So how do we actually do this? Well, it's going to be the exact same way that we deployed the fund me contract, but we're going to add a little if statement in here. We don't want to deploy this mock contract to a test net or a network that actually has a price feed on it. We could just do something like if chain ID does not equal, you know, some chain ID, then deploy mocks, right? And then this is kind of pseudocode. Obviously, this code won't actually work. But instead, what I like is I actually like to specify which chains are going to be my development chains, which chains are going to be the one that I can deploy these mocks to. In my helper hard hit config, I'll define these chains. So I'll say const development chains equals, and then I'll just say hardhat and localhost. I'll export these. And back in my deploy mocks, I'll import these with const development chains equals require dot dot slash helper hardhat config. And now I'll say if development chains dot includes chain ID, this includes keyword basically is a function that checks to see if some variable is inside an array, then we're going to go ahead and deploy mocks, and which is what we want to do. So we'll do log, which we're getting from deployments, which is basically console.log, and we'll say local network detected deploying mocks. And we'll do await deploy, and we'll deploy our new mock v3 aggregator mock v3 aggregator, we'll do a comma, there are little colons here. If we want to get really specific, we can say contract mock v3 aggregator, which we're kind of already saying, we'll say from deployer. 
we'll say logging is going to be true. And then we need to pass some arguments. We need to pass the constructor parameters for the mock v3 aggregator, which are what? Well, let's go to docs.chain to link to find out. Or you can also just go to node modules, chain link, src, v06, tests, and then all the way down to mock v3 aggregator.sol, where you could also find the constructor in here, whatever one you like better. Sometimes I find it easier just to read GitHub. Control plus F or command plus F for constructor. We see, ah, it takes a decimals and a, an initial answer. And if we read through the code, we'll learn that the decimals object is going to be equivalent to the decimals parameter is going to be equivalent to this decimals function and the initial answer. And the initial answer is basically just going to be what is the price feed starting at? We actually get to pick the price of the price feed, which works out really well because that works out great for testing. I usually like to define the decimals and the initial answers somewhere outside of this function so that I can access it later. One good place you can add it is once again in our helper hardhead config.js. So I might do const decimals equals eight and then const initial answer answer equals and we'll do 2000. So since we have eight decimals, we'll do 2000 and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight decimal places. And then we'll export these as well. So we'll export decimals and export initial answer. We could, of course, just do, you know, const decimals equals eight at the top and then initial answer and then use them down here. But I like to do it like that. So const. So now we have to import them in here. Const development chains. Let's also grab decimals. Let's also grab initial answer. We'll save it. We'll take a look back at the constructor. It looks like it's decimals first, initial answer second. So in our arguments, we'll do decimals first, initial answer second, and ta-da, and then we will be all done. Then we'll do a quick log, box deployed. And then I also like to do kind of like a big line at the end of all of my deploy scripts, just to be like, hey, that's the end of this deploy script. Anything else after this is gonna be a different deploy script. All right, great. Now, our deploy mocks script is actually done, but our deploy fund me script isn't quite done. Is there a way that we could run only our deploy mock script? Well, yes, there is. Great, thanks for asking. What we can do at the bottom of our deploy mock script is we can add module.exports.tags equals, and we'll say all and mocks. Now what we can do is if we run yarn hard hat deploy, we can add this flag dash dash tags, and it'll only run the deploy scripts that have a special tag. So we'll run our mox tag, which means it'll only run our deploy mox script. And, uh, and whoops, actually, in our helper config, development chains is actually hardhead and localhost. And I said, we're going to try to do it with a chain ID. Sorry, we're going to do it like this. We're going to do development chains dot includes network dot name. Because our, our helper config is using names and not chain IDs. So if development chains that includes the network of names, then we're going to go ahead and deploy the mocks. So let's go ahead and run this yarn hard hat deploy dash dash tags mocks. And perfect, we do indeed see our mocks getting deployed here. This log true means that it's going to spit out stuff like this. It'll say the contract it's deploying, it'll say the transaction it's doing, and it'll say where it was deployed with how much gas. And awesome, this means our deploy mock script is working perfectly. So now we have our deploy mock script working perfectly. So how do we apply that back to our deploy fund me script? Well, we're going to do the exact same thing here. Instead of making FUSD price feed address a constant variable, we're going to say let FUSD price feed variable so that we can actually update it. And we'll say if development chains dot includes network dot name, what we can do with hardhead deploy is we can just get the most recent deployment using a command called literally get. So we'll say const fusd aggregator equals await deployments dot get and then the name of the contract that we deployed mock v3 aggregator. And if you wanted to just do get instead of deployments dot get, we absolutely could just by doing it like this. Those are exactly the same. So we'll get the address like this, and then we'll say fusd price feed address 
equals the, that FUSD aggregator contract dot address. And then if we're not on a development chain, if we didn't deploy a mock, we're just gonna do exactly what we did before with using the network config. Whew. Oh my goodness. Now, now that we've done all of these steps, let's add a little log thing at the bottom here with just a bunch of hyphens. Now, we should have a very robust script to flip between a local development chain, a testnet chain, a mainnet chain, and allow us to deploy literally everywhere without changing any of our solidity. And then we just take this, this FUSD price feed address and stick it into the logs here. And then at the bottom, we can do module.exports.tags equals, and then we'll just do all, and then we'll call this one fund me. Oh, now moment of truth. If we did all this right, we should just be able to run yarn hard hat deploy and it should work on our local chain, our hard hat chain. And then it should also work on any test net that we give it. So let's give this a try. Yarn hard hat deploy. Let's see if this works. Awesome. And we got this all to deploy locally to our hard hat network. We can see that we went ahead and we deployed mocks. We did our little underline here. And then we deployed FundMe, deployed at this address with this much gas. Now, one of the other awesome things about Hardhat Deploy, when we run our local blockchain, our own blockchain node, Hardhat Deploy will automatically run through all of our deploy scripts and add them to our node. So now if I run yarn Hardhat node, we're gonna spin up a new blockchain node, but it's already gonna have all of our deployed contracts on it. So every time we spin up a local node now, it's gonna come automatically packed with the contracts that we want on it. So we are gonna show us doing this on a testnet on Rinkby, but before we actually test it on Rinkby, I'm gonna add a little bit of the auto verification piece in here as well, because we did that in the last lesson and we wanted to show how to do it in Hardhead Deploy as well. So right after we deploy our FundMe, we can do something similar here. We'll say, if developer chains includes network.name, we'll say if developer chains doesn't include network.name because we don't want to verify on a local network. So we'll say if not development chains dot includes network.name, the exclamation mark, AKA the bang means not when we're talking about Booleans. So we're saying if the name of the network isn't a development chain, we want to go ahead and verify. And same as last time, and if process.env dot ether scan API key, then we're gonna go ahead and verify. Now before we had our verify code right in our deploy code, we're gonna do something a little bit different here. Instead of having our verify code in our deploy scripts here, we're actually gonna create a new folder called utils, which stands for utilities. And this is where we're gonna add different scripts that we can use across different deployments. Because let's say we have 50 deploy scripts, we're not gonna make 50 deploy functions. We're just gonna add them to our utils folder. And in our utils folder, we're gonna create a new file called verify.js. We're gonna add that code from our last project in here. So if you want, you can go ahead, copy paste from our last project over to this one. Or you can pause the video to type it out yourself. Since we're using the run command here, we're gonna do const run equals require hardhat. And then at the bottom, we're going to do module.exports exports equals verify. And now that we have a verify script in our utils folder, back in our deploy fund me, we're going to say const verify equals require dot dot slash utils slash verify. And since now in our verify.js, we have a lot of this try catch stuff in here. We can just do await verify and a verify once again takes a contract address and a list of arguments. We'll say await verify fund me dot address and then the list of arguments. To make the list of arguments easier to put in, you can go const args equals and then we'll just stick our FUSD price feed in here and then replace this with args and then take this args and pop it on down into the second parameter here. All right, great. 
Now let's go ahead and deploy this to the Rinkby testnet. And what do we need to deploy this to the Rinkby testnet? Well, let's jump into our hardhat config first and let's clean this up. We don't really need this accounts task, so I'm just gonna delete it. We don't really need this comment, so I'm gonna delete this too. And let's jump into the network section. We're not gonna be working with Robston, so we're gonna go ahead and dump that. We are, however, gonna be working with Rinkb. The URL is gonna be that same Rinkb RPC URL. So we're gonna define that up here like we did before. And if you wanna copy paste from your last project, feel free to do so. You can also follow along with me or fast forward me. The accounts is gonna be the same. I'm gonna go ahead and just copy paste the gas reporter with what we had from before. So we're gonna add this const coin market cap API key equals process dot EMB dot coin market cap API key. Do the same thing with the Etherscan API key. Let's just add everything in here now. We have our Etherscan section in here already. We're gonna have our gas reporter be false because I don't really feel like using it right now. And then finally, we're gonna add one more thing in here. Remember how in our last project, before we actually verified, we waited some block confirmations. That way Etherscan could make sure to catch up. Well, we can do the exact same thing in here. In our hardhat.config, we can add a section for each testnet for how many blocks we wanna wait. I'm gonna add block confirmations of six. Now, back in our deploy fund me, in a new section, I can add wait confirmations of network.config.block confirmations or one. This or one means if no block confirmations is given in our hardhat.config, we'll just wait for one block. And again, the reason we want to wait for approximately six block confirmations is we want to give Etherscan a chance to index our transaction. And I added chain ID 42 when it should be four, my mistake. And of course, we're going to need our .env file where we add all of our stuff from the last session. The ring PRPC URL, private key, Etherscan API, and then CoinMarketCap API. All right, moment of truth. Let's try this out. If we run yarn, hardhat deploy, dash dash network ring be, it should not deploy any mocks because we have this if statement in our mock deployment, but it should deploy our fund me contract using the correct price feed address. And then it'll go ahead and verify it since we're waiting for six block confirmations. We could even be super secure by adding dash dash tags and just running the fund me tag. But we're just gonna do yarn hard at deploy network rink bean. And let's see what happens. All right, and we're deploying FundMe. And we can see the transaction that we have for FundMe. This is that logging feature. We have log is true for deploying FundMe. So it gives us the transaction once it has a transaction, and it'll give us the address once we have the address. So we're gonna wait six block confirmations for this transaction to finish going through. Now we see we've deployed to this contract address with X amount of gas, and now we're running the verification process. While the verification process is running, we can pull up Rink B Etherscan, paste our address in here, and see that we have indeed created this contract. And now it looks like we've successfully verified the contract on Etherscan. So if we hit refresh, we can indeed see that the contract has been verified. Awesome. All right, so this is fantastic. Our deploy script is looking great. We're able to deploy to a local chain. We're able to deploy to a testnet. And if we wanted to, we could deploy to any network that we wanted simply by updating our hardhead config and then updating our helper config. This is fantastic. Great work so far. Now we're about to jump in and level up our tests, but before we do that, we're gonna clean up our FundMe contract a little bit to make it look a little bit more professional. And I'm gonna talk about some of the syntax and some of the reasons why some conventions exist. We're not gonna do this full force on all of the projects moving forward, but they are good to know and they are good to keep in mind when moving forward and working with our contracts. While we go through this, we're gonna learn why some of these conventions exist, including learning a little bit of low level solidity. So don't skip this part. When we get to later sections, 
we're going to be a little bit looser and not be as strict with the code style guides. But that's basically what we're going to go over now. And for now, you might see this event funded thing here. Please just ignore that for now. In an earlier take, I had introduced the events much earlier. And now we're actually going to learn about events a little bit later in the course. So please ignore that event funded for now. So let's go ahead and tweak a little bit of our contracts here. Now, when I'm talking about tweaking this to make it look professional, a little bit more professional, I'm talking about the Solidity Style Guide. There are some conventions for naming and ordering that we can follow to make our code look a little bit better. Now, like I said, this is going to be a little bit more optional because it can be a little bit verbose and it doesn't really make that big of a difference, but it can increase readability of your contracts by a lot and make your code look a lot nicer. So if you want, you can go through this style guide to learn more about what kind of makes Solidity look nice and what makes it not look nice, but we'll add some of these style guides in here. We're not gonna follow the style guide exactly to a T, but we are gonna make some best efforts to make our code follow the style guide. We've got a link to the style guide in the GitHub repository for this section. We can read some more about the layout, but the main thing we wanna look at is this order of the layout. We wanna start with our imports, with our pragma statement, our imports, interfaces, libraries, and then contracts. And then inside each contract, type decorations, state variables, events, modifiers, and functions. So let's go back here and make sure that we're up to speed. We want our pragma first. All right, awesome, we did exactly that. Then we want our imports. Okay, awesome, we have those two. Something that's not in the style guide is gonna be error codes, which we generally want next. So next is gonna be error codes. Now this is where we're gonna bump into one of our, our first updates here. As of recent, it's sort of becoming a best practice to add the name of your contract, some underscores, and then the name of your error whenever you're running into an error. This makes it a lot easier to understand which contract is throwing the error. So for this, we're going to say error fund me two underscores, not owner. Then we're going to scroll down to the R revert and set it like this. This way, when if we ever run into this error, we know that the error is coming from the fund me contract not from the aggregator v3 interface or the price converter or some other contract. So that's how we want to write our error codes here. If we had any interfaces or libraries not imported, we would add them here. But then finally, we add our contracts. In this file, we only have one contract here. It's our FundMe contract. Awesome. Now, the next thing we want to learn about as far as style guides go is this thing called NAT spec. NAT spec stands for Ethereum Natural Language Specification Format. And it's basically a way of documenting our code inspired by Doxygen. It uses Doxygen style comments and tags to help document our code. You can click the link here in the Solidity documentation to learn more about Doxygen. If we scroll down in the documentation here, we can see an example of using NatSpec. Whenever we have a contract or a function that needs documentation, we can add some syntax that looks like this to it. So for example, if we wanted to add this to our code, we could add a comment explaining this FundMe contract. To start a piece of NAT spec, you can do three backslashes or one backslash, two stars, and then another ending star here. Everything you put inside of this comment section basically gets turned into a comment. For the start of our contract, we'll do the at sign title to explain basically what this contract is. This FundMe contract is gonna be a contract for crowdfunding. We'll add another star and we can add the author of it, which is gonna be your name. I'm gonna put Patrick Collins, of course. Then we'll add a notice, which is just kind of a note to people. We can say this contract is, is to demo a sample funding contract. And we can also add at dev, which is a note specifically to developers. And we can say this implements price feeds as our library. The reason that we wanna add these tags here it's actually because we can use the NAT spec to automatically create documentation for us. If we download Sulk, we can actually run Sulk dash dash user doc dash dash dev doc and the, and the name of our file to automatically generate documentation. So this is also really helpful for automatically creating documentation for other developers who interact with your protocol later on. You can use this NAT spec for as many or as few functions as you like. Most of us probably aren't going to be making documentation. So, we really just want to follow this guidelines if we think some function or some section of our code is a little bit tricky for other developers. Now that we're inside a contract, we can follow the order of our contract. We're first going to start with type declarations, 
which we don't really have any, except for the fact that we're using our price converter for the UN256 type. Okay, great. Next, after our type declarations, we're gonna do state variables. And in this state variables section, this is where we're actually going to change the name of some of our state variables. So we'll do a little comment here, state variables. Now in the Solidity style guide, kind of adhere to the naming styles. We use upper and lowercase, we use total caps with underscores here. However, these naming variables are gonna change in the future in this section. And if you're following along with the GitHub repo associated with this course, these are gonna be actually a little bit different than what you see. However, for now, we're gonna leave them as they are because the reason why we're gonna change them isn't gonna be quite clear yet. Don't worry. So these names are gonna change soon, but not yet. All right, after state variables comes events and modifiers. We don't have any events, but we do have a modifier. So we'll copy this and actually we'll delete this comment here. Close that up and we'll paste our modifier here. Oh, and it looks like it looks like we're not auto formatting here. So we're going to uncomment immutable actually so that it automatically auto formats. Okay, great. We're auto formatting now. And cool. All right. So now we have our modifiers next, which we have right here. And then we have all of our functions. Great. We actually want to group our functions in this order that I just printed here. So we want the constructor, which we have receive and fallback. Oh, we do have fallback and receive. So we're going to actually copy those. We're going to delete this comment. We're going to stick those right underneath here. Looks like receive goes first. So we'll put that here. Then external functions, then public, internal, private. So we have public, public, and that's it. And then we can delete this part down here. Okay, cool. And if we want, we can do that syntax up here for the NAT spec for our functions. For example, for fund, maybe we could even just copy paste. We would remove title. We would remove author and we just say add notice this function funds this contract and we could even leave a little dev thing here to talk about it now if we have parameters you can do at param and say like what the parameter is and then if we have returns we can say returns or returns and then what it returns for the documentation since this doesn't have any parameters in here and doesn't return anything we can just leave it like this. And great, we've just revamped our contract here to make it a little bit more nicely formatted. Great job. Now, like I said, we actually are gonna change the names of our state variables, and we're gonna add some functions in here in a little bit. So if you're following with the GitHub repo, the state of the contract right now is gonna look a little bit different, but it'll make sense why I change this up in a little bit. All right, so now that we've cleaned this up, we've got our deploy mocks, deploy fund me, let's go ahead and start writing some tests. And after we write these tests, we're actually gonna run that gas estimator. And using that gas estimator, we're gonna go back and we're gonna update this contract one more time to make this even cheaper to use and work with. And remember, that's gonna be one of the advantages of writing these tests, is how we can optimize our contracts to be even faster, more gas efficient, et cetera. We wanna make sure that we write really good tests. And this is gonna be one of our first jumps into these more professional test setups. So we're gonna jump into our test folder we're gonna delete this sample test.js. In our last section, we went over a really minimalistic test, which is great. However, when we get bigger and bigger projects, we're gonna to wanna to start testing more and more different things. We're gonna get more and more into at least two different types of testing. So if we CD into our test folder, we're gonna make one directory called staging, and then we're gonna make another directory called unit. And now if you look in our test folder, we now have a staging folder and a unit test folder. Now we're gonna talk about two different types of tests. The first one is gonna be something called a unit test. Now, what is a unit test? Unit testing is a software testing method by which individual units of source code are tested. Basically what we wanna do is in our contracts, we wanna test minimal portions of our code to make sure that they work correctly. Then once our small pieces of the test work, we wanna do a staging test or maybe an integration test. This might be where we run our code on a test net or some actual network. You can think of a staging test as kind of the last stop before you deploy to a mainnet. They're not always 100% necessary, but they can be really, really helpful. Remember, we do want to be conscientious of how much we use our test nets, but we absolutely 100% want to make sure that everything works locally and that we unit test and we run all of our code locally. Then we can use a staging test on an actual test net to make sure 
that our code will work with actual other contracts. Now, unit tests can be done with a local hardhat network or a forked hardhat network. We'll talk about this forked hardhat network very soon. But right now, let's build these unit tests. These unit tests are going to be basically what we saw in our last section. So let's go in and let's jump in and write some of these unit tests. So let's create a new test. We'll call it fundme.test.js. And we'll start making our test in here. Now, we did test previously in our last section, but our tests here are going to look a little bit differently. We're actually going to use hardhat deploy to automatically set up our tests as if both of these deploy functions had been run. So let's go ahead and get this started. So we're still going to do that same setup, though. We're going to do describe. We're going to say fund me. And this is going to have the, that async function like so. And in here, we're going to have a before each. And we're going to have some its and some describes and everything. Now, since we want to unit test this, we're going to go a little bit heavier on the tests here than with our last project. But in the future, we'll go a little bit lighter with some of the tests. So let's get started. If we run yarn hardhat test right now, we're going, get, we're going to get zero passing. Now, if we run yarn hardhat coverage, we're going to get something that looks like this saying, hey, uh, you're missing a lot of stuff. So let's try to cover some more lines with our tests. And one way we can do that is actually we can group our tests based off of different functions. So let's have our first set of tests be around our constructor. To do that, inside of our first describe, we can add another describe and have this describe be just the constructor. This larger scope will be for the entire FundMe contract and everything inside this one will just be for the constructor. So this will also be an async function. And these tests will be just for the constructor. But before we even work on this describe, we probably want to deploy our FundMe contract. So let's learn how to do that. So we'll do it before each, which will be an async function. And we're going to deploy our FundMe contract using hardhat deploy. Since we use hardhat deploy, our fundme contract will come even with our mocks and everything. So above the before each, let's do let fundme. And in here, we're going to deploy fundme. The way we're going to deploy our fundme contract is first by pulling in our deployments object from hardhat deploy. So we'll do const deployments equals require hardhat. And this deployments object has has a function called fixture. What fixture does is it allows us to basically run our entire deploy folder with as many tags as we want. You'll notice I added this all tag in both of our scripts. This means that in this deployments.fixtures, excuse me, await deployment.fixtures, if I run await deployments.fixture, I'll run through our deploy script on our local network and deploy all of the contracts so that we can use them in our scripts and in our testing. And we can deploy everything in that deploy folder with just this one line. Isn't that helpful? Now, once all of our contracts have been deployed, we can start getting them. We'll say fund me equals await ethers, and we'll pull in ethers from hardhat as well. Dot, and this is where hardhat deploy is helpful again. Hardhat deploy wraps ethers with a function called get contract. This get contract function is going to get the most recent deployment of whatever contract we tell it. So we'll say get contract of fund me. So this will give us the most recently deployed fund me contract in just this one line. And now fund me will be equal to this line here. Now we're going to make a bunch of transactions on our fund me to test it. Of course, we can also tell ethers which account we want connected to fund me. So I can say const deployer equals equals away get named accounts exactly like we did in our deploy script. And then we just need to import it from hardhat. In our deploy scripts, we imported get named accounts inside of our input parameters for our deploy function. Remember, get named accounts and deployments was abstracted from, if we look up here, from the hardhat runtime environment. And like I said, the hardhat runtime environment is basically the same thing as hardhat. So we can just go ahead and import it like this, actually like this because we actually need to abstract just the deployer from get named accounts. And now what we can do is we can connect our deployer to our fund me account. So whenever we call a function with fund me, 
it'll automatically be from that deployer account, which is great. Another way you can get different accounts directly from your hardhead config is you could say const accounts equals await ethers.get signers. Ethers.get signers is going to return whatever is in this account section of your network. If you're on your default network hardhat, it's going to give you a list of 10 fake accounts that we can work with. You then, of course, can do something like const account one equals accounts. More correctly would be account zero equals account zero and work like that. And we'll leave that commented out just in case you need a reference to it in the future. OK, great. So now we have our fund me contract. Let's go ahead and write some tests for testing the constructor. And we're probably going to want to use this deployer object down here. So we'll do let deployer above. And we'll do something a little finicky here, but we'll say deployer equals await get named accounts dot deployer. And we'll just wrap this up so that we can just grab this deployer object and assign it to deployer like so. Now in here, we'll create our first test. We'll say it, we'll say it sets the aggregator addresses correctly. Comma, we'll have this be an async function. And we'll say const response equals await fund me dot well let's get this price feed here fund me dot price feed and then we'll want to make sure this price feed is going to be the same as our mock v3 aggregator since we're going to be running these tests locally so we should get our mock 3 v3 aggregator up top let's do let mock v3 aggregator and we'll grab this address the same way mock v3 aggregator equals await ethers.get contract mock v3 aggregator comma we'll connect this one to the deployer as well so we'll want to say cert dot equals cert dot equal response comma mock v3 aggregator dot address and of course we'll want to say const cert equals require chai i want to import that from chai okay Cool. Now let's go ahead and try this out. Yarn hard hat test. Whoops, I spelled response wrong. Let's try that again. Awesome. So this means that we are indeed assigning the price feed address correctly to the mock v3 aggregator. Okay, great. Awesome. I think for now, that's all we really want to do for our constructor. Now these two are kind of a nice to have. I showed them more just to kind of demo what they look like. We're going to skip writing tests for them for now. And we're actually going to go ahead and delete them directly from the contract. If you want to go ahead, write some tests for them and leave them in your examples for your learnings, you absolutely can pause the video and write some tests for it if you choose so. But we're going to skip them. Next, though, we are going to move on to fund and writing some tests for fund here. So let's go ahead and write describe fund. This will be an async function. And in here, we're going to do a number of tests. So if we're going to go line by line here, what's the first thing that we should look at? Well, we should look at this require line. We should write a test to see if this contract actually does fail if not enough ETH is sent. So let's go ahead and we'll say it fails if you don't send enough ETH. Will this be an async function? Now, how do we test to see if something fails? Right now we've done assert equals, but if something fails, we might run into an issue. So for example, if I run await fund me dot fund, but I don't pass any value to this transaction, let's see what happens. If I run yarn hardhead test, well, our test is actually gonna break. VM exception while processing transaction. Reverted with reason string, you need to spend more ETH. So our tests are gonna break, which is good. We want this to break but we want to tell our test that this is okay, right? We want to tell that this is okay. So the way we can do this, and this is where our waffle testing comes into play. With waffle and with testing, what we can actually do is we can use the expect keyword and expect transactions to be reverted and for transactions to fail. So instead of using assert here, we're actually going to run await expect fundme.fun to dot two dot b dot reverted and we can actually even be more specific here by saying to be reverted with and then the exact reverted error you need to spend more eth now if we run our tests 
oops, expect is not defined. So we need to import that from chai, which chai is being overwritten by waffle. We see that it does indeed pass, which is perfect. So now we have a way to both assert things and expect things to fail. Awesome. Even with the specific failure codes. Perfect. Let's write some more tests here. Well, we probably want it to correctly update this data structure. So we could say it updates the amount funded data structure. It's going to be an async function. And in here, we're going to need to call fund me dot fund. However, we're going to need to actually pass some value with this transaction. And for now, we'll just hard code the value that we're going to send. We'll say const send value is going to be 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, which is going to be 1 ETH. Another way we can write this, though, is we can use the ethers utility to make this a little bit easier to read because all those zeros are kind of confusing and it's hard to tell at first glance what this actually is. So we can actually use ethers dot utils dot parse ether one. This parse ethers utility converts this one into that one with 18 zeros, which makes life a lot easier. If you go to the ethers documentation, there's also a parts units function where you can actually convert any unit, either ethers or GUI or really whatever you want to do, you can convert any number to any other Ethereum-y type. So this is the send value that we're gonna use for our fund. And, and this is definitely gonna be more than our minimum USD of 50. So after we call this fund function, we'll say const response is gonna be equal to await fund me dot address to amount funded, address to amount funded for the deployer dot address. Because remember, this is a mapping of each address and how much they've actually funded. So if we use the deployer address, it should give us the amount that we actually sent. So now we can run assert dot equal response dot to string, right? Because this response is going to be the big number version of how much has been funded by that account. And that should be the same as our send value dot to string. Since send value, our one should be the exact same as the amount that we funded. So we can run just this one test by running yarn, hard hat, test, dash, dash, grep. And we'll put this in quotes, amount funded for this amount funded line. And it looks like we ran into an, an issue here. Ah, it's because we don't need to do deployer that address. We can just do deployer here. And great, it looks like we are indeed passing. Now, if we even run yarn hardhead coverage, we'll now see we've got at least a little bit more coverage here. It's still not gonna be great, but we have much better coverage. We have some statements, some branches, and, and at least some functions covered. So this is awesome. Let's keep going. Are we all done testing our fun function? Well, probably not. What else can we do with our fun function? Well, we're also adding funders to a funders array. So let's go ahead and test for that. We'll say it adds funder to array of funders. It's be an async function. And we'll say await fundme.fund. Value is going to be send value. We'll say const response equals await fundme dot calling the funders array at index zero. So this will be funder equals await fund me dot funders of zero. And then we'll say assert dot equal funder should be the same as the deployer. So let's go ahead and run this test. We'll hit up a couple times and we'll change the grep to funder to array so that it looks for this line. And perfect. It looks like that one is also passing. Great. So the money's coming through. The minimum amount is coming through and our data structures are being updated. Awesome. Now we could be a little bit more verbose and do even more testing with this fun function, but I think for the most part, we've got the gist, right? So now let's go ahead and move on to the withdraw function. So we're going to create a new describe for withdraw. This is going to be an async function. And let's see what the withdraw function does. Only the owner of the contract is going to be able to get the balance, get the money back. And we're also going to reset all of the amounts that each one of these users has done. 
So let's go ahead and do some withdrawing. Now, in order for us to test withdraw, we probably first want the contract to actually have some money in it. So what we can do actually is we can add another before each in the describe to automatically fund the contract before we run any tests. So we can say before each async function, we can say await fund me dot fund value, send value. And now for all of our tests in this withdraw scope, we're first going to fund it with ETH. Let's say it can withdraw, withdraw ETH from a single founder. This will be an async function. And this is going to be a little bit longer test. So I'm going to set it up to be an arrange, act, and assert test. So arrange, act, assert is just sort of a, a way to think about writing tests. You want to arrange the test, then you want to act, and then you want to you know run the asserts. And, and you'll see what I mean in just a second. So we're going to arrange this test. We're going to set this test up. We want to actually check that we're correctly withdrawing the ETH from a single founder. So first, we're going to get the starting balance of the FundMe contract and the starting balance of the deployer. So we'll say const starting FundMe balance equals await fundme.provider.getBalance fundme.address. So we're going to start with the balance of the fundme contract after it's been funded with some ETH. And we're also going to get const start starting deployer balance equals await fundme.provider.getBalance of deployer. So we're getting the starting balance of the fund me, we're getting the starting balance of the deployer so that we can test later on how much these numbers have changed based off of what happens when we call the withdraw function. Now that we've done a little bit of the setup, we can actually run this withdraw function, we can do the act here. So we're going to say const transaction response equals await fund me dot withdraw. And then we can say const transaction receipt equals await transaction response dot wait one. And now we should be able to check to see that the entire fund me balance has been added to the deployer balance. So now we can say const ending fund me balance equals await fund me dot provider dot get balance of fund me dot address. And then we can say const ending deployer balance equals await fund me dot provider dot get balance of deployer. And now we can just check to see if the numbers work out here. So we can say assert dot equal ending fund me balance is going to be zero right, because we just withdrew all of the money. So ending fund me balance should be zero. And we'll say assert dot equal starting fund me balance plus starting deployer balance. So the starting fund me balance plus the starting deployer balance should equal the ending deployer balance. Since we're grabbing whatever the starting deployer balance started with, plus the starting fund me balance, because we just withdrew all of the starting fund me balance that should equal the ending deployer balance. Now a couple of notes here, since starting fund me balance is calling from the blockchain, it's going to be of type big number, we want to use big number dot add actually instead of the plus sign here, just because it'll it'll make working with our big numbers a little bit easier. So instead of starting fund me balance plus we're gonna do starting fund me balance dot add like that. And that should be good. One other thing about this, though, is that when we called withdraw, our deployer did what our deployer spent a little bit of gas. So this actually isn't accurate. We actually also need to calculate in the gas cost. So we would need to do dot add gas cost. We'd also have to do dot to string because big numbers are objects. And so identity is a little bit weird. So to test to see if they're equal, we'll just make them both strings. 
Now we don't have gas cost. So let's figure out how to get the gas cost from this transaction so we can add it to our ending deployer balance so we can run this assertion here. So what we can do is we can actually find the gas cost from our transaction receipt. And I'm gonna show you a couple of phenomenal tricks you can use with VS Code. And if you're using a different editor, then don't worry too much about this. What we can do in VS Code actually is create something called breakpoints, unverified breakpoint. File is modified, please restart debug session. Or let's put it right here. Put it right in this line after transaction receipt is created, but before ending fund rebalance. What this breakpoint does is it stops the script at this line and it allows us to drop it to something called a debug console and see all the variables that are happening at this time. We wanna look at the transaction receipt and see if the total gas cost is in there. This is also incredibly helpful for dropping into tests and dropping into scripts and seeing exactly what's going on that's wrong. So what we can do is we can move down to this run and debug section. And if it's not there, you can hit additional views and we can click this JavaScript debug terminal which will create a new terminal in our terminal section. Now what happens here is if we run yarn hard hat test, it'll run our testing and everything, but when it hits this breakpoint, it'll stop. Currently there is no gas cost, so we're just gonna delete this for now so that we compile and we work in everything. But if we run yarn hard hat test, we'll see, it's gonna say debugger has been attached. We're gonna start running our tests and it's gonna stop on this line here. And if we look in this variables section on the left-hand side, we can actually see a ton of the variables that are in here. And we can read a little bit more about what's going on. And if we go over to our debug console, we can type in things like transaction receipt, and we can see a ton of information about that transaction receipt object. What we're looking for is we're looking to see this transaction receipt, which we could look in the de debug console or over here, if there's anything to do with gas in here. And it looks like there is. There's a gas used big number, and there's also an effective gas price. So the amount of gas used times the gas price is gonna give us all the money that we paid for gas here. So now that we've figured out there's a gas used and effective gas price, variables in this transaction receipt, which we could have also found in the documentation here. However, sometimes it's even quicker just to find it out yourself. What we can do, we can exit the debugger by clicking this little thing here. We'll go back to terminal. We'll trash can the JavaScript debugger. We'll remove the breakpoint and we'll grab those two variables. We can pull them right out of that transaction receipt object by typing const gas used comma effective gas price equals transaction receipt. So again, with this curly bracket syntax, we can use this to pull out objects out of another object. Now that we have these two objects, we can create a const gas cost or total gas cost is gonna be equal to the gas used times the effective gas price. Which again, since these are both big numbers, we can use a big number function called dot mole to multiply them together. Now that we have this total gas cost, we can come down and we can say the ending deployer balance plus that gas cost dot to string. Now the two of these should be equivalent. Now I know there's a lot of math that we're doing in this section and a lot of new things. So I wanna just quickly re-go over what we just learned. So first off, the fund me contract comes with a provider. We could have also done ethers.provider.getbalance, but we're using fundme.provider because we're using the provider of the fund me contract. It doesn't really matter what we use here. We just wanted to use this get balance function of the provider object, which gets us the balance of any contract. We do the same thing with the starting deployer balance. The reason that we needed the starting balances is because we wanted to compare it to the ending balances to see if all the money went to the right places. We then call the withdraw function and from the transaction receipt, we grab the gas used and the gas price. If you want to debug your JavaScript code, you can add a breakpoint like so. Go to run and debug, open your debug JavaScript terminal, which is different from your regular bash terminals. And when you run JavaScript commands in here, they will stop where your breakpoints are. 
Then you can read the different variables and see where different things are. Using that knowledge, we pulled out the gas used and effective gas price from the transaction receipt and used it to get the total gas cost of this transaction. We then got the ending fund rebalance, the ending deployer balance, and used all those variables to make sure all of the money went to the right places. And we, and we can check this by running yarn hardhat test dash dash grep withdraw ETH in quotes since there's a space here. And we can see that our test does indeed pass. Great job. If we didn't add the gas cost here, and we just did dot to string, we would see something like this. We would see that the numbers are ever so slightly off because we're not anticipating, we're not calculating the gas here. So we always want to make sure we're using the gas if we're doing calculations like this. Now, another incredibly powerful debugging tool that we're not really going to go over here, but it's important to know about because it could be really helpful is that you can actually use console.log in your solidity with hardhat. If you're inside of a hardhat project, you just import hardhat slash console.soul. And then right in your solidity, you can do console.log and then type pretty much whatever you want. When you execute these functions, similar to how we do a console.log in JavaScript, those will actually console.log out to your terminal. Here's an example of if you run yarn hardhat test and you have those console.logs, you'll see stuff like this get printed out. So in addition to the Visual Studio Code Debugger, importing hardhat slash console.soul and using console.logs in your Solidity can also be an effective debugging strategy. Feel free to give this video a pause, implement this in some of our contracts and try it out in our tests. So we tested that withdrawing ETH when there's a single funder works perfectly. Let's test withdrawing ETH if there are multiple funders. So we'll do it. We'll say allows us to withdraw with multiple funders. We'll have this be an async function. And let's do this await fundme.fund, but with a number of different accounts. So we can create a whole bunch of different accounts, of course, by saying const accounts equals await ethers.get signers. And we can loop through these accounts and have each one of these accounts call the fund function. And we're going to do this with a for loop. So we're going to say for let i equals, we'll start with the first index of the accounts because the zeroth index is going to be the deployer. So we'll say let i equals one, i is going to be less than let's say six, and then we'll do i plus plus. And in here, we'll say const fund me contract, fund me connected contract equals await fund me dot connect to accounts i. So we need to call this connect function because right now, if we scroll up back to the top, our fund me contract is connected to our deployer account. And anytime we call a transaction with fund me, the deployer is the account that is calling that transaction. We need to create new objects to connect to all of these different accounts. So we're going to say fund me connected contract, which is now connected to one of these different accounts dot fund. And this is where we'll do value, send value, or excuse me, we'll do await. Okay, great. So this is going to be our, our range section. And then same as we did above, we need to grab those starting balances. So we can just copy that those two lines and paste it down here. Now we're going to move into act. And we're going to call that withdraw function again. So we're going to say const transaction action response equals await fund me dot withdraw. And we're going to do the exact same thing as we did above by getting the transaction receipt and the gas costs so we can get everything correct. Once we've done the act, we move on into assert and we're going to do some very similar things to what we did above, like this, for example, this whole first part is going to be exactly the same. But we also want to make sure the funders are reset properly. So we'll make sure that this funders array is reset properly. So to do that, we can actually just check to see that if looking at the zero with position throws an error, so we can run await expect fund me dot get fund me dot funder on me dot funders of zero, this should revert. So we'll say await expect 
fundme.funders.2.b.reverted. And then we want to loop through all these accounts and make sure that and make sure that in our mapping here, all their amounts are zero. So we'll say for i equals one, i is less than six, i plus plus, we'll say assert dot equal weight fund me dot address to amount funded of the accounts of i dot address should be zero. So we're making sure that all of these mappings are correctly updated to zero. So let's go ahead and test this. So we're withdrawing with multiple founders. We're going to go back to our terminal. We're going to hit up. We're going to change this grep for this one. We'll see if this passes. And it does indeed. So this means that our withdraw function works really well, even when there's multiple funders and we can be happy and go to sleep knowing that. Now, the other thing we absolutely 100% want to test is that our only owner modifier is working. We want only the owner to be able to withdraw the funds from here. So we'll create a new section. We'll say it only allows the owner to withdraw, only allows the owner to withdraw. This will be an async function. And in here, we'll say const accounts equals ethers dot get signers again. And we'll say const attacker equals accounts of one. So we'll say the first account will be some random attacker. We'll connect this attacker to a new contract. We'll say const attacker connected contract equals await fund me dot connect attacker dot address. Excuse me, a dot connect attacker. Since we're not just connecting the address, we're connecting the account, which attacker is an account object. And then we'll do await expect attacker connected contract dot withdraw dot two dot b dot reverted. They should not be able to withdraw. So let's go ahead. We can even just copy this whole thing if we want. We'll hit up. We'll delete this section here. We'll paste that in. And boom, this means that when some other account tries to call withdraw automatically gets reverted, which is what we want. Now we can be more explicit to make sure that the correct arrow code is being thrown, not just that it's reverted, right? It could be ver reverted because they sent ETH or did it, they did something weird. We want to make sure it's reverted with our specific arrow code. So right now we have this not owner arrow code, but it's actually a best practice to put the contract name two underscores and then your custom error. This makes it a lot easier in the future when you have a ton of different contracts and you're not sure where an error is coming from. So we're going to just update this really quickly to be fund me underscore underscore not owner. Now what we can do is now that we have this custom error, we can say withdraw dot to be reverted with then we can add our custom error in here. And now if we rerun our test with only allows the owner to withdraw, oops, we need to do await here, my mistake, await ethers.get signers. And now let's try this again. And we are indeed passing. Perfect. Okay, great. We have some basic unit tests here. And we're going to write some staging tests pretty soon. But before we actually do that, Let's go ahead and add the gas estimator and we'll see how much gas these contracts and these functions are taking. It looks like the hardhead gas reporter is already here. So let's scroll down. We'll do gas reporter true. And we won't do coin market cap here. And we'll just look purely at the GUI. So you can just comment it out like that. Now we'll rerun all of our tests. So we'll say yarn hardhead test. And in doing so, we're going to get that that gas output in that gas report dash text here. So looks like all of our tests are passing, which is perfect. Now we can look into our gas report and see what's going on here. All right, well, it looks like the fund me function is taking a decent chunk of gas, the withdraw function taking some gas too. We can see the min, the max and the average, of course, we can see how much each one of these contracts cost to actually output. 
We don't really care about the mock aggregator, of course, because we're never actually going to use that. Let's say we look at the average gas for these and we go, huh, this looks like it's actually a lot more than what we originally expected. Is there a way for us to make this a little bit cheaper? We go back to our fund me contract. We look at our withdraw function and we notice something. Oh, there is actually a way to make this a lot cheaper. And it has to do with something called storage variables or these global variables that we've been working with this whole time. Let me let me paint you a little picture here. We're going to look at one of the first gas optimization techniques you can take to drop these down. And it has to do within our fund me contract, these state variables and how they're actually stored and how this contract actually keeps track of all this stuff. This section is going to be a little bit more advanced. So we'll have a note here saying that this is an advanced section. And if you want to skip over it, you can because now we're getting into gas optimizations here. This information still is really good to know. So if you want to skip it for now and then come back later, you absolutely can. But let's talk about what happens when we actually save or store these global variables, aka these storage variables. Now, everything I'm about to go through is in the documentation. And there is a link to this, of course, in the GitHub repo associated with this course. Whenever we have one of these global variables or these variables that stay permanently, they're stuck in something called storage. You can think of storage as a big giant array or a giant list of all the variables that we actually create. So when we say we have some contract called fund of storage and we have a variable called favorite number, we're basically saying we want this favorite number variable to persist, right? We saw in a lot of our examples, we had a favorite number variable that we could always call to see what this contract's favorite number was. Well, the way it persists is it gets stored in this place called storage. Now storage works as this giant list associated with this contract where every single variable and every single value in this storage section is slotted into a 32 byte long slot in this storage array. So for example, the number 25 in its bytes implementation is 0x00 with a ton of zeros 19. This is the hex version of the UNT 256. This is why we do so much hex translation. This is the bytes implementation of a UN256. And each storage slot increments just like an array starting from zero. So for example, our next global variable or our next storage variable just gets slotted at the next slot that's available. So Booleans, for example, get transformed from their bool version to their hex. And we modified our sum bool variable to be true. And the hex addition of the true Boolean is 0x00001. Every time you save an additional global variable, or more correctly, one of these storage variables, it takes up an additional storage slot. And what about variables that are dynamic in length or that can change length? What about something that's dynamic? Well, for dynamic values like a dynamic array or a mapping, elements inside the array or inside the mapping are actually stored using some type of hashing function. And you can see those specific functions in the documentation. The object itself does take up a storage slot, but it's not going to be the entire array. For example, my array variable here at storage slot two doesn't have the entire array in storage slot two. What it has actually is just the array length. The length of the array is stored at storage slot two. But for example, if we do my array dot push 222, we do some hashing function, which again, you can see in the documentation what that is, and we'll store the number 222 at that location in storage. The hex of 222 is 0x00000DE. So it gets stored in this crazy spot. And this is good. This is intentional because 32 bytes may not be nearly big enough to store my array if our array gets massive. And it wouldn't make sense for it to put the elements inside the array at subsequent numbers because, again, the size of the array can change and, and you're never going to be sure how many subsequents that you need. So for my array, it does have a storage slot for the length. For mappings, it does have a storage spot as well, similar to array, but it's just blank. But it's blank intentionally so that Solidity knows, ah, okay, there is a mapping here and it needs a storage slot for its hashing function to work correctly. Now, interestingly, constant variables and immutable variables do not take up spots in storage. The reason for this is because constant variables are actually part of the contract's bytecode itself which sounds a little bit weird, but you can imagine what Solidity does is anytime it sees constant variables name is it just automatically swaps it out with whatever number it actually is. So you can kind of think of not in storage is just a pointer to 123 and it doesn't take up a storage slot. Well, when we have variables inside of a function, those variables only exist for the duration of the function. 
they don't stay inside the contract. They don't persist. They're not permanent. So variables inside these functions like new var and other var do not get added to storage. They get added in their own memory data structure, which gets deleted after the function has finished running. Now you might be asking, okay, well, why do we need this memory keyword, especially when it comes to strings? We saw before that we had to say string memory. The reason we need it for strings is because strings are technically this dynamically sized array. And we need to tell Solidity, hey, we're, we're gonna do this on the storage location, or we're gonna do it into the memory location where we can just wipe it. Arrays and mappings can take up a lot more space so Solidity just wants to make sure, okay, where are we working with this? Is it storage? Is it memory? You have to tell me. I need to know if I need to allocate space for it in our storage data structure. And again, everything here you can read in the Solidity documentation. Now in the GitHub repo associated with this course, if you go to contracts, we've actually got an example contract section called fun with storage, where you can play with and look at a lot of this stuff. And we even wrote a little script called deploy storage fun, where it'll print out the storage location of some of the different variables. Feel free to give it a run if you want to try. I challenge anybody to write some functions that define the storage slots of the elements of the arrays and the mappings, and then find the data inside of those as well. We use a function here called get storage at, which allows us to get the storage at any one of these slots. And this is to reinforce that even if you have a function as private or internal, anybody can still read it. Anybody can read anything off the blockchain and you can test it exactly with this. If you go ahead and git clone that or copy paste the code yourself, you can then run yarn hard at deploy dash dash tags storage and you'll run the deploy script for that storage and you'll see printing out the location of storage in each storage slot with a fun contract that we made as an example. Now you might of course be asking, okay, Patrick, why are you telling me all this? We're just trying to get this gas price down. Why are you telling me all about this storage thing? Well, the reason I'm telling you all about this storage thing, anytime you read or you write to and from storage, you spend a ton of gas. Remember how I said when we compile our code, we compile it down to some crazy weird bytecode? Well, let me show you on Remix what this looks like. We can go to compilation details. We can go to bytecode and we see this weird hex object, zero, blah, blah, blah but we also see these things called opcodes. Now this bytecode here represents these opcodes. Each one of these opcodes represents a small piece of everything in this bytecode. And in fact, in our hard hat, we can go to artifacts, build info, and we can see, we can see these opcodes in the build info. We can do a command F or a control F for opcodes. And we can see opcodes for different contracts. These opcodes represent what the machine code is doing, and they represent how much computational work it takes to actually run our code and do stuff with our code. The way that gas is actually calculated is by these opcodes. There are a couple lists here, but here's one that I'm going to use, this EVM opcodes. And again, there's a link to this in the GitHub repo associated with this lesson. Well, if we scroll down, we can see exactly how much it costs for each one of these opcodes. So for example, anytime we add it costs three gas. Anytime we multiply, that's five gas. Subtracting, three gas. We have all of these opcodes that cost different amounts of gas. And in our functions, here's kind of a sample contract. If we're doing adding, anytime we add, it's gonna cost three gas. Anytime we save to memory, it's gonna cost gas from some other opcodes. These opcodes combined show us how much gas we actually use. Now, Let's look at a lot of these opcodes and how much they cost. Three, five, 10, three, three. Balance is 700. So getting the balance is, is a ton of gas. Let's keep going. Getting the size of an account's code is a lot of gas. Copying an account's code into memory. But oh my goodness, what is this? Save word to storage costs a ton of gas. That is 20,000 gas. And S load, load word from storage costs 800 gas. These are two of the most important opcodes, S load and S store, which stand for storage load and storage store. Anytime one of these opcodes fires, we're spending 800 or 20,000. You know, there's a big asterisk there because that can change a lot, but we're spending a ton of gas anytime we work with storage. As developers, anytime we work with some stuff in storage, we want to go, boy. This is about to cost me a lot of gas. 
and a best convention for making sure we know that we're working with a storage variable and we're about to spend a lot of gas is to append an S underscore right before them, which stands for storage, right? So we're saying address to amount funded is going to be a storage variable. Funders is going to be a storage variable. Owner is not going to be a storage variable. It's immutable. A best practice for immutable variables is prefixing it with an I underscore. Constant values are also not in storage. So for constant values, we want to keep them caps locked like that. Aggregator V3 interface, public price speed. Yep, you know it. That is going to be a storage variable. So we want to append an S underscore with it. So we're going to do a little bit more refact. We've appended these appropriately to update everything. So instead of owner, it's going to be I underscore owner. And as a developer, we'll read this and we'll go, ah, this is going to be much cheaper than a regular variable. Okay, that's great. I'm going to work with this, this I underscore owner for my modifier. Awesome. Is owner anywhere else in here? Ah, okay, right in the constructor. I owner underscore owner is message dot sender. Price feed is a storage variable. We should, as developers, we should see the S underscore when reading this and go, okay, we're spending a lot of gas to store this. Perfect. Okay, great. Let's keep going. Great. We've updated all the owners. Okay. Well, what about address to amount funded? In VS Code, if you do Command F or Control F and you hit this little down arrow, you can actually find and replace all of these address to amount funded with S underscore address to amount funded. Hit it like that. And since I updated one, I got to backspace that one now. So now these are all updated. Let's do the same thing with S funders. Let's update everywhere it has funders just to be S funders. And we probably doubled up here. Yep, let's undo that. We already updated all the I owners. So now let's update all the price feeds. So let's look for price feed. and We'll update it with S price feed. And then we probably doubled up right here. So we'll undo that. Okay, great. Now that we've updated everything in here, we can scroll down and we can look, oh, whoops. So I doubled up there too, sorry. We can, we can read through our code and go, okay, where are we reading and writing to storage way more often than we probably need to? And that's when we get to this withdraw function, which seems rather suspect to reading and writing to storage a lot. So let's take a look at what we're doing here. Okay, so first of all, I can see that when we're doing a for loop here. And every time we do a for loop, we're just constantly looping through all of this code. Every single time we're doing a little compare option here, we're saying, okay, is our funder index less than S funders dot length? S funders dot length. This means the longer our funders array is, the more times we're going to be reading from storage. That's incredibly expensive. Where else are we calling this? Oh my goodness. We're reading from storage a lot and saving it to this memory variable and then updating our storage variable with it. Wow, so we're reading from storage a ton here and we're reading from storage a ton here. Okay, then we have to reset our funders array. There's really no way around it. And that's pretty much it for our reading and writing to storage. We could probably create a withdraw function that's a lot cheaper. So let's go ahead and create a function called cheaper withdraw. Function cheaper withdraw. That's going to take what we've just learned and make a cheaper withdraw that's much more gas efficient. So we'll keep this public payable and have it be only owner. We're not going to change anything there. But what can we do for at least this part here? We don't want to keep reading from storage here, and we don't want to always have to keep reading from storage here. We're like doubling up the amount of storage we're reading from. So instead, what we can do, we can read this entire array into memory one time and then read from memory instead of costly reading from storage. And that's going to make our lives a lot cheaper. So we can create an address array, memory funders equals S underscore funders. And now it's going to start making sense why for arrays and strings in our functions, it makes us say, hey, is this memory? Is this storage? What is this? And we're telling it we want it to be memory because memory is going to be a lot cheaper. So now that we're saving it into our funders, Oh, and, and a quick note, mappings can't be in memory. Sorry, they're just too weird and too wacky. So Solidity just doesn't let you do that right now. But now that we've saved our storage variable into a memory variable, we can read and write from this memory variable much, much cheaper and then update storage when we're all done. So what we're going to do now is we're going to say for u256 
funder index equals zero. And we're going to basically rewrite everything, but just using this memory array instead. We're going to say funder index is less than funders dot length instead of s funders dot length. And then we're going to say funder index plus plus. And then in here, we're going to do nearly exactly the same thing, except we're going to say address funder equals funders using our memory array and not s funders of funder index. And then we're going to say s address to amount funded funder equals zero. So we're resetting our funders mapping here. We're using our memory variables instead. Then we're going to do the same thing. S underscore funders equals new address array of zero. And then we're going to do the same thing. Bool success comma equals S owner dot call value address this dot balance. And we're going to send it nothing. And then require success like that actually. Oops, sorry. I owner, not S owner. Now that we have this function that we think is cheaper, let's go back to our test and let's run this same multi test here, but with our cheaper function. So I know this can be a little bit tricky to copy paste, but let's copy this entire massive test. Let's come down here, paste it, and we'll change the name saying cheaper withdraw testing dot dot dot. And in here and in this giant it here, all we're going to change is we're going to change withdraw to cheaper withdraw. And the rest of the test is going to be exactly the same. So with that, let's see if if we were successful in making our withdraw function cheaper with cheaper withdraw, we're going to pull up our, our terminal now. And we're going to do yarn hard hat test, which is going to run our gas estimator because it's enabled right now. And of course, all of our functions have been broken because we renamed everything. So we'll do a quick find and replace of funders. We're going to change funders to S funders. And then we're going to change price feed to S price feed. And then do we have owner anywhere? We don't have owner anywhere. We need to change this one address to amount funded. Let's come in here. Address to amount funded S address to amount funded. What else do we need to change? Price feed, price feed, funders. Okay, I think we changed everything. All right, so let's try our test now. Yarn hard hat test. All right, great. Everything's passing. And we ran our cheaper withdraw testing. So now if we go to our gas output here, our gas report, zoom out just a hair, we can see the difference between cheaper withdraw and withdraw. We see something really interesting here. We see our cheaper withdraw on average was actually more expensive than our regular withdraw. And the reason for this is because actually, if we go to our tests, our cheaper withdraw, we only tested on the multi withdraw. So it had to reset many, many more accounts. But this was also technically its maximum as well. And if we compare the maximum of the cheaper withdraw to the maximum of the withdraw, it looks like the cheaper withdrawal was indeed cheaper. And if we go to our hardhat.config and we add our API key back in, what we could even do is in our test, we could copy withdraw ETH from a single funder, copy that, paste it in, and just change withdraw to cheaper withdraw, rerun it with the key, and now do yarn hardhat test. We can see exactly how many dollars we would save if we ran this on the Matic blockchain. Now let's go back. We'll reopen up our gas report and we can see in the minimum cheaper withdrawal was actually a little bit more expensive. This actually does make sense because if we look at Fundme, if we only have to withdraw when there was one funder, well, this loop only runs one time and our cheaper withdrawal will do the exact same, but it will have this, this extra thing here of loading them all in. We see that the savings, the more people are funders in our contracts. So on Matic, we can see we pretty much didn't save anything. <laughs> but if I change this one more time to ETH, run the test again. Now we can see cheaper withdraw saved a few cents. So this is how we can start optimizing our contracts to be cheaper and cheaper. And this two cents was just in the average. It's not even comparing the max to the max, which was a lot more gas than their averages. We have just learned an absolute here. Now, 
This next part is going to make some of you mad because we're going to refactor our code one more time. If you don't want to refactor it and you want to leave all your tests as S underscores, you absolutely can. But to other users using our application, dealing with this S underscore is a little bit gross and actually can make our code a little bit more confusing for those who use it. And additionally, right now, all of our state variables are public. And actually, internal variables and private variables are also cheaper gas-wise, and we don't need to make every single one of our variables public because anybody can read them off the chain anyways. So one more refactoring that we're going to do is we're actually going to set the visibility of these to private or internal based off of whether or not they need to be private or internal, and then we'll create getters at the bottom of our function here. So minimum USD we can keep as public because we want other people to know what the minimum USD of our contract is without having to go right through storage. The owner of our contract isn't important for others to know or other contracts to know, so we can go ahead and make this private. And then at the bottom, add a function, get owner. That's a public view that returns I owner returns address. S funders, S funders can be private as well. So at the bottom, we're going to say function get funder. And we're going to pass a UN256 index public view returns address return S funders of index. The address to amount funded can also be private. So at the bottom, we're going to create function get address to amount funded. And this is going to take an address funder public view returns you went 256. We're going to return amount funded of the funder. We did this one, we did this one, we did this one. And then price feed function get price feed. This is going to be public view as well that returns aggregator v3 interface and that's going to return s underscore price feed Ooh, okay the reason why we did that is because we want to have this s underscore so that we as developers can know ah okay this is a storage variable i want to be very careful about how i interact with this but we don't want people who interact with our code to have to deal with this s stuff and we want to give them an api that makes sense and that is easy and readable so we add these getter functions at the bottom to do that and also changing the visibility can save us some gas in the long run as well, because we're gonna be calling from private variables or internal variables, which are cheaper gas wise. Of course, we do need to upgrade our tests one more time. And like I said, if you wanna just leave them with the S underscores, that's absolutely fine. So S underscore price feed is now gonna be replaced with get price feed, S underscore amount to fund it. It's gonna be now replaced with get address to amount funded. We're now going to change s underscore funders to get funder. We're going to change i owner. There's nowhere, so never mind. We don't need to change that. And I think that was everything. Let's just look for s underscore. We don't see that. i underscore. We don't see that either. Let's just run our test one more time to make sure we refactored it correctly. And it looks like we did. Awesome. Okay. We have just learned a ton. We've refactored our code a ton and everything is starting to look really, really good here. One more gas optimization we could make and an optimization for our errors as well is we could update all of our requires to instead be to instead be reverts because with our requires, we're actually storing this massive string, this massive array of text on chain. These error codes are much cheaper but that's optional if you want to do that. The whole reason we were doing this is we were going through the style guide and updating things here. So we have public, internal, private, and the bottom is going to be our view slash peer functions, which they are. They're just all these getters that we just added. So now our style in here looks good. We've learned a lot about gas. We've learned a lot about storage. This is fantastic. Let's do a quick refresher on everything we just learned because we went through a lot right there. And like I said, this is one of the harder parts of this course. Any variable that is changeable that we want to persist across contract executions and transactions, we save to a giant array called storage. This array is sequentially indexed starting at zero. So the first variable, the first value that we have in our contract gets stored to the zeroth index. 
The next one gets stored to one and so on and so forth. Dynamic arrays and mappings and other dynamically sized objects use a specific hashing function that you can find in the documentation to determine where the elements of those dynamic data structures go. Memory variables, constant variables, and immutable variables don't go in storage. And one of the main reasons talking about storage is so important is because the opcodes for loading from storage and for reading from storage and writing to storage are incredibly gas expensive. So in everywhere we can, we want to reduce the amount that we read and load from storage. And it's one of the easiest ways to save gas and try to optimize our code to be gas efficient. Like I said, some of this gas stuff can be a little tricky and a little bit confusing. So if you don't get this right away, it's okay. It is totally fine. If you're a little bit confused and you're like, what is he talking about? Like I said, this is some of the more advanced stuff. It'll come the more you work with Solidity and the more you work with everything here. So don't let it stress you out. Don't let it stop you from continuing. You're doing fantastic being here so far. We've written some really good unit tests. Let's now write some staging tests. And these are the tests that we can use on an actual test net. This is a test that we're basically going to run after we've deployed some code just to see if everything is working approximately the way we want it to. So let's go ahead. We'll create a new file here. We'll call it fundme.staging.test.js. And it's going to look really similar to what we were just doing with our unit test. And we're going to assume this is on a test net. So these are tests that we're going to run right before we deploy this to a mainnet. This is the last step in your development journey. We want to just make sure that everything is working approximately correctly on an actual test net. So what we're going to do is we're going to do the same thing. Describe fund me. And I'm going to go a little quick through these tests here because we've basically written this type of test before. So we're going to say before each, it's going to be an async function. And we're going to do the same thing as our unit tests. So we're going to have a fund me variable, we're gonna have our let deployer, we're gonna have our const send value equals ethers.utils dot parse ether of one. And in here, we're going to do const get named accounts equals require hard hat, we're gonna say deployer equals await get named accounts, and we're gonna wrap this up to dot deployer. We're going to say fund me equals await ethers dot get contract fund me comma we're going to connect it to our deployer we're not going to deploy this we're not going to do any fixtures like we did in our unit tests because in our staging tests we're assuming that it's already deployed here and we also don't need a mock because on a staging we're assuming that we're on a test net now we can actually wrap this whole thing to make sure that we're on a test net by using our helper config and looking for our development chains. We can say we only want to run our describe bit if we're on a development chain. So first we'll say const development chains equals require. We'll pull that, that helper config in and we'll say development chains dot includes network dot name. And we'll basically say, we'll say if developer chains that includes network.name, we're going to skip and we can actually skip using this. We're going to use something called a ternary operator It's basically like a one liner if statement. And you can think of this as a special type of if I've got a link to this in the GitHub repo associated with this course. And here's some JavaScript documentation showing it in action. We say, okay, return is member. And if it's true, have it be $2. Otherwise, have it be $10. And that's pretty much it. So another way of thinking about it is like, you could say let variable equals true. And then we could say let some var equals variable question yes or no. Some var will end up being yes, because variable is true. If variable was false, then some var would be no. So it's literally saying if variable, if variable, then some var equals yes, else some var equals no. These lines are literally the exact same thing. This one is just a little bit more succinct. That's really it. So that's what this operator does. We're going to say development chains that includes network.name. So if our network is a development chain, which we're going to 
import network as well from hardhead and ethers as well. Then we're going to do describe.skip. And this tells our test to just skip this whole describe. And then we're going to put this little colon here thing and save and boom. So now we're only going to run this if we're not on a development chain. And we want to take this exact same syntax. We'll go to our unit testing here. And we'll do the exact same thing. We'll paste it. We'll have this be the opposite by putting a little not here, sticking that colon in. So now our unit tests only run on development chains and our staging tests only run on test nets. Perfect. That's what we want. Allows people to fund and own and withdraw. And this will be an async function, of course. And we probably could make this pretty robust, but we'll just say await fund me dot fund value is going to be send value. And then we'll say await fund me dot withdraw assert equals require chai. And then we'll do kind of a lame final one. We'll say const ending balance equals await fund me dot provider dot get balance fund me dot address. And then we'll say assert dot equals ending balance dot to string comma zero as a string. We're only going to run this on a test net. I'm just going to give you this one more run to show you it in action. Feel free to skip this part again because we are going to be working with a test net. I'm going to run yarn hard hat deploy dash dash network rinkaby. And it's going to run through our deploy. And after it's all deployed, we're going to run our staging test to make sure that everything works even with a price feed on a real test net. And I need to do const development chains equals require dot dot slash dot dot slash help our hardhat config. So now if I run yarn hardhat test, we'll see just our unit test get run. But if I run yarn hardhat test dash dash network rinkaby, we're not going to run nine tests. We're only going to run our singular staging test. And of course, this is going to be a lot slower because we're on a test net. Now that we've write, written all these tests, we can write a couple of scripts, and then we're going to finish this out by pushing this up to GitHub, making this our first smart contract GitHub repository. When it comes to the blockchain, when it comes to smart contracts, interacting with the community, interacting with open source, being a part of GitHub or GitLabs or whatever Git hosting service you're using is essential to being successful here. So let's write our scripts, and then we'll upload this to GitHub to start building our portfolio. So first, we're going to create a script to interact with our code called fund.js. And this is going to be really similar to our tests. And this way, in the future, if we want to just fund one of our contracts very quickly, we can just run this and we can do it. We're going to do the same thing that we've been doing. We're going to do an async function main. And down below, I'm just going to copy paste this because we're going to be copy pasting it a lot. We're going to paste this little syntax here. So let's write a script that allows us to fund our contracts. So first, we're going to need const get named accounts, just like in our tests, equals require hard hat. And we're going to say const deployer equals await get named accounts, just like that. And then we're going to say const fund me equals await ethers.get contract from fund me comma deployer, literally almost exactly the same as our tests. Then we'll do a little console.log funding contract dot dot dot. And we'll do const transaction response equals await fund me dot fund. And for the value, we'll do something like ethers dot utils dot parse ether of 0 0.1 or something, whatever you want to do here. We, of course, need to import ethers, which it looks like we already have. We'll do await transaction response dot wait for one transaction. And then we'll do console dot log funded. We can run this little script by running yarn hardhead node. We'll run a local node with all of our contracts deployed. We'll see if our script looks OK by running yarn hardhead run scripts fund.js dash dash network localhost. 
And it looks like it's funding great. Let's now write a withdraw script. Withdraw.js. And we can even leave our localhost node running because we're going to withdraw the funds that we just funded it with. So we're going to do the exact same setup here. We can even copy this main bit to our withdraw. Go to the top. We'll do async function main. We'll say const deployer equals await get named accounts, which, wow, I hit enter and my VS code auto imported it. That's pretty nice. Maybe yours will too. Maybe it won't. If it won't, you just got to write it out or copy paste from the other one. And then we'll do const fund me equals await ethers.get contract fund me course. And this is going to be the exact same. Now we're going to do console.log funding dot dot dot. We'll say const transaction response equals await fund me dot withdraw await transaction response dot wait one and then console dot log got it back and we can test this out by running yarn hardhead runs scripts withdraw dash dash network localhost we'll see if this works and cool and our script is working Fantastic, crushed out two scripts incredibly quickly. And now we have a way to easily interact with our code, with our contracts, if we want to via a script. There's actually one more thing I wanna show you before we actually work and we push all this wonderful code up to GitHub. In our package.json, I've shown you a little bit of this before, but we can add this scripts section to make our lives a lot easier and condense all these long tests into a yarn script for us. So usually what you'll see in common package.json's is you'll see a list of these in here for people to look and just automatically run. One of the most common ones is gonna be test. And to run test, we're gonna do yarn hard hat test. So now instead of running yarn hard hat test, someone can just come to your package once this is saved and just run yarn test. And this will grab this test from your script section and it'll run yarn hard hat test and Bada bing, bada boom. Okay, cool. What else do we probably want to do in here? Well, we probably want to have a test staging section that'll run yarn hard hat test dash dash network rinkaby. I'm not going to run that, but that's probably something we want to have in here. We're probably going to want some linting. So we showed you briefly that linting thing. So we'll have a yarn lint, which will just run yarn soul hint. And then we'll just have it soul hint the contracts folder and anything that's star.soul. So now if I run yarn lint, it'll run soul hint and all of our code here. And it'll give us some warnings here, which we can pretty much all ignore. And soul hint actually has an auto fix, an auto fix that we can add by doing yarn lint fix. We'll say yarn soul hint contracts slash star.soul. We'll do dash dash fix. So now if we run yarn lint fix, it'll auto fix, which there's nothing to auto fix. So uh, nothing happens, but it's good to have anyways. And then we can do our formatter. We're just going to format our code format, which will do yarn prettier dash dash right. To, and we'll just do a period to do everything. And then we can just do yarn format. And it's going to fix all of our, it's going to fix everything for us, which is great. And then we finally can have coverage by running yarn hard hat coverage. Now we can just run yarn coverage. And it'll give us this wonderful little coverage report. Awesome. So our package is looking fantastic. Maybe we'll even come into package adjacent. We'll give this a name. We'll call this hard hat fund me. We'll give it an author, which is gonna be your name. So I'm just gonna say Patrick Collins and we'll give it a, a version in here of 1.0.0 oops and let's do hyphens instead of spaces oh and uh one, one more thing we're not using eslint so all this eslint stuff we can dump and we could delete the yarn.lock and reinstall but yeah whatever we don't have a readme but that's okay if you want to go back like i said go check out that best readme template and go update your readmes to make them look as awesome as this you could do that as well but other than that we've got an awesome code repo here what do we want to do with it? Well, we've been playing around with GitHub so much. We've been looking at all these GitHubs. It's time for us to join GitHub with our own, with our first repository. 
Let's go ahead and let's make this happen. In the Lesson 7 Full Blockchain Solidity Course.js, there is a link to this GitHub Quick Start that we're going to follow to set up our first repository. This is going to be the moment where you are starting to build your portfolio. Building a GitHub is borderline crucial for your development journey. It's going to be your portfolio. It's going to be where you say, hey, look at all the cool products that I'm engaging with, that I'm working with, that I'm participating in. If you've already made GitHubs before, I highly recommend you still push this up to GitHub as proof that you've done it. And then you can also tweet it at me saying, hey, look how far I've gotten. Look where I've done. Look at how fantastic I'm learning smart contracts and be incredibly excited about it now. This quick start will walk you through creating a repository, creating a branch and teaching you all this stuff. We're going to follow the instructions from the GitHub documentation about adding locally hosted code to GitHub. So we already have a project and we're just pushing it up. Since the Windows users are using WSL, you can just follow the Mac or Linux instructions here. The first thing that we're going to do is in your GitHub profile or your GitHub login, we're going to hit this little plus thing and hit new repository. You can call this whatever you want. Let's call it hard hat. Fund me free code camp. You can put a description if you want. Learning from free code camp and Patrick about smart contracts. Ba, ba, ba. We'll make it public because we want other people to see you being fantastic and learning smart contracts. We'll leave this blank and we'll hit create repository. Now, this is our public code repository. This is our first one. If you've done these already, this will be your first smart contract one. It even has some instructions in here to, that teaches us how to create a new repository from the command line. You can follow this if you want, or you can follow like so. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to initialize a Git branch. And from way back when, you should already have Git installed. Remember, you can check by running Git dash dash version like this. Git is a little different from GitHub. Git is known as version control, and it allows us to make changes to our code, but keep a history of all the code changes that we've made. GitHub is a place where we can push all of these changes and keep track of all of our code. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to create a new branch, and I'm not going to explain Git and working with Git too, too deeply, but if you want to learn about Git, Free Code Camp, of course, has a video on Git and GitHub for beginners. So we're going to create this new branch with git init dash b main. Now your Visual Studio code might automatically start formatting some stuff. And if it does, that's great. And if it doesn't, don't worry about it. But what you'll see here on the left is you'll see some stuff is green and some stuff is gray. Open back up that dot git ignore. You'll see that all the gray stuff is the stuff that we have in this dot git ignore. This is intentional. This is what we want. This is just some, some highlighting saying, hey, this green stuff is what you're working with on GitHub. And this gray stuff is what you're not working with in GitHub. And that's what we want. You don't need to push artifacts or cache or coverage or node modules. People can install and compile on their own machines. We definitely don't want to push up our .env if we're using a .env. And we don't really need to push up coverage.json either. The rest of this, we do. So now, what's next after we initialize our main branch? You now should be able to run git status in your terminal and see this huge red output of all these things that are untracked and we don't have any commits for. What we can do now is we can stage all of our code with git add period and then commit it with git commit. We're going to run these one at a time instead of together. Before I run git add, I'm going to add deployments to this list too because GitHub doesn't really need to know about all the different deployments I make, especially when I make a ton of deployments to my local host, they don't need to know. So we're going to add that too. Then we're going to run git add dot. And if we do a git status now, we can see all of our code has been staged for being committed, for being a part of this history of our code. And then take a quick look at all these files and make sure your .env file is not and never in here. So now I'm going to run git commit dash m and then this message for our commit. Okay, so we'll run git commit dash m. We can say initial commit or whatever you want in this message here. First commit, initial commit, who cares? And it's going to say create mode, blah, blah, blah for all of these files. And if we do git status now, it's blank on branch main, nothing to commit. And then you might get something like this. If you've never worked with Git before, your name and email were added automatically. We're a little bit confused here. We'll talk about this in just a second. So next, what we can do is we're actually going to copy the URL of our GitHub repo. So you can grab that just by copying here or right at the top, 
that URL right there. And what we're going to do is we're going to add this as a remote repo. To do that, we'll do git remote add, and we'll give this remote repo a name. For us, we'll say origin, and then we'll paste that URL there. We're now saying the, the origin remote repo is going to be at this URL. If we run git remote dash V, we can see that the origin repo for fetching is at this branch and the origin repo for pushing is also at this branch. So when we want to get new code, aka fetch code, we'll fetch it from here. And if we want to push code up, we want to give code to the GitHub, we'll also get it from here. So now we've set the new remote with that remote URL. Now we're going to actually push the changes to github.com. And the way we do that is with git push and we pick which remote we want to push to, and we're going to push to origin, and then which branch we want to push to, which we're going to push to main. It'll probably prompt you for your username and your password and maybe your email and everything. Now, if authentication doesn't work for you for some reason, you can come over to settings. Let me scroll down to developer settings, personal access tokens, and create generate new token, some token. Give yourself repo access, write access, and hit generate token and try to use this token as your password instead. Be sure to use the GitHub documentation and the GitHub discussion associated with this course if you get lost or if something doesn't work as shown here. But once it's done, once you add all that information incorrectly, you come back to your GitHub and you will have your first GitHub repo with all the code and everything in it like this. And once you complete this step, once you do this, you should absolutely celebrate. If you like, you can shoot a tweet. The Web3 community and the blockchain community is absolutely this collaborative space. So Twitter crypto is where a lot of these people congregate to share ideas. So definitely be sure to celebrate and share this and be really, really excited and shoot a tweet out like this. Give your friends a high five, share it on Twitter, share it on Discord, share it on Reddit. Be excited for how far you've gotten. We've got a lot more to go, but by completing this part, you have done fantastically. And I am so excited for you to start the next section. Now, we're not going to go over the TypeScript edition of this because there's nothing really new here. However, again, if you want to see TypeScript, feel free to jump into the GitHub repository associated with this course. All right, awesome. You have just completed Lesson 7, the Hardhead Fund Me, and now it's time to move on to Lesson 8, which is going to be our HTML slash JavaScript Fund Me. You can find all the code for what we're about to go through, of course, on my GitHub repo. And for this section, we're now going to start to see some of the differences between Node.js, between that backend JavaScript, and JavaScript in the browser or frontend JavaScript. And if you come to the GitHub repo associated with this lesson, our main version will be using what's considered better frontend JavaScript, but we'll also have a Node.js edition as well if some of the frontend JavaScript is really confusing. And you'll see what I mean with some of those differences very soon. Now, people can programmatically interact with our smart contracts at any time. However, most of our users are not going to be developers. So we need to create a website. We need to create a user interface for them to interact with our smart contracts and interact with our protocols. And that's what this section is going to teach us. It's going to be an introduction to building these full stack, building these front ends on top of our smart contracts. Now, I wanted to show you what this is actually going to look like when we finish it, because here we're actually going to make our first front end, our first website using the blockchain, using Web3. And it's going to be an incredibly minimalistic website. As you can see right here, we're not going to have any styling. We're just going to show you how to get the functionality. And additionally, we're going to do a couple of things that aren't really recommended and are definitely not best practices. The reason we're going to do it like this is the same reason that in math class, before you learn the tricks for derivatives, you learn what a derivative actually is. We're teaching you it like this first so that you can understand what's going on on the websites when you interact with them and when you work with them. We saw already with faucet touching the link where we can connect our wallets and we can work with the faucets. All decentralized applications have this website and have this setup where you connect your wallet and then you interact by clicking buttons, which make these function calls to the blockchain. And here's going to be our minimalistic website that does exactly that. So this section is just going to teach you what's going on under the hood so you can really understand how to build these applications at a professional level. So for this section, if you don't want to code along with me, you definitely don't have to. However, coding along with me will definitely ingrain everything in your memory here. So here is what an application is going to look like. We have our website here, which is connected to our hard hat, our local blockchain, but it's going to run exactly the same as if it was on a real testnet. The first thing you'll notice 
is in our MetaMask, we are not connected. And we'll go ahead and hit connect. And MetaMask will pop up asking us if we want to connect. We'll go ahead and connect to it. And now we'll be able to interact with our hard ad fund me. You'll notice two buttons here are functions that we're familiar with. We have our withdraw function, which is going to be our withdraw function that we just created. And then of course, we also have our fund function here where we push or we send Ethereum or Matic or whatever native blockchain token to our smart contract. So we can do it through this user interface. So once we're connected, if we want to see the balance, we can actually right click, hit inspect, come over to our console, and we'll print out to the JavaScript console, the current balance of our smart contract. So nobody has funded this yet. We can come down, we can choose an amount we want to fund. So for example, maybe 0.1 ETH. We'll go ahead, we'll hit fund. MetaMask will pop up. We'll get a little console saying funding was 0.1. And it'll give us all the transaction details that we need to send 0.1 ETH to our smart contract. We can go ahead and hit confirm. And after it's been confirmed, after it's been mined on our local blockchain, if we hit get balance, we now see that it's 0.1. We could call fund again. We could have multiple funders. We could switch between different accounts and fund with different amounts. And we can see that funding amount increase. Then we can call the withdraw function. As long as we're the owner, we can confirm and we can pull out all the money out of our funding contract and we'll hit get balance. And now we'll see the balance is reset to zero. So this is what we're gonna be building it. Are you ready? I sure am. Let's get into it. This is the introduction to building websites with Web3. All the information here is available in our GitHub repo. So feel free to follow along there. All right, so if you're in your hardhead fund me dash free code camp repo, we're still going to want to have this open as well. But we're also going to want to create a new Visual Studio code for working with our new repo. So let's go ahead and CD down a directory. We'll type MKDIR. We'll call this HTML fund me free code camp. We'll CD into that. And we'll open this up by typing code period. You can also do file open folder, but we just want to open this up in a new Visual Studio code. New VS code will pop up, but before we flip over to that, we do want to CD down, CD back into hard hat, fund me free code camp, because we are still going to use everything in here. We're still going to deploy a smart contract using this folder and using this repo. When you're building dApps or, or websites that are connected to the blockchain, you'll usually have two repositories or repos. One is going to be for the smart contracts, like what we see here. This is our repo that has all the code for our smart contracts. And then you'll also have one for the front end slash website. And it's going to be the combination of these two repos, which makes up the full stack. So when people are talking about full stack, they're talking about the smart contracts, which is going to be our back end, plus, plus our HTML slash JavaScript slash website stuff, which is going to be our front end. So smart contracts are the back end, HTML slash JavaScript slash website stuff is going to be our front end. So we have our back end already. And now we're going to build our front end. We want to keep this up because we're going to need it to test and interact with our front end. Awesome. So we have this new folder now, HTML fund me free code camp. Now this course is not a how to learn front end course. We are going to teach you a number of front end concepts. But if you want to learn a full traditional front end course, once again, you can check out Free Code Camp. They've got a ton of fantastic tutorials on teaching you front end. If you go ahead and follow along with me, though, you'll definitely get a basic understanding of front end as well as front ends and how it relates to our smart contracts. Additionally, you don't have to do the front end parts or the full stack parts. If you only want to take this course to learn back end and to learn JavaScript and to learn solidity and learn how to do these smart contracts programmatically, then you can absolutely skip these front end parts. However, if you want to learn to build exciting websites and you want to have other people other than developers interact with your protocols, you definitely want to watch this part. Now, before we actually jump in here and start writing our code, we need to understand what exactly is going on when we work with one of these websites that uses the blockchain. So I actually made a video about this recently. So let's watch a segment from that really quick, just so that we can get up to speed with, with exactly what's going on behind the scenes of these websites that interact with the blockchain. All right, so here we are with a website or a front end on top of some smart contracts that we've deployed. It doesn't really matter what it is right now. This is typically the interface that you'll see boiled down to a really, really minimalistic level. Typically, you'll see something like a connect function, right? And MetaMask or some other wallet connector thing will pop up. 
We'll hit next. We'll connect here. We might even say something like connected. And we can also execute functions. We can interact with our smart contracts. We can confirm, et cetera, right? This is something you might see something like Aave, right? I'll hit connect on the Aave application. It'll say, hey, how would you like to connect? I'll choose MetaMask. I got to change my MetaMask to mainnet, but you get the picture, right? This is a, a, a simple example of what that would look like. So what is actually going on in the browser when we connect? What is actually going on and what do we actually need to do? We're going to right click, hit inspect. And on the right side, we're going to see our, our debugger here. Now, if we go over to sources on the top of our browser, you'll see a, a few things if you look down over here, right? We'll see this URL, right, which right now is going to be my local host. And we'll also see MetaMask and Phantom and a whole bunch of other stuff. These other things that we see here are going to be what's injected from our browser extensions. The reason we see this MetaMask thing here is because I have MetaMask installed, right? The reason I see Phantom here is because I have the Phantom app installed. MetaMask, of course, being an EVM wallet and Phantom being a Solana based wallet. Now, what happens when we have these extensions installed is they automatically get injected into a window object in JavaScript. And in fact, if we scroll down to here in the console, again, you can find console, you can click it here, you can click anything up there. And we type in window, we'll see we have this big window object with all this stuff, right? This window object represents this our window, basically, right? Now, if we scroll all the way to the bottom, and we do window.ethereum, we also see an object here. Now, this window.ethereum object only exists if you have a MetaMask or MetaMask-like browser. Or if you want to look at some other Web3 wallet, you do window.solana, solana, right? And we see this window.solana. Now, let's look at a browser that doesn't have MetaMask or Phantom installed. What do you think is going to happen in the window now? Let's go ahead, right-click, hit Inspect. We'll go to the console. Now let's see what's going on in here. If we go to sources, we first off, we don't see that MetaMask or that Solana source here. And if we go to console, we still see window. If I, let me zoom in a little bit. We still see window here. But if I do window.ethereum, we get nothing. Or if I do window.solana, we also get nothing. So in order for our browsers to know that there's a MetaMask or that there's a phantom, those extensions automatically add these to our window objects. And that's something that we can check for in our JavaScript. The reason these wallets are so important is built into them underneath the hood, they have a blockchain node connected to them. And in order to interact with the blockchain, we always need a node. And you might have seen URLs from Alchemy or Infura, because you need them to interact with the blockchain. Alchemy and Infura are examples of third party blockchains that you can interact with and basically rent, right? But you need them to create a provider or a node to send your transactions to. So you could do it in JavaScript, like something like this, this is the Alchemy documentation where you, you take that Alchemy URL, you stick it into some object and you use that to send your transaction. This is a way that you could do it in the back end. But on the front end, what you normally want to use is you just want to use the user's MetaMask or their Solana or their wallet as the main wallet. Now, there are a ton of other different types of wallets to connect, like Ledger, Mew, Coinbase, Wallet Connect, etc. And there are different ways to set those up, but they all do the same thing where they expose some URL. They expose some node under the hood. They give us that URL. They give us that provider. The way MetaMask does it is with window.ethereum. Boom. This is now our URL. This is now our connection. In fact, if you go up to your MetaMask, Hit the little three dots, expand view, hit add network, and then just hit the net X so we can get to networks. You can see all of these blockchains that I have in here all have an RPC URL. This is the HTTP RPC URL connection of the blockchain node that's running. I happen to have one running locally right now. All of these also have a node RPC URL and you can actually see them right in your MetaMask, right? This is connected to Infura. These are all connected to Infura. These are, it's all the exact same thing. MetaMask just has a really nice way of taking that URL, sticking it in the browser for us in this window.ethereum or 
window.solana, you know, or whatever. So this is the main thing that we need to know. We need, we always need a connection with the blockchain and these browser wallets are an easy way to do that. Make sense? Great. Let's take this knowledge now and let's apply it. So in here, let's make a quick readme.md just so we can talk about what we're going to be making here. So in this section, we're going to be using raw HTML slash JavaScript in conjunction with our smart contracts to build this website. Later on, we will use Next.js slash React, which is a more modern stack to build our websites here. But learning, understanding how to do everything with HTML and JavaScript first is going to make our lives a lot easier come later on down the road. But as we know, all websites use HTML as kind of their scaffolding for what they look like. So let's go ahead and create our HTML for our website. We'll call it index.html. And this is going to be the basic scaffolding or the basic bones of what our website is going to look like. Now in VS Code, if you go ahead and just type exclamation mark in an index.html and you click the first thing that pops up, it'll automatically populate your code, your file here with some basic HTML setup. If it doesn't do this for you, feel free to copy paste the basic setup from the GitHub repository associated with this course. We have our doc type HTML. We have some HTML tags telling us that everything in between here is going to be an HTML, which is great. However, for simplicity, we don't need most of this. So we're going to make this a little bit easier. We're going to delete this line, this line, and this line. And we're just going to change the title to fund me app. And then inside of our body, we can do something like hi or hello. And now we have the bare bones to create a website just with this. Now to show this on a website, we can do one of two things. If you are using Visual Studio Code, I'm going to recommend you install the extension live server, and it looks like this. And I'll have the extension ID for this extension in the GitHub repository associated with this course. This is going to allow us to easily spin up an HTML website. So we'll go ahead and install this. And if you're not using Visual Studio Code, I'll show you a different way in just a second. Once this is installed, you should have this little go live button at the bottom. And if you don't, you can always open up your command palette, which again, you can open up by hitting view command palette, and you can type in live server and just say open with live server. But we're going to just click this go live button and it's going to say starting. And it's actually going to open up your browser with our index.html. We can actually see our website is being hosted on 127.0.0.1. This is known as the loopback or localhost endpoint. We're on port 5501. If you're not familiar with the ports, don't worry about that for now. But we have our index.html here. And if we change this to something like what's good, we hit save. If it doesn't automatically refresh, we can come over here and refresh and we can see that being reflected here. If you've never created a website before, you've essentially just done it. Congratulations. You might get this .vs code folder. A .vs code folder allows you to make settings specifically for the repo that you're working with for your code editor, for VS Code. But we're going to mostly ignore it for now. Now, if you're not using Visual Studio Code, what you can do is you can just run this in the browser. So one thing you could do is you could right click it and I'm using a Mac. So I'm going to hit reveal in finder, AKA reveal where it's located. And you can just double click it and boom, now it's running right in your browser. Instead of pointing to your local host, it's going to be pointing directly to your local file path. Now, one final version that we could do that I'm going to highly recommend you don't do, but it's another option. We're actually going to download a package for you using Node.js, which allows us to serve up HTTP. And we're going to install it the exact same way we've installed our other packages. We can do yarn add dash dash dev HTTP hyphen server. And you may still want to add it anyways. But now we'll get some node modules for this HTTP server package. We'll get a package.json and of course a yarn.lock as well. And what we could do is we can stop this down here, stop that live server. And if we go back to our website, refresh, it'll now be blank and we can run yarn HTTP server. And this will do the exact same thing. And we can, and if we come over and we refresh, we'll see what's good. Now this one is a little bit more finicky. And after you make a change, like, Hey, what's good. You might have to close it and then reopen it and then refresh. So I do recommend that if you're on Visual Studio Code, you definitely just use this little go live button because it'll reflect your changes a lot nicer. So let's go ahead and hit the go live button. Hey, what's good pops up. Okay, cool. Our HTML is working perfectly.
So the title, of course, is going to be the FundMe app, which we see up here in the title section. So let's update this HTML so that it has those buttons and it can actually connect and work with our blockchain and work with any blockchain. Something else that you can do in HTML is you can actually write JavaScript inside your HTML. And the way we can do that is by doing this script tag, and then we'll do a closing script tag. And anything inside here, inside of our script tags, is going to be JavaScript. So I can do something like console.log i with a bunch of exclamation marks. I'm going to save it. We'll go back to our front end. We're going to right click. We'll hit inspect. And we'll go to the console and we can see that hi printed out. If we refresh, we can see that hi consistently printed out. Hi from script tag. We'll save it. We'll move back. And we see hi from script tag printed out. I know it's a little bit small, so let me zoom in. All right, great. So we can type our JavaScript in here. And it's inside these script tag is where we're going to write our JavaScript to write the functions that our front end is going to interact with. Now, as we saw before, in this little console, we can check for window.ethereum to see if MetaMask or is installed. And again, a lot of what we're working with is actually right in the MetaMask documentation. If you go to their basic section, they talk a little bit about the provider, which is this window.ethereum. You can read how to actually interact directly with MetaMask in the MetaMask documentation as well. Now, using window.ethereum is just one of the ways we're actually going to connect to the blockchain. There's actually multiple ways because there's multiple different kinds of wallets out there. But for now, we're just going to pretend that window.ethereum and MetaMask is the only extension out there. So what we want to do is we want to check to see if this window.ethereum exists. This is the first thing that we should be doing, because if this doesn't exist, this means that they can't connect to the blockchain. One of the first things that we're going to want to do is we're going to want to check to see if that exists. So we can do something like if we can say type of window.ethereum does not equal undefined, then we'll do console.log. I see a MetaMask. So now if we save, we come back to our front end, we do see I see a MetaMask. I've got a Google Chrome up without MetaMask that if we look in the console and we hit refresh at the same URL where our live server is running, we don't see that I see a MetaMask because it doesn't see a MetaMask. We can do else console.log, no MetaMask. We'll refresh, we still see I see a MetaMask where we have a MetaMask. You don't have to open up a browser without one, but we see no MetaMask for Chrome because it doesn't see a MetaMask. Now, what we could do is we could automatically try to connect to MetaMask if we see that there is a MetaMask, right? Remember how before, when we hit that connect button, MetaMask popped up and said, are you sure you want to connect? So what we can do is, and you can, again, you can find this in the MetaMask docs, we can run this ETH request accounts method, which is basically going to be how we connect our MetaMask. Now, this is specified by a new EIP, and in older documentations and in older tutorials, you might see ethereum.enable, which essentially does the exact same thing. So what we could do here is we could say ethereum, or excuse me, window.ethereum, dot request, and we could put method f request accounts. And we'll save that. Now, if we go back to our browser, we'll actually see, you'll actually see MetaMask go ahead and pop up and say, let's connect. So we can choose an account and we'll hit connect. We'll automatically connect our MetaMask to our website. And now if we look at our MetaMask, we can see this little connected thing. It's saying that our account one is now connected to our website. This means that the website can now make API calls to our MetaMask. We still have to be the ones to approve them, but it can go ahead and connect and try to run transactions, which is awesome, which is what we want. If you want to disconnect, we can go ahead and click that little button and hit disconnect this account. The way that we have our code currently is anytime we hit refresh, this is going to pop up, which is going to be really annoying. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to wrap this into an asynchronous function, the exact same as we've been doing. We'll do, we'll create an async function called connect and we'll wrap it up in these curly braces here. And then we'll, we'll just format this a little bit to make it look nicer. And now if we save, we go back to our website and we refresh and we go ahead and disconnect. If we refresh, MetaMask won't keep asking us, Hey, do you want to connect? Hey, do you want to connect? Hey, do you want to connect? because we need to call this connect function. The way we can do that is we can add a little button here. So right underneath our script tag, we're going to add a button tag. So this is the opening button tag, and then here's the closing button tag. And inside the opening button tag declaration, 
we'll give it an ID, which will be connect button. And we'll say on click equals the connect, the connect function. And we'll call this button connect in between these little button tags, we'll call it connect. We'll say when we click it, we'll call the connect function. So if we save, and we go back to our front end, we can now see we have a little connect button. And now if we press connect, MetaMask is going to pop up, we'll hit next and connect like that. And boom, now we are connected. And we can even do a little await here so that we await for this to finish before moving on. And then after we connect, we can say console.log connected. So let's actually go ahead and test this out. We'll go back to MetaMask. We'll disconnect here. Try to never be on mainnet if we don't have to be. And let's go ahead and run connect. We'll hit next, connect. And now we see a little console.log come out saying connected. Okay, great. We can also update our website accordingly so that we can let users know that we're connected. So we can grab the connect button element ID and say that we're connected once we're connected. So after we await to be connected, we can go ahead and, and do document dot get element by ID connect button. And then we'll say dot inner HTML equals connected like that. And then instead of saying no MetaMask down here, we'll do just the opposite. So we'll copy this line. And instead of connected, we'll say, please install MetaMask. And we'll save, we'll go back to our front end. We'll hit connect. And now if we're already connected, it'll just automatically go to connected. If we're not connected, it'll pop up, we'll get connected. And now we have this button that says connected, which is great. So now we already know that we're connected. So we've connected our MetaMask to our front end. Now we want to actually go ahead and do some functions here. And this is where we want to create some more functions and some more buttons that are going to use ethers, that package that we've become so familiar with. Now, as we code, our script section is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. So oftentimes we actually want to put our code in a JavaScript file itself. So we're going to go ahead, come over here. We're going to create a new file and we'll call it index.js. And instead of putting our JavaScript in these script tags, we're going to put it in this index and then import this index file into our HTML. And the way that we're going to do that is we're actually just going to grab this function. We're going to copy it, delete everything for now. We're going to paste it into our index.js. And then in our index.html, we're just going to tell our script tag to use index.js. So we're just going to say the source is going to be equal to dot slash index dot js. And then we're going to say the type of this is going to be text slash JavaScript. Now, if we save that and we save our index.html, we come back to our front end, we do a little refresh and we make sure that we go ahead and disconnect and we do another refresh. We can see that even with our index.js in a different file, because we're doing src equals index.js and we're importing it into our HTML, when we hit connect, it still calls our connect function. That's how we can kind of separate our JavaScript into its own JS file that we're a little bit more familiar with. Now, if you look in the GitHub repo associated with this course and you look in the index.js, you'll see our connect function, we've added some quality of life stuff. We've added some try catches just to make handling errors a little bit better. You can go ahead and add those try catches in yourself if you like, uh, but I'm not going to demo them in this video here. Now we want to create our fund function. And then later on, we're going to create our withdraw function. And this is where front end JavaScript code and Node.js are a little bit different. In Node.js, we've been using this require keyword to import dependencies. In front end JavaScript, you can't use require and it won't exactly work. Now, later on, we're going to use the import keyword, which is really the better way to do this. And this is where our first difference is going to be. Using the import keyword for front end is much better than the require keyword, especially since the require keyword doesn't actually work. 
And for those of you who might struggle with this disconnect and this change, once again, in the GitHub repo associated with this, we do have a Node.js edition of this where you can use the required keyword. You just have to go through the readme and download some packages and run some scripts that basically transform your code that uses require into code that works with imports. But we're gonna teach you the way to work with your front end code here using imports. Now you'll see when we get to Next.js that we will still download code from node modules and using a yarn.lock and a package.json, et cetera. So summary, in future seconds, we are still gonna do yarn add, but outside of a framework, when we're using this raw JavaScript, this raw HTML setup, like what we're working with here, we're not gonna be doing yarn add node modules. We'll add node modules for a framework like Next and React, but for raw JavaScript, we'll be using a different syntax, which I'll show you soon. So let's go ahead and start building our fund function here. To make our fund function, what would we normally do? Well, we'd create an async function called fund. And in this function, we probably would want to take some ETH amount as a parameter because we're gonna wanna fund it with some amount of Ethereum. When we call this function, we might wanna run console.log. We'll do a little string interpolation here. Funding with F amount, dot, dot, dot. These semicolons are gonna drive me absolutely insane. So I'm gonna add a r.prettier.rrc file into this. And I'm gonna go ahead and add prettier in here. Otherwise, I'm gonna lose my mind. So we're gonna do yarn add dash dash dev prettier, just so we can format our JavaScript with prettier, come back to index.js, I'm gonna hit command S, and it looks like it does indeed auto format with prettier now, yay. No more semicolons. We can call this fun function the same way we call connect. So in, in our index.html, maybe we'll create a new button. Button, we give it an ID of fund, we'll say on click equals fund, and we'll say fund, and this will be our button here. We save it, we look at our front end, we now have a fund button that if we call, we say funding with undefined because we're not passing it an amount here. So back in our index, console.log funding with, and we'll just wanna make sure that we can actually call that fund me function. So we'll copy this line again, and we'll say if type of window.ethereum does not equal undefined, we'll go ahead and try to fund here. To send a transaction, what are the things that we absolutely 100% always need? Well, we need a provider slash connection to the blockchain, and we need a signer slash wallet slash someone with some gas to actually send it. And then we're probably gonna need the contract that we are interacting with. And to get that contract, we're gonna need its ABI and address. And with these all together, we can send any transaction. So to get our provider, we're gonna actually go ahead and work with ethers again. Now we're gonna do it a little bit differently though. Before the way we worked with ethers is we said const ethers equals require ethers, right? And this is how we pulled ethers in. Now, like I just said to you though, require doesn't work in the front end. And we actually don't want to install ethers with a node modules package. So what we can actually do instead, is let's go to the ethers documentation. And if you go to the getting started section, scroll down, they have a section about importing using Node.js, which uses require or imports. And then they also have some documentation for working with the web browser. So instead of us doing a node module, what we'll do is we'll copy the ethers library to our own directories and serve it ourselves. So what we do is we can come in here, we can copy this massive file, which is ethers, but in front end edition and come back to our file and we'll make a new file in here called ethers. We'll do 5.6.esm.min.js and we'll paste that massive thing in here. Now, since I have prettier, when I save it, it's gonna auto format and it's just this huge file which has everything ethers, but front endified, if you will. Now what we can do is we can import this into our index.js. So instead of using require in here, we'll say import ethers from, and then we'll just refer to that file that we just got. Ethers dash 5.6.esm.min.js. Now we only need to do this weird 
copy pasting of the file import thing in this HTML JavaScript lesson. In future lessons with Node.js, we are gonna do yarn at ethers, kind of like we've normally seen. The frameworks like React and Next.js that we're gonna use are gonna automatically convert those yarn added packages to their front endified versions. But for this section, this is how we're gonna actually import the ethers package. Now, the other thing we'll have to do is on our front end, we'll have to change this from type text slash JavaScript to type module. Changing this to type module allows us to import modules into our code, which we're gonna be importing this, and we're gonna import another module as well. Awesome. And now though, if we go back to our front end, do a little refresh, hit the connect button, we'll get connect is not defined at HTML button dot on click. So instead of calling our connect button from the front end here, we're going to remove these on clicks from our index.html and go into our index.js and add those connect buttons in here. So we'll say const connect button equals document dot get element by ID connect button. And then we'll say const fund button equals doc you meant dot get element by ID fund button. The ID of the connect button is connect button. The ID of the fund button is fund button. And then we'll say connect button dot on click equals connect and fund button dot on click equals fund. We go back to our front end do a little refresh, we'll hit connect now, and it's actually working. We'll go to our MetaMask, we'll disconnect, we'll refresh, hit connect, and boom, it's popping up again. This is just due to that type being module. If it was text slash JavaScript, that on click button adding in here, but since we're doing module, we're gonna add those on clicks right in our JavaScript. But now that we've got ethers in here, what we can do is we can even do like a little console.log, just paste ethers in here, or actually better yet, we'll add it right above the connect button, we'll go back to our front end, we'll do a refresh, and we see the entire ethers object right in our front end, which is perfect, which is exactly what we want here. And since we've got these two variables here, we might as well update this to just say connect button dot enter HTML equals connected. And here as well, connect button dot enter HTML equals please install MetaMask. Because now connect button is going to be the same as running this document .get element by ID right here. And great, let's go back to continuing our fund function. So we'll say const provider equals new ethers.providers.web3provider window.ethereum. Web3 provider is an object in ethers that allows us to basically wrap around stuff like MetaMask. This Web3 provider is really similar to that JSON RPC provider, which we used before, which is where we put in exactly that endpoint, our alchemy endpoint, or when we're working with MetaMask here, whatever endpoint that we have in our network section. This Web3 provider takes that HTTP endpoint and automatically sticks it in ethers for us. So this line of code basically looks at our MetaMask and goes, ah, okay, I found the HTTP endpoint inside their MetaMask. That's going to be what we're going to use as our provider here. Since our provider is connected to our MetaMask here, we can get a signer or we can get a wallet just by running const signer equals provider.get signer. This is going to return whichever wallet is connected from the provider, which again, our provider is our MetaMask. So if we're connected, with, with account one, it's gonna return account one as the signer. If we're connected with account two, it'll return account two, et cetera. Now I'm gonna add console.log signer here and then flip to the front end now and show you what happens when we hit the fund button. We can see in here, we have our JSON RPC signer. This signer is gonna be the account that we've connected to our front end. Now we have our provider, we have our signer. Now we're gonna need our contract by getting the AVI and the address. So we're gonna to need to say const contract equals what? How are we gonna get our contract? Well, this is where we're gonna to need to know the AVI and the address 
of what we're working with. Typically, what you'll see a lot of projects do, since once a contract is deployed, the address isn't going to change, is they're going to have some type of constants file. So they'll create a new file called constants.js. And in here, they'll add the addresses and any ABIs and anything like that for us to use in our fund piece here. Now, as we're developing and as we're building this, the back end and the front end team are going to have to interact a little bit. Or if it's just you doing the full stack, you're going to have to interact with your back end. So this is why it's so important to have both your front end and your back end code nearby. So if we go back to our hardhat fund me project that we just made, we can find the ABI in here. Once again, we, if we go to artifacts, we go to contracts, we can go to fundme.soul, fundme.json, we can find the ABI right here. It's going to be this massive thing right here. So you can go ahead, you can even copy this whole thing in this little non-squiggly bracket, this little bracket here. We can copy that, and then we can come back to our constant.js, and we can just save it as a variable. We'll say export const. ABI equals and paste that in there. And then back in our index.js, we can import it with import ABI from constants. Oops. It's, okay, great. So we have the ABI. Well, what about the address? Since we're going to be running this locally, we want to get the contract address of this locally run contract. We can do that a couple of ways. One way is you can just have two windows open, one with your front end code, one with your back end code, and the one with your back end code, you can run yarn hardhat node, which will spin up our blockchain node for us and give us the address in here. Or what we can do, and this will probably be a little bit easier, is in your window with your front end code, we can create a new terminal. And now we'll have two terminals running. And in this second one, we're going to CD down, CD dot dot, and then CD hard hat, fund me, free code camp. And in here, we're going to run yarn hard hat node. And this is going to spin up our local blockchain in this second terminal in here, where we have deploying fund me, deployed at address, blah, 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 right here. And just a reminder, if I hit this X, it just hides the terminal. I can always pull it back up with terminal new terminal, and I can always hide it, but this is still running inside of my terminal. So I'm going to hide it. And what I can do is I can come back over to our constants folder. And at the top, we can do export const contract address equals, and we'll pull the terminal back up. And we'll go grab where it says Deploying fund me deployed at right here. We'll copy that address. We'll put some quotes and we'll paste it in. And now we're also exporting the contract address. And then in our index.js, we'll import the contract address with comma contract address. And now we have both the ABI and the contract address. So what we can do, we can say const contract equals new ethers.contract of and we'll pass it the contract address, we'll pass it the ABI, and we'll pass it the signer. Now we have an ethers contract object that's connected to our signer, and we have the contract address, and we have the contract ABI. Now that we have a contract object, we can go ahead and start making transactions the exact same way we've made transactions before. We can just run const transaction response equals await contract.fund and then we'll pass a value of ethers.utils.parse ether eth amount. So this is gonna be how we're gonna go ahead and create our transaction. And if you take this right now and you, we go to our front end, we give it a little refresh, make sure we're connected and we hit fund, we're gonna get this error, value must be a string. That's because eth amount right now is being passed in as nothing. Now, normally we'll pass parameters directly to our functions, but what we're going to do is for now is we're just going to hard code this. So we'll say const f amount equals, and we'll do like 77 or something. If we hit fund now, what do you think is going to happen? Well, we get this other error, insufficient funds for intrinsic transaction cost, or you might get some other error, but you're going to get a weird error here. And that's because we're not actually connected 
to our local hard hat node right now. Well, if we look at our MetaMask, we're currently not connected to the right blockchain. We're connected to RinkB or Mainnet or whatever. We need to get connected to our local host. If you look in your networks, you'll actually have a local host object here already. But let's just be super specific and we'll add a new network here. We're gonna add something called our hard hat local host. And we'll hit add network and we'll add hard hat local host in here. The RPC URL we can find from our node area, which if we scroll to where our node is running, we can copy this URL and paste it into new RPC URL. Chain ID is gonna be 31337. Currency symbol is gonna be Go or ETH, or even though this pop-up says it might have a different currency symbol Go, we're just gonna put ETH in here. And there is no block explorer, right? Because this is a local blockchain, we're not gonna have a block explorer. So we'll go ahead and hit save. And now we have an account here, which is great. We're connected to our local blockchain. And if we switch our MetaMask, we can see we're on the local hard hat and we are connected. Awesome. Let's refresh. Let's run fund one more time. And we'll see a transaction does indeed pop up. This is great. But our account here doesn't have any money. We have, we're broke. We don't have any local hard hat Ethereum. So we're actually going to need to import one of our accounts from hard hat into our MetaMask, which we can do. So, and you can actually do this for any account with a private key. So Hardhat gives us these accounts and we're gonna import the private key of account zero into our MetaMask. So we're gonna copy the private key. We're gonna come back to our front end, click on our MetaMask. We're gonna hit this big button. We're gonna hit import account, select type private key, and we're gonna paste our private key here. A quick note, if you choose JSON file, Remember how back in that ether section, we encrypted our key into a JSON file with a password. You can actually import accounts with that JSON file with the password. So if you encrypt a key and you want to add it to MetaMask, you can go ahead and add it in just like this. But for now, we're going to use private key. We'll paste the private key in and we'll hit import. And we can see we now have an account, a new account, an account three with a ton of ETH from our local blockchain. So we'll refresh one more time. We'll go ahead and connect. We'll make sure that our account three is connected. And if it's not, we'll go ahead and hit this connect button so that now our account three is what's connected here. And we'll go ahead and hit fund. And we now see that we can fund this contract. We can go ahead and hit confirm. And if we look and nothing's gonna happen on our front end because we didn't tell our front end to do anything once we confirm. But if we go to our blockchain, we can see our fund function was called. We've just made our first transaction on a blockchain from our own front end. This is awesome. Great work. But it's a, probably a little confusing to the user if nothing happens here. They're going to hit the fund function and it's going to be like, oh, uh, okay, cool. What, uh, what happens now? We probably want to make it a little bit more obvious that something just happened. And one more thing I want to show you. You don't have to follow along here. If I hit fund and then I hit reject, it's going to freak out on us and be like, hey, like you hit reject. I don't know what to do now. So we're going to make our code a little bit more robust by adding a try catch. So we'll tell JavaScript to try running this transaction. And then if it catches an error, just a console.log that error. So now if I hit fund and I hit reject, it's going to, it'll still be a little bit mad, but at least we're catching it and it's not going to break and destroy everything. Okay, cool. We've got a transaction response here. And when we hit fund, our front end goes, great, you've funded me. I'm I'm super confused. Oh, one other point, something that you'll probably run into multiple times as we're doing this. If you get an error that looks like this, ETHJS query while formatting outputs from RPC, none's too high, expect none's to be two, but got four, you will definitely see this a whole lot. Here's what you do to fix this. The reason this happens is because you've closed your hard hat node and then restarted it. And your hard hat node goes, okay, well, I'm starting fresh. I'm starting from zero, but MetaMask isn't smart enough to know that. What we want to do is we want to come to our MetaMask. We'll hit this big button. We'll go down to settings. We'll go to advanced and we'll go to reset account. And yes, we're going to reset it. This isn't something ideally that you'd like to do with an actual account with actual money. On a local network, this is fine. Now, if you reset the account and you reset the node, we can go ahead and hit confirm and it doesn't give us that error anymore.
So that's kind of the, the tip there. You want to reset the nonce so that our MetaMask and our blockchain are in sync with that nonce number. So we have this transaction response and we probably want our front end to give the user some indication, hey, the transaction went through. So what we want to do is we want to listen to the blockchain for this to finish. So we can either listen for the TX to be mined or we can listen for an event. We haven't learned about events yet, but we will. So for now, since we haven't learned about events yet, we're just going to listen for the TX to be mined. Or to listen for the transaction to be mined, we're actually going to create a new function called function listen for transaction mine. And this is going to take as input a transaction response and a provider. Now you'll notice this isn't an async function. For this section, this is intentional. We don't want this to be an async function, and you'll see why in a second. We're going to be using JavaScript's promise, JavaScript's async functionality to its massive advantage. And this is why JavaScript actually works so well in the front end, is because of how it's asynchronous. So we're going to create this function, listen for transaction to be mined. We're going to await in our fund function, and we're going to have this return a promise. Let's go ahead and let's learn how to build this. So we're going to say console.log string interpolation, we'll say mining, and then in here we'll say transaction response dot hash. All of our transaction response objects have a hash, which just represent that hash. And we'll do a couple of dot dot dot. We'll put in our console here, we're, we're waiting for the transaction to be mined. Then what we're going to do is we're going to return a new promise. And the reason we're going to return a promise is because we need to create a listener for the blockchain that we want to listen for this event to happen, but we want to tell JavaScript, hey, wait for this thing to finish looking. Wait for this thing to finish looking. Now here's where this gets a little bit tricky. In our fund function, after we create the transaction, we basically want to tell JavaScript, hey, wait for this TX to finish. So our code is going to look as simple as await listen for transaction mine, and we're going to pass it the trans action response and our provider. So we're saying, hey, listen for this transaction finish. And we're using this await keyword because again, the await keyword says, okay, we're going to stop right here. We're going to stop until this function is completely done. Now in this listen for transaction of mine, we have to define how we're actually going to listen for this. So we're going to say, listen for this transaction to finish. Ethers actually comes with a way for us to listen for transactions and listen for events, which again, we haven't learned about, but don't worry about that yet. So we can go to the ethers docs and we can look up once contract dot once. There's a whole bunch of listeners that we can use to listen for events and listen for different things to happen. We can do this thing called provider dot once where we listen for some event and once that event fires, we call some other function that we've defined. Now we haven't talked about events yet. And again, don't worry about this quite yet. One of the events that we can wait for is we can just wait for the transaction receipt to finish, right? Because once we get a transaction receipt, that means that the transaction has actually finished going through. So we're going to use this provider dot once syntax to wait for the transaction receipt, which is going to be our event which isn't really an event, but don't worry about that yet. And then we're going to call some listener function that we define. You can also do provider.on, which will trigger any time your event fires. Provider.once just triggers one time. We only care about this transaction going through one time. So we're passing our provider object. So we're going to say provider.once, our event, which is just going to be transaction response hash. Provider.on transaction response dot hash. So once we get this hash, which we'll pretty much get right away, we're going to call our listener function. Now we could create a function listener like this and then just pass listener in here. But we're going to do an anonymous function here because that's typically what we see as the syntax for these. Oops, and sorry, we're doing provider.once. To do this anonymous function, we're going to do just two little parentheses here and this arrow notation. So this by itself represents an anonymous function. So we're saying, hey, there's some function, it doesn't take any parameters, and it doesn't have any code. This arrow function, this whole thing is saying this is an anonymous function. So we're saying provider dot once transaction hash happens. Here's the function that you want to execute. It doesn't do anything right now. 
<laughs> but let's have it do something. So once this transaction.response finishes, we're going to take a trans transaction receipt as an input parameter for our, our callback function or our listener function. And all we're going to do is we're going to say console.log completed with, and a little string interpolation, transaction receipt dot confirmations, confirmations. And then completed with transaction receipt dot confirmations, confirmations. So once this provider dot once sees that there's a transaction hash, it's going to give as an input parameter to our listener function, the transaction receipt, kind of that same syntax that we've been seeing this whole time. Once the transaction response finishes, we get the transaction receipt and we can do stuff with it. And we can see how many block confirmations it has. For us, this pretty much should always be one. Now, if we save this, we go back to our front end and we hit fund, it's going to work. We're going to give the user some indication that it worked, which is great, but it's not really going to work the way that we want it to work. We had this console.log done right after we do the await listen for transaction mine and we come back and we hit fund and we hit confirm. It actually doesn't go in the order that we want it to go. It goes mining this thing and then it says done. And then it says completed with one confirmation. What, uh, what's going on here? We should write completed before we write done because that's the order that we have this in, but it looks like it's words. It's going out of order. What, what, what's going on here? What's going to happen is when we call listen for transaction mine, our listen for transaction mine function is going to kick off, but it's going to kick off provider dot once as its own process. So await listen for transaction mine will kick off the listener, but it doesn't wait for this listener to find the transaction response. So this function will actually finish before provider dot once finishes. So after it kicks off the listener, it'll run to the next line of our code, which is console dot long done. Our front end will go, Oh, Oh, you kicked off a listener earlier. Let me go back down and let me recheck to see if it's finished. And if it has finished, I'll go do what it told me to do. And this is where what's known as the event loop kicks in. We don't actually wait for this provider dot once to finish. We add this provider dot once onto this queue called the event loop. And our front end is going to periodically check back to it to see if it's finished. So we want to adjust our code. So we wait for the listener to finish listening, which is where we're going to get into promises here. So what we want to do is we want to adjust this function to now return a promise. And we're going to use this syntax a couple times in the future. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, Hey, we want to wait for the listener to finish listening. We're going to wrap this whole thing into a promise. And we're going to say return new promise. And a promise takes a function itself as an input parameter. So again, we'll use kind of this anonymous function notation, and it'll take two input parameters, resolve and reject. So resolve says, Hey, if this promise works correctly, call this resolve function. And for us, this promise is going to be done when the listener finishes listening. And then we would reject if there was some type of timeout, we're not going to write the reject function. But in the future, if you were to do this for production, you'd add some timeout as the reject parameter. Basically, you're saying, hey, once the listener finishes listening, we're going to resolve. And if it takes too long, we're going to say, ah, screw you. You took too long. And instead of closing it off here, we're going to close it off around this provider thing. So we're going to say return new promise, resolve, reject. And only once this transaction gets fired, are we going to resolve this promise like so? So what is happening here? So we're going to put the resolve inside of this provider dot once. So we're saying once this transaction hash is found, then we're going to call this function. We're going to say console.log and then we're going to resolve. So this promise only returns once a resolve or a reject is called and we're telling it only resolve only finish this function once transaction response dot hash is found because it's going to be inside of these little squiggly parentheses for provider dot once the promise right now only resolves after it's fired its event here. If this was really confusing, just copy paste this and move on. We're getting a little bit deeper into front end stuff here. 
So hopefully this was clear. If not, definitely jump into the GitHub discussions to start asking about this stuff. But now that we've updated this, we can come back to our front end, we can hit the fund button, and hopefully this time everything will go in order. We'll hit confirm, we see mining completed, and then we see done. And the reason for this is because again, our await keyword is now waiting. It says, oh, you're returning a promise. I need to await, I need to wait for it to resolve or reject. And we only resolve the promise once our provider finds this transaction hash and this transaction receipt. This is this listen for transaction mine. In future sections, all of this is gonna be abstracted away for us. So life is gonna be much easier, but it is important to understand what's actually going on here. Awesome. So now we're giving the front end some indication of what's going on. Our fund function is done. Well, no, not really. Why not? Well, because right now we're hard coding the ETH amount to 0 0.1. And on the front end, we probably don't want to hard code it. We probably want to allow users to fund as much or as little as they want. So we actually need to change this from just a button to a input form. So to do this, we're gonna go back over to our HTML. So we'll go back to index.html and we're gonna change this fund section here. We're gonna add some form information. So we're gonna keep this button as it is, or we're gonna add like a little text box to input as much ETH as they want. So I'm gonna create a label. We're gonna say it's four, it's gonna be fund. And this label we're gonna say is ETH amount. And then we're gonna close the label. This is basically just gonna create a label. And if we go back to our front end, we now just have this ETH amount label that isn't labeling anything. Now we're gonna create an input and we're gonna give it an ID of ETH amount. And we're gonna give it a placeholder of 0 0.1. And then we're gonna close the input. So now if we flip to our front end, we have ETH amount labeling this little text box with a placeholder of 0 0.1. And we can add stuff in here, you know, blah, 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 whatever. And one more thing, if you have some tags, but you don't put anything in between them, you can actually shorten it by just putting the little closing thing at the back of it like this. So if you don't have anything between your tags, you can just close them like this. These two are equivalent. Boom, 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 boom. Those are the same thing. Great. When we call fund, right now we're calling fund and we're not passing any parameters. Let's update our fund to no longer be hard coding ETH amount in here. And we'll have and we'll have our fund function populated by whatever we put in this ETH amount input box. In our fund function, instead of saying const ETH amount equals 0 0.1, we'll grab it from this ETH amount ID. So we'll say document dot get element by ID ETH amount dot value. So we're gonna grab whatever value is in this input box here. Now in our index.js, we have console.log funding with ETH amount. If in our front end, we do 1.7 and we hit fund, we now see in our console.log, it says funding with 1.7 and we'll get 1.7 in our little fund section. Confirm, it'll mine it, it'll complete it and then say done, awesome. So now we've added a little text box here so people can fund as much or as little as they want. Perfect. This whole thing can kind of be considered a form. There's also a form tag, but we're going to just use this for now. All right, great. We're doing a lot of funding, right? And we keep funding our contract with more and more ETH and we keep adding more and more stuff. We probably want a button to keep track of how much is actually in here. So let's just add a really simple balance button. And let me actually just move this down to the bottom here. Much better. So we'll say button ID equals balance button. And we'll call it get balance. Now we have a get balance button and it's not going to do anything because we don't have a get balance function. So let's go back to our index.js and we'll create a get balance function. Async function get balance. And we'll just do what we've been doing so far. If type of window.ethereum does not equal undefined. Then we're gonna do const provider equals new ethers, ethers dot providers dot web three provider of window dot ethereum. Then we'll do const balance equals await provider dot get balance contract address, which again, we're importing way up at the top. And then we'll just do console.log 
ethers dot utils dot format ether balance. This format ether function ethers utils, which you can find in the documentation to make reading ethers formatted numbers much easier to read. And then same as what we've been doing before, we're going to go up, we're going to copy this fun button line, paste it, we'll say balance button equals document dot get element by ID balance button. And then we'll say balance button dot on click equals get balance. We're going to come back to our front end. We'll do a quick refresh. We'll do get balance. And now we can see the balance in the console. We can fund with more like 1.8. We'll hit fund. MetaMask pops up. We'll go ahead and confirm. Mining completed, done. We hit get balance. And now we're at 3.8. Fantastic. All right, let's keep it going. What do we need to do next? We're going to go ahead and need our withdraw function here. So let's create that. This is going to look really similar to everything we've done so far. So on our index.html, let's create a new button that we can do by copying this whole line, paste it underneath, call this withdraw button. We'll call withdraw and we'll call this withdraw. And then in our index, we'll do the same thing. We'll copy this, paste it below. So withdraw button equals document that get element by ID. Withdraw button, withdraw button dot on click equals withdraw. So let's make a withdraw function down at the bottom. We'll go ahead, let's say async function withdraw. We'll do the exact same that we've done above. And I can even just copy everything from the get balance and just remove the balance section. If type of window dot Ethereum does not equal undefined, then we'll grab the provider here. And same as the fund contract, we'll grab the signer and the contract. So let's just grab those two lines, paste them down here. Const signer equals provider dot get signer, contract equals new contract, blah, blah, blah. Okay, cool. Now we're going to do the exact same here as we did with the fund function. So we're going to do a little try catch, and then we'll even add the catch here. Catch error, console.log error. And inside of our try, we'll do const transaction response equals await contract dot withdraw. We don't need to put any parameters in here. Oh, and then actually let's do a little console dot log withdrawing, and then we'll get this transaction response. And then we'll listen for this transaction to get mined as well by running await listen for transaction mine transaction response comma provider. And that's it. Since we can reuse the functionality from our listen for transaction mine. So now we'll refresh, we'll make sure we're connected, we'll check the current balance, which is 3.8. Now we'll go ahead and withdraw. We see our little withdrawing console.log. We'll hit confirm. And it looks like we've completed it. If we look in our MetaMask, our balance will have been increased by the amount that was added here. And now if we hit balance, we do indeed see zero. We can even double check that this is actually working. We can see our balance is 9.99. Let's go ahead and even fund this with 99 ETH. Go ahead, confirm. Looks like it's completed. Our MetaMask now shows 99.00. And if we go ahead and withdraw, confirm, the withdraw has gone through and we can see our balance is back up to 9999. And now let's just go back and change. Hey, what's good. We'll refresh our front end. And now we can see you've done it. We've created a minimalistic website that allows us to connect to the blockchain and call functions from a front end and from a website. This is absolutely massive. You should be incredibly proud and incredibly excited with yourself. Now, this is definitely a minimalistic version, and we're going to work with more powerful and more modern front end frameworks. But this will give you an idea of exactly what's going on behind the scenes when we're working with those more advanced front ends. And we'll style them up so they look a little bit better than this. But with that being said, you've just learned the basics of how these front ends work. And now that you know how to push things up to Git, I highly recommend you start pushing all of these projects up to your GitHub. They will be a record that you've actually done the work and you've built these smart contracts. And if you're looking to get an internship down the line, if you're looking to help other GitHub projects, 
this will be a record of, hey, I can do this. Look at what I can build. Look at what I know how to do. So congratulations on your first full stack or your first front end application. Before we move on, let's do a quick refresher of everything we've learned here. So number one, typically you want the repository or your code base for your back end for your smart contracts to be a different repository than your front end. Your front end code is going to be a combination of HTML and JavaScript. When we have a wallet like MetaMask, we're injecting these browser based wallets into the window object of our browsers like window.ethereum. Each browser will have a different extension here. The reason we do this, we want to connect to the RPC URL that's built into our MetaMasks. And in this way, we're making the same API calls to an RPC URL as we do in hard hat, as we do in remix, as we do in ethers, etc. We created our first promised based function where we had a listener kick off and we wrapped it in a promise to say, hey, we want to wait for our listener to finish. Since this is a promise based function, we said await, listen for transaction mine, and we waited for this transaction to finish so that on our front end, once our transaction finished going through, we could tell the user it's finished going through and we can continue doing other stuff. Give yourself that round of applause and let's move on to the next section. All right, welcome to the next section. We are now on lesson nine, our hard hat smart contract lottery, which again, all the code for this section is gonna be available in the GitHub repo associated with this course. All right, so let me show you what we're about to build. I'm gonna show you the front end, but again, you don't have to do the front end if you don't want, but the front end does give us a nice way to visualize the lottery that we're building here. We're building an application that allows users completely decentralized to allow users to engage in a fair, a verifiably random lottery. This is the application that would actually fix the McDonald's issue that we talked about much earlier. So first we got this connect wallet button that we're gonna click to connect to MetaMask. And here we're actually gonna show you how to connect to more than just MetaMask. Wallet Connect, Trust Wallet, Math Wallet, any of these wallets, and we'll show you how to customize even more. So we're gonna connect to MetaMask here. We'll choose our account that we imported in from Hardhead. We're gonna choose Next, we're gonna choose Connect. And remember, for our front end bit, we're gonna to go to Settings, Advanced, Reset Account, if we're working with a brand new Hardhead blockchain. Now, the front end doesn't look super nice, but we have an Enter Raffle button, and we have a little bit of UI talking about the current number of players and then the most previous winner of our raffle. So we can go ahead and enter the raffle and allow anybody to pay 0.1 ETH to enter our smart contract. We get a little transaction saying transaction complete and we get the current number of players is one. We can continue to enter the raffle and anybody can enter this raffle and this the smart contract will keep track of all of the players in here. We're gonna run this on a timer. The lottery is gonna automatically trigger somebody to win. And to do this, to get a pure verifiably random number, we're gonna be using Chainlink VRF to get a pure verifiably random number. And then we're gonna use Chainlink Keepers to trigger the automation to automatically have one of these winners get picked every time one of those time intervals is up. Once the keepers kick it off, they will pick a winner. Our decentralized lottery will say the most previous winner is so-and-so and they will get all the money from this lottery, making a perfectly fair decentralized lottery. We're gonna call our contract raffle.soul, but you can call lottery.soul or really whatever you want. And we're gonna make it look really, really nice. So now we're back in our Visual Studio Code. This is gonna be the project. If you learn this, you have the skills to learn all, all the rest of these smart contract concepts, and you are gonna be able to do great things in this space. This is gonna be your flagship project. This is gonna be the one that you can be the most excited and the most proud about for this tutorial. So let's go ahead and let's create a new folder. So we're gonna do MKDIR, hard hat, smart contract lottery, FCC, or smart contract raffle, whatever you wanna call it. Then we're gonna CD into our hard hat, smart contract lottery free code camp, and we're gonna type code, period, or we're gonna open this up in a new folder, however we choose to do so. Now that we're in our new folder, we're gonna create our new hard hat project. So we're gonna do yarn add dash dash dev hard hat. And we'll get our node modules, our package.json and our yarn.lock. Now we'll do yarn hard hat to get started with a new project. And we're just gonna select create an empty hardhat.config.js because we know what a basic project looks like and we're gonna give this project the customizations that we wanna see. We're gonna create an empty hardhat.config and now in here we have a blank hardhat.config.js with almost nothing in here. So we're starting completely from scratch. 
Now we're going to add all of our dependencies in here. And oftentimes you'll add these sequentially as you build, but we're just going to add them all in one line. And there are a lot of them. So we've left a copy pasteable section of the full blockchain Solidity course JS for you to just copy paste so you can install everything in one go. So grab that line and it's going to have everything that we've been talking about. And we'll just hit enter and we'll install all of these. And as you create more and more projects, you'll get the feel of what you like for your dependencies and what tools that you like to use. Remember, at the end of the day, the tool that's best for you and best for the job is the tool that you like the most. There never really is a one tool fits all. There's almost always going to be trade offs. All right. Now that we have all those dependencies installed, if we look at our package.json, we'll have this massive dev dependencies, we'll have everything in node modules, we'll have everything in yarn.lock. And of course, as we know, in order for any of these to actually work, we need to add them into our hard hat config. Now, there's a lot of stuff to add in here as well. So like, once again, if you want to come to the hard hat smart contract lottery FCC and go to the hard hat config, you can just copy paste everything and place it into your project so that you don't have to always type everything out yourself. Namic Labs, Hardhead Waffle, Namic Labs, Hardhead Etherscan, Hardhead Deploy, Solidity Coverage, Hardhead Gas Reporter, Hardhead Contract Sizer, which we haven't talked about yet, but we will, don't worry, and then require.env.config. And as you all know, all these little semicolons are popping up and those are going to drive me absolutely crazy. So once again, we can create a dot prettier RC. And if you wanna copy this as well from one of your previous projects, feel free to do so. One thing that I added in here was a print width of 100. This just changes how long a line can be before it goes onto a new line. That's the only difference here. Now, if we go to our config and hit save, huh, they go away. Thank goodness. <laughs> now, if we look at our Solidity version, we're currently using 0.7.3. Let's go ahead and update that to 8.8 .8 or 8.7 or whatever you want to use. Now that we have all the basics set up, we can begin coding our smart contracts. So we first need to create a new folder called contracts where we're going to store all of our contracts. And let's go ahead and create a new file called lottery.soul or raffle.soul or whatever you want to call it. I'm going to call mine raffle.soul. And you might see this indexing thing happen from time to time. It's our hard hat solidity extension indexing all of our node modules. So it knows how to highlight things and knows how to work with everything in our solidity files. So that's what happens when that pops up. Now, before we jump in and create it, let's figure out what we're going to do. So we're going to create our raffle contract. And what do we want people able to do? Well, we probably want people to be able to enter the lottery, you know, paying some amount. We're probably going to want to be able to pick a random winner, but we want this to be verifiably random. We want this to be untamper with a bull. And we also want winner to be selected every X minutes or years or months, AKA we want this to be completely automated. So we want to deploy the smart contract and almost have no maintenance, almost have nobody ever have to touch it again. And it'll just automatically run forever. This is the power of smart contracts. As we know, since we're picking a random number and we have some event driven execution, we know that we're going to need to use a chain link Oracle since we're going to need to get the randomness from outside the blockchain. And we're going to need to have that automated execution because a smart contract can't execute itself. We need somebody to automatically trigger these. So to trigger selecting a winner, we're going to have to use the chain link keepers. And that's pretty much going to be our entire code. Now, I usually like to do this before I start any project. And the reason that I, I do a little bit of brainstorming is because we don't want to just jump in and really do anything. We want to have a good idea of what we're trying to build so that we can write tests for it so that we can know if we're going in the right direction, etc. Now that we have a good idea of where we're going, let's build it. So per usual, let's do SPDX license identifier, MIT, we'll do pragma solidity, little carrot here, 0.8.7, we'll even zoom out just a hair, we'll trash that, we'll say contract, raffle. And we can even make sure that we're not going crazy by doing a little yarn, hardhead compile and compiled successfully. We want it to be able to enter the lottery, we want users to be able to enter it. So Maybe we'll create a function called enter raffle. What else do we want to do? We want to be able to pick a random winner. So maybe we'll create a function called pick random winner. And boom. So 
So let's comment out the pick random winner for now. And let's just work on this enter raffle thing. In the past, we've created projects like FundMe where, where people can send Ether to our contracts or send whatever native blockchain token to our smart contracts using the message.value based off of some USD value. For this one, we're just going to have the entrance fee instead be USD based. It's just going to be that native asset. So for our enter raffle, we don't have to set a USD price. We can just set a minimum ETH price. So up at the top, let's pick our minimum price. So we'll do a UN256 entrance fee. And now some of our learnings from our last section should come in here. We now know that this entrance fee is going to be a what? It's going to be a storage variable. So let's prepend it with S underscore. Let's make it a private variable because we always want to set our visibility. But let's have the entrance fee be configurable. Well, let's create a constructor now and we'll have this entrance fee be settable in our constructor. So our constructor will take a uint 256 entrance fee S underscore entrance fee equals entrance fee. Well, if we're going to only set this one time, we might as well make this a constant or an immutable variable. So let's make this an immutable variable so that we save some gas. We'll change this from S to I. And now we're saying UN256 private immutable I entrance fee equals entrance fee. Now we probably are going to want other users to see the entrance fee. So down below, we can create function get entrance fee. And this will be a public view function, which will returns a UN256. And we'll just say return I entrance fee. Now we have a function that users can call to get the entrance fee, but we as developers can use this I entrance fee to know, ah, this is an immutable variable. This is pretty cheap gas wise for us to read from. In our enter raffle, we've done a ton of these before. All we need to do is we just need to require the message.value is greater than that I underscore entrance fee. But we've learned before about those error codes. So we could use require message.value, or we could do one of these custom errors, which is gonna be a lot more gas efficient because instead of storing this string, we're just gonna store an error code in our smart contract. So let's do that instead. We'll say if the message.value is less than our I entrance fee, then we're just gonna revert the whole transaction with some error code. And we'll use our best practice naming raffle underscore underscore not enough ETH entered. And we'll grab this arrow code and we'll have, if the user doesn't send enough value, we'll revert with not enough ETH entered. Now that we know they're calling enter raffle with enough value, we're probably gonna wanna keep track of all the users who actually enter our raffle. That way, when we pick a winner, we know who's in the running. So let's create an array of players at the top error here. And then just to make this look even nicer, we'll do a little comment here and we'll say state variables. And we'll combine both our storage and our not storage variables just in this state variable section. So we'll do address array players. Now players, of course, is going to have to be in storage because we're going to modify this a lot. We're going to be adding and subtracting players all the time. So we're going to do s players. We'll make this private as well. And we're going to make this address payable players because one of these players wins, we're going to need to have to pay them. So we'll make this address payable private as players. And since we're going to make this private and it's probably good that we know who's in the players array, we'll even do function get player. This will be a public view that returns an address of one of these players. And we'll just return s players of index. And we'll have this function take a UN256 index as an input parameter. We know that players is going to be a storage variable and we're going to add it to our enter raffle. Oh, and we definitely want our enter raffle to be public and to be payable. Since we're having people send message value and we want anyone to be able to enter our raffle. So it'll be public, it'll be payable, it'll be perfect. Now that we have our array and someone's entered the raffle, we'll do s players dot push message dot sender. Now this doesn't actually work because message.sender isn't a payable address. So we'll need to typecast it as a payable address just by wrapping it in payable. So now we have a way to keep track of all the players that are entering our raffle. Now, one of the concepts that we haven't gone over yet is actually going to be events. And events are really important to our smart contracts. Whenever we update a dynamic object, like an array or a mapping, we always want to emit an event. 
when we get to lesson 10 and then especially lesson 15 with the Next.js NFT marketplace, these events will make a ton of sense, especially for front end developers. So right now, events might be a little bit of a weird thing for you as we explain it, but as we continue on, they'll start to make more and more sense. So we're going to start adding events to our smart contracts whenever we update one of these dynamically sized data structures. And to learn more about events and how to use them, we're going to watch another video that explains all about events. You can absolutely follow along with this video as a side project, but let's learn all about events. Now, if you've worked with Solidity, you've probably seen these things called events before. Or maybe you haven't seen something like events, but you've always wondered how Chainlink or the graph or some of these other off-chain protocols work under the hood. And in this video, we're going to learn about logging and events in Solidity, viewing those events on Etherscan, and then working with them in Hardhat. Now, it's the Ethereum Virtual Machine, or EVM, that makes a lot of these blockchains tick, like Ethereum. And the EVM has this functionality called a logging functionality. When things happen on a blockchain, the EVM writes these things to a specific data structure called its log. We can actually read these logs from our blockchain nodes that we run. In fact, if you run a node or you connect to a node, you can make a F get logs call to get the logs. Now inside these logs is an important piece of logging called events. And this is the main piece that we're gonna be talking about today. Events allow you to print information to this logging structure in a way that's more gas efficient than actually saving it to something like a storage variable. These events and logs live in this special data structure that isn't accessible to smart contracts. That's why it's cheaper, because smart contracts can't access them. So that's the trade-off here. We can still print some information that's important to us without having to save it in a storage variable, which is gonna take up much more gas. Each one of these events is tied to the smart contract or account address that emitted this event in these transactions. Listening for these events is incredibly helpful. Let's say, for example, you want to do something every time somebody calls a transfer function. Instead of always reading all the variables and, and looking for some to flip and switch, all you have to do is say, listen for event. So a transaction happened, an event is emitted, and we can listen for these events. This is how a lot of off-chain infrastructure works. When you're on a website and that website reloads when a transaction completes, it actually was listening for that transaction to finish, listening for that event to be emitted so that it could reload or it could do something else. It's incredibly important for front ends. It's also incredibly important for things like Chainlink and the graph. In the Chainlink network, a Chainlink node is actually listening for request data events for it to get a random number, make an API call, or et cetera. Sometimes there are way too many events and you need to index them in a way that makes sense so that you can query all these events that happen at a later date. The graph listens for these events and stores them in the graph so that they're easy to query later on. So events are incredibly powerful and they have a wide range of uses. They're also good for testing and some other stuff, but you get the picture, they're really sick. Now that we know what events are, let's look at what they look like, how we can use them and how we might use them in our smart contract development suite. Now here's what an event is going to look like. We have an event here called stored number. So we have basically a new type of event called stored number. We're saying, hey, Solidity, hey, smart contract, we have this new event thing. We're gonna be emitting things of typed stored number in the future. When we emit this event, it's gonna have these four parameters. It's gonna have a uint 256 for called old number, a uint 256 called new number, a uint 256 called added number, and an address called sender. Now for the astute people here, you might have noticed that there is another keyword in here, the indexed keyword, and this is a really important keyword. When we emit one of these events, there are two kinds of parameters. There are the indexed parameters and the non-indexed parameters. You can have up to three indexed parameters and they're also known as topics. So if you see a topic, you know that that's going to be an indexed parameter. Indexed parameters are parameters that are much easier to search for and much easier to query than the non-indexed parameters. In fact, way back in that fgetlogs function, it even has a parameter allowing us to search for specific topics. So it's much more searchable than the non-indexed ones. The non-indexed ones are harder to search because they get ABI encoded and you have to know the ABI in order to decode them. Now this just told our smart contract that there is a new type of stored number, a new kind of event here. We need to actually emit that event in order to store that data into the logging data structure of the EVM. To do that, we need to do something that looks like this. 
This is what it looks like when we emit an event. It looks very similar to calling a function. So you call emit and then the name of the event and then you add all the parameters in there that you like. Here's the full example of a smart contract that has an event and is gonna be the example that we walk through in hard hat. Now in this smart contract, whenever anybody calls the store function, we're going to emit this event. Here's an example of a transaction where we called the store function with a value of one. Let's look into the logs to see what this event actually is gonna look like. An event is gonna be broken down like so. The address of the contract or account the event is emitted from, the topics are the index parameters of the event, data. This is the ABI encoded non-index parameters of the event. What does this mean? This means that we took those parameters that were non-indexed, we matched them together with their ABI or application binary interface, pumped them through an encoding algorithm, and boom, this is what we got. If you have the ABI, they're very easy to decode. If you don't have the ABI, they are very hard to decode. These non-indexed parameters cost less gas to pump into the logs. Now in this particular contract, since we have verified the code, we verified the contract, Etherscan knows what the ABI is and we can view this in dec or decoded mode. Hex mode is obviously the non-decoded mode or in its raw hex or hexadecimal or encoded mode. You can read more about the layout of these events in the Solidity docs. Now, so that's the basic introduction of events. And for those of you who want to watch the rest of that video and who want to actually practice using events yourself, there's a link to these videos and the code repository associated with that video if you want to play with it and if you want to learn more. So feel free to refer back to the full blockchain Solidity course JS if you want to go deeper into events. Now that we're back and we've learned a little bit more about events, let's add some events to this contract. Remember, these events get emitted to a data storage outside of this smart contract. Let's create an event called raffle enter, a good syntax for naming events, name events with the function name reversed. So for enter raffle, we're gonna say raffle entered. So up at the top, below our state variables, but above our constructor, we'll create a new section called events, and we'll create our first event. So we'll do event raffle enter, and we'll just have this raffle enter take one index parameter. It'll be an address indexed player. So in our enter raffle, we're gonna say emit raffle enter, and we're just gonna pass it message.sender. And I'm gonna remove these comments for now, but feel free to leave them in as you code along. Now in this part of my raffle coding or my lottery coding process, I probably would start already writing some tests and already writing some deploy scripts. The reason that we do this is it's good to test our functionality as we progress. And oftentimes when I'm writing smart contracts, I'm constantly flipping back and forth between my deploy scripts, my contracts, and my tests to make sure everything is doing exactly what I want it to do. For the purpose of this course, and just to make it easy for you to learn and follow along, we're not gonna do that. And we're just gonna keep writing their smart contract almost to complete and then move to our deploy scripts and tests. So in its minimalistic sense, we essentially have a way for people to enter our raffle. Now we need a way to pick the random winner. And this is where we're gonna need Chainlink VRF and Chainlink Keepers. So let's again watch some sub lessons about learning about Chainlink VRF and learning about Chainlink Keepers. We've made some videos about these before, so we're just gonna play these videos so you can learn about how Chainlink VRF version two works and also how Chainlink Keepers works. Then we're gonna come back and we're gonna add them into our contracts here. If you're already familiar and you already play with them, feel free to skip those sections and we'll just get to building them here. Hi, my name is Steven Fluin, and today we're going to be taking a look at Chainlink's VRF version 2. VRF version 2 has a few different mental models that we should be aware of, and I want to show you what it feels like to be using it. The big important thing to know about VRF version 2 is that instead of the VRF1 model where you'd be funding your contract with Link, instead you're going to be funding a subscription, which is basically an account that allows you to fund and maintain balance for multiple consumer contracts. Let's dive into the docs and see what using VRF v2 looks and feels like. In order to show this off a little bit, I'm going to dive right into the get a random number guide in the Chainlink documentation. And so it's going to go through a few of the requirements of some of the technology we're going to use today. And the first thing it's going to ask us to do is to make sure that we are on the Rinkby testnet. So let's go ahead and jump over to Rinkby, make sure my MetaMask is unlocked here. And now that I'm on Rinkby, great, uh, I should be able to use the VRF version 2 testnet. Now we're going to jump over to subscription manager. And the subscription manager is where we're going to manage our subscription account. Basically, this is the place that you put the funds in order to be able to use it across a bunch of different chains. 
So we're going to go ahead and connect our wallet here in order to use the subscription app. And then we're going to go ahead and create a new subscription. So we'll just use my address as the subscription address here. I'll approve the creation. And as soon as that transaction is confirmed, our subscription should be created. All right, now we have a subscription. Basically, this is the account where we're going to fund it. And then we can use that account for all of our randomness requests. So I'm going to go ahead and just put in 10 link here. You can put in however much you want. The price in link of every random number you request is going to be based on the current gas rates on a given chain, as well as the gas lane that you've chosen. All right, our funds have been added. Let's go ahead and add a consumer contract. So it's asking us for a consumer address. We don't actually have a consumer address yet. So let's go ahead and jump over to the documentation and create a contract that is going to request a number. So if you scroll down, you're going to see this VRF 2 consumer.soul contract that we can open in Remix. Let's just jump right there. We're going to notice a few different things in this contract. At the top, we've got uh, some imports. So now you've got VRF consumer base version two. We've got an interface for the VRF coordinator and then also a reference to the link token interface. So uh, all of those are specified for you on the RinkB network here in the example code. Uh, and then you can refer to the documentation for whatever chain you're going to be deploying to. Uh, and then you're going to see a few new options here. So the key hash option is the way that you specify that gas lane that was described in the documentation. So depending on the key hash you choose for the given chain you're on, the gas limit will be set differently for your random number request. So for example, on Ethereum mainnet, we have a 200 GUI key hash, a 500 GUI key hash, and a 1000 GUI key hash. You can also see in our contract here that we have a callback gas limit that you're in charge of. So depending on how much gas you're willing to spend in the fulfill random number, uh, you should set this value appropriately. Uh, next up is request confirmations. So this it was something in Vera v1 that you could not control, but here now, depending on the chain you're on, depending on the request and the type uh, nature of the request you wanna make, you can actually change this number. And then one of the most important and useful features that gives you a lot more flexibility and control of your VRF is you can actually specify the number of random numbers you want. And so you specify the num words, and then that will specify how many random UNT 256s you get back from the network. All right, here in the constructor, we're going to see a address for the coordinator and address for the link token. And then you'll see that the subscription ID is going to be created as we deploy the contract. And so um, I'm going to go ahead and get that. So if you remember when we created the subscription, after we funded it, we see the subscription ID. And now when I deploy this, I'm going to use that subscription ID. And we've got two methods that should look very familiar. We've got a uh, fulfill randomness method that takes in the randomness this is going to be fulfilled by the VRF Oracle, as well as you've got request random words, which is how we're actually going to initiate that request to the Oracle. So I think we're actually already ready to go ahead and deploy this. So let's jump to the deploy screen here and select the right contract, which in our case is Vera V2 consumer. And I'm going to make sure that I am on injected web three so that we can actually deploy to the rink B network. Uh, and I'm going to paste in the subscription ID here and I'm going to deploy. Let's go ahead and pay for that transaction. And as soon as that is confirmed by the network, uh, we'll show up here and we'll be able to copy this address and then add that as a consumer and authorize this contract to use my subscription account. So let's go ahead and authorize this with another MetaMask transaction. All right, we can now view our subscription. We can see how much link we funded it with and we can see our consumer contract. So now by doing this, we've authorized our consumer contract to make requests for randomness. So let's go ahead and make a request for randomness here. So we're going to go back to our contract that we deployed here. And we're just going to use the Remix interface here to keep things simple. And I'm going to request some randomness. So obviously, this is going to use all of the uh, configuration that I specified in my contract, which is kind of hard coded here. So we're going to get two words of randomness here. So we're going to hit request randomness, confirm the rink B transaction. And then as soon as that transaction comes back, we should notice that we actually have a request. And then what we'll be doing is we'll be waiting for the Oracle to call fulfill random words on our contract. And then we'll be storing all of those random words in this S random words storage variable. Let's go ahead and check to see if our random numbers come back from the Oracle. So I'll go in here into random words and let's request the zeroth item of the array. Looks like we've got a random number there. And because we requested two random numbers, we should also have an item in index one. All right, we've got our randomness there. And if we go back to the subscription manager app, you're going to see that there's actually an event history item here. 
we'll see that we spent about 0.33 link to get those two random numbers. We've just taken a journey to see what it looks like and feels like to use VRF version 2. Now that we've learned a little bit more about Chainlink VRF, I hope that you took some time to go to docs.chain.link and play around with it a little bit so that you understand what's really going on. We're going to use this sample contract in here to create our function that's going to pick our random winner. This is an on-chain contract that coordinates with a verifiably random Chainlink node to give us a random number. You could look at the code directly on chain, or you can come right to the Chainlink GitHub and look at all the code for how this is actually happening provably and randomly. And we'll have a link to this in the GitHub repo associated with this course. So we're gonna create our function here called pick random winner. This function is gonna be called by the Chainlink Keepers network so that this can automatically run without us having to interact with it. And actually, while we're updating this, I wanna add some, some stars here saying, view slash pure functions. Now our pick random winner function, we're actually not gonna make public, we're gonna make external. External functions are a little bit cheaper than public functions because Solidity knows that our own contract can't call this. We're actually gonna change the name of this function as well very soon, but we'll get to that in a little bit. So in order for us to pick a random winner, we actually have to do two things. We first have to request the random number, and then once we get it, do something with it. So Chainlink VRF is a two transaction process, and this is actually intentional. Having random numbers in two transactions is actually also much better than having it in one. If it's just one transaction, then people could just brute force try simulating calling this transaction, and we'll learn how to simulate calls soon, simulate calling these transactions to see what they can manipulate to make sure that they are the winner. We want to make sure that this is absolutely fair and nobody can manipulate our smart contract into having them be the winner of the lottery. This function is actually going to request it, and then in a second func, the random number is going to be returned, and in the transaction that we actually get the random number from the Chainlink network, that's when we're going to actually send the money to the winner. And if we go to the Chainlink documentation, the function that the Chainlink node calls is this function called fulfill random words. This is going to be the requesting one, which we could even change this to request random winner to make it more clear. And then we'll make function fulfill random words. And this is going to be an internal override which we'll explain in a little bit. Now, fulfill, fulfill random words basically means we're fulfilling random numbers. The word comes from a computer science terminology, but you can basically just think of this as fulfill random numbers because we can get multiple random numbers. Now, in order to make our, our raffle contract VRFable, we have to import the Chainlink code. We can go back to the documentation and we're just gonna grab this bottom line and we'll grab the top line in a second. So we're gonna do import. I'm gonna write it out, but if you wanna copy paste, you can at chainlink slash contracts slash src slash v0.8 slash vrf consumer base v2 dot sol. And since we're importing at chainlink slash contracts, we're gonna need to add that in by running yarn add dash dash dev at chainlink slash contracts. Now that we have this in here, we should be able to import like so, and we're gonna need to make our raffle vrf consumer baseable. We're going to need to inherit VRF consumer base. Go into our node modules at Chainlink SRC V08, VRF consumer base V2. It comes with this function fulfill random words. And you can see it's an internal virtual function. Virtual means it's expecting to be overridden. The reason that it's in this VRF consumer base V2 is so that the VRF coordinator, which we'll use in a bit, knows that it can call this fulfill random words function. And this is the function that we're overriding. So back in our raffle.soul, we're going to inherit it by doing is VRF consumer base V2. And now if we scroll down to fulfill random words, we can add in the input parameters fulfill fulfill random words, which are going to be UN256 request ID and UN256 a memory array random words. And if we hit save, our linter will now notice, ah, okay, this is what I'm expecting. I'm expecting us to override fulfill random words, which takes these parameters. Now, if we look in our docs, in our constructor, we need to pass the VRF consumer base V2's constructor and pass that VRF coordinator. Again, this VRF coordinator is the address of the contract that does the random number verification. So right next to our constructor, we'll add the VRF consumer base V2 constructor, and we need to pass the VRF coordinator V2 address. So in our main constructor, we'll add that as a parameter as well. So we'll say address VRF 
coor denator v2. And then we'll pass this as a parameter for the VRF consumer base v2. Now that we have that, we shouldn't see that little underscore anymore. And we should be able to run yarn hard hat compile. Awesome. And we can see compile two files successfully and our code is working great. Now, something that I often do is I actually hate running yarn hard hat all the time because that's too many keys for my little brain to work with. I would prefer to write as little keys as possible. Hard hat also would like us to write as little keys as possible. So hard hat comes with a shorthand and autocomplete. Hard hat shorthand is an NPM package that installs a globally accessible binary called HH that runs the project's locally installed hard hat and supports shell autocompletion for tasks. So what we can do is we can install with NPM like this, but we're going to install it with yarn. We're going to run yarn global add hard hat shorthand. And what this is going to do, we can see here installed hard hat shorthand with binaries HH and hard hat completion. Now, instead of running yarn hard hat compile, which we can still run, we can just run HH compile. Running HH is going to be the same thing as if we had just run the hard hat command for our local directory. So now we need to actually have our request random winner function request a random winner. So let's go back to the documentation and we'll see how to do that. We can look at this function request random words and see exactly how it works. On the VRF coordinator address, we go ahead and call this request random words function. We're going to need to call this function on the coordinator contract. To get the coordinator contract, we're going to use the VRF v2 coordinator interface and the VRF coordinator address. So we're going to want to keep track of those. We can do that once again in our constructor. We have the address being passed to our VRF consumer base. Let's also keep it as a state variable for us. First, let's get the interface so we can interact with that contract. We can import that from Chainlink as well by doing import at Chainlink slash contracts slash SRC slash V0.8 slash interfaces slash VRF coordinator V2 interface dot sol. And now that we import this interface, same as we did with price feeds, we can do VRF coordinator v2 interface, VRF coordinator. And then we can save this VRF coordinator using the address. So we can say VRF coordinator equals this address VRF coordinator v2. And we're just going to wrap that address around the interface so that now we can work with this VRF coordinator contract. Now we're only going to set our VRF coordinator one time right in our constructor. So what's the best thing that we can do here? Private immutable, you gosh darn right. Let's do private immutable VRF coordinator, and we'll change the name to I underscore VRF coordinator so that we know that VRF coordinator is indeed an immutable variable. In order to request the random word, we need to give it a number of parameters. I'm going to go ahead and copy this line into our contract just so that we can talk about exactly what's going on with it. And we don't need the S request ID. And instead of coordinator, we're going to do I underscore VRF coordinator. So we're going to call request random words on that VRF coordinator contract. And we need to pass it the key hash or the gas lane. I prefer calling it the gas lane. If we go to the chain link docs, we go to contract addresses, and we scroll down, we can see different gas lanes and different configuration parameters for different networks. This key hash is going to be the gas lane of the key hash, which tells the chain link node the maximum price you're willing to pay for your gas in way. If, for example, gas prices skyrocket and it's going to cost you a ton of money to get that random number, setting a ceiling will make it so that that random number doesn't come back. For us to pick a gas lane, we're probably going to want to have this gas lane or this key hash stored somewhere. So let's go ahead and make that a parameter of our constructor as well, and we'll save that as a state variable. So we'll do comma bytes 32 gas lane or key hash or whatever you want to call it, and then we'll make a new state variable. And we're only going to set this once, so we'll make this a private immutable i underscore gas lane. And then we'll say i gas lane equals gas lane. So now we can just swap this out for i underscore gas lane. OK, what's next? We need a subscription ID. The subscription ID is going to be the subscription that we need for funding our requests. There's actually a contract on chain which we can use to fund any subscription for any of these external data or external computation bits. And in this contract, there's a list of these subscriptions for people to make requests to. So we need the ID of the subscription that we're using to request our random numbers and pay the link Oracle gas. 
the subscription ID is probably also going to be something we're going to pass as a parameter to our lottery. So once again, let's scroll up to our constructor. We'll add a new parameter. And our subscription ID actually doesn't need to be a uint 256. It can actually be a little bit smaller with a uint 64. So we'll pass a uint 64 subscription ID. We'll make a uint 64. Since we're only going to set this once, we'll make this a private immutable I underscore subscription ID. And down here, we'll say I subscription ID equals sub subscription ID. All right, awesome. So now we can change this to our subscription ID. Okay, what's next? Request confirmations. Request confirmations is a UN16, which says how many confirmations the Chainlink node should wait before responding. So if you make a request and there's only one block confirmation, maybe you don't actually send it because you know you're afraid of some type of blockchain reorganization or something. We're not going to worry too much about this, and we're actually just going to make this a constant of three. So we're not even going to have this be parameterizable. We're going to have this one be a constant. So we'll say a uint 16 private constant request confirmations equals three. And we're using the caps lock and underscores for our constant variables here. And now we'll grab request confirmations and stick it in right here. What's next? Callback gas limit. The callback gas limit is going to be the limit for how much gas to use for the callback request to your contracts to fulfill random words. This sets a limit for how much computation our fulfilled random words can be. This is a good way to protect ourselves from spending way too much gas if, for example, we accidentally code our contract in a way where fulfill random words is incredibly gas expensive. It'll block the random number from responding. We are gonna make this parameterizable because we wanna change it depending on how we code our fulfill random words. So in our constructor, let's add one more. We'll add uint32, since the size of this is a uint32, callback gas limit, and we'll save this up top as a uint32 private immutable i underscore call back gas limit, and we'll save this i callback gas limit equals callback gas limit. And then we'll take this and we'll stick it here. All right, we got one more. Number of words. This is going to be how many random numbers that we want to get. We only want one. So we're going to go back up to the top. We're going to create a uint32. And we'll make this also a private constant num words equals one. Because we only want one random number. And then that'll be the last thing we need to add for our IVRF coordinator dot request random words. Now this request random words function returns a request ID, a uint256 request ID, a unique ID that defines who's requesting this and, and all this other information. If we want to save it, we can do a uint256 request ID, IVRF coordinator request random words. Now, for now, we are going to emit an event with this request ID, and we'll go over why we're going to do that a little bit later. Create a new event at the top, and we're not going to follow the naming convention here because we're going to change the name of our functions a little bit, but we're going to call this requested raffle winner. And we're going to take a uint256 indexed request ID. Down here, we're going to do emit requested raffle winner request ID. And now we have a function that we can use to request a random winner using Chainlink VRF. Now, again, we're going to set this up so that the Chainlink keepers call this on an interval, but we'll do that in a little bit. For now, let's figure out what to do once we get that random number. Well, once we get that random number, we're going to want to pick a random winner from our array of players up here. So what do we do? Well, let's go in here. And let's pick a random winner using something called the module function. Now we're going to get an array back of random words or random numbers, if you will. Since we're only requesting one random word, this random words array is going to be of size one with one random word in it. Now this random word is a uint256. So this random word could be something like Bliss. well, obviously without the hyphens, but it could be something absolutely massive like that. Our players array is only going to be so big. So how do we get a random winner from this potentially massive random number? We can use something called the modulo function. The module operation a mod n yields the remainder r after the division of an operand a by the blah, 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 blah. So what does this mean? Well, we can use the mod function to get a random number out of our players array. So let's say our players array, or excuse me, our s players array is of size 10 and a random number is 200. 
So how do we pick a random person out of this player's array? Or well, let's say our random number is 202. If we do 202, which is our random number, mod 10, we're gonna basically do 202 divided by 10. But instead of having the decimals, we're just gonna say, okay, how many times does 10 evenly divide into 202? And what's the remainder? What doesn't divide evenly into 202? Well, 20 times 10 equals 200 with two left over. So two doesn't evenly divide or multiply into 200. So that means 202 mod 10 is gonna to equal to two. So that's how the module function works. And we can use that so we're always gonna get a number between so we're always going to get a number here between zero and nine, which works out perfectly because that which works out perfectly because those are the indexes of the 10 people in our array. So let's use that here. We'll say a UN256 index of winner is going to be equal to random words at index zero because we're only getting one random word module the S underscore players dot length. So this will give us the index of our random winner to get that address of the winner. We'll do address payable recent winner equals s players at this index of winner. So awesome. So now we'll have the address of the person that got this random number, the persons that's going to be our verifiably random winner. Now it might be kind of cool to brag to people that you're the recent winner. So let's go ahead to the top and we'll create a new state variable for our most recent winner. Make this state variable in a new section called lottery variables. We'll say address private s underscore recent winner. And it'll start out as nobody. But as we get winners, update it with s recent winner equals recent winner. And we'll probably want people to know who this recent winner is. So down below, we can do function get recent winner. This is going to be a public view that's going to return that address. And then we'll just say return s underscore recent winner. Since again, the recent winner is going to be a storage variable. So now that we have a recent winner, what else are we going to do? Well, we're probably going to want to send them the money in this contract. So we're going to do exactly what we did before with sending the money. We're going to do that bool success comma blank equals recent winner dot call. We're going to say value is going to be address of this dot balance. We're going to send all the money in this contract and we're going to pass it no data. And now we could say require, you know, success, whatever, we're going to be a little bit more gas efficient here. And we're just going to say if not success, then we're going to revert a new transfer failed error. So we're going to go to the top, we're going to say error, name of the contract is raffle underscore underscore transfer failed like that, and then go back down. And we can now do revert raffle transfer failed like that. And now that we've picked a winner, right now we don't have a way to actually keep track of the list of previous winners. So we're just going to emit an event. So there's always going to be that easily queryable history of event winners. So we're going to create a new event in the event section called event winner picked. And this is going to be an address indexed winner. And we'll scroll down and we'll do emit winner picked with the address of the recent winner. This looks pretty good. This looks pretty good here. Now you'll notice our request ID has this little underscore here and it's saying, hey, uh, it's an unused function parameter. Since we don't use this, but we still need fulfill random words to take a request ID and a random words array, but we don't use request ID, we can just comment out just the request ID part like this. This tells our function, hey, yes, we know that you need a UN256, but we're not going to use the request ID. So we'll leave it in here, but we'll leave it blank. Now let's run a little compile here. We'll use yarn hardhat compile or hh compile. We'll see if we're coding things correctly. And indeed, we don't see any errors. So perfect. We can continue. So we've added the Chainlink VRF way. We have a way to verifiably get a random winner. This is fantastic. Now let's update this contract. So that not only can it pick a verifiable winner, but it can also do this all programmatically and automatically trigger picking a random winner 
based off of some time interval without us having to interact with it and in a decentralized context. In order for us to automatically trigger smart contracts based off of some parameter, be it a time parameter, maybe the price of some asset is some number, maybe there's a certain amount of money in the liquidity pool or really whatever trigger that you want, we can use Chainlink Keepers to do this. Stephen Fluin has done, once again, an amazing introduction to Chainlink Keepers. So we're going to follow along with another sub video section of Stephen explaining Chainlink Keepers to us. He's going to be using the Coven testnet, but be sure to use whatever testnet is in the documentation when you play with this and you try this. My name is Stephen Fluin. Today, I want to show you how to use the Chainlink Keeper network in order to automate your contracts and give them access to off-chain computation. Let's go ahead and dive in. So what we're going to look at today is we're going to start on the Chainlink documentation webpage. And if you just scroll down a little bit, you're going to find using Chainlink Keepers. Now, there's really two parts to building a Chainlink Keeper upkept smart contract. So the first thing is you need to write a smart contract that's compatible by implementing these two methods. And then second, you want to register that smart contract for upkeep with the Chainlink Keeper network. So let's go ahead and do both of those things. So let's start off just by copying and deploying this sample code that we've got uh, with this one click to remix. What we're going to see here is a very, very simple contract that is just a simple counter. So we can see it's got a counter here. So it's got just a simple number. And then uh, you're able to specify when you create the contract, an update interval. And then the contract is going to verify, hey, has enough time passed? And if it has, let's update the counter. And you're going to notice that Chainlink compatible or Chainlink Keeper Network compatible contracts use two really important methods that are part of this Keeper compatible interface. Uh, the first is check upkeep. And check upkeep is special because this is where the off-chain computation happens. So this is a method that's not actually run on-chain. This is run off-chain by a node from the Chainlink Keeper network. And so what's really nice about this is that the gas used here uh, isn't actually gas that's on-chain. So this is just being run by a Chainlink node. And then what happens is if your check upkeep method returns that upkeep is needed, then it's going to go ahead and perform upkeep on chain. So you can actually generate data off chain and then pass that in. That's called the check data. Uh, and then that uh, becomes the perform data that's passed in to perform upkeep. And so the perform upkeep method is where you're going to want to verify that things are uh, correct and that things actually should be modified and run on chain and then actually make the state change. And so let's go ahead and compile this contract and deploy it to the Coven network. So let's go ahead and within Remix, we can do this compilation and we're going to compile and deploy directly to Coven. So the Chainlink Keeper network is currently, as of the filming of this, uh, available on both Coven as well as the Ethereum mainnet. And let's go ahead and deploy the counter contract. And let's say let's not update more than every 30 seconds. And so let's go ahead and deploy. So MetaMask is going to ask for a little bit of payment in order for me to deploy this contract to the Coven network. And it looks like that is live. So now what I'm going to be able to do is I'm going to be able to take this keeper contract and copy its address. And now we're going to register that contract for upkeep. So we're going to jump over to the application that powers the channel keeper network. Uh, there's a few different ways you can do this. You can interact directly with the registry contract, uh, but there's a very, very nice interface that lets you do this. So let's go ahead and register a new upkeep and it's giving me an error that says you need to connect your wallet. So let's go ahead and do that. So I'm going to just connect wallet here and I'm going to give it access to my account. And then from there, we should actually be able to register. So I'm going to use an email address here. I'll give my contract a simple name. I'll paste in that address from the deployed contract, and then I'll give it a gas limit. And then check data is this special thing where you can actually register multiple upkeeps on the same contract and pass in data to specify um, how you want check upkeep to be run. Uh, but we're just going to ignore that. That is an optional one. And then we'll give it a starting balance of around 10 link. It's going to go ahead and use MetaMask again to register that transaction on the network. And once it's confirmed, uh, my upkeep should be registered with the network and funded with 10 link to kick things off. All right, if we go ahead and view the upkeep, we can see it's registered. And as soon as the next uh, round of the keeper nodes executes, which should be roughly about every block, uh, we should see that the check upkeep method is going to return that, hey, upkeep is actually needed because the timestamp is more than 30 seconds ago. And then we should go ahead and perform upkeep. So uh, as soon as I take a look at this in Remix, I can actually uh, make this bigger here. We're gonna be able to see from the methods of the contract, if we check the counter, it's gonna start at zero. And as soon as that 30 seconds has passed, we'll be able to hit the counter again. And we'll see that the Chainlink Keeper Network 
has performed upkeep on my contract. All right, we just refresh and we see that the balance of the upkeep has uh, been decreased by about 0 0.01 link. Uh, and we should also see within our contract that our counter has now updated via that perform upkeep method call. And now our counter is at one, showing us that our contract is being upkeeped by the Chainlink Keeper Network and everything is working exactly as we expect. So as you can see, it is very, very easy to create a contract that is compatible with the Keeper Network and it's very, very easy to register that upkeep and start seeing that your contract automation and off-chain computation are working flawlessly. Now that we've learned a little bit more about how Chainlink Keepers work, if you want to take some time to go through the documentation and open up way down below this open and remix button so you can actually work with one of these and see these in action for yourself on a test net, feel free to do so. We're going to be using a setup very similar to this Keepers counter setup in the Chainlink documentation. So now let's update our code so that this request random numbers automatically happens using Chainlink Keepers. And if we look at the example contract, we can actually read more about what's really important for this to work. And we need a check upkeep and a perform upkeep function in our code. So instead of request random winner, this is going to be the perform upkeep that we're going to change. But first, let's make this check upkeep. The check upkeep function is basically going to be checking to see, is it time for us to get a random number to update the recent winner and to send them all the funds? So let's go ahead and make that function. I'm going to add some notes here just so that it's clear what's going on. And maybe I'll even do nat spec to tell developers what's going on with this function. So we're going to create this function, check upkeep. And if we look at what this needs, it needs to be external override, external override. And if we see this override keyword, this means that, okay, there's probably a perform upkeep somewhere else. And if we scroll to the top and we're going to import this keeper compatible interface so that we make sure that we implement both check upkeep and perform upkeep in our code here. If you want, you can just import keeper compatible in here or just the keeper compatible interface. In our code, we're going to do import at chainlink slash contracts slash src slash v0.8 point interfaces slash keeper compatible interface dot soul. And now we're just going to say contract raffle is VRF consumer base V2 and keeper compatible interface. And this keeper compatible interface inheritance just makes sure that we add check upkeep and perform upkeep, which we're going to add in a little bit. And if we look back at the docs, we can see check upkeep takes a bytes call data check data as an input parameter. So we'll do bytes call data check data as a parameter. Now this check upkeep bytes call data allows us to specify really anything that we want when we call this check upkeep function. Having this check data be of type bytes means that we can even specify this to call other functions. There's a lot of advanced things you can do by just having an input parameter as type of bytes. For us though, we're gonna keep it a little bit simple and we're actually not gonna use this check data piece. So similar to how below, we're not using request ID, we can just comment it out. However, we still need to make sure that this parameter is type of bytes call data. Now, anyways, let's go ahead and annotate this check upkeep function. We'll say this is the function that the chain link keeper nodes call. They look for the to return true. If we look back at the documentation, we can see that this check upkeep returns both an upkeep needed and a perform data, which again, we're gonna ignore this upkeep needed is going to be true or false. If it's true, that means it's time to get a new random number. The following should be true in order to return true. So in order for it to be time to request a random winner, what should happen? Our time interval should have passed, which we haven't defined yet, but we will. The lottery should have at least one player and have some ETH. And then our subscription is funded with link. Similar to how with Chainlink VRF, your subscription needs to be funded with link. The same thing needs to happen for check upkeep and keepers to run. Your subscription needs to be funded with link. Now we're going to add one more additional piece here. We're going to say four. The lottery should be in an open state. Something that we want to avoid when we're waiting for a random number to return and when we've requested a random winner, we're technically in this weird limbo state where we're waiting for a random number to be returned and we really shouldn't allow any new players to join. 
So what we actually want to do is create some state variable telling us whether the lottery is open or not. And while we're waiting for our random number to get back, we'll be in a closed or a calculating state. Now, what we could do at the top of our contract, we could just say boolean private s underscore is open. And we could just set this to true if we're open, otherwise false. Well, what if we have a ton of different states? What if we want it to be like pending, open, closed, calculating, et cetera? What do we have a ton of different states? Well, we could make this a UN256 private s underscore state. And we could just keep track of the state having like zero be pending, a one be open, two be closed, three be calculating, etc. But this can be a little tricky to keep track of. So a better way to actually keep track of all this in our code is to use an enum. Enums can be used to create custom types with a finite set of constant values. So we can create, for example, a state created, locked, inactive, and it's basically a new type for our smart contract. For us, we're gonna create a new type. And if we go back to the layout of variables in our smart contract, types should actually be first thing in our contract. So we're going to create an enum called raffle state. And for now, and we're just going to have it be open, we're just going to have it be open or calculating. Now when we create an enum like this, we're kind of secretly creating a uint 256 where zero equals open and one equals calculating. However, this is much more explicit that we know what each one of these numbers actually means. Now that we've created this new type called raffle state, we can create a new lottery state variable of type raffle state. So the exact same way we declare any other variable, we'll name its type, which is gonna be raffle state. And this is gonna be a storage variable. So we'll go ahead and do private s underscore raffle state. In our constructor, right when we launch this contract, we should open up this raffle. So we'll say s raffle state equals, and we could use a uint256 wrapped in type raffle state like so, or we can be more explicit and say raffle state dot open. Now we know that the raffle state is in an open state and we only want check up keep to work is if the lottery is actually open. Additionally, we probably only want people to be able to enter if the lottery is open. So let's go ahead and create another if statement and revert if the lottery isn't open. So we can say if s underscore raffle state does not equal raffle state dot open, then we're gonna revert with a new error we're gonna create, raffle underscore underscore not open. And then of course, at the top, we'll create error, raffle not open. Now additionally, let's go down, when we're requesting a random word, let's update the state to be calculating so other people can't jump in here. So right above our VRF coordinator dot request random words, we'll do s underscore raffle state equals raffle state dot calculating so that nobody can enter our lottery and nobody can trigger a new update. And then once we fulfill, after we pick our winner, we'll say s raffle state equals raffle state dot open again. And something else that we forgot to do was after we pick a winner from s players, we need to reset our players array. So let's add that in here as well. s players equals new, address payable, array of size zero. So we'll reset the raffle state and we'll reset our players array. All right, great. So now that we've learned about enum, let's add it to our check upkeep here. We're gonna check these four things and if they all pass, check upkeep will be true and we'll trigger the chain link keepers to request a new random winner. So first we'll say bool is open. It's gonna be equal to raffle state dot open equals equals s underscore raffle state. So you can think of that as this Boolean is open is going to be true if raffle state is in an open state. And it'll be false if raffle state is in any other state. So great, we have an is open Boolean that we can check later on. What else do we need? Well, we need to check to make sure our time interval is passed. Well, we don't have a time interval yet. So let's create a time interval. In order to check the time, we can use another one of Solidity's globally available variables with block.timestamp. Block.timestamp returns the current timestamp of the blockchain. To get the current timestamp, we're gonna need block.timestamp. But to get if enough time has passed, we're gonna need to get the current block.timestamp minus the last block timestamp, which we don't have yet. Let's go ahead and create a state variable to keep track of the previous block timestamp. 
So this is going to be a new state variable that we're going to make. We're going to say uint 256 private s underscore last timestamp. And right when we deploy this contract, we'll update this with the current timestamp s last timestamp equals block dot timestamp. All right, awesome. Now we have a last block timestamp, but we're going to need to check that the difference between the current timestamp and the last timestamp is greater than some interval. So we also need to create an interval. And this is going to be some interval. This is going to be some number in seconds of how long we want to wait between lottery runs. So let's go ahead and add this to our constructor as well. We're going to do a comma here and we'll do UN 256 interval. And we're going to create another global variable UN 256 private s underscore interval. And in our constructor, we'll say s interval equals interval. Now interval isn't going to change after we set it. So instead of making a storage variable, let's make it an immutable variable to save some gas. Okay, perfect. Now that we have all this, we can actually create a Boolean to check to see if enough time has passed. So we'll say Boolean time passed equals the current block dot timestamp minus s underscore last timestamp. And we should check to see that this is actually greater than i underscore interval. So we have a Boolean to check to see if we're open. It'll be true if we're open. And we'll have a Boolean to see if enough time has passed. This will be true if enough time has passed. What else should we check? Well, we should check to see if we have enough players. So we'll do a Boolean has players equals, and we'll check to see if s underscore players dot length is greater than zero. If s players dot length is greater than zero, has players will be true. Otherwise, it'll be false. And we'll also see if we have a balance. So we'll do Boolean has balance equals address this dot balance is greater than zero. Then finally, we're going to take all of these Booleans and turn them into the return variable that we're looking for. We're going to say Boolean upkeep needed equals is open and time passed and as players and as balance like that. So all these combined is going to be this Boolean upkeep needed. And if this returns true, it's time to request a new random number and it's time to end the lottery. If this is false, it's not time yet. It's not time to end the lottery yet. Now, again, if we go to the chain link documentation, upkeep needed actually needs to return that Boolean upkeep needed and some bytes memory perform data. So we need to update. We need to update our function here and say returns bool upkeep needed comma bytes memory perform data star slash. And since we've initialized Boolean upkeep needed up here, we don't need to to say what type of upkeep needed is down here since this will automatically get returned. Perform data is something that we can use if we want to have check upkeep do some other stuff depending on how this check upkeep went. We don't really need it to do anything else, so we can just leave it as such. Great, so now we have a check upkeep. We have a way to check to see if it's time to trigger picking our random winner of our lottery or our raffle. Now that we learned how to actually do this trigger, Let's write the function that gets executed after this returns true. This is going to be our perform upkeep function, which we can see an example again in the Chainlink documentation. Now, when it's time to pick a random winner, actually what we're going to do is just we're just going to call this request random winner function. So instead of having this extra function, let's just transform our request random winner function into this perform upkeep. Since once check upkeep returns true, the Chainlink nodes will automatically call this perform upkeep function. So in function request random winner, let's rename this to perform upkeep and we'll have it take the input parameter bytes call data perform data. Bytes call data perform data. If in our check upkeep we had a perform data, we would automatically pass it to our perform upkeep. We're not going to pass anything to perform upkeep, so we can leave it commented out like this. Since perform upkeep is actually identified in the keeper compatible interface, this is now going to have to override that function. Now we want to do a little bit of validation before we continue here, because right now anybody can call our perform upkeep function. So we want to make sure that it only gets called when check upkeep is true. An easy way for us to do that is to actually call our own check upkeep function. 
Now, right now, check upkeep is an external, so we actually can't call our own check upkeep function. So let's change it to public so that even our own smart contract can call this check upkeep function. Now that we've made it public, in perform upkeep, we can call check upkeep, pass it nothing, and then return the upkeep needed and perform data, which we don't really care about. So we'll get we'll get that bool upkeep needed, and then we don't care about perform data, so we'll leave that blank, equals check upkeep, and we'll pass it a blank call data. Now, we wanna make sure that this is true in order to keep going with the function. So we could write a require here, but we're gonna do if not upkeep needed, then we're gonna revert with a new error that we create, raffle, upkeep not needed. And we're gonna pass some variables to this error so that whoever is running into this bug can hopefully see why they're getting this error. So we'll pass the balance of this contract just in case there's no ether in here. We'll add the players dot length just in case there's no players. And we'll add a uint256 s underscore raffle state. Make sure that the raffle is actually open. And then of course, we'll need to create this error at the top. Error, raffle upkeep not needed. We're just gonna take a uint256 current balance, UN256, num players, and UN256, raffle state. Our code is starting to look really professional. This is awesome. Now, something that we forgot to do back in the fulfill random words is we actually forgot to reset timestamp. Every time a winner is picked, we want to reset the timestamp as well so that we can wait another interval and let people participate in the lottery for that interval. So we'll scroll down into fulfill random words, and right after we re reset players, we'll also reset the timestamp. Okay, great. And I think we're just about done here. Let's add a little bit of NAT spec to make this look even more professional and, and give people who are reading our contract even more information. So let's add title here at title, and we'll say a sample raffle contract. We'll say at author is going to be me, Patrick Collins, or you can put your own name there as well. At notice. This contract is for creating an untamperable decentralized smart contract. And then we'll do at dev. This implements Chainlink VRF V2 and Chainlink Keepers. All right, awesome. We've got our type declarations. We've got our state variables. We've got lottery variables, which are still state variables. We've got our events. Now it's time for our functions afterwards. We've done a little bit of NAT spec, at least on our check upkeep. If you want to add some more NAT spec on things like enter raffle, perform upkeep, etc., you can absolutely do so. And then down at the bottom, we have our view slash pure getter functions. Let's see, do we want any other getter functions here? Well, we probably want to give people the chance to get a raffle state. So we'll do function get raffle state. This will be a public view returns the raffle state. We'll say return s underscore raffle state. We probably want to give people the chance to get the number of words. And this is going to be a little bit interesting here. Ready? So if we do function get num words, public view returns un256 return num words, you'll see something interesting happen here. If we pull up our compiler and run hh compile. Hopefully everything works here. Oh, and everything doesn't work because I didn't import this correctly. <laughs> let's fix that. Let's try again. Oh, there's a couple things I missed. Let's fix s players. This is why it's good to compile as you code. S players length. Let's try again. And I spelt interval wrong. I underscore interval. Let's try to compile again. See how many more spelling mistakes I made. And there it is. I underscore in. There we go. Let's paste that. And we do get another error here. Invalid type for argument in a function call. Invalid implicit conversion from literal string to bytes call data requested. Since we're passing this empty string here and check upkeep needs a call data, call data actually doesn't work with strings. So we need to make this bytes memory instead. And our compiler is now happy with us. And I spell it to timestamp wrong. That's a lowercase s. So, and you might see some squiggles here on check upkeep. We could make this a view function since we're not actually modifying any state, but I want to keep it public for reasons I'll show you a little bit later. But finally, we get the, the yellow squiggly that I was looking for here. And if we run 
HH compile, we should see a warning in our compiler as well. Okay, so we see all those yellow squigglies here. Unnamed return variable can remain unassigned. We need this bytes memory in here because that's what the keepers are looking for. Warning, function state mutability can be restricted to view for our function check upkeep. You can make it view if you want, but I'm gonna keep it public for reasons I'll show you a little bit later. And finally, function state mutability can be restricted to pure. This is what I wanted to show you. Since num words is actually in the bytecode, since it's a constant variable, technically isn't reading from storage, and therefore this can be a pure function. Returning num words doesn't actually read in storage, it literally will go and read the number one. So doing get num words in solidity with num words being a constant variable is going to literally be the exact same as saying get one and we would return one here. We might also want to get the number of players. So we'll create a function get number of players. And this will be a public view returns a UN256 return s underscore players dot length. Ah, we're also probably going to want the latest timestamp. So we'll do function get latest timestamp public view returns un256 and we're just going to return s underscore last timestamp and maybe we'll want to do request confirmations so we'll do function get request confirmations public pure since request confirmations is also a constant function returns un2 uint256 Turn request confirmations. All right, we've got some wonderful getters here, some view slash pure functions. We have a way to get a random number. We have a way in a decentralized context, automatically execute picking a random winner. We have a way for people to enter our raffle, to enter this lottery, and we have a bulletproof way to solve creating a truly fair decentralized lottery. Oh my goodness, let's do one more compile for good measure, HH compile. And these are just warnings, so we're good to go here. Our code is compiling successfully. Like I said, normally this definitely isn't gonna be the way that you're gonna write your smart contracts. It's almost impossible to write a full smart contract without making any mistakes and without flipping back and forth between the documentation. I have already written this contract many times myself and I still, made a whole bunch of mistakes. So it is totally reasonable and totally rational for anybody and everybody to make mistakes going through this and to use resources and to write tests along the way. Now that we have our raffle.soul created, it's time to add everything else. So we're gonna come over here, we're gonna create a new folder and add our deploy folder per usual. And we're gonna do exactly what we've already done a couple of times. We're gonna create some scripts to deploy our raffle contract. Now with our raffle contract, there's a couple of things in here that we wanna make note of. First thing is that our constructor right now is absolutely massive. There are a ton of parameters in here that we need to account for. Let's take a look at our constructors and see if there's any contracts that we're already interacting with. Okay, VRF coordinator V2, this is a contract address. Entrance fee, no, gas lane, no, subscription ID, no, callback, gas limit, no, and interval. So knowing that this is an address should be a tip that, ah, okay, we're probably gonna need to deploy some mocks for this. Since we're gonna need to interact with a VRF coordinator contract that's outside of our project. But let's go ahead and start working on our raffle deployment script first. And we know we're gonna have to deploy some mocks, so we'll just keep that in mind. So let's create a new file, 01 deploy raffle.js. And let's get started deploying our raffle contract. Now, this is gonna look really similar to what we've done before, and we're gonna do it again here. If you wanna use your previous deploy scripts as a reference, I absolutely recommend you do so. But let's get started with module.exports equals an async function. It's gonna take get named accounts and deployments as input parameters. Then we're gonna do const deploy log equals deployments. Then we're going to say const deployer equals await get named accounts. Let's go to our config and update module that exports to, to have this. I'm just going to copy paste so that deployer is going to be defaulted to account zero and player is going to be defaulted to account one. 
If you want to go ahead and write this out, feel free to pause and write out your named accounts right now. There's going to be a lot of boilerplate in our hardhat.config.js. So feel free to have the GitHub repo for this lesson up with you or your previous scripts that you've already written as a reference. Named accounts, deployer, and we're also going to have a player named account so that we can separate different users or different players who are interacting with our contracts. But for now, we're going to grab our deployer and we're going to get started. Now, similar to last time, we would just do const raffle equals await deploy raffle comma, and then add all of our stuff in here, right? So this would be from deployer args. We're going to have a ton of args. So we're going to come back to this and then log is going to be true. And then we're going to have wait confirmations. There's a little bit more boilerplate we need to work with here. In our hardhead config, we don't have a network here. So let's add our network information so we can get those block confirmations. We'll be specific in here as well. And we'll say default network is going to be hard hat, and then we'll say networks, and we'll add our network information. Definitely going to be working with hard hat, which has a chain ID of 31337. You might as well put that in here as well. And block confirmations, we're just set to one. We'll add this comma here. We're also going to be running some staging tests on the RinkB network. So we'll add RinkB in here with a chain ID of four, block confirmations of six, and we need to add a URL and then also some accounts. For our URL, we've done this a hundred times. We'll do const rink, rink b rpc URL equals process.env dot rink b rpc URL. That's private key, blah, blah, blah. We're going to add all these same variables from our last projects. So I'm going to ask you to pause here and just copy paste all those variables from our last project. Boom, like so. Since we're adding a rink PRPC URL, private key, corn market cap, and etherscan, we're also going to want to make sure new folder, or excuse me, new file, dot and we're going to drop all of our information in here. A rink PRPC URL, private key, etherscan API key, and then our coin market cap API key as well. Now that we have our private key, our rink PRPC URL, down in URL, BRPC URL, and for accounts, we're just going to add that single private key. So now for weight confirmations, is going to equal network config dot block confirmations or one. And we're going to have to import network from hardhead, which it looks like my VS code automatically did for me. Thanks VS code. So this is how we're going to deploy our raffle. Obviously, we have a ton of arguments that we need to account for. So let's get to it. Let's look at our raffle constructor to see what we need to get. OK, well, the first thing that we need to get VRF coordinator v2. We're going to use the same strategy we used in our fund me project with using mocks if we're on a development chain and using the actual contract address if we're on a testnet or a live network. So let's get to it. So let's go ahead, recreate that helper hardhat config.js and create that const network config. Say it equals for hardhat, we're going to use a mock so we don't need to put that in here for now. But for rink B, let's go ahead. Put a four in here. So the name is going to be Rinkab. And we're going to need to go to the Chainlink documentation, the VRF contracts, and we're going to need to grab VRF coordinator for the Rinkb testnet. So we're going to grab this address here, pop it in here. We'll say VRF coordinator v2. Bam, right like that. So back in our deploy raffle, we're going to have to pick whether or not to use the VRF coordinator v2 in the network config or some mock that we deployed which of course leads us to us having to deploy a mock. So let's create the new file, 00, zero deploy mocks.js. So same thing, module.exports equals async function where it's taking get named accounts and deployments as its input variables from the hardhat runtime environment. We do const deploy comma log equals deployments and then const deployer equals await get named accounts like so. And then we're going to grab the chain ID as well, because we're going to only want to deploy this on a development chain. So we'll do const chain ID equals network.config.chain ID. Now we're going to only want to deploy mocks if we're on a development chain. So once again, we're going to go to our helper config. We're going to add those development chains in here. We'll say const development chains equals 
hard hat and localhost. And then we're going to want to export both of these. So module.exports equals network config and development chains. Now in our deploy mocks, we're going to want to grab those by saying const development chains equals require dot dot slash helper helper hard hat config. Now we can check to see if development chains dot includes the network dot name that we're currently on. If we're in a development chain, we're going to go ahead and log local network detected deploying mocks. And now we'll have to deploy a mock VRF coordinator. Where do we get a mock VRF2 coordinator? Well, let's go ahead and create one of those. We go to the Chainlink GitHub again. We go to contracts, SRC, 0.8. We actually have a mocks folder with VRF coordinator v 2 mocksol And we're just going to use this as our mock. So in our contracts folder, we're going to create a new file called test, a new file called VRF core Denator v2 mock.sol. And we're just going to import this mock and have it be our mock. So we'll do spdx. We'll do pragma solidity caret 0 0.8.0 .0 or 7 or whatever we want to do. We'll do import at chainlink slash contracts slash src slash v0.8 slash mocks slash vrf coordinator v2 mock dot soul. And we'll just check to see if it compiles with hardhead compile. And it looks like it's compiling as well. Awesome. So now that we have our mock contract, we can actually go ahead and deploy it. So we'll do await deploy vrf coordinator v2 mock comma. And then we'll give it our parameters in here. We'll say from deployer log is going to be true. And then we're going to do our arguments. Now, what are the arguments of this VRF coordinator v2 mock? Well, if we open the VRF coordinator v2 mock right in our VS code or on GitHub, we can actually see, if we ro roll over to the constructor, that it takes two things. It takes a base fee and a gas price link. What are these? The first one, well, the first one is this const base fee. If we go back to the documentation, we can see that there's this premium section of 0.25 link for ring fee. This means that for each request, there's a base fee of 0.25 link for every request. So anytime we want to request a random number on ring fee, it's going to cost us 0.25 link, or you can think of it as 0.25 Oracle gas to make this request. So back in our deploy mocks, we can say base fee equals, we could resemble ring fee here and do 25 blah, 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 or we could do ethers.utils parse eth of 0.25. I'll even put a little comment here and say 0.25 is the premium. It costs 0.25 link per request. And remember, the reason that this costs 0.25 link per request versus the price feeds didn't cost anything is because the price feeds, if we look back at data.chain.link, each one of these price feeds is being sponsored by a group of protocols who are paying for all these requests already. Since there isn't a sponsor for this, we are the only ones requesting the randomness. We get to be the ones to actually sponsor getting this random number. Then the second thing here is gonna be this gas price link. So let's create another const here. We'll do const gas price link. But what this is, is actually a calculated value. This is a calculated value based on the gas price of the chain. Here's an example. If we were to request a random number on Ethereum and the ETH price skyrocketed up to like to like a billion dollars, gas would be incredibly, incredibly expensive. Now, when Chainlink nodes respond, Chainlink nodes pay the gas fees to give us randomness and do external execution. The Chainlink nodes are actually the ones that pay the gas when returning randomness or executing an upkeep or et cetera. If we go to our raffle.soul, and scroll down to perform upkeep or fulfill random words, it's actually the chain link nodes that are calling these two functions and paying the gas for it. They get paid in Oracle gas to offset those costs. But if the price of ETH or any native blockchain skyrocketed, the chain link nodes would still have to pay the gas fee. So 
The Chainlink nodes have a calculated price, have a calculated variable called the gas price per link, which fluctuates based off the price of the actual chain so that they never go bankrupt. So basically the price of a request changes based off the price of gas for that blockchain. You can kind of think of this as the link per gas, if you will. For now, we can kind of just set it to whatever we want and we'll just set it to one E9, which is gonna be equivalent to one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So now that we have the base fee and the gas price link, we'll grab this base fee. We'll have these be the arguments for our VRF coordinator V2 mock. So we'll say, and actually we can delete that. We'll say const args equals base fee and gas price link. Then we can take this args variable and just plop it in here. Now we can do log mocks deployed. And then we can do log, do a little line like this to let people know that this deploy script is done. Then we'll just do a module.exports.tags equals all and mocks. So now that we have a VRF coordinator v2 mock deployed, we can come back over to our raffle and make some code around it. Similar to what we just did with our deploy mocks, we can say if development chains dot includes network.name, we'll do some stuff. And we need to import development chains from our helper hardhat config, and we need to import network from hardhat. My VS Code automatically added them. Wow, thanks VS Code. Let's even just do const args and make this variable down here. Let's stick it in args. Our first argument is gonna need to be this VRF v2 coordinator. So let's make a variable. We'll say let VRF coordinator v2 address. And if we're on a development chain, we're gonna grab that mock contract. So we'll say const VRF coordinator v2 mock equals await ethers.getContract VRF coordinator v2 mock. And then we can set VRF coordinator v2 address equals VRF coordinator v2 mock dot address. Cool. We have the address here. Else, if we're not on a local network, the VRF v2 coordinator address is simply going to be derived from our network config. So let's import the network config as well from our helper hardhead config. And we'll say else VRF coordinator v2 address equals network config of our chain ID, which, which actually, sorry, we do need the chain ID, const chain ID equals network.config.chain ID, chain ID of VRF coordinator v2. Chain ID VRF coordinator v2. All right, perfect. We've got this set up to work with our VRF coordinator v2 address. What else do we need from our raffle? Well, we need an entrance fee. We probably want to change the entrance fee depending on what chain we're on. If we're on a more expensive chain, we might want to make this higher than others. So let's go ahead back to our helper hardhead config and make an entrance fee based off of the blockchain. So for rink B, maybe we want to make it 0.01 ETH. So we could say ethers.utils.parse ether of 0.01. And once again, thank you VS Code for automatically dropping that in for me. And we're also gonna want an entrance fee for our hard app. We could also set a default in here, but let's just be a little bit more explicit. So we'll say 31337. The name of this is hard app. We don't need to give it a VRF coordinator V2 address because we're gonna deploy a mock, but we do want an entrance fee and let's just give it the exact same entrance fee here. So we'll say ethers.utils.parse ether 0.01 ETH. All right, great. So on our deploy here, we can just say const entrance fee equals network config chain ID of entrance fee. Let's start populating our args here. So the first one is going to be our FE2 coordinator address. Next one is going to be our entrance fee. Got it. Got it. Now we need our gas lane. On Rink B and other networks, there are different gas lanes that we can choose from. Let's grab the only gas lane from Rink B the 30 GUI key hash. Let's drop this, of course, into our network config as gas lane, pop it in here. For hard hat, our mock actually doesn't care what gas lane we're working on because we're gonna be mocking the gas lane anyways. So we can just say gas lane, we can just go ahead and use the same one or really anything here, it doesn't really matter. Now here we'll say const gas lane equals network config, chain ID, gas lane. We'll grab the gas lane, We'll stick it into our argument array. 
We've got this one. We've got this one. We've got this one. Now it's time for the subscription ID. Now, if you haven't run through docs.chain.link for the Chainlink VRF, I highly recommend you do so so that you can understand what this subscription ID is. We know that we can actually make a subscription ID using that front end, using that website, vrf.chain.link, which is great and all, but what if we're on a local chain? So we can get a subscription ID, no problem in here, but uh, it's a little bit harder on a local network. Now I'm actually gonna teach you how to create and fund subscription IDs completely programmatically. So you don't even need to use the UI if you don't want to. However, for the purpose of this course, we're still gonna use the user interface. We're still gonna use that website for us to get our own subscription IDs, but you could 100% automate the process of creating a subscription ID and funding a subscription ID. Because when you create and fund subscription IDs, you're just calling create subscription and fund subscription on that smart contract. So. On our development chain, we have our VRF coordinator V2 mock. And what we're gonna do, and on our development chain, we're gonna create that subscription. So we're gonna say const transaction response equals await VRF coordinator V2 mock dot create sub subscription. And then we'll run const transaction receipt equals await transaction response dot wait, we'll wait one, block confirmation, and inside this transaction receipt, there's actually an event that's emitted with our subscription that we can get. This is another place where emitting events is incredibly helpful. So in fact, if we open back up that VRF V2 coordinator mock, and we look for create subscription, we see we emit subscription created with the subscription ID. We can actually get this event emitted from our transaction receipt. Now to assign it, let's go ahead and create subscription ID up here. And then we'll say subscription ID equals transaction receipt dot events of zero dot args dot sub ID. And again, be sure to watch that events video if you want to learn more about how to work with events in Hardhat. Now that we have a subscription, we need to fund the subscription. On a real network, you need the link token to actually fund the subscription. The current iteration of the mock allows you to fund the subscription without the link token. So what we can do is we can just run await VRF core donator mock VRF coordinator v2 mock dot fund subscription and we'll give it the subscription ID and we'll need to do some fund amount. For this, we can just create some variable. We'll say const VRF subscription fund amount equals ethers dot utils dot parse ether of, we'll say 30 VRF subscription fund amount. We'll just paste that down here. We could do this as well for a real test net or our live networks, but just so that we become familiar with the user interface, we're not going to do a test net programmatically. And for a test net, we're just going to use exactly what we've been doing so far, where we can put a subscription ID in our helper config. So we'll say subscription ID. We'll put something in here. Right now, we'll just leave it at zero, but later on, when we actually create a subscription, we'll update our subscription ID. And so we'll say subscription ID equals network config chain ID of subscription ID. Perfect. Now we can add this to our arguments array. What else do we need? Subscription ID, we need a callback gas limit. Our callback gas limit is going to vary network to network. So once again, we're going to go into our helper config here, callback gas limit. And for us, we'll set a pretty high limit of 500,000 gas. So we'll say callback gas limit of five dot dot, one, two, three, 500,000 gas. And for hard hat, we'll do the same thing. So we can say const callback gas limit equals network config chain ID callback gas limit. We'll grab this, put it into our argument array. What else do we need? All we need now is the interval. So we can change this network to network as well. For rink B, we'll say interval. We'll have it just be 30 seconds for both hard hat and for rink B. So we'll do the same thing here. We'll say const interval equals network config chain ID interval. And we'll grab this, pop it in the end of our array. Whew. All right, awesome. Now we have an argument array. You can drop it right in here and perfect. Everything in our constructor for a raffle contract. Great. This is looking fantastic. 
We've got wait confirmations. We got logging, arguments, deployer. Okay, well, what next? Well, let's go ahead and add that verification piece. So once again, create a new folder, utils, new file, verify.js. We can either copy paste this from our last project or we can grab this from the GitHub repo associated with this course. Once we have our verify script in here, we're gonna import it by saying const verify equals require dot dot slash helper hard hat config. And then we can add that same bit of code down here to verify our contract. We'll say if we're not on a development chain, And we have process.env.etherscan API key. Then we're going to log verifying dot 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 and then await verify raffle.address and the args. Now we'll just do a log of a whole bunch of hyphens to say that this script is done. Module.exports.tags equals let's say this will be all and raffle. All right. So let's test this out. We'll do hard hat deploy or yarn hard hat deploy and see if this script works correctly. Looks like we ran into an error network config not defined. So let's spell this right network config. There we go. That looks much better. Let's try this again. It looks like our deploy scripts are working well. Local network de detected deploying mocks deployed via our coordinator v2 mock mocks deployed and then we went ahead and deployed our raffle. Awesome. This is massive. Now we're not going to test the deploying this to a test net quite yet because, well, we don't have any unit tests yet. We need to write unit tests before we want to ever test running this on a test net. So we have our deploy script. We have our contracts. That means it's time for us to write some tests. We'll come over here. We'll create a new folder called test. And for now, we'll just make our unit tests. So unit tests. And in here, we can create a new file called raffle.test.js. And let's write some unit tests. Now for these unit tests, we are going to be a little bit verbose here. We're going to make our coverage really, really good here. It's not going to be perfect, but this is going to be pretty verbose. So I'm going to go pretty quickly here. So you can feel free to pause, slow me down, speed me up, whatever you need to learn this section. It is really good muscle memory to go through writing these tests and understand what you should be thinking about when you're writing these tests. So feel free to speed up the parts that you already know and slow down the new parts because we are going to go over some new information here. Writing tests may seem like a tedious process, but I promise as you get better at writing these tests, you'll realize that these are the things that you can rely on when stuff doesn't work and when you're not sure how to code something. Getting this muscle memory down, writing these tests is going to make you a fantastic engineer. So let's go through and we'll write some of these verbose tests here to try to make this really good and have this have really good coverage. And if you want to go back later on and see if you can give it even more coverage and even better tests, please feel free to do so. But let's get started. Let's write some tests. So we're going to start out pretty much the same way we've been starting everything out. We're going to grab our development chains so that we only run our unit tests on a development chain. So we'll do const development chains equals require dot dot slash dot dot slash helper hard, hard hat config. And then we'll say not development chains dot includes network dot name describe dot skip. Otherwise, we'll do describe. So this first describe is going to be our raffle unit test. And this is going to be an async function. So raffle unit tests so that it comes on the next line. It looks a little bit better. All right, great. Now, what are some of the main things that we're going to need to deploy? Well, we're going to need to deploy a raffle. We're probably going to want a VRF coordinator v2 mock created before each. It's going to be an async function where we go ahead and we get these. So we'll say const employer equals await get named accounts. So we're going to need to import get named accounts or require get named accounts from hardhat. And then we're going to want to deploy these using our fixtures. So we can say await deployments and then we're going to import deployments as well from hardhat.fixture, and we're going to call all. We're going to deploy everything. And again, if we look at our 01, our raffle has the all tag, and our 00, our mocks also have the all tag. Okay, perfect. Once we deploy everything, we can say raffle equals await ethers.getContract. And we got to import ethers from hardhat, like so. 
and we'll say we'll get the raffle contract and we'll connect it to our deployer. And then we're going to do the same thing with VRF coordinator v2 mock equals await ethers.get contract VRF coordinator v2 mock. We'll connect this to deployer as well. All right, great. Our first set of tests describe they're going to be the constructor. And this is going to be an async function. And let's do this. Let's create an it initial initializes the raffle correctly. This is going to be an async function. Now, I just want to make a note because ideally we make our tests have just one assert per it. Just keep that in mind is that ideally we want to have just one assert per it, but we're going to have a bunch because like I said, we're being a little bit loose here. So we want to just make sure that our raffle is initialized correctly. So we'll say const raffle state and we'll get that raffle state because we want to make sure that we start in an open raffle state. So we'll say const raffle state equals await raffle dot get raffle state. And then we want to say assert dot equal. Oh, and then we need to import assert from chai. So assert equals require chai assert dot equal raffle state dot to string because again, raffle state is going to be a big number and even though our raffle state is of type raffle state, it'll return a zero if it's open and a one if it's calculating. So this gets transformed just into a uint 256. When we call it like this, our raffle state variable here will be a big number. So we want to just to stringify it. So assert.equal raffle state dot to string zero. We'll also make sure our interval gets set correctly. So we'll do const interval equals await raffle dot get interval. And I don't know if we have one of those. Let's actually see interval. See if we have one of those. Oh, we don't have a get interval. Let's go ahead and add a get interval function. So we'll do function get in interval. It'll be a public view returns u in two fifty six return i underscore interval. We'll have get interval. We'll say raffle dot get interval. And we'll also say assert dot equal interval dot to string. This should equal whatever is in our helper config, right? Because we're using the interval in the helper config. So we say interval dot to string should equal. So we'll import that as well. Network config. And we'll say the interval should equal network config of. And let's also make get our chain ID up here. Chain ID say const chain ID equals network dot config dot chain ID network config of the chain ID of interval. All right, cool. So let's test this so far. HH test or yarn hardhead test. And cool. It looks like it passed and we have our little gas output here. Awesome. Let's go to our hardhead config just so that it doesn't always print out that gas bit there for now. So I'm going to copy paste the gas reporter section from our last project like so. And we're going to have enabled gas be false for now. So now if we run a hardhead test again, we shouldn't have that gas bit printed out. We should just see the tests and perfect. That's what we see. And our constructor test passes. Yay. What's next? Got our constructor and we probably could have written more tests for the rest of these, but let's just move on. All right, enter raffle. That's going to be our next describe block. So we'll do describe. Enter raffle. And this is going to be an async function. And we'll say it reverts when you don't pay enough, right? Because one of the first things that we check is that they're paying enough. So we want to make sure that this actually reverts if they don't pay enough. So this will be an async function where we're going to do that same expect await thing. So we're going to import expect from chai, which comes from those waffle matchers. And we're going to say await expect raffle dot enter raffle. And we're not going to pass any value here. We're going to expect it to dot b dot reverted with. And if we look here, we want it to be reverted with this raffle not enough ETH entered. So we can put that in quotes, raffle not enough ETH entered. And now we can try this out, make sure that it actually works. HH test, 
dash dash grep. Put this in quotes that you don't pay enough. And awesome, we're passing there. What else do we want to test? Well, we want to test that if the raffle isn't open, we also revert. But we'll test that in a little bit as we kind of test the rest of the functionality. We want to see that it records players when they enter. So this will be an async function. And now we'll enter the raffle. But first, we're going to need that raffle entrance fee. Let's go ahead and save that at the top. So we'll say let raffle, VRF coordinator v2 mock, raffle entrance fee. And in our before each, we'll say raffle entrance fee equals await ethers dot get entrance fee. This should be raffle dot get entrance fee. So now we have this raffle entrance fee. We can use it to enter the raffle. We'll say await raffle dot enter raffle with a value of raffle entrance fee. And we can make sure that our deployer here has been correctly recorded. So since right now we're connected to the deployer, we'll just make sure that that deployer actually is in our contract. So we'll say const player from contract equals await raffle dot get player of zero because we record them in our players array and we have our get players function, which pulls them out. And then we'll say assert dot equal player player from contract should be the deployer. So now we can grep for this in our hardhead test, make sure this works. HH test dash dash grep. Deployer is not defined. We got it up here, but we actually didn't save it globally. So we got to do let comma deployer, and we'll say deployer equals await get named accounts, and we'll wrap it like this to get the deployer. Awesome. Let's try this again. And awesome. What else should this do? Well, it's also emitting an event. So let's make sure it emits an event. So we'll say it emits event on enter. And this will be an async function as well. And this will be the first time that we're testing to make sure a function emits an event. And the syntax is going to look really similar to what we test for when we check to see if an error is fired. So we're going to say await expect raffle.enter raffle with value of raffle entrance fee dot two dot emit and this dot two dot emit we get from Ethereum waffle these chai matchers for emitting events we can do await expect to emit and then the event that we're expecting to emit so we're saying to emit the raffle contract to emit a raffle enter event and we can copy this try to test this in our terminal so we'll say hard hat test dash dash grep put this in quotes and that passes as well great let's now go ahead and test to make sure that we can't enter the raffle whenever this raffle is not open or it's calculating so we'll say it doesn't allow entrance when raffle is calculating and this will be an async function and first we'll enter, we'll say await raffle dot enter raffle. Value is raffle entrance fee. Now what we want to do, we want to get this raffle into a closed state. So we want to get it out of its open state. Well, how do we move this raffle from raffle dot open to raffle dot closed in perform upkeep? We move the raffle from raffle dot open to raffle dot calculating, but Perform upkeep can only be called if check upkeep returns true. Otherwise, it'll revert with raffle upkeep not needed. So what we need to do is we need to make check upkeep return true, and we will pretend to be the Chainlink Keeper network to keep calling check upkeep waiting for it to be true. And once we make it true, then we'll pretend to be the Chainlink Keepers and call perform upkeep to put this contract in a state of calculating. Now, how do we actually do that? Well, in order for check upkeep to be true, we first need to see that we are indeed open, which we are. The next thing that we need to do, though, is we need to do this time passed bit. We need to actually wait that 30 seconds for time to pass. Now, that kind of sounds awful. Do we have to wait 30 seconds for all of our tests? What if our interval was 10 days? Would we have to wait 10 days to run our tests? It sounds ridiculous. Well, hardhead actually comes built in 
with a ton of functions for us to manipulate our blockchain to do literally whatever we want it to do. In the Hardhat documentation, there's a section called Hardhat Network Reference inside the Hardhat Network section. And in here, there's a ton of information about how the Hardhat Network actually works and different configs that we can do with it. If we scroll down low enough, we can see the JSON RPC methods that we can use on this blockchain. We can do ETH accounts, block number, call, chain ID. We can do all these RPC methods that a normal blockchain has. Additionally, we can do even more than that. We can use these things called hardhat network methods. Since this is our local hardhat network and we're using this for testing, we want to be able to test any scenario and it's these methods that give us the ability to do that. You can go through this and play around and see all the different things you can do. One of them in particular is gonna be set storage at, where you can set storage at any place, which is really fun. But some of the special testing debugging methods are gonna be EVM increased time and EVM mine. Increased time allows us to automatically increase the time of our blockchain, and EVM mine allows us to mine or create new blocks. Because if we increase the time, it doesn't do anything unless there's a new block mined. So what we can do is we can run await network and we'll import network from hardhat network await network dot provider dot send EVM in crease time comma we can send a list of parameters to send with it, which for us are just going to be our interval dot two number and then we'll do plus one. Now, right now, our interval isn't stored globally, so we're probably going to want to do that. So let's go ahead and do interval. And then in our before each, we'll do interval equals await raffle dot raffle dot get interval. I'm just going to copy this and we're going to delete this whole line. Wait, raffle dot get interval. Since now we're just going to call it interval at a global level since we're going to use it a lot. Now we're going to say interval dot to number plus one. So we want to increase the time by whatever our interval is to make sure that we can actually get that check upkeep to return true. So additionally, we're going to want to do await network dot provider dot send EVM mine with an empty array, just because we just want to mine it one extra block. You can also do network dot provider dot request with an await here, these two would be basically the same, but this one's a little quicker to write. So we've increased the time of our blockchain. We've mined a block to move forward. It should be open. Time has passed. Do we have a player? We do indeed, because we've entered the raffle. We should have a balance because we'd enter the raffle. Check upkeep should now return true. So we should be able to call perform upkeep and pretend to be a chain link keeper. So we're gonna pretend to be a chain link keeper and call await raffle.perform upkeep. And we're going to pass this some empty call data just by passing a blank array like that. And now this should be in a calculating state. So now that it's in a, in a calculating state, we can say our enter raffle reverts correctly if the raffle isn't open. So now we'll say await expect raffle.enter raffle and we'll send it value of raffle entrance fee. We're expecting this dot two dot B dot reverted with that raffle underscore underscore not open error. Okay, let's try just this in our test now. So we'll run hard hat test dash dash grep, put this in quotes and perfect. That passes as well. Now, if we run hard hat test, Let's just test everything together right now. Oh, and everything is passing. Oh, this is wonderful. Awesome. Let's keep it going. And if we run hardhead coverage, we'll see our coverage is bumping up. We are already drastically better than where we were before. Let's keep going. Well, let's go ahead and test our check upkeep now. So we'll do describe check upkeep. And this will be an async function where we'll say it returns false if people haven't sent any ETH. This will be an async function. So we'll have everything in here be true, except for the fact that nobody's entered yet. So we'll do await network.provider.send EVM increase time, comma, interval dot to number plus one. We'll do await network.provider 
dot send evm mine no parameters and now we're going to call check upkeep now here's the thing check upkeep is a public function so if we just run await raffle dot check upkeep and we pass nothing in this is going to kick off a transaction because hardhat knows oh okay it's a public function they're clearly trying to send a transaction here if this was a public view function it wouldn't it would return that view but the thing is i don't really want to send a transaction but i want to simulate sending this transaction and seeing what this upkeep needed would return well i can actually get that by using something called call static. I can simulate calling this transaction and seeing what it will respond. So instead of raffle.checkupkeep, I can do raffle.callstatic.checkupkeep, and this will give me the return of upkeep needed and the bytes performed data. I can extrapolate just the upkeep needed out of this return by writing const upkeep needed equals this. And then I can do assert not upkeep needed because right now upkeep needed should return false so we'll say assert not false which is true and if upkeep needed was true then this would be false and this would break so that's what we want to do so let's go ahead we'll run this see if it worked hard hat test dash dash grep and we're in passing we are in business awesome so this is working perfectly well, let's also test that it returns false if raffle isn't open. This will be an async function. And we'll do everything except, and we'll do everything in here, but we'll make the raffle in the calculating state. So we'll do a wait, raffle.enter, raffle, value, raffle entrance fee, await network.provider.send. And I'm just going to copy these two lines here because we're going to go ahead and do those. We're also going to do await raffle.perform upkeep. Oh, and, and another way to send a blank bytes object is to do a string like 0x. Hardhat is smart enough to know that this should be transformed into just kind of a blank bytes object. So either one of these should work. Now we're do const raffle state equals await raffle.get raffle state and we'll get upkeep needed so we'll say const upkeep needed we'll do exactly what we did above raffle.call static dot check upkeep let's say excuse me await raffle.call static now we can do assert dot equal we'll say raffle state is going to be or excuse me raffle state dot to string it's going to be calculating and assert dot equal upkeep needed is going to be false. Let's run a grep on that. And perfect. That's also working correctly. Great. Now I'm going to skip over these next two tests because we haven't really learned anything from them. We're, so I'm just going to copy paste them from the GitHub. We're going to return false if enough time hasn't passed. And we're going to return true if enough time has passed. We have players ETH and is open. So we're just asserting true down here and we're asserting not true up here. If you want to pause the video and copy paste these and write these out, you absolutely can. Copy paste them from the GitHub repo, you absolutely can. Like I said, going through this and making yourself write these and making yourself understand these tests is going to make you a substantially better coder. And let's just test that it all looks good with HH test. Now, as I was recording this, I just realized that for all of our describe blocks, I've been making them async functions. Describe blocks actually don't realize and can't recognize and can't work with promises. So having them be async actually doesn't do anything. So in your describe block, you want to get rid of the async word because it's actually not helping us at all. In fact, it's just extra word and it looks kind of gross. So <laughs> in all of our describe blocks, we're going to get rid of that async keyword and just have them be functions. Of course, all of our its, though, are going to be using asynchronous functions, which is what we want. So we've written some tests for check upkeep. Now let's go ahead to perform upkeep. Let's create a new describe block. Describe for perform upkeep. This is going to be a regular function. And in here, we're going to start and say it can only run if check upkeep is true. And this will be an async function. 
because we only want perform upkeep to work if check upkeep is indeed true. So we'll say await raffle.enter raffle. We'll send it some value. Raffle entrance fee. Oops, sorry, those should be curly braces instead. Then we'll do await network.provider.send EVM increase time interval dot two number plus one await network dot provider dot send EVM mine it's an empty array there too. The reason that we're moving time forward and moving our block forward, of course, is going to be the same thing as above. We want our check upkeep to return true. And then we're going to say const dx or transaction equals await raffle dot perform upkeep. We can either do a, a blank array or we could do zero x doesn't matter. And we can assert dx. Now, if tx doesn't work or this errors out or something, this will fail, right? So that's how we know that this actually can work. So let's test this out. We want this only to work if check upkeep is true. And we made check upkeep true by all the stuff that we did above. So now we'll do yarn hardhat test dash dash grep with our it block here. And I spelled perform upkeep wrong. Perform upkeep. Let's try spelling things correctly. And let's run that test again. And great. That's working. All right. Well, what else do we want to do? We want it to revert with raffle upkeep not needed if check upkeep is false. So in here, we're going to say it reverts when check upkeep is false. This will be an async function. And we're going to do that same syntax await expect raffle dot perform upkeep empty bytes object dot two dot b reverted with and what do we want it to be reverted with? We're hoping it's reverted with this with that. We can run this test here, hard hat test dash dash grep, paste that in. And we see that is indeed passing. Now something that you'll notice here is that our revert actually goes ahead and reverts with all this extra stuff as well. Our test is smart enough to know that if all we do is put the name of the error that is getting reverted with, then it's good enough. If we want to be super specific, we can actually go ahead and make this a string interpolation and add all of these in here. So we should, can add the balance that we expect, we can add the players that we expect, and we can add the raffle state. For now, we're just gonna keep it as we're expecting this. But if you want to be super specific, you can have your tests expect for exactly the specific values that you're looking for. But all right, what is the last thing we should expect for? Well, we should check to see that this actually gets called, the raffle state gets changed, and we emit this event. So. Let's go ahead and add that. We'll say it updates the raffle state, emits an event, and calls the VRF coordinator. This will be an async function as well. Let's do this. So let's go ahead and let's make check upkeep true. I'm just going to copy paste these first three lines since it's going to be exactly the same. We're going to enter the raffle. We're going to increase the time. We're going to mine a new block. Then we're going to call perform upkeep. So we're going to say const tx response equals await raffle dot perform upkeep with an empty bytes object. Then we're going to do const tx receipt equals await tx response dot wait for one block. From this receipt, we're going to get the request ID. We're going to say const request ID equals we can get the request ID from this emitted event. However, we should look at our VRF coordinator mock again. When we call request random words, both in the mock and then in the actual contract, you'll notice that it also emits an event with random words requested. And if you look in here, the second parameter that it has is indeed the request ID. So in reality, us emitting the request ID is redundant. We can just use the emitted request ID from the VRF coordinator. For the purpose of this course and showing you what an event looks like, we're going to leave it in there. But if you want to go back and refactor this, you would definitely want to remove this emit. But for this test, let's do tx receipt dot events 
And this is going to be the first event instead of the zero width event, because before this event gets emitted, this function is going to emit an event. So instead of the zero width event, this is the first event that gets emitted after this one. So TX receipts dot events of one dot args dot request ID. And then we're going to say assert request ID dot to number is greater than zero. And then we'll also assert that the raffle state equals equals one. <laughs> so we're going to do const raffle state equals await raffle dot get raffle state. And this should actually be raffle state dot to number or to string and then you know, do whatever we want to do. And this is a very big it, but we're going to copy the whole thing anyways. HH test dash dash grep, paste that in there, rerun it, excuse me dot to to string equals equals one. Try this one more time. And perfect. We are passing. Great. Now it's time for fulfill random words. And this is where we're going to learn a lot of fantastic stuff here. So we're going to make a new describe block. I zoomed out a little bit here. And this is going to be our fulfill random words. This is going to be a function, of course. And in here, we're actually going to add another before each. We want to have somebody have entered the raffle before we run any tests in here. So we're going to do a before each, which will be an async function. And we're just going to run await raffle dot enter raffle with a value of raffle entrance fee. And then we're going to do await network dot provider dot send EVM increase time of interval dot to number plus one, and then await network dot provider dot send EVM mine, comma, before we try to do any testing of our fulfilled random words, we're going to have somebody enter the lottery. And we're going to have increased the time and mined a new block. Okay, cool. So the first thing we want to do is we want to see that fulfill random words can only be called so long as there's a request in flight, so long as there's a request ID, so long as request random words has been called. So we can actually check that by running it can only be called after perform. And this will be an async function. And in here, we're going to revert on some requests that don't exist. So we'll do await expect DRF coordinator v2 mock dot fulfill random words. And if we look at our VRF coordinator v2 mock in here has the fulfill random words function, which is what the chain link node actually calls and inside this function in the actual contract calls another contract that does the random number verification. So we're basically checking this part right here. If the request doesn't exist, we're going to get this non existent request here. And as you can see, it needs a request ID and a consumer address. So we're going to guess zero. And the consumer address is of course, is going to be raffle address. We're going to expect this to dot b dot reverted with non existent request. And then we're going to do this exact same thing with a, a different request ID, a request ID of one, and hopefully we're also going to get non-existent request. Now, ideally, no request here would ever allow this fulfill random words to go through. Now, it obviously would be really hard for us to test every single possible request ID. We're going to see a way in the future to actually test for a ton of these variables with something called fuzz testing, but we'll get to that in the future. And I spelled describe wrong. Let's actually spell describe correctly. Go ahead and run this HH test dash dash grep. And great. It passed. Now I'm going to make just one more test here. That's going to be way too big. But all right, now the test that we're about to write is going to be it's going to be a really big test. And we'd probably want to split it up into different sections. But I actually figured that this was actually the best way to show this section. And it's going to be exactly what we're going to do when we get to our staging test, we're going to write this test literally almost exactly the same. So let's write it. This is basically going to be the test that puts everything together. So we're going to test that this indeed picks a winner, resets the lottery and sends money, which is kind of a lot for a single it. We probably would want to split those into their own pieces. But for this, we're just going to put them all into one. It's going to be an async function. 
Now, we are going to learn a couple of new tricks here. So definitely be sure to follow along. Now, for this one, we're also going to add in some additional entrances, additional people who are entering this lottery. So we'll say const additional entrance equals three. We're going to have some more of those fake accounts from ethers enter our lottery here. So we're going to say const starting account index equals two. Since deployer equals zero, actually, excuse me, equals one. Since deployer is zero. So we're going to have new accounts start from index one. And we're going to do a little for loop for let i equals starting account index. i is less than the starting account index plus additional entrances, or excuse me, entrance i plus plus. We're going to do a little loop and connect our raffle contract to these new accounts. And then we're going to have these new accounts enter our raffle const account connected raffle equals raffle dot connect accounts of I and do we have accounts defined somewhere? We don't. So let's get accounts defined somewhere. We'll say const accounts equals await ethers dot get signers. And then we're going to do await account connected raffle dot enter raffle with the value, of course, of raffle entrance fee. We're going to connect three additional entrants to our raffle. So we're going to have a total of four people connect into this raffle. Now that we have them in here, we're going to keep note of our starting timestamp. So we do const starting timestamp equals await raffle dot get last timestamp. And here's where we're going to get a little bit tricky. What we want to do is a couple of things. We want to we want to perform upkeep, which is going to mock being chain link keepers, which will kick off the chain link, which will kick off calling fulfill random words. And we're going to mock doing that as well. Mock being the chain link BRF. Once we do that, we can, of course, just check to see, OK, did the recent winner get recorded? Did the raffle get reset? Does players reset? Is the timestamp reset? Is everything reset? But we want to do this in a specific way. If we're doing this on a testnet after we call fulfill random words, we will have to wait for the fulfill random words to be called. Now, since we're working with a hard hat local chain, we don't really need to wait for anything right? Because we can just say, okay, boom, snap our fingers and adjust our blockchain to do whatever we want. But we're going to simulate that we do need to wait for that event to be called. So in order for us to simulate waiting for that event, we once again need to set up a listener. Now, if we set up a listener, we don't want this test to finish before the listener has is done listening. So we need to once again, create a new promise. And this is going to be incredibly important, especially for our staging tests. So we're going to do await new promise. And this is going to be exactly the same as we set it up before. It's going to be an async function that's going to take resolve and reject as parameters. And we're going to use this little arrow syntax here saying this is an async function, basically. And we're going to set up once again that once syntax. We're going to say raffle dot once. What's the event name? winner picked. So we're going to say, listen for this winner picked event. We're going to say raffle dot once winner picked happens, do some stuff. And again, this is just an anonymous function. So we're going to say raffle dot once the winner picked event gets emitted, do some stuff. So we're, we're setting this up. Now it's in this function, we're going to add all of our asserts and everything because we want to wait for winner to get picked. Now, before the event gets fired, though, we, of course, need to actually call perform up and call fulfill random words. So this is going to seem like it's a little bit backwards, but that's because we want to set up our listener so that when we do fire the methods that will fire the event, our listener is activated and is waiting for it. So we're going to put all of our code inside of this promise now. Because if we put it outside of the promise, we put all the code outside of the promise, this promise will never get resolved because the listener will never fire its event. So if down here, you know, we call fulfill random words with something, you know, which the spelling is bad, but let's say we called it down here, this piece of code will never reach this fulfill random words because it's always going to be waiting for this once to get resolved. So we need to add all of our code inside the promise, but outside this raffle dot once. Now we don't want to wait forever. 
right? Maybe there is an issue here and we want to be able to reject this if there's an issue. Now, what we can do is in our hardhat.config, we can add a timeout. So we can add this mocha section. We can give ourselves a timeout of 200,000 milliseconds, which is gonna be 200 seconds max. If this event doesn't get fired in 200 seconds, this will be considered a failure and this test will fail, which is what we want. And I typically like to just wrap this in a try catch because if something fails, it'll cause you a whole bunch of headache. Catch E. And if anything fails, we'll also reject. There's an issue with us calling some function. We'll just say, hey, okay, that's a failure. Boom, you fail. That way our promise can get resolved in a timely manner. We're gonna add this code in a little bit, but let's keep going. Well, let's keep going and, excuse me, the try catch should be in the once, in the once above the resolve, excuse me, because this is the listener. So, sorry, we want the try catch to be inside the once. If this takes too long, we want to just go ahead and, and throw an error. Otherwise, we're going to resolve. Now, outside the listener, but inside of the promise, we're going to do this bit here where we go const tx equals await raffle.perform upkeep, and we'll pass it the empty bytes object. We'll get const tx receipt equals await tx.wait of one block. And then we're going to do await brf coordinator v2 mock dot fulfill random words tx receipt dot events of one dot args dot request id comma raffle dot address. So then the final thing that we're going to do is we're going to get this VRF coordinator v2 mock. We're going to have it call fulfill random words, which takes the request ID and the consumer address. So we're going to mock it, give it the request ID, which we get from the transaction receipt and the consumer address here. All inside this promise, we're setting up a listener for this winner picked event, and then we're mocking the Chainlink keepers, and then we're mocking the Chainlink VRF. And once this function gets called, this function should emit a winner picked event. So this raffle that was set up, that was listening for this to get emitted, will pick up and go, ah, okay, I found it. I found the winner picked event. Now we can go ahead and do some stuff. So once the winner picked event gets fired, we'll do a little console.log, found the event like this and we'll jump into our try catch. And this try catch is gonna be basically us doing all these asserts in here. So first we wanna say const recent winner equals await raffle.get recent winner. And we're gonna be checking just everything in this raffle, right? We're gonna be checking that the recent winner is right, that, that the raffle state's been reset, the players have been reset, you know, players has been reset, et cetera, et cetera. So we're gonna say const raffle state equals await raffle.get raffle state, we'll say const ending timestamp equals await raffle.get last timestamp. And let's start doing some asserts. So first we should assert that this S players array has been reset to zero. So if we call get number of players, it should be zero. So we can do const num players equals await raffle.get number of players like so and we can do assert dot equal num players dot to string is going to be zero what else can we assert well we can assert dot equal the raffle state should be back to being open so raffle state dot to string should be zero we should assert that the ending timestamp is now greater than the starting timestamp because the last timestamp should have been updated. We also want to make sure our recent winner is correct. So we'll do console.log recent winner. Now we can go to the VRF coordinator mock and we could simulate this and try to figure out who the random winner is. Do console.log accounts two. And then just to show a bunch of them, we'll do zero, one, and three. Our raffle.once. This needs to be an async function, not just a regular function. Let's try that one more time. Get latest timestamp is the correct function. So let's update this with the correct latest. Let's put latest in there because I'm spelling some things wrong. I sure am. Looks like we're printing out recent winner here when we haven't even initialized it. 
So let's move it up and then we'll do console.log recent winner. So I know this is a massive test here, but let's give it a try and see if everything kind of does what we think it should do. And it's slowing down here, which is good because we're doing a lot of stuff. And aha, we finally get this passing thing to come out. And we did a ton of console.logging. So, so there's a lot of stuff in here. All of these signers are getting printed out. So let's just make this a little easier to read. We'll add dot address to all these. We can see who the winner is. So it looks like the winner is going to be account number one, which is great. So what we can do now that we know account number one is going to be the winner, we can get that winner's starting balance way down here before we call fulfill random words. So we'll say const winner starting balance equals await accounts one dot get balance. So yes, you can just call get balance right like that. And now that we have the winner starting balance back in our tests, we can say const winner ending balance equals await counts one dot get balance. And we can make sure that this winner got paid what they need. So now we're going to do a big assert with some money stuff. Just trust me, this is what the math is. So we're going to do assert dot equal winner balance dot to string, excuse me, winner ending balance dot to string should equal the winner starting balance dot add the raffle entrance fee dot multiplied by the additional entrance dot add the raffle entrance fee that we paid dot to string. So this math is basically saying the winner should end with a balance of all of the money that everybody else added to this contract. And that's it. So we can run this test one more time. And gosh darn it, it passed. Okay, so there was a lot of code here. And this might have been one of the hardest pieces of this entire course is going to be this part right here. So if you struggled a little bit with this, don't let that bog you down. This is probably one of the more difficult sections of this course. Let's do a quick refresher of just this test that we're doing. And then we'll see it in action when we do it in our staging test. What we did is we're picking a winner, resetting the lottery, and we're sending money. Basically, what we're doing is we're testing that this fulfill random words thing does what we want it to do. A random winner wins and they get the money. So how do we actually do that? Well, we first started off by having a bunch of random people enter the lottery. Great. Sounds good. Now, what we wanted to do was we want to call perform upkeep and fulfill random words. We want to pretend that the random number was drawn. And that's what this code down here does is it calls that random number. But and what we could have done was we could have had all these assert and checked all the variables after we did this, right? We could have totally done that. However, on a test net where we don't always know exactly when a transaction is going to finish, we have to wait, we have to listen for an event to be fired. Before we could call the transactions that would end this whole thing, we needed to set something up to listen for that event to be fired. And we said, hey, only once this event is fired, only once this transaction is called, can we do our testing? Now, for our local network, we are mocking the VRF coordinators. We have control. We know exactly when this is going to run. But on a test net, we don't. So you'll see in our staging tests, we won't have any of this here. And we'll have to rely on setting up a listener to listen for the Chainlink VRF and the keepers to fire their events. And that's why the staging test is going to be so important to make sure that we're doing everything correct. And that's why we set up our local tests like this so that it mimics what we're going to be doing on our staging test, what we're going to be doing on a real network here. And again, we're setting up this listener and we're saying, ah, once we do hear this event, then we're going to try to actually check all of the balances and check that everything is working as intended. And if we don't see it, we're going to reject. And if there's a timeout, if it takes more than 200 seconds, we're going to say, OK, something went wrong. We're going to cancel it. And actually, I'm going to bump this up to 300 seconds because I think 200 seconds is not going to be enough. And depending on how quick the rank B testnet is, you might have to bump this up even bigger. So just keep that in mind. But whew, OK, we have just built some fantastic tests. Let's go ahead and let's just run HH test to see if all of our tests are going to pass. And wow, 14 passing. Everything is passing here. We are looking good. This is fantastic. All right, so now that we have our unit test, let's go ahead and create a staging test. 
our staging test is going to look really similar to that massive test that we just created down here. And the reason we set up our unit test to do this await promise thing with the raffle dot once was because this is actually how we're going to need to wait on a test net or a main net for a winner to be picked. We cannot on an actual test net pretend to be the Chainlink VRF. We can pretend to be the Chainlink Keepers if we want, but we're not going to, to make sure that the Chainlink Keepers is actually working. But we are going to be doing this because we want to listen for that event to be fired. We want to listen for the Chainlink VRF to respond with the winner. So let's create a staging test. And this is a test that we're going to run on an actual test net here. Okay. So we're going to create a new test called raffle dot staging dot test dot js and this is where we're going to put our staging test now we can actually code this pretty quickly because most of our staging test is going to look real similar to our raffle test here so for now let's just grab this whole first part and then we'll adjust it as we need and then we'll close it off because we're definitely going to need a raffle we're not going to need a vrf coordinator mock because again we're not going to be using a mock since we're on an actual test net we will need the raffle entrance fee we will need a deployer we will need a deployer and we might need the interval but let's delete it for now we probably won't need the chain id so let's delete that as well awesome something that we want to keep in mind is that when it comes to our staging tests we only want our staging test to run when we're on a test net we don't need to run our unit test because our unit tests aren't checking that compatibility with a test net we want our unit tests to only run on a local network, and we want our staging tests to only run on a test network. This is where, again, in our tests, we're gonna check to make sure what type of chain we're on. And oops, it looks like I already imported the development chains here. So we're actually, in our staging tests, we're gonna check before we run any test what kind of network we're on. So we're gonna say, if our development chains dot includes, network.name, we're gonna say if our development chains includes network.name, so if the chain we're on is in the development chains, and again, we're gonna use this ternary operator where we say, if we are on a development chain, do something, and then if we're not on a development chain, do something else. If we are on a development chain, what are we gonna do? Well, we wanna skip this, and we can actually skip this by putting in this describe.skip, and this will skip this whole section here, and then we can say, if we are on a development chain, go ahead and do our thing. So this is some really nice syntax that allows us to skip our staging tests if we're on a local network. And additionally, we can grab this syntax, go into our raffle.test.js where we have our unit tests and, and add the bang operator, which is the not, and hit save. And now we're saying, if we're not on a development chain, skip it and only run this if we are on a development chain. So this says, run this only on a testnet or a mainnet. And then this says, run this only on a local network. So great, so we're, we have a deployer, which we're gonna need. We are not going to need to deploy any fixtures because we're going to run our deploy script and our contracts should already be deployed. We will need a raffle. We won't need a VRF coordinator mock, so we can delete that. We will need the entrance fee and we probably won't need the interval, so we can go ahead and delete that too. All right, awesome. So we have our describe, we have our before each. Let's make our tests. And I'm just going to make one giant test to test kind of everything end to end. And you can add more tests later on yourself if you want to. Our staging test is going to be really similar to this massive test that we made down here. And in fact, we're going to use most of this code here as our boilerplate. So let's create a describe and we'll say, and we'll actually just copy this describe for, for random words and paste it in here. Because again, we're going to be using a lot of the same code in our staging test here. Great. So now we'll say it works with live chainlink keepers and chainlink VRF. We get a random winner async function boom so this is going to be our test in here so in this test we of course we want to enter the raffle and we shouldn't have to do anything else except for enter this raffle because the chain the keepers and the chain the vrf are going to be the ones to actually kick off this lottery for us we'll do a quick grabbing of the starting timestamp to have it before all this kicks off so we'll say const starting timestamp equals await raffle dot get last, excuse me, get latest timestamp, get latest timestamp. We're going to grab this because later on, we're going to test to see if the timestamp has indeed moved forward. We want to enter the lottery, right? We want to run the command we've been running over here all the time. We want to do, you know, await raffle.enter raffle, but we don't want to call it yet because same as what we did over here, we want to set up our listener first. Now, in here, we probably should have set up our listener before we entered the raffle. However, we controlled the blockchain, so 
putting it in that order was is was okay. But we want to set up the listener before we enter the raffle, just in case the blockchain moves really fast. And we're gonna set up the listener the exact same way we did it over here. So we're gonna say await new promise. And this is gonna be an async function that takes a resolve and a reject. And we're gonna use a little arrow notation here. And in here, we're gonna set up the listener. We're gonna say raffle dot once. Once that winner is picked, we're gonna do another async function using that arrow arrow function syntax. We'll say console.log winner picked event fired. And only once we get this winner picked, can we start doing our asserts in here? Can we start making sure that there's a winner, there's a verifiably random winner, it's been picked, the money's been moved, etc. This is where we'll do our try catch. And if there's any error, we're just going to automatically reject. We're going to reject the promise. And if all goes well, of course, we're going to resolve the promise. So our listener has been set up here. We haven't added our asserts here, but we will. Let's just go ahead and write the rest of the test, and then we'll go back and we'll update this listener. So, so our listener has been added. And inside here is actually where we're going to enter the raffle. So inside here, await raffle.enter raffle value is going to be raffle entrance fee. And really that's it, right? So we're setting up the listener, we're setting up the listener, then entering the raffle. And this code won't complete until our listener has finished listening. Because again, this whole sec is in and await. So we're going to say, okay, cool. Set up the listener, wait for this to finish. And then when it gets here, it goes, ah, okay, this is the end of the code. Uh, are we all done executing? Oh, no. Resolve or reject hasn't been called yet. And that's because we're still waiting for the listener to finish listening. Now, once we get this winner picked event emitted in here, we're going to get that recent winner. So we'll say const recent winner equals await raffle.get recent winner. We'll get the raffle state. We'll say const raffle state equals await raffle.get raffle state, we'll get the winner's balance. So we'll say const winner balance equals await recent winner. And since we're only entering with our deployer, we should check to see the deployers balance at the end. And we can't do it right with this deployer object here. So we'll have to do deployer account equals await ethers dot get signers. And we'll wrap this actually, actually, we'll just say this is Accounts here like that. And then we'll just do accounts of zero because accounts of zero is going to be our deployer. So our winner balance is going to be accounts of zero dot get balance. And then we're going to do const ending timestamp equals await raffle dot get latest timestamp. And we should also get the starting balance. So we'll say winner ending balance. We should also get the starting balance right after we enter. So we'll say const winner starting balance equals await accounts zero dot get balance. So that now we can do some comparisons. All right, great. Let's do the comparisons now. So we should first expect for the raffle to be reset. So we can do this a few different ways. Down here, we did number of players. We could also say await expect raffle dot get player zero dot two dot b dot reverted, right? Because get player of zero should get reverted because there's not even going to be an object at zero. So that's another way we can check to see if our players array has been reset. Next, we can do assert dot equal recent winner dot to string. This should equal our account zero dot address, aka our deployer. What else can we do? We will assert dot equal raffle state to zero. We want this enum to go back to open after we're done. And then we finally want to make sure that the money has been transferred correctly. So we'll do assert dot equal. This should be winner ending balance dot to string should be equal to winner starting balance dot add raffle entrance fee dot to string. So if we look down here, they enter the raffle, we check their starting balance right after they enter, and they basically should just get that raffle entrance fee back, right? Because they're the only ones 
who have entered this raffle. And then we can do one more assert. We'll do assert that the ending timestamp is greater than the starting timestamp. And then we'll, of course, say resolve. So if this all goes well, we resolve. If there's an issue with any of these asserts, we're going to catch those errors and we're going to reject. And this is going to be false. And this whole test is going to go, ah, there was an issue. We now have a staging test that looks really good here. Let's try this out. Let's try our staging test out from start to finish. So now in order for us to test this staging test from end to end, we first going to need to get our sub ID for the Chainlink VRF, then we're going to need to deploy our contract using the sub ID. We're going to need to register the contract with Chainlink VRF and its sub ID. We're going to then need to register it with Chainlink Keepers. And then of course, we're going to run the staging tests. So let's do it. So first thing we're going to need to do is what? Get our sub ID for Chainlink VRF. Okay, great. So we're going to come over to vrf.chain.link. And we're going to need to create a new subscription. If we don't have enough Rink B ETH, Let's, we want to head over to the full blockchain solidity course here. We're going to scroll down and we're going to look for the recommended testnet here, which is rink B. And we're going to use the faucets link to get some rink B link. We're on faucets.chain.link. Let's switch over from Coven to Ethereum rink B. We know we're going to need some link and some ETH. So let's just go ahead and get both. All right, great. Now that our transaction has gone through, let's just double check our wallet here. And it looks like we do indeed have Ethereum here. And if you don't see the link, you can head over to Link Token Contracts, Link Token Contracts in the Chainlink documentation. We'll scroll down to Rink B. We'll grab this contract address, import tokens, and we'll paste it in here. Add custom tokens, import tokens. Great. And now I can see my ETH and my link here. Perfect. We have some ETH. We have some link. Let's head over to VRF Subscription Management, and we're going to create a new subscription. Again, we could totally do this programmatically because the user interface here is only helping us facilitate call contracts to the registration contract that's completely decentralized and on-chain. So let's go ahead, create subscription. We'll create subscription. We'll confirm the transaction to MetaMask on the RinkB network. We'll do a little bit of waiting. And great, once it's gone through, you can go ahead and click the Add Funds button. I'm going to show you what it looks like if you accidentally refresh and jump off, though. So if you refresh, and you go back to vrf.chain.link, you should have a new active subscription. And you'll see this number here. If you click on it, this is your subscription ID. Great. So we can actually take this, come back to our code, into our helper hardhat config, and we can paste our subscription ID under subscription ID for our RinkB network here. Awesome. Now that we have a subscription, we can see it's not funded with any link, so we don't have any Oracle gas here. And we don't have any consumers, right? Our consumer is going to be our raffle or our lottery contract. So let's add some funds first. And we don't need to add a whole lot because we're only going to be testing once. So let's go, just go ahead and add two link here. This number might change depending on different costs of the test nets and how much link token there's available. So if you're actually working on a main net, be sure to head over to docs.chain.link, EVM chains, contract addresses. You can read more about the costs of some of these different chains so you can figure out exactly how much to put in here. And if you go to the full blockchain solidity course JS, we can scroll down to lesson nine. There's a recommended link amounts for ring beat staging tests for Chainlink VRF. For now, we're going to put two. For keepers, we're going to put eight. But feel free to refer to here so you know how much to put in. So let's go ahead and confirm. We're going to approve adding funds here. We'll go ahead and confirm. And we're now funding our subscription to so we can pay that Oracle gas to get our random numbers. Great. Once we're funded, we can close it. We'll do a little refresh and we can see the balance is now to link when we don't have any consumers. Perfect. So we've got our sub ID. We funded it. Now let's go ahead and deploy our contract. And we already know that we should be all good for deploying our contract. We go to our dot env. We'll need to add all of those same parameters from our previous projects. We'll need a rink B RPC URL. We'll need our private key. If we want to verify, we'll need our Etherscan API key. And if we want to do a gas output, we'll need our coin market cap API key. So let's make sure we have all that. And we'll look at our deploy script once again, just real quick. And we'll look at our helper hardcat config just real quick. And it looks like we do indeed have everything in here. And we should just be able to deploy it in one command. So we should be able to do yarn hard hat or just HH again, ploy dash dash network 
Rinkaby. Let's go try this out. All right, it looks like we've compiled successfully, we've deployed it successfully, and we've even verified it. We can go and open it up on Rinkaby Etherscan. And we can see our code here has been verified. Oh, and it's looking beautiful. We can read from it, which is great. We can see all these commands here now that it's verified. And if we look at the get raffle state, we should indeed see that it's open, right? And it's going to stay open until somebody ends the raffle and updates the amount of ETH that the contract actually has. Now that we've deployed our contract using that sub ID, we need to register the contract with Chainlink VRF and with Chainlink Keepers. So we need to add this consumer to tell Chainlink VRF hey, this is the contract that you're looking for now. So we're going to go back to vrf.chain.link and we're going to grab this contract address and we're going to add it as a consumer. Your subscription is ready. You can now add consumers. We're going to add consumer. And again, this website is just here to help facilitate us interacting with the contract. So we're going to approve add user. We'll go ahead and confirm and the transaction is going through. While we wait for this to go through, we can go to keepers.chain.link and do the same thing, work with the user interface to register a new upkeep. So we'll go ahead and add our email, hardhatfreecodecamp at gmail.com. We'll call this raffle upkeep. We'll paste our upkeep address in here. We have our admin address and you can ignore this bit right here. For gas limit, this is gonna be the gas limit of the perform upkeep function. If we did our gas estimator, we could just check to see how much that perform upkeep costs. But for now, I'm just gonna put 500,000. That's probably overkill, but that's fine. Check data, we're gonna keep blank because again, our check upkeep doesn't take anything. And then starting balance, we're gonna put as eight. And if you forget to put a starting balance here, you can always fund it later. So let's go ahead and hit register. We're gonna get a MetaMask pop-up. We're gonna go ahead and hit confirm. And we can go back to our VRF and see that it's indeed been added. And awesome, we now have a consumer on our VRF. So now let's just wait for our keepers to go through. Upkeep registration request submitted successfully. On a mainnet, you might actually have to wait a little bit for your request to go through, but on a testnet, it should automatically go through. Now, if we go back to keepers.chain.link, we should now see, we now, if we scroll down to my upkeeps, we have a raffle upkeep here. And I have two because I accidentally used the same account that I tested on. You can ignore the two, you, you'll have one. But this is the one that we just created. And we can actually see what our balance is, and then what the minimum balance for this actually is. So it looks like eight link was a little bit too low. So let's go back to faucets.chain.link slash Now that we have some more link, we can come back to our raffle upkeep and we can go ahead and hit add funds. And we'll add just three. And we'll go ahead and confirm. We first need to give permission to spend. We approved our link transfer. Now let's actually transfer the link to the contract. And all right, funds added successfully. So now let's do a little refresh. Now we no longer see that message saying that it's underfunded and we have our balance and we can see that it's more than the minimum balance. We can see the history that we just funded this twice. Once this actually kicks off, we'll see activity type will be like perform upkeep or something. We've got our sub ID. We've deployed the contract. We've registered with Chainlink VRF. We've registered it with Chainlink Keepers. Now all we need to do is run the staging test. Now running our staging test is essentially going to be the same as us calling this enter script, right? Because all we're doing in our staging test is entering the lottery. And then we just have a whole bunch of validators that we're running to make sure that things are doing as we expect. Since our contract is actually verified, what we could do on Rinkby Etherscan is we could actually go to this write contract section of the contract and we could even connect our wallets to it. And once this turns from red to green, after a little refresh, we'll now see that it's green, it's connected. We could even call functions on this contract ourselves. So we could enter the raffle ourselves. We would add, you know, however much ETH to enter the raffle, and that would kick off the keepers and the VRF as well. So we could call it via Etherscan. We could obviously call it via our staging tests here. We could call it via our scripts. We could call it via the console. There's a ton of ways to actually do this. But moment of truth here. We're going to run our staging tests, which is going to have us enter the lottery and set up a listener to make sure that everything works correctly. And additionally, we'll see on our raffle upkeep history, we'll see a transaction go through and then we'll see a transaction on our Chainlink VRF as well. Are you ready? I sure am. Let's do this. So we'll do HH test dash dash network rink B. And that should be all we need to do. And in our staging test, we probably should have added some console.logs in here 
to tell us, hey, to tell us what step that we're on with each, but uh, we forgot to. So if you follow along with the repo associated with this, we've added the console.longs in the test there. But all right, if we go to the ether scan for this contract, we go back to the rink B ether scan for this. We paste in that address. The first step that we're doing in this test, of course, well, we're setting up this listener. The first transaction is going to be entering the raffle. That's going to kick everything off, right? So if we refresh a little bit on EtherScan, we do indeed see we've entered the raffle and we've updated the balance of the raffle. Okay, awesome. So raffle has been entered. Now, then what happens? Well, if the raffle has been entered, if we go to raffle.soul, if it's open, if enough time has passed, if there's players and it has a balance, which we just checked it does, this will get kicked off by the keepers. So if we go to the keepers and we do a little refresh here, after a little bit, oh, we do indeed see check upkeep passed and we see a perform upkeep having gone through. Great, what does perform upkeep do? Well, perform upkeep calls the Chainlink VRF. So now if we go over to Chainlink VRF, we do a refresh here, we go down to history, we do indeed see one of the transactions has gone through. We can see the transaction hash, the link spent, et cetera. And now if we go back to our tests, we do indeed see raffle unit test, fulfill random request, winner pick event fired. And this means that we just went through this entire process of having a perfectly, truly decentralized raffle work on an actual test net with our integration test working correctly. Absolutely massive. Huge congratulations if you've made it this far and if you just walked through that integration test with me. Now, balance of our contract has now been reset to zero because our wallet address just won the lottery, right? And got the money back. Now you might be wondering, hey, um, I see the create raffle function and I see enter raffle, but I, I don't see, didn't the Chainlink nodes just call perform upkeep and fulfill random words? How come no matter how often I refresh, I don't see those transactions here? Well, those are actually gonna be considered internal transactions. Fulfill random words is actually called through the VRF coordinator and the VRF coordinator contract then calls fulfill randomness. So we can go to internal transactions and one of these transactions is gonna be the transaction to the VRF coordinator contract, which calls our contract. Same thing with perform upkeep. Perform upkeep, the chain link nodes actually call through the registry contract and then the registry contract calls perform upkeep. That's what we see here. And if we go through the internal transactions, we'll see them there. Now let's look at this enter raffle as well. And since we've learned about events and logs, we can actually go to the log section now and we can see our log or our event being omitted here. We can see the name raffle enter. We can see the topic zero, which is going to identify this entire event. And then we also see this number here, which is what? Which is index topic one address player. And then there's no data associated with this, right? Because we only have indexed parameters, which again, show up as topics. So this is absolutely phenomenal. Wow, absolutely massive. And we can rerun our unit test just by HH test. And this will only run our unit tests. And we can see that these are all passing as well. Things are looking fantastic here. And we have just successfully created a verifiably random, autonomous, decentralized, raffle and or lottery deployed on the blockchain. You should be so excited right now. Now, I'm not gonna show you how to push this up to GitHub. However, if you wanna push this up to GitHub, and again, tweet at me, tweet at Chainlink, tweet at Free Code Camp, please feel free to do so because you just did an amazing job getting this far. And if you're gonna wanna push this up to GitHub, remember, we're gonna wanna put a .git ignore in here, where we add a ton of stuff like .vs code, artifacts, cache, deployment, zone modules, etc type chain types, all this stuff. You can find a sample .gitignore, of course, in the GitHub repo associated with this. This is an advanced project. We did a lot of really advanced things here. And this is the section of the course where I think at this point, you've got most of the fundamentals down. And now we're gonna move into more front end and we're gonna move into more industry specific and more advanced topics that are really gonna supercharge you and make you one of the masters of the blockchain and the smart contract realm. So huge congratulations one more time. Definitely go celebrate, definitely go for that walk, take a quick break, let everything we just learned settle in your brain and get ready for the next one. All right, now we're gonna go over the TypeScript edition of this lesson. 
we're going to go a little bit quickly here because we're not learning too much new stuff for this TypeScript edition. So if you want to just follow along, you can open up the repo here and use the TypeScript branch. One thing to note that is a little bit different is when we do our promise in our tests, we're doing await promise void because we're not going to be returning anything with our promise here. But the rest is going to be exactly the same. We're going to have a hardhat.config.typescript that's going to use imports once again. Everything else is pretty much the same. We're going to export the config like we did last time. In our package.json, of course, we're going to have all of our TypeScript dependencies as well. And then our deploy scripts are going to follow that same functionality that we've used before. So now our deploy scripts use a type deploy function on our variables that we export at the bottom. And we also import the hard hat runtime environment type, which where we pull the deployments, get named account and networks from. In our tests, of course, we're still importing the types of these contracts from type chain slash types, like you see here. Like for example, raffle is going to be assigned to raffle. VRF coordinator v2 mock is going to be assigned to type VRF coordinator v2 mock. And if we wanted to deploy with these contract factories, we could as well. So those are going to be the main differences with TypeScript. There's not anything really new there. But again, if you want to follow along with TypeScript and you want to code everything in TypeScript, an example is here for you. All right, welcome back. I hope your break was absolutely fantastic because now we are getting into more advanced full stack slash front end development. We've done the back end development. We've created smart contracts. We've created our lottery in our last section. And we have all this wonderful code that allows us to work with our own provably decentralized lottery. In order for regular everyday people to use our lottery, we're going to need to build a front end. Now, previously, we learned to build a front end with raw HTML JavaScript with our FundMe project. We created a front end with just pure HTML and JavaScript. Just creating applications with HTML and JavaScript is great. And if that's what you want to do, you absolutely can. But doing it with those vanilla protocols has some limitations and working with a framework like what we're going to be working with in this section is going to make our lives a lot easier. We're going to be able to develop quicker, have more functionality and do more in less time. As you remember back to that project, it wasn't really a, a fleshed out project. If you remember, it was just a bunch of buttons and that was really it. So working with a framework is really going to enable us to put more features and add more styling to our applications really easy. Once again, the code for this entire section is located in our lesson and is located in this GitHub repository associated with the course. Now I have to put an asterisk here. As I've said many times, the front end sections of this course are not required. We're not going to learn anything new about the back end in this front end section. So if you don't care about building websites, all you want to do is learn the smart contract aspect of this course, you can skip these sections. But if you do want to learn how to build these front end applications, if you do want to give users and non developers the abilities to interact with our smart contracts, then please continue to watch. Now I also have to put an asterisk here. Because if you haven't worked with some of these frameworks before, the learning curve can seem a little bit steep. And as I've said many times, this isn't going to be a front end course that would take several more hours than what we want to do for this video. So if you've never done front end before, this is one of the sections where I do recommend you follow along with one of these optional sub lessons. We're not going to play them here, but if you follow along with one of these sub lessons, that'll definitely be incredibly helpful. One of the videos that I have for the sub lessons is this video right here, how to connect your smart contracts to MetaMask. And it shows a number of ways connecting your smart contracts and building kind of these, these front ends. It does start with a raw HTML and JavaScript edition. So you can really get some more practice in here with HTML and JavaScript. And then it moves to a Next.js ethers and a few other Next.js based applications. Doing it a few different ways will install in you some more insight on what you should be thinking about when you're approaching these. So this is absolutely a video to watch if you're new to front end development. Additionally, for this section, like I said, we're going to be using a framework. And in particular, we're going to be using the Next.js framework. Now, Next.js is a React based framework. React is a framework for building front ends and full stack applications. Next.js is a framework on top of the React framework. So if you already know React, most of this is going to come very naturally to you. The reason that we're using React in Next.js is because React is easily as of right now, one of the most popular frameworks and languages out there. And it's no surprise why. 
We've got a little article in the GitHub repo titled why you should use React.js for web development, which we'll go into it a little bit more. Some of the biggest applications like Facebook and Instagram use React.js and a number of other Fortune 500 companies. And React.js, especially in the blockchain space, is easily the most popular with protocols like Uniswap and Aave also using React.js. Now, the reason we're using this Next.js on top of React.js is that Next.js I think makes working with React much easier. And I want us to work with the easiest and most powerful framework out there. Next.js is also getting a ton of steam and has some really advanced, but in my mind, easier to use features than just raw React. Now, like I said, if you've never worked with React before, if you've never worked with Next.js before, and you wanna do a little brush up, definitely watch my video, Six Ways to Connect Your DApp to a Wallet. And if you find yourself struggling with, with this section because the front end stuff doesn't really make sense, we also have a Next.js crash course in the GitHub repo associated with this course. It's about an hour long and it is absolutely phenomenal. Free Code Camp also has some Next.js crash courses. So if you're struggling with the front end bit, go take a Next.js course and then come back to this section or skip the front end sections altogether, do the rest of the course with just the back end, and then come back and do these front end sections. We are going to show you the cutting edge ways to interact and work with your front ends and then also deploy them. And if you follow along correctly, by the end of this, you'll have a website deployed that you can show off and you can send a link of it to your friends. And now I know we already showed you what this looks like, but I'm gonna show you it one more time just so we can walk through and see exactly what we're doing. So we're gonna have this decentralized lottery where we can go ahead, we can connect our wallet if not already connected, and we can switch, we can switch around between networks and our app will actually recognize it and say, hey, the only supported chains that we're working with here are gonna be 31337, which is localhost, or four, which is RinkBee. And we'll learn how to add this validation into our application so that our app only works when we're on a chain that we want. Then we can go ahead and interact with it normally. We can click a button, MetaMask will pop up. We can go ahead and confirm. We'll get a little transaction notification saying that transaction is complete and we'll get our front end updated. And then on the back end, we'll be able to see the Chainlink nodes and the Chainlink VRF do their work. And once they actually pick a winner, after a refresh, we'll be able to see that the back end of the node was updated. We do indeed have a previous winner. Awesome. Now, not only that, we're gonna show you how to build this, but also we're gonna show you how to host it on an actual site. So you'll be able to push it up to your own blockchain. And additionally, we're gonna host it in a decentralized context. So this site that we have here is gonna be hosted on a technology that allows us to host websites in decentralized context as well. So our backends and even our front ends can be hosted in decentralized context. So, so I hope you're incredibly excited for this because we are gonna be showing you the cutting edge tools that many of the top blockchain projects use. And let's just jump right into it. Now I'm currently in the hard hat smart contract lottery project, the project that we just did. We did this hard hat smart contract lottery, which is great. What we're gonna do now is we're gonna create a new folder. Although we are gonna be coming back to this folder from time to time to make a couple of updates. So if you wanna keep it open, you absolutely can. But for me, I'm gonna go ahead and CD down our directory to kind of my main directory for this whole course. And we're gonna create a new directory called next.js smart contract lottery FCC. And then we're gonna CD into Next.js Smart Contract Lottery FCC and go ahead and hit code period. And like I said, if you want to keep that one up and have this new folder up, you absolutely can. But basically, again, we're just opening up our VS code in this Next.js Smart Contract Lottery folder. Now for this front end stuff in particular, if you want to be absolutely sure you're using the same versions as I am, what you can do is you can git clone this repo and then copy the yarn.lock and package.json and then run yarn. This will make sure you're always using the exact same packages that I'm using and you'll never run into any weird issues. So if you do run into an issue, one of the first things to do, especially for these front end parts, is to go back, make sure you have the exact same yarn.lock and package.json that I do in my examples here and go from there. Now we're here in our front end project and we're gonna create a website. We're gonna create a front end for application. Like I said, we're gonna be using Next.js. If you wanna follow along with the Next.js documentation here, they do have a great getting started and walking through this. So for us, we're gonna do yarn create next app and then put a little period saying we want our next app in this directory. If you don't put this period, it'll create it in a new folder and you'll have double folders. Okay, awesome. So once we do this, 
in our little files explorer section, we now can see all the different files that come boilerplate with this. Now, let me just do a quick walkthrough of what's going on here. Again, we also go through this in those two videos that I recommended, but it doesn't hurt to go over it twice. So node modules, of course, is gonna be the package in the installations. Pages is gonna be the different pages on our site. Let me, let me show you what I mean by this. To run this whole thing, actually, we can just run yarn, run dev, and we'll get started server on blah, 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 blah. You can command click it or copy paste it into your browser. And now you'll see on localhost 3000, we have our page up here. Now what we can do actually, so index.js is gonna be our default page, which is you know considered this slash here. But what we can do is we can create new pages. So I could do new file, you know, dog.js, and then, you know, just copy paste index into dog.js, paste it, delete everything inside the div. You don't have to follow along here and just go hi, save this, go back here. I can now put in dog and get this. So pages is going to be all kind of these different routes to these, these different spots on our website. And index is going to be our default, kind of like our home page. So I'm going to delete dog now. And inside these files is going to be something called React Syntax or JSX. They, they come as JS, but they're basically React Syntax. Next.js is based on React. You'll see these pages are this weird combination of both JavaScript and HTML. We see some import stuff at, this, at the top, which reminds us of JavaScript. And again, you'll see some import stuff at the top. And then down here, you'll see like div, head, main, h1, p. You'll see all these like HTML tags. React and Next.js allow us to do this combination of JavaScript and HTML, and it actually makes life a lot easier. Now, you'll also notice we were doing imports in here. Remember, I told you all this earlier, imports work with our front end, require does not. So that's some of the difference between node does not equal JavaScript, right? This is where the differences can start getting a little bit confusing, but the way that I usually like to think about it, so I'll just say, or node.js, excuse me, I'll just say backend, Backend.js is a little different from frontend.js. So backend.js and frontend.js are a little bit different. That's kind of the way I like to think about it. App.js is going to be our entry point for everything. The way React and Next.js work is everything is what's called component-based. In all of our files here, you're going to see this export default function home or something along those lines. What React and Next.js do is they say, hey, this huge clump of HTML stuff that has a hodgepodge of JavaScript inside of it is considered a component. And so all of our pages get wrapped through this underscore app.js page. So this is a page, but it's kind of like the main entry point and they get stuck into this component section of our app.js. So you can think of this underscore app.js as kind of the whole application, our whole front end. And on this home page. This component, we're sticking index.js right in here. We're swapping out component for index.js. Now, API is what we wanted to do if we wanted to do like some HTTP get, HTTP post requests, but we're not gonna do any of that. So we're gonna pretty much ignore API for now. Public is just gonna be some public images like a favicon or vercel.svg. Styles is going to be the CSS for our project. CSS stands for cascading style sheets. And it's basically a way to style your HTML. We're gonna change the way we do styling in a little bit, but that's basically what these both do. ESLint, I'm dumping this right now. We have our .gitignore, which we know what it does. We have our next.config.js. This is a configuration file for Next.js. Of course, we have our package.json, we have a readme, and we have our yarn.lock. So most of what we're gonna do is actually gonna be inside this pages folder, and we're also gonna create a couple other folders that are gonna be our main stuff. Now, because I'm me, and like I said, I love working with Prettier, I'm gonna automatically dump a Prettier RC and a Prettier Ignore in here, just so that I can format my code a, a little bit nicer. You can grab your Prettier RC from our last projects, you can grab your Prettier Ignore as well, or you can just pause me right now, copy paste them from the GitHub repo associated with this lesson, paste them in, and then we'll do yarn add dash dash dev Prettier so that we can auto format all of our code. If we come back over to here, we can save and boom, stuff gets auto formatted. Now, again, we're gonna be using the multi-terminal feature. So right now I have one running my front end. So if I come back to the front end, I hit refresh, it's still running. And then I have one to do, you know, my scripts and stuff. We have yarn run dev running right now. And if we go to our package.json, running yarn run dev just runs next dev. And actually let me cancel it and just do 
yarn dev. Yarn is actually smart enough that I don't need to do run dev, but it just runs next dev. And this next command comes built in once we installed next, which we did when we did yarn create next app. So next.js comes with these scripts already built in for us. We want to build our front end to enable people to interact with our lottery in a fair way and connect with the smart contract that's running. Let's create some simple front end pieces for this. So first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna to go to pages and we're gonna to go to index.js. All this stuff in here is cute and nice and thank you Next.js, but we're going to delete it all. We're gonna delete everything except for that, that head piece. We're gonna leave that up. We're just gonna change the name, put this way down here. We're gonna change the name from create next app to smart contract lottery or raffle or whatever we wanna do. Description will be our smart contract lottery. And then right below the head, we're gonna write hello, hello, and save. And if we look at our front end, we now see that it says smart contract lottery in the top, and I'm gonna move this all the way over here. Smart contract lottery in the top, and we see hello. So smart contract lottery, hello. The description here, we're not gonna see, this is gonna be something that web scrapers and stuff are gonna find. Now, one of the first things that we're going to need to do is we're going to need to create that connect button. We've done this in the past with raw JavaScript, but now we're going to do it with Next.js and React. The one that we made previously was pretty minimalistic. In fact, if we bring it back up, it checked to see if there was window.ethereum, and then it went and requested and connected and said, okay, cool, you're connected. Now, what it didn't do was a lot of the things that we would want an application to do. When we change networks, our application didn't detect that. When we changed users, our application didn't detect that. This was really stringent in the functionality that it actually had for connecting to a wallet. So we're gonna make our wallet connect button incredibly powerful so that you can connect with the button, you can switch networks, you can switch accounts, you can pretty much do anything and our application will know. Our application will be responsive. So that's gonna be one of the first things that we're gonna do. We're gonna create a header connect button nav bar. Want a little nav bar here saying, hey, you know, you can connect with this button. So that's gonna be the first thing that we're gonna do. Now we could build our whole connect button in this index.js and stick it in here. But instead, what we're gonna do is we're gonna make it a, what's called a component. So we're gonna create a new folder called components. And we're gonna create a new file in here called header.js. And you might also see a lot of people do header.jsx, .js and .jsx do literally the exact same thing. You can do either one. I'm gonna do .jsx just to remind me that this is a, a React file that we're creating. This is a component that we're creating. But yeah, you can do JS, JSX. Now, if you wanna learn a little bit more about components, we've got a link to learning about components. They're basically independent and reusable bits of code. They serve the same purpose as JavaScript functions, but work in isolation and return HTML. So basically we're gonna create like a little chunk of HTML that we're gonna export into our index.js. Like what we've done in the past, this just helps modularize and reuse this header component you know, across our project. Now, we're only gonna be using our header in one area. However, it's still nice to modularize the project regardless. And to get start, this is gonna be what's called a, a functional based component. So we're gonna create basically a function called home, right? Really pretty much exactly like what we see in JavaScript, except it's gonna return some HTML. So we can do like a little div, and my VS Code auto created the closing div here. And in here, I'm gonna be like, hi from header. This is gonna be a real minimalistic component. Like this is a valid component here. Now we have this function that returns HTML. And to give other applications the ability to use this component, we'll do export default function home. And then in our index.js, we can import it with import home. Actually, excuse me, I'm not gonna call it home. We're gonna call it header header, excuse me, export default function header, and then import header from, go down directory, components slash header, like so. So now we've imported our header in index.js. If we go back to our front end, which is still running, we don't see it in here, right? Remember, everything goes through our app. And when we're on the slash page, that's gonna go to our index.js. Index.js is importing our header but it's not returning our header, right? We see in here, we see it returns, and this is the HTML that it's returning. And as you can see, there's clearly no header in here. So now that we've imported our header, we need to actually add our header in here. So we'll do header, 
and then it adds the closing tag right here. If you don't add any stuff, you know, in between two tags, you can go ahead and just do this one liner here with a backslash at the end saying, hey, this is an open and closed tag here. Now that we've imported it, what do you think we'll see on the front end? Now that we've added it to our index.js, you're right, we see hi from header because we added our header here and then we see hello. So hi from header, hello, boom. Now, anything that we do, obviously now in our header.js, we'll see reflected on our front end. So we can do hi from header, blah, 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 you know, just a bunch of jarbles and we'll see it on our front end. So this is gonna be our section where we're gonna make our header or our nav bar or all the functionality for the connect button. Now I'm gonna tell you something and some of you are gonna love this and some of you are gonna hate this. I'm going to show you, I'm gonna show you the hard way first, then the easy way. Why am I gonna show you the hard way first? Well, because I want you to become familiar with what's actually going on behind the scenes and what's actually going on with some of these components because it is really helpful when building these front ends to understand, ah, okay, here's what's going on. If you don't understand what's going on behind the scenes, you're gonna to go to try to build more advanced applications and you're gonna have no idea what to do because you've just learned the shortcut. I like to think of it as like calculus. Like we're gonna learn how to calculate a derivative first and then we're gonna learn the shortcut to quickly getting derivatives. So don't skip this part because this is gonna help you well and beyond down the line, okay? We're gonna learn this the harder way to set everything up. In our HTML fund me, we just used raw ethers to kind of do everything. And you absolutely can use raw ethers to do everything. However, there are some packages, especially for React, that make life developing a front end substantially better. And in our full blockchain Solidity course JS, we have a number of other packages that you can use full stack development and other libraries. And if you watch this six ways to connect your dApp to a wallet, you'll actually understand some of the differences. So if you haven't watched that video, go back, watch that video. But there's a whole bunch of libraries that we can use that are gonna make our lives a lot easier. We've listed some of them here. React Morales is the one that we're gonna be using today. They have some additional plugins and they have probably my favorite thing on the planet, which I'm gonna show you how to do very soon, but these are also open source. Morales also comes with some optional functionality to hook into your own backend to, to give your app even more features and even more functionality. And that's the other reason that we're doing it. So, and we're gonna go over that later. And if you wanna use pure ethers, you absolutely still can. A lot of these packages that we're using do rely on ethers, but we're not gonna use just ethers. So we can go to the React Morales page and to get started, we can just do this bit right here. So we're literally gonna copy this and bring it into our project. And if you go to our package of JSON, we actually already have React and React DOM. So we can just do yarn add Morales and React Morales. Now you'll notice I'm not doing these as dev dependencies. I didn't do yarn add dash dash dev here. The reason is because for our production builds, when we actually create the website here, you will need Morales and you will need React Morales. We don't need Prettier to create our website. Prettier is a tool that we're using as developers. So in all of our projects so far, we've been using just dev dependencies. That's because we've only been building our projects for developers. Our GitHub repos, they haven't been made to build a website. They've only been to do things on the back end. For our website, we're actually going to be building a front end. So we need to put this in the dependencies section because we need to say, hey, these are the ones that you need to bundle up together for the front end and you can ignore these ones. And if it's just like a tool to make our lives better, it's gonna go in dev dependencies. So we're adding Morales and React Morales. And a lot of the syntax that we're gonna do for our header is actually gonna be really similar to what we've been seeing so far. So let's do this. And then actually we're just gonna change this name to manual header, manual header, update imports for manual header. You can go ahead and hit yes, do manual header here. We're gonna copy manual header, make sure it's in our index.js. Yeah, we're gonna change header to manual header and we're gonna change header to manual header here. And the reason we're doing this is because like I said, we're gonna create a much simpler header after we create this kind of harder one. And we're gonna to wanna to create that connect button, which again, we made in HTML fund me by calling ETH request accounts. What we can do actually with Morales is we can just do this thing called enable web three. So at the top, we're gonna to import use Morales from React Morales. And if you go to the React Morales page here or to their GitHub, you learn how to set all this up too and learn more about the documentation. So we're gonna import use Morales from React Morales and inside our function here, but outside of our return, we're gonna say const enable web three equals use Morales. 
Now, use Morales is what's known as a hook, as a React hook, and it's a way to keep track of state in our application. Now, in order to use Morales, our entire application needs to be wrapped around what's called a Morales provider, which is gonna be a context provider for us. And I'll explain what that means in a minute. But basically what we need to do is we need to add this Morales provider to our app.js. So in here, we're gonna import Morales provider from React Morales, and we're gonna wrap our entire app around this Morales provider. So we're gonna do some little Parentheses here, new line. We're gonna paste Morales provider like this. It's gonna give us the closing tag, copy it, paste it like this and save. And then in here, we're gonna write initialize on mount equals false. This initialize on mount piece here is the optionality to hook into a server to add some more features to our website. We don't want to hook into a server for this application. We want everything just to be open source and we don't need any of this additional functionality. So we're just going to do initialize on mount equals false. Now that the whole thing is wrapped in this morales provider, we go to the front end, we should be able to refresh. Everything looks pretty much the same. Uh, and we can start using these hooks. Now this use morales is what's known as a hook and hooks can be a little bit confusing to understand at first glance but they're incredibly powerful and they are the de facto way for us to, to build React projects. And if you're familiar with class components, we're not gonna be using class components because hooks are much better. Hooks allow function components to have access to state in other React features. State being probably one of the biggest ones and the most popular ones. We want our application to be different if we're connected to MetaMask versus if we're not, right? If we go back, we go back to our example website here, right? If we're not connected, we want to say, please connect to a wallet. And then when we are connected, we want to go ahead and, and be connected. If I have, let's say I have some variable, like, and I don't have this hook here, I have like let connected equals false, right? Or enable web three or is web three enabled. Let's say I've let connected equals false. And then I have, you know, let's say I have some button that connects us and changes connected to be true. Changing connected to be true is great and all, but it won't re-render our application. You see, when I disconnect and I reconnect here, our application actually changes based off of whether or not we're connected. And this is what we want. We want our front end to re-render when we're connected. If I just use a variable like this inside of our component, our front end isn't gonna re-render. Or even worse, if I use it outside, our component doesn't even know anything about this changing. So hooks are a way for us to actually work with state especially and automatically re-render when something changes. And enable web three is gonna be a function that we get from this use morales hook to do that. So for a lot of our components, instead of just saying like let web three enabled equals true, like we did in normal JavaScript, we're gonna be doing a lot of this, these hooks. For the most part, we usually want our website to change based off of if some variable has changed. And enable web three is a function that we get from this hook that says, okay, go ahead and connect. Enable web three is basically the equivalence of saying try await ethereum.request like this. Now enable web three, the way we're gonna use it here only works on MetaMask, but we will show you how to get this kind of, this cool little module up where we can choose between different ways to connect our app. We have our enable web three. Let's go ahead and create a button that's gonna do the same as what we did in our HTML phone. In our return bit here, instead of high front header, we're gonna add a new component or we're gonna add a new tag. We're gonna add the button tag. And for me, it automatically closed too. And I'm just gonna call it connect. I'm gonna go ahead and save. Now we see a little button that says connect. And obviously it doesn't do anything. We're gonna give this some functionality. We're gonna say on click. Now, since again, this is a JSX component, this isn't raw HTML. In raw HTML, we can't just kind of stick JavaScript wherever we want. But in JSX files, we can stick JavaScript kind of wherever we want. So inside of this, inside of this block of HTML, we can actually stick JavaScript in here by adding these little brackets. So adding these little brackets in our JavaScript return bit here, we can add JavaScript. And what we wanna do is we wanna have our on -click call enable web three. We're going to call an async function. We're gonna use the arrow syntax here. On click, we're gonna call this async function, which is just gonna be await enable web three. Await enable web three, let's add the little parentheses here. And essentially with just this, we've done pretty much everything 
that we had back in this big connect function here. Now, if we go back to our front end, do a little refresh, we can see that right now, uh, we can see that I'm actually connected. I'm gonna go ahead and disconnect. I'm still connected from some of the last applications I was doing. We can hit connect, and now we see MetaMask does indeed pop up. We'll hit next, connect, and boom. And that's all we need to do. Now, if we look at our MetaMask, it says connected. Great, okay, cool. So now we have a way to actually connect here. Let's add some functionality to make our application smart enough to have the connect button if we're connected, and if we're not connected, not have that button. So what we'll do now, is use Morales comes with another hook called is web3 enabled, which is just a variable part of our hook that keeps track of whether or not our MetaMask is connected. But we can actually do one better. We can actually check to see if there's an account because maybe web3 is connected, but, but they didn't connect it to an account. So let's go ahead and we'll import account from use Morales and we'll check to see if there's an account. So what we'll do, is inside of our div tags, we'll do a little JavaScript. We'll do that ternary operator again. We'll put account here with a question mark and we'll do that, that same syntax that we've seen before. We'll say account, if account exists, do this. If there's no account, do this. And if there's no account, we want to add this connect button. So we'll go ahead and we'll stick this in here. If there is an account, we'll just show that account, right? So we'll do div backslash div. And in here, we'll just say connected like that. Now, if we go back to our front end, we see connected. If we do a little refresh, it'll go away. So we'll, we'll re-hit connect and now we're, we're connected, which is great. Let's make it even smarter. We'll have it show our account here. So instead of just saying connected, we'll say connected to, and we'll put some JavaScript, and we'll put some JavaScript inside of our JavaScript. But since this is that HTML stuff, we got to use these brackets to say JavaScript again. So we'll put JavaScript inside the JavaScript. We'll say connected to, we can just say account. Now we go back to our front end. We see connected to blah, 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 blah. You'll notice if you hit refresh, you'll have to reconnect. We'll get to that in a minute. What a lot of people do is they'll do account.slice 0, 6, and then outside of the brackets, they'll do dot, dot, dot. Another set of brackets, account.slice, account.length minus 4. We close that off like that. We have our account. When we hit connect now, it says connected to blah, blah, blah. Hello. And because of these hooks, when I switch accounts and I connect with these new accounts, it even automatically re-renders switching accounts. So these hooks are really good for re-rendering our websites whenever some value changes. For example, if I said like let count number equals seven and we had a button that updated account number, our front end wouldn't re-render unless we, we told it specifically to re-render, which gets really annoying. So hooks kind of help us a lot with doing that. And it allows us to keep track of states between renders. Now here is something that right now it doesn't do. If I hit refresh, I have to re-hit this connect button, even though my MetaMask says, hey, we're connected. But if I refresh, I have to re-hit this connect button. Why is this happening? Well, when I hit refresh, our website doesn't know that we've hit enable web three already, right? Because we basically go back to blank when I refresh. And then I have to hit connect, which is really obnoxious and really annoying. So we want to add some functionality so that automatically the instant we we render, we go ahead and we check to see if we're already connected and if we're connected to, you know, show this. Now to do that, we can use another hook called use effect. And this is a core react hook. So we'll do import use effect from react like this. This is a core hook directly from React, and it's one of the most popular out there along with use state. And we've left some links to learning more about the effect hook in the GitHub repo associated with this course. I'm gonna give you my summary of basically what this use effect does. We basically have this function called use effect, which takes two parameters. It takes a function as its first parameter, and then second, it optionally takes a dependency array. And what this use effect is going to do is it's going to keep checking the values in this dependency array. And if anything in this dependency array changes, it's going to call some function and then re-render the front end. So for example, uh, use Morales comes with this function called is web3 enabled or this variable called is web3 enabled. If we add this to our dependency array, what we can do in our use effect is do console.log i, and then we can do console.log is web3 enabled. 
what this use effect is going to be doing is it's going to constantly be running. This is running all the time, and it's going to be listening to see if is Web3 enabled changes, right? And anytime we run enable Web3, is Web3 enabled becomes true. So, so now if we go to the front end, we do a little refresh, we see high, false, high, false. Now, why do we see this twice? Is Web3 enabled only changed once? Well, this is because of how use effect works. It will automatically run on load, or right, or the first time it, it does, and then it'll run checking the value. So we're basically seeing this run twice. It runs the first time we load it, and then it'll check the value and it'll run again. So we see it go twice, even though it's really just once. But if we go back here, sorry, let me just do a quick reload again. We hit connect. We now see high is now true because it saw is Web3 enabled change to true because enable Web3 made is Web3 enabled return true. And it ran this again, right? So that's how that actually works. And there's a couple different ways to think about this actually. Uh, we actually don't even need to give this an array. And what happens if we don't give this an array? Well, let's refresh. We'll hit connect and we'll see it, it still ran a couple times. So if we don't give it array, no dependency array, It'll run anytime something re-renders. And you need to be careful with this because then you can get circular renders. If you have some use effect that changes some value and you have another use effect that re-renders when that value changes, well, they're both just gonna keep changing back and back and forth. So no dependency array like this, it will run anytime something re-renders. If we give it a blank dependency array, it'll just run once on load, it'll just run one time. So now like we have a blank dependency array in here. We reload, right? We see that it runs twice. That's actually because we're basically re-rendering once in the background. So it really is just running once, but there's something else going on in the background. So it, it looks like it's running twice. Now, if we just add is Web3 enabled, do a little refresh, it'll do the exact same thing. It'll run the same amount as if this was blank, but when we connect, it'll add here. If this was a blank array and we refresh, we'll see it kick out twice, which should be once, but like I said, there's something going on in the background. If we hit connect now, we don't see anything here because the blank dependency array says, hey, I'm only gonna run one time on load. Now, if there's R stuff in this array, like is Web3 enabled, it's gonna run anytime something in this array changes, right? So again, we'll refresh, we'll connect. We see it ran again after I hit connect. We'll refresh, hi, hi, connect, it ran one more time. So. So that's kind of the cheat sheet here. If we give it no dependency array, it's going to run anytime anything in this project re-renders. If we give it a blank dependency array, it's just going to run one time or like we saw it, it ran twice, but that's because there's something else re-rendering in the background. And if we give it dependencies in this array, it's going to run anytime something in this array changes. And this is really helpful because oftentimes we're going to want our front ends to re-render. This use effect will say, oh, cool, some value changed. I'm going to run this function and then I'm going to re-render your front end. And now we're going to use this use effect thing to make sure that when we refresh, it remembers that we're actually connected. So how do we do that? Inside here, we are going to use this is Web3 enabled thing. And the first thing that we want to just do is we want to say if is Web3 enabled, then we'll just return. Because if we're already connected to Web3, then we don't need to do anything. Now, if we're not connected to Web3 and we don't have an account, we'll want to go ahead and call enable Web3, right? We'll want to automatically enable Web3. So now if I go back, you'll see just with this code, I'm just always automatically calling enable Web3. But this can get really annoying because if I disconnect, right, let's go ahead and disconnect everything. And now I refresh. It's going to always call enable web three, right? Every time we refresh, it's going to automatically call enable web three without us even hitting the connect button. So that's no good to, we want to actually see if we're connected. So the way we do this, like I said, we want to use our local storage again, application or these little, this little thing here, go to application. We want our, we want our application to remember that somebody hit this connect button and they went and connected to us. So what we're going to do is in our little on click function down here, we're not just gonna call await enable web three. We're also gonna store a little remembrance here saying, hey, uh, we actually did connect recently. So below this, we're gonna run window.localstorage.setItem connected, comma, injected. Um, I'm actually gonna comma this out for now because my friend's just gonna keep popping up like that. 
So what this does is we're saying, okay, in our window, because again, if you go back to the window, you go to console, and you type window, you're actually gonna see this giant window thing here, right? Which we showed you before. There's always this window object in here. And we're gonna do window.localStorage, which relates to, if we go to uh, this application section, this local storage section here, that set item connected to injected. So we're gonna set a new key value in here. We're doing it like this because in the future, maybe you wanna do, you know, connected to wallet connect or connected to Coinbase wallet or something, right? But we're just gonna say injected, meaning we're connected to that MetaMask. And in some versions of Next.js, Next.js has a hard time knowing about this window variable. So we can just do if type of window does not equal equal undefined, then we're gonna do this. So we're just making sure that window doesn't equal undefined, that there is a window. So now if I go back to the front end and I hit connect and we go ahead and we connect here, we'll see now in our application local storage, we'll see we've added this connected injected bit here. We're, we're storing in the browser that we are indeed connected to this. Now that we've added this into our browser, we can roll back up to our use effect here and say, okay, if they're already connected, great, we'll be done. But before we do anything, let's check to see if they have this here. And if they already are connected, let's just run that connect bit. So we'll say if type of window does not equal undefined, right? Because we want to check for that window object again. We'll say if window.localStorage.getItem connected connected. So if that connected key exists, then we'll just run enable web three. So now we have some functionality in here, which even when we refresh, it'll automatically run enable web three for us. So now if I go ahead and refresh on the front end, we don't have to press that connect button anymore because it goes, Oh, I see that locally we stored this connected key. Whenever you refresh, now it, go, it checks for this first, it sees it, and then it runs Enable Web 3. Now on the other side though, if we're in here, and now we disconnect, and then we refresh, this will show up, which is really annoying. And every time we refresh, it'll keep showing up, which we don't want. We want it to be that when we disconnect, we tell it, hey, uh, we, we've, uh, we've gone ahead and disconnected here. So back in our application, we can add another use effect to check to see if we've disconnected. So let's create another use effect that's gonna constantly just look for us being connected. We'll say use effect, do a little arrow bracket thing here. And we're gonna do this anytime, and oh my goodness, anytime I save, it's gonna keep popping up. So I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna comment that out for now. So in here, we wanna say, okay, whenever there's a re-render, we wanna run if any account has changed. And Morales has some functionality for us to do this as well. So from use Morales, we're gonna import Morales. And then down here in our use effect, inside the little function, we're going to say Morales on account changed of account, we're going to do some stuff. So on account changed takes a function as an input parameter. So we'll say console dot log account change to account. And what we can do is we can check to see if this account is null. And we can say if account equals equals null, then if the account's null, we can assume they've disconnected. So we can say window.localStorage.remove item connected. We'll also run a deactivate web three function. So from where else, deactivate web three. We'll also run deactivate web three, which is gonna set is web three enabled to false. So we're gonna disconnect the web three. And then we're gonna say console.log null count found. So let's try this out now. Let's go back to our front end. We'll do a little refresh here. So right now it says we're connected, even though in my MetaMask, we're not connected, right? And to start from scratch here, you can go ahead and be disconnected. But, but my browser says, hey, we're connected, right? So now we'll connect and we'll actually be connected, right? Next connect. And it, uh, and it just overwrote connected, you know, with inject. Let's, let's make this injected and then we'll remove. Yep. Okay. Injected. We'll refresh, click connect, and now it says injected. Okay, cool. So now we're connected here. If in here, if I just switch accounts, right? Let's go to account three, I'll connect. If we go back to our console real quick, 
we'll say account change to blah, blah, blah. I can change back, right? We'll go changed, account change to blah, blah, blah. Now, if we go back to our application, go in here and we disconnect now. Let's disconnect both of these, disconnect and disconnect. We'll see it's now been removed from local storage. And if we go to our console, it'll say null account change to null, null account found, and it removed it. Now, if I hit refresh, nothing happens here. I can go ahead and connect, right? Next, connect. I can refresh. Whoops, I need to go back in here and re-enable this. So sorry, let's add this back in here. But now I can refresh. Let's go ahead and disconnect here. Disconnect. Let's go back to the console. We can connect. Thing will pop up. Next, connect. I can refresh. It stays connected for me. I can switch accounts. I can go ahead in here. I can switch accounts. I can even disconnect. And it'll automatically update for me which is what we want. So now we've essentially made a way more robust connect button where it goes back and forth with when we're connected. Now, now one more thing that we might wanna do for our application is when we hit connect, we wanna maybe disable this button, right? We don't want it to allow it to be able to be pressed. So I'm gonna hit cancel. We're just gonna add one more bit of functionality here. We're gonna add this is web three enable loading. And what this does is it just checks to see if MetaMask has popped up. And so with our button, after the on click section, we can add disabled equals is Web3 enabled loading. So it'll be disabled if we're loading here. So let's go ahead and we'll disconnect, disconnect. Now we'll hit connect and you'll see the button can't be clicked. So that just it makes it a little bit nicer. Next, connect, bada bing, bada boom. Awesome. We have just made a way more robust front end than what we had before. This connect button is super sleek and it allows us to kind of flip back and forth in our application is incredibly powerful and knows how to handle all these different changes. Now that we've learned how to do it the manual way, let me give you the cheaty way. In our components, we're gonna create a new file, header.js. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna install this web three UI kit. It's a front end kit and it has a whole bunch of these components already built for us. So we can build like a header component and a connect button component just by using this. So to install, to install it, we're gonna come back here. We're gonna stop our front end and we're just gonna run yarn add web3 UI kit like that. And again, we don't want this to be a dev dependency because it is gonna be a part of our website. And then we'll do in our header.js, we'll do import connect button from web3 UI kit and then we'll do export default function header and then all we'll do is return we'll do like a div and then inside this div we'll do connect button with a little backslash here we aren't going to need this for this project but if we want to be super explicit we'll say morales auth equals false just again to reiterate, hey, we're, we're not trying to connect to a server here, just to make that super explicit. But this connect button does everything this manual header thing that we just created does. So back in our index.js, we can comment or delete this line. We'll do import header from dot dot slash components slash header. And then instead of manual header, we'll just do header. We start our app back up with yarn dev again. We go back to the page. We do a little refresh here. We now see we have this connect wallet button and it even looks a lot nicer. It's got some nice styling to it as well. We can hit connect wallet and it'll give us this little modal asking us which wallet we wanna to connect to. So asking us which wallet we wanna to connect to is kind of similar in our manual header to this or set item connected injected, right? For wallet connect, it would do connected wallet connect for trust wallet it would it would set item as connected wallet connect etc so it allows us to connect in different ways and we if we hit metamask we go ahead and connect like so it even has some nice styling here where it gives us our wallet address here but it also gives us our wallet balance as well and again if we go ahead and disconnect we'll see it automatically disconnect we can connect like so we can reconnect like so boom boom if we switch accounts it's smart enough to know that we're switching accounts so I know I showed you kind of the hard way, but I wanted to show you kind of what's going on. It's setting this local storage in the background so that it knows which where it's actually connected. 
But for headers moving forward, this is all you need and your life will be drastically, drastically easier. And let's just add decentralized lottery or decentralized raffle or whatever you want to our header as well. So it says decentralized lottery, you know, the button, hello. Now that we have that, what else do we need? Well, well, the main thing that this app needs to do is just have a big button that says enter the lottery and then ideally, you know, show how many people are in the lottery and then the recent winner as well. So let's go ahead. We'll create a new component called lottery entrance and we'll grab that component similar to like what we did with our header. We'll drop this, that component right here and then our app will pretty much be done. So let's create this lottery entrance component, lottery entrance.js. Right. And again, and the reason we're putting these in components, we could hundred percent stick it all, you know, all our code in here to make it more modular so that we, in the future, if we want to have more pages or do other stuff, and I'm going to zoom out a little bit just so that we can see all of our code a little bit easier. This is our whole index.js. This is our whole header. Let's create a new lottery entrance app just for the boilerplate code here. We can do export default lottery entrance. Oops, excuse me. Export default function lottery entrance. And this is just going to be, you know, another component where we're going to return some of that JSX HTML stuff, right? So we're going to do div, we can do like hi from lottery entrance, like so. And now that we do that, we can go back to our index.js, we can do import lottery entrance from dot dot slash components slash lottery entrance. And we'll stick it right underneath the header like that. And if we go back to our website, we see hi from lottery entrance. So our lottery entrance is going to be right underneath the header, which is what we want. And then we'll delete this line that says hello. So lottery entrance, what is the what is the first thing that we really need to do in here? Well, we're going to want to have a function to call the lottery to enter the lottery. Let's go ahead and do this. Now let's go back to how we did this with HTML fund me. We called that old fund function like this, but doing it like this won't re-render and there's a whole lot of other functionality that doing it like this won't give us. So we're gonna use Morales to actually call some of these functions because Morales has, in React Morales, again, they have hooks for us to do pretty much anything we wanna do. And one of these hooks is called use web three contract. And what this does is it gives us a hook that will give us the data returned from a, a function call, the, an error returned, a little function that we can use to call any function. And then we also have these really helpful is fetching and is loading. So if we want ever want to have our UI or our website do something while it's fetching or while it's loading the transaction, we can use these two variables to do that. And then all we need to do is we just need to pass it the contract information, which similar to ethers is gonna be the ABI. Contract address will pass the function name and then any parameters for that function. So we're gonna use this syntax here to make that transaction to the blockchain and to call these functions. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do import use web three contract from react Morales and inside our function, but before our return, of course, we're gonna say const and then we'll do kind of exactly what we see in here. For now, let's just get the function. Let's just get this run contract function because this is gonna be the function that we can call to actually enter the lottery. So we'll say const run contract function and we're actually gonna call this enter raffle and we'll say equals use web three contract and we need to pass the ABI. We're gonna need to pass the contract address we're gonna to need to give it the function name. We'll need to give it the params, which actually we do know it's gonna be blank. But then finally, we will need the message value because if we remember back, enter raffle doesn't take any parameters. All it takes is this message.value bit. So that's all we're gonna to need to pass. So how do we get all this stuff? And I'm gonna leave this in here, but we're gonna comment it out for now because this is what we need to do but we need to get all of this stuff into our code here. So how do we actually get all that stuff? Well, ABI is easy, right? ABI isn't gonna change at all, no matter what network we're on. ABI is always gonna stay the same. Now, if you've already deployed your smart contracts and you know exactly what address it is because you've deployed to a mainnet or you've deployed to a testnet, all this stuff isn't really gonna change. And we can just hard code it all right into here, or we could do what a lot of people do is they'll create a constants folder 
And in here, they'll add like an abi.json. Maybe they'll add a contract addresses.json. And then they'll add maybe like an index.js or something. We're gonna build our application in a way we can actually test locally using our own hard hat network and then compare it to what it looks like on an actual test net as well. So we're gonna make it network agnostic so the front end works exactly the same no matter what network that we're on. And we can go back, download a directory, back into our CD hard hat smart contract lottery free code camp and spin up our node here, right? With HH node or yarn hard hat node. And we'll use this as the blockchain that we're gonna connect to. The thing is, if I go back here and I'm building the front end and I go, ah, like this would be better if we did X, Y, or Z. And maybe I change the name of some functions, you know, blah, 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 something else. I want that change to be reflected on my front end. And I wanna be able to code my front end as such. So since we are the only developer right now, we kinda of have the ability of where we both know the back end code and the front end code. So something that I like to do to make my life a little bit easier is I like to create an update front end deploy script. So that after we deploy stuff, we run a little script that will create this constants folder for us with a whole bunch of stuff, right? It'll give an ABI, it'll give contract addresses and anything else we might need in our front end from our back end. So what I like to do is I like to come back to my original code and, and update this for a new script. So I'll come in here in this deploy script, I'll create a new file and I'll call it 02 or even like 99, 99 update front end.js. And the reason I do 99 obviously is because we want this to be always the last script in our deploy folder. And then we can just write a little script that's connected. We can just write a little script that's connected to our front end here so that whenever we deploy contracts, no matter what chain, we can update that constants folder on our front end. So let's go ahead and create that script right now. We'll do module.exports equals async function, and we'll add all our stuff in here. We don't really need to deploy any contracts because we're just updating the front end. So we can just leave the parameters of this one blank. And the other thing I like to do, because sometimes I don't care about the front end, what I'll do is I'll only update the front end if we've specified a .env variable. So I'll create a .env variable called update front end, and then I'll set this to true. And now in our script here, we can say if process.env.update front end, then we can just say like console.log updating front end. And now back in here, right, if I'm at, if I'm in the correct directory in here, if we're on hard hat deploy, you know, I'll get this little updating front end, and now we can update front end. So let's do it. So I'm actually gonna create one function called update contract addresses. And this is gonna be our function that we're gonna to use to update contract addresses. Then I'm gonna make one called update ABI where we just update the ABIs on the front end. So, so we're gonna call this update contract addresses. So I'm gonna create a new function, async function, update contract addresses. And first we're gonna get that raffle contract since we're gonna to need to get its address. So we're gonna say const raffle, equals await, and we're gonna do the same thing we've been doing, ethers.getContract, raffle. And then my VS Code auto imported it, but doesn't const ethers equals require hard hat like so. So we have raffle in here, and we're gonna to wanna to pass this raffle address to our front end. Since this is gonna be a variable that we might use a lot of places, we could just add it like const front end location addresses file equals and we're gonna give it the relative path to where we are now, which is gonna be, you know, if we CD down a directory to Next.js Smart Contract Lottery, FCC, and I can even just copy this, paste that in here. And then it's in the constants folder, and it's gonna be contract addresses.json. And let's get the ABI file. We'll say const front end ABI file. It's gonna equal, and this is gonna be nearly the same thing. So we can just copy paste that, and then we'll do slash abi.json. And now in our update contract addresses function, we can say const current addresses equals, and we can read, again in our front end, we can read from this file. So I'll usually start it with just two brackets so that it's like JSON compatible in both of these files. And so to read it, we're gonna say json.parse 
fs dot read file sync and then we're gonna have to import we're gonna say const fs equals require i know we've used fs extra in the past but for this one we're just going to use fs which is going to be our front and addresses file and we're going to read it in with utf eight encoding so now this is going to be our current addresses and we're going to update the list of current addresses with some new addresses because our contract addresses we want this to be chain agnostic we would do something like four you know and then the addresses on rink b we could do three one three three seven and then the addresses on our local host right we, we want to be able to keep track of all the different addresses across all the different chains so back in our function here then we'll say if if network dot config dot chain id dot to string in contract addresses that were config id is in there then we're just going to go ahead and add this new contract address in there but before we add this new address in there let's just check to make sure it's not already in there so we're just going to say if contract addresses of network dot config dot chain id dot to string this is so long i don't want to keep running this i'm going to say const chain id equals network dot config dot chain id dot to string and we're just going to use chain id if chain ID in contract address, then if if we don't already have dot includes raffle dot address, we're gonna go ahead and add this new address. And then if the chain ID doesn't even exist, we're gonna go ahead and do contract addresses, current addresses equals, or excuse me, current addresses of chain ID equals and then we'll just create a new array, raffle.address. So we're saying if the chain ID doesn't exist in current addresses, we're just gonna add this new array in there. And then finally, now that we've updated this object, we're gonna write it back to this file. So we'll say fs.write file sync front end addresses file. And then we're gonna do json.stringify. So we're gonna stringify this JSON object. So we're just gonna go ahead and write it back. And then at the bottom, module.exports dot tags equals all and then front end. All right, cool. So we have a function to update the contract addresses, but we also need the ABI. So we're going to do date ABI and we're going to create another function, async function, update ABI. And in here, we're going to do the exact same thing. Const raffle equals await ethers dot get contract raffle fx dot write file sync front end ABI. Oops, just going to copy paste it front end ABI file. And then to pass just the ABI, we can actually get it directly from this raffle object. We can actually just do raffle dot interface dot format ethers dot utils dot format types dot JSON. If you look in the ethers docs, ethers has this contract dot interface thing, which returns an interface, which is different from a solidity interface, but it allows us basically just to get the ABI with this one line of code. So in our backend code here, now if you run HH deploy or HH node, we should automatically update our contract addresses and our ABI.json. So let's go ahead and try this. So we'll run HH node. So we'll start a node right in this terminal over here, we'll flip back to the front end. And if we open ABI.json, we do indeed now see we have the raffle ABI in this file. And if we go to contract addresses, we see on network 31337, here is our first address, right? And if we deploy to different chains, this will get populated with different network IDs and then a list of addresses associated with them. So it helps make our front ends a lot easier to maintain and bounce around and, and kind of test and work with. Now that we've done all this, we can actually close our hard hat smart contract lottery free code camp, the hard hat project for this. And we're just gonna have all of our terminals be, you know, in here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go down to directory, cd dot dot, and we're gonna cd into, oh, sorry, we actually were already in there. cd hard hat smart contract lottery free code camp. And then in this one, we're gonna run hh node or yarn hard hat node. 
Now we'll have a local blockchain running so we can test everything that we're doing in the front end. Actually, I'm gonna move this up one. So now in our first area here, we have our front end code running. Then we have our blockchain running. And then in this one, we're just gonna add, you know, whatever we wanna add. Now we can actually go ahead and hit this little X button here to close the panel. So that's just hiding the panel. These are all still up. They only get trashed when you actually hit the little trash can. So we're just gonna close the panel, but all those terminals are still running, I promise. Back, so where were we? Okay, back to our function here. So we just automated the process of updating our ABIs and then updating our contracts as well. And now we can import these into our files. Now we could import them one at a time by being like import ABI, from dot dot slash constants slash ABI, or we could do something a little bit clever is we could export these in the same file. So if we create a new file, a new index.js, in here we can import them and then export them in this one file. We can say const contract addresses equals require dot dot slash contract addresses.json and then const ABI equals require dot slash, oops. ABI.json, and then we'll do module.exports equals ABI and contract addresses. So now once we export them like this, back in our lottery entrance, we can import them just in one line. So we'll say import ABI comma contract addresses from dot dot slash constants. So we can just specify the folder instead of each individual files because we have this index.js here, which basically represents this whole folder. Back in here, what do we have now? Let's uncomment this. ABI, okay, great. We have the ABI, we're importing it from our constants folder. Contract addresses, we have our contract addresses and we're gonna need to specify the network ID in just a second here. We have the function name here, which is gonna be what? Enter raffle, there are no params, so all we need to do, so how do we get both the chain ID and then also the message.value? Well, chain ID is something that we can get really easily with Morales. Let's comment this whole section out one more time, just so I can show you something. We can do import. Once again, we're gonna get that use Morales hook from React Morales. And what we can do is we can say const chain ID equals use Morales. Now, the reason Morales knows about what chain we're on is because back in our header component, the header actually passes up all the information about the MetaMask to the Morales provider. And then the Morales provider passes it down to all the components inside those Morales provider tags. Const chain ID equals use Morales. And I'm just gonna do a little console.log chain ID because I wanna show you what it looks like. So if we do a little refresh, and we're in the console here, we can ignore some of these warnings here, but we see the chain ID is actually 0x5. Well, because I'm on the Rinkby chain, or the Gorilla chain, excuse me. If I switch back to hardhat localhost, which you should know how to do for our HTML fund me bit, if you don't have hardhat localhost in your MetaMask, go back to that HTML fund me bit, follow that along, okay, great. Now it's gonna print this OX blah, 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 blah. So that might be a little bit confusing, but this is the hex version of our chain ID, right? So let's switch to Ethereum mainnet. Now we print out OX1, right? OX1 is the hex version of the number one. So chain ID gives us the hex edition of the chain ID. So I don't want the hex edition, I want the actual number. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, okay, chain ID, your name is actually gonna be chain ID hex, and we can do console.log chain ID hex, but I want the number, so what we can do is parse, a built-in JavaScript parse int chain ID hex like that. Now, if I go back, we'll do a little refresh here. Just scroll away from the warning. We can see the one here. Now let's switch to hard hat localhost. We'll scroll down. We see 31337. So use Morales chain ID returns the hex. We parse it with parse int to get the actual number. Okay, great. So we can stick the chain ID into here. Now this raffle address is something that we're actually gonna use a lot. We might as well have it be at the top of our code here we aren't gonna be changing the raffle address, so we don't need to put it in a hook. We are gonna technically be changing the address when we change networks, but our header app takes care of re-rendering and dealing with all that. So we can just make this a constant variable. So we can say const raffle address equals, first let's check the chain ID hex, 
And if there's a chain ID hex, and if there's not a chain ID hex, we're gonna do something else. Excuse me, we're gonna say chain ID hex in contract addresses. And actually there's never gonna be a chain ID hex. So we'll do const chain ID equals chain ID hex parsed, parsed chain ID hex. And you might be thinking, hey, this these are both the same name. Well, what we're doing up here in use morales is we're saying, hey, pull out the chain ID object and then rename it to chain ID hex. And down here we're saying, hey, we're gonna create a new variable called chain ID. So we'll say contract addresses of chain ID at zero. So in here, we're saying this network ID and this address. Otherwise, we'll just say no. Okay, we're getting there. Let's uncomment this. Now we have the raffle address and we can just stick it in here. All we need now is the message dot value. If we remember back to our raffle, we actually set that fee dynamically. So we have in here, we do entrance fee equals entrance fee, which is a parameter in the constructor. So we wanna call this get entrance fee function. This is one of the ways we can send a transaction and we can also send functions. One of the ways that we're gonna do it, right when our lottery entrance loads, we're gonna run a function to read that entrance fee value. So how do we do that? Well, we can use one of our hooks again, right? Use effect. Use effect can run right when something changes. We're only gonna wanna try to get that raffle entrance fee if Web3 is enabled. So what we can do is back up in here and use Morales, we'll pull in that is Web3 enabled, and we'll have our use effect in our function, we'll just say if is Web3 enabled, then we'll try to read. So we can go ahead and use this use Web3 contract way again. Let's go ahead and just copy paste this and we'll use the same setup here, except instead of enter raffle, of course, we're gonna be doing get entrance fee. So we're gonna do get entrance fee. We need the ABI, we got it. Raffle address, got it. This is gonna be, the function name is gonna be get entrance fee, params, nothing, message.value, nothing. We're gonna be calling this get entrance fee function. And now I'll finally show you how to actually call one of these in our contracts here. Use web3 contract, down in our use effect, we're actually gonna call get entrance fee. Now, if we just call get entrance fee like this, and we say like, you know, const something equals get entrance fee, and then console.log something, what do you think is gonna happen? And oops, I need to import, I need to import use effect from React. There we go. If we look at our logs, huh, I don't see console.log something. Well, get entrance fee is gonna be an async function. Once again, we need to wait, we would need to do await get entrance fee, right? So there's an issue. We can't call await in our use effect. So what can we do? Well, we can actually make an async function, we'll call it update UI, and then we can stick this inside of the async function here, and we can call update UI right outside of it like this. So now we go back to our front end, we can do a little refresh, and if we scroll, we still see nothing. Well, is Web3 enabled actually changes. So the first time that this runs, is Web3 enabled probably is false. But when it turns to true, we want to we want to run this section. In our little dependency array, we're gonna add this in here, right? And the reason that it's false to start with is because of exactly what we showed in that manual header, right? What does it do? Well, first we check to see after we do a refresh, if window.localstorage.getitem is connected, then we call enable web three, which will make this enabled. So in our lottery entrance, is web three enabled starts off as false when we do a refresh. And then the browser checks the local storage says, oh, web three should be enabled. Let's enable it and it turns to true. So now if we hit save and we do a little refresh in our console, we can now see the logged out entrance fee. So then we'll switch this to entrance fee from contract. Now, we also probably want to show this entrance fee on our UI. If we do let entrance fee, and we'll say equals blank, and we'll take this and we'll update, you know, and we'll update this just saying entrance fee equals await entrance fee. Cool, now we have this as kind of a global variable. We can add it in here, and then let's even do await entrance fee, put this whole thing in parentheses, and then do dot to string. And we can even console.log, entrance fee. Now we're adding it in our browser, but there's still an issue here. Let's see if you can spot it. We'll do a little refresh. We don't see the entrance fee in the UI here, 
but we do see it get console.logged out, right? And again, this is gonna be in way here. What, what is going on here? Well, use effect is gonna re-render our browser, right? And that's what we want. Is what 3 enable goes from false to true, our browser re-renders. But once we get our entrance fee, does our browser server re-render? No, it does not. Because entrance fee is just one of these normal variables, right? So we wanna actually change this from being just a normal variable to being a hook. Because entrance fee does get updated, but it's not triggering a re-render. So we actually wanna change this to being what's called a use state hook. So you can read some more on the documentation about the using the state hook. It's kind of the same as doing let entrance fee, you know, equals blah, 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 and setting it below, but it also will trigger a re-render for us. And to do it, we actually do const entrance fee, comma, set entrance fee equals use state of zero import use state from react as well. So basically entrance fee is going to be our value, right? So if we do console.log entrance fee, it's going to print out the entrance fee. Entrance fee is going to be the variable we call to get the entrance fee. The entrance fee is going to be the function we call to update or set that entrance fee. And whenever that this entrance fee variable is set, we trigger a re-render from the front end. We have the state or the actual variable and the function to update it. And then in in the use state here, we just give it its starting value. So we're saying entrance fee is gonna start out as zero. So now that we know that, let's go back down here. And instead of saying entrance fee equals this, we, we can say const entrance fee from call equals await entrance fee dot to string. And then we can say set entrance fee to this entrance fee from call. And now when we set the use state, we're gonna trigger a re-render so entrance fee will actually be populated. So now if we go to our browser, we do a little refresh here, we can see that the entrance fee has indeed been re-rendered here and we can actually see it here. We see the console.log of zero here, even though we're doing console.log entrance fee because this set entrance fee function hasn't finished running yet, basically. So we're just gonna get rid of that line, we'll refresh and bada bing, bada boom. This huge number is kind of gross, we might even want to update it so that it looks a little bit nicer. So once again, we can import ethers, ethers from ethers. And down below, we'll do a little ethers.utils.format units. And we'll do entrance fee from call and we'll do a comma and type in. And if we refresh on the front end, now we can see Entrance fee is 0 0.1. So we can even label this. We'll say entrance fee, blah, 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 ETH. Now if we do it a little refresh in the front end, entrance fee 0 0.1 ETH. Finally, we have the entrance fee and now use this finally on our function to enter the lottery. So let's finally uncomment this out. And for message value, we're gonna wanna use this entrance fee. And I'm realizing it's actually better to store this uh, in its raw to string format. So we're gonna undo this part that we just did, but we're gonna add it down here. So we're gonna do ethers.format units, entrance fee, comma, ether, like that, so that, like that, and let's comment this back out real quick. So that at least in the UI, it shows up at 0 0.1, but on the back end, we're actually gonna save it as its raw kind of way value. So we're saving, we have this entrance fee, and what we can do, Uncomment this, we can just grab this entrance fee and plop it in here. So we need to make a button that's gonna do that. Now, again, we wanna make our code that all this works even if we're connected to a supported chain though. So before we even add this, right, if we switch from hard hat to like Ethereum mainnet, we do a little refresh, we're gonna, gonna get an error here because we're calling get entrance fee dot to string on an address that doesn't exist. Right, so it's gonna get really confused and be like, hey, uh, what what are you doing here? Let's add a little button here so that we can actually enter the raffle. Before we actually do that, let's make sure that we can only call the function so long as there actually is a raffle address. So we'll do raffle address, and we'll do this ternary operator once again, so that only if this raffle address is valid, right, and it's not null, we'll add all this code here, right? So we'll say if the raffle address exists, we're gonna do some stuff. And for now, we can actually just copy paste this line, stick it in here. And then otherwise, we'll say div, backslash div, close it off. We'll save, reformat, great. We'll say 
no raffle address detected. Now we'll just do all of our code in this section up here. So we have this little div here, which is great. Inside of this div, let's add a button. Button, button, we'll save it. We've got a little button here. We'll have it say, enter raffle. And we'll say on click, well, we're gonna do some JavaScript. So let's do some JavaScript. We wanna call an async function, async function. So I know the double brackets is gonna be confusing, right? But these brackets allow us to do JavaScript in our HTML or JSX or whatever. And these brackets represent this function. So we're gonna do an async function and we're gonna say await enter raffle and that's it. So let's go back to the front end. Now we have a little enter raffle function. If we do refresh, let's just make sure our account is reset here. So we're gonna go down to settings, advanced reset accounts. Yes, if I hit enter raffle, MetaMask does indeed pop up and we can go ahead and confirm. Awesome, okay, we can now enter our raffle. We're doing incredibly well with this. As you saw, we just got that pop-up and that was pretty much it, right? It's, it's not very helpful for the users who are following along with this to look at this and go, ah, uh, okay, did it go through? Are we, did it fail? Like what, what just happened? So what we wanna do is create what's called notifications, right? We want a little pop-up saying, hey, you sent your transaction, great job. We're gonna use a library. Again, we're gonna use the Web3 UI kit, which comes with some notifications that we can go ahead and use. So if you come to this little interactive thing, which is right in there, GitHub, there's a whole bunch of stuff in here. And you can actually click around and play with different buttons and different things. And you can actually go ahead and even go to docs for each one of these. And you can go show code. And you can literally like copy paste code into your project, like whatever you wanna do, styling and everything. For us, so back in our app.js, we're gonna add import notifications provider from Web3 UI kit. And inside of the morales provider, but outside of the component, we're gonna do notification provider, notification provider like this. So it goes morales provider, notifications provider, component. So we're wrapping our component in this notifications thing, and oh, that's notification provider, not notifications. And this is gonna allow us to actually make notifications back in our lottery entrance. So back in our lottery entrance, we're gonna scroll up to the top. We're gonna to import a hook for those notifications called use notification from Web3 UI kit. And this use notification gives us this thing back called a dispatch. So I'm gonna say const dispatch equals use notification. So use notification returns this dispatch and this dispatch is like a little pop-up that it'll give us. So down here, when we call this enter raffle, we're gonna give it a little, some parameters in here. We're gonna say on success, these functions come with on success, they come with on complete, they come with on error, all this stuff. And when this function is successful, we'll do handle success. We'll create a new handle success function that will handle the success. And this is Patrick from the future coming back to show one additional point. I know I mentioned it, but it is really good to add this on error colon error console.log error for any run contract functions, even the reads. If any of your run contract functions break, you won't know. So definitely want to add this on error error console.log error to all of your run contract functions. So up here, before the return, we'll create a new const handle success. We'll say this is an async function, async function that takes the transaction as input parameters. And remember, you can turn functions into you know, constant variables. And we'll say await tx.wait one. So we'll wait for that transaction to go through. And then we'll create another function called handle new notification tx. And you'll see why I'm doing it like this in a minute. And we'll say const handle new notification. This is just gonna be a synchronous function because we don't need it to be async. And we're just gonna call this dispatch. We're gonna set up this notification basically. So we'll say notify or dispatch, and then we'll add the parameters in here. So it takes an object as a parameter and we'll say type info message is gonna be transaction complete. Title, it's gonna be T 
TX notification position. We're going to say top R and then icon. We're going to say a little bell. And you can find all this stuff right in here. Type, icon, position. You can read all about the different parameters you can kind of set this up with. So handle new notification, handle success. So we're saying enter raffle. Once this transaction is successful, call this handle success function, which is going to call handle new notification. Okay. And you'll see why we split this into two instead of just having handle success also do the dispatch. When we press our enter raffle button, we're going to call enter raffle. If it's successful. We're going to call handle success. We're going to wait for that transaction to finish. Yes, it passes a parameter to our handle success function. And then all we're going to do is we're going to call handle new notification and we're going to dispatch. We're going to launch one of these notifications. So back here, let's hit enter raffle. MetaMask pops up. We'll confirm. And after it completes, we get this wonderful transaction notification, transaction complete, right? So we've let the user know, great job. You've submitted a transaction. Great work. So this is great. We're giving our users some helpful pieces here. Now let's add a little bit more here so that the users know what else is going on with this lottery, but we need to display a little bit more data, right? Let's display how many people are in this lottery, how many people are in this game. And we can do that, of course, because we have a num players command. We also probably want to get the recent winner and we can do that as well. Up here, we're going to copy this get entrance fee. We're going to create another one called get num players. And this is going to call go back to raffle.soul. It's going to call get number of players, actually. So let's just call it call it the same thing. Get number of players. And we're going to call get number of players. And to store this value, once again, up at the top, we're going to copy this line, paste it right. And we'll do num players. And then we'll do set num players. And then we'll copy this line again, for recent winner. So we'll do recent winner winner, we'll do set recent winner, and then we'll copy this again. And instead of get number of players, we'll do get, yep, get recent winner. So we'll call it get recent winner, get recent winner. In our use effect, let's do more than just get the entrance fee, let's get everything. So we can say const num players from call equals, we'll do await get number of players dot to string, and then we'll do set set num players. Let's do it like that. So we'll do set num players, num players from call. And then we'll also do const recent winner from call. This is going to be await get recent winner. And we might need to wrap this to string, but I think I don't think we need to. So we'll do set recent winner, paste that in here. So now we've added a number of players. We've added a recent winner. Let's come back down here. So we have an entrance fee. Let's go ahead and do number of players. And we'll add number of players or what do we call it? Oh my God, we called set number of players twice. Whoops. Let's call it num players. We'll scroll down. Players, it's going to be num players. And then we'll do recent winner. And then we'll add in the recent winner. Awesome. Okay, entrance fee 0.1 ETH number of players to recent winner is nobody here. And if we go ahead and we enter the raffle, MetaMask pops up, we'll go ahead and confirm. Once a transaction goes through, we'll get transaction complete. And if we do a refresh, we see the number of players has updated. But we had to refresh, which is kind of annoying, right? Let's enter the raffle again. We'll go confirm. Transaction complete, but this didn't re-render, right? So we want to set something up so that we automatically re-render. And guess what's going to do that? The handle success that we were talking about before. That's right. All of this update UI stuff, we can actually pull out of the use effect. So we're going to copy it all, delete it there, and we're going to have it be its own standalone function like this. And then in our handle success, whenever this successful transaction goes through, we're going to update the UI, right? So handle success, handle new notification, and we're going to update the UI. So now if we go back here, let's enter the lottery. Let's confirm. We see we get the five and we get transaction notification. Now we want to test 
getting a recent winner here. So what we can do actually back in our hard hat project is we want to create a new script and I actually already created it for you. That's going to mock the Chainlink VRF and that's going to mock being a keepers. So all this is really doing is pretty much exactly what our tests were doing. If you want to pause right now and look through this yourself, pause here and add this mock off chain, which is both keepers and VRF, or you can just go to the GitHub repo here. Just go to the GitHub repo for lesson nine. It's already in scripts. If you go down to scripts, mock off chain, you can just copy paste it here uh, because I want to test that that recent winner. So in my hard hat smart contract lottery, so we'll do yarn hard hat run scripts slash mock off chain dash dash network local host. And we're going to mock, you know, basically picking a winner. Formed up keep with request ID one, we're on a local network. Okay, let's pretend the recent winner was so and so. And what we can do is we can do a little refresh here. And we can see we have a winner updated. Boom. Now we're going to clean up the UI, but I want to talk about a couple of things before we do that because we're, we're almost done with this section. Something I want to make really clear because it confused me a little bit is that this on success isn't checking that the transaction has a block confirmation. It's just checking to see that the transaction was successfully sent to MetaMask. So on success checks to see a transaction is successfully sent to MetaMask. And that's why up in that other function, we do tx.wait1 because that's the piece that actually waits for the transaction to be confirmed. Right now, we're using Morales to make, once we called that mocking script, I had to refresh the browser to see the winner here, right? And a number of players obviously got reset to zero, which is great. That's not ideal. Ideally, we want our UI to just automatically update once some event gets fired. In our raffle contract, we get this event omitted. Instead of in our code doing this await success here, what we could do is we could set up a portion to listen for that event being omitted and update the front end accordingly. With that knowledge, we could also listen for the winner event being omitted. We could update our front end instead of having to refresh. If you're curious and you want to see if you can add to this right now, I highly recommend you do so. We've pretty much finished all the functionality and wow, you've learned a ton in this little bit, right? We've learned about use effects, use Morales, all these hooks, all this stuff. And we've got a front end that very nicely handles interacting with our smart contract. The only thing is, is it looks really ugly. This is kind of gross. <laughs> so let's make this look at least a little bit nicer. There's two things to think about when it comes to building these front ends. There's component libraries like Web3 UI kit, which we're using, which give us kind of like components that give us, you know, blocks of code like this connect button that are already formatted for us. And then there's CSS libraries that actually will help us format the rest of our stuff here. So we're using one of these component libraries. We're also going to use one of these formatting libraries. And the library that we're going to use is Tailwind. And the reason that we're going to use Tailwind CSS is because it's really popular. If you want to learn CSS, there's some wonderful resources that you can use to learn CSS. Web3 Schools is one that I've used a ton. So there's going to be a link to that in the GitHub repo associated with this course so that you can make your websites look pretty uh, when formatting stuff. But we are actually going to work with Tailwind because it's going to make us doing CSS stuff a lot easier. Since we're using Tailwind with Next.js, there's actually a wonderful little guide here for installing Tailwind with Next.js. And we're going to go basically go ahead and follow along with this. This link is available in the GitHub repo associated with this course with this lesson. So we've already created our project. We've seeded into our project. Now we're going to go ahead and install Tailwind. npm install dash D instead, since we're using yarn, we're going to do yarn. I'm going to pop this open. We're going to do yarn add dash dash dev. Paste those three in Tailwind CSS, post CSS, and then auto prefixer. And it's the three of these that are going to basically make up Tailwind with Next.js. Once we have those, we're going to basically init Tailwind and make a config file for Tailwind. So we're going to do yarn Tailwind CSS init dash P, yarn Tailwind CSS init dash P, and we'll run that. This is going to give us this post css.config.js and this tailwind.config.js. And what we're going to want to do is literally just hit this copy button and we're going to update our tailwind.config.js, tailwind.config.js, so that it says, okay, all of this stuff, anything in pages, anything with .js, .ts, .jsx, or .tsx, anything in these components, anything in those two folders 
is going to be considered tailwindable. We want to use tailwind on these two folders. Then we're going to add the tailwind directives to our global CSS files. So if we go back, we go to styles, globals, we're going to overwrite everything in here with at tailwind base and at tailwind components at tailwind utilities. And this makes it so that our global CSS file uses tailwind. Now you'll see like unknown rule at tailwind. What we can do is we can go to components. What we can do is we can look up this post CSS language support extension, paste that in here. Boom. Let's go ahead and install this. And now we get those little underscores to go away, which is really nice. Now, per usual, we can just do npm run dev and start adding tailwind to our divs. Now what tailwind does is allows us in our divs to set everything as a class name and then just set some real minimalistic text in these class names here. So let's look at our smart contract lottery here. We've just tailwinded it, so it already has been updated a little bit. Let's update our header here. Let's say we want to give our header a border. Come to Tailwind. We'll do a quick search. We'll look up border. And we can see all this border stuff, like border width, border this, border that. Let's say we want a border on the bottom. We can see we can get a border on the bottom with something like this. So let's do border on the bottom uh, with a width of two pixels. We just do border B2. So I'm going to copy border B2 do border B2, I'm going to save it. And what we need to do for our CSS and everything to take effect, let's go ahead and, and kill the front end, and then we'll rerun it with yarn dev. Go back to our front end now, give it a little refresh. And okay, cool. Now we have a little border here. So we're starting to add some stuff and it's just not a whole lot yet. <laughs> oh, and then we can also add tailwind, excuse me, go to extensions, we can also look up tailwind. There's a tailwind extension here. If we... So I'm just going to add a whole bunch of stuff in here. We're going to do flex, flex row. We're going to make our decentralized lottery in H1, which stands for like header one. We'll do class name equals, we'll do EY dash four. So we'll give it padding to the top of four, the X padding on the X axis of four. We'll make it bold font and we'll make the text three XL size. So we'll make everything bigger. Cool. And then we'll do one more. We'll wrap our connect button in a div. So we'll say div class name equals, and we'll give it a an automatic left margin. We'll do a py2, so some y padding, some x padding. See what we have done. Okay. Now if we zoom out a little bit, we can see if we close this too, we can see now our connect button is on the side here and they're kind of separated like that. And I, I think that looks nice. So we're going to keep that. Now we're going to go back to our lottery entrance. We're going to change this up just a hair. We'll say div class name equals P five. We'll make our button look really nice. We'll say class name equals background blue 500. When we hover over it, we'll say background blue 700. So now if I just save that and when we hover over it, it looks a little different. That's really nice. We'll say text is white. We'll say the font is bold. We'll give it some Y padding. We'll give it some X padding. We'll have the button be rounded and we'll give it a margin left auto. Now it looks a lot better, right? That's a lot prettier. Uh, we're just going to be doing some basic CSS here just to make it look a little bit nicer, right? But just that by itself already made this lottery button look a lot cooler. Now some functionality that we didn't add here. So we need to add a disabled. Uh, kind of like what we did before. And in our enter raffle, it comes with, like I said, an is loading and it is fetching. And if our transaction is loading or fetching, we'll just make this disabled. So we'll say is loading or is fetching. This will be disabled, right? And now if we go back to the front, we hit enter raffle. Go ahead and hit confirm. We didn't add any CSS for it, but when a transaction is loading, they will not be able to click that button anymore. Which now something else pretty that we want to do, speaking of is loading and is fetching, when it's loading or fetching, we probably want it to have that like little spinny thing, right? When we hit it right now, MetaMask just pops up and we can confirm, but it would be cool if it had like a little spinny thing here, right? So you can usually just Google like how to add spinny thing or, or stuff like that and it'll get something. But you can, again, you can just copy paste this from my code. I'm going to show you what I ended up doing for this section. And we're going to say is if is loading or is fetching, and we're going to use that ternary operator all the time. Then in here, we're going to do a little div and otherwise we're going to do a different div. 
if we're loading or if we're fetching, we're going to add like a little spinny thing in here. So we're going to add class name equals If we're loading, we're going to add this little spinny thing, which I'll show you what it looks like in a second. And if we're not loading, we're just going to do enter raffle like that. So we'll come back to the front end, see enter raffle, we click the button. Now we get this cute little spinny thing, we confirm, transaction goes through, spinny thing goes away. Nice. Well, let's put these on different lines. So we'll just do So those will be on different lines now. Boom. Entrance fee, number of players, recent winner. We'll enter the lottery now. We'll confirm. Transaction complete, number of players has gone up, and we have done it. Now this looks a lot nicer. It's clearly not perfect, but it's much easier to read than kind of that lump that we had before. And the reason I wanted to show you this was really just kind of giving you your footholds for making these look a little bit nicer. This definitely isn't a CSS course. Oh, okay. This is phenomenal. We have an app that we really like, and we're like, you know what? We want to deploy this bad Larry. So let's talk about how we can deploy this. This section is going to be optional, okay? Because I'm going to deploy something to Rink B, and deploying to test sets can take a long time. So we're going to deploy our contracts to Rink B, and then we're going to deploy our website to a hosting provider. So first, let's, let's talk about hosting providers for a quick second. If we want to host our beautiful website that we just created, there are ways to deploy it using things like Vercel or Google Cloud or AWS. Uh, Nettlefy is another really popular one. There are all these different places that we can deploy our application. Now, the thing about these, though, is that these are all centralized deployment places. Having a centralized deployment application can still be incredibly important, right? If we look at Etherscan for a second, Etherscan is a centralized application, right, at the end of the day, but it's still one that we've been using a lot. However, if we want to have a front end that's decentralized, well, that's a little bit harder. The more important thing for us is that our back end, our smart contracts are decentralized, right? That's the most important thing because that'll give users the ability to interact with our logic in a decentralized way. But maybe we also want our front ends decentralized. Now, at some point, we will still use a centralized service like Vercel to deploy an application. And I'll show you why when we get there. There's some features that right now, they're really just hard to do without like a really solid centralized backend. What's important to keep in mind is that our backend, the logic of our contract is on a decentralized blockchain. So even if we host the front end on a centralized hosting provider using some type of centralized database to make the front end easier to work with, the logic of the application is decentralized and that's the most important piece. So I'm gonna give you some tools later on on how to introduce more of these feature richness if you choose to do so. Doing so will add a centralized component on your front end and is something to keep in mind depending on how you want your architecture. So when doing that, just be absolutely sure that the smart contracts on the back end are deployed, are decentralized on one of these blockchains. Now we'll learn about some of those centralized ways to do that in a later section. For now, let's learn how to deploy this front end in a more decentralized way. And the tool that we're gonna use is this tool called IPFS. Now, let me explain a little bit about how IPFS works. It's this distributed decentralized data structure that's not exactly a blockchain, but it's, it's similar to a blockchain. There's no mining though, but there is pinning data. You can add data to this. So let me explain how this actually works. And you can read how this works on the site. There's gonna be a link to this in the GitHub repo associated with this course, but let me give you my basic take on it. So we have our code or, or our file or whatever it is, right? We have some piece of data. Now, as we know, when you really have anything, you can hash that thing, you can hash that data, right? And you can get a, a unique output. So, and that's actually the first thing that IPFS does. It hashes our data to get a unique hash that only points to that data. Yes, a massive code file, a ton of text. Yes, you can encode all of that into a single hash function. Your IPFS node does this hashing for you. And every single IPFS node on the planet has the exact same hashing function, kind of like a blockchain, right? They all kind of run this same spec, the same specification. So we can hash our data on our IPFS node and get this unique output. What we can do then is we can then pin that data or pin that code or pin that file or pin that whatever to our node. We have some data, we get a unique hash of it. All it does is 
host this data and have these hashes. That's it. Our node is connected to a network of other IPFS nodes. So there's a massive network of people running IPFS nodes. They're incredibly lightweight, way lighter weight than any other blockchain node, and they all talk to each other. So if I ask the network, hey, I want to get this hash, all these nodes would talk to each other and eventually they'd reach up at our node saying, oh, I found a node that has that hash. Here is the file associated with it. Now you might be thinking, okay, well, that's kind of centralized because we have the data on one node here, right? Well, you're right. Well, here's the thing. What other nodes can do is they can say, oh, that data looks really cool. I want to have that persist. What they can do is they can pin your hash. They can pin your data and they'll get a copy of your data on their node. And you can keep doing this. And so you easily allow an entire network to easily replicate any code or any data in a decentralized sense. And they're incredibly easy to spin up and they're incredibly easy to work with. Something about IPFS that makes it drastically different than a blockchain is they can't do smart contracts. There's no execution. It can really only store. It's just decentralized storage that IPFS can do. Now, the issue here is that in order for our data to really be decentralized, another node does need to pin our data, right? Because if we're the only IPFS node that's got this hashed, it's kind of centralized on our node. If our node goes down, that data is gone and the network won't be able to access that data anymore. So we'll talk about strategies in the future about having other people pin your data. But for now, this is a way we can host data, we can send code and have it be in a decentralized context. So unlike a blockchain where every single node in a blockchain is going to have a copy of the entire blockchain, IPFS nodes get to optionally choose which data they want to pin and they can't do any execution. So you could have an IPFS node half a megabyte and you could have an IPFS node that's several terabytes. It's up to the node operators how much data and what data they want to pin. Now that we know about IPFS, let's actually deploy our wonderful application to IPFS so that anybody can use it and anybody can connect to it so long as our node is up. Are you ready? Okay, get excited here. We're first gonna do this kind of the manual way because I'm gonna show you how to install IPFS and, and work with IPFS. Hit get started. There's a number of ways to install and work with IPFS. You can get it with a desktop application, get a command line, and then we can also add IPFS to our browser. If you're using something like Brave or I think Firefox 2, some of this IPFS router is automatically built in. But if you're using something like Chrome, you might have to add a little companion because what we want to do is we can actually use those little hashes as URLs for websites, right? And so we want to be able to put that URL in our browser and connect to that node or that piece of code. So what we're going to do is we're going to have you install the IPFS desktop. So you're going to hit that. And when you do that, you should be able to open up IPFS. Now, if you install it, you might get this little guy, this little box here in your upper section. Otherwise, you might be able to open it up with, with IPFS desktop and see it as a, a regular desktop app. But once you install it, you might see IPFS is running. You can restart, stop, you can do all this stuff. We're gonna go to the file section and we're gonna get a little pop-up that looks like this. Now, I've got a ton of stuff in here because I've been using IPFS for some time in here right now, you might have no data. So let's just go ahead and import some file. And maybe for now, we'll just import, you know, our next.config.js, right? It doesn't matter, just import something. And now in here, we have this next.config.js or whatever file you imported. So what we can do with this is we can actually copy the CID and we can view this in our browser. So if we do IPFS dot dot slash slash, and we paste it in, we hit enter we can give our browser access to actually rendering IPFS URLs. If you're using Brave, you can just do use a Brave local IPFS node, or let's go ahead and download this IPFS companion. So we'll hit get IPFS companion. There's a Firefox install for Chrome, Brave, blah, blah, blah. I'm gonna, so I'm gonna go to the Chrome store to get it for Brave. We're just gonna hit add to Brave, add extension. But once you download it, you'll get something that looks like this. Even on a little browser companion, we can see like import, we can see stuff about our node. If we click our node, we'll see a very similar setup. But now that we have the companion in our browser, we can copy that CID, that hash. Now Brave, we can just do use Brave local IPFS node and will automatically get dropped into the file. Now, if IPFS companion doesn't work for you and you can't see the URL 
inside of something like Google Chrome or some other browser, what you can do is you can use something called the IPFS gateway. Now using a gateway, you're not actually directly requesting the data through IPFS, you're requesting the data through another server, which is requesting it through IPFS. But if you are having some trouble accessing these files, you can use the gateway. So what you'll do is you'll do HTTPS slash slash IPFS.io slash IPFS slash, and then paste the hash code there. And you'll be able to see your file. Now, if you do it like this, you won't even need IPFS companion at all. So we're going to deploy our website to IPFS so that anybody else who wants to pin this can, and we will now have the ability to have an incorruptible and unpull downable website, which is just awesome. We're going to learn how to do this the raw way first, and then we're going to use a tool that's going to make it a lot easier for us. Okay. So first let's go to our, our website here. And, and if you want to deploy to Rinkby, go ahead, feel free. Just remember to make sure that your contract addresses file updates accordingly. Okay. Now Next.js has the ability to create static websites, and that's going to be a, an important term to know. We're going to make a static website. At the moment, we don't want our website to be tangled with any server stuff. And the reason we don't want it to be tangled with any server stuff is because if our website runs with server stuff and we deploy it to IPFS, well, IPFS doesn't have the ability to run any code. It just hosts code. If our front end has any server stuff, it won't work. Now, in its current state, IPFS can't come to our project and know what to do, right? It doesn't know how to do yarn dev. It can't do yarn dev. So we need to put all of our code into its static equivalence. So to do that, we're going to do yarn build. And if, again, if we look in our package.json, it comes with this build, which just runs next build. And running this build command is going to build our code, what's called like a production build, creating an optimized production build here. And we'll get something that looks like this. And we can see this point down here, static automatically rendered as static HTML, uses no initial props. There's some server-based applications that Next.js comes with that if we use them, our static build won't work. And actually you'll see when we run yarn next export, it'll fail if you have any of that non-static stuff. So let's go ahead and try yarn next export and let's see if it fails. It didn't fail. We now have a new folder called out. And this is our folder that's just pure static code and that we can use on IPFS. In a later section, I'll show you what it looks like when you don't use some of those static things. Both Morales and Next.js have the optionality to not have static code, so we'll just want to keep that in mind. So now that we have this out folder, we can go back to IPFS and we can import a folder. We're going to import that whole folder in here. So hit the hit that import button and go to the folder where that is. Mine is in Next.js Smart Contract Lottery out. So now we're going to upload this to our IPFS node. Once it's done, we'll get this little check mark and we can go through our IPFS files and see our out here. What we can do, let's go ahead and pin this to our node. We'll pin it to our local node here. And now once it's up, we can copy the CID. We can go back to Brave or Chrome or whatever. We can type in IPFS colon slash slash, paste that in there and we immediately get dropped into our smart contract lottery in a browser. Now we see hi from lottery, no raffle address detected because right now the way I set mine up was it only works with, you know, our local hard hat. So let's connect our MetaMask. We'll hit the connect button, connect, and voila, we are right back where we were, but with our data stored on IPFS. And we can enter raffle as long as our node is running, go confirm, and we see exactly what we get in our local browsers. So this is phenomenal. Now that I've shown you how to do this, this is the manual way of adding our code to IPFS. Let me show you the easier way of adding your code to IPFS. We're going to go to this site called Fleek HQ. We'll go to fleek.co. And to get to it, I'm going to turn my, my IPFS companion node off because of some of the oddities with working with Brave. But now we're here at fleek.co. Fleek.co makes it easy to, to deploy websites and apps to the new open web. Permissionless, trustless, censorship resistant, etc. I like to think about it as kind of like an auto deployment for our websites. And additionally, it does some things to help out with that problem I was talking about, how we want to get other nodes to pin our data. So it helps us out with that. So let me show you what it does. So let's go ahead, we'll sign up. And wouldn't you know, you can sign in with GitHub. So if you have your GitHub, 
definitely want to sign in with GitHub here because we're going to use GitHub to actually help us automatically deploy. So we'll authorize Fleek to work with our GitHub. You've authorized your GitHub. Let's go ahead and add a new site. We'll add a new site. Now we can use Fleek to just automatically deploy websites once we push them to our GitHub. So we can come to our GitHub once again and click the little plus button. We'll do a new repository. We'll call this Next.js Smart Contract Lottery Free Code Camp. We'll make it public, we'll create the repository. And let's push all this code to GitHub. We did it once before. Let's do it again. We'll do git add. We'll do a little dot. Then we'll do git commit minus M. We'll say like initial commit or whatever. We'll do git remote add origin. And then we'll grab that URL, paste it right here. And then we'll just do git push origin main. Now we go back to our application. We see it in here. What we can do is back in our fleek, we can connect with GitHub. We're going to say only select repositories. We're only going to do this Next.js application, this Next.js Git. We're going to install and authorize. Authorize, great. So now we're going to pick a repo. We've picked a repo. We're going to choose this application and we're going to use IPFS as our hosting service. And now we're going to add our information in here. So we're going to use the main branch. Here's the repo. Or excuse me, our framework is going to be Next.js. So we're going to do Fleek, Next.js. We're using Yarn. So we're going to do Yarn install and Yarn run build and then Yarn run export. Um, if you want, you could also just do Yarn, Yarn build and Yarn run export. Those are going to be the same thing. Publish directory is going to be out. And then we just hit deploy site. Yarn next export as the last command, not Yarn run export. If you accidentally did the wrong one, you can go over to deploys, click on this. Go to deploy settings and then edit settings and then just change it to yarn next export save. And then we'll go back to deploys and trigger deploy. If you did the wrong one, that was just a learning opportunity for you to learn where the settings are after you deploy. And what this is going to do is we're going to do a deploy. It's, it's going to run those three commands, yarn build, yarn export. It's going to run everything and then it's going to deploy us a site for us both on IPFS and it's going to give a regular URL that we can use for normies, if you will. And while this deploys, you'll actually see down here, we have this thing called Filecoin DID and Deal Proposal CID. IPFS, like I said, we need other people to host our node. Filecoin is actually a blockchain that helps you pin your data and uses decentralized storage to do so. And Fleek helps you create those deals and helps you pin your data with this Filecoin blockchain. Filecoin is one definitely to take a look at. And then after a while, you might have to wait a little bit. And once it's done, we get a little deployed website. If we go back to hosting, we click on our thing. We can see we have like a little website here. And if we click it, we get a normal URL for connecting and interacting with our website. You might even see this little IPFS thing, which will connect to your IPFS note. And additionally, we scroll down in here, we can see current IPFS hash. So we can just stick that in. Boom. And bada bing, we have an IPFS deployed application. Now, what's cool is let's say I'm, I make some changes, you know, I'll go to lottery entrance and I'll do, I'll scroll on the bottom to recent winner. I'll make a new div. What's up? Close the div off. We'll save. Git add dot git commit minus M added dot git push origin main in our github we'll do a little refresh added dot is the most recently added one we go back over to fleek go back to hosting click on the section that we just made go to deploys and you'll see there's a new deploy going through so it automatically deploys your new site it'll automatically create a new ipfs hash for your new data however it'll still be on this holy bird you know or whatever your URL is here. And this is kind of just a router for IPFS so that people without IPFS connected can also connect to this still. And now that my application's done pushing automatically with Fleek, we can see what's up being posted in my application here. Now, like I said, Filecoin isn't gonna be a technology we're gonna go too deep into and use ourselves. But like I was just saying, 
IPFS does have this limitation. It doesn't have data persistence. You have to have people pin your data in order for it to stay distributed and stay decentralized. Filecoin is a blockchain dedicated to keeping this data both decentralized and persistent. And to give us a better understanding of Filecoin, we actually have Ali here to give us an overview. Take it away, Ali. Hello all, I'm Ali and I'm a developer advocate here at the Filecoin Foundation, which works closely with Protocol Labs and IPFS. Just a quick note, Protocol Labs is our R&D arm, so it uh, works on um, creating tooling and technology for a truly open and democratic internet and web. Uh, and it's building out some of the foundational tooling like IPFS and Filecoin, which are two separate projects to enable that. And hopefully um, today, because you're here to build, I want to impart on you the knowledge and tools you need to get started with both of those projects. Um, so as anyone that's kind of played around in this ecosystem or tech in general would know, data is an absolutely essential part of our daily lives. And not surprisingly, it's also a super fast growing field in Web3. Uh, and one that's fundamental, one of, and it's one of the fundamental necessities of the decentralized web stack as well. So the current model of centralization that's grown up and basically out of a lack of an identity layer on the internet um, is one where only a few big companies offer storage and only a few entities hold our data for authorization purposes. And this is an obvious problem, both in terms of being an attack vector for data mining. So with our data getting leaked through uh, insecure service to third parties and also creating a data resilience problem so whole services go down every time one of these companies servers does and we've definitely seen that um, so it really leads to the question why aren't we designing the web for the autonomy and resilience we need in the first place and how do we store data in a way that aligns with both the original uh, vision of the internet as an open place for knowledge sharing and collaboration and and um and in a way that uh, agrees with the Web3 mission as well. So these are the core problems we're solving with IPFS and Filecoin. Firstly, IPFS is a distributed system for storing and accessing files, folders, websites, applications, and data. And it's designed to be able to work even when the network's between planets. So it's a distributed by design. It has no central authority servers, and it's designed to be offline first for resilience. And it's not just a fancy name for another peer-to-peer -peer network either, because the unique thing about the IPFS protocol um, is the standard it uses for addressing content on the network. IPFS is unique because rather than using traditional methods we might be with familiar with from um, the web like those are location paths that point to a particular http address where your content may or may not be available and stored um, ipfs uses content addressing so content addressing means that each piece of data each meme or even full file system has its own uh, unique cryptographically verifiable fingerprint, you might call it. Um, so if you change even one pixel of your meme image, for example, then the content ID or CID associated with it also changes. Um, so importantly, uh, this hash function is also upgradable. So let's say quantum computing breaks our current secure hash algorithms, we can upgrade the standard we use. Uh, and it means that you will always get the same content returned by an IPFS CID as what you expect. So this is fundamentally important because when you don't have to care where the data comes from, you open up the web to massively distributed storage systems. Hello, decentralization. Uh, so now we have a really important and valuable protocol that enables distribution at scale and it provides verifiability of data um, to serve and retrieve content on the web and and not just for Web3 either, uh, but also for all web um, or tech use cases. Uh, the problem is, and it's one that the early internet also faced, who's going to ensure the persistence and permanence of all this data on the network? So unless you're running your own nodes 24-7, or your content is really popular, or other nodes decide to altruistically store your data because they think it's important, then this data can become unretrievable because they're no longer actively hosted on any nodes on the networks. So to avoid this, you could also turn to a pinning service that you pay to keep a copy of your content around. Um, unfortunately, the problem with this, though, is that we're heading back towards centralization of data and we're creating new data silos uh, with this solution and losing the trustlessness and resilience we're looking for. And these weren't a bad solution um, prior to Filecoin, um, and it's why they sprung up initially. Um, but we want a better solution. So this is where Filecoin comes in. 
So Filecoin's architectured and designed to leverage a crypto economic incentive model together with cryptographic proofs in order to ensure data is stored persistently, uh, highly reliably and verifiably. Um, it uses these cryptographic proofs to also enable smart contract based permanence and that and means that it's designed to be as permanent as you, the data owner, want it to be. It's your data, so it's your choice. Um, it's also designed to enable internet scale capacity. It's currently the largest distributed storage network in the world with over 18 million terabytes of capacity available, which is apparently about 135 copies of the European Union's nuclear program CERN's uh, data, which, which is kind of a fun fact. Um, it's also, Filecoin's also designed to be and stay hyper competitive on pricing due to its market economics. Um, and this comes down to storage deals. So to make this network feasible, Filecoin uses storage deals. And these include two main consensus mechanisms that ensure both rewards for good actors in the system and penalties for bad actors. So when you make a deal with one or more storage providers to store your important data, uh, the provider generates a proof of replication. Um, so this proves that the storage provider is storing a unique copy of your original data. Uh, over time, to make sure that this um, data is persisted, you, these uh, storage providers must prove that they still have random subsets of this client data and they create uh, proof of space times. And these proof of, this proof of space time um, is something that it is stored on the blockchain so anyone at any time can also check that this is true. Uh, and it also makes up the mechanism by which miners are rewarded or penalized because you have to stake fill on the network in order um, to become a storage provider. So when a storage deal uh, comes to an end, um, a user can, you can opt to let it expire or renew the deal. If you opt for renewal, then the providers again bid to host this content. Uh, so this creates an efficient market for pricing, a continual efficient market for pricing as well. It can even go negative. So the storage provider can even pay you to store your data if it's an important data set due to some of the block rewards that are being offered by the Filecoin Foundation as well. Um, so these mechanisms are what builds in not just data permanence, but uh, data timeframe sovereignty too. So it's your data, it's your choice. You can decide if you want to store your data for five minutes or 500 years. It's also your choice over how much resilience you want to have for that data. So, or how many copies you, of that data you want to have and with what storage providers. So this allows you to comply with regulations like GDPR, um, and there's a growing number of tools in the ecosystem like Mermomation's BitScreen that are allowing for you to do this filtering, but it also gives you some guarantees that your data, you know, if one storage provider goes down, you know, surely not 10 of them are gonna go down. So that's a guarantee for your resilience there as well. Um, and this is why IPFS and Filecoin are great complements of each other. So IPFS gives you that benefit of content addressing and Filecoin gives you persistent guarantees that even if your computer or your favorite IPFS pinning service were to go away, the content persists. Uh, just as a quick final note on these concepts as well, IPFS and Filecoin are separate projects, as I mentioned. Uh, so IPFS is a protocol, much like HTTP, whereas Filecoin is a blockchain. Um, so IPFS is also storage layer agnostic. You can combine it with the storage layer of your choice. And while Filecoin was specifically designed to complement it and we think is a great choice, uh, you can also store your IPFS data in the cloud or in other storage solutions as well. Uh, so hopefully you've got a good baseline for why you'd want to use IPFS and Filecoin. Um, and for those engineers out there that like a challenge, and are interested in working on uh, the base protocols and code of IPFS in Filecoin, which isn't always easy for the average user, um, I'd encourage you to go and take a look at the project docs and GitHubs and some of the associated grants available uh, for extensions to these open source projects. And this is a great site here if you wanna get in more information into the nitty gritty and really dig into the code behind IPFS and Filecoin and extend some of that. For those of you that just wanna build out of the box though, and this is definitely a camp that I often fall into, I want to talk about some of the dev tooling and storage helpers that make it easy for you to get started. So firstly, Fleek. Fleek is one of my favorite IPFS dev tools and projects. Fleek is a CI CD tool that you can use to deploy your apps for free as simply as easily as you would with some of the web tools you might 
Web2 tools you might be familiar with like Netlify or Vercel. The big difference though is Fleek uses IPFS to host your site or app and it even offers ENS domain routing on their platform. So if you're deploying a front end app, I would encourage you to use Fleek to make it more distributed instead of some of the traditional Web2 tools. It's just as easy, I promise. Um, so another one of my favorite tools is NFT storage. Storing your NFT metadata immutably and persistently, as you already probably know, is integral to keeping the main value proposition of NFTs, their non-fungibility. Um, so if you're not storing this data on chain, which obviously can become pretty financially unviable for large files, then this is exactly where NFT storage comes in. So it was specifically created as a public good to archive and persist NFT data. So it's free and it takes care of the complexity around firstly creating an IPFS CID for this metadata and then making automatic deals with Filecoin storage providers. So it does this with at least eight uh, storage providers, so eight times redundancy, and it does it with a multi-generational timeframe. So it automatically renews those deals. It, because it's a public good, it's all free as well. And it's also super easy to use because you just need uh, because it's a JavaScript um, service. So you just need to say import that as an NPM package or JavaScript library and then call the API and nft.storage takes care of the rest. Um, let, for data that isn't NFT metadata as well, we've built Web3.storage. Web3 storage is designed to give you those same Web2 benefits. Um, so similar to NFT.storage, make it super easy for you to use. Uh, and it's got um, JavaScript and Go client libraries. Um, while giving you, you know, the power of IPFS and Filecoin of decentralized storage and IPFS content addressing. So it's got one terabyte up to ter one terabyte of free storage with that. So try that out if you're not just like trying to store NFT metadata. The next tool is a bit more advanced. Um, it's called Textile Power Gate, Gate and it's for, you know, more advanced developers or those looking for more flexibility um, to interact with IPFS, Lib peer to peer and Filecoin. Um, it's a Docker container wrapped around Filecoin and IPFS nodes, and it gives you a lot of options to configure, say, minor selections and extend functionality. Uh, it also offers some bridges to several layer ones, which might be of interest to developers out there. Uh, another one uh, here, and I'll preface this by saying you need an invite to this, is Estuary Tech. So it's for people looking to store really meaningful public data. It's currently in alpha mode. And like I said, uh, it requires an invite because it's been built as a public good specifically to store important information. Um, if you are, I do have a use case around this though, please feel free to reach out to us on this project. Uh, the final tool I'll mention is OrbitDB. So many people coming to the Web3 space from Web2 are often looking for the same sort of relational databases that we're so used to in traditional computing, except in a decentralized or distributed uh, format. Um, and this isn't an easy problem. So OrbitDB is currently in active development and because this isn't an easy problem to solve, uh, this isn't an ideal solution for those of you looking for an out of the box experience. But if you are, um, looking for something like that, uh, try out OrbitDB. Uh, there's also several other tools in the ecosystem leveraging IPFS and Filecoin, including uh, Ceramic, which is similar to Textile PowerGate, except it uses decentralized identities. Uh, Lighthouse is FileDrive, and there's even Morales has an IPFS API. So check those out as well. Um, so storage is really a fundamental component of modern technology systems. So, and there's so many use cases you could dive into here. And so hopefully I've provided you with some of the knowledge and tools you need to get started with IPFS and Filecoin and really make powerful distributed um, applications. Um, and there's just one more tool that's also in active development now. So if you look closely at this diagram, you'll notice a probably unfamiliar logo right at the end of the logic layer. And that's the logo for the Filecoin virtual machine. So FVM will be launching at the end of this year uh, and we're super excited about it. And it's gonna allow smart contracts, uh, contract use combined with like co-location of storage data. Like, so computing capabilities with storage capabilities. And it'll also be EVM compatible. So as I said, we're super excited for the kind of use cases that we're gonna see come out of uh, this project as well. Uh, and you can follow along here on, on the website here as well. 
So hopefully I've given you all the tools you need to get started with IPFS and Filecoin. Uh, if you do need more resources or want to get involved, we have uh, Proto School, which is interactive tutorials on decentralized web protocols. There's also nftschool.dev um, or join a hackathon. Uh, check out our hackathons.filecoin.io page for all of the latest hackathons we're involved in. Uh, and if you do really want to dig deep and build um, tooling in IPFS and Filecoin or build a cool project, check out our grants option as well for that. In the meantime, all um, please learn long, build and prosper. Ooh, so we've learned a ton in this section and that is it. So let's do a, a summary of all the amazing things that we've learned. And then we'll go into the TypeScript edition of this because the TypeScript edition is definitely a little bit different. So let's talk. All right, so first, we learned more about Next.js, and we learned we can have an application using Next.js, and it's a framework that's going to allow us to build really powerful front ends and full stack applications really easily. We learned about the layout of our Next.js project. We add components in a components folder, which are basically minimalistic blocks of JavaScript and HTML that we can use to modularize and create our website out of these components. Constants is a folder that we can put constant variables. Node modules is node modules, and out folder is what happens when we export all of our code to a static example. Pages are gonna be basically the routes or the different pages of our website. Everything goes through app.js. Public is just some public stuff. Styles is for any CSS or styling of our application. And then we have our basic files here. In our pages section, we have our app, which is surrounded by both this notification provider and our Morales provider. All of our components run through this app and all of our pages run through this app. So this is kind of considered the entry point for our entire application. Having this morales provider wrapped around our notifications and component means that we don't have to pass parameters between our components and our lottery will just know what chain ID that we're on because our header is gonna pass it up to morales provider and the morales provider is gonna pass it back down to our lottery entrance. And we saw with our manual header, the way that that connect button works behind the scenes. So it's doing some local storage where we're storing whether or not we're actually connected. We learned about use effect and use state and these different hooks in our front ends where one of the main reasons we want hooks is we want, we want our websites to re-render when stuff changes. We want our components to be able to talk about the state of the blockchain with each other. And they're incredibly powerful for building our React applications. Use effect is one of the most popular ones where if we don't have a dependency array, our function inside of our use effect will run anytime something re-renders. A blank dependency array means it'll just run once on load. And if there are dependencies in the array, it'll run anytime any of the variables in those change. We also learned about the use state hook, which is really similar to saying like let variable equals X, but it also comes with the re-rendering ability and it comes with some other nice abilities that we didn't really discuss here. We learned how to call different contract functions with Morales, not only sending transactions, but also calling data. Morales is smart enough to know that when it sees get entrance fee, that this is gonna be a view function, and this is gonna be a transaction. It can tell the difference between the two, so this one's gonna populate MetaMask to pop up, and this one's just gonna return kind of normally like a view function would. We can actually use the same syntax between sending transactions and then calling view functions on our contract. We added a button calling one of these morales pieces and then had an on success section where when our transaction completed, we update the UI and we add a little pop-up for notifications. We learned how to deploy our code directly to IPFS and use that IPFS hash to interact and see our code. We also learned about Fleek and how Fleek automatically deploys to IPFS whenever we do a Git push to our GitHub repository, and it makes continuously updating our websites much easier. It also gives us a regular canonical URL as well. And then finally, we learned about IPFS and decentralized database storage. Now you might be asking, okay, well, why don't we just store all the data for this website on Ethereum or Polygon or Avalanche, et cetera? And the answer to that is that can get incredibly expensive. Storing data, storing a ton of data on the blockchain costs a ton of gas. Whereas this is a much cheaper alternative. Ethereum, Avalanche, and these smart contract platforms aren't really meant to be data storage layers. They're meant to be logic layers, right? Decentralized logic, decentralized smart contracts 
Oftentimes, yes, we're going to have to store data in them, but when it's a ton of data, there are better solutions and there are different solutions out there for storing our data like IPFS and Filecoin. You should be incredibly proud of yourself if you've made it this far because you've just made a really solid app, a really solid front end application, and you've learned how to really easily add functionality for interacting with your smart contracts. So give yourself a pat on the back, maybe even tweet this out, share this really cool application with your friends and family, take a break, and I'll see you in the next lesson. All right, welcome to one of the fastest lessons that we're gonna have here. And in this lesson, we're gonna talk about the hard hat starter kit. Really quickly, I'm gonna walk you through it and show you how to use it. Now we've learned a lot about projects, we've learned a lot about different repos, we've learned the basics of smart contracts, and we've learned a lot about front ends as well and building front ends for our applications. So this smart contract kit repo comes packed with a ton of starter kits that you can use to start deploying your projects right away. And as you can see, the hard hat starter kit is easily one of the most popular ones with the most stars, the most forks out there. The smart contract kit repo actually comes with a ton of frameworks. Like if you want to work with Solana, if you want to work with Python and Brownie, if you want to work with Foundry, Truffle, or really any other framework out there, you can get started, clone one of these repos, work with one of these repos and build your project and get started right away. We're going to show you how to use the hard hat starter kit. So you can just grab the repo and go and already have some boilerplate code and a boilerplate really good looking repo to start your projects with. We come to the smart contract kit, hard hat starter kit repo here. And if you're working with GitHub, you can just go ahead and use this template and it'll automatically generate you a new GitHub repo with the hard hat starter kit. So let's go ahead we'll click use this template. We can come up with our own name here. We'll call it, we'll make it public, create repository from template. It'll generate our repository. And now we automatically have it in our own repo here and we can get started working with it and we can get started working with it. If you don't want to click the use that template button, we can also just copy the URL and in our code editor, we can just do git clone and paste that in there. So for now I am going to get clone, but I'm going to get clone with this repo that we just created. We'll come back in. We'll do git clone hardhead play FCC or hardhead starter kit. I'm going to CD into hardhead play FCC and then open that up in a new code editor. And awesome. Now you'll see in this repo, it comes packed with a ton of contracts, de deployments, scripts, tasks, tests, everything, you name it to really get started in a professional environment. If we look in the contract section, we can see we have a couple of sample contracts. We have a contract for making an API call to a chain link node, working with keepers, working with price feeds, and then working with Chainlink VRF V2. We've got some test contracts and we additionally have this fuzzing folder, which we'll talk about in a much later section of this course. We have deploy scripts where we start with deploying mocks, then we deploy each one of those contracts. We have a sample script to read the price from one of these contracts, and we have a whole bunch of sample tasks. Now at the time of recording, instead of scripts, this repo uses tasks, but again, they're a little bit interchangeable. And of course we have some unit tests and some staging tests as well that you can go through and take a look at. Once we're in this repo, we can run some familiar commands here. We'll do yarn, of course, to install our all of our packages. And then everything that we're going to do, if you get lost, you can always come back to this repo. And you can follow along with getting started and the quick start. So we just did the git clone. Now we're doing the yarn. And then we're going to go ahead and run yarn hard hat test. This hard hat starter kit repo is very consistently up to date. We see the last push being just a few days ago, and we'll constantly have some best practices for building our smart contracts and having a really professional coding environment. And it's got this really cute logo. Once we've installed all the dependencies, we can run yarn, hard hat, test. We can run all of the tests in the test folder, which also will show us how to interact and how to use all these different contracts in here. And they each have some console.logs so you can see more about what's actually going on when these tests actually run. If we look in the hardhat config.js, it's got some really familiar code in here. We have all our imports at the top. We grab a whole bunch of environment variables. We've got the etherscan plugin. We've got the gas reporter, the contract sizer, which is a plugin that tells you how big your contracts are, some named accounts, different solidity versions, and then Mocha timeout as well. We can of course do yarn hardhat node, which will run through our deploy scripts and then spin up a new node for us which has 
mock chain link tokens, mock oracles, mock aggregators, and mock VRF for us to go ahead and interact with. Once that's up, we can then, of course, do hard hat console dash dash network localhost and begin interacting with contracts on the localhost. So we can kind of follow along with price feed, for example, and do const price consumer v3 equals await ethers.get contract price consumer v3. And then we can do await price consumer v3.get latest price. Right, let's, let's wrap that in a two string. And we can see a mock latest price from a contract that uses Chainlink price feeds. And we can interact with any of our contracts and work with any of the mocks as well in here. If we want to deploy this to an actual testnet like RinkB or mainnet, we'll just pop in our .env file, we'll close our node terminal, and we can run yarn hardhat or just hh deploy, and then we'll add whatever tags we want to do here. So let's just deploy our price feed contract. If we go to the price feed deploy, we scroll down, we'll get the tags. Okay, great. We'll use the feed tag dash of tags feeds dash to, or feed dash dash network rink B. And while we're waiting for this to deploy, we can go back to the actual repo and just make sure to follow along with the documentation here and the quick start and all the usage and everything so that you make sure that you're working with the most up to date version. There's even documentation on running a local network using a test net or live network, working with Ethereum rink B, adding your private keys and .EMVs, all this stuff that you already know forking, which we'll learn a little bit later, auto funding your contracts for working with Chainlink API, running tests. You can additionally run your tests in parallel by adding the dash dash parallel flag to our tests. We can interact with our deploy contracts with those different tasks that we've created, linting, code formatting, estimating gas, code coverage, fuzzing, we'll talk about later, and then contributions. PRs, issues are always welcome here. And once it's outputted and even verified, if you have verification turned on, you'll get a little task that we can run to just go ahead and read the price feed or interact with the contract. So we can copy that task out, yarn hard hat read price feed since it's a task here, contract the contract address we just deployed, network rink B, and we'll get reading data price feed from consumer contract on network rink B. Price is here, which of course we're saying the price of Ethereum is $3,053 because it has eight decimal places. <coughs> so if you're ever looking to start a new project and you want some boilerplate code, this hard hat starter kit is a great place to get started. And of course, you can open it in Gitpod if you want to just test it out and try it in Gitpod in a cloud shell. So that's it for this lesson. Wasn't that fast? This was the fastest lesson ever. So if you want to do a little extra learnings here, I would fork this, I would clone this, I would use this template, try to play around with the repo a little bit yourself and see what you recognize, see what you don't recognize and keep that prepped in your mind for later sessions in the course. And then for everyone here who's TypeScript, there's of course a TypeScript version of this as well that you can get clone. And it has a nice blue logo here uh, to show that it's a little bit different. So with that being said, use the repo, have fun. Let's get to lesson 12. All right, now we're moving on to the hard hat ERC-20s, or the section where we're gonna learn how to create our own ERC-20 or EIP-20 or BEP-20 or AEP-20, any of these tokens on the blockchain. Before we can understand what an ERC-20 is or even what one of these tokens are, we first need to understand what is an ERC and then also what is an EIP. In Ethereum and Avalanche and Binance and Polygon, all these blockchains have what's called improvement proposals. And for Ethereum, they're called Ethereum improvement proposals or EIPs. And what people would do is they come up with these ideas to improve Ethereum or improve these layer ones like Polygon, Matic, Avalanche, et cetera. And on some GitHub or some open source repository, they'll add these new EIPs, they'll add these new improvement ideas to make the, these protocols better. Now these improvements can really be anything. They can be anything from a core blockchain update to some standard that is gonna be a best practice for the entire community to adopt. Once an EIP gets enough insight, they also create an ERC, which stands for Ethereum Request for Comments. So EIP, Ethereum Pro Improvement Proposals, ERC, Ethereum Request for Comments. And again, these can be like BEP, PEP, you know, et cetera, for all these different blockchains. Both the improvement proposals and the request for comments all have these different tags. Now, they're numbered chronologically, 
So something like an ERC-20 is going to be the 20th ERC slash EIP. The, the ERCs and the EIPs share that same number. And their websites like eips.ethereum.org, they keep track of all of these new Ethereum improvement proposals. And you can actually see them real time go through the process of being adopted by the community. Now, one of these EIPs or ERCs is going to be the ERC-20 or the token standard for smart contracts. This is an improvement proposal that talks about how to actually create tokens and create these smart contract tokens. I made a video about this recently. So in the GitHub repo associated with this course, we're going to have a sub lesson and we're going to watch a quick video that explains more about these different tokens. Now, first, let's define even what are ERC-20s. So ERC-20s are tokens that are deployed on a chain using what's called the ERC-20 token standard. You can read more about it in the ERC-20 token standard here, link in the description as well. But basically, it's a smart contract that actually represents a token. So it's token, but it's a smart contract, it's both. It's really cool. Tether, Chainlink, UniToken, and DAI are all examples of ERC-20s. Technically, Chainlink is in the ERC-677 as there are upgrades to the ERC-20 that some tokens take that are still backwards compatible with ERC-20s. And so basically you can think of them as ERC-20s with a little additional functionality. Now, why would I even care to want to make an ERC-20? Well, you can do a lot of really cool stuff with it. You can make governance token, you can secure an underlying network, you can create some type of synthetic asset, or really anything else. In any case, how do we build one of these ERC-20s? How do we build one of these tokens? Well, all we have to do is build a smart contract that follows the token standard. All we have to do is build a smart contract that has these functions. It has a name function, a symbol function, decimals function, et cetera, all these functions. We need to be able to transfer it. We need to be able to get the balance of it, et cetera. And again, if you want to check out some of the improvements that are still ERC-20 compatible, like the ERC-677 or the ERC-777, you can definitely go check those out and build one of those instead. All right, awesome. Now that we know what one of these ERC-20s is, we can go ahead and create our own. Per usual, in the GitHub repo associated with this course, we have all the code available here if you want to just git clone. This is going to be, again, another one of our quicker lessons here. So we're in our terminal, we're in our VS code here. We're going to make a new directory. I'm going to call it hardhat erc20 fcc. We'll cd into hardhat erc20 fcc. Oh. And we're going to create a new hardhat project the exact same way we've been doing it. Yarn add dash dash dev hardhat. Let's actually open it in its own VS code. We'll do code dot or file open this folder. And okay, we're in our project now. Let's create a new hard hat project. We'll do yarn hard hat. We'll do create an empty hard hat dot config dot JS here. And great, we've now got an empty hard hat dot config dot JS. If you want to copy paste your hard hat dot config from your previous projects, you want to copy paste your hard hat dot config or your dot env file because you know we're going to need those. Feel free to do so now. I'm just going to update this to 8.7. I'll add the rest of my stuff later. So as we've heard, this EIP20 or this ERC20, all it needs is to have these functions in its token standard so that we can transfer tokens, we can do all this stuff. In the ERC20 contract itself, it really is just keeping track of how much of each token people have. So the smart contract kind of in a weird way, it keeps track of itself. To get started, we're going to do this kind of the manual way first. We're going to create our own manual token here, or a really minimalistic one anyways. So let's create a new folder, contracts. We'll create a new file called manual token .sol. Yes, I'm going to show you kind of the hard way to make it, and then I'll show you a much easier way to make it. So to get started here, per usual, we can do pragma solidity, do caret 0.8.7, and then we'll even do spdx license identifier MIT. We'll do contract, manual token, and boom, let's get started. The main reason this token smart contract works is that there's some balances mapping. So we have a mapping of addresses to UN256. It's usually public called balance of. And all this does is this mapping is obviously the key is going to be every single address on the planet and then how much they have. And basically, when we transfer tokens, transfer tokens, we're basically just subtract from address amount and add to to address. 
So a really minimalistic way to implement this would be to create this transfer function first. So we'll create this function. I'm going to call it underscore transfer. We can do an address from address to UN 256 mount. And now we'd probably put some requirements. We'd probably omit some events. Oh, and let's make this public as well. And really at the end of the day is we're going to say balance of from minus equals value, which is the same as saying balance of from equals balance of from minus value, or excuse me, amount. And then we're going to say balance of two, or excuse me, plus equals, which is the same as saying, you know, balance of two plus. And technically, that's really all we need, right? We probably want to do some assertions here, some requires to make sure all of our numbers make sense. But really, at the end of the day, this is all that this function is doing. Transfer works when the caller is sending money directly into another address. But what happens if we want to allow some smart contract to work with our token? Or we want to allow somebody else to work with our token, you know, maybe to deposit it into a protocol or do some more functionality with it. There will be some approve function that will approve that contract to do that. And then we'll have a function transfer from, and this function will, you know, it'll just implement taking funds from a user. And this will be public as well. And there at the top will be some type of allowances mapping that will tell who's allowed which address to take how much token which sounds a little confusing, but let me just add the mapping. So it'll be a mapping of addresses to a mapping of addresses to an amount to a UN256. And this will be public allowance. We're going to say address Patrick is going to allow address of Patrick's brother to use 25 tokens. And that's how this allowance works. And in our transfer from, transfer from will check this allowance mapping and say, hmm, did Patrick give you authorization to borrow those tokens? Oh, yes, you did. Okay, we'll let you transfer from. And I'm just I'm just going to copy paste an implementation of it. You can check out the GitHub repo as well. And it would look something like this, right? So we check the allowed amounts, update the allowance, and then transfer the token. So those are some of the main functions. So we would need an approve function, obviously, to update the allowances here. And usually you'll have like a UN256 initial supply. And this will be like how many tokens there are starting with, how many tokens there are total. Sometimes you'll add a mint function to add more functions, but you can basically start to see this contract ramping up. One thing we could do is we could go ahead, go through this spec and just line by line, you know, build our token ourselves. And after we do that, it might look something like this. So I'm just copy pasted the code from the GitHub repo. If you go to contracts, manual token, I just copy pasted this code in here. This is what a contract, a token contract might look like. Okay, so we have all these functions, we have all these arrays, we have all this stuff. And you can see in the constructor, we're taking an initial supply, and then a token name and a token symbol, the name, you know, might be something like die token. And then the symbol might be something like die, just so that it's easily recognizable just by its name and its token. Coding it all from scratch like that is definitely something that we can do. But as engineers, we know that that's probably really annoying and we don't actually want to do that. So what can we do instead? Well, we can use an open source library like Open Zeppelin to actually get some boilerplate code to work with. Open Zeppelin is almost considered kind of the standard library of Solidity. They have a list of open source contracts that anybody can use and import into their contracts that have a ton of boilerplate so that you don't have to manually write everything out. We can see all their code in their GitHub repository, open Zeppelin slash open Zeppelin contracts. And we're going to be using them a lot moving forward. So for example, you can see kind of on the left side of their documentation, they have this tokens section and they have an ERC 20, which is one of those token standards. If we scroll in here, they even have some minimalistic examples of how to create your own ERC 20 token. And that's what we're going to be using to build our token. Because you see how much smaller this is, how much less code this is to maintain. Let's go ahead and let's use Open Zeppelin for us to create our token. So let's create a new file. We'll call it our token.soul. And we're going to create our own token here. So let's do SPDX, license identifier, MIT. We'll do pragma, solidity, caret, 0.8.7. And we'll do contract, our token. Now, what we're going to do. 
we're going to import open Zeppelin contracts into our hardhat project. And we're going to do it the same way we did with Chainlink and any other packages in the future. So we'll do yarn add dash dash dev at open Zeppelin slash contracts. And this is going to add the open Zeppelin slash contracts NPM package to our project. And one of the code pieces that they have is this ERC 20 contract that we can use and we can have our token inherit all the functions. So we'll go ahead and import it with import at open Zeppelin slash contracts slash token slash ERC 20 slash ERC 20 dot soul. And just by importing it like this, all we have to do is have our token inherited now. So we'll say contract our token is ERC 20. Boom. And just like that, our token is almost done. Now you might get this little wiggle, this little red line here saying our token should be marked abstract. And that's because if we look into the ERC 20 dot soul of open Zeppelin, we'll see that it has a constructor. So in order for us to inherit the ERC 20 token, we have to use the ERC 20 constructor. And we just need to give our token a name and a symbol. But we can say in our constructor, we can leave it blank. And then right next to our constructor, we'll add the ERC 20 constructor. And our name will be our token. And then our symbol will just be OT. And then this ERC 20 token also comes with something called a mint functionality which is essentially a function that allows us to create tokens, right? Because right now we actually get initialized with zero tokens, right? So nobody's actually allowed to have any tokens. So we want to mint the initial amount of tokens and then who owns all those tokens to start with. So usually what you'll see is you'll see a mint function like this. It'll be passed to message.sender. So whoever deploys this contract will own all the tokens to start. And then we'll give it like an initial supply. And then we could do like UN 256 initial supply equals like seven or whatever. But instead, a common practice is just to add it to the constructor. So UN 256 initial supply like that. As we know about Solidity, decimals don't work so great. So if I say my initial supply is 50, that 50 is going to be like 50 way. And there's all these ERC 20s come with a decimals, a decimals function, which tells us how many decimals we should expect with our ERC 20. The default is 18. And we can override this function if we want a different amount of decimals. And if we know the default is 18, and we want to deploy 50, we might want to do our initial supply of 50 E 18. Or you can also say like 50 times 10 raised to the 18th or whatever you want there. And in our code, when we deploy this, now this is actually where we're going to finish the project, because everything else that we would do here, we've already done. All we need to do is make a deploy script and write some tests. That's really it. Because right now you have all the skills that you need to write a deploy script and then optionally write some tests for this project. So I highly encourage you to pause the video here and try to write your own deploy script. And even if you want to write your own tests, you can always refer back to the GitHub repo associated with this lesson, as we do have a deploy script in here. We also have a TypeScript edition in here as well that we're additionally not going to go over. And of course, if you get totally lost, there's a ton of instructions in here to help you learn more and help you work with this specific repository. So let's do a quick review of what we just learned. So ERC 20 tokens or EIP 20 tokens or, or BEP or PEP or any of these dash 20 improvement proposals are what's known as the token standard and the token standard, these tokens on chain are actually just tokens that are smart contracts. Now, these tokens are obviously different than the layer one tokens like Ethereum or Polygon or Avalanche or Arbitrum. Those are not going to be smart contracts. Those are going to be blockchain native tokens. And you'll hear me refer to it as blockchain native tokens a lot versus these tokens, these ERC 20, these smart contract tokens, which are just smart contracts. And they're just kind of a combination of these functions that represent how many tokens each address has. We can create our own token with all of these specifications added, or we can just use Open Zeppelin to import a token in. Now, another popular repo like Open Zeppelin is going to be this one from Rari Capital called Soulmate, and they're both aimed to be standard libraries for Solidity. And one of the important things to keep in mind is that these tokens have this allowance mapping, and you can allow other addresses to have access to your tokens and move your tokens around. This is important, especially when we get to later on when working with DeFi, when we want to give some smart contract access to our tokens, 
so that they can input it into their DeFi protocol. It's also a little bit tricky and you want to make sure you're not allowing malicious contracts to interact with your tokens. And we'll also see that when we start to interact with these tokens more, before any contract can interact with our tokens, we need to approve them to interact with our tokens. And that's it. Now you're a token wizard and you can deploy your own tokens. Take a break, get that coffee, and I'll see you in the next one. All right, welcome to the next session. We are going to be learning about DeFi in this session and going to be programmatic and going to be programmatically interacting with the DeFi protocol. I am incredibly excited for you for this session because DeFi is one of the best use cases for smart contracts and one of the use cases that I am specifically most excited for. Now, as I've mentioned in the past, DeFi stands for decentralized finance. We've left some links in the GitHub repository for you to learn more about DeFi. One of the main reasons we're so excited about DeFi is because we move away from this area of traditional agreement. And that's what smart contracts are all about. They're about removing this centralized entity from our financial world, and especially from these financial institutions that have a conflict of interest. They're in business to make money, not to keep our money safe, not to make us money. And we want to work with a system where everything is transparent, especially when it comes to our financial services. So we want to move to this world of smart contracts, especially when it comes to our money. And in my mind, DeFi is going to be the industry that affects the masses the quickest because of how much fairer, how much better decentralized finance is than centralized finance. And at the moment, the rates and the yields and the interest that you gain in DeFi is much better than centralized finance. Because remember, we'll go away from these centralized protocols saying, hey, trust us, we'll give you access to the markets or hey, trust us, put, put your money in us will keep your money safe to this cryptographic math based guarantees instead of having to trust these companies and these entities, which is what we want. And additionally, the more our Oracle networks get better and the more our Oracle's networks work with these smart contract platforms like Ethereum, like Polygon, like Arbitrum, the more data and the more complex financial products that we can do. Now, one of the other reasons I'm so crazy excited about DeFi is if you look at this little chart right here, it shows the different markets uh, by size. Now, this, this image is a little bit outdated, but it, it still shows you the relative sizes of all these different industries. DeFi right now is a $200 billion market. There's about $200 billion locked in the DeFi industry, and I'll show you that in a minute. Cryptocurrency, actually at the time of recording, isn't $360 billion. It's actually like $1.8 trillion. So it's a lot more than this, but still it's, it's a massive subset of all these other areas like gold is a $10 trillion market. The stock market is almost a hundred trillion dollars. Global real estate, almost $300 trillion derivatives is quadrillion dollars. So DeFi is a super tiny, 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 tiny subset right now. And in my mind, all of these areas can be re-landscaped with DeFi. So we're ramping up, we're getting there. So it's gonna be up to us to make some of these protocols and make it much easier for people to get into the space where their finances are gonna be more fair, more accountable and more transparent and with better yield rates. We can actually see a pretty good summary of what's going on in DeFi at this site called DeFi Llama. It shows total value locked in all these different decentralized protocols. And we can see a lot of these are across multiple chains, right? And a lot of these are EVM compatible chains. Ethereum, Binance Smart Chain, Avalanche, Fanta, Tron, Polygon, all these are EVM compatible blockchains where we can see exactly how much money independent users have put into these protocols. At the time of recording, Aave is the number one protocol for total value locked. So there's $22 billion locked in Aave, which is the protocol that we're gonna be going over today. So what is Aave? So Aave is a borrowing and lending protocol. It allows us to borrow and lend cryptocurrencies. So we can actually put down a token as collateral. It's kind of similar to like putting money in a bank and earn yields on other people borrowing that collateral from us. Almost exactly what a bank does, except for the fact it's what's called non-custodial. So the Aave team never touches their money. Nobody ever touches their money. It's all just smart contract. It's all just this programmatic code. So we can be rest assured, no one's gonna run off with our money, no one's gonna do anything bad, and we also gain these higher yields. Borrowing and lending is a critical piece for creating really any interesting financial applications. If you want to short sell something, if you want to leverage up on some asset, if you want to 
If you want to do more complex financial products, you need borrowing and lending. Now, a lot of the typical fintech or financial technology or finance terms do apply here. And this course isn't going to be a deep dive into exactly how these financial products work. And it's also not going to be a course on finance. If you want to learn more about finance, we'll leave a number of links in our GitHub repo associated with this course. So you can learn more about finance and become what I like to call a DeFi quant, a quantitative DeFi engineer. And I am so excited for more DeFi quants to get into this space. All right, so here we are in uh, the Aave application. It's at testnet.ave.markets. We are in the testnet of Aave. Now, everything that we're going to do here is going to work on mainnet as well, but we're going to use it on their testnet. Now, this is actually Aave's older UI, and they have a new website that looks even better than this. But we're going to be going through a lot of the basic functionality positing, taking out a loan, potentially even shorting an asset if we want. I don't recommend going to this site because it might not work on Coven the way you'd expect it to. So for this, just sit back, relax, and watch. In order for us to actually short sell or margin trade, the first thing that we're gonna to need to do is actually deposit some collateral. We need to deposit some collateral in order to borrow. This way, if we never repay back the loan that we took out or the, the amount that we borrowed, Ave will just go ahead and take the collateral that we put in here. It'll do what's called a liquidation call. And that's why this is actually a little bit safer than short selling in traditional markets, because if your collateral is less than how much you have borrowed, you'll just immediately get liquidated, but you still lose a bunch of money. So like, don't get liquidated. So what we want to do now is we're going to scroll to Ethereum. Uh, we're going to connect our wallet here. We're going to move to Coven Test Network browser here. And we're going to go to this deposit piece. So it, it already shows our, our balance here. We have 0.2 Coven ETH. Let's deposit 0.1. We're going to hit deposit. MetaMask is going to pop up, confirm. But once this goes through, this means that we have it deposited. And we go to our dashboard, we can see we have uh, some ETH here, 0.1 ETH. Um, it's got some APY. This is kind of like that percentage return that we're going to get back for, for depositing into Aave. Uh, and yes, we can use it as collateral here. We have this, this marked as yes here. So that's exactly what we're going to do. And it says nothing borrowed yet. Uh, we can go ahead and hit this borrow now button. And we're going to get brought to the borrow screen. And we're going to choose which asset we want to borrow. Now, whenever we borrow one of these, there are these APYs, right? This is the percentage that uh, over the course of a year that we're going to have to pay in order to actually borrow this asset. The stable one means it'll always be four or variable means it actually changes depending on kind of the, how much liquidity the protocol has. Uh, you can kind of pick which one you want to do. Stable is, is you're always going to be at 4%. Variable is going to be a little bit riskier, but you might get a lower fee. So we're actually going to borrow some DAI, right? Because DAI is a stable coin. It's worth a dollar. In, in a way, you could call this taking out on margin because we're taking out DAI to, to borrow. And another way, we could say we're shorting DAI, which is kind of funny to think about. Uh, you get to choose how much you want to borrow here. And you'll see this, this thing called health factor. I'm going to zoom in a little bit. This thing called health factor here as we, as we scroll this thing. So this health factor is how close to being liquidated you are. Remember how I said you can get liquidated? This health factor represents how close we are to getting liquidated. This means how close we are to Ave saying, you know what, F you, we're taking your funds. If it goes below one at any time, somebody can liquidate you and, and take a lot of that deposit that we put in. There's some math behind uh, actually what the health factor actually is. Uh, and you can head over to the Ave documentation, which I will leave a link in the description to kind of read more about the health factor. So we're gonna borrow. 29 die we're bo we're borrowing basically 30 bucks I'm gonna hit continue i'm gonna do uh, a variable zoom back out continue we're gonna borrow metamask pops up confirm transaction is pending and we're gonna go to the dashboard and now we can see kind of our new balance here right we can see the 0.1 eth deposited and 29 die and we can see our health factor up here. You can even click this little button saying, hey, it represents how close you are to being um, liquidated. We can see the value here. Our, our ETH is worth like $200. Our DAI is worth 30 bucks. So we're good. We're, we're pretty healthy here. In order for Aave to understand and under to price the underlying collateral so it knows how much it can lend out, Aave is another one of these protocols that uses Chainlink price feeds to price the underlying collateral. Many of these billion dollar DeFi protocols use Chainlink on the back end to do all their pricing mechanisms. And that's essentially it. We could then repay our debts, we could borrow more assets, we could swap assets around, and the interest return we get on depositing our assets is amazing. So now that we learned a little bit about how to use their UI, which is hosted on IPFS, by the way, let's go ahead and let's learn how to do all this and do even more 
programmatically so we can become DeFi quant engineers. Now, like I said, we're going to be working with the Aave V2 protocol. If you want to try out the V3, you absolutely can. And you can go there and play with it. Right now, it still has more money locked in it, which is great. But the V3 protocol is obviously the latest addition. So we're going to be flipping back and forth between the documentation and our code base. So I recommend that you have the documentation up as well. And per usual, all of the code that we're going to be working with is in this hard hat DeFi free code camp repository. So let's jump in. I'm in my VS code. I'm in my folder with this course. We're going to make a new folder. We're going to call it hard hat DeFi FCC. We're going to CD into it. And then we're going to open it up with code period. Or you can also do per usual file open and then open that folder. Now we're in a new project. We're going to do yarn add dash dash dev hard hat. And we're going to add hard hat and start up our minimalistic hard hat project. Once again, for starting up your minimalistic hard hat projects, I usually just copy paste from another folder or I just use that hard hat starter kit that we saw in the smart contract kit repo. But whatever works best for you to get your project started, you can use. Now that we've got this, we can run yarn hard hat. <clears throat> And we'll just create an empty hardhat.config.js. Now, to save us some boilerplate time, I am going to copy paste my hardhat.config.js from a past project into this one, just to make it so we don't have to go through that boilerplate setup again. And I'm also going to copy paste this line from our hardhat smart contract lottery again. If you want to use your package.json or your yarn.lock to install dependencies, you absolutely can. But I'm just going to paste that in here and run it. And then I'm going to copy paste over my prettier files so that all my JavaScript can be formatted the way I want it to be. Okay, great. Now we have a minimalistic project spun up. Let's go ahead and get started learning how to interact with the Aave protocol here. So let's make a quick readme and talk about what we want to be able to do. So first, we're going to want to be able to learn how to programmatically deposit collateral. And if we stopped right there, that might be enough. We'd be able to programmatically deposit collateral. And in doing so, we'd earn yield. We'd earn that percentage return just on our deposited collateral. So accomplishing this by itself is already a feat. But let's say we want to go one step further. We want to get into these more interesting financial products. So after we deposit some collateral, we're going to learn how to programmatically borrow another asset. The deposited collateral is going to be ETH slash wrapped ETH, which we'll talk about in a little bit. We're going to borrow another asset, which for this demo is going to be DAI. And the reason that we're using DAI is because DAI is what's known as a stable coin. So DAI is actually a token on the blockchain created by this MakerDAO, where the price of the DAI token is always pegged to $1. So we're putting down ETH as collateral, and we're borrowing cryptocurrency US dollars, sort of. We're borrowing this token, which represents a US dollar. And then we'll just repay the DAI. We'll repay almost everything back. And you'll see why we don't repay everything back in a minute. One other protocol that I want to talk about quickly is the Uniswap protocol. And the Uniswap protocol has become this haven for trading. It's a decentralized application that allows us to trade assets and tokens with each other on something called an automated market maker. It, and it's basically a decentralized stock exchange, but with tokens. And again, tokens aren't exactly stocks. They're very different. So when looking to get some of these assets like wrapped Ethereum or DAI or link token on a mainnet, oftentimes you're going to use one of these decentralized exchanges. And obviously these decentralized exchanges are much fairer because everything that happens on them is transparent, much fairer than centralized finance. Everything that happens on them is transparent. You can see everything that's going on on chain, which is absolutely phenomenal. So let's go ahead and get started here. And let's just create our scripts folder because in this project, we're actually not going to create any contracts ourselves. We're just going to learn how to interact with these protocols. If you do want to learn how to build some of these protocols at the end of this session, I'll, we will give you a ton of links and we'll have a special guest explain a, a few different ways to learn how to build more of these decentralized protocols. Although we've already built one with our decentralized lottery, which is fantastic. Let's create some scripts here. And for all of these things, deposit, collateral, borrow and repay, we'll just put this all in a new script called Ave borrow.js. So we're gonna do everything in here. And since this is a script, it's gonna have the same setup as we've seen before, right? So we're gonna have this main thing where I have an async function main, and then we'll have our imports, of course, at the top. Now, something that's important to note, we go to Aave, we go to the protocol, we can kind of read through the docs and eventually we would find out the protocol treats everything as an ERC-20 token. But we know that Ethereum or the native blockchain token that you're using isn't an ERC-20 token. 
And the reason it treats everything like an ERC-20 token is that it's just much easier, right? If everything's using this ERC-20 token standard, it's much easier to send and, and interact with stuff. On a lot of these protocols, when we go to deposit Ethereum or Polygon or Arbitrum or et cetera, what actually happens is they send your Ethereum through like what's called a WETH gateway and swaps it for WETH, which stands for wrapped ether. And it's basically Ethereum, but in an ERC-20 token contract. So what we wanna do is gonna do that same thing. We're gonna skip kind of using this WETH gateway and we'll just get the WETH token ourselves and we'll use that as collateral. So in our scripts tag, I'm gonna make another file called getweth.js. And in here, we're actually gonna go ahead and we're going to build a script that will deposit our token for WETH token. Okay, so let's create this script. And there's a link to the WETH token on Etherscan and on mainnet in the GitHub repo. And the way it works is you actually deposit Ethereum and in return, it'll give you the WETH token. I'm on Rinkby right now. If I deposit 0.05, go ahead and write I'm connected to etherscan I'll go ahead and write this transaction I'm on rink B so I don't really care if it's if it's the actual contract or not because it's not real money but I'm going to deposit 0.05 eth and after our transaction goes through we copy the contract address we add this token to our metamask the same way we added link we'll import tokens paste the address in here add custom token import tokens we'll now see we have some weth token in here I deposited 0.1 before, so it's 0.1 plus 0.05, which is why it shows 0.15, because I, I did it twice while, while I wasn't recording. So, um, but this is how you can get this WEF token into your contract. And then anytime you want, you can call this withdraw function and you can withdraw your Ethereum out of this and do what's called burn your WEF token. So when you want to swap back from WEF to Ethereum, you hit this withdraw and boom, you basically swap them back because this contract itself right now is holding your Ethereum token. Pretty cool, right? So in our get weth function, we're not going to add this main thing here. We're going to create get weth here just as kind of a module and we're going to import it into our Ave borrow. So we're not going to do this, this main thing that you see here. Instead, we're going to create an async function called get weth. And then below, we're going to export it. So we'll do module that exports equals get weth. We're going to export it so our Ave borrow can use this get with script that we're creating right now. Let's add, let's go ahead and do this. Well, in order to interact with a contract, we're going to need an account. So we can do const deployer equals await get named accounts per usual. We'll do const get name accounts equals require hard hat. My VS code automatically imported that. Thank you, VS code. Now, and now we want to call the deposit function on the WETH contract. How do we call this deposit function on the WETH contract? Well, how do you call any contract? Well, what do you need? You need the ABI and then you need the contract address. Drill this in. You're always going to need the ABI and the contract address to interact with a contract. We know that if we give, we know that if we give our project the whole contract, it'll get the ABI, but we also know if we just do the interface, that's just as good. It won't give us all the functionality, but it will tell, it will give us the ABI. It will tell our ethers what functions it can use. So we're gonna create a new folder. We'll create our contracts folder. And in here, we're gonna create a new folder inside of that called interfaces. And this is where we're gonna create our WETH interface. Now a WETH interface is gonna be really similar to an ERC-20 interface. So if you wanna go ahead and, and try to add it yourself, feel free to do so. Or what you can just do is you can come to the GitHub repo associated with this lesson, come to iWeth and just copy paste, right? You'll see the functions in here are exactly the same as an ERC-20. Allowance, approve, balance of, decimals, name, blah, 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 with these additional deposit and withdraw functions. So I'm gonna copy all this, move back over to my hardhat project. We'll create a new file. We'll call it iWeth.soul. And just to note, oftentimes a good best practice is to have interfaces start with I so that you know it's an interface. And then we'll paste it in here. Now, in order for this to compile, we'll need to use 0.4.19 version of Solidity. So what we can do is we can come over to our hardhat.config.js. We have Solidity compilers version 0.07 or whatever versions that you have in here. We can add or just replace. So I'm going to put a comma here version 0.4.19 save 
And now, in order to make sure we can get that ABI, do yarn hard hat compile or HH compile. And great, we compiled this interface. So now we have the ABI to interact with. Now that we have the ABI, put a little check mark here, let's go ahead and get the contract address. But for reasons that we're gonna learn about very soon, we're actually gonna work just with mainnet. Instead of getting the rinkby test and address, I'm gonna look up weth mainnet, and we're gonna find the weth token on mainnet. So I'm gonna copy the address of mainnet. And again, you can just grab this address from the GitHub repo associated with this lesson as well. And for now, we're gonna say check, I'm gonna put a little check mark here, and paste the address there. So now we have the ABI compiled from an interface and we have the contract address for mainnet, but let's go ahead and create this contract now. So we can say const iweth equals await ethers dot, and then we'll need to import ethers from hardhead as well. Ethers dot get contract at, this is another one of these functions on ethers. It allows us to get a contract at a specific address. We'll say get contract at, we use the iweth ABI. For now, we'll just hard code this address in here, and then we'll connect it to the deployer. So we're saying, let's get this WETH contract with the ABI of IWETH at this address connected to deployer. So we could go ahead and run await IWETH.deposit, and we'll send value, which will be some amount. Let's go ahead and at the top, we'll say const amount equals, let's do ethers.utils.parse ether, and then we'll do 0 0.0, do 0 0.02. So we'll deposit 0 0.02. We'll say const tx equals that. We'll do await tx.wait1, wait for one block to go through. And then we'll just get the balance. We'll say const weth balance equals await i weth dot balance of deployer. So we're going to call the balance of function on our i weth erc20 token. And then we'll just do console.log got weth balance dot two string. So we're using the mainnet address in here and we're gonna say, okay, we're gonna deposit some amount, we're gonna wait, and then we're gonna go ahead and get the balance, right? So we're just depositing our Ethereum so that we can get that ERC20 version of Ethereum, that weth token here. Now you might be thinking, okay, why are you putting the mainnet address in here? Let's Patrick, you, you slow down. Let's go ahead. Let's create a mock weth token contract address. Let's deploy the mocks first, and then we'll go ahead and use that same setup that we've been doing this whole time. Why are you, why are you directly hard coding this in here? Well, I'd been alluding to this for some time, but there's another way that we can run tests in our smart contracts. And this is with something called mainnet forking. We can actually do something where we fork the mainnet and run a local hardhat node that's pretending to be a mainnet node. And all we have to do is update our hardhat config to do so. So let's talk about forking for a minute. So on the left here, we have a blockchain, an example of a blockchain. It's gonna be something similar to a testnet or a mainnet like RinkB, ETH mainnet, Polygon, et cetera. This is going to be a blockchain that we deploy to. Now there are a whole bunch of blocks in here, right? We have this huge chain that we can work with. And all this information on the blockchain is public information. Like this block is gonna have transaction, transaction, transaction. Each one of these blocks is gonna have a whole bunch of transactions and all this information is on this public blockchain. In addition to all these transactions, it's gonna have things like price feed contracts. It's gonna have things like Aave contract, the WETH token contract, et cetera. All this contract information is public. So hypothetically, if it's already there, we should be basically able to copy this to our local environment and do some simulations ourselves. And that's exactly what forking does. A forked blockchain literally takes a copy of an existing blockchain, like on the left here, and brings it on our local computer. We actually have control over our blockchain that's running locally because it's gonna run on our local computer, similar to Hardhat. Now, everything we do on this local forked blockchain is not gonna affect mainnet because it's a simulated blockchain. It's just running in our local environment. So we can actually interact with this forking, this kind of local blockchain that resembles, that mimics the actual blockchain. Now, here's what forking doesn't do. It doesn't download the entire blockchain into our local setup. Anytime we reference an address, anytime we reference, hey, there's something at a specific address, 
we make an API call to our Ethereum node, which again, we're using Alchemy and say, hey, uh, what's at this address? And it'll return just that specific contract for us. This way we don't have to download the whole blockchain and it's a lot quicker. And we can also do this forking to run our tests, to run our scripts, to do everything. And now you might be thinking, wow, Patrick, th this sounds awesome. Well, why don't we just do this for everything? Well, there's some trade-offs. The pros are that it's quick, it's easy, and our test will resemble what's on mainnet. Now the cons are that we need an API and we can't do everything locally. Some contracts, some contracts are complex to work with and mocks might just be better, but using a forked network might be a good way to run your tests. It might be a good alternate to just using mocks. So it really depends on what's right for you and right for your project. But it is a fantastic tool, especially for something like Aave, where we wanna quickly test some things. Now the hard hat forking also will give us a bunch of fake accounts. So we'll still get a bunch of fake accounts on mainnet that will be given Ethereum. So we'll get fake mainnet accounts for this forking. So for the rest of this, we're going to be using this forking to run our scripts and run our tests. If you want to go back after this and try this all out on Coven, we've got a whole bunch of different addresses for the Coven network so that you can run these scripts directly on Coven and you can see the transactions yourself. Just note that when using Coven, you'll want to make sure that you're using the same addresses as are in the Aave docs for the Coven network because they do change sometimes. Great. Let's go ahead. We'll go to our arthat.config.js. And now we'll go to our networks, which right now uh, I don't have anything. I only have Rinkby. And we'll add hardhat in here. We'll add a little comma down here. And we'll say, you know, the chain ID, of course, is going to be 31337. But we'll add this forking keyword. And in here, we'll say the URL for our forking is going to be our mainnet RPC URL. And this is another reason why we're using Alchemy. Alchemy is fantastic at these forked blockchains and has really good pieces here. So what we can do is we can come back to our Alchemy dashboard. We'll create a new app. This one will be for Ethereum mainnet. And we'll say forking chain. We'll say for forking. We'll go ahead and create this on Ethereum mainnet. Now that we have this forking chain, we can do the same thing. We'll grab our API key. We'll come back to our project, we'll create this new file, we'll create our .env, and we'll do mainnet RPC URL equals and paste that in there. In our hardhead config, we are now going to be forking from mainnet RPC URL whenever we work with the hardhead blockchain. So now that we have this in here, let's go ahead and, and try to run this get weth function because since we're forking the blockchain, we should be able to go ahead and simulate this. So back in Aave borrow. We'll go ahead, we'll do const get with equals require, and then we'll pull this script in dot dot scripts slash get with. And then in our main function, we'll just run await get with. So to run our script here, we'll do yarn hardhat run scripts aveborrow.js. And our default network is hardhat. So we could either do dash dash network hardhat or just run it. And remember, since in our config, we're saying, hey, when we run the hardhat chain, use this forking, we're going to be forking. So let's go ahead and run this. And it ran to error. Mainnet RPC URL is undefined. Well, that makes sense. Let's go ahead and add this. Const mainnet RPC URL equals process.emb dot mainnet RPC URL. Let's try this again. And we now see we got you know, this much width, which again, that much width is going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 0 0.02 width, which is exactly what we want. So now we have a way to interact with mainnet locally, which sounds kind of crazy, but it is incredibly powerful for exactly what we're doing right here. So we have a way to fork mainnet ETH and run our scripts and kind of test to see and simulate what it would be like to actually run these transactions. So we're going to do it like that. Our get with function looks good. And obviously we would still modularize this. We'd put this in our helper hardhead config, but we're going to skip doing that for now. So let's go ahead back to the Ave borrow and let's go ahead and flesh the rest of this out. Now let's go ahead and set up the rest of the boilerplate here. So we'll do const deployer because we need an account. Obviously equals await get named accounts. And then we'll do const get named accounts equals require. Now we want to start interacting with the Aave protocol. Well, what do we need? We're going to need the ABI and the address. Nothing changes. We're going to need these two. So what we can do is we can go to the Aave docs. 
And again, we're going to be on V2. And we can go ahead and find the contract address in here. Now, the way Ave works is they actually have a contract which will point us to the correct contract. The contract that we're going to be doing all the lending with is this lending pool. And there's actually a contract to get that contract address. And to get the lending pool address, we have to go to the lending pool address provider. It's this contract that will tell us what the address of the lending pool is. And we can actually see the deployed contract section. We can see the address of this contract and we can see the address of all the main ones and the Coven ones. Again, if you want to play with this on Coven, but we can see lending pool address provider is going to be located right here. So we can copy this address and we'll just take notes of this. And then lending pool, we're going to get from the lending pool address provider. So let's actually create a function that will get us the lending pool address from the lending pool address provider. So down here, we'll create async function, get lending pool. Now, in order to interact with this lending pool address provider, same thing, we're going to need its address and its ABI. We have its address. So let's go ahead and, and get its ABI. You can go ahead to the GitHub repo associated with this lesson and just copy paste it from the interfaces section. You could also look directly on the blockchain to see what this contract looks like and create your own interface, or we can go ahead and use the interface right in the documentation. So we have I lending pool address provider. I'm just going to copy this from the Ave docs, but again, you've got a, a number of options. In. So in our contracts, in our interfaces, oops, let's, let's stick I with in interfaces here. Let's create a new file and we'll call it I lending pool address provider dot soul, and we'll paste it in here. We just see we're using 0.6.12. So be sure to in our hardhead config, make sure we have that we don't. So we'll just create a new one, 0.6.12. And then we'll compile yarn hardhead compile, and it compiles. So awesome, we now have the ABI here, we'll get this contract by saying const lending pool address provider equals await ethers dot get contract at we'll say I lending pool address. Oops, address as I lending pool addresses, excuse me, I'm going to update the name I lending pool addresses provider, I lending pool addresses provider, we're going to pass in that contract address that we got from the Ave docs here, paste that in. And then we're going to connect it to our deployer. So we're going to have our get lending pool, get passed an account variable, and then we'll just use the account here to connect it. And the account that we're going to pass is of course going to be our deployer in our lending pool address provider. There's a function called get lending pool, which returns the address of the lending pool. And this is going to be the function that we're going to call. So we're gonna say const lending pool address equals await lending pool addresses pro oops, address lending pool addresses provider dot get lending pool. And that's it we will have the lending pool address. And then we'll have this contract give us the lending pool contract by doing const lending pool equals await ethers dot get contract at and we need to do the same thing, the interface, the interface, the address, and then the account. So back in the docs, we can grab the I lending pool by copying this like this. We'll go back to our contracts interfaces, new file, I lending pool dot soul, and we'll paste it in. Now with this one, if we scroll to the top, we notice that we're importing from some local places that we actually don't have in our contracts area. We can once again, go ahead and add the Aave protocol V2 from NPM and just use this as our imports. So we'll do yarn add dash dash dev at Aave slash protocol hyphen V2. Now that we have the at Aave protocol in our node modules, we can update these imports to point to our node modules instead of our local files. So I'm just going to go ahead and tell you that the I lending pool adage provider is at Aave slash protocol hyphen V2 slash contracts slash interfaces. And then data types dot soul is gonna be at Aave protocol hyphen V2 slash contracts slash protocol slash libraries slash types data types dot soul. Again, to make sure this is right, 
Yarn Hard Hat Compile or HH Compile. And cool, looks like I did that right. Lending pool equals await ethers dot get contract at, we're gonna be using lending pool, by lending pool here. We're gonna use this lending pool address got from the addresses provider, and then the account, which is gonna be our deployer. And now we can do return lending pool. And if we want, uh, and now that we have this function get lending pool, back up in our main function, we can say const lending pool equals await get lending pool and then we'll pass the deployer. And then we can even do a little console.log lending pool address and then do lending pool dot address. And since we're mainnet forking, we can kind of just keep running this, right? So we'll do yarn hard hat run scripts Ave Barra JS. There are multiple artifacts for contract I lending pool addresses provider. And this is because in our node modules, we import all this stuff from contracts and in here, and there's already an I lending pool addresses provider in those at Ave slash contracts. So actually we don't even need this I lending pool addresses provider. We can go ahead and delete it. Hard hat right now is getting confused. It's saying, oh, are, are you referring to the one that you downloaded from NPM or the one that uh, you made, which which one do you want to use? So we'll just make it easier for a hard hat and we'll say, okay, we'll, we'll delete the one that we created. We'll use the one that we downloaded here. And now we should be good. We run this again, because now there's only one for it to pick from, which is the one we downloaded from NPM. And perfect. We get our get wef printout here. And then we get lending pool address is here. And this is going to be the actual lending pool address on Ether Ethereum mainnet. So if we go back to Ether scan, copy that address and paste it in Etherscan, we can see it's even labeled Ave V2, and we can see a ton of transactions going through all the time. <laughs> and Etherscan's having a hard time keeping up with all the transactions. So we've got the lending pool address, we've got some WETH token. What do we need to do now? Well, we want to deposit, but what do we need in order to deposit the token? Well, if we look at the deposit function in the Ave GitHub, we can scroll in here and we see it eventually will call this safe transfer from, which is basically going to be this transfer from function. Since we're calling transfer from, it's going to be this contract that's actually going to pull the money out of our wallet. So in order to give the Ave contract the ability to pull the money out of our wallet, we need to do what? We're going to need to approve the Ave contract. So first, before we can even deposit, we're going to need to approve it to get our WETH token. We're going to have to get the WETH token first. So let's get the WETH token address. We'll say const WETH token address equals, and this is where we'd modularize it and get it from our hardhead helper config. But for now, we can just hard code it. The WETH token contract address is going to be the exact same thing as what's in get WETH. And then we'll want to approve. So let's write an approve function because we're going to use this a couple of times. So we'll make an async function, approve ERC20. And we'll take a contract address, a spender address, which is going to be the contract that we're going to give the approval to, to spend our token, an amount to spend. So exactly how much we want to approve it. And then an account to do all this on. So in here, we'll say const ERC20 token equals await ethers.get contract at. And we could say iwef but maybe we just want like a simple ERC20 token interface. And we're gonna grab that by cheating a little bit. Going to our hardhead DeFi FCC, we're gonna go to interfaces and grab this interface from here. So we're gonna copy this, paste it in here, new file, ierc20.sol, paste. And now we have an ABI for ERC20s. So we'll do get contract at ierc20. Actually, let's change this name to ERC20 address. So we're gonna get the contract with the ABI of IRC, ERC20, at contract address, ERC20 address, and then we'll connect it to our account here. So once we have the ERC20, we can do const TX. We're gonna do that approve transaction. We'll do await ERC20 token dot approve spender address, and then amount, just amount to spend. We'll do, we'll do await TX dot wait for one block. And we'll do a little console.log saying approved. 
Now, if you don't run this function before you try to deposit, you'll just get an error saying, hey, token is not approved, which is a pretty common error. So if you ever see that, just know, ah, oh, I, I forgot to approve my token. So back up in our main script, we'll go ahead and run this function. We'll say await approve ERC20 with the WEF token address, lending pool dot address, because we want to give the lending pool the approval to pull our WEF token from our account, and then we'll give it some amount. So we'll actually, we'll import amount from get WEF as well. Amount, and we got to go back to get WEF and export it, so we can actually import it. So get WEF exporting that amount, that 0.02. So we'll approve the amount and then we'll connect, we'll have our deployer do it, obviously, because we're doing everything with the deployer. So we'll approve the ERC20. And then once we approve, we can go ahead and deposit it. So we'll say console.log depositing dot dot dot. And then we'll run await lending pool dot deposit. If we look at the deposit function, we can see all the parameters that the deposit function takes. We can also see it in the Aave v2 documentation. We just look for deposit. And we can see it takes the address of the asset that we're gonna deposit, how much of that asset we're gonna deposit, address on behalf of, we're gonna do it on behalf of ourselves, and then a referral code, which right now is just always gonna be zero because the referral code has been discontinued. So we're gonna deposit the WETH token address. We're gonna deposit our WETH token. We're gonna deposit 0 0.02 of that WETH token. And then we're going to use a deployer. Oh, and then referral code is going to be zero. And then we'll do a little console.log deposited. So let's try this script. Let's see if it works. I'm just going to hit up to go ahead and rerun this script to rerun this command I just ran. And it's doing a little compiling that erc20.sol has compiled one solidity file, got a bunch of wrapped Ethereum, lending pool address. We approved it. We deposit, we were depositing it, and then we deposited it. So if we're looking at our little readme here, we get a little check mark. We've done step one. We've deposited our collateral. Awesome. So now we have some collateral to use to borrow other assets. Great. So now we've deposited. Let's go ahead and learn how to borrow now. Do a couple of new lines and we'll say borrow time. So in order for us to borrow, we probably want to know how much we can borrow. And we want to know more about our account, right? We want to know how much we have borrowed, how much we have in collateral, and how much we can borrow. So there's a function that Aave comes with called get user account data, which will return the user's account data across all reserves. How much collateral we have down, the total value it in its ETH price, we have the available borrows in ETH, current liquidation threshold, loan to value, et cetera. Now, these are really important metrics. If we have one ETH in collateral, that doesn't mean we can borrow one ETH of assets. Each one of these tokens have some different values, like loan to value. For example, if you have one ETH, you can only borrow 0.75 for the DAI token. This is to reduce risk of the collateral and reduce risk of people not having enough collateral down as prices fluctuate. There's a liquidation threshold of 80%. If you have one ETH as collateral and 0.81 ETH borrowed, you'll get what's called liquidated. So what is liquidation? When you put down collateral and you borrow, if the amount that you have borrowed past this liquidation threshold is past that 80% or, or depending on different assets, it's different, people can do what's called liquidate you. This is when they pay back some of your loan that you took out and they also get to buy some of your collateral at a cheaper price. This keeps the Aave platform solvent and it makes it so that there's never more borrows than there are collateral. In order to borrow assets, we still need that collateral down. So basically if you've borrowed more money than you've put up, other users can, can take the money that you've put up in return for them paying for your loans. So we obviously don't want this to happen. And the Aave protocol programmatically doesn't want to have not enough money to do this. So they incentivize users to liquidate in case of these failures. Is the protocols come with this thing called a health factor, which if this health factor is below one, you go ahead and you get liquidated. The actual function to liquidate somebody is called liquidation call. So you can actually build a bot and you can liquidate users who go insolvent and you can make a fee, you can make a reward for actually doing this. 
These protocols need to stay solvent. They need to have enough money to lend out and they programmatically enforce this, which is why it's so great. You can learn more about liquidations in the liquidation documentation. So this get user account data will tell us how much we have in collateral, how much we have in debt, and how much we have available to borrow based on how much collateral we have. We can see the current liquidation threshold, we can see the loan to value, and then we can see our health factor, which is obviously really important. If our health factor ever falls below one, we get liquidated. So we never want this health factor to fall below one when we're borrowing assets. So let's create a function that can grab that first. So let's create a new function we'll call it async function get get borrow user data and we'll pass in the lending pool contract we'll pass in the lending pool contract and the account that we want to get the data for so we can say const and actually we can pull out just the values that we want we could pull out the total collateral eth total debt eth and the available to borrow let's just pull out the total collateral eth the total debt eth and the available borrows ETH. Say this equals await lending pool dot get user account data of account. And now we'll even just kind of log this out. We'll say console.log. You have total collateral ETH worth of ETH deposited console.log you have total debt eth worth of eth borrowed and then console.log you can borrow available borrows eth worth of eth and then we'll just return available to borrow, we'll turn available borrows ETH, and we'll return our total debt. We don't really need to return total collateral. We could if we want, we really just want to print it out here. So now back in our function, we can do in our main function, we can run let, and I'm going to do let because we're going to be calling this a few times, available borrows ETH, and total debt ETH equals await get borrow user data of lending pool and deployer. And if we run this, we'll see how much we can actually borrow. Yarn hardhat or just HH run scripts of a borrow.js. Going to work on our forked blockchain here. And remember, it is going to be a little bit slower. And this is kind of one of the disadvantages too, because it does have to make API calls whenever we want to interact with these chains. And then we got total collateral ETH is not defined. And that's because I spelled total wrong, so let's spell total correctly and we'll run this again. But okay, great. So you have this much worth of ETH deposited. You have zero worth of ETH borrowed because we haven't borrowed anything. And you can borrow this much worth of ETH. Remember, the amount that we can borrow is always going to be less than the total amount that we have as deposited. That's why we see this lower number here. So cool. So that's how much we can borrow. Let's use that to go and borrow some dime. So we have this total amount we can borrow in ETH and we're, we're going to get to borrow time. We're, I promise we're going to get to borrow time, but we need to figure out what the conversion rate of die is. We're going to get how much we can borrow in ETH, but we want to borrow die. So how much of die can we borrow based off of the value of ETH? And to do that, we're going to have to get the die price. And how are we going to do that? Well, you guessed it. We're going to use chain link price feeds. If you look in the Aave documentation, you can find Price Oracle, which is a contract that you could actually use right directly from Aave. But the first thing it does is check from a Chainlink aggregator, which we already know how to do. So we're going to go ahead and just call directly from the Chainlink aggregator. So let's create a new function. Function, we'll call it get die price. Is first, we're going to need to get that interface, same thing. So you can either go right to hard hat DeFi and just grab the interface right from here. We could swap this out with just an import from Chainlink NPM as well, but I'm just going to go ahead and copy paste new file. This is going to be the aggregator v3 interface .sol that we've worked with so many times. Now that we have this interface, this will compile. We're obviously looking for latest round data, which will give us this answer here, which is going to be the price. So let's go ahead and grab that. So we'll say const die ETH price feed equals await ethers.get contract at 
and we'll use the aggregator v3 interface. We'll get the die eth price feed right from the chainlink docs. So we can go to docs.chain.link, EVM chains. We'll go to contract addresses on Ethereum. We'll look for die eth on mainnet, and we see die eth is right here. So we'll grab this, and again, we're just hard coding it in the GitHub repo associated with it. With this, we put it in a little config file, but we're, we can just go ahead and hard code it in. And for this one, we don't need to connect this to the deployer account since we're not going to be sending any transactions. We're just going to be reading from this contract, right? So reading, don't need a signer. Sending, need a signer. Now we can say const price equals await die ETH price feed dot latest round data. Now latest round data, as we know, is going to return us this huge thing. And we only want the answer at the first index. So another way we could do this, we could just wrap this whole thing up. And then once this returns, we're going to say, okay, just grab that first index here, which will be that price. And then we could do a little console.log, the die ETH price is, and then price dot two, like that, and then return price. So we can go ahead and run this as well, test this out just by hitting up and then enter. For depositing, we deposited. This is how much we can deposit. Nothing. Oh, and I forgot to call it. So oh, excuse me, let's go up. Let's do this. We'll say const die price equals excuse me, await get die price. And ta-da. The die ETH price is this big number, which of course we know is going to be $3,289, which is which of course is going to be 3289 die per ETH. Now that we have the die price, we can figure out how much die we want to borrow. So great, we have the price now. Let's figure out the amount that we can borrow in die. We have the amount we can borrow in ETH. We need to convert it to die. So we'll say const amount die to borrow equals available. Be the available borrows in ETH dot to string. And then in JavaScript, we can do this dot to string, but still do math. Um, so times 0 0.95 times, and then we'll do the reciprocal of that die. So one divided by die price dot to number. So this will give us the amount of die that we can borrow. And then we'll want to get this in way. So if we print this out right now, console.log, you can borrow. If we run this now, you can borrow amount die to borrow not in way units, which we need it in way units. So you can borrow 48 die, which based off the price looks about right. So to get the correct units, so we'll say const amount die to borrow way, that's gonna be equal ethers dot utils dot parse ether amount die to borrow dot to string. This is just purely the amount of die to borrow, right? So we get 48.79 die. But again, we want that in way the die token has 18 decimal places similar to Ethereum. So we need that amount in way. And then we can go ahead and start actually borrowing now. So we'll create a new function called borrow die async function borrow die. We'll take the die address, take the lending pool, we'll take the amount die to borrow in way. And then of course, we'll take the account. And all we'll do is we'll do const Borrow TX is going to be a weight lending pool dot borrow die address amount die to borrow. And again, we can go right to the documentation if we want. It takes the address of the asset, the amount we want to borrow, the interest rate mode, which is going to be variable or stable, the referral code, and then address on behalf of. So we're going to say one for the interest rate mode, where one is going to be stable. And then we're going to do zero for this referral code because that's debunked now. And then we'll do account. Then we'll do await, borrow tx.wait, we'll wait one transaction, and then we'll do console.log. You've borrowed, boom, and that's it. So we now have this borrow die function. So back up in our main function, right now, we can finally do the borrow time. So we'll do await, borrow die, and we'll pass those parameters in here. So we're going to do const die token address equals, and we're just going to hard code this for mainnet. So we can look up die token address, ETH mainnet. 
we'll grab this address here. This looks like this is indeed the die token. We could check right on the Ave GitHub. We could check right on the Ave, Ave actual code since we're just testing. We're just gonna go ahead and grab from Etherscan here. So for borrow die, we're gonna need the die token address. We're gonna need the lending pool contract, the amount of die to borrow in way, and then our deployer. And then we'll await borrow die. And then we will run this get bar user data again, just print out the information about where we are after we do that. So we can run this again. We should see the amount that we have borrowed updated. Our first call to that function is gonna say, hey, you have this much ETH deposited, you have nothing borrowed, you can borrow this much ETH, we get the price, we get how much we have borrowed, we get borrowed. And now it says you have this much worth of ETH deposited and you have this much worth of ETH borrowed and you can borrow this much ETH. So we actually now have bar or a bunch of this die actually borrowed. And the reason we're doing times 0 0.95, we don't wanna hit that cap of the maximum amount that we can borrow. So we're saying, hey, let's get 95% of the amount that we actually can borrow. So we're not gonna borrow everything, we're just gonna borrow 95%. And you can see that the amount of ETH we have deposited is actually higher. This is because we're actually gaining interest just by having this ETH deposited. And now that we have some die borrowed, we borrowed 48 die, which is equivalent to this much Ethereum. And then we still have a little bit more we can borrow because we only borrowed 95%, which is great. Awesome. We've taken out a borrow programmatically. Let's repay at least some of it here. So we're gonna have to create a new function that's gonna use the repay function in the contract. So we're gonna do async function repay. And this is gonna take the amount that we want to repay, the die address that we're gonna repay, the lending pool, and then the account. Now to repay, once again, we're gonna to have to approve sending our die back to Aave. So in here, the first thing we need to do is we actually need to call wait approve ERC20 with the die address lending pool dot address amount and then account right because approve erc20 that's the input parameters it takes and we need to approve sending the die back to the contract so we borrowed it and we're going to send it back now we're actually going to send it back so we'll say const repay tx equals await lending pool dot repay die address amount one account and then we'll say await Repay tx dot wait, and then we'll do console.log repaid. Up in our main function, we're gonna do await repay, and we're gonna give it the amount die to borrow in way. We're gonna give it the die token address. We give it lending pool, and then we'll give it deployer. Get you borrow user data one more time just so we can print out the final amounts. Now, you'll notice something though. We're gonna give back all of the die that we borrowed. However, we're still gonna have a die balance. You'll, you'll see that when I run this, that we still have a little bit of Ethereum borrowed, basically. We'll still have a die balance because we'll still have a little bit of die borrowed and try to figure out why before I answer it, actually. So we have this tiny, tiny, tiny amount of ETH borrowed here, and we have a much larger amount of ETH deposited. So why do we still have this tiny, tiny amount of ETH borrowed? Well, the reason is because as we borrow DAI, we actually accrued interest. So we still owe DAI back. Now, what we could do is we could use something like Uniswap to actually swap our Ethereum for DAI to repay the rest of our debt here. And that's how we could actually finish repaying all of the debt is to get a little bit more DAI to pay off that interest that we had accrued. And if you want, you can go back and you can do the exact same thing we did here to grab the Uniswap code place it in here to programmatically repay your debt as well. But at this point, you have just gone through the entire life cycle here. And that is absolutely massive. Huge congratulations. You have just deposited, borrowed, and repaid tokens from the Aave protocol. Now I'm gonna go briefly show you what some of these transactions are going to look like on an actual testnet, on an Etherscan you'll see that when we deposit our collateral, we actually get back what's called an A token or an interest bearing token. These tokens keep track of how much collateral, or in our case, how much WETH token 
we have deposited in the Aave protocol. And when we want to withdraw our WEF back, we burn these A tokens. We remove these A tokens. We can see that our first transaction is going to be deposit. And I want to just show you what it looks like when you actually deposit one of these tokens. This is a transaction associated with this lending pool dot deposit right here. If you look at tokens transferred down here, you can see we actually we deposited, you can see that we actually sent wrapped ether to the Aave contract. Now you'll also see this AWEF stuff here. So what is this AWEF stuff? So to keep track of how much you've actually deposited into Aave, Aave will give you your own AWEF token or A token to keep track. And this is this interest bearing token. You actually can see up here a little bit of interest already for actually depositing these tokens into the protocol. And it's this token that will keep going up the more people borrow and the more people use the protocol. So you can actually grab this token address, interest bearing token, this A token, I could import it into my MetaMask and I could see that I have 0 0.1, which represents my initial deposit, 000517, you know, dot, 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 AWEF. And if you keep this up long enough, this number will slowly go up as you get more and more because the interest keep, oh, and you can see it just went, went up right there. The interest will keep changing and keep going up. Obviously, we have so little deposited that the interest isn't going to go up very quickly, but it will go up the more people use the protocol. And since I'm using a testnet, the actual usage of the protocol isn't very high, but you get the picture. Awesome. You've done phenomenal to get this far. Let's do a quick recap of everything that we've learned, and then we'll head on to the next section. So first we learned about the WEF token or the wrapped Ethereum token. It's a way to tokenize our Ethereum or our layer one blockchain native token. Then we learned a little bit about the Aave protocol and how it's this DeFi primitive for borrowing and lending assets. And we can actually gain interest by depositing our tokens and our assets into Aave. We learned a little bit also about Uniswap, which is another incredibly important DeFi protocol, which allows us to swap tokens between each other in the decentralized context. Then we learned that we can actually deposit some of our tokens into the Aave protocol, which is a decentralized borrowing and lending platform, and similar to a bank, will actually gain interest on our deposited tokens. But first, we have to approve them because anytime you want a contract to interact with your tokens, you need to approve the contract to do so. And then we go ahead and deposit. Once we deposited, we got the die price, and then we learned that we can actually borrow die, we can borrow an asset based off of how much collateral we put down. And then we learned how to repay it back. We learned about forking a blockchain as opposed to using our own main blockchain. Another thing to note, if you are using an RPC URL, like something from Alchemy, so awesome, you've learned a ton about DeFi. Now DeFi is an absolutely massive powerhouse when it comes to the blockchain. It is one of the most important things blockchains can do. If you wanna learn more about DeFi and read more on DeFi, I've got some more links in the GitHub here so that you can learn more about DeFi. And one of them in particular that I want to show you is this one called Speedrun Ethereum. Not only does it give you a ton of DeFi examples, but it gives you a whole bunch of other examples as well. And this will be a good test of everything that you've learned after you pass this course, or even right now if you want to, or whenever you want. And to talk about it a little bit more, we actually have Austin Griffith here to talk a little bit more about Speedrun Ethereum himself. I'll pass it over to Austin. Hey, what's up? I'm Austin Griffith. I want to show you Speedrun Ethereum. Speedrun Ethereum is a great way to get started in Ethereum if you are a developer. It's targeted at Web2 developers becoming Web3 developers. SpeedrunEthereum.com is the website. It takes you through both getting started and kind of getting, getting the idea for the language and the syntax, but that's just the start. Just understanding the language is just the start. You feel like you are you can do anything and you're on the top of the world when you finally get the syntax of Solidity together and you can jam through a smart contract, but really getting context for the space and figuring out what works and what doesn't, that's a whole nother battle and that's where speedrunethereum.com comes in. So uh, let's speed run the speed run. Uh, first, you will get scaffold ETH down. Speedrun Ethereum kind of revolves around Scaffold ETH and uses Scaffold ETH uh, as a base. You'll want to tinker around with some ideas within Solidity, and let me show you what I mean by that. So with Scaffold ETH, you have a front end, 
and you have uh, your smart contract. So Scaffold ETH comes with hard hat out of the box and you will use the combination of hard hat and React to build a, a dApp where you'll deploy both the smart contract and the front end. And this, this ability to edit your smart contract and have your front end auto adapt to it is kind of the key to Scaffold ETH. I just added some ex extra exclamation points, but we'll see that show up over here once this contract deploys. There we go, there's that. So just real quick, again, if I create like a UN256 public counter and we set that equal to five, and then I build a function called increment that's public that does counter uh public there we go that does counter plus plus you can imagine what's going to happen here so you you edit a little bit of solidity you deploy your contract and then your front end auto adjusts to that and it gives you the ability as a developer to uh call those functions tinker with your smart contract play around you can even have a console log in there where it uh you know sets says the count now is there we go, something like this. And let's go ahead and deploy that. Notice I'm doing these quick iterations. I'm making small changes in Solidity and I'm seeing those changes show up in the front end and I'm tinkering with those in the front end and testing my assumptions. Uh, here, if we go look at our hard hat node, when I make this increment call, we should see that nice uh, console log there. You know, this address set the count to eight, right? Very, very cool. So this is Scaffold ETH. This is what Speedrun Ethereum is built on top of. You'll get in here, you'll edit your smart contract, then you'll edit your front end. You'll point your front end at some particular network. You'll deploy your smart contract. You'll deploy your app. It just gives you the ability to have a front end along with your smart contract, and you'll have that as you're building your smart, co smart contract. So to have this front end to tinker with your smart contract is gonna help you kind of figure out how you wanna write your solidity. Like, is this gonna be a Mapping? Is this going to be an array? How am I going to track this struct? You can kind of do this in an iterative process by just throwing it in here into your smart contract and tinkering with it on the front end and trying it out and seeing what you need to build. So that's Scaffold ETH and that's the base that you'll need to get started with Speedrun Ethereum. Once you've, you, you're able to have this all installed, you'll, you'll have your kind of React front end here with Yarn Start. You'll have Yarn Chain, which will run your, your hard hat node. And then you'll do Yarn Deploy. Once you have that set up locally, you're ready to go uh, with Speedrun Ethereum. And you can also do this right here in Challenge Zero. So Challenge Zero, gotta go zero indexed, right? We gotta be nerdy. Challenge Zero sets you up with just getting the environment set up. You'll, you'll quest on building a simple NFT example. It's gonna come with uh, an NFT smart contract and it's gonna come with an NFT front end, a little uh, kind of like uh, minting view. It'll come with all of this stuff to do that and it'll walk you through, basically Challenge Zero is gonna hold your hand. It's gonna take you through every step. You'll have to get Git, you'll have to have a certain version of Node, you, well, some, some correct range of Node, and Yarn installed. Watch out, Yarn has an executable on Linux. Make sure you have the Yarn, the package manager. Uh, but after you have Git, Yo Node, and Yarn, you'll run through uh, cloning down each challenge. You'll do an install, you'll fire up the chain and you'll fire up your front end and you'll have a working app that lets you interface with your NFT smart contract. You'll go through here and you'll learn about wallets. Uh, then you'll start minting NFTs and you'll send those NFTs around. And that's challenge zero. It's just getting you started. Uh, here, even in challenge zero, you'll deploy this NFT to Rinkaby and you'll also deploy an app and it'll allow your friends to go to your app and mint NFTs on Rinkaby. So that's the, the first challenge. It looks like we even like dive into OpenSea and play around with some of those mechanics. Uh, the second challenge, challenge number one. Challenge one of Speedrun Ethereum is like where it all really starts. This really shows off the superpower of Ethereum. It sets it up so uh, you need to build an app where a bunch of people that don't necessarily trust each other can coordinate and stake into a smart contract. And this is like 
This is the superpower of Ethereum. The ability for you, the developer, to write a few simple rules to allow jerks to coordinate financially and not grief each other and steal each other's money, right? You're, we're building these financial systems. There's you know game theory and economics and so many other things going on here. But you as the developer, you're writing simple rules and you're building a system that allows people to coordinate. So challenge one will take you through uh, how to get set up with your staker.soul smart contract. You'll install everything exactly the same way. You'll fire everything up. And then it's just going to walk you through the kind of things that you will need in your smart contract, but you'll have to write the solidity yourself. So this is, this is not going to be a handheld tutorial hell thing. You're going to have to write the smart contract yourself. And there's some guidelines and some rails that kind of help you out, but it's not going to do it for you. Okay, so that's that's quest one is or that's challenge one is building a decentralized staking app. Then challenge two is bu building a token vendor. This So in challenge one, you'll learn things like how to send money into a contract, how to have a contract keep track of mappings. In challenge two, you're gonna learn contract to contract interaction. You're gonna learn about ERC-20s. You're gonna learn about specifically the approve pattern, which is kind of a jerk. It's it's hard, it's, it's, it's a hard thing to, to deal with is the approve pattern. You need to go to your token contract and approve the vendor to take some money then in a second transaction, you need to go to the vendor and have the vendor grab the money from the token contract and do something else. So that's that's challenge two is learning about uh, tokens and vendors. And it's starting to really like get you kind of exposed to the idea of this like massive multiplayer game that is uh, Ethereum and also kind of like how to build these vending machines that anybody can get to. Then uh, you'll build a DEX. Now, now once, you, once you're done with zero, one, and two, you're really kind of, you have a license to learn at this point. You're, you're ready to really like go deal some damage and build some cool things. Maybe go build a couple other things, but come back and come, come hit challenge three. Challenge three is gonna be a little bit more open-ended. There's going to be a, a cohort of other people that are also building this, and you have to get through the first three challenges to even get to challenge three, to even get to this chat room. But there's a chat room where other developers Developers that are also building their own decks are all there together and you can kind of learn with them and chat with them but you're gonna build an exchange and you're gonna build an exchange that works in a smart contract in a decentralized way with no centralized uh, breaking points and what that's gonna mean is you're gonna have to have reserves of both ETH and tokens and you're gonna have to have a pricing function and uh, LP tokens and all sorts of other things that you'll have to learn about as you get to it uh, then challenge five is a multi-sig wallet such a fundamental uh, important thing about how to store your ETH safely is going to be in a multi-sig wallet and how you can have multiple identities. Even even like the the base of like what a DAO is, is sort of like starting with a multi-sig wallet and you'll need to build one of those. You'll need to understand call data. Call data is super weird and complex and everything's a transaction. Even when you're just poking a contract, it's a transaction and you have to craft that call data correctly to say, I would like to call this specific function on this specific contract. So that's multi-sig wallets. And then and then it kind of ends up, we've, we've got more challenges in the pipeline, but it kind of ends on build an SVG NFT. So much fun to build an NFT that crafts the actual drawing in the smart contract and renders it. So that's the speed run. Go speed run Ethereum, check out Scaffold ETH, start building, build something awesome on Ethereum. Hearts, 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 go get them. Austin Griffiths is one of the OGs when it comes to helping engineers get caught up and up to speed in the blockchain world. So massive thank you to Austin for all he's done so far. All right, now we're going to get into NFTs. Let's do this. Now, I've already made a number of videos on what NFTs are and how to start working with NFTs. So we're going to watch a portion of the previous Python edition of this course where I explain NFTs from a high level. And then of course, we're gonna get into the ultimate NFT tutorial. So let's learn about NFTs. Look, NFTs are hot right now. NFTs, also known as ERC-721s, are a token standard that was created on the Ethereum platform. NFT stands for non-fungible token and is a token standard similar to the ERC-20. Again, ERC-20 is like Link, Aave, Maker, all those goodies that are found on the Ethereum chain. An NFT or a non-fungible token is a token that is non-fungible. This means that they are starkly unique from each other, and one token isn't interchangeable with any other token of its class. 
A good way to think about it is one dollar is interchangeable with any other dollar. One dollar is going to have the same value of another dollar. Those are fungible tokens. That's like ERC-20s. One link is always going to be equivalent to one other link. By contrast, is going to be NFTs. Those of you nerds out there would know, like, a Pokemon would be a good example of an NFT. Your one Pokemon is going to have different stats, different movesets, and isn't interchangeable with any other Pokemon. Or maybe a more relatable one is like a trading card, a unique piece of art, or the like. So that's what these NFTs are. They are non-fungible, non-interchangeable tokens that, for the moment, are best represented or thought about as digital pieces of art that are incorruptible and have a permanent history of who's owned them, who's deployed them, etc. Now, like I said, NFTs are just a token standard. So you can actually make them do much more than just be art. You can give them stats, you can make them battle, you can do really unique things with them, you can do pretty much whatever you want with them. But right now, the easiest way to think about it, and the most popular way to think about it, is by calling them art, art, art. It's art! Or some type of collectible, or just anything that's unique. Now, they've been getting a ton of buzz recently because we've been seeing more and more of these being sold at insane prices. Like we saw Axe Infinity sell nine plots of their land, nine plots of their unique land, for $1.5 million. We also saw the original creator of the Neon Cat, you know, this cat, <laughs> sold for like 300 ETH. So apparently people really value these things. So like I said, they're just tokens that are deployed on a smart contract platform, and you can view them on different NFT platforms like OpenSea or Rarible. And these are the NFT marketplaces that let people buy and sell them. You obviously can do that without these marketplaces because it's a decentralized, but they help and give a good user interface. Now, like many of you out there, my initial thought to NFTs was, okay, this sounds pretty dumb, but I think that that was dumb. I think art does have a lot of value, and I think that artists are not always paid fairly for what they do. And this is actually a huge issue right now in the modern day world where an artist can make some type of art, people just copy paste it, you know, everywhere and, uh, and they never get attribution for what they made. So having a really easy decentralized royalty mechanism or some type of mechanism where these artists can get accurately comp for what they're doing, I think is really important. I love music. I love movies. Those are pieces of art that I digest and I really like. And I think it's fair for them to get comped appropriately because they are providing value to my life. I think NFTs are a great way to solve this issue as kind of having these decentralized audit trails and, and royalty trails that we can set up and and see really transparently without having to go through some centralized service. So that's the basic gist of it. Let's talk some more about the standards. The ERC-721 standard or the NFT standard. This is the basis of it all. There is another standard that's semi-fungible tokens, the 1155. We're not gonna talk about that here, but you can check it out. The main differences between a 721 and an ERC-20, on ERC-20s they have a really simple mapping between an address and how much that address holds. 721s have unique token IDs. Each token ID has a unique owner. And in addition, they have what's called a token URI, which we'll talk about in a minute. Each token is unique. Each token ID represents a unique asset. So since these assets are unique and we wanna be able to visualize them and show what they actually look like, we need to define those attributes of the object. If it's a piece of art, we need a way to define what that art looks like. If it's some type of character in a game, we need a way to define that character's stats in the the NFT. This is where metadata and token URIs come in. So if you know anything about Ethereum, you know that sometimes gas prices can get pretty high, especially when it comes to storing a lot of space, it can get really, really expensive. So one of your first questions might be, well, are they storing these images and, and these art pieces on chain? And the answer is sometimes. Back when they were coming up with NFTs and artists were deploying stuff, the ETH devs and the artists were like, yeah, art, let's do that art. I'm just gonna deploy this one megabyte image onto the Ethereum chain and oh God, it's so much gas expensive. How do I hit the delete button? How do I? It's not dumb. It's not deleting. <laughs> and they realized that if they put all this art on chain, it was going to be incredibly expensive. So to get around this, what they did is they put in the standard what's called a token URI. This is a universally unique indicator of what that asset or what that token looks like and what the attributes of that token are. And you can use something like a centralized API or IPFS to actually get that token URI. Typical token URI has to return something in this format like this, where it has the name, the image location, the description, and then any attributes below. There is often this talk of on-chain metadata versus off-chain metadata. Because it is so much easier and cheaper to store all your metadata off-chain, a lot of people will use something like IPFS that is decentralized, but 
does take a little bit of centrality to keep persisting, but they can also use their own centralized API. However, obviously, if that goes down, then you lose your image, you lose everything associated with your NFT. Because of this, most NFT marketplaces actually can't and won't read off on-chain attributes or on-chain metadata because they're so used to looking for the token URI. Obviously, if you do off-chain metadata, you can't do anything really cool or really interesting or have any games with your NFTs. For example, if you wanted to create an on-chain Pokemon game, all your attributes would need to be on-chain in order for your Pokemon to interact with each other because if it was off-chain, then that becomes a lot harder to cryptographically prove. So if you're new with NFTs and you're like, wait, this is kind of a lot of information, I'll make it easy for you. If you're looking to render an image of an NFT, add your image to IPFS, add a metadata file pointing to that image file on IPFS, and then grab that token URI and put it and set it as your NFT. The Chainlink D&D article does a great job of walking you through this and showing you how to do this, so be sure to read that if you're looking to learn how to do that. We're not going to cover that in this video, but we will be deploying our first NFT with some on-chain attributes. Again, having your attributes on-chain is really going to allow you to build really creative NFTs that build games or have interesting properties and, and really makes the authenticity of your NFT guaranteed because those attributes are always going to be on chain. All right, so now that we know the basics of approximately what an NFT is, and similar to the ERC-20, you can see the EIP-721 or the ERC-721 non-fungible token standard on the Ethereum EIPs. And once again, if you scroll down, you can see all the different events and the different functions that come with creating this token. And now everything that we're going to do is going to be available at this GitHub repo, this hard hat NFT FCC. We're going to actually go through all the code now to deploying and creating our own customized NFT. And I've labeled this the ultimate NFT repo as part of this course, because we're going to go through a lot here. We're going to go through a basic NFT, a real minimalistic NFT, and then an IPFS hosted NFT that is dynamic and it uses randomness to generate unique NFTs so that we can have provably rare NFTs or provably rare cards or provably rare tokens or stats or whatever you want. And then we're going to do what's called an SVG NFT. These are NFTs that are 100% hosted on chain. So you don't need an off chain. So you don't need IPFS, you don't need an off-chain database. And this one's also going to be dynamic, where it's going to use price feeds in order to fluctuate what the image of the NFT actually looks like based off the price of some asset. And here are the images that we're going to be using. And we obviously have these three adorable doggies here. If you want to follow along with the quick start, you absolutely can. And I'm going to do a quick overview of just running the code to show you what it's going to look like at the end. Basically, what we're going to do is we're going to have our code. We're going to run hardhat deploy dash dash network rink b dash dash tags main. And this is going to deploy all of our contracts and everything. And then finally, if we go to testnets.opensea.io and we grab the address of one of these NFTs, we should be able to put it in here and see our actual NFT as a collection with an item. Or additionally, we can just go right to the contract. We can read the contract, we can get the token URI, and then we can copy the token URI, paste it into our browser or any IPFS, paste it into our browser, and then grab the image attribute and see what this actually looks like on chain. So with all that being said, let's learn how to build this ultimate NFT repo and build all of these different customizable NFTs. Let's jump in. So once again, we're in our terminal, I'm going to create a new directory. We're gonna call it hard hat NFT FCC. We're gonna CD into that NFT FCC, and we're gonna open that up with code dot, or you can hit file, open folder. And at this point, you'll have gotten pretty familiar with the setup of our code bases here. Feel free to copy over or do whatever you wanna do for our setup. We'll do yarn add dash dash dev hard hat. And then while that's loading, I'm gonna copy over my prettier files because I wanna use prettier. I'm gonna copy over my hardhat.config.js. And I'm also going to grab my package.json, copy it over here. I'm going to delete this old package.json. And I'm just going to hit enter on this and rename the one I just copied over from package copy to package.json. And the reason I'm doing this is so that I can just go ahead and run yarn and install all this stuff for me. Or we can just come back over here and just grab this lesson nine hardhat smart contract lottery, all that stuff again. We'll just run that massive piece as well. 
or you can copy over your package to JSON and then just run yarn. That'll do the same thing. Now we don't have to keep doing this boilerplate over and over and over again. And then while that's loading, I'm also going to grab my .env file that we've been using on our past couple projects, the readme.md, and we'll just do what we're going to be doing here. So we're going to make three different contracts. One is going to be a basic NFT using that ERC721 standard. Then we're going to do a random IPFS hosted NFT. And then finally, we're going to do a dynamic SVG NFT. So our random NFT is going to be random at creation time. This is going to give some true scarcity and some true randomness to our NFT. And it's going to be hosted on IPFS. Our dynamic SVG NFT is going to be hosted 100% on chain. And the image of it's going to change based off of some parameters. That's what makes it a dynamic SVG NFT. Let's go ahead. We'll create a new folder. We'll create our contracts folder and we will create our first NFT. This is going to be our basic NFT. And I'm going to go a little bit quick here because most of what we're going to be doing is actually things that we're already familiar with. So we'll do basic NFT.soul in a new file and let's go ahead and let's do it. Let's go ahead. We'll do SPDX license identifier. It's going to be MIT. We'll do Pragma Solidity, carrot 0.8.7, Pragma Solidity, and then we'll do Contract, Basic NFT, and let me just basic NFT.soul like that, and we'll say Contract Basic NFT, and then we'll just run Hardhead Compile or Yarn Hardhead Compile, and it looks like we're doing well here so far. Okay, perfect. Based off of that NFT token standard, if we go back at EIP, we're going to need a whole bunch of different functions here. We're going to need transfer events. We're going to need owner events, balance of, we're going to all these different functions. And we could 100% implement these and, and transfer them exactly like the ERC20 did. Or once again, guess what we can use? You guessed it, we're going to be using Open Zeppelin contracts for this as well. So we come back over to Open Zeppelin, we go over to contracts. And we're going to go ahead and add this with yarn add dash dash dev. So yarn add dash dash dev at open Zeppelin contracts like so. And while that's going through, we can look at the ERC721 of this and we can see what creating a minimalist ERC721 looks like. Now there's a number of extensions that come with this ERC721. In this example that they give us, they're using ERC721 URI storage, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So we've added it in here and now we can actually import that ERC21 from Open Zeppelin in our contract. So we'll do import at Open Zeppelin slash contracts slash token slash ERC721 slash ERC721.soul. They use a different one in the demo, but don't worry about that. And same as the ERC20, we're going to say our basic NFT is ERC721. So we're doing this inheritance. We can find the constructor. We can see this has a constructor where it takes a name and a symbol. So we're going to want to use this constructor in our contract. So we're going to say constructor. And our constructor is just going to be blank. But we'll do the ERC721 constructor. And we'll call this a doggy. And the symbol will be dog, just like that. For our basic NFT, we're just going to have it be this doggy here, right? So it's going to be an NFT of just of purely this dog here. The name is going to be doggy and the symbol is going to be dog. Now, in order to create new dogs, what we're going to do, this open Zeppelin code comes with something called a mint function, exactly the same as the ERC20. So we're going to create a function called mint NFT. This will be a public function and it's going to return a UN 256, and we'll use the safe mint function of this ERC20. We're calling underscore safe mint message dot sender. We'll mint the token to whoever calls this mint function. And then we need to also give this a token ID. If we look at back at the code for the ERC721, and again, you can see this on GitHub as well. We can look at this safe mint function. It takes an address to who is going to own the NFT and then a token ID. What is the ID of the token based off of this address? So if you have a collection of tokens on the same smart contract, each one of them needs their own unique token ID. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a UN256 
private variable called s underscore token counter. And it's going to get initialized in our constructor to zero, but we'll just be explicit and say s token counter equals zero. And then in here, we'll just have the token ID of this new NFT be that token counter. And then of course, we'll say s token counter equals s token counter plus one. So every time we mint a new NFT, we up the token counter. And then we'll just return, we'll just return the new token counter. Um, right. And then obviously at the bottom, we could do like function get token counter. This would be a public view returns UN 256. And I'm going to go a little quick here because you've seen this before. Return S underscore token counter. Right. Since it's a private variable up here, it's a public function down here to get that token counter. So this technically is it. This is technically an NFT. But what does this look like? Well, right now, this NFT isn't going to look like anything at all. In this EIP token standard, it has this thing called a token URI. And this is the important function that tells us exactly what this token is going to look like. Like what we said in the mini lesson here, this token URI returns some type of URL or universal resource identifier that returns some JSON that looks like this. And in this JSON, we're going to have this image part. And this image is going to be a URL that's going to point to what this image actually looks like. Now, this URL could be hosted on chain. It could be hosted in IPFS. It could be hosted really wherever. But ideally, we're not going to use a centralized server to host it. If this is hosted on a Google Cloud or a centralized server or whatever, and our centralized server goes down, well, guess what this NFT is going to look like? It's not going to look like anything. So we want to use some type of decentralized storage to get a URL or a URI to store what this looks like. To make this section a little bit easier for you, I've actually already gone ahead and hosted an image to IPFS for you. It's going to be at IPFS dot dot slash slash. It's going to look like this. This is going to be the image that we're going to use for our dog here. If you create just this image, though, as the token URI, that's not going to work. We need a URI that returns this with the image inside of it. Now for this first section, I've already gone ahead and done that for you as well. And that's going to be located here. This is what our token URI function needs to return. So it's going to have the name, the description, the image URI, which then points to the dog, and then some attributes, et cetera, et cetera. Now you'll notice that the image here is pointing to HTTPS dot dot slash slash IPFS dot IO. The reason I did this was again, just in case you didn't have the IPFS gateway, but this would be a lot better if this was in its IPFS form, because if the, the centralized server IPFS.io goes, ever goes down, this NFT will show what it'll show nothing. So it would be much better if it was instead of IPFS.io, it was IPFS colon slash slash like that instead of IPFS.io. But for now, this is what we're going to be using. And you can just go to the GitHub for this, just to grab this for this section, right? Just go to contracts, basic NFT. You can just grab this, this, this top part, just copy it like that. So we're going to paste that the token URI up at, up the, up at the top, like so. Oh, it should be returns, not return. There we go. Okay, cool. So we're just going to copy paste that in here like this. Like I said, even though the token URI here is pointing directly to IPFS, which is good, if you actually go to this file, the file is actually pointing to HTTP.IPFS.io. Again, for your NFTs, don't do that. For this NFT, I just did that just in case. But for your NFTs, don't do that. And we're going to make this a public constant variable. Why? Well, because this token URI is never going to change. We're going to make this NFT so that everybody who mints one will have this exact same adorable little pug here. And the way we do that now is we need to identify the actual token URI function. So I'm going to do it above get token counter. We're going to say function token URI. And these always take a uint256 token ID. We're going to make this a public view override returns string memory and this needs to return the token uri now this is going to be the most basic way to create this right and if we wanted to make this function a little nicer we'd comment out token id as well since we're actually not using token id but we're overriding in our 
in the ERC721 that we're importing, this has a token ID function or a token URI function, and we're overriding this, right? We're not using this at all. We're saying, hey, we're just going to use our own here. And that's all we need for this to work. And now if you were to deploy this to RinkB, if you were to jump over to OpenSea Testnet and you were to deploy this, this dog, this adorable little pup would be what shows up for all of the mints. So let's go ahead and let's create a little deploy function for this. So we'll do a new folder, deploy, new file. We'll call this 01 deploy basic nft.js. And this is going to look real similar to everything that we've done before. So I'm going to move a little bit quicker here. Const network equals require hard hat const development chains equals require dot dot slash helper hard hat config. And I don't think I added that. So I'm going to copy paste my helper hard hat config from our last project. And if you get confused, you can always just come to the GitHub here and just go to the helper hard hat config and grab it from here. So we have that const development chains. We're going to say const verify equals require dot dot slash utils slash verify. We're also going to grab our utils. I'm going to copy paste our utils folder from our last project. Once again, you can copy paste from your last project, or you can just go straight to the repo, grab the verify.js. Uh, we're going to go over these two functions a little bit later, but at least grab the verified for now. And then we're going to start the function. So we'll do module that exports equals async function, where we're going to get named accounts and deployments. And we're going to say const deploy log equals deployments const deployer equals await get named accounts. So we'll do a little log here just to get started. Do, 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 do. Our basic NFT doesn't take any constructor parameters. So we'll say const args equals a little blank here. Then we'll do const basic NFT equals await deploy basic NFT, exactly what we've seen before a, a number of times at this point. We'll say from deployer, args is going to be args, and then log is going to be true. And then we'll also do wait confirmations. It's going to be network.config.block confirmations or one. Then if we want to verify this, we're going to once again do if it's not development chains dot includes network dot name and process dot env dot ether scan API key. We'll say log verifying dot 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 await verify basic nft dot address arguments, which are going to be blank. And we'll grab this little log here, stick it right underneath. And then actually in our basic NFT, this should be args, not arguments. So now we have a deploy script. Now we have a basic NFT here. You can test out our deploy script by running HH deploy or yarn hardhead deploy. And whoops, let's go back to the basic NFT. Our mint NFT needs to return a uint 256. Let's try again. Get token counter also needs to return a uint. I forget uint anywhere else. Nope. Okay, looking good. And looks like we're compiling well, compiled, deploying well. Now, if you want to deploy this to RinkB, you can. Uh, I recommend holding off though, because we're going to do that at the end. Now that we've written a deploy script, we've written the contract, you already know what's coming next. Yes, neat. What's next is the tests. Now, because we're not actually learning too much more here, I'm not going to walk you through writing this test. I'm going to challenge you now to pause the video and write the test out yourself and see how far in this test you can actually get. Remember, to test it, you're going to want to run yarn hard hat test, right? Let's see if you can actually write the test yourself, then come back to the video, see if your tests were just as good or not as good as what we did here. And of course, you can always go to the GitHub repo test sections. And if you get lost, you can look at the basic nft.test.js to follow along. All right, welcome back. Hopefully you wrote some awesome tests. 
taking the time to actually do some of those exercises is really going to make you a much better engineer. Following along with me is awesome, but tinkering yourself and trying to do everything yourself is really what's going to make this stick. So I hope you did pause the video and I hope you did go ahead and try to write the test for this yourself. You've technically just created a really minimalistic NFT. Great job. Let's kick things up a notch. Let's move now to a random IPFS hosted NFT where we're going to do everything pretty much programmatically. So let's jump in. In our contracts, we're going to create a new file, random IPFS nft.soul. Same thing, SPDX, license identifier, it's going to be MIT, pragma solidity, carrot 0.8.7 or whatever version you want to use. We'll do contract, random IPFS NFT, like so. So what is this one going to do? So instead of just minting any NFT, when we mint an NFT, we will trigger a chain link VRF call to get us a random number. Using that number, we will get, get a random NFT that we're going to decide on. And the random NFT that we're going to use, it's going to be either a pug, a Shiba Inu, or a St. Bernard. So whenever anybody mints an NFT, they're going to get one of these random three dogs. And we're going to make this so that each one of these dogs have a different rarity. We're going to make these dogs rare by different amounts. Say we want the pug to be super rare, the Shiba to be sort of rare, and then the St. Bernard to be pretty common. So pug is going to be super rare, Shiba Inu is going to be sort of rare, St. Bernard is going to be pretty common, right? Or the most common, if you will. So let's go ahead and, and start building this. We're probably going to have to make a function called like request NFT because we're going to know that we're going to need to kick off a chain link VRF request. We're probably going to have to make a function fulfill random words. It's going to take a UN256 request ID and a UN256 array memory random words. As we've seen before, we've done fulfill random words in the past. And let's let's even go one step further. We'll make it so that users have to pay to mint an NFT. So this is going to be they have to pay a certain amount of ETH to get the NFT. And then the owner of the contract can withdraw the ETH. So we're basically paying the artist here. We're paying the artist to create these NFTs. And then they can be the ones to actually actually withdraw the payment for all these NFTs. And we're also going to need, of course, a function token URI, which takes a UN256. And this is once again, same as our basic NFT going to be what this token actually looks like. So let's go ahead and get started creating this. Now because these red lines are going to draw me crazy, um, we're going to add some visibility here. We'll make this request NFT public, fulfill random words, we actually know from the past is going to be internal token URI is going to be public. Let's build this request NFT. And again, to request a random number, go back to EVM chains, we can go to using randomness, we can follow along with the docs.chain.link again, to figure out how to get this random number. So since we know we're going to be working with Chainlink, we want to add at Chainlink slash contracts. So back in in our code base, we'll add that in yarn add dash dash dev at Chainlink slash contracts. Like so, which is perfect. And we can go ahead and we're going to import that VRF consumer base V2 and the VRF coordinator interface into our code because we know we're going to use both of these. If you want to just copy paste from the docs, you absolutely can. If you want to pause here. And since we're going to be using this VRF consumer base, we want to inherit it. We're going to say random IPFS NFT is VRF consumer base V2. And this little little wiggly line will show up here saying this needs to be override. So I'm just going to go ahead and add override here. And this little wiggly line is going to stay there for a little bit until we implement the rest of the functions. So let's go ahead and implement the rest of those functions. Request NFT, of course, is going to be public here. And in order for us to request an NFT, we're going to need to call the coordinator dot request random words where we pass all this stuff in, right? So let's go ahead and get all this stuff for our VRF coordinator in our constructor. So let's create a new constructor, constructor, and we're going to use the VRF consumer base v2 constructor to use to create our constructor. 
The VRF consumer base V2 needs an address in here for the VRF consumer base. So we'll go ahead and we'll do address VRF coordinator V2. And then we'll pass this to the VRF consumer base constructor here. Just by adding that, that red squiggly line has gone away from me. Perfect. And we want to save that address to a global variable so that we can call request random words on it. So we're going to go ahead up here. We're going to say I underscore VRF coordinator. We're going to make this a mutable VRF coordinator. And we're going to do it by saying VRF V2 interface. It's going to be private immutable VRF coordinator. And then in our constructor here, we're going to say I VRF coordinator equals VRF coordinator V2 interface wrapped around this like so. So we know we're going to need this. We know we're actually going to need a ton of these. So let's just add all these variables in here. So we're going to need a coordinator. We're going to need a uint64 private immutable i underscore subscription ID. We're going to need a bytes32 private immutable i underscore gas lane. We're going to need a uint32 private immutable i underscore callback gas limit. We're going to need a uint16 private constant request confirmations. We're going to say it's going to be three. And then a uint32 private constant equals num words, which is going to be one. And we'll get this red squiggly line saying it's mad at our, our constructor here. So let's go ahead and, and add all of our immutable variables in our constructor. So we'll get the VRF coordinator v2 from our constructor. We'll get the uint64 subscription ID. We'll get the bytes32 gas lane, aka the key hash. We'll get the uint256. We'll do a uint32 callback gas limit. And then we'll go ahead and do I subscription ID equals subscription ID. We'll do I gas lane equals gas lane. We'll do I callback gas limit equals call back gas limit. Okay, a lot of variables set up, but those are the variables that we're going to need for the chain link VRF. Now we have all these variables. Down in our request NFT, we can request a random number to get for our random NFT. We're going to say uh, returns a UN256 request ID. So in here, we'll say request ID, this request ID that we just initialized, I underscore VRF coordinator dot request random words. And this should look pretty familiar to what we did in our lottery, I underscore gas lane, comma, I underscore subscription ID, comma, request confirmations, I underscore callback gas limit. And then of course, num words, and we can just literally copy paste this from the documentation or from our last project, whatever you want to do. So we are requesting this random NFT here. Now, here's the thing, though, we want whoever called this request function, it to be their NFT, right? And if we saw in our basic NFT, when we minted the NFT, we called this safe mint, which needed the owner and the token counter. When we request a random number for our NFT, it's going to happen in two transactions, right? We're going to request. And then later on, we're going to fulfill. And it's going to be the chain link node that's calling fulfill random words. So if in the fulfill function, we just do this safe mint message that sender, the owner of our this NFT is actually going to be the chain link node that fulfilled our random words. So we don't want that. What we want to do is we want to create a mapping between request IDs and whoever called this so that when we call fulfill random words, which returns with that exact same request ID, we can say, ah, okay, your request ID X, you belong to the person who called this request NFT. We're going to create a mapping between people who called this and their request IDs so that when we fulfill random words, we can properly assign 
the dogs to them. So up at the top, create underneath here, I'm going to call them VRF helpers. We're going to create a mapping of UN256 to an address. We'll make this public, which we should make it private, but we'll just make it public. S underscore request ID to sender. And then when we call this request NFT, we'll set the request ID to sender of request ID equals to message dot sender. Now, when the chain link node responds with fulfill random words, what we can do is we can say address dog owner or the NFT dog owner is going to be equal to s request ID to sender of request ID. This way, it's not going to be the chain link nodes that are going to own the dog, but it's going to be whoever actually called request NFT. Okay, cool. So we have a way to request a random number for our random NFT. Now let's go ahead and mint this random dog, this random NFT for this for this user. So we have the user now using this mapping. What else do we need? Well, we're going to need the token counter here. Let's go ahead and we'll create a token counter variable. So we'll scroll up. I'll make a new section. And we'll say UN256. And then again, we'll just make a lot of these public just to make it easier. But you might want to make this private and use that same syntax we were doing before. We'll do S underscore since this is a stored variable. Token counter. And we'll grab this token counter. And we'll say UN256 new token ID equals S token counter. Now that we have the dog owner and the token ID, we can go ahead and mint this NFT. So we'll do safe mint dog owner, new token ID. And then safe mint is going to be squiggly because our code is going to say, uh, what is this? What is this safe mint function? Where did you get this from? Well, we're going to need to get it from open Zeppelin again. So we're going to need to go ahead and do import at open Zeppelin slash contracts slash token slash ERC 721 slash ERC 721.sol. We'll say our random IPFS NFT is VRF consumer base and also ERC 721 in our constructor. Right after our VRF consumer base, we're going to put the ERC 721. And same thing, we need to give it a name and a symbol. So we'll call this random IPFS NFT, comma, we'll just do RIN for random IPFS NFT. And now SafeMint actually works. And then it's going to be mad at me for this. So I'm going to do override just so that it stops getting mad at me. Public view override returns string memory, just so that squiggly line goes away. Okay, cool. So great. So now we can safe mint to the dog owner this new token ID. Are we done with this? Absolutely not. Why not? Well, we don't know what this token looks like. And what we said above is we want to actually make these dogs different rarities. So how do we actually create these dogs with different rarities? Well, what we could do is we create a chance array, an array to show the different chances of these different dogs here. So down below, we're going to create a function, and it's going to be a public pure function called get chance array. And this is going to return a uint 256 of size three in memory. And this chance array is going to represent the different chances of the different dogs. So we're going to say return 10, 30, 100, or we're going to say max chance value. And up at the top under NFT variables, we're going to say uint 256 internal constant max chance value equals 100. So by making this array, we're saying index zero has a 10% chance of happening. We're saying index one has a 20% chance of happening because it's going to be 30 minus 10. And then we're saying index two is going to have a 60% chance of happening because it's going to be 10 plus 30 minus this 100 this array that identified the percentages of the different dogs. So we're saying the pug is going to have a 10% chance, Shiba Inu a 20% chance, and the St. Bernard a 70% chance. We're going to use it to give this token ID that we just minted 
it's dog breed. So we're gonna create a new function called get breed from modded RNG. And the reason we're calling it get breed from modded RNG is exactly the same way in our lottery, we got a random number. We're gonna say uint 256 modded RNG equals random words of zero mod max chance value. We're gonna mod any number we get by 100. Doing it like this, we're always gonna get a number between zero and 99. If random words zero mod max chance value is gonna be seven, that means we're gonna get a pug. If we get 88, that means we're gonna get a Saint Bernard. If we get a 45, we're gonna get a what? That's right, a Saint Bernard. If we get a 12, we're getting a Shiba Inu. If the modded number that we get by modding this random word is between zero and 10, it's gonna be pug. Between 10 and 30, Shiba Inu. Between 30 and 100, St. Bernard, and that's how we get these randomness values. So now that we have this modded RNG, we have this modded number that's gonna be between zero and 99, we'll create this function called get breed from modded RNG. And this is gonna take the UN256 modded RNG. We'll make this a public pure function and it's gonna return the breed of the dog. Now the breed of the dog is gonna be an enum similar to raffle state that we did before. We're gonna do this right at the top, since this is gonna be what? A type declaration. We're gonna say enum breed. We're gonna say the zeroth number is gonna be the pug. The oneth number is gonna be the shiba in you. And then the second one is gonna be the Saint Bernard. So we have the pug, which is zero to 10, shiba in you, 10 to 30, Saint Bernard, 30 to 100. So get breed from modded RNG, public pure returns a breed. So we're gonna loop through this. We're gonna say uint 256 cumulative sum equals zero. We'll say uint 256 size three memory chance array equals get chance array. So we're getting that chance array. So we're gonna create a little for loop. We're gonna say four uint 256 i it's going to start with zero i is going to be less than the chance array dot length i plus plus so we're going to do that for loop here and we're going to say if modded rng is greater than or equal to this cumulative sum and modded rng is less than the cumulative sum plus chance array, plus wherever we are on the chance array, then return breed of i. And then outside of this, we're gonna say cum cumulative sum plus equals chance array of i. Let's say modded RNG equals 25. And if it's 25, it should be a Shiva Inu because that's between 10 and 30. So we're saying if modded RNG, which is 25, is greater than or equal to cumulative sum, which right now is zero, and it's less than, and the modded RNG is less than the cumulative sum plus the chance array of i, which is going to be 10, return breed of i. Cumulative sum is currently zero plus chance array of i, which is 10, is gonna be 10. And this is not true because modded RNG is 25. So since this is not true, we're gonna to move to the second step, which is just cumulative sum plus equals chance array. So cumulative sum will now be equal to 10, and then we reach the end of the for loop. So we restart, i is now one. So let's try this again. Modded RNG is greater than or equal to cumulative sum. Okay, that is true. Cumulative sum is 10, modded RNG is 25, and modded RNG is less than cumulative sum plus chance array of i, which is 30. So we're saying 25 is less than 10 plus 30, which is 40, return breed of i. This is true. So breed of i would be true, and i at the moment is one. And if we scroll up, that's indeed the Shiba Inu. So that's how this function is, is gonna work. It's gonna get us the breed from that modding bit. And then if for some reason, some really wacky stuff happens here, we wanna just go ahead and add a revert, right? Because we should be returning a breed uh, but if we don't return a breed, we should just revert. 
So we're going to create a new error at the top. Random IPFS NFT underscore underscore range out of bounds. And then down below, we're just going to say, if for some reason you don't return anything, just do a revert random IPFS NFT range out of bounds. And now we have this function. Okay, so now we can get the brief from a modded RNG. So back in our fulfill random words function, let's go ahead and we'll say, we'll uncomment this, we'll say breed dog breed equals get breed from modded RNG. We'll pass the modded RNG here and let's move this safe mint down below us getting the dog breed just so we can mint and, and add the dog breed at the same time. So we're gonna go ahead and safe mint here. Now we could do a few things to set this dog breed here. We could create a mapping between the dog breed and the token URI and then have that reflected in this token URI function. Or what we could do is we could just call a function called set token URI. In the open Zeppelin ERC721, you have to set this token URI function yourself. However, there is an extension in the open Zeppelin code called ERC721 URI storage. And this version of the ERC721 comes with a function called set token URI, where we can just call set token URI and this will automatically update that token's token URI to whatever you set it as. So we're gonna use this extension, this set token URI in our contract. And the way that we do this is instead of doing token ERC721, ERC721.soul, we'll do token ERC721 slash extensions slash ERC721 URI storage dot soul. And we'll say random IPFS is ERC721 URI storage. Now what's cool is that our constructor will still just use ERC721 because ERC721 URI storage is extending ERC721. And then this contract just comes with some additional functions like set token URI. So right after safe mint, we're actually gonna call set token URI with this new item ID. And then we're gonna give it that breeds token URI. We're gonna give it a string here that relates to whatever breed that we just got based off the dog breed here. Now, to do this, what we could do is right at the top in our NFT variables, we could create a string array internal called s dog token URIs. We can make this constant where it would just be this array of all these strings that we created. But maybe in our code, we wanna make this a little bit more variable and we wanna parameterize this. And that's exactly what we're gonna do. So we're gonna create this string array, internal s underscore dog token URIs, which is just gonna be a list of these URLs or these URIs that point to stuff like this. We're gonna do that in our code so that when we upload any image that we want to IPFS, we can then upload this sdog token URIs accordingly. In our constructor, we're actually gonna take in another parameter called a, a string of size three, memory dog token URIs. We're gonna pass as a constructor parameter these different dog token URIs. So we're gonna pass this list of dog token URIs. Of course, zero is going to be the token URI of the pug. One is going to be the Shiba Inu. And two, of course, is going to be the St. Bernard. So we're going to pass it this list of dog token URIs. And then down in set token URI, from that, that list that we created, we're going to set the token URI of this token based off of that array of the Uint256 version of that breed. We're casting this dog breed back into UN256 to get its index. With that, we now have a way to actually programmatically get a provably random NFT with different randomness for different one of these NFTs. Now let's go back up to our little, our little comments we made here. We minted NFT, we trigger a chain link VRF to call a random number. We got the rarities down, we got the minting down, awesome. Okay, we don't have this part though. 
Users have to pay to mint an NFT and the owner of the contract can withdraw the ETH. Okay, this is stuff we've already done before. This should be pretty familiar here. So back in our request NFT function, we'll make this a public payable and all we'll need to do is we'll just say if message.value is less than some mint fee. And actually let's go back to our constructor. We'll create a mint fee, UN256, mint fee. And then we'll do UN256 internal I underscore mint fee. We'll make this immutable. And then we'll just say I mint fee equals mint fee. If message.value is less than mint fee, you already know we're gonna do a revert need more ETH sent and we'll create a new error called need more ETH sent. And actually we'll do error random I PFS NFT underscore underscore need more ETH sent like that. We'll copy this, paste it here and boom. So now just by adding this line, this is now a payable function and people have to pay some mint fee to mint their randomized NFT. Now we're also going to want a way for our owner to withdraw. So we'll scroll down a little bit. We'll scroll down to here, we'll create function withdraw. This will be public. And we only want the owner to do this. So we could create our modifier, you know, our modifier again, only owner, or what we could do is use open Zeppelin again, open Zeppelin also comes with some access code, where one of them is this ownable code. And in here, it already has the only owner modifier for us. We're just going to go ahead and import that as well. So we'll do import at open Zeppelin slash contracts slash access slash ownable dot soul. And we'll say contract random IPFS NFT is this is this comma ownable. And then we'll make our withdrawal function only owner. And so whoever deployed this contract is going to be set to being the owner, which is what we want. Now in here, same as what we've done, we'll do UN 256 amount equals address this dot balance. And then we'll do bool success comma equals payable message dot sender dot call value is going to be amount. And then we're going to call nothing. And then we're going to say if not success, then we're going to revert with transfer failed. And then up top, we're going to do error transfer failed. And I'm just going to copy this make it a little quicker, like so, and then come back down to transfer failed, paste it here. So we're going to revert random IPFS NFT transfer failed. Perfect. So now we have a withdrawal function and a way for people to pay for our art here. Now we don't need this token URI anymore. Because when we call set token URI, this is going to set the token URI for us because in the back ERC 721 URI storage already has that function laid out. So our contract will already have the token URI function and we don't have to explicitly set it ourselves, but we do have to explicitly set some other ones. We are going to need function get mint fee. This will be a public view returns you int 256 turn I mint fee. We'll need function get dog token URIs, UN256 index. This will be a public view, which will returns the string memory, turn S underscore dog token URIs of index. We'll need function get token counter. This will be a public view, returns UN256. Return S underscore token counter. All right, so we just wrote a ton of code here. And of course, as we taught you before, we also are gonna need some events. So when we request an NFT, we're gonna emit an event. So we'll emit NFT requested, and then we'll pass it the request ID and the message.sender. So up at the top, we'll say event NFT requested. This will pay, take a UN256 indexed request ID and then an address requester. And then we're also going to make an event for NFT minted for when it's finally minted. And it's going to take a breed, dog breed, and an address minter. So write down when we fulfill, we're going to emit NFT minted. 
and it's going to take that dog breed and then the dog owner. Okay, we've just written a lot of code here. <laughs> so let's go ahead and see if we can compile this with HH compile or yarn hardhead compile. And wow, looks like we went ahead and compiled it. This is great. So all of our code now looks good. Now might be a good time to take a quick breather. We've just written a lot of code and it might be good to just go over all the stuff that we just went through. A lot of this is familiar, but it's still really good to redo some of this stuff and really get that muscle memory in for these. Create an NFT contract that when you mint one of these NFTs, you're gonna get a Pug, a Shiba Inu, or a St. Bernard based off of some rarity, where the Pug is really rare, Shiba Inu is sort of rare, and the St. Bernard is pretty common. The way we do it is we have this request NFT function, which people have to pay to call, and it makes a request to a chain link node to get a random number. Once our contract gets that random number, it uses a chance array to figure out which one of the NFTs we're gonna actually use for this for that minting. And we're gonna set the token URI accordingly. And we're gonna store the image data for this on IPFS, which we haven't done yet. So our deploy function for this is gonna be really the interesting part of this contract. But because we just went over so much, if you wanna take a quick break, quick breather, and then come back, I encourage you to do so. We just learned a lot and we wrote a lot of Solidity code. So go take a quick breather and I'll see you in a minute. So let's go ahead and get on in here, create a new deploy, O2, deploy, random, ipfs.js. And now this is gonna look really similar once again to the lottery contract that we've already done. And we can then copy some boilerplate from our code over here. We're gonna need all this. So we'll just copy that, close it off with a little curly and boom, we've already got our boilerplate. Now, since we're working with Chainlink here, we are gonna be working with mocks again. So we're gonna come back, new file, 00, zero deploy mocks.js. And if you want, you can just copy paste from the earlier section that we did with the, with the raffle slash lottery, since we're gonna be doing the exact same thing here. I'm gonna go ahead and pause and you can copy paste from your previous projects. Or if you want, once again, you can just come to the GitHub repo associated with this course, come over to the deploy and go ahead and grab the deploy mocks right from here. If you grab from the GitHub repo, we also are gonna be working with a mock V3 aggregator, but I'm not gonna add that part in quite yet because we don't need it quite yet. So go ahead and pause the video right now, copy paste the VR coordinator mock, or pause the video and try to write the mock code yourself. Okay, great. So once you've done that, we're of course gonna need the const chain ID, network.config.chain ID, because we're gonna to need to decide if we're actually on a development chain. So same as what we did before then, we're gonna say if development chains.includes network.name, then we're gonna say const brf coordinator v2 mock equals await ethers.get contract brf core denator v2 mock. Similar to the raffle, we're gonna say let brf coordinator v2 address. We'll say the brf coordinator v2 address equals brf coordinator v2 mock dot address. And then we're gonna to wanna to create a subscription, exactly the same as what we did with our lottery. So we're gonna say const tx equals await brf coordinator v2 mock dot create subscription. And then we'll do const tx receipt equals await tx dot wait one. And we're gonna get the sub ID from this exactly the same way we did it in the lottery section. So we'll say, and then we need that sub ID by saying subscription ID. We'll say subscription ID equals TX receipt dot events zero dot args dot sub ID. So that's what we do if we're on a development chain. Else, we'll say the VRF coordinator v2 address equals network config of the chain ID dot VRF coordinator v2. And then the subscription ID equals network config of chain ID dot subscription ID. Perfect. 
And then we'll just double check our helper hardhat config. So that Rinkby has both the VRF coordinator v2. And we're also going to need a subscription ID. So right now I have our subscription ID from our past project from our lottery project, but we can go ahead to vrf.chain.link. We can go to vrf.chain.link can make sure we're on rink B here and see our other subscriptions. And it looks like we have one here. So I'm going to copy this and paste it in for rink B. Now, again, we can go over to docs.chain.link evm chains contract addresses for using randomness to see more parameters in here uh, especially for rink b and make sure these are all correct we have our subscription here we'll add a new consumer very soon once we deploy this contract if we're actually going to use rink b so we'll do a little log here with a bunch of hyphens we'll now get const args equals we'll make our arguments here and what do we need we need the coordinator, subscription, gas lane, callback address, dog your dog token URIs, and a mint fee. So we're gonna need VRF coordinator v2 address, subscription ID. We'll need the network config chain ID dot gas lane. We'll need the network config chain ID dot mint fee. Then we'll need network config chain ID dot callback gas limit. Is that the right order? Yes, it is. And then we need the dog token URIs and the mint fee. Put that down here. Now, what do we not have? We don't have this array of token URIs. Now we could do this one of a couple ways. If you go to the GitHub repo associated with this, go to deploy. We actually did the randomness for 03 in the Git here. There's one section where we just automatically say, okay, great, token URIs is just going to be these three. And then if we can actually even copy paste these, see these on IPFS. These are the better ones that actually do have the IPFS as the image. And we can see them like that. So we could just use the stuff that I've already deployed. And if you want to do that, you absolutely 100% can. Or what we could do is we could actually learn to upload programmatically our own images to IPFS. That sounds a lot cooler. <laughs> so let's go ahead and do that. Now, what I want you to do, if you wanna use your own images for this, feel free to do so. But if you wanna just follow along with us, then we're gonna to go to the Hardhat NFT FCC repo and we're gonna grab these random NFTs from here. So what you can do is you can come to here and we can go ahead, we can right click, save image as, we'll save it to our downloads. Let's actually create a new folder. We'll call it images. In the images, we'll create a new folder called random. And then we can pull it just right into here. I'm gonna make the name random NFT. And this is just gonna be pug.png. So we can do that for all of our images. Now in our images tag, we have the pug, Shiba Inu, and St. Bernard. So we have these locally, but we want to upload these to IPFS. We want to upload them in a way that anybody can actually pin them and work with them. So before we do all this stuff, before we get the arguments to deploy this contract, we're going to need to get the IPFS hashes of our images. And there's a couple of ways we could do this. We could do it with our own IPFS node, which I've already shown you how to do that manually. We could also do that programmatically. Now, I'm not going to show you how to do this here. However, if you go through the IPFS documentation, you actually can learn how to do it through the command line and even through some scripts. However, if we're the only node that's running this, again, it's kind of centralized. So ideally, we'd want these images and these token URIs and this, and this token metadata on our own IPFS node and some other nodes. So the second way that we want, can look at this is using something like Pinata. Pinata is a service that basically you just pay to help pin NFT for you. And this is going to be the one that we're going to be looking at here. Now, the issue with Pinata, of course, is that we're just paying one single centralized entity to go ahead and pin our data. We're kind of trusting that they're actually going to pin it and that they're not going to go down. The final way that we could look into actually pinning our data is with this thing called nft.storage. nft.storage uses the Filecoin network on the back end to pin our data. Now Filecoin is a blockchain dedicated to pinning IPFS data and storing decentralized data for us. The process is a little bit more complicated. 
Uh, but nft.storage makes it really, really easy. Now, we're not going to go over using nft.storage in this video. However, if you want to look into nft.storage for pinning your data, in the GitHub repo associated with this course, we do have a script that uploads your code to nft.storage called in the utils folder, upload to NFT storage. And if you want to go and try it out, I recommend that you do so. Working with nft.storage will be one of the most persistent ways to keep our data up, but it's still good to upload your own data to your own IPFS node, which we've learned how to do manually, and at least get one other person also pinning your data. And then ideally an entire decentralized network pinning your data, which is what nft.storage helps you do. But for now, for us, we're just gonna work with Pinata, keep it nice and simple for this video. And then uploading, uploading our metadata and our token URIs up to IPFS will give us this list of token URIs for our three dogs. So up at the top here, we're gonna do a little if. We're gonna say if process.env dot upload to Pinata equals true. Yes, we're gonna use the string true like that. Then we're gonna upload to Pinata. Above here, we're gonna say let token URIs and we're gonna say token URIs equals await handle token URIs. And we're gonna create a function called handle token URIs, which is gonna upload our code to Pinata. Down outside of this, we're gonna create a new function called async function handle token URIs. And this is gonna return an array of token URIs for us to upload to our smart contract. We're gonna say token URIs equals this. And then way at the bottom, we're gonna say return token URIs, right? So we're gonna be returning this array here. Now we need to do two things. We need to both store the image in IPFS, and then we need to store the metadata in IPFS. So first we're gonna create a store images function. And this is where we're gonna actually gonna to go to our utils and we're gonna create a new folder in here. We're gonna create a file called new file, upload to pinata.js. We're gonna add all of our code for actually uploading to Pinata in here, right? Because again, Pinata is this service that we're gonna be using to just pin data for us. Now to work with Pinata, we can go ahead, try for free, and we can create our own application. And we're good to go. You'll see the setup here, looks really similar to an IPFS node because that's essentially what Pinata is. It's just an IPFS node run by somebody else. And we can say, hey, can you please pin this data for us? So a manual way we could do this is we could just hit upload CID just like an IPFS node and put the hash of some IPFS file and Pinata would pin it for us. We could also upload a file or a folder just like an IPFS node. But for us, we're just gonna leave this blank because we're gonna wanna do this programmatically because we're engineers. So what we can do is we can come over to our profile, we'll open up API keys and documentation. And the documentation pretty much has everything that we need to get started. If you scroll down to the Panada Node.js SDK, this is basically what we're gonna be working with. They've already created an SDK for us that we can work with. We're gonna go ahead and install this Panada SDK. So they're using npm install dash dash save. We're just gonna go ahead and use yarn add dash dash dev at Pinata dash SDK. And they have all these different endpoints we can call to actually pin data. We're gonna be doing pin file to IPFS because we're gonna upload our files and also pin JSON to IPFS. Since JSON is gonna be the metadata and file is gonna be the actual image. And if you click on it, it'll even give you kind of the output of the SDK here. So back in our code, now that we've downloaded this, we can go ahead and start creating this. So we'll say const Pinata SDK equals require at Pinata slash SDK. And then we'll create a function, async function called store images. It'll take an images file path. So we're gonna use this function. We'll pass it our images, random NFT file paths, and we're gonna have it store everything in that folder. To help us work with paths, we're also gonna install this path package. So we're gonna do yarn add dash dash dev path, like so. We're just gonna work with FS as well, not FS extra. So now that that's up, we're gonna say const path equals require path. And in here, we're gonna say const full images path equals path.resolve images file path. 
So if we give that like dot slash images slash random, you know, NFT or whatever, this will just give a, give you the full output of the path. So we're getting the full images path. And then we'll say, we'll get those files by doing const files equals FS. So we'll do, we'll grab S, we'll say const FS equals require FS just to read these files in here. Dot read dir sync, which is going to read the entire directory and get our files back. So read dir sync full images path. And to actually test that this is working, what we're going to do is we're going to do module dot exports equals store images. And then back in our deploy script here, we can just go ahead and, you know, comment out args and we can do hit import the const store images equals require dot dot slash utils slash upload to Panada. And in this script, we could just do a little, we could just call this, we could say await store images, and then we'll pass, we'll pass our images location. So maybe way at the top, even outside of the function, we'll say const images location equals dot slash images slash random NFT. So we'll do await store images like that. And we should be able to run hardhead deploy. Then if we add some tags to this deploy thing, module.exports.tags equals, we'll say all random IPFS and then main, we can do hard hat deploy dash dash tags, random IPFS. We'll also do mocks, I believe. And I need to create a test folder in here, a new folder, test. And we need to add that VRF coordinator v2 mock in here. So again, I'm just copy pasting the VRF coordinator v2 mock from our raffle project. Feel free to pause, copy paste that over. Or again, everything's available on the GitHub. So we'll try one more time. Tags, random IPFS, and mocks. And boom. Okay, mocks deployed and perfect. Pug.png, Shiba Inu PNG, St. Bernard PNG. Great. So we're getting the files correctly here. Now let's create a little array for responses from the pinata server. So we'll say responses equals this, and we'll say for each file index in files, for each one of these files in here, we're gonna say const readable stream for file equals fs.create read stream of the full images path slash files of file index. So what is this line doing? Well, we're creating a read stream. Since this is an image file, it doesn't work exactly the same as just like push this data, right? We have to create a stream where we stream all the data inside of these images. Because these images, even though they're just like a cute little image here, they're really this kind of this big file with all this bytes and all this data in here. And then we're gonna send it by doing try, we'll say const response equals await. And this is where we're gonna do Pinata stuff. If we go back to the Pinata docs, there's some stuff about keys in here. What we can do, if you go to your profile, go to API keys, we can create a new key. We'll say this is an admin key, why not? We'll give it all the pinning access here. Maybe you'll give it this, maybe we'll just give it everything, whatever you wanna do. And then we'll call this hard hat free code camp key, create key. Now we're gonna to wanna to grab these and drop these into a .env. So the API key, go ahead and copy, come back over here, open up our .env, and we're gonna call it our Pinata, Pinata API key equals that key. We're gonna grab the API secret and say Pinata API secret equals that key. We don't need this massive token here for what we're gonna do, but if you want it, you can absolutely have it. And then outside of our store images, we're going to say const Pinata API key equals process dot env dot Pinata API key. And then const Pinata API secret equals process dot env dot Pinata API secret. And then we'll say const Pinata equals Pinata. SDK 
of Pinata API key, comma, Pinata API secret. In order to work with Pinata, we need to pass it an API key and an API secret so that Pinata knows, ah, it's us who's working with them. So once we've initialized this Pinata thing, we can now run Pinata dot and then do some Pinata stuff, right? We want to work with this pin file to IPFS, which takes this readable stream, which is why we created that readable stream. So Pinata dot pin file to IPFS of readable stream or file. And then we're going to push this response onto our responses array. So we'll say responses dot push response. And then we're going to catch error just in case there's some weird error here. And we'll just say console dot log error. And then we're going to return responses and files. So we're going to return all the responses from pushing all these files up and then the files as well. Now, at this current point, we can go ahead and actually test this out ourselves. So we have this in here. If we go back to our deploy, at the top, we have this if process.env.upload to pinata equals true. Do this stuff here, uploading to IPFS. And the final thing we need to do in here, of course, is going to be require.env.config so that we can pull in our .env file. Yeah, down here, we're just doing await store images. So we, if we run this as is, it should go ahead and store our images. So let's run that same command, hard hat deploy, random IPFS, and the mocks to run this store images command. And if we come back to our Pinata, after we run it, we'll be able to see the code uploaded here. If we run now this script, loading to IPFS, it'll give us a little bit of a delay because it needs to upload these big picture files to IPFS or more correctly, Pinata. So I'm gonna say uploading to Pinata. And then we could even say console.log working on file index, dot, 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 like so. And okay, great. It looks like it finished running. So if we come back to our project here and we do a little refresh, we see our three files have been uploaded and we see they each come with their own CID. Now, if you want, you can go ahead and copy the CID. And if you have your IPFS node, what you can do, what we can do is actually, we can hit import from IPFS, paste it in here, and we can say exactly what this is, which is IPFS dot dot slash slash. That's the St. Bernard. Call it St. Bernard. Import. And now we'll have it pinned on our IPFS. Ta-da! I've got mine saved in a little puppy's file. Now that we've got them uploaded into Pinata, I do actually recommend you pin your own on your own node as well. So cool. So we've got a way to get those images up onto IPFS. Awesome. Onto now that we've done that, we're also going to need to store the token URI metadata. So let's go ahead and we'll delete that for now. What we can do back in here is back up at the top again. We can say const metadata template equals, and we'll create a metadata template. This is going to have all the basics of what we need for our metadata for our token URI. So in here, we'll have a name, set it as blank. We'll have a description, which we'll also set as blank. We'll have the image, which this is going to be replaced with the image URI, that IPFS URI we just created. And if you want to give your NFT like any types of stats, you can do some, you can create this attributes section like so, and you can give it like trait type, cuteness, comma, value 100. And this is how, if you want to create like different cards or have different attack, defense, HP, speed, you know, different, different stats for your NFTs, you would add them in this attributes section. Typically, you'd want these attributes also stored on chain so your contracts can obviously programmatically interact with these attributes. But so now we have this metadata template. This is what we're going to fill out for each one of our doggies. We're going to create a new function in here called async store token URI metadata. And we'll pass in the metadata. This will be async function. And we'll pass in the metadata that we get from our script over here. We have this little template here, and we're going to populate this template based off of 
what we get from storing data into IPFS. So now we're going to write the rest of this handle token URIs bit. And so we're going to want to do in our dot env, we're going to say upload to pinata equals true so that we can do everything in handle token URIs. So upload to pinata is true. We'll scroll down, we'll start creating this. So the first thing we got to do, obviously, we're going to want to get those responses and those files, right? Because it's in the responses, pin file to IPFS is going to return the hash of the file, right? And we need that hash to add to our metadata. So what we're going to do is down here, we're going to say const responses, which is going to be image upload responses, comma files equals await store images and then images location. And so this responses is going to be a list of these responses from Pinata. And these responses are going to have the hash of each one of these uploaded files. So now we're going to loop through that list and upload each of the metadata. So we're going to say for each image upload response index in image upload responses. For each one of these, we're going to create the metadata, we're going to create metadata, and then upload the metadata. So we're going to say let token URI metadata equals dot 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 metadata template. So this is some fun JavaScript syntactic sugar, which kind of means like unpack. So basically, we're saying token URI metadata is going to be equal to this stuff, we're sticking all this stuff into this token URI metadata variable. Now we're going to say token URI metadata dot name is going to be equal to files of of the index dot replace dot PNG dot PNG with nothing. So files is going to be each one of those files, right? It's going to be pug dot PNG and be St. Bernard dot PNG and it's going to be Shiva dot PNG. And basically, all we're doing is we're saying, okay, cool, the name inside of our token metadata is just going to be pug. So we're just going to drop the extension, basically. So that's how we're going to get the name token URI metadata dot description is going to be equal to an adorable. And then we're just going to get the name token URI metadata dot name. So it's going to be an adorable pug pup, an adorable St. Bernard pup, or an adorable Shiba Inu pup. Token URI metadata dot image, which is probably the most important one here. This is going to be, it's going to be that IPFS extension with the IPFS hash that we get from the response. So we can get that by doing image upload responses of the image upload response index dot I IPFS hash. We can go to the Pinata docs and we can see pin file to IPFS returns an IPFS hash, the pin size and the timestamp. All we care about is the IPFS hash. And we're going to use that to give the, our metadata image here. And then finally, I'll do a little console.log uploading, and then we'll say token URI metadata dot name dot dot dot. And now we'll have to store the file or store, store the JSON to Pinata slash IPFS. And this is where in our upload to Pinata bit here, we're going to add this function here. So we have store token URI metadata. And all we're going to do in here is we're going to say try const response equals await Pinata dot pin JSON to IPFS of the metadata, right? And again, we have we want pin JSON to IPFS, which is going to be really similar. So we need to pass the body, which is going to be the JSON. And we have some optional stuff here, but it's going to give us the same return, the IPFS hash, pin size and timestamp. And then if this works well, we're just going to do return response. Otherwise, we'll do catch error. And then we'll just do console.log error. And then we'll just do return null. And then we'll export store token URI metadata. And then back in our deploy, we'll go ahead and import this store token URI metadata. And we'll scroll down and we'll do const metadata upload response equals await store token URI metadata, where we pass the token URI metadata. 
And now, finally, and now with all of these metadata being uploaded, we're finally going to have the token URIs that we need. So we'll say token URIs dot push IPFS slash slash, and then the metadata response here, metadata upload response dot IPFS hash. So we finally will have this array of IPFS hashes that points to the metadata and each one of these metadata are pointing to the image. And then we'll do a little console.log token URIs uploaded. They are, and then we'll do another little console.log token URIs. Ooh, all right. So let's go ahead and run this and let's see if it works. In our Pinata, we should see both the images and then also the metadata. If process.env.upload to Pinata equals true, it looks like it is true. And we should run this and handle token your eyes. We'll both upload our images with store images here and then upload our metadata. We'll only see it in here once because again, it's gonna have the exact same CID, right? It's gonna have the same hash. So we won't get duplicates of the same file in Pinata or in our IPFS. So let's open this up. Let's run this one more time. Art head deploy, dash dash tags, random IPFS and mocks. Okay, it looks like we almost worked. Uploading to Pinata, working on zero, working on one, working on two. Metadata template is not defined. Aha, it's because I spelt metadata template, metadata template, let's spell things correctly. Now let's try this again. Okay, working on zero, is it working on zero two? Image upload response is not defined. I should spell correctly. We go. Let's uh, let's do our caps correctly. Let's try this one more time. Okay, zero one two. Uploading pug. Uploading Shiba Inu. Uploading Saint Bernard. Token URIs uploaded, and they're here. Now, if we grab this, we stick it into our browser or your IPFS node. Boom! We have them in here. And what we can do is we can grab this hash. We can jump into our IPFS desktop. We go to files. We do import from IPFS. Paste it in here, and you know, give it the name, etc that we have it on our own IPFS node as well. Awesome. Now, if we go over to Pinata, give this a little refresh, we can see we have everything in here. So if I copy one of these and I go to IPFS dot dot slash paste that in, we can see the metadata in here and everything looks good. So this is absolutely massive that we've just done this because now we can store our data both on our own IPFS node and at least one other node so that if our computer goes down or our server goes down, there's at least somebody else who's done it. Now we finally have this list of token URIs. We can finally go back to our arguments and now we can pop, do it like this, and we can upload all of those token URIs to our smart contract. And then we're gonna need a mint fee as well for this. So if we go to our upper hard hat config, we'll create like a little mint fee in here. We'll say mint fee is going to be whatever we want. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, we'll, we'll do 0 0.01 ETH. So we'll even drop this down one. We'll do it for, uh, we'll do it for the hard hat network. And then we'll also do it for rink B as well. We have the arguments here. Now we can finally deploy our contract. So we'll do const random IPFS NFT equals await. Deploy in the contract is random IPFS NFT from deployer. Args is args. Log is true. And then wait confirmations. This is going to be network.config.block confer confirmations or one. And great. Then we might do another little line here. We'll do the verification bit. I'm actually just gonna copy that from our deploy, from our basic. I'm just gonna copy this. It's gonna be, code's gonna be exactly the same, except for we're going to verify random IPFS instead of, oh, and then actually we used args instead of arguments. Then that is it. So we'll give this a quick deploy test, HH deploy or yarn hardhead deploy. And it looks like we almost worked. We almost got everything done. Network config is not defined because we didn't import it. So let's go ahead and import network config from our helper hardhead config. So we'll import network config. We'll try this one more time. Chained ID is not defined. It's gonna be chain ID, not chained ID. Try it one more time. 
and awesome. It's at least working for our hard hat network. And then we can copy this array and just paste it in here. Boom. And now we have those token URIs. And now back in our .env, now we can set this to false. Since we have all those token URIs already, we can just run hard hat deploy. And we'll just use the token URIs that we already have uploaded. Yes, we have done it. Now, I know you're excited to see this on something like OpenSea. You're excited to see this right away, but let's save deploying all of these to RingP for our last thing. Because again, deploying to test nets is really slow. So let's just wait until our last bit, and then we'll go ahead and we'll deploy this to RingP. But before you write tests, something that I noticed when I was writing my test is that we forgot to update the token counter. So in here, before we do our safe mint, we'll do S token counter plus equals S token counter, which is going to be S token counter equals S token counter plus one. And that's a perfect example of why writing tests is so important. But before you write any tests, you're definitely going to need to fund that subscription, uh, which we didn't do in here. So we need to do await BRF coordinator v2 mock dot fund sub subscription subscription ID comma we'll do fund amount and then just up at the top actually we can even pull this out too since that's not going to change at all we could do let token your eyes like that we'll say const fund amount equals cool or you could do you know you could also do ethers dot parse But as you know, before we can even deploy to Rink Beam, what should we do? Well, you got it right. We should absolutely 100% write some tests. So we'll create a new file called random IPFS NFT.test.js. And we can write some tests here. Now, once again, there isn't anything new that you're going to learn in this test here. It's going to be very similar to the lottery test that we've written before. So here's what I'm going to say. I'm going to highly recommend once again, that you try to write at least two or three of your own tests, but definitely write a test for fill random words. But I'm going to encourage you to pause the video now, please pause the video and try to write some tests yourself. Struggling with some of these tests and writing some of these tests is going to be what really gives you those coding muscles, if you will, it's going to give you the skills to keep writing these tests and be really fast and really efficient. When you're building these smart contracts, these tests are the tests that protect you from writing bad immutable code. So please pause the video. I'm gonna copy paste from the GitHub repo, but please take this time to write some of your own tests here. All right, great. Did you write some tests? I hope you did. If you didn't write some tests, pause this video and go write some tests. I promise you doing these test writing exercises on your own will help you dramatically. At this point, what have we done? We've done some some amazing stuff. We've deployed a basic NFT with pretty much nothing to it. Then we've deployed a provably random NFT with random stats, with random traits, with different rarities for each NFTs, depending on when it was minted or who minted it. We've stored the data for this on IPFS, and we've learned how to programmatically upload our files to Pinata, which is another pinning service for us. We learned a little bit about nft.storage, which is another way to pin data to IPFS. And then of course, we learned that if we wanted to, we could programmatically pin data to IPFS on our own node. But since a lot of us aren't going to be running our own computers 24 seven, we went ahead and said, okay, we'll we'll stick with Pinata for our default here. Now that we've done all that, boom, we've got another little check mark here. Now I got something to say, we don't need to host our data on IPFS. We can actually host our data, our metadata directly on chain if we want to. However, there are some pros and cons to it. The pros of hosting on IPFS are that it's gonna be cheap. And then the cons are that someone needs to pin our data, right? There's so, at least one person always needs to have our data pinned, right? It's decentralized, but you at least need somebody to pin your data, right? And using something like Filecoin is a, is a way to incentivize people to pin that data. But if you're not using Filecoin, it's not necessarily guaranteed. The pros of doing our SVG on chain NFT, the data is on chain, and you never have to worry about somebody actually pinning the data. The cons are that this is much more expensive. These little images right here are actually surprisingly large and storing them on chain can actually get pretty expensive. 
So we're going to use some different images, some much smaller images, much cheaper images to work with here. And if you want to see another version of this, I have another video how to make NFT art with on-chain metadata. It goes through pretty much what we're about to go through here as well if you want a second reference. And there's a link to this in the GitHub repo associated with this course. So instead of these PNGs that we're using, we're going to use something called SVGs. Now, an SVG stands for Scalable Vector Graphics. And these are much, much more minimalistic files that we can go ahead and upload to, to the blockchain. So that's why we're going to use them, because since they're so much more minimalistic, they're a lot cheaper to upload. Because remember, the more data that you upload to the blockchain, the more expensive it is. Now, in this video, I make randomized SVG data on chain. And here's kind of an example of what one looks like. It's just a whole bunch of random lines. Not super thrilling, but uh, random and, and kind of cool. And it's 100% on chain. These SVGs actually work right in HTML. So if you want to use these for your websites, you can as well. Now there's a link to this tutorial in the GitHub repo associated with this course, where we can go ahead and try it yourself and we can actually play with making an SVG, right? So they have all these different commands in this web through schools.com slash graphics slash SVG intro .asp you can see some of the different commands, right? You can make a rectangle, you can make a circle. Path is a big one where you can say exactly what the path or the line you want to draw is gonna look like. And there's a whole bunch of stuff you can make in this SVG. And the cool thing is, no matter how big you make an SVG, the quality is always gonna be exactly the same because SVG just explains exactly how to draw it, no matter how big or how little the image is gonna be. So if you want to learn more about SVGs, you want to play with SVGs, you know, you can come in here, try it yourself. So with that being said, that's what we're going to store on chain. So that's how we're going to store this SVG stuff on chain. But we're going to go one step further. We're going to make this dynamic. We're going to make this actually change based off of some data on chain. If you go to the GitHub repo associated with this lesson and you go to the images and you go to dynamic NFT, you'll see two images. You'll see happy.svg, which looks like this and you'll see frown.svg, which looks like this. So we're going to make this NFT dynamic in the sense that we're going to say, if the price of ETH is above some number, then we're going to have it be a happy face. And then if it's below, then we're going to make it a frowny face. So our NFT is going to change based off of some real world parameters. And this is obviously really powerful and really cool because we can have an NFT that changes based off stats. We can have an NFT that changes based off of really whatever. And we're going to store all the data 100% on chain, it's going to be a little bit more expensive. So that's what we're going to be building here. Let's go ahead, let's jump into it. And let's do the final contract for our ultimate NFT section. So we're going to create a new contract in here, new contract, and this is going to be our dynamic SVG NFT dot soul. And it's going to look real similar to what we've been doing. Slash slash dynamic SVG NFT dot soul slash slash SPDX license identifier MIT pragma solidity parent 0 0.8.7 contract dynamic SVG NFT. Now let's talk about what the architecture of this is going to look like. It's going to look like a pretty normal NFT with a couple of caveats. We're going to give it a mint function to mint these NFTs. But we're also going to need to store our SVG information somewhere. And then we're going to need to have some logic to say show X image or show Y image, right? And as we know, that's really just going to be switching the token URI. Just say show X or show Y. So let's go into how we'd actually do this. So first we know this is going to be an ERC 721. So we can go ahead and import that from open Zeppelin. So we're going to say import at open Zeppelin slash contracts slash token slash ERC 721 slash ERC 721.sol. Now we're not going to call that set token URI function that we called before. So we can just use the raw ERC 721 instead of an extension. So we'll say our contract is ERC 721. And now that we're making it an ERC 721, we can say constructor like this, then we'll call the constructor of the ERC 721, which we're going to call this dynamic SVG NFT 
DSN, dynamic SVG, NST, NFT, uh, like so. Then we're also going to need a mint function. So let's just create that right now. We'll say function mint NFT or request NFT, and we'll be a little bit looser here. We'll say the user doesn't need to pay any money for this. So this will just be a public function, and we're just going to mint them an NFT. Same thing, we're just going to call safe mint message.sender. And of course, we need that token counter. So let's go ahead and in our top, we'll do UN 256 private s underscore token counter. We'll do token counter here. And then after we mint, we'll do token counter plus, or excuse me, equals token counter plus one. And then that's pretty much it. We have a way to mint. We've done some of the basics here. We'll even, we'll be explicit. We'll say s token counter equals zero to initialize it. But now what is this token gonna look like? We want these to look like SVGs and we want it to be based off the price of some asset. In our constructor, we'll write, create a string memory. We'll call it low SVG and a string memory high SVG. And in our code, we'll save this low SVG and this high SVG. So these will be the images. These will be like the frowny face and the smiley face that we'll just import as input parameters here. So as we know, we can make these immutable since these are probably not gonna change. We could say string private I underscore low image URI and then string private I underscore high image URI. But if we just pass the SVG data, right, the SVG data is going to look like what? In this GitHub, I can go to display the source blob here and I can see exactly what this code looks like. This code here is definitely not an image URI. What we need is the image URI to look something like this. Right now, the way that we're going to pass it in is like with this SVG code, right? Because we want to just pass it the SVG code and then have the contract handle everything else. So how do we actually do this? Well, what we can do is we can create a function called SVG to image URI. And on chain, we can convert these SVGs from SVGs to image URIs. So instead of having IPFS as their start, we're gonna use something called base64 encoding. You can actually encode any SVG to a base64 image URL. That's right. It'll look something like this. Base64 is grouped of binary to text encoding schemes that represents binary data, or in our case, our SVG data. Base64 is particularly prevalent in the World Wide Web, where one of its uses is the ability to embed image files or other binary assets inside textual assets such as HTML and CSS. What we can do, we can actually convert all this SVG stuff to a URL or an image URI. That would be great, right? That's exactly what we want. We want to be able to convert this to a URL or an image URI. Now, if you take one of these images, one of these SV images like the happy.svg, what we can actually do in this happy.svg so we can actually copy the image address, which is gonna be the URL of this address. And if we paste it back in, we'll see just this file here. And in this site, we can actually do data type, remote URL, paste it in here, and we can say encode SVG to base64. And down here, we'll get this weird jarble of numbers and letters and stuff. This base64 encoding represents the SVG that we just got. And what we can do in our browser, we can type data, colon image slash SVG plus XML semicolon base 64 comma and then paste that massive thing in here and enter and wouldn't you know it we get exactly that image back up so that huge massive thing here is the base 64 encoding of this image so with this base 64 encoded image we can use this on chain is the image URI for our images. And then for our metadata, we'll just bake that directly into our token URI. You'll see what I mean in a second. So we have a way where we can actually directly put our SVG code right into our smart contracts. Let's figure out how to do that. So we have function SVG to image URI. So we know we're gonna wanna probably do that same base 64 encoding on chain. We could 100% do this off chain if you wanted to save some gas, but it's kind of fun for to show how to do this all on chain. So we'll make this a public pure function and we'll have it returns a string memory. So we're gonna 
give this function an SVG, which we're going to pass in from our constructor, and we're going to return a string, which is going to be that base64 encoded URL that we just saw. Well, up at our top, we'll do string private constant base SV base64 encoded SVG prefix equals that right there. And we'll use this to generate our SVG. Now, what we can do, oh, and then we're going to do string memory SVG, we can encode this SVG in base64 ourselves by adding the base64 encoding on chain. Now, we don't really want to have to rewrite that ourselves. So luckily for us, somebody has already done this. And we can see the GitHub repo associated with this. This was created by one of the Loopring devs. Really awesome project if you want to check that out as well. And we're going to borrow this code for our SVG on chain. So what we can do is we can add this in here, add their GitHub code where they have basically everything that we need in here to encode and decode base64. We can do yarn add dash dash dev base64 dash soul. This is going to add their code as a dependency. And once we've added it, we can go ahead and import it with import base64 dash soul slash base64.soul. And this contract comes with an encoder. So then we can just do string memory SVG base64 encoded equals base64 dot encode. And here's where it gets a little bit weird. We'll do bytes string ABI dot encode hacked SVG. And then we'll return string ABI dot encode packed base 64 coded SVG prefix comma SVG base 64 encoded. And just this function, this SVG to image URI will take in any SVG and spit us back out a URL or a URI that looks exactly like this. Now I kind of sped through some stuff in here. There's a whole bunch of new stuff like ABI dot encode packed that we did twice. What is this ABI dot encode packed doing? Well, let's learn about that. So from a really, really high level, this is basically how you concatenate strings, right? This is how you combine strings together. And we're going to jump over the remix to actually explore this ABI dot encode packed and this ABI encoding stuff a little bit more. Now, the section that we're about to go through is definitely advanced and we're going to be going over some really low level stuff and how solidity works behind the scenes how the binary works and this thing called opcodes and all this crazy low level tricky difficult things to understand if you want to move past this section there are timestamps in the github repo to help you move past this however i do encourage you to at least try to absorb most of this material if you don't understand it the first time that's 100% okay. This is more advanced anyways. For most of your basic projects, you won't really need this information. It's only later on, once you get more advanced, that knowing all this is really going to make you a phenomenal Solidity developer. And when you approach this section, when you approach this sub lesson on EVM opcodes and coding and calling, just know that if you don't 100% understand it the first time, that is okay. If you want to watch this section a couple times, fantastic. So if you want to jump over to Remix and follow along, let's do it. Now in our contract section, let's go ahead and create a new file. We're going to call it encoding.soul. And remember, all the code that we're going to be going with in here is going to be in this sub lesson folder of the hardhat NFT FCC. And all the code we're going to be working with is going to be in this encoding.soul. And then in a little bit, we're going to work on this call anything.soul. So we're in this encoding.soul and let's just make our basic code here. So we'll say, SPDX license identifier MIT pragma solidity carrot 0.8.7 like that. We'll do contract encoding. Boom. Compile or command S or control S. Great. Things are looking good. Now remember, the whole purpose for this is to first understand what's going on here and more about this ABI.encode packed stuff. So let's first just write a function that shows us wrapping abi.encode packed with some strings and wrapping around a string is going to return a string. So we could do function 
bind strings or concatenate strings. This will be a public pure since we're not going to be reading any storage. We'll say returns string memory and we'll say return string abi.encode packed. Hi, mom, comma, put space in here. Miss you like so. So we need another parenthesis here. Okay, great. Now let's go ahead and deploy this. We'll stay on a JavaScript VM. We'll deploy encoding, coding.sol. And we'll come down here, we'll click combine strings and we get that whole string output, hi mom, miss you. So what we're doing here is we're encoding hi mom, miss you together into its bytes form because abi.encode packed returns a bytes object and we are typecasting it by wrapping it in this string thing to be a string. And Solidity says, okay, yeah, bytes to string, that's fine, that totally works. And this abi.encode packed, one of these globally available methods and units. And actually in Solidity, there's a whole bunch of these. There's this Solidity cheat sheet, and there's gonna be a link to this in the GitHub repo as well, that has a whole bunch of operators and it has a whole bunch of these global variables and methods. You can see if we look in here, we look for abi.encode packed, we see abi.encode packed right here. If we scroll down, we'll see some more that we're familiar with as well. Like for example, message.sender, sender of the message, message.value. There's a whole bunch of other globally available methods and variables that we can use when we're coding our stuff. Now, I will say though, in 0.8.12 plus, you can actually do string.concat, you know, string A, comma string B. If you want to, instead of doing this abi.encode packed, but I still wanted to show you the abi.encode pack because it's a great segue into all this ABI stuff that we're about to go over. But let's focus on this encode pack thing. So what is actually going on here? Well, before we dive deeper into this encode pact, let's understand a little bit more about what happens when we send a transaction. So when we compile our code, and again, all these pictures are gonna be in the GitHub repo. Remember back to ethers.js, we had those two files. We got a .abi file and a dot bin or dot binary. Back in our ether simple storage, when we ran yarn compile, the two main files that we got were this simple storage.abi, which was this, you know, th this ABI thing that we've become familiar with. And then the simple storage.bin, which is the binary, which is a whole bunch of just numbers and letters and stuff we didn't understand. And you can see that in Remix too. Like if we were to compile this, you go to compilation details, you get a whole bunch of stuff in here, right? You can see the ABI in here, which this is kind of like a different way of viewing that ABI. We also get this bytecode bit, and it's this object that has the same stuff that has like those random numbers and letters, but this is actually the binary. This is actually what's getting put on the blockchain. It's this binary, it's this low level stuff. Now, when we actually send these contracts to the blockchain, we're sending, like I said, we're sending this binary thing. That's exactly what we're sending to the blockchain. And remember how, again, back in our ethers project, we saw what is a transaction, right? A transaction has a nonce, it has a gas price, gas limit, two value data. We kind of skimped over the VRS a little bit because that's kind of that mathy component of the transaction signature. But again, back in our ethers project, we did this as well, right, in our deploy script ended up sending a transaction ourselves using just ethers. We passed a nonce, a gas price, gas limit, two value. Data was this massive thing to deploy our contract and then also the chain ID. We didn't work with the VRS because ethers does that for us, but there's also this VRS component that we, we don't bother to look at. When we send a transaction that actually creates a contract, the two is gonna be empty. We're not gonna send this contract deployment to any address but the data of this is gonna have the contract initialization code and contract bytecode, right? So when we compile it, we, we get all this code, like how do you initialize the contract and then what the contract actually looks like. So if you look at any of the contracts that you deployed, for example, I'm gonna look at our raffle that we deployed. If you go to the transactions of your contract, we can see create raffle, right? Let's go to that transaction. If we go down and click to see more in Etherscan, we can see this input data thing. And once again, it's got all this random garbled numbers and letters. This is that binary data of the contract initialization code and the contract bytecode, right? What we send in our transaction is this data thing. We send this, this weird bunch of jarbled nonsense. Now we're gonna head back to Remix. 
And I'm just going to leave this as comments in here. In the encoding.soul, in the GitHub repo, there is a ton of comments in here explaining exactly what I'm explaining. So if you want to follow along there, you can as well. But now, in order for the blockchain to understand, okay, what do these numbers and letters even mean, you need a special reader. Ethereum, or the blockchain, needs to be able to read all this stuff. It needs to be able to map all these random numbers and letters to what they actually do. How does Ethereum or Polygon or Avalanche know that all this nonsense is basically telling it to make a contract? You kind of think of it as saying like, take off your coat. The only reason that we as human beings understand what take off your coat means is that we understand English. We're all reading English. For Solidity and for blockchains, instead of English, they read these numbers and letters kind of like words. Just instead of take off your coat, it's like deploy contract and the contract does X, X, Y, Z and all this random stuff. So this bytecode represents the low level computer instructions to make our contract happen. And all these numbers and letters represent kind of an alphabet, just like how take off your coat is an alphabet. And when you combine them like this, it makes something that to us makes sense. You can kind of think of the alphabet for these as what's called opcodes. If you go to create a new tab, if you go to evm.codes, we'll get to this place where it just has a list of all these instructions. On the left side, you can see this thing called opcode, and then you can see name. So this opcode section is saying, hey, if you see a zero zero in this bytecode, that zero zero represents this opcode stop, which does what? Which halts execution. If you see a zero one, you're going to do some addition stuff. A zero two is multiply. There are all these opcodes that are kind of like the alphabet or the language of this binary stuff, right? And they go all the way down to, to FF self-destruct. These opcodes also have, and that's what this is reading, right? So if we look at our transaction here and your, yours might be a little bit different, 061 says, okay, the first thing we want you to do is the 061 opcode. And if we go to EVM opcodes, we look up for 61 saying push to place two byte item on the stack. That's exactly how it's reading this. Any language that can compile down to this opcode stuff, down to this specific set of, of Ethereum opcodes or EVM opcodes is what's known as the EVM, the Ethereum virtual machine. So being able to read these opcodes is sometimes abstractly called the EVM, the Ethereum virtual machine. The EVM basically represents all the instructions a computer must be able to read for it to interact with Ethereum or Ethereum-like applications. And this is why so many blockchains all work with Solidity, because Solidity compiles down to this bytecode here, and Polygon, Avalanche, Arbitrum, Ethereum, they all compile down to the exact same type of binary, and they all have the exact same readers. Now, why are we telling you all this stuff? You might be saying, hey, Patrick, this is cool and all, but it looks like ABI.CodePact, all that does is concatenate strings. ABI.CodePact can do actually way more. And if we look at these global variables, ABI.CodePact is like, what, the third one down the list? Because it's a non-standard way to encode stuff to this binary stuff that we just talked about. We can actually encode pretty much anything we want to being in this binary format, basically. And let's take a look at, at encoding something. So let's create a function called encode number. And this will be a public peer function since we're not gonna read any states. And we'll say returns a bytes memory. So we're gonna have this function return a bytes object. We're gonna have it return the, what this number is gonna look like, but in binary. So we'll say bytes memory number equals abi.encode one, and then return number. So we're gonna encode number down to its ABI or its binary format. So I know a lot of the times when we say, oh, what's the ABI, what's the ABI, right? Previously, we say, oh, the ABI is, is this thing, right? It's, it's, it's all these inputs and outputs. This is kind of the human readable version of the ABI, but again, the ABI is the application binary interface. We want to encode our numbers down to its basically its, its binary. This ABI.encode is gonna be a little different than like the ABI that you see when you're looking at compilation details. This is technically like the ABI, it technically is how to interact with this contract. However, it's not the actual binary version of it. So we're saying, okay, uh, encode this number one down to its binary version, so that our contracts can interact with it in a way that they understand. So we're just saying, okay, cool, that number one, let's make you machine readable. And if we go 
we compile this and we deploy this, right? Let's delete that, that old contract. We deploy this. We now have combined strings and encode number. If we click it, we get this big hex thing. This is how the computer is going to understand the number one. Now we can encode pretty much anything, actually. We could encode a string. So we'll say function encode string. We'll make this a public pure as well. It'll return a bytes memory because we want to give it that binary stuff or that bytes stuff. And we'll say bytes memory some string equals abi.encode some string and then return some string. Now let's compile that. We'll delete our old contract, deploy that encode string. We get this big, big, big object here. And this is the binary. Now you'll notice something here. There's a ton of zeros and those zeros take up space, right? That's a lot of space for the computer to take up, even though they're not really doing anything. They're just kind of taking up space. So solidity also comes with this abi.encode pact, which performs pact encoding of the given arguments. And you can read more about it in the solidity docs if you want. And this is called the non-standard pact mode. And it does the same encoding with some stipulations. Types shorter than 32 bytes are concatenated directly without padding or sign extension. Dynamic types are encoded in place and without the length. Array elements are padded, but still encoded in place. You can kind of think of encode packed as sort of like a compressor, right? It's the encode function, but it compresses stuff. If we wanted to encode some string, but we wanted to save space and we didn't need the perfect low level binary of it, we could do function encode string packed make this a public pure and have it return a bytes memory. And we could say bytes memory, some string equals abi.encode packed. Once again, some string. And so we're doing encode packed instead of encode. So we'll return some string here. We'll compile this and we'll see the difference, right? We'll compile, we'll delete our old one. We'll deploy this. Now we have encode string, which again, that's what encode string is going to give us. And we have encode string packed which returns us this much, much smaller bytes object here. So you see the size difference. If we're trying to save gas, encode string packed is going to be a way for us to save a lot more gas. Now, abi.encode packed is actually really similar to something that we've done before, which is typecasting. If we did function encode string bytes, public pure returns bytes memory, bytes memory some string equals bytes some string turn some string these two are going to look nearly identical right so if we compile we'll delete our old contract we'll deploy this encode string bytes which gives us this and encode string packed using the abi on code packed they give us the exact same output whereas encode string still gives us this big piece. So the two of these get the same result, but behind the scenes, they're doing something a little bit different. And I'm not gonna go over exactly what that is, but uh, I've left a link inside of the code here if you wanna learn more, which is exactly what we're doing in our NFT, right? We're doing abi.encode packed. We're combining two strings by putting them together. We're encoding them to their bytes implementation, to their packed bytes implementation, and then we're just typecasting them back from bytes to string, and that's how we concatenate them. Now, at this point, you might be thinking, okay, cool, great, Patrick, I'm all set, I understand this, I'm happy to go back to my project, and if you wanna do that, absolutely go for it and skip over this section. But some other views might be going, okay, Patrick, this is seems pretty cool, but I'm sure this encode packed and this encode function aren't just here to concatenate strings. They probably have some other function. What, what do they actually do? Well. If that's what you're asking, I'm glad you ask, and I'm glad you're curious because we're going to find out. Now, not only can you encode stuff like strings and numbers and really anything, but you can decode stuff. So I could say function decode string public here returns string memory, string memory, some string equals abi dot decode. This is going to take a couple parameters. So if we look in the docs here, abi.decode, it takes as a first argument, the encoded data, and then it takes a tuple. You can kind of think of it as a list, but not quite a list, a set of types to decode this into, and it returns the number of parameters that you gave it. So we might want to say this string memory, some string, let's give it as input, this encode string function, 
the result of this encode string function, right? Which again is going to be this big thing. So this is kind of equivalent to sticking this massive thing in here, but we're just not going to stick the massive thing in there because it's really big. So we're going to say, let's decode the result of encode string and let's decode it into a string because we need to tell solidity, Hey, we're going to decode this, but it, it doesn't know what to decode it into. It does, it's like, okay, cool. I can decode this, but like, what, what do you want me to do with it? And we say, oh, oh, this is a string. So decode it into a string and then we can do return some string. Now, once again, we deploy that old con or we delete the last contract. We deploy this new one. So encode string, encode string, where is encode string? Encode string returns this massive thing. As a human being, we're like, God, uh, I, I can't read that. Computers can read that, but we can't really read that. So we say, okay, let's decode that back into its string form. We hit decode string and we get back some string. And now we can actually multi encode and multi and decode, right? We can encode as much stuff as we want. So I can say function multi encode public pure returns bytes memory. We're going to encode a couple things. We'll say bytes memory some string equals ABI dot encode some string comma. It's bigger. So we're going to encode two strings here. We're going to encode some string and it's bigger. So we have two strings we're going to encode and we'll return some string, even though it's, you know, bytes. And then we can actually multi decode. So we'll say function multi decode. This will be a public pure returns. We'll say it returns two strings, string memory and string memory. And instead of doing string memory, some string equals ABI decode, we'll say string memory, some string comma string memory, some other string. So we're going to get two returns equals ABI dot decode. Let's decode this multi encode result, which is the doubly encoded strings into a string and another string. And then we'll return both of these or some string. There we go. And then we'll return some string and then some other string. I need a semicolon here. So now when we deploy this, Let's close this out, deploy this new one, right? We now have this multi encode, which gives us this even bigger bytes object, right? Because this is two strings encoded. And now if we hit multi decode, take a second, what do you think it's going to put out output? Let's go ahead and hit it. Now it's going to give us two strings, right? It's going to give these two strings, some string it's bigger. So we can tell solidity to encode a bunch of stuff. And then we can even decode it by telling it, okay, this big object here, it's two strings combined, and then we decode it. Now you can even multi encode with that encode packed thing, right? We could do function multi encode packed public pure returns bytes memory, and then bytes memory some string equals ABI dot encode packed some string, comma, it's bigger, and then return some string. We could do this, right? But this is going to give us the packed version of these two strings. So the decoding actually isn't going to work on this because this is packed encoding. So if we tried to do, and I'm going to say this doesn't work. We tried to do function multi decode packed public pure returns string memory, string memory, some string equals ABI dot decode multi encode packed in a string kind of exactly what we did above to if we do return some string, what do you think is going to happen? Well, let's, uh, let's try it. Delete the old contract, deploy a new one. We'll do multi decode packed, multi encode, multi decode packed. And we actually just get an error. Solidity basically goes, um, yeah, this looks like it's packed. I don't know how to decode that. But instead, what we can do is we can do function more t string cast packed make this a public pure returns string memory string memory some string equals string multi encode packed return some string this one will work right because again this packed encoding is kind of similar to just typecasting so we'll compile We'll redeploy multi string cast packed. We get some string, it's bigger, right? And we don't have a space here, but we should have put a space in there.
now that we've learned more about this in ABI.encode and decoding, and we know that, okay, this is what the computer, this is what Ethereum, this is what the EVM or any EVM compatible chain is looking for. It's looking for this byte code. It's looking for this, this binary stuff. And we just learned a little bit more about how to encode different variables into the binary, into that data bit. Well, uh, what do we do now? Now, since we know that our transactions are just gonna be compiled down to this binary stuff, what we can do then is we could actually populate this data value of our transactions ourselves with the binary the code is gonna use. So here's our transaction for a contract deployment. The data field of the contract deployment is gonna be all that binary code of the contract. For a function call, the data piece is gonna be what to send to the address, what data, what function to call on the two address. Let's look at another one of our transactions on Etherscan, right, on one of our contracts. You don't have to. I'm gonna look at enter raffle from a previous section. And if we select down, we look at input data, it says function enter raffle, method ID. But if we look at the original, this is what's getting sent in the data field. It's this binary, it's this hex, it's this weird low level bytes thing. This is how the Ethereum blockchain or the or whatever EVM chain you're working with knows which function to call. It translates this into a function. And we can do the exact same thing and call these functions ourselves. So what we can actually do with this crazy newfound data encoding stuff, what we can actually do is send the data field of a transaction ourself in a transaction call. Remember back in this Ethers throwback where the, this data thing was the contract creation code? Well, instead, we could populate this data thing with our function call code, the exact function that we want to call in the binary in the hex edition. Now, you might be thinking, oh, well, why would I do that? I can always just use the, the interface, the ABI, all that stuff. Well, maybe you don't have that. Maybe all you have is the function name. Maybe all you have is the parameters you want to send. Or maybe you want to make your code be able to send arbitrary functions or make arbitrary calls or do random, really advanced stuff, right? That's where sending our function calls directly by populating this data field is going to be incredibly important. So remember, I said you're always going to need the ABI and the contract address to send a function. Now, when I said you always need the ABI, originally we were kind of talking about this thing, this big, this big thing, which is cool, which is the ABI, but this is like the human readable ABI. You can also do it with the not human readable ABI. And additionally, you don't need all this stuff. You can really use just the name of a function and then the input types to send a function call. So the question is then, okay, how do we send, how do we send transactions that call functions with just the data field populated? And then the next question is, how do we populate the data field? What do we populate the data field with to, to make one of these function calls? And then how do we send these transactions? Solidity actually has some more low level keywords, namely static call and call. We actually, we've used call in the past before. Does this code look at all familiar to you? Well, it should, because this is, we use a similar setup in our fulfill random words for our lottery, right? We sent money doing this recent winner dot call, right? Recent winner was the address of the recent winner and we did dot call. And then we had this weird stuff in this brackets here and then nothing in the parentheses. So we did actually, essentially, we used this call keyword previously, but we didn't really tell you what it did. So call is how we can call functions to change the state of the blockchain. Static call is basically how at a low level we call our view or pure functions, right? Static call is going to be like, okay, don't change the state of the blockchain with this one. Just give us the return value. So this is kind of similar to like a view or a pure function at, at low level. There's also a send word, but like basically forget about it. <laughs> We're just going to be working with call and static call. And, you know, later on we'll learn about another one called delegate call, but don't worry about that for now. Recent winner dot call like this in these little squiggly brackets, we said, okay, we updated the value directly of our transaction in Solidity. So which again, if we had these transaction fields and we just directly updated value in these little brackets, right? We can also directly update gas limited and gas price in these little brackets if we wanted to as well. And in here, these parentheses is where we're gonna stick our data. Since all we wanted to do with our withdraw function previously was send money, we said, okay, send money, change the value that we're gonna send 
but don't pass any data. Keep that data bit empty, which is why, again, remember how we hit this button before, right? And we had call data be empty. That's the, essentially running this command with call data be empty, with this section be empty, and then just updating the value that we sent with the transaction. And so it's this section that we can use to populate data to actually call specific functions. I'm gonna put a whole bunch more comments here. So when our squiggly brackets, we're able to pass specific fields of a transaction like value. And in our parentheses, we're able to pass data in order to call a specific function. But in here, there's no function to call since we were just sending Ethereum. If we wanna call a function or send any data, we can do this in the parentheses. Oh, and I think I spelled that wrong. Now, we've learned a ton here, so let's do a quick refresher of what we just learned. And then we're gonna actually learn how we can call any function just by using this syntax here. What we learned from really high level, if we wanna combine strings, we can do abi.encode packed and then typecast it to a string. And in newer versions of Solidity, you can do, you can do string.concat, you know, hi mom, comma, miss you. In newer versions of Solidity, this works as well, but not in older versions of Solidity. Then we learned a lot about some low level stuff. We learned, okay, when we compile our contracts, we get an ABI file and this weird binary thing. It's that numbers and letters stuff that gets, when we deploy a contract, that gets sent in the data field of our contract creation transaction. So for contract creations, the data is populated with that binary code. For function calls, is going to define which functions to call and with what parameters. And this is what we're going to go over next. Now we learned that we can actually encode stuff into this binary, into this low level code. And any program, any process that can read this low level stuff and execute accordingly, read this EVM stuff, read the specific binary that Ethereum has specified or the EVM has specified is considered EVM compatible. We can encode numbers, we can encode strings, we can encode pretty much any, anything we want to encode. To save space, we do encode packed. We can decode stuff that we've encoded, but we can't decode stuff that we encode packed. We can multi-encode stuff and then multi-decode stuff. And then finally, we can use this call function and add data in here to make any call that we want to any smart contract, and this is what we're going to learn next. All right, so now's a great time to take a break because we just learned some really difficult concepts. And like I said, if you don't get it the first time, that is okay. All right, welcome back. Now that we've learned about this encoding stuff, let's learn how we can populate this parentheses, this data field, so we can call any function and we can do essentially what the blockchain is gonna do at the low level. We can work with just that binary. We can work with just that bytes. We can work with that hex to interact with our smart contracts. So let's create a new file and we're gonna call it call anything.sol. I uh, start off with SPDX license identifier MIT and let's talk about this. Now in order to call, now in order to call a function using only the data field of the call, we need to encode the function name and the parameters that we wanna add, right? Cause when we call a function, we call the function name and we call the parameters. So we need to encode these down to the binary level so that the EVM or these Ethereum based smart contracts, the Solidity stuff can understand what's actually going on. In order to do this, we're gonna to need to work with two concepts. To encode the function name so that the EVM or Solidity can understand it, we actually have to grab something called the function selector. Now the function selector is gonna be the first four bytes of the function signature and the function signature it's just gonna be a string which defines the function name and parameter. Now, what does this actually mean? Well, if we have a transfer function, this right here is known as the function signature. So the function name is gonna be transfer and it's gonna take an address and a U256 as its inputs. If we encode this transfer function and then we take the first four bytes of it, we get this, which refers to the function selector. So that's how Solidity knows. So in the byte code, in the binary code, this function selector is how Solidity knows, oh, they're talking about the transfer function. They want me to call the transfer function. And this is one of the first things that we need to use call to call any function that we want. We need to get the function selector and we can get it a number of different ways. But one of the ways is by encoding the function signature and grabbing the first four bytes. So we'll create this contract. We'll do pragma solidity 0.8.7, say contract, call anything. 
And we'll give this two storage variables. We'll give this two storage variables an address public s underscore some amount or some address. And then u in 256 public s underscore amount. And then we'll create a function called transfer function transfer. Now, normally in here, we would actually do like transfer for like an ERC20 transfer, but we're just going to do address, some address, and then UN256 amount, amount here. We'll make this a public function. And then all we'll do is we'll set S some address equals some address, and then S amount equals amount. So here's going to be the function that we're going to work with. And the function selector for that function is this. The function signature is this. So it takes an address, some address, amount that gets boiled down to the function selector and the function signature. And of course, in our bytecode, there's going to be some code saying, okay, here's what this function does, blah, blah, blah. So we can actually even write a function to get that function selector. So we can say function get selector, and I'm going to say get selector one, because I'm going to show you a few ways to get the function selector. We'll make this a public pure, and we'll have this return a byte for selector. We could say selector equals bytes four, and then we hash with the check 256 of the bytes of that signature, which is transfer, and it takes an address and a uint 256. All right, if we compile this, and then we run it, oh, let's get rid of our old contract, deploy, make sure we're on call anything if you have the other one up. And here now we have a couple of things. If we hit get selector one, we get this OX A905, blah, blah, blah. Right. And that's the same as the example I just gave. So this right here tells Solidity, tells our smart contract that, okay, when we make a call to this contract, if you see this in the function data, this is referring to our transfer function with an address and a UN256 as input parameters. So we see address UN256, our function knows to execute this data here. Great. And then of course, S amount and S address are zeros. Now, while we're here, we can also see, okay, what happens if we call the transfer function, right? It takes an address and an amount. So let's just give it its own address for an address. And we'll do 777 for an amount. If we hit transfer, we have the log up, right? We'll get a little check mark here saying success. Now, if we hit S amount, we'll get 777 and then the address will be the same, right? So that's us directly calling transfer. When we directly call transfer, we're basically saying, hey, grab this function selector and then do some other stuff, which we'll, we'll tell you the other stuff in a minute. Now we have the function selector. Okay, great. What else do we need? We also now need the parameters we want to add. So we're going to need to encode those parameters with our function selector. So what we're going to do is we're going to say function get data to call transfer. And in here, we're just going to have this get data to call transfer. We're going to have it take these input parameters, and we're going to encode these to work with our function selector. So we're going to say address, some address, UN256 amount, public pure returns, bytes memory. And then we can return and use one of those ABI encodings from the cheat sheet. Now, so far, we've just been doing ABI encode for a lot of our encoding. So it's, since we have the function selector, we can actually do abi.encode with selector. This ABI encodes the given arguments starting from the second and prepends the given four byte selector. When we do encode with selector, we're just sticking our selector onto the data that we're going to give it. So we're going to do return abi.encode with selector, and we're going to pass it the result of get selector one, and then we're going to give it some address and amount. So what this is going to do, it's going to give us all the data that we need to put in that data field of our transaction to send to this contract to let this contract know, hey, go use the transfer function, pass in some address and then an amount. And then if we compile this, we run it, let's delete our old contract, we'll deploy it. We now get a new function called get data to call and transfer. We'll just pass, you know, we'll just pass this contract's address. And then we'll also do 777 again. And so this thing right here is what we're going to put into the data field of our transaction in order for us to call transfer from anywhere. So this is the bytes. This is the binary encoded data of, hey, call the transfer function with this address that we specified with, you know, 777 amount. 
So what we can do once we have all this, we can actually call our transfer function without even having to directly call it. So what we can do is we can say function call transfer function directly, or I guess with binary might be a better title, but you get the gist. We'll say address sum address, u in two fifty six amount. So we'll make this a public function, and we'll have it returns a bytes four and a bool. You'll see why in a minute. And we'll do that same call thing that we did to send our raffle money. So what we'll do is before we did recent winner dot call, right? We're gonna do some address, and then for us we're gonna do address this dot call, and then we're saying this contract's address, which we could put any address here, address dot call, and we're gonna call the encoded data that points us to the transfer function with some parameters. So we're gonna do address this dot call. And we could just do get data to call transfer some address amount, right? We could do it like this, or we could do it kind of the raw way. We could do ABI dot encode with selector, get selector one, comma, some address, oops, comma, amount. And actually there's no semicolon there, sorry. So those are gonna be the same. And this dot call thing, right? It's gonna return exactly what we saw before going to return a bool success. So whether or not the transaction was successful, and then bytes memory return data, which is going to be, you know, whatever the call returns. So right, and this is where we put like require success, right? But for us, we're just going to do return bytes four, bytes four of return data, and then success. So we're just going to return the first four bytes of whatever data we get returned. And then we're going to return whether this was successful or not. So this function is going to have us directly call tr the transfer function by passing these parameters without us having to do like contract.transfer or, or transfer, or whatever, right? And you could do this across multiple contracts, across different contracts, just by changing the address that you call on. So let's go ahead and compile this. We'll run this now. We'll delete our old contract. We'll deploy call anything. Now, if we, if we were, so right now, S amount and S some address are both zero. Now, if we do call transfer function directly, and we'll pass in this one's address, and then we'll do 777. Now, if we pull up the logs, if we hit this, we're gonna get this transaction response here. But if we scroll down, we'll be able to see the decoded output, which is a bytes four of just a bunch of zeros, right? Because our transfer doesn't actually return anything. So it's just gonna be a whole bunch of zeros. And then our Boolean true, which means it was successful. So since it was successful, these two should have changed based off of that. So let's go ahead and try them out. And we do indeed see that they're changed. So we have just directly called this transfer function without having to call the transfer function itself. We can also do encode with signature instead of selector. So if we go to our cheat sheet, there's also this encode with signature down here which takes the string memory signature and it's equivalent to doing abi.encode with selector, bytes four, kakak, bytes, you know, signature. It's, it's equivalent to doing exactly what we did up here, but it does this step for us. So we could copy this whole thing, paste it down here, right? And we could do, instead of encode with selector, we could do encode with signature, the function signature, and then we'll copy our function signature from up here, paste it in here, Compile. We ran into a compilation error. Oh, these are the same uh, call transfer function directly sig. I'll call it that. Compile. Delete our old contract. Deploy. Now these two are both zeros again. Now if we copy the contract address, we do call contract call transfer function directly sig. We paste that in here. We do seven seven seven. We call it. Then we check these. We can see that that does the exact same thing. So this is ABI dot encode with signature. This is abi.encode selector. Encode with signature just turns this into the selector for us. That's all. Up here, we just, we encoded the selector ourselves. Now, there are a whole bunch of different ways to get the selectors. And I'm not, we're not going to code these out ourselves. I'm just going to say a bunch of different ways to get selector. And who knows why, why you might want to use one of these other reasons, right? There's, there's a ton of reasons why you might want to get the selector a different way. And here's some. Now in this video, we're not gonna explain or go over all these different all these different function selector getting methods, but if you go through them in the GitHub repo associated with this course, they all have a ton of commas to explain what they're doing. What we are gonna show you though, is actually how two contracts can interact with each other
without actually having all of the code for each contract. So we're going to make a second contract that has all this binary, this bytes information to call the transfer function on a different contract. And we're going to show you how that can work. Uh, this is just another contract that I made called call function without contract. Actually down here, we're going to call the transfer function just by using the address and the function selector signature and stuff. We're going to update these storage variables in our call anything contract from another contract just by doing this binary calling, if you will. All right, so let's compile. Let's go to deploy. We can actually leave this up, right? We can leave this up is let's deploy our call function without contract. We'll pass it as an input parameter, the call anything contract address. We'll deploy it. Now in here, I can call the transfer function directly by, you know, maybe I'll switch it to this, this contract address, this new contract address, and we'll give it a new number of one, two, three, right? And we'll click call transfer function. And then when we go back up here, we see that this has indeed been updated. Now doing this call stuff is considered low level and it's a best practice to try to avoid it when you can. So if you can import an interface, it's much better to do it like that because you're going to have the compiler on your side. You're going to be able to check to see if your types are matching and all this other stuff. So usually doing these low level calls, some security auditor checkers might say, Hey, like uh, this spooks me out a little bit. You, you doing this low level stuff. But with that being said, you have just learned a ton about lower level solidity. This is some really advanced stuff. And like I said, if this was hard, if you're kind of confused here, don't worry, you can always come back to this section and try it again when you're a little bit more advanced. If you want to try to understand it all now, awesome. Absolutely. We've left some links in the GitHub repo associated with this lesson that I definitely recommend you check out. One of the ones you should definitely check out is going to be this deconstructing solidity by Open Zeppelin. It really breaks down exactly what's going on behind the scenes of a contract. If you want to learn more about op codes, about low level stuff, definitely give this a read. It is a phenomenal read. Essentially, it breaks down a little bit more than what we went over here. Uh, a couple other videos as well. And I've left a whole bunch of links in here too. Ooh, with that being said, here we are back in our NFT. And now we know all about this ABI.encoding stuff right? And what it does. And we know that ABI.encode packed, the way we're using it here is just a way to concatenate strings. And we're not using ABI.encode for really any of its crazy superpowers, but we might in a later section of this course. Whew. In any case, so we do use this base64.encode thing that we've imported, right? We imported this base64.encode so that we can encode our SVG that we pass it in to the, its base64 encoding. I'm going to copy paste an example here. You don't have to do this. But like, for example, we'll pass it in like SVG with equals blah, blah, blah. All this SVG stuff, kind of similar to what I was showing you before. We pass that in as an input parameter here and outputted, we're going to get the base 64 encoding of it. We're going to get this massive kind of string here. We will test this later to make sure that this works. Uh, normally, if I added a function in like this right now, I probably would test it right away. For now, we can just leave it in here. That's going to be great for getting this image here. But we don't want just an image, right? We, we're going to need that metadata. We need this to be a JSON object, not just an image URL like this. We need to stick this image, this base64 encoded image into this image field of our JSON. So how do we actually do this? Well, what we can do is we know that our ERC721 code comes with a token URI. And it's that token URI that points to this, which tells us what our code is going to look like. So what we can do is we can actually base 64 encode our JSON as well to turn into a JSON token URI. So we base 64 encoded this image to get this. We're going to stick this URL into our JSON and then we're going to base 64 encode our JSON and that's going to be the URI that our token uses. So we have our function token URI, right? And this takes a UN256 token ID. We'll say it's going to be a public view public view override, and it returns a string memory. So we're going to override the token URI function of the ERC721 to whatever we want it to be. And here we're going to encode some JSON text that we give our contract into a base64 based JSON token URI. Just to get started, we'll do a require underscore exists token ID. And then I'm just going to say URI. Query for non-existent token. 
And yeah, this probably should be an if not exists uh, revert with an error. However, we're just going to go like this. And this exist function comes in from your ERC721. So we're going to do the same thing here. So we're going to say require this token ID exists. And again, we could 100% and probably should make this an if exists token ID, you know. Now, what we want to do is we want to figure out how to make this token URI return a base64 encoded version of this JSON. So first we know how to how to concatenate a string, right? So that's gonna be the first thing that we're gonna do. So we'll do abi.encode packed, and we're going to encode ourselves the JSON on chain. Uh, we're gonna use single quotes here because inside of this ABI encode packed, we're gonna use double quotes. In here is where we're gonna add our JSON. So we'll give a name, right? So the first piece of metadata needs to be a name. So we'll give it a name and we'll put a comma here and we'll say, the name of this NFT is going to be the name we get from, we have a name function, which returns the name. So we're going to say the name is going to be the name. And we're going to just concatenate all this stuff. Name right there. We're going to continue on with the JSON. So we put a little quote here and a little quote here. So we encapsulate this name in quotes, right? Because remember, we're, we're concatenating this big string that we're making here. So we'll do a comma. We'll say description. We'll do another quote and this time we're just going to put the description ourselves and we'll say an nft that changes based on the chain link feed we'll put an end quote here and a comma and then we'll put a comma outside the quote down here we'll say attributes we'll just say trait type it's gonna be coolness comma, value, give me 100. Boom, boom, do a comma, do image. We'll put a comma out here. And this is where we're going to put our image URI, image URI, which we're going to have to get from somewhere. So for now, I'm just going to say string memory image URI equals I, right, which clearly isn't an image URI. But just to make this format and stuff, we'll, we'll put this there. This is where we're going to put that image URI that we get from SVG to image URI. And then that's it. So we can close off our, our JSON there. So doing abi.encode packed is going to concatenate this all together. So this is basically going to be a string that looks like this. Great. But how do we turn this into a base64 encoded token URI so that other people can read it? is we're going to type cast this whole thing to bytes. And then now that this whole thing is in bytes, we can do exactly what we did with the SVG above is now we can base 64 encode it. So we'll do base 64 dot encode. And then we'll just put another pair of parentheses around this and save and auto formatted. And this here is going to give us this second line, right? It's going to give us all of this bit, but it's not going to give us this first bit, right? So we just need to append this first bit now and we should be good to go. For base64 data image SVG plus XML base64, this is the prefix for images, for SVG images, right? We use that above because that's the prefix for SVG images. The prefix for base64 JSON is gonna be, it's gonna be data application JSON base64. So we're gonna do it like this instead. Now, the ERC721 has something called a base URI that we're gonna override and that we're gonna use. So we're gonna say function underscore base URI. This will be internal pure. And we're going to override the one that ERC721 has. And this is going to returns a string memory. And we're just going to return this bit right here. And now we can use this base URI to append, right, we're going to append this first part to our base 64 encoded JSON. So in order to append them, once again, we'll do abi.encode packed and then we'll put this down here and we'll say we're going to we're going to concatenate base uri to this massive thing that we just created and then we save and we auto format so now this is obviously a bytes object and we want it to be a string so then all we got to do is typecast it as a string put another parenthesis down here and then we can actually just return this but basically what we're doing is we're creating a json string we encode it in bytes. That way we can encode it in base64. Once we have it encoded in base64, 
which is going to look like this second string. It's going to look like here out. We then just append this initial part, but for JSON objects, it's data application JSON. We, we append that, we do abi.encode packed, and then cast it to string, and then boom, we now have a token URI that'll look something like this. And then all we have to do is update our image URI with what we get from our function up here, and then we'll be good to go. So let's finish this out. Let's do this. So in our constructor, we're passing a low SVG and a high SVG. And what are these low SVGs and these high SVGs? Well, we're basically saying when the price of this asset is too low, show a frown. And when the price of the asset is high, show a smiley face. So we're going to give it this frown SVG and this happy SVG as input parameters, low SVG and high SVG. We probably want to save those, but we don't necessarily want to save them in like their SVG format. So we just want to store the image URI, right? We would just want to store this string up here instead of the actual SVG. So right in our constructor, we can do I underscore low image URI equals, and we have this SVG to image URI function where we can pass the low SVG. And then we can do the same thing for the high image URI. So now SVG to image URI is going to return something that looks like this. And we're going to store just this string, this image URI on chain. Now that we have the two of those, we can use that down below in our token URI function. So when somebody calls token URI of token ID zero, we're going to stick into our JSON, either the low image URI or the high image URI. And we're actually going to base that off of the chain link price feed. So how do we do that? Well, we've already worked with chain link price feeds before. So let's go ahead and add it. So we'll do yarn add dash dash dev at chain link slash contracts. Once that's done at the top, we can do import at chain link slash contracts slash SRC slash V0.8 slash interfaces slash aggregator V3 interface dot soul like so. And then down here, let's comment this out for now. We're going to want to call a price feed to figure out what the price is and then show the high image or the low image based off that. So in order to get a price feed in our constructor, let's just add another price feed address, price feed address, and then we'll make another variable. We'll do aggregator v3 interface, internal, immutable, i underscore price feed. And we'll say in our constructor, i price feed equals aggregator v3 interface at price feed address. And then what we can do down here, do a whole bunch of commas in here, int 256 price, comma, 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 equals i price feed dot latest round data. And what we can do is we can say if price is greater than or equal to some value, then show one image URI, otherwise show another one. So we can say string memory image URI equals s underscore low image URI. And then if the price is higher than some value, well, great, then the image URI we're going to use is going to be, or excuse me, I is going to equal the high image URI. And then we have image URI down here. So all we got to do is figure out the price. So we can make and in our mint, we'll let the minters choose the value that they want to use. So we can say, int 256, high value, and we'll assign each NFT their own high value. So we'll, we'll need to create like a little mapping up top. So we'll say mapping UN 256 to UN 256. And eh, let's just make this public for the heck of it. Public S underscore token ID to high value. And we'll say that when they mint an NFT, we'll do S token ID to high value best underscore token counter. We'll set that equal to high value. So when they mint, they choose the high value that they want. And then down here, we'll say if the price is greater than or equal to the high value of the token ID, then we'll use the high one. Otherwise, we'll just use the low one. Oops, and this needs to be UN256 to INT256, excuse me. 
since we want to be able to compare them pretty equally. And boom, our contract looks really good. Now, the only thing we'd want to add in here is it's probably an event. So we'd probably want to emit an event anytime we minted one of these NFTs. So we might do event, created NFT. We'll say you went 256 indexed token ID, comma int 256 high value, like so. And then when we mint this NFT, we'll do emit, create an NFT, S underscore token counter, comma, high value. And then it's best practice to, to have, to update our token counter before we actually do the minting. So we'll do that as well. Okay. There's a ton of code here. And like I said, we definitely would not have written all that code without having compiled and written some tests first, but we decided we wanted to just write it all, write it all first. So, and I, I did some misspellings. Let's just make sure everything compiles here. Awesome. Everything's compiled here. As you already know, a couple things that we're going to need to do to test this out. First thing we're going to need to do is write our deploy function. We've got our basic NFT. We've got our random NFT. Both of these hosted on IPFS. Now we're going to do a dynamic NFT that's hosted 100% on chain. And it changes based off the price of an asset. So let's do this. O3. Deploy, dynamic, SVG, NFT.js. We already know we're going to need a little bit of boilerplate. So let's go to our basic NFT and we'll just grab all this, the first, you know, seven lines or so. And we'll just paste it in here. What do we need for our constructor? Well, we need a price feed address, a low SVG, and a high SVG. Okay. So let's get all of those. So price feed address is something we've already done before. We can add that into our helper hardhead config and we'll do one. And if we're on local, we're going to use what? We're going to use a mock. And if we're on rink B or an actual network, we're going to use an actual address. So let's go ahead to docs.chain.link. We'll grab a price feed address, EVM, Ethereum data feeds. We'll go to rink B, rink B. And let's just use ETH USD. Copy that. We'll make a new entry, ETH USD price feed. Like so, and for localhost, we're good. So since we know for localhost, we're going to need to do a mock. Let's see if we have a price feed mock. Okay, no, we don't. We're going to need a mock v3 aggregator.soul. I just copy pasted mine. If you want, you can just go right to the to our repo here, or you can copy from a previous section. Just a reminder, hard hat F, NFT FCC contracts test mock v3 aggregator. And this is using 0 0.06 of Solidity. So we're going to want to make sure that in our hardhat.config, we have at least one 0 0.6 version, which we do. So we're good there. So that means in our deploy mocks, we're going to want to add So initial price will be 2000 decimals will be 18. So now we have a way to deploy mocks for that price feed. So we're going to say const chain ID equals network dot config dot chain ID. We'll do if development chains dot includes network dot name. And then we'll need to import development chains. Looks like we already did. We'll say const F USD aggregator equals. We'll get that price feed equals awaits. Ethers.get contract mock v3 aggregator. And then we'll up here, we'll do let ethusd price feed address. ethusd price feed address equals ethusd aggregator dot address. Else we'll say the ethusd price feed address is going to be equal to what we find in the network config. Network config chain ID dot F USD price. Okay. So we have the F USD price feed. Great. Now we need the low SVG and the high SVG. So we're going to create a new folder in our images folder. We go CD images, MKDIR, dynamic NFT. And now we'll have two folders in here dynamic, which is empty, and random, which has all the random stuff. Uh, if you want to use your own SVGs for this, you absolutely can. 
but if you want to just come to my images file and then save these images as, so just come right click, save image as, save them, and then drag and drop them into your images files here, you can absolutely do that. So now that we have those, we wanna go ahead and read those into our script here. We'll say const low SVG equals await, and we're gonna use FS again. So we're gonna do const FS equals require, FS, we do await fs.read file sync. We're going to read in this file, which for me, it's at dot slash images slash dynamic NFT slash brown dot SVG. And we're using encoding of UTF eight. And then we'll say const high SVG equals await fs.read file sync. Copy this whole thing because we're using the same stuff. So this one's gonna be happy.svg and that's it. So when price is good, we're gonna do happy.svg. When price is bad, we're gonna do frown.svg. Now let's go ahead and let's deploy this contract. So we'll say arguments or args equals, it's gonna be the price feed address, low SVG and then high SVG. And we'll say const dynamic SVG NFT equals await deploy dynamic SVG NFT, comma, a little bracket here, from deployer, args, args, log true, and the wait confirmations, it's gonna be network.config.block confirmations or one. We'll do some logging, right, we'll do log, do to do at, at bed Larry, do some verification. I'm actually just going to copy paste that from our, our last script because it's going to be exactly the same copy paste. But instead of random IPFS, it's going to be dynamic SVG NFT. And the rest of this looks good. And that's just about it. So we'll do module dot exports dot tags equals and we'll do all dynamic SVG and we'll do main. Ooh, okay. Let's try to see if our deploy script that we just created works. So do HH or yarn hard hat deploy dash dash tags die dynamic SVG. That makes sense because we didn't deploy the mocks. So we'll do tags dynamic SVGs and then also the mocks. Local network detected deploying mocks. We deploy the mocks deploying dynamic SVG. Awesome. You know what comes next, you gosh darn right. It's time for some tests. Now, once again, I'm going to encourage you to pause the video now and try to write your own tests for this. The test for this section actually can be a little bit tricky since we are gonna be manipulating the price of our mock aggregator. We are checking for these long strings and such. So be sure to use the GitHub repository associated with this lesson in case you get lost. Now, I want to show you what this looks like on a marketplace like OpenSea. So we are gonna deploy this to RinkB. Now keep in mind, test nets can be slow, so you might wanna be patient here. And you don't even have to do it if you don't want to, but it is kind of nice to see, okay, that's what it really looks like. And you can go to the contract on chain once it's verified and you can read the token URI and everything, and it is pretty fun. So let's just add one more bit to our deploy folder. Let's add a mint script that just mints an NFT for each one of these contracts. So we're gonna create an 04 mint, JS, and we're just gonna have each one of these contracts mint an NFT. Let's go ahead and do this. So in here, we'll do const ethers network equals require hard hat. And then I'm gonna do a little copy paste in. I'm just gonna copy this part because I know I'm gonna need that. We are gonna need a deployer, but we're not gonna need to deploy. So I'll grab get named accounts. Get named accounts, it's gonna come right from there. So we have a deployer. Our deployer is just gonna be used to mint though. First we'll mint the basic NFT. So we'll say const basic NFT equals await ethers.getContract basic NFT and we'll connect the deployer to it. And then we'll say const basic mint NFT or basic mint TX equals await basic NFT dot mint NFT. And then we'll do await 
basic mint tx.wait one, and then we'll do a little console.log basic NFT index zero has token URI, and then we'll put in a little await basic NFT dot token URI of zero. That's it for the basic NFT. Now we'll do our random IPFS NFT. So we'll say const random IPFS NFT equals await ethers dot get contract random IPFS NFT connected to the deployer. This one we need a mint fee. So we'll say const mint fee equals await random IPFS NFT dot get mint fee. And then we'll do the mint. So we'll say const random IPFS NFT mint TX equals await random IPFS NFT dot request NFT. And for this one, we need to pass a value, which is going to be the mint fee dot to string. Now for this one, just like what we saw in our tests, we're going to have to do this await new promise again, right? Because we need to wait for it to return. We need to listen for those events. We probably should set up the listener first. So let's actually set up the listener first. So we're going to do await new promise and we're going to do async function and we're going to do resolve eject in here. We're going to use that, that fun little arrow syntax in here. And now since we're in this function here, we can actually set the timeout resolve like this which means we have five minutes to time this out. You might want to bump this up even more. Five minutes might not be enough. This is going to be 300 milliseconds here. We're going to do that once again. So we'll say random IPFS NFT dot once. Once we get that NFT minted event, we're going to run an async function. We're just going to do resolve. And inside here is where we can actually put actually requesting the NFT, but below our listener, right? So in there, and then we can say if development chains dot includes network dot name. So let's just make sure we import those development chains and network. Perfect. Development chains dot includes network dot name. So if we're on a test net, this is where we go ahead and we pretend to be those mocks. Right? So we'll say const request ID equals random IPFS. Oh, actually, we're going to need to do uh, Const random IPFS NFT mint TX receipt <laughs> equals await random IPFS NFT mint TX dot wait one. So we're going to need to get the receipt. And from the receipt, we can get the request ID dot events one dot args dot request ID dot to string. Then we can do const VRF coordinator v2 mock equals await ethers dot get contract. BRF coordinator v2 mock. We'll connect this to the deployer. And then we'll do await BRF coordinator v2 mock dot fulfill random words with request ID random IPFS NFT dot address. We can do console dot log random IPFS NFT index zero token URI. Do await random IP best NFT dot token URI of zero. Finally, we can do our dynamic SVG NFT. So we can say const high, high value equals ethers dot utils dot we'll do parse ether here. So we'll say $4,000 $4, will be the high value. We'll say const dynamic SVG NFT equals await ethers dot get contract dynamic SVG NFT will connect it to the deployer, we'll say const dynamic SVG NFT mint TX equals await dynamic SVG NFT dot mint NFT high value dot to string, and then we'll just do await this dot wait one. And finally, console.log dynamic SVG NFT index zero token URI is going to be await dynamic SVG NFT dot token URI of zero. Okay, 
I think that looks good. Let's try this on a local network. So we'll do yarn, hard hat deploy, and we'll run all those scripts. And it looks like everything worked. So we have random basic NFT index zero has a token URI of this IPFS thing. Random IPFS NFT index zero has this thing. And then our SVG has this giant monstrosity. Okay, perfect. And then we can even check, right? We could even grab this IPFS hash. We go to our IPFS node, or if you installed IPFS into your browser or you're working with Brave, we can just pop it right into our browsers and see what it looks like, right? And then if I zoom in, an adorable St. Bernard with the image of the St. Bernard, looking like that. This one's also gonna be St. Bernard. And then of course, our SVG, which we can also copy paste. And boom, that looks great. And then we can copy the image. And it's a frowny face, oh, shad. But awesome, okay. So it's working locally for us. Now let's go ahead and try to make this work on an actual testnet. So hopefully our helper hard hat config is set up correctly and there's enough stuff in here. We need to make sure that we have a subscription ID, right? We're gonna need to make sure we have a subscription ID and we shouldn't call the mint function, right? Cause we're gonna need to add our consumer to the VRF before we can actually mint. So let me, uh, let's add some tags to our mint here. So we'll do module.exports dot tags equals and we'll say all comma mint uh a while ago i said okay let's add a main tag now we're coming around to why we added this main tag here so what we want to do is we want to deploy all of these contracts but before we finally mint for our ipfs one we need to add that contract to our consumer here's what we're going to do we're going to run yarn hard hat deploy dash dash network Rinkaby dash dash tags main. Now this won't mint any of our NFTs. Okay, it won't mint any of our NFTs. It'll just deploy those contracts. You might have to sit around and wait a little bit for these to actually deploy. So this is a great time to go take a break, maybe go take a walk, get a sip of water, get a cup of coffee, whatever you want to do. But yeah, once everything is deployed, then we can go to vrf.chain.link. We're already connected here. We used our subscription and then we would just add our IPFS consumer in here, and we'd be good to go. And all right, once everything goes through and we have all three of our transactions on the blockchain, we can go ahead, we can grab our random IPFS NFT. We'll grab that address. We'll come back over to vrf.chain.link slash rinkb. We'll go to our subscription ID and we'll add a new consumer. We'll add that contract address. So we'll go ahead and approve in MetaMask. And once this goes through, we can finish running the mint part of our deploy folder. Once it's confirmed, we can close, maybe even do a little refresh. And we should see our new address added as a subscription here. And now that we've added that, we can mint one NFT from each one of these contracts. Yarn hard hat deploy dash dash tags mint dash dash network rink B. And we'll have to wait a little bit for this too. Okay, and now that we have them all minted, we should get a little output like this. Right, basic NFT zero has token URI here. Basic random IPFS NFT has token URI here. And then our SVG has this as a token URI. So what can we do now? Well, let me go grab, I'll grab my wallet address and stick it into Rink B Etherscan. And we can see we called mint, request, and mint again. And we created three contracts, right? We created our basic NFT, our random IPFS NFT, and our dynamic. SVG NFT. What we can do now is we can grab, we can copy the address of our contract and we can go to testnets.opensea.io and we can put that address in the bar here, in the search bar here. Now, this part is incredibly, incredibly variable, okay? OpenSea can be really slow and it can take OpenSea up to a couple of hours to register that a contract has been deployed to a testnet. So if it doesn't show up right away, don't be discouraged. Don't let it drag you down. But if it does, you should be able to click on your collection and see the NFT is actually here. I'm going to grab our random IPFS NFT. Let's grab that contract address. I'm going to grab that testnets.opensea.io. Let's paste that address in there. And what do you know? We do indeed see random IPFS NFT, right? And I've deployed a couple of them. So this one's V2. And we have our adorable Shiba Inu right here. So this is what it'll look like on OpenSea. Now we can 100% verify 
that our code is good, even if it doesn't show up on OpenSea. If we go to the contract, we go to read contract, then we go to token URI, we'll punch in zero here, query, grab this, stick it into our browsers. JSON looks good. So let's grab the image URI, paste that in. And if we can see this here, that means that our code is good and you have successfully deployed a number of NFTs to the blockchain. We have learned a massive amount in this course. This is definitely one of the most jam-packed one. And it's all about art, right? Isn't that crazy? So let's do a quick refresher of this entire course here. So first off, we learn the basics of an NFT with our basic NFT.soul. We learn that these NFTs are based off of the ERC721 standard. And that just means they have functions like name, token URI, etc. We learned that NFTs use this token URI to tell us what the token actually looks like. A token URI will look something like this. It's going to be a name, a description. It's going to have an image URL, which points to a different location for what the NFT actually looks like. It'll have stuff like attributes. It can have stuff like attributes and a few other tags. This is known as the metadata of the NFT. And this tells us about the NFT. We can also have all that metadata on chain, of course, to customize it on chain and make it look and grow and change and be interactive on chain. We learned more about IPFS. And we actually wrote a script called upload to pinata.js where we can actually programmatically upload images and files to another IPFS pinning service for us. We can, of course, always use our own IPFS nodes if we want. Now, this token URI can really be anything. And we hosted it on IPFS for our basic NFT and for our random NFT. But for our dynamic NFT, we actually hosted the token URI 100% on chain. So we didn't use IPFS. And we made this dynamic where the token URI actually changes based off of the price of a chain link price feed. In our random IPFS NFT, we gave our NFT a chance. We gave different rarities to the different dogs so that we could create programmatically rare NFTs where our pug is super rare, our Shiba is sort of rare, and our St. Bernard is pretty common. So the fact that we got a Shiba in you was awesome. We did some amazing deployments. We wrote some tests. Not only that, but we learned a lot about transactions and how we can actually add whatever data we want to this data section and a little bit more about what our transactions look like and how we can actually use function selectors and function signatures to be able to call anything, right? And we learned more about abi.encoding and encoding packed and all this binary stuff if you wanted to go deep into that. So this was an absolutely jam-packed session and you should be incredibly proud of yourself, especially with your little poppy that you can see on OpenSea or you can see directly on Etherscan or you can just look at it at IPFS and be really proud of what you've done. But with that being said, huge congratulations on making this far. Definitely, definitely, definitely take a break here and we'll see you in the next one. Okay, now we have lesson 15, which is gonna be our next JS NFT marketplace. And if you finish this lesson, you are a Web3 full stack monster. This is going to be our most complicated front end using the Web3 stack and using a lot of really advanced Web3 and blockchain tools. So get really excited because we are going to learn a ton in this lesson. Now, there are actually three different repos associated with this lesson. The first one is going to be our typical hard hat project for the back end. After the hard hat project, we actually have two repos. Both are going to be our front end repos and they're going to be slightly different. In this project, we're going to learn more about how events are so important and why events are so important, especially for off chain services. And so we're actually going to look at two different ways to work with them, one using the Morales or a centralized database, and then one using the graph. And the reason that I want to show both of these is that oftentimes when people are looking to scale their projects, when people are looking to get things done really quickly, taking a more centralized approach can often be a little quicker. And you can sometimes add more functionality to your website. And there's still a lot of protocols that have decentralized backends and centralized frontends. One such example is OpenSea. OpenSea, for example, has the ability to actually like different NFTs. Now, this isn't something that we would actually want to spend any gas on. 
but it is something that we're gonna have to store in some type of database somewhere so that people have the ability to do that. So I wanna show you this optional first way to build these front ends. Since all of our logic is still going to be 100% on chain, the front end matters a little bit less because anybody can still interact with the contracts that we build on chain. Now in Web3, we don't wanna stay there. However, getting an MVP done, getting a minimum viable project done is really, really important. So using a centralized server like Morales or a centralized project can make us much quicker. In fact, we have been using centralized services like Alchemy kind of throughout this whole project. But of course, I also wanna show you the decentralized way to make your front end. So after we work with Morales, we're also gonna show you how to use the graph then for, to do all this event indexing. Now the graph is gonna be the decentralized way we can make our front end and work with these events. And the graph also comes with its own graph repo. So we'll learn all about that once we get to the front end section. But let me show you what we're gonna build because it is really cool. Now that we've learned a ton about how to make NFTs, what they are, we're gonna make our own NFT marketplace. And like I said, this is really gonna be our deep dive into all these amazing front end tools. So here's what our front end is gonna look like. But what we can do is we can connect with our little connect button. We hit MetaMask, MetaMask pops up. We'll go ahead and connect. And now that we're connected, we can see the different NFTs in here. And if we're on an address that's owned by us, it'll say owned by you. And if we switch addresses, our UI will go ahead and update, we'll connect there. And now we're owned by a different address. Now, if it's owned by us, we'll get this little hover that says update listing. And right now it's worth 0.1 ETH. That's what it's listed for on our marketplace. If it's owned by us and we click it, we can update it to a different price. Let's update it to 50 ETH or whatever your layer one currency is. We'll do save new listing price. We'll go ahead and confirm. It'll say listing updated, please refresh. And what we can do then, and we'll mine some blocks on the back end, and boom, now we see that it's worth 50 here. Now, if we switch to a different account, now we can see owned by blah, 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 and the hover now says buy me. And if I select it, as a different user, I'm gonna get this transaction to actually buy it. And I can go ahead and confirm that I'm gonna buy it. I'll get a little pop-up that says item bought successfully. Now, if I do a little refresh, we'll now see that that NFT is gone from the marketplace since we bought it, right? And it's no longer available to be sold. Now, what we can do then is we can come over to sell NFTs. And at the bottom, we'll see a withdraw proceeds. So whenever somebody buys an NFT, the NFT marketplace actually keeps the proceeds. It actually keeps the result of the sale. So if we switch back to our address that had the NFT listed, we can now see withdraw 50 proceeds because we know that we have 50 ETH because we just bought that for 50. So if we hit withdraw, MetaMask is gonna pop up. We can go ahead and confirm, we'll wait a little bit as the transaction populates. And boom, once it goes through, we'll see now we have zero proceeds, right? We withdrew everything from here. So what we can do now is we can relist that NFT. So if we come back, let's go back to the one who just bought that NFT. If we know the address and the token ID of the NFT and we own it, we can go ahead and relist it. So we can place the address in here with the token ID, and give it some sort of price, we'll submit. We'll approve giving the NFT marketplace access to our NFT, to our little doggy, and then we'll go ahead and actually send the transaction to actually list the NFT on a marketplace. Then we get NFT listed successfully. After we move some blocks in the back end, we can go back to the front end and we now see it's owned by us instead of the original owner, right? And it's set for 10 ETH here. And then we can of course switch back to a different user and we could have them actually buy. So this is gonna be a NFT marketplace that's completely decentralized. We are going to learn a ton about front end, a ton about indexing, a ton about events and why they are so powerful. And I'm really excited for you for this one because if you get through this one, you will have so many tools at your fingertips for working with the blockchain. Are you ready? Let's jump in, let's build the contracts first and then we'll build the front end. Let's do this. Now this project is gonna be based off the Ardeon project which is a completely open source, decentralized smart contract NFT marketplace. I'll leave a link to it in the GitHub repo associated with this course. Ours, of course, is gonna be a minimalistic version of this. So we're in our VS Code, pretty normal, and we're gonna create a new folder here called Hardhat NFT 
marketplace, FCC. Oops, MKDIR, like that. We're going to CD into it and then open this up in its own VS Code. Once again, you can use code period or file open folder and open this folder. Once we get in here, we're going to do all of our normal stuff that we've been doing throughout the course. And once again, if you want to copy paste over your package JSON, if you want to copy paste no modules, whatever you want to do, feel free to do so. I'm going to go ahead, actually, this repo here, I'm going to scroll up and just grab once again, this line from lesson nine and just run that. I know I'm going to be using prettier. So I'm just going to go ahead and copy paste those two prettier files over prettier ignore and prettier RC going to be using them again. For linting with Solidity, we're going to use soulhint.json. So we're going to grab that dot soulhint.json and the dot soulhint.ignore. I'm also going to grab the hardhat.config.js because we're going to be using a really, really similar setup. And this hardhat.config.js, it's got waffle in it, etherscan, hardhat deploy, coverage, gas reporter, sizer, and .env.config. We're going to bring over our .env. And we're also going to bring over our utils folder as well. Right, so a lot of that boilerplate we're going to bring on over. And now just like that, since we have the hardhat.config.js in here, if we run yarn hardhat right now, yarn hardhat, we'll actually see we get the output like this. So let's go ahead and before we actually write our contracts, let's go ahead and write a little doc saying what our contract is even going to do. What do we want this to do? We're going to create a decentralized NFT marketplace. So what does that mean? What will we probably need? Well, we'll probably need some type of list item function because we'll want to list NFTs and this will be to list NFTs on the marketplace. We'll need some type of buy item to buy the NFTs. And then we'll probably need maybe like a cancel listing or cancel item if you no longer want to sell it. Maybe an update listing to update price and then maybe a withdraw proceeds to withdraw payment for my bought NFTs. So when somebody buys an NFT, I'm going to have to withdraw it from the contract since the contract is going to be the one to actually hold those funds. That looks pretty good to me. Let's go ahead and start building this. So let's create a new folder contracts and let's jump into this. So we'll create a new file NFT marketplace. That's all. So let's get our boilerplate SPDX. Fragma solidity carrot 0.8.7 contract NFT marketplace. Boom. So if we're doing this all right, HH compile or yarn hardhead to compile or MPX hardhead compile. Boom. Things are looking good. So if we go back to our readme, we can grab these here. We even stick them in as like a little comment for us to kind of reference later on. Let's start with listing the items. How are we going to keep track of listing people's items? And once again, remember when I'm usually coding this, I'm going back and forth between writing tests and writing the actual code. We're just going to write all the solidity in one chunk and then go write the tests. So we're going to say that these are going to be our main functions. And we're going to start with function list item. And we are going to make this one look really, really good. So we're going to do NAT spec and everything. This is going to need to be an external function, right? We're probably not going to want any of our internal functions calling list item. It's going to be called by external projects or external accounts. We're probably going to need an address, NFT address, right? The address of the NFT contract, a UN 256 token ID, the ID of the token ID of the contract that we're going to use. And then we're going to want to set a UN 256 price. So first off, we're probably going to want the price to be greater than zero. So maybe we'll put in like a little if or a require statement here. So we'll say if price is less than or equal to zero, then we'll go ahead and revert with a price must be above zero error. And then of course, we'll prepend it with the name of the contract in two underscores. And then at the top, say error, price must be above zero. Now, in order for us to list it, we could actually do this one of two ways. We could one, we could send the NFT to the contract. This would require us doing like a transfer, right? And we could have, we could have the contract hold the NFT. Now we could do this, but this is going to be kind of gas expensive for someone to actually list their NFT. 
and we can have the owner of the NFT be our NFT marketplace. We could 100% do that. The issue with this, though, is that the marketplace will then own the NFT and the user won't be able to say like, hey, I own this NFT. It's in the marketplace. They technically would be able to, but they would have to withdraw it. We might do this a, a slightly different way where we could say owners can still hold their NFT and give the marketplace approval to sell the NFT for them. Now, of course, the owners of the NFT could withdraw approval at any time and the marketplace wouldn't be able to sell it anymore. However, this would be really easy for people to actually read. They would all they would have to do is read like is approved for marketplace and they could actually see if the item was really listed or not. So we're going to go ahead and write it this second way because that's what RDN does. And this is the least intrusive way to have this marketplace, right? People still will have ownership of their NFTs and the marketplace will just have approval to actually swap and sell their NFT once their prices are met. So since we want to make sure the marketplace has approval, let's make sure the marketplace has approval. So we can call, we can call this get approved function on that token ID to make sure that the marketplace is approved to work with the NFT. To do this, we're going to need the IERC 720 interface. And we can actually grab that from Open Zeppelin, right? And this interface will wrap around an address, and then we can call get approved on that address. So we'll do import at open zeppelin slash contracts slash token slash ERC721 slash IERC721 dot soul. And since we're doing an import from Open Zeppelin, we'll do yarn add dash dash dev add open zeppelin. Now that we have this interface in here, what we can do is we'll say IERC 721 NFT equals IERC 721 wrapped around this NFT address that we're passing it. And we'll say if NFT dot get approved of the token ID that we're trying to list does not equal address this. So if we are not approved, then we'll revert not approved for market place. And then we'll, of course, we'll want to do prepend it with NFT marketplace and two underscores. Say error like this, bada bing, bada boom. Now that we've gotten a little bit of that out of the way, we're probably gonna wanna have some type of data structure to list all these NFTs. And typically we could say, okay, do we wanna use an array or do we wanna use a mapping? What do you think? Before we continue, let's pause for a second. Do you think it makes more sense to put these NFTs in an array or in a mapping? And when you're thinking about this, try to think about, okay, well, people are gonna have to buy these and sell these. What makes more sense? Think about this for a second, maybe pause it and, uh, and write in a comment here what, uh, what you think, an array or a mapping is better. Now, if you said mapping, I would agree with you. You could do an array and you wouldn't necessarily be wrong, but it's not the way that I would go about this. For an array, Anytime someone wants to buy an item, we're going to have to traverse through the array. We're going to have to make this massive dynamic array. And that might get a little bit dicey as that array gets really, really big. So we're going to go ahead and make this a mapping. And this is probably going to be a global variable or a state variable. So up at the top, let's go ahead and create this mapping. It's going to be a mapping of addresses, of NFT addresses. Right? So this is going to be the NFT contract address mapped to the NFT token ID mapped to some type of listing. So we'll say an, a mapping of address to a mapping of UNT 256 to, well, what, what do we want here? Well, we want, we want the price, right? So is that another UNT 256? But we also want, we also want to keep track of the sellers. So we know who, who to send money to. So we could make two mappings or we could just create a new type of type listing. Let's go ahead and do that. We'll comment this out for now. And so at the top, since this is going to be a type, we're going to say struct listing. And in here, we're going to do a UNT256, the price of the NFT, and then an address, the seller of the NFT. And now that we have that new typing, we can uncomment this. We can say NFT contract address mapped to the NFT token ID mapped to the listing. And we'll make this a private variable called S underscore listings. Now back down in our list item function, we're going to update that S listing mapping. So we're going to say S listing of NFT address, right? The address of the NFT at the token ID is going to equal, we're going to create a listing 
of the price and then who? Well, the seller is going to be message.sender, right? So message.sender because they're the one who's actually listing the item. And since we're updating a mapping here, what's the best practice for update mappings? You guessed it. We need to emit an event. And especially for this project, you're going to see why emitting events for at least this project, this is so helpful. So we're going to go ahead and emit an item listed event, which we're going to create in just a second. And we'll give it the message.sender, the NFT address, the token ID, and the price. Item listed. And then up at the top, of course, but below our struct here, we're going to say event, item listed. We'll do an address indexed seller, address indexed NFT address, address indexed token ID, and then a UINT256 price. Sorry, this needs to be a UINT256 token ID. UINT56. This looks pretty good to us. However, we probably want to make sure we only list NFTs that haven't already been listed. So we can add like an if then in here. And this is kind of where preference comes in a little bit, but I'm actually going to create a modifier called not listed. So we make sure we don't relist NFTs that are already listed above our main functions. I'm going to do like a little, I'm going to create a modifier, a not listed. And this is going to take an, uh, an address, NFT address, a UN256 token ID, and an address owner. And what we're going to say is we're going to check, we're going to make a new listing, memory listing equals S underscore listings of NFT address, token ID. Now we're going to say if listing.price is greater than zero, we're going to go ahead and revert with already I'm going to pass in an NFT address and a token ID. And of course, we're going to prepend this with NFT marketplace. And at the top, we do error NFT marketplace already listed like so. And then we're going to put our little underscore right underneath. And then up here, we'll do address NFT address, you went 256. Token ID. So this modifier looks pretty good. Let's just make sure it's actually going to compile. We'll do yarn hardhead compile or HH compile. Great. That looks good. We'll add this modifier to our list item function. We'll do NFT address, token ID, message.sender. Cool. What else should we check for here? Well, we should also check that the NFT that's being listed is owned by message.sender. This way only the owners of the NFT can actually list it here. So let's go ahead and we'll add a is owner modifier. Modifier is owner, NFT address, token ID, spender, the UINT256 here, and an address spender, IERC721 NFT equals IERC721 NFT address. Address owner equals NFT dot owner of token ID. And then we'll say if spender does not equal owner, then we'll revert with a not owner error that we're going to go ahead and create up top. So we'll say error, not owner, and we'll prepend it with NFT marketplace with two underscores. So revert, revert, not owner. And then we'll do underscore for the rest of the code. And boom, now underneath our not listed, we'll do is owner, NFT address, token ID, message.sender. So now our list item checks to see if it's already listed, make sure that only the owner of the NFT of that token ID can list it, and then it goes ahead and lists it. Looking nicely. Okay, cool. So that is our list item method here. Now let's go ahead and do a little bit of NAT spec on this. And now we have a little NAT spec here, which looks really professional. All right, great. So we have a list item function. All right, what's next? Well, maybe let's make a buy item function for people to buy their NFTs after they've been listed. So let's create that. We'll do function buy item. So we'll take an address, NFT address, EU256 
token ID, and this will be an external function. And then we'll also make this payable, an external function, because we know only people or contracts outside of this contract are going to call buy item and payable so that people can spend ETH to spend ETH or whatever layer one currency to actually buy these prices. We could 100% add chain link prices in. Now for listing, we could of course add price and then do like, you know, address token price and do what we did before with chain link price feeds to convert the price of these tokens into how much they actually cost. And we could 100% do that with chain link price feeds, but for simplicity, we're gonna leave that off. But I will put that as a challenge to you. So your challenge is going to be have this contract accept payment in a subset of tokens as well. Of course, we would need to, I'm gonna give a little hint here, use chain link price feeds to convert the price of the tokens between each other. We're gonna choose which NFT and which token ID we want to buy. So what's the first thing that we probably want to do? Well, we probably want to check that this buy item is actually listed. So we're actually going to make a new modifier. Instead of not listed, we'll make it is listed. Oh, up in modifiers, modifier is listed. And this is going to take an address, NFT address, a UN256 token ID. And to check to see if this is listed, we'll say listing, memory, listing equals s underscore listings of the NFT address of the token ID. So we're going to go into the mapping here, and then we're just going to check the price. So we'll say if the listing dot price is less than or equal to zero. So basically, if there's no price, if it's defaulted to zero, if the price is zero, then we're going to say revert not listed NFT address token ID. Then of course, we're going to prepend NFT marketplace, NFT marketplace, underscore, underscore, not listed. And then we're going to copy this. And up here, we're going to say error, not listed. And this is going to take address, NFT address, and a uint256 token ID, like so. And then down in our modifier, then we're just going to add the underscore to add the rest of our code here. So now we have an is listed modifier where we're going to check to make sure that that NFT is actually listed. Down here now, we're gonna say is listed address, NFT address, or excuse me, NFT address and token ID. Now, once again, we're gonna say listing memory listed item equals S underscore listings, NFT address, token ID. We're gonna say if message.value is less than listed item dot price, then we're going to revert with price not met. And then we'll do NFT address, token ID, listed item dot price, like so. So we're going to create a new error, price not met, error, price not met. Of course, we're going to prepend this with NFT marketplace. We're going to take an address, NFT address, uint256, token ID, and then a uint256 price. So we can see exactly how the price wasn't met. And then back down here, we'll make it the full error. So we want to make sure they're sending us enough money, first of all. So when they send this money, it needs to belong to whomever listed the item. So we actually need to keep track of how much money these people have. So let's create another data structure called proceeds where we keep track of how much money people have earned selling their NFTs. So we'll create a mapping of address to UN256. And this is going to be a mapping of seller address to amount earned. And we'll make this private we'll call it S underscore proceeds. And what we'll do is when somebody buys an item, is we'll update their proceeds. So we'll say S proceeds of the listed item dot seller equals S proceeds of the listed item dot seller plus MSG dot value. Now, once we buy this item, we're going to want to delete the listing. So to delete a mapping from a ret, so to delete an entry in a mapping, we just use delete. S underscore listings, 
NFT address of the token ID. So we remove that mapping. And then finally, we're going to go ahead and transfer it. So we'll say IERC 721 NFT address. We're going to call dot transfer from. We listed item dot seller to the message dot sender with the token ID. Now you'll notice something here. We don't just send the seller the money. Now, why is that? Well, Solidity has this concept called pull over push, and it's considered a best practice when working with Solidity. You want to shift the risk associated with transferring Ether to the user. So instead of sending the money to the user, this is what we don't want to do. We want to have them withdraw the money. We always want to shift the risk of working with money and working with ETH or whatever layer one you're working with to the actual user. So we don't want to send them the money directly. We want to create this as proceeds data structure, and we can have them withdraw from it later on. Now we could probably do some checking here where we could say, okay, check to make sure the NFT was transferred. And if we look at IERC 721 though, and we look at the transfer from function, we don't see it actually has a return. And if we go to EIP 721, we can see that none of these have a return type though. Transfer from doesn't have a return type here. However, we do see this safe transfer from bit. Safe transfer from is going to be a little bit better, right? Because if we look at transfer from transfers ownership of an NFT, the caller is responsible to confirm that underscore two is capable of receiving NFTs or else they may be permanently lost. So maybe instead we want to use safe transfer from which throws an error unless message.sender is a current owner an authorized operator or blah, blah, blah. So instead of transfer from, we're going to actually use safe transfer from just to be a little bit safer. So we'll do safe transfer from instead of transfer from. And then since we're updating a mapping, we're going to do what? You guessed it. Let's emit an event. We'll call it item bot. We'll have it be a message.sender, NFT address, token ID, and for listed item.price. So up at the top, let's create a new event event item bot and this will be a, an address indexed buyer an address indexed nft address an address indexed token id and then a unit 256 price just kidding that doesn't look fantastic this should be a unit 256 now it looks fantastic now in this buy item, we've set this up in a way that is safe from something called a re-entrancy attack. And we've been coding these contracts in a way where we kind of do all this state change first, and then we transfer the NFT, the token, or et cetera. But why are we doing that? Cognitively, we think it might make sense. Okay, first, maybe we should actually send the NFT, right? We'd want to send the NFT first. This is actually a huge security vulnerability. And to understand why, let's learn about one of the most common hacks in blockchain, the reentrancy attack. Now in this sub lesson, we're gonna talk about reentrancy. And in the GitHub repo associated with this lesson, we're gonna have the code for everything that we're gonna go through here. And the code that we're looking at is based off of this solidity by example, reentrancy example, and I have a link to it in the GitHub repo associated with this course. Now I have a sample contract here. It's a place where you can deposit and withdraw your ETH. So what it does is it has a mapping called balances where you can call deposit and it'll update how much you've deposited into the protocol. And then it has a withdraw function as well. So what it does is it first grabs your balance from this balances mapping, make sure that you have more than zero. And then the way that we've been sending ETH this whole time, we do message.sender.call. We send the balance and then we update balances of message.sender equals zero. Now, this is the line that actually makes this contract incredibly vulnerable. And if we run this right now, though, we'll say, hey, no, it looks like it's working as expected. We can go to deploy. If I copy the account that I'm working with, click that in, I have balance of zero. We can deposit, you know, let's go to wet, let's go to ether. 
we'll deposit two ether, come down, we'll hit deposit. Now we'll hit to balance, bounces up. We'll hit withdraw. Now we'll hit bounces, goes back to zero. And it seems like it's working as intended. Now there's actually a way we can attack this function to drain all the money in this contract. And this is what's known as a re-entrancy attack. The two most common kinds of attacks in this space are gonna be re-entrancy attacks, which is what we're talking about here, and Oracle attacks, which usually only happen when a protocol doesn't use a decentralized Oracle. Lucky for you, we're teaching you right from the get-go how to use Chainlink so that you can be protected. And it's these two types of attacks that often result in the most amount of money lost. There's a leaderboard called rec.news, which keeps track of many of the top attacks that have ever happened in the DeFi space. With many of them, if you go into the retrospectives, are either an Oracle attack or a reentrancy attack. And you might be saying, hey, weren't we just talking about NFTs? This, this doesn't have anything to do with NFTs. We'll get there, don't worry. In a new contract below, we're gonna create a new contract called attack down here. And what we'll do with this attack contract is we'll grab this reentrant vulnerable contract. We'll say reentrant vulnerable, public reentrant vulnerable, like so. And we'll save that reentrant vulnerable contract as a global variable. And we'll say constructor address underscore reentrant vulnerable address. And then we'll say reentrant vulnerable equals reentrant vulnerable at reentrant vulnerable address. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a function called attack. And it's this function that's gonna call withdraw in a malicious way. So we're gonna say attack, this is gonna be an external payable contract. And we're gonna call deposit on this. So we'll deposit some money first. So we'll do reentrant vulnerable dot deposit. We'll send a value of one ether. And then immediately we, we will call reentrant vulnerable dot withdraw. Now at first glance, this seems pretty harmless. But remember, when we call message.call like this to send, we're calling back to this, this attack contract. Now, when we call this attack contract, is there a way to execute any other code? Well, there is. Remember how we learned about fallback functions. If we put a fallback function in here, or a receive function, when this code runs call and sends our contract ether, we can have it trigger our fallback function to call withdraw again, so that we'll send our contract more ether than it's due before we update the balance. So let's see what this looks like. So in our fallback here, we'll say, if the address of reentrant vulnerable dot balance is greater than or equal to one ether, AKA we're saying, if there's money left in the contract, then reentrant vulnerable dot withdraw. And then we'll put, put a get balance function in our attacking contract. We're gonna attack reentrant vulnerable by calling withdraw. When we get to this send section, what are we gonna do? We're gonna have our fallback function trigger calling withdraw again. Now, when we call withdraw again, balances of message.sender hasn't been zeroed out yet. So the contract code will go, oh, you still have some money here. Let's go ahead and let's send you that, which will then again trigger us to call withdraw. And so we'll just keep calling withdraw until we're done. So let's see what this looks like. So we compile this and then let's go to deploy. First, let's deploy the reentrant vulnerable contract, All right? And we can have any contract address, you know, like the one that deployed it. We can have a deposit. Let's do, we'll have a deposit one ether, deposit. Now we can check the balances of it. Copy, paste, great. It has one in it. So now let's have it do 10. Deposit it, check the balance. And now we have this much in here. So we have this much in here. And if we withdrew, we would withdraw all of it. And if we switched accounts to somebody else, we hit withdrew, nothing would happen because that other account doesn't have anything, which makes sense. 
so there's a lot of money in here, right? And if we do get balance of the contract, we can see how much money it has, right? It has this much money total. Now what we can do on a different account, let's choose this, this brand new account. Let's go ahead and deploy the attack contract. And we'll pass it the reentrant value address as an input parameter. So we'll deploy that. And now what we'll do is we'll call attack. And you'll see, even though this contract doesn't have anything deposited in the reentrant vulnerable contract, we will still steal all the funds in here, or just about all the funds. So right now, I hit get balance in our reentrant vulnerable. Here's what it is. Get balance of here is zero. You know, there's the address. We hit attack now. Now if I hit get balance, oh, and excuse me, in public and withdraw should be payable as well. Now we'll pass one ether as an input parameter to our attack function, and we're gonna deposit just one ether, and then we're gonna withdraw, and we're gonna keep withdrawing because our fallback function is gonna keep calling withdraw. And all we had it to do was deposit one ether, and we're gonna be able to pull out all 11 that are in here. So we'll hit attack now. Transaction went through. The new balance of our contract is 12 because the one that we deposited and then the 11 that we stole and the new balance of our old contract is now zero. So this is known as a reentrancy attack. Basically, since we call a function in another contract in the middle of our withdraw, we allow code to run on a different contract. And the code that ran runs on this contract recalls withdraw before balances is sent to zero. We get to here, we call the fallback function of our other code and it calls withdraw and we need to reread withdraw before we get to setting balances of message.sender equals zero. So this is an issue, obviously, and there are two ways we can prevent it. There's the easy way and then the mutex way. Uh, I don't wanna say the hard way, it's just a different way. So one of the things you'll always see in security tools is you always want to call any external contract as the last step in your function or the last step in your transaction. And we want to update balances to zero before we call that external contract. Because if balances of message that sender is reset to zero before we call external code, then if it were to try to re-enter this, it would hit this require step and just cancel out right here and wouldn't be able to send any ETH again. So that's the first step that we can do. The next step that we can do is using something called a mutex lock. And this is what Open Zeppelin does with one of the modifiers that they have. We can have some type of a Boolean called locked or something. And just right at the top, we can just say require not locked, otherwise revert. And then the first thing we do in this contract is we can say locked equals true. And then the last thing we do in here is we say locked equals false. And using this lock in here, we only allow one piece of code to ever execute in here at a time. And we only unlock it once the code finishes. Now, Open Zeppelin comes with a reentrancy guard, which we can use on our code. And it has a modifier nod reentrant, which does essentially what we were talking about with our locks. It creates a variable called status and changes it to enter whenever a function has been entered. It runs all the code and then changes it back to not entered when it finishes. And whenever any code runs, it just requires that it is not entered. So if we wanted to use this on our code, we could import at open Zeppelin slash contracts slash security slash reentrancy guard dot soul. We can inherit the functions by saying NFT marketplace is reentrancy guard. And then any function that we're nervous is going to have this reentrancy issue, like maybe buy item, for example, we would just add the modifier non reentrant, just like that. And that'll add that mutex that locking mechanism that we talked about. Now the mutex way is a little bit more explicit with our security, right? Because we're saying, hey, this is locked. This is a non reentrant function. It's still a best practice. Uh, whenever you call external code, like what we see here, is you do all of your state changes before you call ex an external contract. Now you may be saying, oh, that's cool and all, but what about, how does this relate to our NFTs? Well, imagine for a second, instead of message.sender.call, this is, you know, full success equals, you know, some NFT.transfer from. 
and then we do some transfers from stuff in here. And and instead of doing some fallback stuff, our NFT has our NFTs function transfer from does some malicious code to re-enter into our withdraw. If we have our withdraw set up like this, since we're still calling an external contract with NFT to transfer from, that transfer from in that external contract could be malicious and try to re-enter our contract. As a best practice, you always want to change your state before you call any external contracts that you might not have control of. I highly recommend playing around with this a little bit just because seeing is believing. And with that being said, again, all the code for this is gonna be available in the GitHub associated with this lesson for this re-entrant vulnerable code. And with that, let's go back to our NFT project. Okay, so now we know why we're doing this safe transfer from at the bottom of our function here, at the bottom of our buy item, because if our safe transfer function from was a little bit higher, maybe what ends up happening is we send multiple NFTs to the wrong address before we update them. So that's why we do that. And we favor push over pull, as we said here, there's a whole lot of these security tips that you'll learn going on through this course and in Solidity. But this is still fantastic, right? We have our buy item and we have our list item functions. Let's do a cancel item now or cancel listing. So we'll do a function. Cancel listing. We'll do the NFT address and the UN256 token ID. This will be an external function. We'll want to we'll wanna make sure only the owner of this NFT can cancel it. So we'll say is owner, NFT address, token ID, message.sender. We'll wanna make sure that the NFT is actually listed. So we'll do is listed, NFT address, token ID, and great. Now to cancel this, all we're gonna do is we're gonna delete S listings, NFT address, token ID, we're just going to delete that mapping. And then we'll emit an event item canceled of message sender, NFT address, and token ID. And of course, we're going to create a new event here. We'll say event item canceled. And it'll be an address indexed seller address indexed NFT address, UN256 indexed token ID. All right, great. That was pretty quick. Cancel the listing. Boom. Check. Done. What's next? Okay, let's update our listings. So we'll do function update listing address NFT address, UN256 token ID, UN256 new price. We'll update the price of these. Of this be external, we'll make sure it's listed with is listed. We'll say is owner. Do a token ID, and then we'll do message.sender. Now to update our listing, we'll just say s underscore listings of NFT address at token ID dot price equals the new price that we're giving it. And then we'll emit, we could emit like item updated, but we could also just emit an item listed with msg.sender, NFT address, token ID, new price. Because essentially by updating it, we're essentially just relisting it with a new price. So we're just gonna do an item listed event. We only have one more function to do. We need to do a withdraw proceeds. So we'll say function withdraw proceeds, get all the payments for all of our NFTs. So we'll get the, the proceeds by doing unit 256 proceeds equals S underscore proceeds of msg.sender, right? We're getting all the payments that were collected in buy item. And we're saying if proceeds is less than or equal to zero, then we're gonna revert with no proceeds. And we're going to make this a NFT marketplace underscore underscore no proceeds. Like so, create at the top. 
error NFT marketplace, no proceeds, bada bing. Otherwise, we'll say S underscore proceeds of msg.sender equals zero. So we're going to reset the proceeds to zero, right? We're going to do this before we send any proceeds. And then we're going to do our traditional way we send payments. So bool success, comma, equals payable message.sender dot call value is going to be proceeds call blank here and then we could do require you know we could do require success or we could say if not success revert with NFT marketplace transfer failed and then we'll make this a new error error NFT marketplace transfer failed we put a semicolon here and we're looking pretty good. Now we even have a way to withdraw. So we have our five functions here. Awesome. Let's just create a couple getters. So maybe we'll do, we'll even copy this, paste it here. We'll say getter functions like so, and we'll do function. Maybe we'll do get listing, take an address, NFT address, and the UN256 token ID. External view, which returns a listing in memory. And we'll just say return s underscore listings of NFT address, token ID, like so. And then we'll say function get proceeds of address seller. External view returns uint256 return s underscore proceeds of the seller. So we'll get how much money somebody is owed and then any listings. And let's run a little compile here. Yarn hardhat compile or HH compile just to see where we messed up. Oh, we didn't mess up. Wow, that's great. And now guess what? You have successfully created a minimalistic NFT marketplace that's completely decentralized. That is pretty wild, and that is incredibly powerful, and you should feel really excited for yourself. Very cool, very good job, but you know we're not done. We got to write some deploys and some tests, so let's jump into that. Now, since we've done this a couple of times, I actually encourage you to pause the video here and try writing your own deploy scripts and your own tests, and then go ahead, come back, and follow along with us and see if you did it correctly. Going to create a new folder called deploy, of course. And we already have the hardhead deploy in our hardhead config, so we know we're good to go here. So let's go ahead and create a one deploy NFT marketplace.js. Now, once again, you've seen a lot of this before, so we're gonna spare the details. We'll do const network equals require hardhat. We'll do const development chains equals require dot dot slash helper hard hat config, which we should have. Let's see. Do we copy paste it over? No. Okay. So we didn't copy paste over our helper hard hat config from the last project. Let's go ahead and grab it or we can grab it from the smart contract lottery. Let's go ahead and paste that in here. And we really only need this file for the development chains here, right? For hard hat and local host. We're going to grab the development chains from that. And then we'll also grab const verify equals require. Get this from utils verify, right? Do we have utils? We have verify. Fantastic. Now we'll do module that exports equals async. An async function where it's going to take get named accounts and deployments from the hard hat input parameter, and then we're gonna do const deploy comma log equals deployments, and then const deployer equals await get named accounts, which of course we're getting from our hardhead.config. We have named accounts, we have a deployer, we have a player or whatever you have in here from our last project. And now does our NFT marketplace have a constructor? Construct, nope, no constructor. So we know args is going to be blank. And then we can say const 
NFT marketplace equals await deploy NFT marketplace. We'll say from deployer, args is going to be args. Log will be true. And then wait confirmations will be network.config dot wait confirmations or one two this is gonna be block confirmations we'll go to the config just make sure that those are in here looks like i didn't add them in here so we'll do block confirmations is going to be six for all of our networks so i actually grabbed this not from a last project it looks like i, I grabbed this from the Hard hat starter kit. So I'm just going to add those block confirmations in there. And now we're good to go. Now we're going to say if we're not on a development chain, not development chains dot includes network dot name and process dot env dot ether scan API key. Then we're going to go ahead. We'll do log verifying and then we'll do await verify. NFT marketplace dot address with args. And then we'll do like log a whole bunch of hyphens here. And then finally, module dot exports dot tags equals all and then NFT mar get place. And we can test this deploy function with yarn hard hat deploy. Ta da, we did it. Great. So now we have a deploy function. We can verify we have our contract. What else are we probably going to need to do? Since this is an NFT marketplace, we're probably going to need some NFTs. So what we can do is in our contracts and we'll create a new folder for tests. Create a new file in here called basic nft.soul. And in here we can add that basic NFT from our last project. Or you can just go to my or you can just go to the GitHub repo associated with this course. Go to contracts, test, basic NFT, and then just copy paste. That works too. So this basic NFT that we're using is just pointing to the pug as the basic NFT for us to use just to test this out. So now that we have a basic NFT, we're going to need to create a new file. O2 deploy basic NFT.js. And we'll borrow a lot of the boilerplate from over here. So we'll copy all of this actually. Paste it in. We'll say const args equals blank. And we'll say const basic NFT equals await deploy basic NFT from deployer. Args is going to be args. Log is going to be true. Wait confirmations is going to be network.config.block confirmations or one and then we'll verify this with if not development chains dot includes network dot name and process dot env dot ether scan api key then we'll say log verifying dot 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 await verify basic nft dot address and args module.exports.tags equals all and basic NFT. And we can test both of these with yarn hard hat deploy. And fantastic. Both of these have been deployed. Again, you don't have to pause, but it is a good way to really hone in, to really sharpen those skills on doing all this. And repetition is the mother of all skill. So repeating this stuff yourself and thinking through these problems yourself and trying to code these things yourself are really what's going to make you successful at this. All right, awesome. Now that we have our deploy bits in, it's time to write some tests. Now, if you go to the GitHub repo associated with this course and you go to the test folder, the tests in here are some of the robust we've actually written out of all of our projects. There's a lot of tests in here. Now, pretty much everything in here we've already learned about and you already know how to do. You have the ability to do it. So I'm just going to go ahead and get you started off and we're going to write one test together. And then I highly recommend you going back and you try to write some tests yourself 
to get that code coverage, to get that test coverage to be 100%. So let's go ahead, we'll write one test together, then you should pause this video and try to write some tests yourself. When you're done writing tests and you think you've hit 100%, feel free to compare back to the test that we wrote. So let's create a new folder called tests. We test. And in here, we'll do a new one called unit. And if you want to write staging tests later on, you absolutely can. We will not. We'll create a new file in here called nft marketplace.test.js. And we'll start some tests. So we'll do const assert expect equals require chai const network deployments ethers equals require hardhat const development chains equals require dot dot slash dot dot slash helper hardhat config. And we're gonna do the same setup we've been doing. We'll say bang development chains dot includes network dot name question mark describe dot skip else describe NFT marketplace tests comma async function. Oops, excuse me, this is just going to be a function. Scribable is just a function, not an async function, like so. Great. Now let's get some variables and do a before each. So we'll say NFT marketplace, basic NFT, we'll create a const price. So we'll just always set the price of all of our NFTs to the same thing. This will be ethers.utils.parse ether 0.1. We'll say const token ID for now will always be zero. And then we'll do before each will be an async function. And we'll get, oh, and we'll also get deployer. We'll say deployer equals await get named accounts. So we're gonna need to grab get named accounts from hardhead as well. Wrap this all up dot deployer, like so. And then we'll also in our hardhat.config.js, under get named accounts, we also have something called player. Now I didn't talk about this too much. But we're going to have a second account, which is defaulted to the first index, right? So we can do at the top, we'll do comma player. And we can say player equals await get named accounts dot player. Now we have a player and a deployer account. We'll do await deployments dot fixture all. We'll just deploy all of those contracts. We'll run through everything in our deploy folder. We'll get our NFT marketplace. We'll say NFT marketplace equals await ethers dot get contract NFT marketplace. And then we'll do basic NFT equals await ethers.getContract basic NFT. The way ethers.getContract works is it defaults to grabbing whatever account is at account zero, which right now is our deployer. If we want to call a function on NFT marketplace with the player being the one calling the function, we would have to say NFT marketplace equals await NFT marketplace.connect player like this. And now whenever we call a function, we would use the player instead of the deployer. Sometimes what I like to do, and you'll see this in my code, is I'll do let NFT marketplace contract, and then let NFT marketplace, and then I'll do NFT marketplace contract equals await ethers dot contract. And then I'll connect and set that to the NFT marketplace. Yes, we can do, we can automatically choose who to connect by placing whoever we want to connect to, right, and get contract. But sometimes it's really nice to be kind of explicit. So, and it's really up to you. I'm going to undo all that, but I just wanted to re-show you that to make sure that you knew that's how you kind of switch around with the different accounts and the different users. Now that we have an NFT, we're probably going to need to mint the NFT so that we can actually place it on the market. So we'll do await 
basic NFT dot mint NFT, and then we'll approve to send it onto the marketplace. So we'll do a wait basic NFT dot approve NFT marketplace dot address token ID, which is going to be zero. And just like that, the NFT marketplace, remember, it can't call approve because it doesn't own that NFT. So we need to have the deployer call approve, right? And remember, since we're not, uh, oh, uh, we need to put basic NFT in here. Since we didn't tell Ethers who to connect this to, it just automatically connected it to our deployer because that's what's at account zero. So it's the deployer calling, minting it, and then the deployer approving to send it to the marketplace. Only after this approve function has been called can the NFT marketplace call transfer from on those NFTs. Now we're just gonna do one test here. We're gonna say it lists and can be bought. That's it. And this will be an async function. And we're just gonna list the NFT and buy it. Await NFT marketplace dot. And if we go to our NFT marketplace, what are we doing? We're listing it, right? We wanna list the item for it with the address, token ID and the price. So we'll do dot list item basic NFT dot address token ID is zero, which we've defined right here. And then price we've hard coded up here as well. So we're listing it. So the deployer owns the NFT the deployer is now listing it. Now we want to buy it. Let's have the player be the one to buy it. So what we're going to do is we're going to have to connect the player to the NFT marketplace. So we can say const player connected NFT marketplace equals NFT marketplace dot connect player. And then we can buy the item by saying await player connected NFT marketplace dot buy item. It'll be the basic. And if we look back at the NFT marketplace, what does buy item need? It needs the NFT address and the token ID. So basic NFT dot address. And then the token ID. And after this bot, we should check to see that the player actually does indeed own that NFT. So we can say const new owner and we can check to see if that owner is indeed updated. We can say basic NFT dot owner of because NFTs have an owner of function token ID. And then we also want to see that the deployer actually is going to get paid. So we can say await NFT marketplace dot get proceeds of deployer. So now we can do assert new owner dot to string equals player. And we can assert deployer proceeds dot to string equals price dot to string because they should have been paid that price. And that's right. It's actually a little bit easier instead of grabbing players from get named accounts. It's, it's a little bit easier just to grab it right from ethers. So we'll do const accounts equals await get signers. And then we'll say player equals accounts of one just because when we connect, it's expecting a type of account. And then the the get named account is a different type. So it's just a little bit easier to actually connect like this. So now we'll connect to the player like so just know that player and deployer are now different types. So uh, you'll see a little bit differences there. To me, this is ethers dot get signers. And then when we buy the item, we're of course going to have to pass comma value. It's gonna be price, of course, we're going to need to you know, pay the price of the NFT. And then of course, this needs to be player dot address. And that's the difference, right? Now we got to do player dot address whenever we want the address of one of the ethers accounts. And then this new owner, of course, should be in await. And now we can run this all. And ta-da, we see things pass. So our NFT marketplace is able to facilitate the buying and selling of an NFT with arbitrary humans. This is fantastic. So we just ran this single test to show a little bit of the oddities of working with NFTs and some different accounts. But 100%, if you feel up for the challenge, take this time, pause this video and try to write some tests. Remember, the goal here is for us to do yarn hard hat coverage 
and see what our coverage is and try to get it to be 100% coverage. If we run it right now, we'll see, oh my goodness, we are missing a lot of coverage here. We have a ton of uncovered lines, a ton of uncovered functions, branches, statements, etc. Try to write some tests to get this to 100% and then come back. Okay, welcome back. Hopefully now you've written some tests and when you run your tests, you're gonna get some of them might look like this. All right, and these are my tests. These are the tests that I wrote. You could do more, you could do less. And let's see, when I run yarn, hardhead coverage, I even missed some lines and I could, uh, I could test a little bit more. So make your tests even better than the ones that I made. <laughs> so these are the tests from the GitHub repo associated with this. Now that we've written some tests here, let's just write a couple of scripts. And the reason we're gonna write a couple of scripts is we're gonna need these a little bit later. So we'll, we'll write some scripts to mint some NFTs, to buy some NFTs, et cetera. And we'll need this to fiddle around and play on the front end a little bit later. So to create a script, again, we've done this before. Let's do a, a, a script called mint and list. .js. And this will be to mint an NFT and then immediately list it on the marketplace. So let's create an async function called mint and list. And down below, we're gonna call mint and list. I'm gonna copy paste with that same script thing that we've been doing. Obviously, instead of main though, we're calling this mint and list. Now in this mint and list, we're gonna say const NFT mark, NFT market place equals await ethers.get contract NFT marketplace. And right, we're gonna import ethers from hard hat. And then we'll do, we'll grab basic NFT. So we'll say const basic NFT equals await ethers.get contract basic NFT. And then first we'll mint a basic NFT. So we'll do console.log minting dot dot dot. And we'll do await, or actually we'll say const mint TX equals await basic NFT dot mint NFT. And then we'll do await mint tx .wait. We'll wait one block and actually we'll say const mint tx receipt receipt equals that and in this receipt here's another reason why events are so good when we mint this nft we're emitting the token id in an event in this dog minted event so we could say const token id equals mint tx receipt dot events of zero dot args dot token ID like that. And now we have the token ID. And now that we have the token ID and the basic NFT minted, we can now call on our NFT marketplace list item. So now we'll say console.log approving NFT, right? This can be real similar to our tests here. And we'll say const approval TX equals await basic NFT dot approve NFT marketplace.address token ID, and then we'll do await approval tx .wait one, and we'll do console.log listing nft dot dot dot, and then we'll do const tx equals await nft market marketplace dot list item, and we'll do nft marketplace dot address token ID, we'll do await tx dot wait one console.log listed and cool. And we can try this out by running yarn hard hat node, which is gonna run through our deploy scripts, right? It's gonna run through these deploy scripts here. And then in a new terminal, we'll run our script, yarn hard hat run scripts, mint and list, dash dash network localhost. And we missed an argument. Oh, we need a price as well to list our NFT. So we'll create a const price equals, and we'll say ethers.utils.parse ether 0 0.1, and we'll pass the price into the list item. So, whoops, and sorry, it's not the marketplace that we're listing, it's the basic NFT that we're listing, of course. So we'll run that again, and bada bing, bada boom. We've got some listed events, and we can see here, we're doing some listing and awesome. So now we have a script. All right. So now that we have a script and we're going to be writing a couple other scripts 
a little bit later, we essentially have a really solid repo here for our totally decentralized NFT marketplace. This is absolutely massive and you should be incredibly, incredibly proud of yourself. Now, of course, this is all code and people can interact with this if they're software developers, which is great, but we're gonna want to allow anybody to be able to interact and list their own NFTs on our marketplace. So what are we gonna do? Well, we're going to want to build a front end for this. And now we're gonna get into the second part of this lesson. So on lesson 15, we just finished the back end. Now we're gonna move onto the front end. We're gonna start with this Morales code. The code for both of these is pretty much nearly identical, but we're gonna start with Morales and we're gonna teach you how to do both of these. And we're gonna teach you the difference between the Morales and the McGrath and kind of why we're even using them in the first place. We're gonna start with Morales. So if you want to follow along with this next section, all the code we're gonna be working with is gonna be in here. So are you excited? I hope you are, because this is gonna be a phenomenal session. We are about to build one of the most sophisticated front ends that we can using the tools that we have. And like I said, we showed you a little bit earlier what this is gonna look like. So let's do a quick refresher here. So here's what our front end is gonna look like. But what we can do is we can connect with our little connect button. We hit MetaMask, MetaMask pops up. We'll go ahead and connect. And now that we're connected, we can see the different NFTs in here. And if we're on an address that's owned by us, it'll say owned by you. And if we switch addresses, our UI will go ahead and update, we'll connect there. And now we're owned by a different address. Now, if it's owned by us, we'll get this little hover that says update listing. And right now it's worth 0.1 ETH. That's what it's listed for on our marketplace. If it's owned by us and we click it, we can update it to a different price. Let's update it to 50 ETH or whatever your layer one currency is. We'll do save new listing price. We'll go ahead and confirm. It'll say listing updated, please refresh. And what we can do then, and we'll mine some blocks on the back end, and boom, now we see that it's worth 50 here. Now, if we switch to a different account, now we can see owned by blah, 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 and the hover now says buy me. And if I select it as a different user, I'm gonna get this transaction to actually buy it. And I can go ahead and confirm that I'm gonna buy it. I'll get a little pop-up that says item bought successfully. Now, if I do a little refresh, We'll now see that that NFT is gone from the marketplace since we bought it, right? And it's no longer available to be sold. Now, what we can do then is we can come over to sell NFTs and at the bottom, we'll see a withdraw proceeds. So whenever somebody buys an NFT, the NFT marketplace actually keeps the proceeds. It actually keeps the result of the sale. So if we switch back to our address that had the NFT listed, we can now see withdraw 50 proceeds because we know that we have 50 ETH because we just bought that for 50. So if we hit withdraw, MetaMask is gonna pop up. We can go ahead and confirm, we'll wait a little bit as the transaction populates and boom, once it goes through, we'll see now we have zero proceeds, right? We withdrew everything from here. So what we can do now is we can relist that NFT. So if we come back, let's go back to the one who just bought that NFT. If we know the address and the token ID of the NFT and we own it, we can go ahead and relist it. So we can place the address in here with the token ID, and give it some sort of price, we'll submit, we'll approve giving the NFT marketplace access to our NFT, to our little doggy, and then we'll go ahead and actually send the transaction to actually list the NFT on our marketplace. Then we get NFT listed successfully, after we move some blocks in the back end, we can go back to the front end and we now see it's owned by us instead of the original owner, right? And it's set for 10 ETH here. And then we can, of course, switch back to a different user and we could have them actually buy. All right, so now that we have the contracts, we know what this looks like on the contract side. So now let's figure out how to do this on the front end side. So let's jump into our code editor and begin. If we're on our hard hat MIT NFT marketplace free code camp folder, that's great, but we're gonna create another folder. We're gonna CD down a directory and we're gonna make a new directory and we're gonna call it next.js NFT marketplace dash FCC. Now you can do next.js marketplace dash Morales FCC if you want. Again, we're starting with Morales CD next.js NFT marketplace FCC. So now that we have this folder, we'll do code dot 
will open up a new VS code, or you can do file open folder and open this new folder. And we can begin working in this new folder in here. Now that we're in our new project, we're in our new folder. We're gonna do exactly what we've done before. Yarn create next app period. Okay. We've done our setup here. Now I don't like ESLint. So once again, I'm just going to go ahead and delete that. And what we're going to add in instead is our prettier stuff. So prettier ignore, prettier RC. Again, some people may strongly disagree with me on that, but to each their own, right? This is what I like to do. So this is what I'm going to do. Now we have a minimalistic React project, right? If we run yarn dev, we open up our UI on that site, we copy this or command click it. Ta-da, welcome to Next.js. Yay, we've got a Next.js application. As we know, we go to pages, we go to index.js. Let's delete everything in here. Bah, bah. We'll leave the stuff in head. If it comes with stuff in head, we'll write hi, exclamation mark, we'll save, we'll come back, and now we see hi. And I'll zoom in a whole bunch. Boom. So now we have some minimalistic Reacts, minimalistic Next.js. Now, I know we already started the, the project here, well, let's jump into the readme that's given to us and let's talk about how we want to do this, what we want this to actually look like. Well, we're going to want to make a home page. And in this home page, we'll say we'll have it show recently listed NFTs. Home page will show recently listed NFTs. Then we'll say if you own the NFT, you can update the listing. If not, you can buy the listing. So we'll have that. And then we'll have a sell page. And in this page, you can list your NFT on the marketplace. So these are gonna be our two main pages. We're gonna have a home page and a sell page. Now we're gonna have a ton of components, but we're really only gonna have two main pages. So if we go back over to pages, right? Right now we have our app.js, which shows our app, which is cool, which everything runs through. And then we have our home page. So let's also create right now our sell page or sell nft.js. And then in here, we'll just make this really minimal Fact, we can copy most of what's in here. We can actually just copy paste this whole thing, paste it in here. And instead of hi, we'll say sell page. We'll save that. Now, if we go to our local host, do de uh, slash sell NFT. Oh, whoops. We got to run, run the front end again with yarn dev. Sorry. We'll run yarn dev again. Now we refresh and now we can see sell page. So sell page is that slash sell page. And then home is just going to be high. Okay, cool. So we have our two pages. Which one should we work on first? Well, let's work on our home page. So we're going to be in our index.js. I'm going to keep this front end bit running. We're going to hide it. Oops. That's the opposite of hiding it. I'm going to push it down. We're going to hide it like that. And let's go ahead and let's start building this. So we see in our index.js, we have some head stuff here. I'm going to change this to NFT marketplace. Description is going to be just NFT marketplace. Like so, favicon looks great. Now, if we do a little refresh, now it says NFT marketplace up at the top here, which is good. That's what we want. Well, in our index page, what's one of the first things that we're always going to need to do? You guessed it. We're going to need a little connect button, right? We're going to need our users to be able to connect to, to Web3 to connect to a blockchain. So same as we've done before, let's go ahead. Let's create a components folder and we'll create a header component. Components folder. And we'll create a new file, header.js. Now, remember, since we've done this before with our front end lottery code, we can always refer back to the lottery code as well when we're building this. Okay. And of course, we have all of the code for this on the GitHub repo. So uh, you can use that too. What I'm not going to have you all do is last time we did that manual header thing, right? Where we had to do all the local storage and do all that crazy stuff. We're not going to do that <laughs> this time. We're going to just do it the easy way. We're going to just use the web three UI kit. So to use this connect button, we're going to do yarn add, and we're not going to do dash dash dev because this connect button is a necessary component for the front end yarn add web three UI kit. This also means we're going to do Morales and react Morales. I said, and this is where it might be a little confusing. I know I said in here that we have both a Morales and a the graph edition. So we're still going to use the Morales package in both of them. The only difference is we're going to use a Morales server as well in our Morales edition. 
and we're not going to use a Morales server on our the Graph Edition. They're both going to use the Morales package because all the open source hooks and, and tools are still incredibly powerful, even if we don't use the Morales server. So we're still going to use the Morales package, even when we're going to be using the Graph. All right, great. So now that we've added those all, we're going to do exactly what we did before on our last Next.js process. So in order to use our Web3 UI component in our app.js, we're going to do import Morales provider quotes and without, sorry, in curly braces from React Morales like that. And then we're going to wrap our whole component thing in a Morales provider. So we're going to do return, little open parenthesis, close parenthesis here. We're going to do Morales provider. And then we're going to do initialize on mount is going to equal false because we're not going to use the server yet. Morales provider. Okay, cool. Now that we've wrapped our app in a Morales provider, we can go back to our header. We're going to say export default function header. We're going to grab our connect button from web three UI kit. So we'll do import connect button from web three UI kit. And then in here, we're just going to say return connect button. Now what we can do back in our app JS is we can do import import we'll do header from dot dot slash components header. Now we have our header, we'll just put our header right above the component. And we're going to add some stuff to the header in a bit. Let's just make sure that we're importing the header correctly. Let's go back to our UI here. And okay, boom, we have our connect button. If we click it, you know, we'll get this little pop up and I'm way zoomed in. So I'm going to unway zoom in. Now, what else do we want to put in our header? Well, we're probably going to want to like give this like a name and make this look a little bit nicer. Probably going to want a, a link as well to our sell NFT page. So let's create a nav bar. So instead of just returning the connect button, put this in parentheses and we'll have it return some other stuff too. So we can use this nav tag, which usually defines like a nav bar. So it's really similar to a div. It's just another tag, right? So now we'll put everything into this nav tag. And in Next.js, we can actually make links using the Next.js link tag. So what we can do in this is link allows us to basically connect to different links or URLs in our application, like so. So we can do import link from next slash link. And in here, let's say if we wanted to go to the home page, we can make a link and we'll say href equals slash equals slash. And inside of this, we would wrap this in an a tag to make it clickable. And then we could just say something like NFT marketplace. Now, if we save that, we go to our front end. We now we see have a NFT marketplace button that we can click. And since we're already at home, we're not going to go anywhere. But if we copy this link section, paste it below, and we make another one for sell NFT and we title this sell NFT. Now we save, we go back to our front end. We now have NFT marketplace and sell NFT. If I click sell NFT, we now get to the sell page, right? We'll go back to the home page, sell page, flip back and forth. Awesome. Very exciting. So now we have an incredibly minimalistic header. It obviously looks terrible. <laughs> so let's do just a little bit of formatting. And oftentimes you'll do the formatting last, but while we're here, we might as well. To do our formatting, we're going to use what? If you guessed Tailwind, you guessed correctly. So remember, Tailwind with Next.js. You can always just follow along here and we'll grab, we'll do the exact same thing we did before. We'll do yarn add dash dash dev, that stuff right there. And then we'll run init after these finish installing. So we'll do yarn and then paste that in and there we go so now we've got our post css config we've got our tailwind config we're going to grab tailwind.config.js paste it in here and then we're going to grab globals.css we're going to open up globals.css paste that in here and cool now we have tailwind in here now that we have tailwind we can do some tailwindy stuff to our header here let's uh let's create a div 
for all of these for everything here. We'll create a little div for all this stuff here. We'll make like a big section for almost like a big sign saying, hey, you're at the NFT marketplace, uh, H1, which stands for header one. And we'll give it a class name of padding Y of four, padding X of four. We'll do font bold text will be three XL. And then it'll just say NFT marketplace. Now we have this NFT marketplace, which is nice and bold. Awesome. If you're on your server, you're going to kill it. We're going to kill it with control C and then we're going to restart it. And that's going to pull in all the tailwind stuff. And now if we refresh our local main, we should now see, okay, NFT, well, NFT marketplace, right? We now see this in big and bold, which looks a lot better. So let's keep going. Let's give our whole nav a class name equals, we'll give it padding of five, border bottom of two, flex, flex, row, justify, just if I between and items center. We'll see how that looks. Aha, it looks a lot better. We're now kind of like setting this up with a bottom border, kind of sticking some stuff like this. That looks much, much nicer already. Let's go down here. Let's make our buttons have a class name equals flex, flex row, items center. And like I said, this is not a styling class. So we're not really going to go over exactly how we're styling this. And that is okay. But that's going to move that over, make that look a little nicer. We'll give our link here a class name equals MR4P6. And we'll give both of these the same class name, both these links. Give them some padding so they moved away from each other, some margin to the right so they're away from each other. And uh, oh, I forgot to do this. Morales auth equals false. Uh, we need Morales auth equals false so that we don't automatically connect to a Morales database or try to connect to a Morales database when we connect. We want to just connect with our MetaMask. And we'll change this to home instead of NFT marketplace. But otherwise, that looks pretty good. Home, sell NFT, connect button. And we could adjust the formatting of this to make it look a little different. But I think for the most part, this looks much better, right? All right, cool. Much, much better looking header here. We have our app.js set up with the Morales provider, headers, components. Let's now move on to our index. Let's now move on to showing these NFTs, showing all the NFTs in our marketplace. And here's where it's going to already start to heat up and get really interesting. And actually, one more thing, we're going to grab this head piece in the index if you have it. And we're just going to have it be in the app.jsx. So yeah, in our app.js, we're going to put that header up at the top and just put a little, little div, oops, div, div, like so wrapping around this whole thing. This goes here. And this way, no matter what page we're on, we're always going to have this as our header. And we don't have to define it in each one of our little our things here. So we'll do a refresh. And it says head is not defined. Sorry, that's because we're going to need to copy import head from next slash head. Paste it into our app.js import head from next dash head. And now we can see we're going to get NFT marketplace no matter what page we're on because we're defining it at our app level. We have the header in here. We have this stuff in here. Index almost has nothing in it now. Let's do this. So what do we want to do? We want the home page, AKA our index to show recently listed NFTs. So the question is, how do we show the recently listed NFTs? How do we do that? Well, let's go back to our contract, right? We go back to our hard hat NFT marketplace. We look in NFT marketplace. What do we have in here? How do we actually see where are NFTs are stored? Well, they're stored in this listings mapping. However, how do we see all of the listings that are in here? Well, this is a mapping, which means we have every single address on the planet in here. We can't loop through the mapping. We'd have to loop through every single address on the planet, which is some insanely large number that you and I could never fathom how many addresses there are. So what are some solutions that we can take to this problem, right? Because we're obviously not going to loop through everything. So what do we do? What's, what's kind of the first approach? One of the first approaches would be like, all right, Patrick, well, why don't we just create an array, an array of listings instead? And this might be a good approach, but what if then later on, we also want to get some other weird data. Maybe we want to get all the NFTs a user owns, NFTs a user owns. There's no array of NFTs that a user owns. Again, that's just a mapping. Well, what if we want to query some other weird data or query some other weird data? 
Or what if an array will be very gas expensive, which it is. If we make this an array to loop through, it'll be incredibly gas expensive. So we don't want to have to go back and change. So I'm going to, I'm going to type this out because this is important. We don't want to change our protocol for just the website. We don't want to have to change our protocol for just the website, or we don't want to much change our protocol for the website. Because if we were to make this an array, it would become incredibly gas inefficient, and it would become much harder to use this NFT marketplace because it would be so much more expensive. And as you build more and more complex protocols, you're going to realize that having an array for every single mapping you have isn't feasible. This is one of the reasons where these events come into play. So every single time we list an NFT, we call this list item function and we emit item listed. This item listed event is stored in a data structure that's still on chain, but just smart contracts can't access it. However, guess what can access it? Off chain services can access these events. So what we do in this case is what we're going to do is we will index the events off chain and then read from our database. So what we're literally going to do is we're going to set up a server to listen for those events to be fired, fired, and we will add them to a database to query. So yes, we're literally going to take so yes, every single time an item is listed, we're going to index it in a database for ourselves. And then we're going to call our centralized database to start. And we're going to call that database to do that. Now, the question then becomes, whoa, isn't that centralized? Hey, Patrick, we're talking, isn't that centralized? What the hickety heck? And the answer to that is it's not necessarily. So the graph is a protocol that does exactly this. It's a protocol that indexes events off chain and sticks them into this, the graph protocol. And it does it in a decentralized way. Morales, the way we're going to show you first, does it in a centralized way. Morales is going to do it in a centralized way, which might be the route that you want to go for speed, for extra bells and whistles, so that you can do local development, which is what we're going to be focusing on here, or any of the other functionality that Morales comes with, because Morales does a lot more than just events. Something to keep in mind, too, is even though we are adding a centralized component, our logic, our smart contracts, the real bulk of this application is decentralized and you can verify all your interactions are working with this decentralized smart contract. We've actually been using a lot of protocols that are centralized like Etherscan, like OpenSea, and some of these centralized protocols are really important to this space. So we're showing you Morales to get you familiar with working with one of these centralized servers in case you optionally want to make an application that provides a centralized service. And there's a ton of tools in the space like Open Zeppelin Defender, Tenderly, and more that are centralized but give us massive, massive benefits. We as a community are bringing more and more things to being decentralized, and sometimes we need some training wheels to get there. And then the graph is gonna be the decentralized way, which is a bit of a longer process to go mainnet, but we'll explain all that when we get there. Let's learn how we can list the most recently listed NFTs. And Morales and the graph both have some really solid videos. I'm gonna leave some links in the GitHub repo associated with this. So if you wanna learn more, you should definitely watch both of those because they are absolutely fantastic and will help you understand this event stuff better. So normally when we read from the blockchain, we do something like contract dot you know, get, get listing, and, you know, and then we put it whatever our input parameters are, contract blah, blah, blah. So instead, so we're gonna read from a database that has all the mappings in an easier to read data structure. Both Morales and the graph do this. We've been using the Morales open source packages and tools. However, Morales also comes optionally with a server backend to give your Web3 applications more functionality. However, there's a ton of stuff that we're not going to cover that Morales can do to help build your Web3 applications. So instead of me continuing to talk about Morales and what it can do, we have Ivan here to give a brief overview of some of the other things that Morales can do. Take it away, Ivan. My name is Ivan, I'm from Morales, and I'm here to tell you how you can speed up your development by 10 times. And I'm not over-exaggerating. When you're building something, you want to ensure that it's scalable because your dApp may go global, it may get viral, it may go mainstream, it can happen. And if it happens, you don't want to start from scratch. You want to use tools and services that allow you to go fast and also to go big. And that's exactly what Morales provides. At Morales, 
we create tools, we create infrastructure for developers in a way that you have a single workflow. And I will soon explain what it means because this is what saves you time. If you have a single workflow for doing things and workflow in Web3 really means that you have to have a smart contract, whether it's a token, a game, some kind of staking, some kind of marketplace, some kind of DeFi, it will be on chain. But at the same time, you have to connect it to your backend because when something happens on chain, you need to monitor that. So you can create web hooks, you can create email, you can create a push notification, you can run some custom code, you can run some calculation, you can save something to the database. Everything on chain at the end of the day needs to go into your backend. And when something is in your backend, it needs to go to the front end. So for example, you change the UI when something happens on chain or you change the UI if your user receives a transfer that is above a specific threshold. Or if your user has this NFT, you can allow them access into some kind of chat or some kind of exclusive piece of content. So at Muralis, we provide you with a full stack suite of tools that is used by over 100,000 developers. It's really becoming one of the most adopted tech stacks in Web3. And it all starts with Muralis Identity which ensures that you get one piece of code, you write one piece of code and you can log in your users across different blockchains, across different wallets. And in your Morales dashboard, you will get a user profile and you will get a web session. So Morales allows you to manage identities because a user profile can have many different wallets from many different chains connected to it. And all of the transactions will be synced from that user. All the real-time transactions will be synced about that user. And also you have established web session between your front end, whether it is a game, whether it is a, a web website, we ensure that you have secure authenticated web sessions and we provide you with session management. So in case you have your own backend and you have Morales session identity management, you can invalidate sessions, you can log in users and do all of that great thing, all of these great things with one line of code. That's very important. Number two is Morales real time. I already mentioned a bit of it, but basically when you have a user, you know exactly what's going on in real time. You can run custom code whenever a user does a transaction. You can run custom code or do a web hook or email or push notification whenever a user interacts with a smart contract or when a smart contract simply emits an event. This can be an trade in an NFT marketplace. This can be ERC20 transfer, you, you can be very flexible by setting filters. So you can say only give me alerts, only give me web hooks when the user transfers more than 10 NFTs or when this token transfer is above $1,000 and so on and so forth. This is Morales real time, very, very powerful things. Next are Morales SDKs. So whether you're building a website, whether you're building a game, we have full integration with game engines, whether you're building for some other platform, we have extensive SDKs that are easy to use that allow you to do all of this, that allow you to connect to Morales and do this very, very easily. And if you go to our documentation, which I highly recommend you to do, you go to Morales, uh, docs.morales.io. If you go to docs.morales.io, you will first and foremost understand what Morales is in depth. So you can think of it kind of like Firebase, but for crypto. Basically, it's a managed backend that you can connect to your front end. Also, you can connect it to your own backend using Node.js SDK, it's very, very easy. But what I wanted to show you here is cross-platform. So for each thing we have, let's say you want to get NFTs for your user. We show you how to do it in simple JavaScript, vanilla JavaScript, how to do it in React, how to do it using a web request. Let's say that you just want to use raw web request. Let's say you're using some kind of language that we don't have SDK for, you still can use Morales, just that you have to call the raw HTTP request. And we'll also show you how to do it in Unity using C Sharp in Unity Game Engine. So we're very, very cross-platform and we are cross-chain. So this means, for example, when you log in a user, you can create a user profile where you have the Solana address. Let's say your user uses Solana. Then they can easily connect Ethereum. They can easily connect the Binance Chain. They, and we're going to add more chains soon. They can easily con connect Elrond. So one user profile, and then you have all kinds of different wallets, different chains, and you have one single user profile, one single user ID. This is, by the way, how it will look like in your database. As you can see, you're going to have a user, uh, user uh, uh, table right here. You're going to have all of their accounts. So in this case, I only have ETH, but if I have... Solana, if I have other types of blockchains, it will all be right here. And this is a database that also has all my transactions. This is a database where I can set up different um, uh, listen events. 
or smart contracts. So for example, OpenSea, I can watch OpenSea smart contracts or something else. And it's very, very queryable because this is MongoDB. This is MongoDB, you can run um, MongoDB queries. It's very, very queryable. So on, in that sense, Morales gives, gives you a nice, nice dashboard with everything you need to know about your users, their sessions, their permissions, and so on and so forth. And of course, you can connect to your, to your own backend using the Node.js SDK. So this is Morales SDKs. And finally, when we're speaking about the workflow, the final thing is the APIs, which I also already showed you. But the API is that you can do raw requests from any programming language, from any kind of architecture. So using this workflow, you can easily achieve anything you want very, very quickly. You really have to try Morales. It, is, it will change your life. I can explain here all I want. I have limited time. But as you can already see by this presentation, you're very curious. As you already can see by this presentation, you want to try this. As you already feel by watching me here, you are very, very excited. You have to get your hands dirty. So go, number one, to docs.morales.io and uh, go here, getting started, connect your SDK in uh, vanilla or React and go through all of this. See the magic for yourself. And if you want practicalities, go to YouTube channel and go to morales.io slash projects. Guys, see you all in the community. Using Morales, you will succeed. Using Morales, you will achieve your goal and you're going to do it sooner than you expect yourself. You're going to surprise yourself. So don't let yourself down. Go to morales.io, sign up, get started. See you guys. Now that I've explained all of that, what does this look like? Well, this is where we're actually going to start using Morales with its server capabilities. And we're going to sign up for a server here and we're going to use Morales as our backend for our application. So to get set up with Morales, we go to morales.io. We can go ahead and sign up for free. We'll put our email in. We'll create some password. Why are you here? Other, please specify Patrick's amazing hard hat video. You don't have to write that, but if you want to write that, you can. <laughs> Where did you hear about Morales for the first time? Well, you all heard about it on YouTube because you heard it from me and then pick your role. I'm going to be a developer. We'll hit next. I don't want to subscribe, but I'm going to not be a robot and create your account. And it even gives us a little prop here. Create your first server. So our back end is going to use a server to do any stuff on the back. So we'll create a server. And if we were going to do a mainnet or a testnet, we'd choose one of those. But for now, we're going to do a local dev chain server. And again, this is one of the advantages of Morales is it allows us to work with our local dev chain for indexing events. We can actually index our events from our local hardhat node, which is incredibly, incredibly powerful here. So check your email and we'll have an activate my account thing. Email we will hit activate your account and it'll bring us back here and we'll recreate and we'll do local dev chain. All right, so now we're going to create a new local dev chain server. So we're going to call this NFT marketplace. We're going to select the region, whatever region you want. I'm in the Eastern United States, so I'm going to choose New York, but whatever location works for you, we're going to do local dev chain and we're going to do ETH local dev chain. And again, if you're building for Polygon, if you're building for Avalanche, if you're building for Phantom, if you're building for any of these EVM compatible chains, again, your ETH local dev chain, it's going to work exactly the same. So we're going to add instance now and we're going to create a new application here. So we're going to close. Now we have this server here and it says Ganache, but it's really hard hat. Don't worry about that. Now that we have our server up, we can go to the Morales documentation. What we're looking for is events. We're looking to sync with events. So we can even do a little search in here for events. And we see smart contract events platform automatic sync. And it even tells us a little bit more about why do we need to sync and watch smart contract events. So basically, this server, our database, is going to be looking for these events to be emitted. But before we can do that, we need to hook up our application to our server. And if you go to the React Morales GitHub, right at the top, and you probably see, saw this before, when you have this Morales provider, in their docs, they actually pass in an app ID and a server URL. And this is how we can actually connect directly to our servers on Morales. So what we're going to do is right now, we're going to go back to our app.js. And originally, we've been saying initialize on mount equals false. When we say this, we're saying, hey, we're not going to use a Morales server. We're just going to use the open source Morales tools that y'all provide. Now, we actually do want to use their server, right? We do want to use all these bells and whistles that Morales comes with out of the box. So we're going to change that. So instead of saying initialize on mount equals false, we're just going to give it the app ID and the server URL. So we're going to delete this. And just like it says in the documentation, we're going to give it an app ID and a server URL. So we're going to say app ID equals, and this is where as a string, we'll put our app ID. So if we go back to our Morales database, we can go to view details and we see all this information in here and we can grab our application ID 
So we can copy it, paste it in here, and then we'll want to grab our server URL, which is at the top. So this is the URL of our unique custom morale server. So we'll say server URL equals, and then paste that in there like that. Now, if you've been following along with these tutorials, you might be thinking, oh, we're, we're kind of just hard coding that stuff right in there like that, huh? That seems kind of, that seems kind of bad. Well, if that's your intuition, that is fantastic. So instead, we're actually going to put these into environment variables. So we're going to create a new file, a .env file. And this is where we're going to put all of our environment variables. Now, Next.js comes with built-in support for environment variables, which allow you to do the following. Use .env.local to load environment variables or expose environment variables to the browser by prefixing it with next underscore public. So there's a couple different environment variable paths we can use. We can do .env.local, we can do .env.this, that, 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 the other thing. We're just gonna do .env to keep it simple here. But in order for our front ends to read environment variables from our .env file, we have to do next underscore public underscore. And Next.js will look into our .env file for variables that start with this and only stick these environment variables into our application. If we were to just do like Morales server, equals blah, blah, blah. It has no idea what this is because we need to do next underscore public underscore. And if we do that, and we'll do a console.log, look here, process.env, next public morale server. And we actually need to kill it and restart it. And then we go back, we do a little refresh here. It'll say, look here as a do blah, 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 because that's what is in the .env file with that next public. So we'll grab our app ID, we'll copy it, and in our .env, we'll do next public app ID equals, and we'll paste that in there. We'll grab our server URL. We'll go back to here. We'll do next public server URL equals, we'll paste that like that. And now at the top, we'll say const app ID equals process.env.next public app ID. And then we'll say const server URL equals process.env.next public server URL. Now that we've had these variables, we'll stick them in like this. So this is how we can connect our application to our morale server. Now, of course, we haven't done anything yet, but we're getting started, right? This is how we're going to connect to it. Now that we've signed in, well, I told you that our morale server was going to be indexing our events. And if you go to this dashboard button, this is our entire database. Everything in this browser tab is what's in our database right now. And as you can see right now, there's not a whole lot of anything. If we had any events data in here, it would be in here. So we need to tell our server, hey, you need to start listening for events so we can show the most recently listed NFTs. So morale server, you need to start listening. You need to create a database entry for every single one of these item listed events. And whenever somebody buys an item, right? Whenever somebody buys an item or cancels an item, you need to remove that from your database. How do we start telling morales to start listening to our events? Well, first off, well, first off, we're going to need to connect it, connect it to our blockchain. And then we're going to say which contract, which events and what to do when it hears those events. So we need to connect it and then we need to tell it what to do when it hears those events. So how do we connect our Morales server to our hard hat blockchain? And right now we're not running one, but let's go ahead and we'll start up our hard hat, our local host blockchain. So in one terminal, we're running the front end. In another terminal, we'll CD down a directory. We'll CD into our hard hat NFT marketplace that free code camp or free code camp. And we'll do yarn hard hat node. And if we've done everything correctly, it'll deploy our NFT marketplace, it'll deploy our basic NFT, and then it'll start local HTTP WebSocket at blah, blah, blah. So that's good. So now that we have that node running, what we can do is we can go to view details and go to dev chain proxy server. So this dev chain proxy server is going to be how we actually tell Morales to listen to our locally running hardhat node. Now to do this, what you're going to need to do is we're going to need to download this, what's called a reverse proxy. And I have a link to this in the GitHub as well. Depending on what computer you're running on, will tell you which one of these we actually need to download. And then there's some troubleshooting tips down here if you ever get lost. And if you're really, really confused, what we can do, what Morales FRP to download. Do a quick search on this. We even come right to the documentation. 
connecting Ganache to Morales. A note for Mac users, download frp.darwin.blah, blah, blah, for the Ganache proxy server. So I'm on a Mac, so I'm going to download this Darwin AMD64. If I look at the releases, that's the first one at the top. Darwin AMD64. So this is the one that I'm going to go ahead and download. So I'm going to click it. I'm going to download it. Once I have it downloaded, we're going to open it up and we're going to get a folder and we're going to get a folder that looks like this. The main things that we need are going to be FRP and FRPC.ini. FRPC is going to be the executable. It's going to be what we're going to run to connect our blockchain node to Morales and FRPC.ini is going to be basically the config file to do this. Now, again, this is one of these sections where downloading this is going to be one of the hardest steps here. So if you get lost, please ask questions in the GitHub. Please ask questions in the Morales forum. There is a Morales forum as well, where you can ask a ton of different questions. And please check out the troubleshooting as well. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new folder in here, new folder called FRP. And I'm doing it in here just to make it a little easier, but you could really put this wherever you want and then always refer back to it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take, I'm going to copy these two files and place it into this FRP folder. So now I have FRPC and FRPC.ini. If you click on the FRPC, it's going to be like, hey, uh, it's binary. You, you can't really look at this. Uh, don't click that. It'll just be a whole bunch of nonsense. But the FRPC.ini looks like a pretty typical config file. And this is what we're going to adjust. If we even go back to our morale server, it'll give you what you need down here. And we're using hard hat. So we're going to copy everything here. We're going to go back to our FRPC.ini and then just paste whatever is in there in here. And that's how we're going to tell this FRPC thing that we need to connect. I haven't tried this out for users using WSL. So if you're using WSL, let us know in the full blockchain Solidity course JS. Make a new discussion if you haven't seen it already saying, hey, I'm using WSL for the FRPC and here's what you need to use. And then at the bottom, it says run and enjoy. I'm running on a Mac OS, which runs Linux commands. So I can just copy this. I'll create a new terminal. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to CD into that FRP folder. And I'm going to paste that thing that I just that I just copied from Morales. So we're running that FRPC executable dash C, which is dash config FRPC.ini. And if I hit enter, it's going to say log into server success, get run ID, blah, 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 server to UDP port, and then a whole bunch of other stuff. If you're seeing success stuff here, that means you did it right. And you can hit control C to cancel because we're not going to keep running it. Now, if you want to just run this, you absolutely can. But I'm going to show you another way to do this. And this is using the Morales admin CLI. So everything that we're doing here, all these buttons that we're pressing, Morales actually comes with this thing called the Morales admin CLI or the command line interface. So this is a way for us to connect and run all these buttons and stuff that we're pressing right from our terminal and right from our shell. So I'm going to show you a couple of commands on how to work with the admin CLI. And we're going to be working with a lot of admin CLI commands. But all we're going to do is npm install dash g morales admin CLI or for us yarn global add. So we're going to grab that. We'll do yarn global add morales admin CLI like that. And now we should be able to run morales admin CLI and see a whole bunch of stuff like that. And if you ran morales admin CLI, we have all this stuff. And one of the big ones, one of the important ones that we're going to be working with is this connect local dev chain. So running this FRPC dash C dash FRPC INI, that's going to be the same as us running this connect local dev chain. Now, what I like to do is I'll jump into our package.json and we'll create an additional script in here for us to just run yarn, whatever the name is that we want, and just to do that. And just to make it a lot easier for us to connect our local dev chain. So underneath lint, I'm going to do a comma and I'm going to create a new command. I'm going to say Morales sync. And we're going to run the Morales admin CLI version of this FRPC dash C thing. So what we're going to do in here is we're going to say Morales admin CLI connect local dev chain dash dash chain hard hat dash dash Morales capital sub domain. This is where we're going to put the subdomain of our Morales server, which if we go to, if we go back to our Morales admin servers, we can go back to server details. So it's going to be not the HTTPS. It's just going to be from here all the way to the dot com. So not even the port. We're going to grab that. 
We're going to paste that there. And then we're going to do space dash dash FRPC path is going to be dot slash FRPC slash, excuse me, FRP slash FRPC. Now, if we save this and we run it, it's not going to work though. So if I run yarn with our new script, morale sync, it's going to say specify morales API key. It's going to give us this prompt. And in our dashboard, we have our API key, which we can copy, we can paste it, and then API secret, we can copy and then paste it. And then it'll say starting connection to hard hat, which is great, but that's really annoying. And I don't want to have to do that. So we're going to control C, we're going to kill that. And what we can do is we can go into our .env and we can actually add those as environment variables that Morales is expecting. So when we run this Morales admin CLI, it'll check our .env file for Morales API key, which we can copy right here. And then Morales API secret, which we can copy and paste right here. Now, the reason that these aren't capital and doing next public, these are not going to be part of our front end piece. These are keys that we're using on the back end to test and for our local dev chain connection. So we don't need to do next public. We're just going to leave them like this. But now if I hit up and I run yarn morale sync again, it's not going to prompt me this time. It's just going to say starting connection to hard hat. And if you see this, this starting connection to hard hat bit, we can come back to our servers. We'll go to dev chain proxy servers. We'll hit this disconnected button and refresh. And if you see connected, you've successfully connected our hard hat node, which is running here, to our Morales server, which is awesome. And in fact, if you sit on your hard hat node terminal, you'll see the actual RPC calls to our blockchain here. And you'll see Morales is consistently calling F block number to make sure it's up to date with what it has. So how do we tell a morale server to start listening for events? Well, there are two ways we can do this. The first way is with the user interface. So we can go to view details. We'll go to sync. And right now it says no sync services installed. So we'll hit add a new sync and we can see sync and watch address and sync and watch contract events. We can watch the address for transactions or we can watch some address for any events. And we can manually add all our information here. We could select the chain, description, decide if we want to optionally sync historical. We could put the topic of the event, the ABI of the event, the address of the event, a filter, and then a table name. Or we could do all this programmatically, which is what we're going to do. We'll create a little script that we can run, tell our morale server to watch for those scripts. And we'll see our database get upgraded to listen for those events. So back in our code, we're going to create a new file called add events.js. Now we have one terminal that's running our front end, one terminal that's running our blockchain, one terminal that's syncing our blockchain with Morales. And now we're going to do another terminal for anything else we want to do, like run little scripts. If you come to the Morales docs and you click connect with SDK, there's a ton of different ways we can actually connect with the SDK. We've already learned how to connect with React by using React Morales. Now we're going to connect with Node.js since we're going to run a little Morales script. And here's like a little example of what it looks like in the documentation. But I'm going to go ahead. So I'm going to say const Morales equals require Morales slash node. And we're going to import the node extension of the Morales package into our script here. We're going to require .env config, which means we're going to need to install .env, yarn add dash dash dev .env. And now we have to tell our morale server all the same information that we would need to tell it on the user interface. So one of the first things that we're going to need is the address of our contract. We're going to need to say const contract address equals, and this is where we go, oh, well, how do we, how do we get that contract address? The easy way to do this is we just go back where we're running the blockchain and we grab where that NFT marketplace is deployed. And similar to our smart contract lottery, where we created an update front end script, we're going to do the exact same thing here. So back in our hard hat NFT marketplace NFT code, we go to our deploy script or deploy folder. We're going to create a new file called 99-update front end.js. And we're going to create a little bit of our deploy process that will automatically update our front end. So we can just grab the network address from a file that is programmatically created. So we're going to do module.exports equals async function. And now we'll say if process.env.update front end, then console.log 
updating front end. So that in our .env, we have update front end equals true. And that will be how we decide whether or not we actually want to update the front end. And then we'll create a function called update contract addresses, which we will await. And this will update the contract addresses of our front end. So let's make that function. We'll do async function update contract addresses. Make sure those are spelled the same. So we'll say const NFT market place equals await ethers.get contract. And then yes, we need to import const ethers equals require hard hat. We'll grab the NFT market place. And then we're gonna want to write our files in here to someplace in our front end code. For us, we're gonna do in a new folder, constants, and we're gonna create a new file in here called network mapping dot JSON. And we'll have ju this just be a JSON object which keeps track of all of our deployments. So if we deploy something to the ring B chain, we'll keep a list, we'll keep a list of it. We'll say NFT marketplace, and we'll keep a list of all the addresses of the NFT marketplace. We'll do comma, basic NFT, right? And then a list of all those. Right now we don't have anything deployed, so we'll just have it be an empty JSON object. Now back in our deploy script in the hard hat NFT marketplace project, we're gonna keep track of that location. So right at the top, we're gonna say const front end contracts file equals, and we'll place where it is uh, according to your file setup. So if I do cd dot dot slash next.js NFT marketplace free code camp, constants network mapping dot JSON, this is where mine is. So you're gonna to wanna to put it wherever your location is in relation to your hard hat NFT marketplace free code camp. So my front end contracts file is gonna be right here. Now that we have all that, we're gonna get the chain ID. So we're gonna say const chain ID equals network dot config dot chain ID dot to string. And we're gonna to need to import network from hard hat as well. And then we're gonna to wanna to read from this network mapping file to see what's currently in there. So we'll say const contract addresses equals, and we're gonna do it with json.parse fs.read file sync front end front end contracts file comma utf8. Now here's what we're gonna say. If chain ID is in contract addresses, let's say if this list of contract addresses doesn't include the marketplace, then add it on. So we're gonna say if contract addresses of chain ID of the NFT marketplace, we'll say dot includes NFT market market place dot address. Then, so we'll say contract addresses chain ID NFT marketplace dot push NFT marketplace dot address. Else, we're just say contract addresses of chain ID of NFT marketplace, which is going to be a new entry now, equals NFT market marketplace dot address. So now we've updated our contract addresses object, and we just need to write it back to the network mapping. So now we're going to say fs dot write file sync front and contracts file comma json dot string if i contract addresses and then at the bottom we'll do module dot exports dot tags equals and we'll say all or front end now what we can do is we can run just this update front end script with yarn hard hat deploy dash dash network localhost and we only want to do this update front end script. So we say dash dash tags front end. And we run this and I ran into an error. FS is not defined. Oh, I forgot to do const FS equals require FS. Let's try it again. Cannot set properties of undefined NFT marketplace. Oops, and that's because this line is off instead of this line, sorry. Basically right now what it's saying is it's saying, hey, this NFT marketplace thing uh, doesn't exist. So we need to make it exist. So now we'll say contract addresses of chain ID equals a new entry of NFT marketplace and adds its first parameter. It's going to be NFT marketplace dot address. 
like that. Now we can run it and updating front end. Looks like it's done. So if we go back to our front end, we now see we have an entry for localhost with NFT marketplace with the address in our network mapping.json. So if you did that correctly, you should get this. If not, if you're having a hard time with that, you can, of course, just go ahead and hard code it in. But I do highly recommend you do it programmatically because your life is going to be a lot better. So cool. We have this update front end script that works now. So we can put this back off to the side and let's keep going. So we now have this network mapping file with contract addresses based off of the chain ID. So what we can do is we can pull that in as well. We'll say const contract addresses equals require dot slash constants slash network mapping dot JSON. And now we can get the contract address based off the chain ID. So we'll say chain ID equals process dot env dot chain ID or 31337. So in our .env, we'll make a new entry called chain ID. And for now, we'll do 31337. And now we can get the contract address by saying contract address equals contract addresses at the chain ID of NFT market place of zero. So we're going to go into that network mapping, go to the chain ID, go to the NFT marketplace and get the most recently deployed NFT marketplace. But boom, so now we have the contract address. Contract address says, excuse me. Now in our add events, we'll create a new function kind of similar to what we've been doing. We'll do async function main, and this will be our main function. And then of course, we're going to copy paste that main script thing we've been doing this whole time. You know, main dot then catch blah, blah, blah. We go back to the Morales documentation, though, we can see we're going to need to grab our server URL, app ID, master key, and then start it up. So we're going to do the exact same thing. Actually, once again, sorry, before we even get into our main, you can do it in your main function if you want. We'll say const server URL equals, and we can just grab this once again from our .env. So we'll say process .env dot next public Morales server URL. We'll get the app ID equals process.env.next public Morales app ID. And then we'll say const master key equals process.env.master key. So we don't have a master key in here yet. So we'll create a new one called master key. We'll go back to our Morales front end. We'll close out of this. We'll hit view details and we'll grab that master key. So we'll copy that go back to our code editor and paste it in. And now we have a master key in our .env as well. We don't want our master key on our front end. So we're not going to put next public like that. Now, the first thing we're going to do in our main function is we're going to do await morales.start server URL app ID and master key as the input parameters for this. We'll do a little console.log working with contract address contract address. Now we're going to go ahead and add all those same pieces that we see on the UI. So what are the events we want to listen for? Well, if we go back to our code here, we also have our NFT marketplace, where if we just type an event, we have item listed, item bought and item canceled. So we have three events we want to listen. And in Morales, they have this add new event sync from code, which we're basically going to be following to do this, we need to obviously start and then create our options for the event. We have the chain, address, topic, ABI, a limit, table name, and sync historical. And then we just do morales.cloud.run, watch cloud event, options, use master key. And that's pretty much it. So we're going to follow these documents here to do our code. So let's start with item listed. Let's create some options for our item listed event. So we'll say let item listed options, or we could do const if we wanted, but I'm just going to do let item listed options equals. And first, we're gonna need the chain ID, which we have because we're getting it from Morales. Now, the first thing to point out about chain ID is that Morales understands a local chain is 1337. So even if you're on 31337, if you're doing a local development, you got to switch it to 1337. So we're going to make another variable called Morales chain ID. And we're just going to say, let Morales chain ID equals chain ID equals 31337 question mark 31 1, 3, 3, 7. 
otherwise chain ID. So we're saying since Morales understands that any local dev is going to be 1337, we're going to say if chain ID equals 31337, then have Morales chain ID equal 1337. Otherwise, have it equal whatever whatever our chain ID is. And in our .env, we can decide, okay, if we want to do rink B, localhost, mainnet, etc. We're going to say, okay, chain ID, Morales, we'll do your Morales chain ID. Comma, we'll say, what else do we need? We did the chain ID. We're going to skip description, a sync historical. So hit sync historical allows the node to go back throughout the blockchain, grab all the events ever emitted by that contract. Since this is a very small local blockchain, We'll just say sync historical is true like that. Okay, what else do we need? Okay, we need the topic. The topic is gonna be your event information. So to get the topic, go back to our event code and the topic is just gonna be the name of the event plus the type of the parameters. So we're gonna go back to our code. We're gonna go back to here. We're gonna say topic is gonna be item listed and it takes an address, an address, an address, a uint 256, and a uint256. Address, address, uint256, uint256, close parenthesis, like that. We also need the ABI of just the event, which again, we can find, we go back to our hardhat project, we go to artifacts, we go to contracts, nftmarketplace.soul, nftmarketplace.json. Our ABI starting from here is gonna be the ABI of the whole contract. And we just want that item listed event, so we did control F and we found it here and we're going to grab from right after it says type event. We're going to copy, we're going to scroll up to right up to anonymous false, right? So this bit describes the ABI of the event. So we have internal type address, name seller, type address, NFT address, token ID, price, item listed, right? So this is going to be the ABI of our, just our item listed event. We can take that and we just stick it in here. We hit save and mine auto formatted to get rid of the parentheses. Okay, what else do we need? We have the topic, we have the ABI, we already have the address, we're not gonna do a filter, and then we need a table name. So we're gonna do a new line, we'll say table name, it's gonna be item listed. And this is gonna be the name of the table that we update in our database. So we're gonna get a new table in here called item listed, and it's just gonna be filled with information about the item listed event. And that's it, right? And we would hit confirm if we were doing this on the UI, and since we're doing here, we'll just hit save. This is one of our events. We want to do this for all of our events. Let's do it now for item bot. So we'll say let item bot options equals, and we'll repeat the process. Some of the stuff at the top is going to be the same. The chain ID is going to be the same. Sync historical is going to be the same. So we can just grab those two, paste them down here for item bot. The topic is going to be different. The topic is going to be item bot is the name of the event. It's going to take an address, an address, a uint 256 and a uint 256. The ABI is going to be different. Once again, we're going to go to our hardhat NFT marketplace. We'll look for item bot. We can find this event here. We'll copy this. We'll go back. We'll paste it in here. We now have item bot. We'll give it a table name of item bot. And then one more event. We have let item canceled options equals and we'll do chain ID, it's gonna be Morales chain ID. It's gonna be this same boilerplate from the top, address, contract address. Topic is gonna to be different. The topic for this, it's called item canceled, and it takes an address, an address, and a uint 256. We'll say sync historical will be true. Sync historical is true. And then we need the ABI. Once again, we can go back to our hard hat Compiled information, we can look for item canceled. We'll grab that ABI of that event, copy that, come back to our front end code, paste it in. Oops, and I didn't give item canceled. Let's give item canceled a table name, which will be item canceled. So now if I zoom out just a hair, I now have item canceled options, item bought options, and item listed options. Well, we're telling Morales, hey, listen for these events. Whenever you hear, an item canceled event, stick all this stuff into a database. Whenever you hear an item bot event, stick all this in a database. Whenever it emits an item listed, stick all this in a database so that we can read from it. So we're indexing these events so that we can query them much easier. Now to send them up to our, our server, we'll say const listed response equals await moralis, moralis.cloud. 
dot run watch contract event. We'll pass the item listed options. And then one more comma. And then we pass an object in here where we're just going to say use master key is going to be true. And we'll do the same thing. We'll say const bot response. We're passing the bot item options. So we'll say bot response equals await morales.cloud.run watch contract event comma item bot options comma use master key it's going to be true and then finally const canceled response equals await morales.cloud.run watch contract event comma item canceled options comma use master key it's going to be true now this morales.cloud.run api call to our server that we're making is going to return a response and let's look at the docs to actually see what that response looks like if it worked out well in the terminal you'll see success true so this is the return we're getting from the api so just to make sure everything goes well i'll do an if listed response dot success so we're getting that success object from the morale server we'll just do a console dot log success database updated with watching events and then else we'll say console dot log something went wrong dot 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 and of course we're not just looking for listed response dot success to be true we also want canceled response dot success and bot response is successful and then say hey you did it otherwise say hey something went wrong so this is how we're going to programmatically tell our server our database to listen for events so we just do await morales.cloud to run watch contract events we pass it this object with all these parameters and flags in there and then that's it and then we can send them is because i put next public morale server url and in my .env, I just have next public server URL. So let's change the name here. Looks like our server URL was wrong. And our app ID name is also wrong. So let's fix that. Next public app ID. Master key looks correct. Okay, cool. So let's spell things right. More Alice.cloud.run, morales.cloud.run. When we run this in our database, if we hit refresh, right now we don't see those tables in here. But once we run this add events.js, we should call our server and we should tell it, hey, you need to add these tables and you need to start listening for those events. So in a new terminal, we're going to run this add events.js. So I'm going to make the terminal nice and big. And this is where if something goes wrong, it can be a little frustrating to figure it out how to fix this. So if you run into an issue here, if something's not working as expected, please use the GitHub repo associated with this course. And also the Morales forum is here for you and Stack Exchange Ethereum. So we're going to run node add events.js and we'll hit enter. Okay, boom. Now we see success database updated with watching events. Now, if you ran into an issue and you rerun it and it gets something went wrong, there's a chance that it could still be correct, right? Because it returns false. It returns that there's an issue if any of these already have the table in there. So if we go back to our database here and we hit refresh, I can now see item bot item canceled and item listed in my database. And again, you can see them by hitting the drop down on your server and hitting dashboard. We also see event sync status. And this is how our database knows that it needs to be listening for some events. And it's got all the information about how to listen for our events in here. So cool. So now we are listening for events. This is fantastic. So now what this means is our database is now listening to our blockchain node and it's listening for events in here. It's listening for these item listed, item bought, item canceled events. So let's go ahead and test this. Back in our hardhat NFT marketplace, free code camp window, we have some scripts in here. One of them is mint and list. So we mint a new NFT and we list it on the marketplace. When we list an NFT, well, our Morales database should hear that item listed event and go ahead and stick it into this item listed table that it made. So for us to test this out, Let's open up our terminal in our hardhat NFT marketplace repo, and we'll run mint and list for our local host. Before we actually run it, 
just be sure that our hardhat node is synced up with our morale server. In order for your database to actually grab that event, your local hardhat node needs to be connected. So we'll do yarn hardhat run scripts, mint and list .js dash dash network local host. Let enter. Okay, minting, approving, listing, listed. Now, if we flip back to our database, after a quick refresh, what do you know? We see that there's an indeed an item listed event in our database. We can see information about it too. We can see there's a block hash, a timestamp. We see the token ID that was listed. We see the price of the listing, the transaction hash. We see all this information about our event. And now it's in this database for us to query. So if you have reached this point, you have successfully set up an indexer with the Morales database, and you should be super pumped because this is really powerful. And now we're getting advanced. We're starting to do some advanced stuff. So if you've made it this far, huge congrats. This is already really cool. Now, some other troubleshooting help here that I've run into many times myself. Let's say I've left this project and I've killed my hardhead node. I'm gonna kill it right now. If I stop my hardhead node and I, and I come back to my Morales admin, I go to view details, dev chain proxy server. I'm now disconnected. And if I hit this little refresh, I'm disconnected, of course, because I'm not running my hardhead node anymore. If I restart my node, my node is now restarted. My connect local dev chain command is still running. If I refresh it, it'll now say connected, which is great. However, if I go back to my blockchain or if I go back to my hardhead NFT marketplace script, I run yarn hardhat script mint and list again, network local host. If I go back to my database now and I do a refresh, we don't see that item listed in here. So our Morales server is looking to make sure that that the blockchain we're working with is the same one. So if we reset our blockchain like we did, right, we canceled it and we reset it, our database is going to get really confused. So what we have to do is we have to hit reset local chain, reset local chain. We want to make sure that our new local chain is running and that we're connected here. So we'll hit reset local chain, and this will tell Morales, hey, we reset the chain. It's okay, please continue doing so. And once we hit reset local chain, we're not gonna see that item listed in here. However, if we go back and we rerun mint and list network local host with this reset local chain, now, if we go back to our Morales database, we hit refresh, we now see that new one has gotten in. Anytime you stop your hardhat node, anytime you reset your hardhat node, the takeaway is you're gonna need to go to view details, dev chain proxy server, and reset local chain. Now you can do that programmatically as well. We're not gonna go over how to programmatically do that, but that might be something you wanna add to your hardhat deploy. The other thing to note is that it didn't clear out our last event, right? The last event, and if I go run mint and list again, after it completes, we'll have another event in here. Okay, this is great. So all of this is being said, the reason we're doing all this in the first place is so that in our index.js, we can start listening for events. How do we show the recently listed NFTs? So now we have a database of listed NFTs. So what we could do, we could just query this item listed table, right? And grab everything in here. However, we have an issue here. What happens if someone buys an NFT? If someone buys an NFT, the item listed event will still be in our database, but technically it won't be on the marketplace anymore. It'll be gone. It won't be listed. So what can we do? There's a number of architectural choices we can make to get around this problem, to solve this problem. But one of the things we can do is actually we can use Morales Cloud Functions. So Morales Cloud Functions allow us to just really add anything we want our front end to do from the Morales server. And these are functions. These are scripts that are going to run on our Morales server whenever we want them to. So we come to our server, we hit the little drop down, and we hit cloud functions. Now, this is where we can write some Morales stuff to run on our server whenever we want. And we are going to set up our cloud functions in our IDE by hitting this little drop down. To actually sync up our Visual Studio code with our cloud functions, we can just run this command here, and it'll add whatever cloud functions we have in some cloud folder to here. So what we can do back in our VS code, let's make a new folder, new folder called cloud functions. And in here, we'll create a new file called update active items.js. So in here, if we were to write something like console.log, hi, we can actually have this automatically save on a Morales server. And the way that we do this is by running this command. 
Now, we want to make it so that it's a lot easier for us to run this command than just always having to run this massive thing. So what we're going to do is we're going to open up our package.json and we're going to make another Morales script here. It's so right below here. We're going to make another Morales script. We're going to say Morales, Morales Cloud, and we're going to have it run this command. So we're going to copy this command here, paste it into our package.json. So it's going to be Morales admin CLI watch cloud folder. We don't need the Morales API key because it'll grab that from our environment variables. We don't need the Morales secret because it'll grab that from our environment variables. We do need the Morales subdomain, autosave one, and then the Morales cloud folder is going to be that new cloud functions bit that we made. Dot slash cloud functions. functions. Now, in a new terminal, if I run yarn, Morales cloud, which is going to be the same as running this huge function here, I hit enter, it'll say compile, you know, version, blah, blah, compiling, blah, blah, changes uploaded correctly. And if we go back to our front end, we can see this console.log high and our front end being updated. And if we continue to run this in our update active items.js, we could also write console.log, yo, save it. And if this is still running, it'll automatically upload it. And now we can see if we do a little refresh on our front end, cloud functions, we can see it's been uploaded here. Now at this point, if you have a ton of this stuff running, you might see CPU 100%. You might see this little thing pop up and the server might start going a little bit slower. We're starting to use a lot of network activity here. So I'm going to close my Yarn Morales cloud for now. And I'm just going to upload it once when I need to, because we're connected. We have it listening to events. We're having it doing more and more stuff here. And it can start to put a lot of load onto the server. So we're just going to go ahead. We're going to cancel that out. And now the CPU is a lot lower. But if we go back to cloud functions, we can see it's still in here. And anytime we update our cloud functions, it'll update our server with those cloud functions. And we'll just run that Yarn Morales cloud once we're all done here. Anyways, so right now we're trying to figure out, okay, we have item listed. But if someone buys an item, technically it won't be listed anymore, but our item listed table will still have it listed. So what we can do is we can create a cloud function that runs whenever we want. And like I said, we can have these run whenever we want. We can call these whenever we want, but we're going to create a cloud function that only runs whenever one of these events are synced, item listed, item canceled, or item bought. We're going to create a new table called active item. An active item is going to say, okay, anytime it's listed, it'll be active, but when it's bought or canceled, we'll remove it from the active item list. So we're going to create a new table. So let's go ahead and do that. We start off with more Alice dot. And then if you're, if it auto does that, you don't need this. Uh, we don't need to import Morales here because we're going to upload it as a cloud function and our server already just automatically injects Morales into our scripts. So we're going to say Morales dot cloud dot after save. And there's a whole bunch of stuff you can do with your Morales dot cloud. And again, you can find these all in the documentation. The after save keyword means that anytime something gets saved on a table that we specify will do something and it takes two parameters. So it takes what table that we want to do something after it's saved and we're going to say item listed. So we're saying anytime something is saved to the item listed table, we'll run some async function and we'll put request in here because anytime something gets saved, it comes with a request. So anytime an item listed happens, we want to add it to our active items list and our requests come with this, this flag called confirmed. So we'll say const confirmed because every request, every event actually gets triggered twice. So once the transaction goes through, it triggers a save. And then once again, once that transaction is actually confirmed. So we actually only want to update our active item when the transaction is actually confirmed. So we'll say const confirmed equals request dot object dot get confirmed. So we're going to get the confirmed attribute from that request. And then we're also going to make a logger. We'll say const logger equals Morales dot cloud dot get logger. And you'll see why in a second, we can actually write logs to our Morales database with this logs thing. So any logs we can add into here and I'll show you that in a minute. So const logger Morales dot cloud dot get logger. And then we'll just do logger dot info looking for confirmed DX. And we can actually test this right now, right? We can actually test this right now. In our logs, we should see 
looking for confirmed TX once an item listed is saved. Now to test this out, just to test that our logger is actually working, let's run yarn, yarn morales cloud, just to update active items to our, to our morales server. Changes uploaded correctly. Okay, we'll kill it now. And now in our, where we have our mint and list script, let's run mint and list. And we should see on our server, we should get those logs. Now, if we go to our server, we do a little refresh here. And if we look in our logs now, we can now see looking for confirmed TX in our server logs. Now in our logs here, we see, we only see that looking for confirmed TX once. And I just told you, it actually triggers twice. Once when the transaction is first sent, and then once when the transaction is confirmed, AKA has block confirmations. And additionally, if we look in our database at the item listed and we scroll all the way to the right, we can see confirmed equals false. So we only want to count this item listed event in our active items when confirmed is true. So what we wanna do actually is we wanna update our scripts to add one block confirmation on top of our local hardhead blockchain so that these can be changed to confirmed. Now to get around this, what I usually will do in my mint and list script is I'll add a new utility. So I'll go to my utils, I'll do new file, and I'll create a move blocks.js. And this will be a utility that I, I use to actually move the blocks. So when we run our own hardhat node, we actually have complete control over what we want our hardhat node to do. So what we can do is we can actually manually mine nodes and actually move blocks ahead so that Morales knows, oh, okay, this transaction is confirmed, right? Because we're mining the block with a transaction and that's it. And Morales is just gonna forever be waiting for the next block. So we wanna add some functionality to our scripts where we just mine a block after it's done. Now, keep in mind that if we mine like a thousand blocks or a ton of blocks really quickly, Morales might have a hard time indexing that. So we really wanna just mine one at a time and give Morales time to index each block that we mined. So we're actually gonna build a little script. We're gonna manually mine using this EVM mine RPC method that comes with our hardhat blockchain. So we have this new move blocks script and let's go ahead and make this. So instead of this being a, a script, where we're gonna have like a main function at the bottom. We're just gonna have this be a utility that we're gonna import into other scripts. So we're not gonna need a main function here. We're just gonna need to make this an async function and we'll call it move blocks. And then we'll say amount, which is gonna be the number of blocks we want to move. We'll also put a sleep amount and default it to zero. This sleep amount is gonna be an optional parameter. If we want to move blocks and sleep maybe a second between blocks, to resemble a real blockchain, we can have that in here too. So we can have it resemble a real blockchain by sleeping every time a block is moved or just kind of waiting every time a block is moved. So in our move block scripts, we'll do console.log moving blocks dot dot dot. And we'll say for let index equals zero and we'll do a for loop around the amount and call that EVM mine in this for loop. Index is less than amount, index plus plus, await, network, and then we got to import network. Oops, uh, we got to import network from hardhat here. Await network.provider.request. And then we're going to request the method EVM mine comma params are going to be empty. And this is actually the same way we can make raw calls to our blockchain nodes. We don't do a lot of this because ethers abstracts this under the hood but we're making a raw call to EVM mine. Obviously you can't call EVM mine on a real blockchain because you can't just tell a blockchain node to mine the next block. Since this is our local hardhat node, we can call EVM mine. Now we're gonna say if sleep amount is greater than zero or just if sleep amount, then we're also gonna have this script sleep or wait a short duration. So up at the top, we're actually gonna create a new function called sleep which is gonna input a time in milliseconds. And this is gonna return a new promise, right? Because remember, in order for us to wait for some time, we gotta use promises, which we've learned before. And this promise is going to take a function with resolve as an input parameter. And we're just gonna say set timeout is gonna be resolve comma time in MS. So the way we can sleep in JavaScript is we return a new promise and we just call this set timeout function, which basically just waits the time in milliseconds. Now to actually sleep, we'll say console.log sleeping for sleep amount. And then we'll do await sleep, sleep amount. 
and this is going to be in milliseconds. So since sleep returns a promise, we can call it with a wait to say, okay, wait for this sleep function to finish. And the sleep function is only going to finish when the time in MS in time in milliseconds finishes. So now we have a function called move blocks, which will actually mine blocks on our local blockchain so that Morales can get that block confirmation that it's looking for. Now at the bottom, we'll just do module.exports move blocks, move blocks. And then we'll also export sleep as well, because why not? Equals like that. Now what we can do back in our mint and list up at the top, we'll say const move blocks equals require dot dot slash utils slash move blocks. And then we'll also import network from ethers network. And then down in our script, just right at the bottom, we'll just say if network dot config dot chain ID equals equals three, one, three, three, seven, await, move blocks. We'll say we'll move two blocks. And then we'll also do sleep amount equals 1000. We'll wait one millisecond between each block that we mine. So sleep amount equals 1000, which is going to be one millisecond. Now let's even just comment all of this out for a second. We'll just run this script with only this live, right? We'll pull this up, we'll do yarn hard hat, run scripts, mint and list, dash dash network, localhost. We'll just move the blocks, move back to our front end, we'll refresh, we'll go look at item listed. We'll scroll all the way to the right, and now we see confirmed is true. And now if we were to look in our logs, we would see that logging item happen twice. All right, so let's uncomment this and continue. Now that we have this, now that we're learning about logging, now that we're doing all this stuff, we can just say if confirmed, we're going to do some stuff. If confirmed, we're going to create a table called active item and add this to the active item table. So we're going to do a little logger.info found item, and we'll create a new table and a new entry in this table. So we'll say const active item equals moralis dot object dot extend active item. This we're saying if active item exists, great, grab it. If not, create it. So we're going to create this active item table. If it doesn't exist, if it does exist, great, grab it. And we're going to say const active item equals new active item. So we're going to create a new entry in this active item table that we're creating. And we'll say active item dot set. And we can set any of the columns we want for this new table that we're creating. So let's give it a marketplace address column. So we'll say marketplace address. And this will come from the request dot object dot get address. All of these requests from events come with the address that they're coming from, which for us is going to be the marketplace address. We'll do active item dot set NFT address, which these events saved come with all the parameters of our event. So we'll say request dot object dot get NFT address. We'll get the price. We'll say active item dot set price is going to be request dot object dot get price. We'll get the token ID. So we'll say active item dot set token ID request dot object dot get token ID. And then we'll get the seller. So we'll say active item dot set seller is going to be request dot object dot get seller. So we're getting all of this information from our event and this event update from Morales automatically always comes with the address that the event was emitted from. So we're going to grab all that we're going to create this active item table, we're going to add all these rows, we're going to add this one row with all these columns in it. Awesome. Now we'll just do logger.info just to do a little printout. We'll say adding address, we'll do a little string interpolation, we'll say request dot object dot get address, period token ID with request dot object dot get token ID. And I need to close this off here much better. And then outside of the logger dot info, we'll just say logger dot info saving. And then we just run await active item dot save. And now we have cloud function that's going to create a new entry in a new table called active item anytime 
item list that happens. So after item is called the trigger for our cloud function, and there are a whole bunch of different triggers for different Morales cloud functions. If you go to the Morales docs, we look for trigger. We can find a list of all these different triggers in here, like after save, before save, after save, before delete, after delete, before save file. There's all these different triggers to trigger this cloud code. Now, if we upload this new script to our Morales server with Yarn Morales Cloud, changes uploaded correctly. Okay, great. We'll kill it. Let's go to our cloud server, do a little refresh just to make sure that it's not still processing that update. Okay, CPU is low enough. Okay, great. Now in our database, we don't see an active item table in here. But if we go back to our hard hat script and we call mint and list, since now we have a cloud function that says, okay, anytime an item listed event happens, update that active item table, we should see active item update. So let's run this. And remember for all of this, we need to have our hard hat node running, connected to hard hat. And if we reset our local chain, we need to click that reset local chain button. So we went ahead, we ran this. Now, if we go back to our database, we give it a little refresh. And right now I actually don't see anything. So if I go to my logs, go to info, I can see any errors or issues in here. So it looks like after save failed for item listed for user, blah, blah, blah. Looks like there is an issue. Cannot read properties of undefined, reading extend. And that's also in the info. I made an issue. I didn't quite write all my code right. And if we go back to our update active item, I can see where I messed up. It should be morales.object with a capital O dot extend. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna run yarn morales cloud again. Now that I have this correct, we're gonna cancel that. We're gonna run our mint and list again, now that we've fixed our script. And now that we've fixed our script, go back to our database, we'll give it a little refresh. I can now see we have an active item entry in here. Now at this point, there are gonna be times when you're gonna to wanna to leave and go get a coffee, right? Or go to the bathroom or go get some food and you're gonna to wanna to stop your terminals from running. So let's actually practice restarting everything and re-getting into this local development environment because it can be a little weird and a little tricky. So let's practice this. So once again, let's come over here and what do we need to do? Well, we're going to control C, we're gonna kill our blockchain. Control C, we're gonna kill our connection to our morale server. And if we're running a front end, control C that too. Now, if we go to our server, we go to view details, dev chain proxy server. If we hit status, this reset button here, we'll still, we will be disconnected now. And now everything has been disconnected. Now, if we want to restart everything, if we're on our hard hat NFT marketplace, we'll run yarn hard hat node, and that will spin everything up again. We'll run yarn Morales sync to sync back with our Morales connection. We can go back to our server. We'll do view details and we should be connected now. Connected. Since we restarted our local blockchain, we now need to remember to do reset local chain. We'll go ahead and run that. Great. If we want to restart our front end, we can restart our front end like so. Now, the thing is, our database will still have, even when we refresh it, even though we reset the local blockchain, it'll still have all this stuff in it. Now, these entries in here are entries from a blockchain that no longer exists. So what I often will do is I'll click this button up here and we'll just delete all rows in this class. To confirm, we do active item, write the name of the table, and let's do it for item listed too. We'll select that, edit, delete all rows, item listed, yes, delete. We'll do a little refresh. Now everything is zeroed out here. Now we have an empty database for these events and our after save here. And now that we've added that little weight in our script, let's go back to our Hardhat NFT marketplace. We'll run yarn hardhat, run scripts, mint and list.js dash dash network localhost. This will mint it, approve it, list it, and then we mine two blocks to give Morales time to index our event. And then on a Morales server, we go ahead and refresh. We now see item listed is one and active item is one all at the same time. So that is how we're gonna make sure that Morales always indexes whenever we call a function. We're just gonna mine one additional block to tell Morales, hey, that transaction has indeed been confirmed. So really exciting. And we got to practice closing and restarting and doing all that good stuff too. So now this is fantastic. Now that we have this additional functionality to make it a lot easier for our Morales server. Okay, awesome, we can check active item. Well, we're not quite done yet right? Because what if somebody buys 
an NFT or sells an NFT, we should have active item be removed, right? Right now there's one item listed and one active item, but if we buy an item, active item will still show that that item is active. So let's go ahead and let's update our cloud function to also say, okay, anytime an item is bought, we remove that item from being active. So let's create another after save. Let's first build this for canceling the item and then we'll build one for buying the item. So to make another after save, to make another trigger, we'll say morales.cloud.after save. We'll say item canceled. And this will be an async function that takes the request as an input parameter again. And we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna say const confirmed equals request dot object dot get confirmed. We'll say const logger equals morales.cloud.getLogger like so. And then we'll do logger, oops, lowercase l. And then we'll do logger.info marketplace, do a little pipe object, and then just request.object. And then we'll do the same thing. If confirmed, if this transaction is confirmed after one block, we're going to remove it from active item. And we're going to be using a query to first find that active item that's getting canceled. And you can learn more about basic queries in the Morales documentation here. So we're going to get that table by saying const active item equals morales.object with a capital O object.extend active item. And we're going to create a new query. So we're going to query our table before we actually set or save anything. So we're going to say const query query equals new morales.query of active item. So we're going to query our Morales database to find an active item that's in there that's going to match the request here so we can cancel it. So we'll say query dot equal to marketplace address comma request dot object dot get address. We're looking for an active item where the marketplace address is going to be the same as the address of the item canceled. We'll say query dot equal to NFT address, comma, request dot object dot get NFT address. We'll say query dot equal to token ID, comma, request dot object dot get token ID. And that should be it, right? So let's look again at our contract here. And what does the item canceled give us? It gives us a seller, NFT address, and a token ID seller, NFT address, and a token ID. And we're looking for NFT address and a token ID. We don't need to look for the seller. We just need to look for these two. And then of course the marketplace address. So great. So now that we have those two, we can say logger.info and then we'll just print out marketplace pipe query. And then we'll just print out this query that we're running. And then we can say const canceled item equals await query.first. We're going to find the first active item in the database that has the same marketplace address, NFT address, and token ID that just got canceled. So we're going to find that first canceled item. We'll do a little bit more logger information. We'll say logger.info marketplace pipe canceled item. And then we'll just do some string interpolation and we'll print out that canceled item. Canceled item. And we'll say if canceled item. So if the query doesn't find anything, it'll return undefined. So we're saying if canceled item, which will return true if it found something. So if canceled item, then we're going to say logger.info deleting, and then we'll do request.object.get token ID at address request.object.get address address space since it was canceled. So we're going to do a little print, a little logging here, saying deleting that thing since it was canceled. And then we're going to run await canceled item dot destroy. And that's when we remove it from the active item. And then we'll just say else logger.info no item found with address request dot object dot get address and token ID request dot object dot get token ID. So cool. So now we have this after save here. It looks like my terminal automatically added this require in here, which we don't want. So I'm just going to go ahead and delete that. 
We can upload this to our Morales server by running yarn Morales cloud and great changes uploaded correctly. And now to test this, test that this is working, let's create a new script in our hard hat NFT marketplace called cancel item. So we'll go to scripts right now. We have mint and list. We'll do new file. We'll call it cancel.js. We'll do cancel item.js. And this will be a script. So we're going to use that, that main thing here, but we're going to call our function cancel. So we'll do async function cancel. And then at the top, we'll say const token ID equals. Now let's go to our active item list and let's find a token ID that's in here. Okay, token ID zero. And so we'll use this as the token ID that we want to delete. So we'll use token ID zero. So in our cancel item.js script, we'll say const token ID equals zero and let's cancel it. So we'll say const NFT marketplace equals await ethers.get contract. And yes, const ethers equals require hard hat NFT marketplace. We'll say const basic NFT equals await ethers.get gets contract basic NFT. Do const TX equals await NFT marketplace dot cancel listing basic NFT dot address token ID. And we're going to call cancel item, excuse me, cancel listing. We call it the cancel listing. So cancel listing. Yep. Like that. And it takes the address of the NFT and the token ID. So the basic NFT dot address and the token ID. Okay, great. And then we'll do a wait TX dot wait one. And then we'll do console dot log NFT canceled. And then we'll say if network dot config dot chain ID equals equals three one three three seven. We'll go ahead and we'll do await move blocks two, and then we'll say sleep amount equals one thousand. And then we'll just say const move blocks equals require dot dot slash utils slash move blocks. Okay, cool. That looks really good. So let's go ahead and run this. Yarn hard hat run scripts cancel item.js dash dash network localhost nft canceled moving blocks sleeping okay great our node is running awesome we're connected to our morales we've uploaded our cloud function with yarn morales cloud now if we go back to our database do a little refresh looks like i have an issue here if i go to my info it says after save failed for item canceled for user blah 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 here's the logging information Morales.cloud.getLotter is not a function. Aha. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Get lotter. <laughs> let's do, uh, let's make this get logger, shall we? Get logger. So let's re upload that. Change this uploaded correctly. And now I'm going to have to manually go to active item. I'm going to have to manually delete this one. We'll go ahead and delete this row. Yes, delete. Do a refresh. And the reason I have to do that is because it's already been saved and we're doing an after save. So, because I messed up, if you spelt it right, you probably did it right. But because I messed up, we're going to have to remint a new one and then delete that new one. I'm going to run yarn hard hat run scripts, mint and list network localhost. And we just minted a new one. Let me check the Morales database. We'll do a refresh. I can see it in here. I can see it in item listed. It has a token ID of one. So let's go ahead and cancel that now. So I'm going to change my token ID in cancel item to one. And now we'll run that script. Yarn hard hat run scripts, cancel item, network localhost, we'll run this, NFT canceled, moving blocks. Now we'll go to the front end, we'll do a refresh, and we can see it's been removed from active item programmatically, which is great. So this is where these logs can be really helpful. Now it can be a little scary to do things wrong on purpose, but learning how to use information like the logging and learning how to debug effectively is gonna make you a lot faster of a coder, because guess what? You're not gonna be perfect, you're gonna run into issues. Understanding how to use the logger and understanding how to read the errors is going to make you a much faster developer. So now we have something for cancel item. We're also going to need something for what? Well, you guessed it for buying the item. So let's make another one of these morales.cloud that after save. And we're going to be using most of this same exact code for item bought that we used for item canceled. We probably should turn it all into a function, but for practice, we're just going to go ahead and do it one more time. We'll do morales.cloud 
and then my VS code keeps sticking this in for some reason. I'm gonna undo that. Morales.cloud.after save. Item bot is the event. It'll be an async request. Do a little arrow function here. Say const confirmed equals request dot object dot get confirmed. We'll get whether this transaction is confirmed. We'll get the logger. I'm just going to copy paste so I get it right this time. So I'm going to copy paste those two lines. Const logger equals morales dot cloud dot get logger logger dot info. And I'll say if confirmed const active item equals morales dot object dot extend active item const query. And for this query, I'm actually just going to copy these lines because this is going to be exactly the same. We're going to look for the NFT address and the token ID and the marketplace address. And if we look in our nft.soul, nft marketplace.soul, our item bot event has the NFT address and the token ID, which is what we want to find our listed NFT. So we'll run that query. We'll do const bot item equals await query.first. And we'll do exactly what we did before. If bot item, then logger.info, deleting request.object.get object ID, await bot item.destroy, logger.info, deleted item with token ID, request.object.get token ID at address request dot object dot get address. And then if we don't find it, we'll say else logger dot info, no item found with address request dot object dot get address and token ID request dot object dot get token ID. All right, cool. So that looks good. Let's go ahead and upload this to the cloud. So we'll do yarn Morales cloud. Changes uploaded correctly. Let's go make sure it looks good on our server. So we'll give our morale server a little refresh. We go to cloud functions here. I can see the item canceled in here still. And now I can see the item bought after save. Perfect. Looks like I'm at 100% capacity. So we're going to give it a second just to cool down thinking. Give it a little refresh and looks like we're back down after our cloud function has been uploaded. Okay, cool. To test out that this part's working, let's go ahead. We'll write another script here. Do new file, buy item.js. And we'll do the same thing right now on our database. We don't have any active items, so we'll just run real quick. We're on mint and list, mint a new one. We'll go check our database. We'll do a little refresh. Looks like active item is in here with the token ID of two now. So what we'll do is we'll buy that token ID. So we'll say const ethers network equals require hard hat const move blocks equals require dot dot slash utils slash move blocks const token ID equals two async function by item const NFT marketplace equals await ethers dot get contract NFT marketplace const basic NFT equals await ethers dot get contract basic NFT const listing equals await NFT marketplace dot get listing basic NFT dot address and the token ID We'll say const price equals listing dot price dot two string. Then we'll say const TX, and this is us gonna actually buy it. Equals await NFT marketplace dot buy item basic NFT dot address token ID, comma, and then the value, of course, is gonna be the price. Do await TX dot wait one console dot log bot nft and then if network.config.chain id equals 31337 then await move blocks 
two comma sleep amount equals 1000. And then this is a script, of course. So we're going to use the same stuff we're using for cancel. But instead of cancel, it's going to be called buy item. So we have the item in active item here. We'll run yarn hard hat, run scripts, buy item.js dash dash network localhost. Now we can test buying this item. Okay, bought the NFT, moving blocks. We'll do a little refresh on our database, and boom, we can see the active item is gone, and we can see the item has now been bought. Awesome. We're almost done keeping our active item just a table of active items. But there's one more thing we should do. We're not going to test this here, but if you want to test it, we can. We actually, in our NFT marketplace, we go to marketplace.soul, we actually have an update listing function as well that also emits an item listed. So we also want to check to see if item listed is coming from update listing. So back in our item listed cloud function, before we actually start saving stuff, we want to check to see if it already exists. So we're going to say, so we'll say const query equals new morales.query. And sorry, I keep sticking this in of active item. And we're going to do exactly what we've been doing. We're going to say query dot equal to NFT address. We're going to look for the NFT address request dot object dot get NFT address query dot equal to token ID request dot object dot get token ID query dot equal to marketplace address comma request dot object dot get address query dot equal to seller request dot object dot get seller we'll say const already listed item equals await query dot first and then we'll say if this item has already be li been listed then we'll go ahead and say logger dot info deleting already listed request dot object dot get object ID and we'll do await already listed item dot destroy and then do logger dot info deleted item with token ID request dot object dot get token ID at address request dot object dot get address since it's already been listed. If the object has already been listed, we know that it's coming from this update listing function. So we're going to delete it first and then we'll resave it with its new price. So and let's just go ahead and let's upload this to the cloud yarn Morales cloud. Upload this to our server changes uploaded correctly. Let's go check our server, give it a little refresh. We'll go check cloud functions. And it looks like our item listed query for deleting is now in here. But with all that, we now have a way to constantly have this active item table only be the items that are actively on our marketplace without having to spend any additional gas in our application. And this is going to be way better for user experience because they're not going to have to pay extra gas to keep all these NFTs and maybe an array or some more data structures. If you've made it this far, this is easily one of the hardest parts of this course because we're working with a ton of technologies. We're working with a smart contract. We're working with cloud functions. We're working with a backend database now. If you've made it this far, you should be incredibly, incredibly proud. So now let's just go ahead. Let's mint and list one more NFT. So we'll do, we'll run Yarn hard at run, scripts, mint and list, network local host. We'll mint it, we'll list it, we're sleeping. Let's go check our database. We'll do a refresh. We see the active item in here. And now let's learn how to call all of the objects in our active item database here. Let's do it. And remember, if you ever reset your local blockchain, you're gonna have to come in here and delete all the rows in these four tables. With all that being said, it's time to finally come back to our front end and come back to our index.js and answer this question. 
how do we show the recently listed NFTs? We only want to show the active NFTs on the marketplace. And now we have a system for getting only the active ones, only the ones that are currently on the market because we're indexing these events. Now I'm gonna delete all these comments here and let's do this. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do this thing called use Morales query. So if we go to the React Morales docs, there is a hook called use Morales query. And this allows us to fetch and make queries to our database in a React context. Back in here, we're gonna say import use Morales query from React Morales. Now, if you look in the docs here, use Morales qu query returns data, error is loading, and this will automatically run this query the instant our index pops up. So to get the data from the query, to get all of our active items from our database, we'll say const data, and we'll rename data to listed NFTs. And then we'll also check to see if this query is still fetching. So we'll say is fetching, and then we'll rename that to fetching listed NFTs equals use Morales query. And inside here, this takes two input parameters. It takes the table name to do the search on, and then it also takes a function for the query. So the table name that we're gonna be looking for is gonna be active item. And then the function for the query is gonna be, we're gonna say query dot, we'll limit it just to 10. So we'll say only the first 10, we'll do it in dot descending order based off the token ID. And then if we wanted to do different pages, we could do this thing called dot skip uh, with page numbers. Uh, we're not gonna do page numbers here. So we're just gonna leave it like this for now. And that's it. So we're saying, okay, great. Grab from our database on the active item table, grab just the first 10 in descending order of the token ID. Now it's gonna save the result of this to this listed NFTs section. Now to see if this is working, let's just do a little console.log listed NFTs, just to see what this use Morales query actually returns for us. And now we have our local blockchain node running, we have our connection to our Morales server, and we have our front end running. So let's go to our front end, we'll do a little refresh here, we'll right click and hit inspect, we'll go to the console, and we see we have this array being spit out here. Now the first time it console.logs, it's empty. This is because when it initially loads, listed NFTs hasn't returned yet. And it's so it's actually just gonna be an empty array. But when it finishes loading, we're gonna get an array of size one. We get an array of size one because active item only has one in it right now. So we get this array of size one and we can see, ah, at index zero, we have class name active item, we have the item ID, we have all these attributes, which are gonna be created at the marketplace address, NFT address, the price, the seller, and the token ID. This is exactly what we see in our database here. So perfect, that's exactly what we want to be able to show these NFTs on the front end. So how do we actually show this NFT and list this NFT for people who aren't developers and aren't gonna be going through the console.log? Well, what we're gonna be doing is in this return here, We'll put some parentheses around this. First, we should check to see if we are fetching those listed NFTs. So we'll do some JavaScript stuff and we'll say fetching listed NFTs and we'll do a ternary operator. So we're going to say if we are fetching those NFTs, let's add like a little div div that just says loading dot dot dot. We'll put a little colon here. And if we're not fetching, we'll do we'll say listed NFTs dot map. So dot map basically loops through and does some function on all of the listed NFTs. And the function we're gonna want ours to do, and it's gonna take each NFT as input parameters. So we're gonna say we're gonna basically loop through each NFT and we're gonna say console.log NFT dot attribute, excuse me, attributes with an S. And then inside of these, Inside of this attributes are the different pieces that we want. So we're going to get those pieces. We'll say const. We want to show the price, the NFT address, the token ID, the marketplace address, which of course is just going to be this one, and then the seller. That's all this information that we're going to want to show on the front end. And we'll say that equals NFT dot attributes. So we're going to pull these out and we can see price, seller, token ID, et cetera. We're going to pull those out of NFT dot attributes. And we can show those by in this function here, we'll say return 
and then we'll return some HTML. We'll do like div, div, and then we can say like price, 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 period, NFT address, NFT address, token ID, token ID, seller. And then it added this for some reason. So I'm going to delete that. It added dollar signs before all these for some reason. Delete those. Save. Now, if I go to the front end, I can now see information about our NFT from our database is listed here. That's fantastic. We see the price. We see the address. We see the token ID. We see the seller. Now, if we go back to our NFT marketplace, our little, our little hard hat NFT marketplace, let's mint another one. Yarn hard hat run scripts mint and list dash dash network localhost. We're going to run that. It's going to mint one more. If we go back to our Morales database, we do a little refresh on that active item table. We now have a new item in here. So if we go back to our front end, we give this a little refresh and boom, now we have two items in here. So this is awesome. We now have a way to actually show the most recently listed NFTs on our marketplace. Huzzah. Now, of course, you might be saying to yourself, hey, Patrick, that's cool and all, but that looks really ugly. And I would agree with you, <laughs> but 100% agree with you. So we should come up with a component to show our listed NFTs that looks a lot nicer. So instead of returning and just printing out the raw information, we probably want to show the image, right? We want to show the image, we want to make everything look a lot nicer. So we're going to create a new component that we're going to return in here to format all of our NFTs appropriately. So we're going to go to components. We'll do new file and we're going to call NFT box. JS. And this is where we're going to grab all the information on how to show what our NFT actually looks like. So let's get started working on our NFT box. We're going to set this up the way we've been setting all of these up. We'll do export default function NFT box. Now, something that's a little bit different for this one, though, is that in our index, we have all this information. So we're going to need to pass all these variables to our NFT box component. So to do that, we'll add them as input parameters for our component here. So we'll say price, NFT address, token ID, marketplace address, and seller. So right now on our front end, we just have a whole bunch of text and we even have this gross warning. We're gonna get rid of that too. And as we know, tokens have their token URI, which points to an image URI or an image URL of what the actual token looks like. So what we're gonna wanna do is we're gonna want to call that token URI and then call the image URI to show the image. So we are going to actually have to wait those two API requests to get the actual image. And we're going to save that image as a state variable on this component here. So as you already know, we're going to work with use state to keep track of that image URI. So we'll do import use state from react like this. And then here we'll say const image URI comma set image URI equals use state. And we'll start it off as a blank string. Now let's create a function. We're going to call it update UI to update our UI and grab this token URI and the image URI. So we'll create an async function called update UI. And in order to get the image, first we're going to need to get the token URI and then using the image tag from the token URI gets the image. So first thing we're gonna have to do is get the token URI. So we know how to do this with use web three contract. So we'll do import use web three contract from react Morales. And as we know, use web three contract is going to need some parameters. So we'll say const run contract function, get token URI equals use web three contract. First, we need the ABI of the NFT because we're going to need to call token URI. So to get the ABI, we're going to need to once again update our front end. So let's comment this part out. We'll go back to our hard hat piece and let's look in our deploy scripts. We have this update front end right now. All this is doing is updating contract addresses. Well, that's good. We're also going to want to add ABIs to our front end as well. So let's create another function in here called update ABI and we'll pass the ABIs as well. So we'll do async function update ABI and we'll give it both the basic NFT ABI and the NFT marketplace ABI because we're going to need both of them. So we'll say const NFT 
marketplace equals await ethers.getContract NFT marketplace. We're going to write the ABI to the front end ABI location. We have the front end contracts file. So let's also do a const front end ABI location equals, and we'll do dot dot slash next.js NFT marketplace dash FCC slash constants. And instead of actually just giving the file name, we can just give it the front end ABI location. And then we'll actually have it generate that file for us because we're just going to overwrite the ABI file anytime we work with it. So now that we have the marketplace, we'll just do fs.write file sync and we'll do front end ABI location nft marketplace.json nft marketplace dot interface dot format ethers dot utils dot format types dot json so we're also going to want to do that for the basic nft so we'll say const basic nft equals await ethers dot get contract basic nft fs dot write file sync it's going to be that exact same place right here except for it's going to be a different location it's going to be basic nft.json and of course we're going to do a comma basic nft.interface.format ethers.utils.format types.json you can find this nft marketplace.interface in the hardhead documentation and you can find this in the ethers documentation so now we have this update abi function let's also add this to our module that exports so we'll do await update abi like that there's a hyphen here that shouldn't be here and we'll run just this part of our hard hat front end we'll run yarn hard hat deploy dash 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 tags the tag here is front end front end and now it says nothing to compile updating front end it's done so if we go back to our front end now we go to our constants we now see two objects in here which are going to be the abis of the basic nft and the nft marketplace Awesome. So now that we have that, we can import those into our front end. So we can say import NFT marketplace ABI from dot dot slash constants slash NFT marketplace dot JSON. And we can also get the NFT ABI. So we'll do import NFT ABI from dot dot slash constants slash basic NFT dot JSON. Now in our run contract function, our token URI function is part of the NFT ABI. So the ABI will be the NFT ABI. The contract address is going to be the address of the NFT, which we're passing in as a parameter. So we'll pass in NFT address. The function name is going to be token URI. And the params are going to be the token ID, which is getting passed as an input parameter to this function, to this component. Right? And we can double check. We'll go to our basic nft.sol, right? We scroll down. We have this token URI that we're overriding. And this is the function we want to call. It takes the token ID. So this is the function we want to call. It takes the token ID. Okay, great. So in our update UI, first we'll say const token URI equals await get token URI. Now let's do a little console.log token URI just to see what this returns. To make sure that update UI is called, We'll add it to a use effect. So we'll say use effect. And this takes an input parameter of a function to do. We'll just say update UI. And then we'll only have this run anytime is web three enabled changes. So we want to run update UI, but we want it to be dependent on is web three enabled. And then we'll say if is web three enabled, then update UI. So we need to add use effect as well. So we're using use state. We'll do comma use effect. And now we should at least be reading our token URI off the blockchain. We're not going to set the image yet, right? Because we're going to get the image URI from the token URI. Let's add this NFT box to our index to, to see if it's working well so far. Back in our index, up at the top, we will import NFT box from dot dot slash components slash NFT box. And down here, while we're returning this, we'll add our NFT box component, but we'll make sure to pass in all the parameters it takes. So the price is going to equal that JavaScript price, NFT address, 
is going to equal the JavaScript NFT address. The token ID is going to equal the token ID. Marketplace address is going to be marketplace address. Seller is going to be the seller. And you saw that warning where it's saying, hey, all the components need to, all the things in the mapping need to have their unique key. So we'll say key. We'll give these all a key as well. We'll say key equals. This we'll do some string interpolation. We'll just say the NFT address combined with the token ID can be the key. So if we save that, we go back to our front end here, do a little refresh. Marketplace address is not defined. Market place address. So let's make sure we spell things right. Let's go back to the front end. We'll give it a refresh. Is Web3 enabled is not defined. Whoops, excuse me, in the NFT box. We need to grab that from use Morales. So we'll import use Morales. And in our components here, we'll say const is Web3 enabled equals use Morales. We'll save that. And one thing I, I noticed actually is this needs to be wrapped in squigglies. Sorry, I forgot to do that. Our component actually just takes a props props input parameter and we would need to do like props that token ID uh, to get token ID but instead we just extract it out by doing putting the little squiggly brackets here so we'll put the squiggly brackets there great we'll do a little console.log token URI or index.js is everything updated here let's do a little save and we can even say if is web3 enabled update UI like that we'll save we'll go to the front end we'll do a little refresh we'll see if everything's working as expected and as long as we're on that hard hat local host in our MetaMask, and again, you can ignore this error, this warning that's up here for now. And if you click this and you have your IPFS and Brave or your IPFS companion, we can now see we're getting our token URI, which is perfect. The piece that we want now is this image bit. And for this one that I'm using, it is an HTTPS, which technically isn't decentralized, right? We would need it to come from, instead of HTTPS, we would need to come from IPFS colon slash slash, but but actually having it as HTTPS IPFS.io for now is good. We'll explain why in just a second. Now that we're getting the token URI, we can call this URL and we can get back the image that we want to actually show on the front end. So in here, we'll do a little console.log. The token URI is a little string interpolation like this. And then we'll say if token URI. We're going to need to now grab this token URI and get the image from it. And this is where we're going to get a little bit funky and we're going to cheat a little bit. Now for our application, not everybody is going to have IPFS companion. Not every browser is IPFS compatible. So we're going to have to actually cheat a little bit here. We're actually going to change the token URI from its IPFS edition to an HTTPS edition. And this is known as using an IPFS gateway, which is a server that will return IPFS files from a normal URL. So we're gonna use an IPFS gateway, which we can just make regular HTTPS calls to, and it'll return those IPF files. So technically, are we making this centralized doing this? Yes, and is that ideal? No, however, until the world adopts IPFS and until the world adopts these standards, it's kind of what we have to do right now because otherwise the front end will just show up as blank to them and we can't have that. We don't want that. So we're going to say const request URL equals token URI dot replace IPFS slash slash with HTTPS, HTTPS slash slash IPFS dot IO slash IPFS slash. So we're saying if you have a token URI that starts with IPFS, that's great, but we're gonna switch it to using an IPFS gateway. So we're gonna use the IPFS gateway provided by the team that builds IPFS. So pretty reliable gateway. Is this kind of a cop-out? Yes. Are our files still on IPFS? Yes. So it's not the end of the world, but this is just gonna make calling these APIs a lot easier for us. And we're gonna say const token URI response equals await and this is going to be a little weird we're going to do two awaits await await fetch request url dot json so fetch is a keyword you can use in javascript to fetch or get the url fetch keyword is essentially doing the same thing as pasting this into the browser like so 
and we're getting this JSON response. So we await to get the response and then we await to convert the response to JSON. And that's how we get the token response. So we now have this object in our JavaScript, which is perfect because this object has this image attribute that we want. So we're gonna do the same thing we did here. We're gonna use the IPFS gateway. This one's already using HTTPS.IPFS.io, but if it wasn't, we would still wanna convert it. So now we're gonna say const image URI equals token URI response.image. So we're gonna get the image tag of this response here. And then we're gonna say const image URI URL is gonna to equal to, and we're gonna do the exact same thing that we did up here. We're gonna use the gateway image URI dot replace IPFS colon slash slash with HTTPS IPFS.io slash IPFS. And now, and that's how we get this URL right here. And so we can finally do set image URI to that image URL. And now we have our image URI is going to be that image URI here. Now, is this a little bit wonky? Yes. Are there better ways that we can do this? Yes, there's actually a number of better ways that we could do some of this. We could actually, since we're using Morales, we could render image on our server and, and just call our server. What else could we do? Well, for test nets and main nets, Morales actually comes with a bunch of hooks like use NFT balance that will show us NFTs, show us how many NFTs, show us all this information about NFTs, but it only works on test nets and mainnet. We'd have the world adopt IPFS, so we don't have to do this wrapping. Unfortunately, it doesn't yet, so such is life. But now that we're setting the image URI, we have this image URI, we have what this actually looks like. We're gonna have this, and if we click on this, if we use this in our browser, it returns this dog. So now we have the image URI in our website, we can finally use it to show what this is gonna look like. So finally, we can create a return in here. So down below, we'll do return, do a little div, and then I'll do another div just because I want to. <laughs> and we can do some JavaScript. We can say, if if that image URI exists, we'll do some stuff. Otherwise, we'll do some other stuff. So if it doesn't exist, maybe we'll do a div for now. Div that just says loading, dot, dot, dot. And if it does exist, for now, we'll just say, just do a little div, close the div, and we'll just say, found it. Now, if we go back to our front end, let's see if we're good here. Aha, if I do a refresh, we see found it for both of these NFTs. Okay, cool. So how do we actually show these NFTs? We finally have the URL that we can use to show the NFTs, but we wanna actually use them. Next.js actually comes with a component called the image component that we can use to render images really easily just by using a URI. Now, because we're gonna use this image tag and because it does some optimizations on the backend, that means that this website won't be able to be deployed to a static to a static site like IPFS because now our website requires a server. Technically, it re requires a server just because we have Morales, so that might be another reason we might not want to. Since we're using this image tag, we can't deploy this statically to something like IPFS. Is we're gonna up at the top, we're gonna do import image from next slash image, and we're gonna down here we're gonna say instead of found it, we're gonna go image, we're gonna close it off here too. We're gonna give a loader of just a blank function that just gives us the image URI. Don't worry too much about loader for now. We're gonna say the source of the image is gonna be the image URI. And then we'll give it a height of maybe 200. And then we'll give it a width of also maybe 200. And if we did this right, after we save, we should see the image on our UI. So we'll go back to our website and oh my goodness, we can see the dogs. Holy cow. This is getting really exciting. We can see the puppies, we can see the images. We're definitely doing something right here, which is really exciting. Now I know I said this before that this isn't a CSS. This isn't a formatting tutorial because that's definitely not my expertise. However, let's make this look a little bit nicer. And we're gonna use once again, the Web3 UI kit because the Web3 UI kit has a whole bunch of tools that are really, really helpful for us to use. So if we go to the Web3 UI kit, we can go to that live storybook demo, that interactive bit, and we can scroll down to the section that it has called card, where we can make these little clickable cards and we can display some information about our NFTs. So let's go ahead and at the top we'll do import, import card, 
from Web3 UI Kit. And now instead of just showing the image, we'll wrap the image in a card like this. We'll save that. Now back on our front end, give it a little refresh. Now we've got this kind of clickable section that looks a little bit nicer. We'll even label it and we can even label it with a title and description. Now we can grab the title and the description from the token URI response. So up at the top, let's go ahead, let's grab the title and the description of the token URI as a state variable. So we'll say const token name, set token name equals use state, start off as blank, we'll do const token description, set token description equals use state, and I'll start off as blank too. Down when we do this update UI bit, we'll call set token name. So we'll say name is token URL response dot name. We'll say set token description, which will be token URL response dot description. And then we'll use those descriptions and title in the card. So we'll say title equals token name description equals token description. Save that. We'll look at our front end here. Give it a little refresh. Oh, and now we have the name of the NFT and its description on our front end. Okay, cool. Let's keep going. What else do we want on this? Well, we probably want who it's owned by. So we'll put a little div inside the card, say div. Maybe we'll even put the token ID. We'll do a little number for the token ID. We'll do another little div and then we'll make this italic. We'll say class name equals italic and then text is going to be small and we'll say owned by and this is where we can get the seller that we're passing in as an input parameter and then maybe underneath the image we want to put the price so we'll do a little div here and then we'll say price like this however we're probably don't want it in way we want it in human readable units so we'll import ethers we'll say import ethers from ethers and then instead of just showing the price, we'll do a little, little JavaScript in here. We'll do ethers.utils.format units price, price in ether. And then we'll do space eth. And then we'll make this be class name equals font bold. So we can read how much it's listed for on our marketplace. So let's go back. Aha, we can now see. This is token ID number four. We can see who it's owned by. We can see the price of it and then more information about the dog. Yay. Now let's format all this stuff in here a little bit nicer. So let's wrap everything in a div in one more div. And now we'll say class name is going to be flex and this is going to help format everything. We'll put everything on a column items end gap two. And now if we look back, they're kind of like in a column now and we'll wrap in one more div, give them some padding. Last name equals P2. We see a little bit of padding has been added. Okay, nice. And then we'll go back to our index and we'll add some formatting to our index here. So our main one, we're going to remove styles.container. We're just going to say container MX auto. We're going to make an H1 in here. Class name equals high four DX four font bold text to Excel. This is gonna, we're just gonna say recently listed. Then we're gonna do another div class name equals flex flex wrap. We're gonna end this div around our JavaScript here. And let's look at our UI. Let's see what that does. Okay, cool. Let's go back to our index. Let's remove all this stuff. Since now we're adding that to the card. Let's save. And now it's looking a lot better. We are finally able to start listing our NFTs and then have them show up on our marketplace like we see here. Fantastic. Okay. If we go to the readme homepage show recently listed NFTs. Oh my goodness. This is a check. We're done here. Now, I know it seemed like a lot of work, but a lot of it was setting up that morale server correctly. And because we have our own backend now, we have some backend services that we needed to configure. But now that everything's set up, the rest of this is going to be easy street. Now we are only going to want this to show if we're connected to Web3. Right now, if we click this, this still shows up. So we're going to have to update this a little bit. And in our index.js, where now we're checking to see fetching listed NFTs. Right before that, 
right before we do that, we actually want to see is Web3 enabled? And this is going to be a little bit of nested tertiary operations. If Web3 is enabled, then we're going to do all this fetching listed NFTs stuff here. We're going to do everything in here. So if it's not enabled, we'll just do like a little div that says Web3 currently not enabled. And of course, we're going to need to grab is Web3 enabled. So we're going to say at the top, we'll do const is Web3 enabled equals use Morales as we've been doing. And we're going to grab use Morales from React Morales. We'll save that, go back to our front end, give it a little, a little refresh. If we're connected, we'll see the marketplace. If we disconnect, we see Web3 currently not enabled, which is what we want. Perfect. So what is next in our readme? If you own the NFT, you can update the listing. Let's first, let's figure out if somebody actually is the owner of these NFTs. Let's make it really easy for the people on this website. Well, first we can get the person's MetaMask by grabbing the account from Use Morales. So we'll do a comma account like so. Then we can easily just do const is owned by user equals seller equals 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 account. So the seller we're getting from the contract, the account we're getting from whoever's connected here. If the seller equals the account, there is no seller equals 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 undefined. We'll just say they're owned by you. And now instead of saying owned by seller, we can say const formatted seller address equals, and we'll do the ternary operator. We'll say, if it's owned by you, then we'll just say you instead of seller. Otherwise we'll say seller. So now we'll say owned by formatted seller address like this. So if we go back to our front end, we do a little refresh, depending on who's connected, you might see owned by blah, blah, blah. Now, if I go to my MetaMask, let me go ahead and switch account to account three. Let's go ahead and connect our account three. We now see owned by you instead, right? And we can even switch again. We'll switch accounts again. We'll switch to account one. We now see owned by blah, 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 like so. Since when we switch back and forth, the diameters of this actually change, which is really annoying. So maybe we want to go one step further and we want to truncate this seller address, make it a little bit smaller. So we want to make a seller a little bit smaller. So let's create a new function. And we can create this outside of the export default function because this is going to be a function that doesn't depend on anything inside our app. It's just going to be kind of a raw function. So we're going to create, we'll call it const truncate string. And this is going to be a function that takes a full string and a string length as parameters. And we're just going to pass the seller address and how long we want to make this string. So this is going to be an arrow function we're going to do here. And we're just going to say, if full string dot length is less than or equal to str lang, return full str. Otherwise, we'll say concept ra tor equals three little dots. And we'll say let sep ra tor length equals sep ra tor dot length. Excuse me, const separator length. We'll say const chars to show is going to be the the string length minus the separator length. We'll say const front chars or front characters is going to equal math.ceiling chars to show divided by two. Const back chars is going to equal math.floor chars to show divided by two. And if you don't understand this math here, don't worry about it. And then we're just going to say return full string substring of zero to front chars plus the sep ra tor plus full str dot substring of full str dot length minus back chars. And now what we can do is we can grab this truncate str, this truncate string, and for is formatted seller, we'll say if it's you, we'll still do you, but otherwise we'll do truncate string of seller or blank if there's no seller, and we'll have it be size 15. And now if we save that and go back to our front end, if it's owned by you, it's still going to say owned by you. But if we switch accounts, it now says owned by, you know, blah, 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 dot, 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 blah, 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 with a truncated address. And then these sizes don't actually change, which is a lot nicer than them getting bigger and smaller. So awesome. So now we have this formatted even better. Okay. 
Now what do we want to do? Well, now that we know who owns the NFT, NFT and it's formatted pretty nicely, we need to figure out a way to update the listing. So what we want to do is, once again, if it's owned by us, and we can switch back to the account it's owned by, if it's owned by us, when we click on it, we want to be able to update the listing on the marketplace. So to do this, we're going to create a new component called Update Listing Modal. So we're going to create a new component, new file, update listing modal.js. And a modal is something that like pops up. So for example, this little pop up here is known as a modal. And this is what we want to build. If it's owned by us, when we click this, we want it to pop up this modal thing. So to get started, we'll do the same thing we've been doing for all of our components here. We'll do export default function update listing modal like so. And we're probably going to want to pass it these parameters from the NFT box. We're probably going to want to pass it these parameters so the modal knows what function it needs to call in our NFT marketplace. The way we're going to update listing is we're going to call this update listing function where we need the address, token ID, and then some new price. So we're going to at least need those. So we're going to need the NFT address and at least the token ID. To make this little pop up, we're not going to code it ourselves. We're going to once again use the Web3 UI kit. Web3 UI kit has this nice pop up section where it has some code to work with a modal. So we're going to import that. We'll do import modal from Web3 UI kit like so. Here's what it looks like. We have modal and then we have all this stuff on working with the modal. So we'll do our return. We'll do a little modal like this. One of the key things in a modal is whether or not it should be visible. So it has an is visible tag, which we're actually going to have to grab. We're actually going to have to grab from the NFT box. So we're going to pass a little is visible here as well. In our NFT box, we need to tell our modal when it's visible. So we'll, we'll make that code in a little bit. Right now, it'll just be blank. And inside of our modal, we're going to want to give an input field for how to update it. So I know we've done some regular inputs before. Since we've been working with Web3 UI Kit, let's just use the input that it has as well. So we'll do a little comma, input here. And inside of the modal, we'll create a new input. So in our input field, we'll give this a label, which is going to be update listing price in L1 currency. And we'll just do ETH for now. We'll just hard code it as ETH. Name will be new listing price and type is going to equal a number. And we'll do a little backslash here. Oops, it will do a little backslash instead of like that. So cool. So when this modal pops up, it's going to have this input in here. And we can actually test to see if this is working. We can import this into our NFT box. We'll do import update listing modal from dot slash update listing modal. Oops, and sorry, this doesn't need parentheses. And at the top of our return here, right before our card, we'll add it in. So we'll just add another div though, so that these two can be in the same React bit. We'll add another div. We'll say update listing modal, like so, with a little backslash here. And right now we just have to pass is visible. And then for now, we're just gonna say true. So now with this listing modal, on our front end, we do a little refresh. And we get this little box like this update listing price in L1 currency. And we'll have to close two of them because technically we right now both modals are true, right? So if we do a refresh, we get this little input pop up, this little modal, and we close it twice because we have two NFTs. If you have a ton of NFTs here, you will have to close a ton of those. So we change it to false. We go back to the front end. We do a little refresh and boom, now it's false. So true, save, front end, it's there. Gross, delete, delete, false, save, front end. It's not there anymore. Okay, cool. So we're going to have to tell this modal only to pop up when somebody clicks this NFT that they own. So to actually toggle this and actually make this work, we're going to update our card. So whenever we click our card, we're going to create a function called handle card click. That handle card click is going to update a variable for whether or not we should show this modal. So what we're going to do is we're going to say on click of the card, aka once we click our dog, we're going to call some function. So we're going to say on click equals handle card click, handle card click. And we're going to make this a function. We're going to say const handle card click 
equals a function. We'll use some arrow stuff here. And then we'll just say, if it's is owned by user, if it's owned by user, we'll show the modal. Else, we will call the buy item function. Since we want our whole UI to re-render, once we change once we, we change the variable to show the modal, we're gonna do this as a use state. So we'll say const show modal, comma set show modal equals use state. And then we're gonna start it off being defaulted to false. So by default, we are not gonna show the modal, which is what we want. But if it's owned by the user, we're gonna say set show modal to be true. And then else, right now we'll just put console.log Let's buy. We'll actually update this to buying the item a little bit later. So now instead of having is visible be false, we'll have is visible equal to show modal, our show modal variable. Okay, great. So now if we save that, we go back to our UI, we right click, we hit inspect. If we own it and we click it, the modal will pop up and we can click it out. If we click another one, modal will pop up. If we don't own it, so if we switch accounts, we'll connect, we'll switch. We click it, nothing happens. And if we go to inspect, we go to the console, we click it, we should see let's buy pop up, which is what we do see. We'll do a little refresh here. Click, we see let's buy pop up. Click again, let's buy, click, let's buy, let's buy, let's buy. Great, cool. So now we have a way for that modal to actually show up correctly. Let's switch back to the person who actually owns this NFT. If we click it. We want to be able to, when we hit OK or submit, we want to send a transaction to update the price of our NFT here. So what we can do is in our input, we'll have a label called onChange equals, and this is the function that we'll call whenever this updates. So we're gonna say onChange event is gonna be a function, and we're going to create a function called set price to update listing, listing with event.target.value. So we wanna keep track of whatever we've put in here. So when we call the function to update the price, it'll just already automatically have it. So we'll create this function and event.target.value is gonna be whatever's in this input box here. So we'll create this set price to update listing with. We'll have this be a use state because we are gonna to wanna to change the UI based off this. So we'll say const price to update listing with, comma, set price to update listing with equals use state, and then we'll have this be zero to start or blank. And so now whatever is in here is gonna get updated with this. So now I can do like a console.log price to update listing with. We got back to the front end. Oops, we need to import use state. Import use state from React. Go back to the front end, we click this, we right click inspect. If I type, you know, one, we can see one. 14, we see 14. Let's remove the console.log now. Now what we can do in here is we can create a field called on OK. And this is gonna be the function that we call when we hit this OK here. So on OK is gonna be equal to a function. We're gonna use a little arrow notation and we're gonna call that update listing function on the blockchain. We're gonna to need to grab that function so we can use it. So once again, to use that function, we're gonna do import use web3 contract from React Morales, and as a new hook, we'll say const run contract function called update listing equals use web3 contract. And this is gonna be a function that we're gonna call on our NFT marketplace. So ABI is gonna be the NFT marketplace ABI, which we can get by doing import, similar to what we did over here. And we actually just copy paste from our NFT box. So we'll do import NFT marketplace ABI from dot dot constants NFT marketplace .json. We're gonna need the contract address, which is gonna be an input parameter to our update listing modal. So we can even do a comma marketplace address, copy this, place that here. That means in our NFT box, pretty soon we're gonna to have to pass all these variables to it, but we'll save that in just a second. So NFT marketplace address, marketplace address, function name is gonna be what? It's called update listing in our smart contract, and then the params. So if we go to this, we have update listing, takes the NFT address, token ID, and new price. We'll do NFT address, which will be NFT address. We'll say token ID, 
is going to be token ID and then new price. New price will get from price to update listing with, but we'll convert it from human readable to ethers. So we'll import ethers from ethers and the new price will be ethers.utils.parse ethers or ether price to update listing with or just in case it's blank we'll just say or zero so we have the nft address the token id marketplace address in our nft box we're gonna have to pass those parameters in here so we have is visible we're also going to have token id which is going to equal token id marketplace address is going to equal the marketplace address and the nft address is going to equal the nft address and as we code and test this, something that's going to be really annoying because it's really annoying for me right now, let's refresh our website. And if we click it, this thing pops up. But when I hit X and I click this again, nothing shows up. That's because technically show modal is still true right now, even though we've exited out. So what we want to do in the NFT box is in our update listing modal, we're also going to pass it an on close and we're going to pass it a hide modal variable that we're going to create. And right under show modal, set show modal, we're going to create const hide modal. And this is just going to be a function that's just going to say set show modal to false. We're going to pass this function to our update modal listing. So we're going to do comma on close. And in our modal here, we're going to say on close, excuse me, on cancel. We're going to do, we're going to call that on close function or on close button pressed. We're also going to call that on close function. Now, if we refresh our website, click this modal pops up, we click X, we click it again, it'll pop back up because now we're properly setting it to false and then resetting it to true. Now to actually send this update listing function, we're going to pass this another thing, another variable, we're going to pass it on OK, which is going to be a function as well, is just going to call update listing that we just created. Now it's always a good idea to add an on error. We'd say on error, take that error as a function and console.log the error. Oh, and this needs to be in squiggly brackets like that. But contract address is wrong, so we'll make this contract contract address. Let's spell that correctly. Spell that correctly. Now let's go back to the UI. We'll give it a little refresh. Click this. We'll add a one and we see MetaMask pop up. So this is working out perfectly. Now I'm going to cancel it and our app's going to freak out and stuff, but that's okay. We are doing fantastically. Okay. App popped up like that, which is good. We have this little error handling, which I like to add for all of these run contract functions. Let's also do an on success. So let's say when this does go through successfully, we'll call a function called handle update listing success. And this will be a function that we'd call when this goes through correctly. So at the top, let's make this new function. We'll say const handle update listing success is going to be a new function using the arrow syntax here. And we'll have this set up a new notification for our, a web application. So for us to do notifications, we're going to use web three UI kits use notification. This is going to be that same notification service that we used in our last one. So up at the top here, we'll import it, use notification, and then we'll say right in our component, we'll say const dispatch equals use notification. And since we're using notifications back in our app.js, we have to import it in here. So we'll do import notification provider from Web3 UI kit and inside of our morales provider, We'll add the notification provider around our header and our component so that we have context for this. Now in our handle update listing success inside this function, we'll say dispatch, we'll say type is going to be success. Message will be listing updated. Title will be listing updated. Please refresh. Please refresh and move blocks and then position top right. And then we'll do on close. 
and on close. And we'll say set price to update listing with back to zero. Hi all, so I'm editing this a little bit in the future and I realized that I actually forgot to add the TX to a lot of these handle functions. So on these, whenever we call one of these run contract functions, like we've been saying, they have this on error and this on success. Now this on success automatically passes the results of the call to whatever callback function is there. So for example, update listing returns a transaction and we'll pass that transaction to whatever you add to the on success. So now in here, you can actually have it have a transaction as an input parameter. And this will be the transaction that's gonna go on the blockchain to you know update the price. So we actually wanna change it from a regular function to an async function so we can actually do await tx.wait one because we don't want to say, hey, success, you know, listing has been updated before the transaction actually goes through. So we want the transaction to go through first, and then we want to pop the dispatch up saying, hey, it's gone through. So, and then additionally, when we actually call these modals on the on OK, on the on success, we pass them in just by referencing the name of the function. So we don't do this arrow syntax anymore like this. We just say, hey, the on success is going to be this, go ahead and, and pass your results to it. So that's how we actually call it down here. If you look at the GitHub repo associated with this, and you go to components, and we go into these. So in this video, I forgot to add the await tx.wait1, but in the GitHub repo, we have these. And when I'm demoing things in the video here, the dispatch is gonna pop up before the transaction actually finishes going through. So just wanna let you know, and back to the video. So now we have a little success thing that'll pop up when we're successful. And the other thing is, when we call this, we are going to emit an item listed. Inside of our Morales dashboard, the price should actually update in our active item because of our cloud functions. So we're gonna put this all together now. So we're on the front end, NFT Marketplace, owned by you. We'll click it. Update listing to 25. We're gonna hit okay. MetaMask is going to pop up. We're going to go ahead and confirm. And it ran into an error because we need to click MetaMask. I need to reset my accounts. So I'm going to do settings, advanced, reset account. Okay. Now let's go ahead. MetaMask has popped up again. We're going to go ahead and confirm. It closed the pop up modal and we got our little notification there. And we can see an activity we have that transaction has indeed completed. So now if we go to active item, we give it a little refresh. Right now we see our item listed event, but the issue is that it's not confirmed yet. So what we're gonna need to do is we're gonna need to move our blocks by one. So in our NFT marketplace, we're just gonna create a new script, a new file called mine.js just to move our blocks once. And we're gonna say const move blocks equals require dot dot slash utils slash move blocks. We'll say const blocks equals two const sleep amount equals 1000 async function mine we'll do await move blocks. We'll do blocks as the parameter and then sleep sleep amount will equal sleep amount, and this will be a script. So we'll add our, we'll copy paste our, that same syntax we're doing here just with mine. And now we want to just mine these two blocks. So we'll run yarn, hard hat run scripts, mine.js dash dash network localhost. So we're going to mine those two blocks. Now, if we go back to our database, if we go back to active items, we can see it's been updated because now in our item listed, that 2500 event is now a confirmed transaction. And we can see confirmed there. Excellent. So that means since it's confirmed back in our front end, we'll give this a little refresh. We can see the pup is now worth 25 ETH. Awesome. So our updating modal is working perfectly. Excellent job. So now let's go to the readme. If you own the NFT, you can update the listing. That's a check mark. Excellent.
Next, what do we want it to do? If you don't own it, you can buy the listing. Okay, so let's go back to our website. Let's switch users to a different account. Uh, we're probably going to want an account that owns some money. So let's go ahead and send this other account some money. Transfer between my accounts. We'll send 100 ETH to account one. Confirm on our hard hat chain here. All right, great. Now we can go ahead and switch to account one and we have 100 ETH. Okay, great. Because these pups each cost less than 100 ETH. So that's going to be more than plenty for us to test this out. Let's go back to this box because I think somewhere we said we did a little handle card click. If it's owned by the user, have the modal pop up. If not, let's do the buy functionality. So to do the buy functionality, we're going to go ahead and do another run contract function. So we'll do const run contract function. We'll call this one buy item. And this will equal use web three contract. And this is going to be the ABI for the NFT marketplace. ABI, the contract address is going to be the market place address. The function name is going to be buy item. The message value is going to be the price of the NFT because we need to send that amount to buy the item. And then params are going to be NFT address, which is going to be the NFT address and the token ID, which is going to be the token ID. Now that we have this buy item on handle card click, we can say, okay, set show modal is true. Otherwise, we're going to call buy item and we're going to do on error. Error is going to be a function where we're just going to console.log the error. And on success, it'll be a function where we call handle buy item success. So we'll create a new handler for this. It's right underneath handle card click. We'll do const handle buy item success equals a function. And for this, we'll also have this do a little notification. So once again, we're going to import. We're going to import use notification from Web3 UI kit. We're going to say const dispatch equals use notification. And then in handle buy item success, we're going to say dispatch type success message item bot title will also be item bot and then position will be top right and that's it so handle card click if they own it we're going to show that update listing modal if they don't already own it someone's going to buy it so let's go back here and i'm currently on an account that does not own these nfts let's go ahead and click it our metamask does indeed show up for 25 ETH, that's crazy expensive. Let's go ahead and confirm. Item has been bought. We'll go ahead and click that little X. We go to our MetaMask. The transaction is pending and it's gone through. This is fantastic. Okay, our homepage is done. We can show recently listed NFTs. If not, you can update the listing. If not, you can buy the listing. And now it's time for our sell page. So the last thing that we need to do is our sell page. Let's get this sell page. Let's get this done. Pages. We have our sell NFT page, which right now does a whole lot of nothing. And on our front end, we go here. There's not a whole lot here. And actually, you can list your NFT in the marketplace. We also needed to and withdraw proceeds. So I didn't add that, but that's probably going to be something we're going to want to allow people to do as well. So let's get started here. So we can remove this head stuff now that we're adding that in our main page. And for us to submit a new NFT, we're probably gonna need a space to add the address of the NFT, the token ID of the NFT, and all this other stuff. So we're gonna need a form to do this, which guess what? We can also grab a form from the Web3 UI kit as well. So we're gonna go ahead in our sell NFT page. We're gonna do import form from Web3 UI kit. And we're going to create a new form in our sell page. Now, the parameters we can add to our form, again, you can find them in the documentation here. But we're going to add with one of the main pieces is going to be this data piece, which is going to be an object that has a list in it of all the different fields we can put in our form. 
So maybe we'll do our first one, have a name of NFT address. That's going to be of type text. Oops, excuse me. And these are all going to be, this is a list of a list of objects like that. Now, if we save that, we go back to our cell page. We can now see an NFT address and a little submit button that right now does a whole lot of nothing. So we have an NFT address. It'll take a text. Maybe we'll also do in put width of 50%. We'll have the starting value be blank. And the key of this will be NFT address. What else do we need? We're going to need to give it the token ID. So we'll say name token ID. Type is going to be a number. Value will start off as blank. And then the key for this will be token ID. Next, we're going to need the price. So we'll say name will be price in ETH. Type will be a number. Value will be blank. And the key will be price. And we don't need to have two form tags. We'll just delete that second one and have it auto close with one tag. And then in here we'll do title equals sell your NFT ID equals main form. So cool. So now we can take an NFT address, a token ID, and a new price with the title of sell your NFT. Great, that looks really nice. But right now our form doesn't do anything. We probably wanna give it the functionality to actually do stuff. So we'll say on submit, and we'll have to create a new function to actually list our NFTs. So we're gonna create a function called approve and list. We have to approve our marketplace to pull the NFT from our wallets. So we're gonna create a new function, async function approve and list, which is gonna take a data input parameter. On our form, when we hit on submit, it's just automatically gonna pass this data object to our approve and list function. So that's how we're gonna get the value of the address, the value of the token ID, and the value of the price. So in our async function approve and list, we'll do console.log approving. So the const, the NFT address, is gonna come from this data object. So it's gonna be data dot data at index zero. Our zeroth object here is gonna be our address dot input result. Our token ID is gonna equal data dot data one, because again, this one is gonna be our token ID dot input result. And then the price is gonna equal ethers.utils.parse units of data dot data of two dot input result comma ether dot to string. So we're going to get the price in ETH in human readable form. We're going to convert it to Ethereum readable form. And then we're going to pass it as a string because this returns a big number, which we don't want. So we have the NFT address, the token ID, and the price of the new listing. What we can do now is we can say const approve options equals a little function here, the ABI, which is going to be our NFT ABI, which we need to import we need to import both ethers from ethers. And we also need to import the NFT ABI, import NFT ABI from dot dot constants slash basic NFT dot JSON. I just copied and pasted it from the NFT box. The contract address is going to be the NFT address. The function name is going to be approve. The params are going to be two the marketplace address, which we're going to define in just a second. And then the token ID will be token ID. Now the marketplace address in our NFT box, we're getting this directly from index and index is getting it from our database. Now we want our app to be smart enough to be able to grab the NFT marketplace itself, the marketplace address. And if we go to our constants right now, we actually have it in this network mapping. So we're going to want to grab it right up at the top by saying const marketplace address equals network mapping, network mapping of what? Of the chain ID of the NFT marketplace address at the zero with index. So network mapping of the chain ID, which we're gonna get 
const chain ID equals use Morales. Now chain ID actually comes, like we said, in its OX hex form from Morales. So we're gonna have to convert the chain ID to its string readable version. So we'll say const chain string equals chain ID, and we'll do a tertiary operator. If the chain ID exists, we'll parse int of the chain ID dot to string. So we'll parse it from its hex to a more readable version and then do dot to string. And then otherwise, we'll just say we're on 31337. So chain ID string. So in the network mapping, at the chain ID string, dot NFT marketplace at index zero, that's gonna be our marketplace address. So we got the marketplace address. This is all we need to call the approve function on our NFT. We can now call run contract function for approve. So we're actually gonna do this a little bit differently. We're just gonna say const run contract function equals use web three contract. You could import just run contract function and then pass all those options to it like what we're gonna do here. So now we're just gonna say await run contract function because this is an async function, await run contract function. We're gonna say params are gonna be approve options. And we're gonna say on success, we're gonna do something. And we're gonna say on error. We're also gonna just do error, little arrow function, console.log error. Now on success, once we send this transaction, after the approve goes through, we're gonna to want to call the list function. So right underneath this, we'll call async, async function, handle approve success. And this is gonna take the NFT address, the token ID, and the price is input parameters. So once this run contract function goes through, we're gonna call of handle approve success, and we'll pass it the NFT address, token ID, and the price, which we'll say console.log. Okay, now time to list. And we'll do the same thing. We'll do const list options equals, and this is gonna be all the options for calling the list function. ABI is gonna be on the marketplace this time. So NFT marketplace ABI, which again, we're gonna have to import. So I'm gonna go back to NFT box. I'm gonna copy that line here, paste it in the top. That's gonna be the ABI for that. Contract address is going to be the marketplace address, which we already have. Function name is going to be list item. And the params are gonna be NFT address of the NFT address, token ID of token ID, price of price. And now we have those options. We can do await run contract function with params of list options. We'll say on success, arrow function, handle list success, which is a function we haven't made yet. We'll say on error, error, and we'll just say console.log error. Okay, so let's make this handle list success. Handle, let's spell handle correctly. Handle the success. This will be an async function. And this is also gonna call dispatch and make a little notification. So we're gonna grab that from Web3 UI kit. Use notification. We'll say const dispatch equals use notification. And now down in handle list success, we'll say dispatch type success message NFT listing title NFT listed position top R and cool. And we're also gonna have to grab use Morales from React Morales. So we'll do import use Morales from React Morales. So let's import this network mapping, import network mapping from dot dot slash constants slash network mapping dot JSON. Because I spelled contract address wrong again. Let's go to our front end. We'll give it a refresh. Use Web3 contract isn't defined. Let's get that from React Morales as well. Save that, refresh our front end, and ta-da, we're good to go here. 
All right, now to test this out, what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to create another script here. So we're back in our hard hat NFT marketplace. We're looking at our scripts and we're going to create a new file just called mint.js. So we're not going to list this time. We're just going to mint it, just going to mint an NFT so we can list it ourselves on the UI. And actually, we can just copy our mint and list code, paste it into here and just remove the approval and the listing code. Boom, remove that, remove this, remove this. And that's all we need. And now we'll just change the name to mint. Well, we can remove price as well. And we'll change this to mint. And that's it. Now we have a script that we can call where we'll just mint an NFT. Oh, we can also get rid of the NFT marketplace. Actually, we will probably want the token ID so we can know what it is. So let's do const token ID equals. So let's actually get the receipt. We'll do const mint tx receipt. Let's put the receipt back in there equals that. And then I'm just going to copy this from the mint and receipt. Const token ID equals this, paste it into our mint.js, and then a console.log got token ID, string interpolate token ID. Hard hat run scripts, mint.js dash dash network localhost. And we're going to mint an NFT. Got token ID six means we know on token ID six, we can list this NFT. Let's also add the address. Let's do console.log NFT, uh, NFT address. It's going to be, we'll do string interpolation. And you know what? Let's mint this again. Mint.js. Okay, cool. Got token ID seven NFT address this. So what we can do now, we'll grab this NFT address. So from account one, let's go to account three, because that's the account that I've done my imports on. Now, when you switch accounts, we're going to want to refresh the page, paste the address seven, 0 0.6, submit. MetaMask pops up. Give permission. Yes. Okay, now it's time to list. You now have one pending. Okay, localhost, list item. We can see all the data and everything. Okay, let's go ahead and confirm. NFT listed. Okay, 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 okay. So this is good. Now to get Morales to catch up to speed, back in our, our node, let's just go ahead and run yarn, hard hat, run scripts, mine.js, dash dash network localhost. We're gonna mine those two blocks. And now if we go to our item listed, we'll give this a little refresh. Go to active item. We can see there's a new item listed for 0 0.6 ETH in our database. This is fantastic. Now that we've listed this, if we go back to now, let's mint. Let's mint one more. Let's list a second one just to see that it's actually working. OK, token ID eight. Let's grab this address. Oh, let's give this a refresh. Paste this in token ID eight. We'll do 0 0.999. Let's submit. We'll approve this. Yes. And then we'll send it. Yes. OK, now let's go ahead and mine two blocks. So I'm just going to hit up and go back to mine. We'll run the mining, moving blocks. Okay, great. Now, if we go back home, we'll see there are three NFTs now listed. We have the original one. Then we have those two that we just listed, eight and seven for 0 0.6 and 0 0.999 listed on our NFT marketplace. This is so exciting. Our listing is working correctly. Okay, now due to the fact that this lesson is already incredibly long, I actually decided to cut the part of adding the withdraw bit because we don't really learn anything new there. However, feel free to jump back into the GitHub repo associated with this course, where we will have that withdraw functionality for you if you want to implement it. Otherwise, feel free to skip and move on ahead. This is incredibly powerful, and you should be incredibly excited about yourself if you've made it this far. This is awesome. You just made a decentralized marketplace and then built a front end on top of it to allow anybody to interact with your marketplace easily. Huge, huge congratulations here. Ooh, this is a perfect time to go take a break and celebrate. And this is a great time to ping me on Twitter. To ping me on Twitter saying, hey, Patrick, I just completed the NFT marketplace full stack front end part of your free code camp course. I now know how to build full stack front ends on top of my smart contract applications and be so, so pumped with yourself because this is so awesome. I can't understate how excited I am that you've made it this far. 
you are learning and working with a ton of technologies, Solidity Smart Contracts and front end. You are doing full stack. You are doing a lot of stuff here. So you should be really proud of yourself. Huge congratulations. Be sure to absolutely give yourself a pat on the back and then get ready to continue to our next section. Now that we've done all of this using our Morales backend, I'm about to switch it up on you. Instead of indexing all of our events with a centralized server, now we're going to learn how to build this using the graph, which is a decentralized event indexer that we can use. A lot of the code is going to be exactly the same. So instead of us starting from anew, what we're going to do, first of all, we can we can close all our local stuff. We can close all of these things. We can close all of our terminals finally, which is really exciting. And in this folder, what we're going to do is we're actually just going to copy everything into a new folder. So I'm going to CD down a directory. We're going to make a new one called Next.js NFT Marketplace the graph dash FCC. And all the code for this section is going to be here for front end the graph indexer. We're going to have to make another repo and we'll get to that in a little bit. For all the changes, it's going to be in this section here. So what we're going to do is we're going to make this new folder and we're going to do copy dash R Next.js NFT Marketplace FCC into Next.js NFT Marketplace the graph FCC. So we're going to copy recursively everything that's inside that folder we just created into this new one that we're going to make a lot of adjustments to. And this might take a little bit of time to run because we've got a lot of stuff in this folder. And all right, once we've done that, we can CD into this Next.js, NFT Marketplace, the graph FCC, and do code period, and open this up in a new code editor. Or as always, you can do file, open folder to open it like that. Now that we're in here, we're gonna learn how to do this exact same project instead of using Morales, but using the graph. One of the things that we're first gonna do is we're actually gonna deploy our contracts to Rinkby. So we're gonna grab our marketplace.soul, pull this over. We're gonna grab our hardhat marketplace.soul project, pull it over. And first we're gonna run our deploy script on Rinkby. So hopefully you've got all your deploy stuff set up correctly so that all of the arguments can go through correctly for Rinkby as well. So we're gonna go ahead and run this. Yarn, hardhat deploy, dash dash network, Rinkby. And to make sure that it's gonna work for Rinkby, let's check our hardhat config. Okay, for networks, looks like I have my Rinkby stuff in here. For networks, okay, I've got my RPC URL, which I'm getting from my environment variables. I have a private key. I have a private key, which I'm also getting from environment variables. I have a chain ID, block confirmations, and save deployments. So. Let's go ahead and run this. Now we're going to go ahead and be deploying the NFT marketplace to the Rinkby network. And our deploy script also has in it some verification so we can verify this as well. You can't really follow along with this section without deploying a marketplace to Rinkby here. So deploy to Rinkby or whatever testnet is recommended in this lesson 15 section and go from there. All right, great. We've deployed our NFT marketplace. Now we're going to go ahead and deploy our basic NFT. And once these are done deploying, we can start updating our front end code to work with the graph instead of Morales. Okay, and we've verified everything too, which looks great. Now we're gonna verify our basic NFT and we've have it verified. Awesome. So now we have an NFT marketplace deployed to Rinkby and a basic NFT deployed to Rinkby and both of them are verified. So be sure to take note of those because we're gonna need them when we're moving over to our the graph section. So now let's grab our code editor titled Next.js NFT Marketplace, The Graph, and let's get going. Now we just deployed that to, to Rinkby, but uh, we forgot to add some code in here to update our network mapping. However, if we go back and we open back up code dot dot, Next.js, NFT Marketplace, FCC, in the network mapping in here, we'll now have a new entry for Rinkby if we did it correctly. So let's copy this network mapping and paste it over in our network, our Next.js NFT marketplace, the graph section, or you can just manually add your new entry, right? So you want to add network ID four, network marketplace, and the address of that network marketplace that you just deployed is we're going to delete this cloud functions bit. Goodbye, because since we're not working with a server anymore, 
There's not going to be any cloud functions or any backend to run. So we're going to move that to trash. Goodbye. Next, we don't need FRP anymore because we're not going to be connecting our local blockchain to the graph. We're only going to be working with the testnet here. So let's go ahead and delete that. Goodbye. What's next? In our pages and our app.js. Right now, we're connecting to a morales provider like this. We're going to switch this back to allies on mount. This is going to go back to being false. We're no longer going to connect to our Morales database like this. We're just going to use the hooks again. Now with that, the only thing that's going to change is our index.js. Right now in our index.js, we're getting our list of NFTs from our Morales query. So we're going to change this. Let's update our readme. So we're going to say instead of reading the events from Morales, we will, first off, we're going to index them with the graph, and then we're going to read from the graph. So then the question is, what is the graph? So the graph is going to be a decentralized layer for storing event data. So there are all these blockchains and all these different storage networks, and the graph is a, and the graph is a network of different nodes that read from blockchains and index this data. And it exposes an API for us to call so we can read that data. But rather than just myself, we actually have Nader Dabit who can explain it a lot better than I can. Take it away, Nader. First, I'd like to thank Patrick for creating such a wonderful educational resource and inviting me to be a part of it. My name is Nader Dabit. I'm a developer relations engineer working with The Graph. The Graph is an indexing and querying protocol for decentralized networks like Ethereum, IPFS, dozens of other EVM-compatible networks, as well as Near and in the future, Cosmos and Solana. Using The Graph, developers can build and publish open APIs called subgraphs that they can then use in their applications to enable better querying capabilities of data stored on these networks, including features like filtering, sorting, relational data, and full-stack search. Subgraphs live in between the blockchain and the UI, providing an important piece of software infrastructure, a flexible, performant, and decentralized API layer. In the traditional tech stack, databases, servers, and APIs query, filter, sort, paginate, group, and join data before its return to an application, usually via some type of HTTP request. These types of data transformations are not possible when reading data directly from Ethereum or other blockchains. Before the graph, teams had to develop and operate proprietary indexing servers. This required significant engineering and hardware resources and broke the important security principles required for decentralization. How we interact with and build on top of blockchains is much different than what we are used to in the traditional tech stack. In a blockchain, data isn't stored in a format that can be easily or efficiently consumed or retrieved directly from other applications or front ends. The problem is that you need to have the data indexed and organized for efficient retrieval. Traditionally, that's the work that databases and web servers do in the centralized tech stack, but that indexing layer was missing in the Web3 stack. Let's take a look at a couple of other examples of indexing in the real world. Search engines like Google crawl the internet, indexing relevant data, making it available for users to search via their web interface and other APIs. Without this indexing layer, it would be hard for us to know where and how to find relevant information across the web. Another similar analogy is a library. Using an indexing system like the Dewey Decimal System, we know where to find the book that we're looking for without having to go through book by book looking throughout the entire library. The graph serves over 2 billion queries per day to many different types of Web3 applications, including apps in the DeFi, gaming, and NFT space. Before we dig into any code, let's take a look at how to build a subgraph. To get started, you would go to thegraph.com and create a new subgraph in the graph user interface. You would then use the graph CLI to scaffold out an empty subgraph boilerplate that you can then update with your own contract information. In your subgraph configuration, you would define things like your data model, the network, the contract addresses, and other configurations that are specific to the data that you would like to index. For our data model, we use GraphQL schema definition language defining top-level types as well as fields within those types. When we're ready to deploy our subgraph so we can begin testing it out and using it in our application, we can use the graph CLI running the deploy command. Once the subgraph is deployed and the data begins to be indexed, we can start testing it out using the graphical interface directly in the graph dashboard. When we're ready to start querying our subgraph from our application, we can use the API URL that's been given to us by the graph along with any GraphQL query. If you'd like to learn more about the graph, check out thegraph.com as well as Graph Protocol on Twitter, the docs at thegraph.com slash docs, or our Discord at thegraph.com slash Discord. 
Thanks, Natter. And now that we have a better idea of what the graph is, we can actually start building with it. Now, if we were to try to run this app as it is, it obviously would fail, right? Because index.js right now is reading from Morales instead of from the graph. So like it says in our readme, first thing we're gonna need to do is we're gonna need to index from the graph, and then we can adjust this project to read from the graph. So let's go ahead and learn how to build our subgraph. In order for us to tell the graph network to start indexing the events from our contract, we're gonna to go to graph.com, we're gonna to go to products, and we're gonna to go to subgraph studio. If you go to products, the first thing you see is the graph explorer. These are already existing subgraphs. And if you go through here, you'll see a lot of incredibly popular decentralized protocols all have different subgraphs. Hosted service is gonna get discontinued at some point, so we're gonna skip there. So let's go to subgraph studio. This is gonna help enable us to create a subgraph for other nodes to start indexing our events. So we're gonna go ahead and connect our wallet with MetaMask. And I'm gonna choose account one here. Next, connect. And we're gonna to wanna to switch off of hardhead local over to the Rinkby test network. And I'll go to account one here. And we're gonna get a signature request from the graph. Similar to the website that we just built, this subgraph website has some sign-in functionality with a database on the backend. So we're seeing in real life exactly the methods that we just used. So instead of signing with Morales, they just have their own custom sign-in here. So we're gonna go ahead and sign in so that the graph website knows that it can interact with us. And we can go ahead and enter our email if we want. I'm gonna go ahead and skip. And you'll even get a little notification here saying only subgraphs indexing Ethereum or mainnet or RinkB can be created in Subgraph Studio. So let's go ahead and create a subgraph. So we're gonna pick Ethereum RinkB and the subgraph name is gonna be NFT Marketplace. We'll go ahead and hit continue. Now this is gonna be our dashboard for creating our subgraph. And there's a ton of instructions over here and documentation that we can view to get started. I'm gonna add this documentation to the GitHub repo associated with this course. So this NFT marketplace subgraph is gonna need its own Git repository itself. So what we're gonna do back in here is we're gonna CD down and we're gonna make a new directory and we're gonna call it graph NFT marketplace FCC. And we're gonna open that up as well. So code graph NFT marketplace FCC or file open graph code marketplace FCC. And in this window, we're gonna build our subgraph locally. We're gonna build our subgraph and push it up to the subgraph studio. And in here, there's a whole bunch of instructions that we can follow along with to go ahead and install. The first thing that we need to do is install the, the graph command line interface. And we wanna install this globally. So I'm gonna copy this part here come back to my terminal, yarn global add, and paste that in. It's this command line that's gonna help us build a graph and build instructions for the graph to actually start indexing our events. Now that we've installed it globally, we can initialize our graph code. So we can copy this line and we'll run graph init dash dash studio NFT marketplace and hit enter. The protocol is gonna be Ethereum. Our subgraph slug will be NFT marketplace. We want the directory to be here, but it's saying directory already exists. So we'll just give it an NFT marketplace and then we'll move it after this. And this is on the RinkB testnet. And now we want to give it the contract address. So we want to grab that address that we just deployed and it should be now in our network mapping. So we're going to grab that contract address that we just deployed and paste it in here like so. And since we've already verified it on etherscan it automatically grabs the abi for us from etherscan we'll give it the contract name which is the nft marketplace and it's going to give us a whole bunch of boilerplate code in this nft marketplace directory and this might take a couple of minutes all right awesome so now that it's done we see subgraph nft marketplace created in nft marketplace now i don't want it to be in this other folder so what i'm going to do is i'm going to move it down a directory but you can leave it where it is if you want i'm going to say move I'm gonna say move NFT marketplace star to dot slash. Now everything inside of NFT marketplace will be in this current directory and NFT marketplace will be empty. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and delete NFT marketplace. All right, great. Now let me walk you through exactly what's going on here and what these files are that we just created. 
So our first folder is going to be ABIs. In order for the graph to index and read our contract and index our events, it's going to need the ABI of our events. So it got the ABI of our entire marketplace from Etherscan. If we didn't verify an Etherscan, we could just create this ABI folder ourselves and add the NFT marketplace JSON in here. Now we have this generated folder. This is an auto-generated file. It even says at the top, do not edit this file directly. You can kind of think of this as the build folder or where we compile graph code. Node modules, of course, is going to be node modules and dependencies. SRC is going to be where we define and we tell the graph how to actually map and how to actually work with our contract. And it is a TypeScript file. So for all of you who have been just doing this in JavaScript, I will have to teach you a little bit of TypeScript just to get through this part. Then we have networks.json, which give us all of our network information about which networks, what are the addresses, and what are the different contracts that we're going to be indexing. Package.json, which of course is just a normal package.json, and it's got some graph scripts already built in. Schema.graphql is going to be our GraphQL schema. So this is also going to be how we tell the graph how to actually work with our events and index our events. And if you're familiar, the schema follows the GraphQL syntax. So if you've ever worked with GraphQL before, it's going to be the exact same way. GraphQL is a query language for your API. And instead of being kind of a relational database, it can query in a more graph type way. I'm not going to go too deep into how it actually works behind the scenes, but if you want to learn more, I'm going to leave some docs in the GitHub repository associated with this course. The subgraph.yaml tells our subgraph how to combine all the files together. So we have data sources, data sources where they're coming from, different addresses, different entities or events, the ABIs where to grab our files from, different event handlers, which we'll talk about in a minute, and then the main file, which is going to be our mapping.ts. We have a TS config, which is a configuration file specific to TypeScript. And then, of course, we have our yarn.lock. With all this information, with all this code, we are now going to update all this code to tell the graph to start indexing our events so we can read our events from the graph in a decentralized context as opposed to from a centralized database. And after we build everything, we're going to run through this auth and deploy code, which is to authenticate ourselves and then deploy our code to the graph to start indexing. So without further ado, let's jump in and let's do this. So one of the first things I'm going to do, I'm going to add a highlighter for these .graphql files. So in our extensions, we're going to look up GraphQL, and we're going to install this GraphQL extension. Now that we've installed it, if we go back to schema.graphql, we've got it with some colors now, which is exciting. So this schema.graphql is going to define what entities we have in our contract. If we were to be analogous to Morales, these are going to be how we're going to define what our tables are going to look like. And these are going to be our events plus that active item table that we created. So we're not going to have an example entity, though. We're going to have a type active item. And this is going to be an at entity. So these are the different types we have in our graph that we can actually query on. Our main thing that we're going to want to query on is same as before, it's going to be our active items. And then inside of our active items, we're going to tell the graph what parameters each one of these active item types has. Well, it's going to have an ID of type ID. So the variable is ID of type ID. And you can read more about the different types in the graph documentation. And this exclamation mark means it must have an ID. So every active item needs to have and will have an ID. We'll say there's going to be a buyer which is going to be an address. So that's going to be a bytes. And the buyer could be blank, right? It could be the 0x000. We're going to have all of our active items have a, a 0x000, you know, dot, 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 if, if no one has bought yet. We're going to have a seller, which of course is also going to be a bytes because it's going to be an address. We're going to have an NFT address. So the address of the NFT, which will also be bytes. We're going to have a token ID, which isn't going to be bytes. This is going to be of type big int. And then we're going to have a price, which is also going to be a big int. Now price, we're going to leave as not required. For price, we're just going to have price be nullable. So price can be null. So we have an active item. Awesome. What else are we going to need? Well, what other tables do we have in Morales? Well, we're going to need type, item listed. And this is going to be at entity. It's going to need an ID. It'll have a seller. Whenever an item gets listed, it's going to have a seller, right? It's, which is going to be a bytes again. 
NFT address, the address of the NFT, which will also be bytes, the token ID, which is going to be a big int, and then the price, which will also be a big int. We're going to need to type item canceled at entity, which will have an ID, a seller, an NFT address, and a token ID will be a big end. And then last, type item bought will be an at entity. It's going to have an ID, ID. It's going to be a buyer, bytes, an NFT address, a bytes, and a token ID, big int, and then a price of big int. And with just this information, we've defined what we want our subgraph to keep track of. We want it to keep track of item bought events, item canceled events, item listed events, and then we're gonna make this new active item table similar to what we did with Morales. And it's gonna be some function of these, these other three events. And now we're done with our schema.graphql. Awesome. So what do we do now? We're gonna need to tell our subgraph to actually listen for these events. So what we can do, so what we wanna to do to tell it how to listen for these events, is we're going to go to src mapping.ts. It's this mapping.ts file that's going to tell our subgraph how to actually map and how to actually store all the event information that we have. If you look in it right now, it might even give you kind of a sample event. So it says export function handle item event. This is what Maya says right now. It takes as an input parameter event item bot. So this is saying whenever an item bot event occurs, do this handle item bot function. So anytime item bot happens, do this handle item bot. And we're actually getting this item bot from our generated NFT marketplace from some generated code. In the graph, if we run graph code gen, this graph code gen command grabs all the stuff we have in the schema.graphql and puts it in this generated file. Now that I've run graph code gen, you'll see in here there's an item bot class, you see there's a schema.typescript. And actually, we can even find that new active item class that we created in our schema. So anytime you update schema.graphql, you're always going to want to run graph code gen so you can update those types. And if this failed, it means that you messed up something in your schema.graphql. Now, in our mapping.ts, we're actually importing item bought, item canceled, item listed from generated NFT marketplace, NFT marketplace from our generated code. These are going to be our events, and we're not going to need to do anything with the NFT marketplace. We're just going to need our event information. For now, let's go ahead and just delete everything inside our handle item bot or whatever sample is given to you. So we're importing our events from our generated code, and then we have this line here, which we're going to change in a second. So again, we have these three functions, handle item bot, handle item canceled, and handle item listed. Whenever we get an item bot event, we're going to do this function. Whenever we get an item canceled event, we're going to do this function. And all this code is defined in our subgraph.yaml. You can see the different entities here, item bot, item canceled, item listed, and the event handlers. So it says, okay, anytime this specific event gets fired with an index address, an index address, index UN256, and UN256, call handle item bot which again, we're getting in here, handle item bot. So that's exactly how this works. So let's figure out what to do when an item bot event triggers. And I think that item bot, item canceled, item listed is a little confusing. So I like to change this to item bot as item bot event, item canceled as item canceled event, item listed as item listed event. So I'm just changing the names of these three that are imported from NFT Marketplace. And now I'm going to change event item bot to item bot event, event item canceled to item canceled event, and event item listed to item listed event. Okay, great. And we're just going to remove this line for now. And we also don't need this line at the top with the big end. We will in a minute, but we'll delete it for now. So here's our minimalistic code here. So whenever we list an item, what do we need to do? Well, we need to save that event in our the in our graph and then we also need to update our active item exactly as we did with morales so 
first thing that we're going to need to do is either get or create an item listed object. And something that we need to know is that each item needs a unique ID. And we actually need to create that ID. So one of the first things I'm going to do is I'm going to create a function called get ID from event params. And it's going to take a token ID. And here's where TypeScript comes into play a little bit. In TypeScript, we actually need to define the types of our different parameters. So token ID is going to be a big int. And we'll also take an NFT address, which will take in a type of address. And we also need to say what return type our function is going to give, which we're going to return a string. We're going to create an ID from event params, and it's just going to be a combination of the token ID and the NFT address. The combination of these two will give a unique ID for each one of these types of event. So we're just going to say return token ID and token ID has a function called to X string. And we're going to say plus NFT address dot to X string like so. And big int and address we need to import from at graph protocol slash graph TX. It already imported big int for me. So I'm just going to add address in here. These are the two special types that come from the graph and then string is built into TypeScript. Now that we have a way to get a special ID for each item in our function here, we have to now either get or create a new item listed. Now, right now we have an item uh, bot event, but we don't have an item bot object. So the item bot object is going to be what we save. The item bot event is just the raw event. So we have to create an item bot object from our item bot event. And in TypeScript, these are going to be two different types. So we have to import these item bot objects. So those actually get auto created from generated schema. In here, we have active item, we have item, we have an item bot class, we have an item canceled, etc. So we're gonna have to import those types from there. So we can say import item listed, comma, active item, item bot, and item canceled from dot dot slash generated slash schema. Let's go ahead and get or create an item bot object. So we'll say let item bot equals item bot dot load. And this is how we load an item. We load its unique ID by calling this get ID from event params dot load get ID from event params. And we can pass event dot params dot token ID because an item bot event is going to have a token ID and event dot params dot NFT address. Now I know we probably should have done handle item listed first, but we're doing item bot first. Since we're buying an item, we probably will also have an active item as well, right? We haven't made it yet an item listed, but this is going to be similar to what we did with Morales. So we know that every time we list an item, we'll also list it an active item. So we'll say let active item equals active item dot load. And we're going to do this exact same thing. So I'm just going to copy paste it into here. And even though these are going to have the exact same ID, it doesn't matter because they're the same ID across different types. Now we're going to say, if there is no item bot, we'll say item bot equals a new item bot object, and we'll give it an ID which is going to be exactly our ID giving parameter here, get ID from events and pass that there. So we're going to create a new item bot here. And now we're going to update all its parameters. So back in our schema.graphql, an item bot has an ID, buyer, address, token ID and price. So we're going to say item bot dot buyer equals event dot params dot buyer item bot dot NFT address equals event dot params dot NFT address item bot dot token ID equals event dot params dot token ID. And that looks good. And our active item will be from item listed and item listed should give it all these parameters, except for it won't have a buyer. So we just need to update the buyer on our active item. So we'll say active item dot buyer. We'll do a little exclamation mark. This is some TypeScript stuff saying we will have an active item. Don't worry too much about it if you're unfamiliar with TypeScript. And we'll say that equals event.params.buyer. And now, similar to Morales, we're going to do item bot.save and 
active item with an exclamation mark again dot save. And this is how we're going to save this item bot event as an object in our the graph protocol. And also we're going to update our active item. So this is our full function of handle item bot. Whenever somebody buys an item, we update a new item bot object and we update our active item to be a new buyer. We're not going to delete it from our active items list. We're just going to update it with a new buyer. And we'll just say if it has a buyer, that means it's been bought. If it doesn't have a buyer, that means it's still on the market. Awesome. So now that we've done our handle item bot, let's now do our handle item listed, which will hopefully make our handle item bot a little bit easier to understand. So for handle item listed, we're going to do the same piece here. So we're going to say let item listed equals item listed dot load. And we're going to do the exact same thing as what we did for all of these. We'll do get ID from event params like so. Get ID from event params. And we're going to say let active item. And this line is going to be exactly the same as up here. So I'm just going to copy paste. So we're saying, OK, great. Grab our item listed and grab our active item. See if those objects already exist. And we'll say if there is no item listed, which there shouldn't be, we'll go ahead and create a new one. We'll say item listed equals new item listed. And its ID is going to be from this function that we created for unique IDs. Now, unlike what we did above, we're also going to say if there is no active item, then we're going to create a new active item, right? Because we're listing an item, it shouldn't be an active item. Now, this functionality is going to make a lot more sense here, right? Because if we're updating the price of an item, active item will already exist. If it's a brand new listing, though, active item will not exist. So we'll say, OK, if it doesn't exist, OK, that means it's a brand new listing. We'll say item listed equals new item listed, and then we'll give it an ID. That's the same ID methodology, paste that in. So now all we got to do is update these new objects. So we'll say item listed dot seller equals event dot params dot seller. And I'm just going to copy paste this line because this is just going to be active item dot seller now. Oops, excuse me. And then I'm going to make this active item active item instead of item listed. And what else comes with item listed? Well, let's go to the schema. Item listed has an NFT address, token ID, and a price. So, okay, so let's add those. Item listed dot NFT address equals event dot params dot NFT address. Copy paste this line because it's going to be the it's going to be the exact same for active item. Now, item listed dot token ID equals event dot params dot token ID. Copy paste this line. Same thing for active item. Item listed dot price equals event dot params dot price. Copy paste this line for active item. And then we just save those two. So item listed dot save active item dot save. So in our protocol here, if it's already been if there already is an active item, then we just go ahead and we get that active item. This would be for a listing that we're updating. If not, we make a new one, we update it with whatever came in through the event, and then we save it to our graph protocol. Okay, perfect. Now we only have one left, item canceled. So let's figure out how to do item canceled. It's gonna look really similar to item bot. So we'll say let item canceled equals item canceled dot load. Again, we're going to do this exact same ID getter that we've been doing for everything. We'll say let active item equals, and then I'm going to zoom out a little bit. Let active item equals active item dot load. We do this exact same thing here. Boom. And then we're going to say if not item canceled, which there shouldn't be, because this should be the only item canceled event here, we'll say item canceled equals new item canceled. And we're going to give it an ID using the same ID methodology we've been using. Now this is going to look a little bit different. We're going to say item canceled dot seller equals event dot params dot seller. So far so good. Item canceled dot NFT address equals event dot params dot NFT address. Item canceled dot token ID equals event dot params dot token ID. 
And then finally, we are going to change the active item a little bit different than what we've seen. Active item, exclamation mark, again, ignore if you're confused by that, dot buyer. And we're going to update the buyer to equal address dot from string. We're going to give it what's called the dead address. And that's this right here. 0x, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, 60, 61, 62, 63, 64, 65, 66, 67, 68, 69, 70, 71, 72, 73, 74, 75, 76, 77, 78, 79, 80, 81, 82, 83, 84, 85, 86, 87, 88, 89, 90, 91, 92, 93, 94, 95, 96, 97, 98, 99, 100, 101, 102, 103, 104, 105, 105, 106, 107, 108, 109, 110, 111, 112, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, that's going to mean that the item has been canceled. And that's how we are going to be able to tell that an item is on the marketplace or not. A dead address means it's been canceled. An empty address, which is what will happen for handle item listed, means it's on the market. And an actual real address means that it's actually been bought by somebody. So the way we can tell if it's on the market is if it's 0x0000000, because the dead address is obviously going to be different than, than all zeros. The dead address is a commonly used address kind of as a burner address that nobody owns. Then we can just say item canceled dot save and active item dot save active item exclamation mark dot save. And perfect. Our mapping file is now completed. We now have three different functions to define how to handle when items are bought events, how to handle when items are canceled event and item listed events. And if you're confused, remember all the code for this is available on this, the graph section of my GitHub. So you can just follow along with the code here if you ever get lost or need help. And with that, we're almost ready to tell our subgraph to start listening to our contracts. There's just at least one more thing that we want to do. So in our subgraph.yaml, we'll see source, address, blah, blah, blah. This is telling us to start indexing events since the beginning of Ethereum. Now, we don't really want it to do that because it'll take a really long time. We want to tell our subgraph, hey, you don't have to start from the beginning of time. You just need to start from right before our contract was deployed. So we can add what's called our start block to tell it what block number to start deploying. Now, if we have our address, which we do right here, we can copy it. We can paste it onto the ring etherscan, paste it in here, or really any block explorer and we'll see what block number our contract was deployed. And it looks like it was this block. So I'm gonna copy that address, go back to my code and say starting block is gonna be right here. Starting block is gonna be when it was deployed, minus one. So we're gonna go right before we deployed our contract, we're gonna start reading any event that is indexed from it. Now, if you just deployed this, it might not have any events in it at all, which we're gonna fix in just a minute, so don't worry. But with that, all the instructions for how to build our subgraph are ready to be deployed to the graph to start indexing and start working with our instructions in a decentralized context. So what we can do now is back in the graph, we actually have the auth and deploy code right here. We can copy this, this graph auth dash dash studio, which is our deploy key on how to deploy, and we can run this in our code editor. So we're gonna paste that in here, graph auth dash dash studio, hit enter, and we're gonna say deploy key set for the graph. So this is just setting us up so that whenever we push our code, it's gonna push it to this subgraph configuration that we've made on their site to help us deploy automatically. Now what we can do, we don't need to enter the subgraph because we've already moved stuff down, is we'll build the subgraph, we'll run graph code gen, we can just run graph code gen, which again is just going to make sure our schema.graphql looks good. And then we're going to run our graph build. And this graph build command is going to compile and run all of our subgraph stuff, everything in mapping.json, all our generated code. And it's going to put this into a, a real build folder. The generated folder is kind of like a pseudo build folder. And then we have a real build folder. So the generated is just to build some typings for our TypeScript. And it's this build folder, this real build folder, is what we're gonna actually be deploying and sending to the graph. And we can actually deploy our subgraph now with graph deploy, dash dash studio, NFT marketplace, which we're gonna run right now. Now it's gonna give us a version label option, which we're gonna give it v0.0.1, since this is our first version. And it goes ahead and starts deploying it to the graph. 
we also get to upload our subgraph to IPFS. And we have a little hash right here for IPFS for our subgraph that we could look at. But now, if you're successful, we now have this build completed thing. And we have these subgraph endpoints for queries and subscriptions. So we can actually start querying and subscribing to our subgraph. But if we go back to our site here now and we hit refresh, we can now see status deployed. We can see that we're syncing. And now we have some nodes that are listening for our events to be emitted here, which is incredibly exciting. We can go to logs to see if anything went wrong. And right now it's just indexing. It's listening. It's going through all the different blocks in the blockchain, listening for our events. And then we have a playground here where we can run some queries to see different events and the different responses from our GraphQL, which right now it's totally blank because we haven't done anything yet. So once again, let's pull up our hard hat NFT marketplace code or open it up in a new terminal, whatever you want to do. And let's go ahead and let's run our mint and list script, but for rink B. So we'll do yarn hard hat run scripts, mint and list item dash dash network rink B. So we're going to mint an NFT, right? This is going to be two transactions. So we're going to have to wait a little bit. And then we're going to approve the NFT. And then we're going to list it on our marketplace. And once it's listed, it's going to emit an item listed event. And we should see now we have an active item and an item listed data in our GraphQL. Now you can learn more about. Now what you see here on the left hand side is what's known as a GraphQL query. Now we're not going to go over how to do these, but I'm going to leave some links in the GitHub repository if you want to learn how to do more of these queries. These are going to be similar to what we saw with Morales, but instead of them being kind of regular table lookups, they're in GraphQL syntax. And the results of our query end up being over here. We can see more information about our schema all the way to the right over here. But if we look at our code now, we've minted the NFT, approved it, we've listed it on, on our marketplace. So now if we go back to the graph and we run this query, and we do a little refresh on our NFT marketplace. We might have to wait a few minutes for the graph to index these new blocks. But in our playground, we should see this show up as a query. If you don't automatically get these, you can pause the video to write these into your, your GraphQL playground. All right. So after a few minutes, if I refresh on Etherscan, I can see that list item transaction has gone through. This means we've omitted a new event. So if I come back to my playground and I hit play here, Oh my goodness, we can see we have active items and we see we have items listed. This is fantastic. That means in a decentralized context, we have a off chain service that is indexing our events for our contract so that we can update our front end and we can update people in a decentralized way. This is so exciting. Awesome. So now that we have this all set up, we can finally go back to our Next.js project, our Next.js NFT marketplace, the graph FCC. The reason we did all this is because right now in our code base for our Next.js NFT marketplace application, we're reading from a Morales database, which we're not going to do anymore. Instead of reading from a Morales database, we're going to read from the graph. Let's go ahead and learn how to update our code, our index.js to read from the graph instead. So to, to highlight this, to show this, we're actually going to create a new page, a new file, and we're just going to call it graph example.js. And we're just going to make this a really minimalistic page to show you how to do a graph query. So similar to index.js, we're going to do export default graph example. It's going to be a function or default function graph example. And we're going to use this tool called Apollo client, copy paste it over. And we're going to add it with yarn add dash dash dev at a p o l l o slash client or excuse me not dev because we do need this on the front end so yarn add at apollo slash client oh sorry we also need to do yarn add graphql we need to add both of those and it's this apollo slash client which is how we're going to make queries to our newly created graphql so we're going to say import the use query hook from this package we just installed from at a p o l l o slash client and we'll also import gql so to create a new query we'll say const get active item equals gql and we'll add this back tick here and we'll add all of our graphql stuff in here this is going to be equivalent to this this is graphql syntax 
and we're going to be putting this GraphQL syntax into our code base here. But we only want to get the active items. So how are we going to get the active items? Well, we can actually build it over here on our playground first and then add it to our code base. So we'll say we want to grab the active items. We'll grab the first five and then we'll say where the buyer is going to be zero X one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We're saying where the buyer is empty. So we're grabbing the active items where there is no buyer. And then we're going to do, and then we're going to get the ID, the buyer, the seller, the NFT address, the token ID, and the price from that. And if we hit run, we get our active item here. So we see here the buyer is this exact 0x1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, because it gets defaulted to zero when there is no buyer. And this is why for item canceled, we updated the buyer to be that dead address. So if it's bought, it won't be active anymore. And if it's canceled, it also won't be active anymore. Now we can copy this query and paste it into our code. And now we have a GraphQL query that we can use for our graph example. Now in our graph example, we'll use this query with this use query hook. So in export default function, graph example, we can say const and it comes with a whole bunch of stuff like loading, error, and then the data returned equals use query. And then we'll just pass it this get active item or get active items. Let's put an S on it, get active items. And then we can just return, we'll return a little div We'll say hi in the div, and then we'll just do console.log data. And then now we'll go back to our app.js where we're wrapping everything in a Morales provider. We also need to wrap everything in an Apollo provider. And we need to initialize it kind of similar to how we initialize connecting to our Morales server, but we're going to initialize connecting to our GraphQL. So we're going to say import A P O L L O provider, A P O L L O client and in memory cache from at A-P-O-L-L-O -L -L -O slash client like that. And then we'll have to initialize this so we can delete the morale stuff. We'll initialize this client by saying const client equals new A-P-O-L-L-O -L -L -O client. And we'll give it the parameters here. And you can find this all in the Apollo client documentation. We'll say there's going to be a cache to help when we do refreshes and stuff, we'll say new in memory cache, and we'll say comma URI, aka where we're going to be connecting. And this is where we're going to add the API for our subgraph. So if we go back to details, we can see temporary query URL. And this is a rate limited temporary query, because this is just a testnet. And we're going to copy this, you know, back to our code, and we're just going to paste it in here. So whatever you have for temporary query URL, in your subgraph studio, that's where you're going to paste in here. Now, this client tells our GraphQL where it should be making those queries, and we're going to make it to here. Now, this starts with HTTPS. So is this centralized? Yes, because we are directly calling the graph website. However, all the data is still going to be stored in this decentralized graph indexer. And kind of similar to what we did with IPFS, we're doing this kind of as a gateway to make it a lot easier for us to connect and read the data from the Graph Studio. However, in the future, as more protocols and more browsers adopt the Graph and IPFS, this will become a lot easier. Inside of our Morales provider, but outside of our notifications provider, we're gonna say A-P-O-L-L-O -L -L provider, and then client equals client. And then we're gonna copy the closing tag and put it around the notifications provider and press save. Now I'm going to save our front end. Now we're going to try to run our front end and we're going to have to change some stuff in here because it's going to freak out. <laughs> so we're going to run yarn dev for new front end. So we're going to go to our local host 3000 and it's going to totally freak out because we still have some morale stuff in here and that's totally okay. We, of course, we don't need a hard hat node running because we're on a test net. We don't need to be syncing with Morales. We don't need to be doing any of that stuff because we're working with the test net. And right now it's actually not freaking out, uh, which is great, but it shows obviously nothing for recently listed. So what we're going to do now is we're going to do slash graph example and hit enter. 
and we can see high show up. But if we go to inspect and we go to console, go to console here, we can see an object here of active items, which is returned from our the graph with buyer ID, NFT address price, and all this stuff in here. This is fantastic. So, okay, okay, okay. So all we have to do now is we just have to update. So let's go ahead, we'll kill our server for now. All we have to do is update, instead of use Morales query, we're gonna delete this and we're just gonna query from Apollo, query from our GraphQL. And everything else stays the same, right? Because our NFT box and all the rest of the code that we worked with will still work exactly the same. So first we just gotta get our address. So we're gonna say import, same as sell, sell NFT, import the network mapping. So I'm actually just gonna copy it. So we're gonna do import network mapping from constants network mapping .json. And now we can say const marketplace address equals, and we're gonna get it the exact same way we did this in sell NFT too. So we're gonna grab this line, getting the chain string. We'll paste that in here, which means we're gonna need to get chain ID from use Morales. And then we're gonna get the marketplace address like this. So we're gonna copy that line, paste it in here. Okay, great. Now we have the marketplace address. So now we're just gonna do const loading error data, which we can do listed NFTs again, equals use query. And we can do that get active items. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a new file in constants we're going to pass that get active items thing in there. New file, we're just going to call it sub graph queries.js. And in here, we're going to say import gql from at a Apollo slash client. And we'll say const get active items equals gql back tick. And exactly what we did in that graph. Let's go back to the graph example. We'll just copy that whole line actually paste it in here. And now we'll just do export default, get active items, and we'll import this query from subgraph queries into our index.js. So we'll say import get active queries, or excuse me, get active items from dot dot slash constants slash subgraph queries. And now in our use query, we'll pass get active items which should return our listed NFTs. So now we'll change this from fetching listed NFTs to loading, loading, or we don't have listed NFTs. So if it's loading or we don't have listed NFTs, then do loading. Otherwise, we're gonna do another mapping, but the return of the GraphQL is gonna be a little bit different. So instead of listed nfts.map, it's going to be listed nfts.active items.map nft. And then we're going to get price, nft address, token ID. We're not going to get marketplace address, but we will get seller from nft. And it's not going to be returned with attributes. So we can just do console.log nft instead. And then we just pass all that stuff normally to, to that nft box exactly the way that we did before. So really, we're all we're doing is we're swapping out the query methodology here. Price is gonna be from price, price is gonna be from the query, NFT address gonna be from the query, token ID from the query, marketplace address, that's also gonna be slightly different. We're gonna get that from our own config. Seller is gonna be from the query, and then the key is gonna be from the query as well. So now if we save that, if we restart our website with Yarn Dev, and we go back to our homepage, we should see everything exactly the same, except for the images being pulled from the graph instead of being pulled from Morales. So let's go back to our front end. We'll give it a nice refresh. We'll close out the console and we'll go to our home page. Oh, and I forgot to do use query. So let's import use query. Import use query from at Apollo slash client. Let's save and let's go back and give that a refresh. And oh my goodness, we now have updated to get our events from a decentralized data structure. Whew, that's freaking awesome. Now let's talk about hosting this real quickly. We are using the image tag in here. In our NFT box, we are using the image tag in here from Next.js, which comes with some pre-processing, so it's a little hard to use on IPFS. 
So we would need to update the way we do images in order to host this on IPFS. But we still could do that. Some other options we have actually are Morales. We can actually even host our apps on Morales if we want. We can also use things like Vercel or Netify or et cetera, or really any other traditional centralized hosting service. Now, if you want to, I challenge you to update this code to make it be able to be hosted on IPFS so that you'll have an end-to-end -end decentralized NFT marketplace. First, I want to make a PR to this code so that it can be successfully hosted completely end-to-end -end on IPFS wins an NFT from me. But wow, and with that, we are done with lesson 15. This is an absolutely monstrous accomplishment. And if you've finished this, if you've understood everything, if you've gotten through everything so far, you should feel incredibly proud of yourself because this is our last full stack section, our front end section, and you are a full stack monster at this point. Huge congratulations. You should be super, super, super proud and definitely take a break, go get a coffee and get ready for the final stretch of lessons, 16, 17, and 18. Those are going to go by a little bit quicker. I'm very excited for you. Take a break and I'll see you there. All right, welcome to lesson 16, where we're going to be going into even more low level code here. The hard hat upgrades, of course, per usual, our entire GitHub repository is located here. And additionally, we have an optional video that you can watch if you want to learn more. We're actually gonna watch a slice of that video that explains upgradable smart contracts. So let's jump in. Now I'm editing this video much later after I filmed it, hence why I have a beard. So I'll be jumping in from time to time, updating some of the sections. When deploying your smart contracts on chain, we all know that those smart contracts are immutable or unchangeable. But what if I told you that they were mutable? <laughs> Well, technically I wouldn't be correct. However, smart contracts actually can change all the time. When people transfer tokens, when people stake in a contract or really do any type of functionality, those smart contracts have to update their balances and update their mappings and update their variables to reflect this. The reason that they're immutable is that the logic itself never changes and will be on chain like that forever. So technically, yes, once they are deployed, they are immutable. And this is actually one of the major benefits of smart contracts in the first place, that nobody can tamper with or screw with our smart contracts once we deploy them. However, this can be an issue if, for example, we want to upgrade our smart contract or protocol to do more things, or we want to fix some glaring bug or issue that we have. Now, even though we can't change the specific code that's been deployed to an address, we can actually do a lot more than you think. And in this video, we're going to explain the different methodologies behind upgrading your smart contracts, and then we're gonna show you how to do it with Hardhat and Open Zeppelin. Huge shout out to a lot of Open Zeppelin and Trail of Bits articles that helped me put this video together, uh, and a number of other sources as well, links in the description. So let's get to it. Now, at first glance, you might be thinking, rum, 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 rum. if you can upgrade your smart contracts, then they're not really immutable then. Rum, 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 rum. And in a way, you'd be right. So when explaining kind of the different philosophies and patterns that we can use here, we do need to keep in mind the philosophies and decentralization implications that each one of these patterns have, as they do all have different advantages and disadvantages. And yes, some of the disadvantages here are going to affect decentrality. So we need to keep that in mind. And this is why it's so important that before you go ahead and jump in and start deploying upgradable smart contracts, you understand the trade-offs. So we're going to talk about three different ways to upgrade your smart contracts. The first one being the not really slash parameterized way to upgrade your smart contracts, the social migration method, and then the method that you probably have heard about, which is proxies, which have a ton of subcategories like metamorphic contracts, transparent upgradable proxies, and universal upgradable proxies. So let's talk about the not really upgrading method or the parameterization method, or whatever you want to call it. This is the simplest way to think about upgrading your smart contracts. And it really isn't upgrading our smart contracts because we can't really change the logic of the smart contract. Whatever logic that we've written is there. We also can't add new storage or state variables, so this is really not really upgrading, but it is something to think about. Upgrades is just parameterizing everything. Whatever logic that we've deployed is there, and that's what we're interacting with. This function means we just have a whole bunch of setter functions and we can update certain parameters. Like maybe we have a reward parameter that gives out a token at 1% every year or something like that. Maybe we have a setter function that says, hey, update that to 2% or update that to 4%. It's just a setter function that changes some variable. Now, the advantages here are obviously this is really simple to implement. The disadvantage is that if you didn't think of some logic or some functionality the first time you deployed their smart contract, that's too bad. You're stuck with it. You can't update the logic or really update anything 
uh, with the parameterization, aka not really method. And the other thing you have to think about is who the admins are, who has access to these setter functions, to these updating functions. If it's a single person, guess what? You have a centralized smart contract. Now, of course, you can add a governance contract to be the admin contract of your protocol, and that would be a decentralized way of doing this. So just keep that in mind. You can do this method, just need a governance protocol to do so. Another example of this might be a contract registry, and this is something actually that early versions of Aave used. Before you call a function, you actually check some contract registry that is updated as a parameter by somebody and you get routed to that contract and you do your call there. Again, this really doesn't allow us to have the full functionality of upgrades here. You can argue that this registry is a mix of one of the later versions, but for all intents and purposes, this doesn't really give us that flexibility that we want for our upgrades. But some people might even think that upgrading your smart contract is ruining the decentrality. And one of the things that makes smart contracts so potent is that they are immutable and that this is one of the benefits that they have. So there are some people who think that you shouldn't add any customization or any upgradability. You should deploy your contract and then that's it. Trillabits has actually argued that if you deploy your contract knowing that it can't be changed later, you take a little bit extra time making sure you get everything right and there are often less security vulnerabilities because you're just setting it, forgetting it, and not looking at it again. Now, if I wanted to upgrade a smart contract with this philosophy in mind, the philosophy that I do want to keep my smart contracts immutable, we can instead use the social migration method, which I previously called the yeet method, and now I think it's less funny, so we're just gonna stick with social migration. The social yeet method, or the migration method, is just when you deploy your new contract not connected to the old contract in any way, and by social convention, you tell everybody, hey, hey, this new contract, this new one that we just deployed, yeah, this is the real one now. And it's just by convention of people migrating and over into using this new one that the upgrade is done. Hence my slang name of social yeet, because you yeet the first one out of the way and you move to the second one. I think I'm funny. Yeet! This has the advantage of truly always saying, hey, this is our immutable smart contract and this is our new one. This is really the truest definition of immutable because since you give it no way of being upgraded in place, then if somebody calls that contract in 50,000 years in the future, it'll respond exactly the same. Another huge disadvantage here is that you have to have a totally new contract address. So if you're an ERC-20 token, for example, you have to go convince all the exchanges to list your new contract address as the actual address. Keep in mind that when we do this, we do have to move the state of the first one over to the second one. So for example, if you're an ERC token moving to a new version of that ERC token, you do have to have a way to take all those mappings from the first contract and move it to the second one. Obviously, there are ways to do this since everything is on chain, but if you have a million transfer calls, I don't wanna have to write the script that updates everyone's balance and figures out what everyone's balance is just so I can migrate to my new version of the contract. So there is a ton of social convention work here to do. Trail of Bits has actually written a fantastic blog on upgrading from a V1 to a V2 or et cetera with this Yeet methodology. And they give a lot of steps for moving your storage and your state variables over to the new contract. So link in the description if you wanna read that. Now let's get to our big ticket item. So in order to have a really robust upgrading mentality or philosophy, we need to have some type of methodology or framework that can update our state, keep our contract address, and allow us to update any type of logic in our smart contracts in an easy way. Which leads us to our big ticket item, the proxies. What's our big ticket item? Proxies. It's people. Proxies. Proxies are the truest form of upgrades. Since a user can keep interacting with the protocols through these proxies and not even notice that anything changed or even got updated. Now these are also the places where you can screw up the easiest. Proxies use a lot of low level functionality and the main one being the delegate call functionality. Delegate call is a low level function where the code in the target contract is executed in the context of the calling contract and message.sender and message.value also don't change. So you understand what delegate call means now, right? Great. And in English, this means if I delegate call a function in contract B from contract A, I will do contract B's logic in contract A. So if contract B has a function that says, hey, store this value in a variable up top, I'm going to store that variable in contract A. This is the powerhouse. And this combined with the fallback function allows us to delegate all calls through a proxy contract address to some other contract. This means that I can have one proxy contract that will have the same address forever, and I can just point and route people to the correct implementation contract that has the logic. Whenever I want to upgrade, 
I just deploy a new implementation contract and point my proxy to that new implementation. Now, whenever a user calls a function on the proxy contract, I'm going to delegate call it to the new contract. I can just call an admin only function on my proxy contract. Let's call it upgrade or something. And I make all the contract calls go to this new contract. When we're talking about proxies, there are four pieces of terminology that we want to keep in mind. First is the implementation contract. The implementation contract has all of our logic and all the pieces of our protocol. Whenever we upgrade, we actually launch a brand new implementation contract, the proxy contract. The proxy points to which implementation is the correct one and routes everyone's calls to the correct implementation contract. You can think the proxy contract sits on top of the implementations. The user. The user is going to be making contract and function calls through the proxy contract and then some type of admin. The admin is the one who's going to decide when to upgrade and which contract to point to. In this scenario, the other cool thing about the proxy and delegate call is that all my storage variables are going to be stored in the proxy contract and not in the implementation contract. This way, when I upgrade to a new logic contract, all of my data will stay on the proxy contract. So whenever I want to update my logic, just point to a new implementation contract. If I want to add a new storage variable or a new type of storage, I just add it in my logic contract and the proxy contract will pick it up. Now using proxies has a couple of gotchas and we're going to talk about the gotchas and then we're going to talk about the different proxy contract methodologies because yes, there are many proxy contract methodologies as well. And this is why Trillibits doesn't really recommend using upgradable proxies for your smart contracts because they're fraught with a lot of these potential issues. Not to mention, again, you do still have some type of admin who's going to be upgrading your smart contracts. Now, if this is a governance protocol, then great, you're decentralized. But if this is a single group or entity, then we have a problem. The two biggest gotchas are storage clashes and function selector clashes. Now, what does this mean? When we use delegate call, remember, we do the logic of contract B inside contract A. So if contract B says we need to set value to two, we go ahead and set value to two. But these smart contracts are actually kind of dumb. We actually set the value of whatever is in the same storage location on contract A as contract B. So if our contract looks like this and we have two variables in contract A, we're still gonna set the first storage spot on contract A to the new value. This is really important to know because this means we can only append new storage variables in new implementation contracts and we can't reorder or change old ones. This is called storage clashing. And in the implementations we're gonna talk about, they all address this issue. The next one is called function selector clashes. When we tell our proxies to delegate call to one of these implementations, it uses what's called a function selector to find a function. The function selector is a four byte hash of the function name and the function signature. Don't worry about the function signature for now. Now it's possible that a function in the implementation contract has the same function selector as an admin function in the proxy contract, which may cause you to do accidentally a whole bunch of weird stuff. For example, in this sample code in front of you, even though these functions are totally different, they actually have the same function selector. So yes, we can run into an issue where some harmless function like get price has the same function selector as upgrade proxy or destroy proxy or something like that. This leads to our first out of the three implementations of the proxy contracts. This is called the transparent proxy pattern. And this is actually gonna be the pattern that we're gonna be demoing to you today. In this methodology, admins are only allowed to call admin functions and they can't call any functions in the implementation contract. And users can only call functions in the implementation contract and not any admin contracts. This way you can't ever accidentally have one of the two swapping and having a function selector clash and you running into a big issue where you call a function you probably shouldn't have. If you're an admin, you're calling admin functions. If you're a user, you're calling implementation functions. So if you're an admin and you build some crazy awesome DeFi protocol, you better come up with a new wallet address because you can't participate. The second type of proxy we're gonna talk about is the universal upgradable proxy or the UPS. This version of upgradable contracts actually puts all the logic of upgrading in the implementation itself. This way, the Solidity compiler will actually kick out and say, hey, we got two functions in here that have the same function selector. This is also advantageous because we have one less read that we have to do. We no longer have to check in the proxy contract if someone is an admin or not. This saves on gas, of course. And the proxy is also a little bit smaller because of this. The issue is that if you deploy an implementation contract without any upgradable functionality, you're stuck and it's back to the yeet method with you.
And the last pattern or methodology that we're going to talk about is the diamond pattern, which does a number of things. But one of the biggest things that it does, it actually allows for multiple implementation contracts. This addresses a couple different issues. For example, if your contract is so big and it doesn't fit into the one contract maximum size, you can just have multiple contracts through this multi-implementation method. It also allows you to make more granular upgrades. Like, you don't have to always deploy and upgrade your entire smart contract, you can just upgrade little pieces of it if you chunk them out. All the proxies mentioned here have some type of Ethereum improvement proposal, and most of them are in the draft phase. And at the end of this explainer, we will do a demo of showing you how the delegate call function works. And the end of the demo is right now. So let's look at delegate call. Now we're gonna learn about how to actually build these proxies, how to build these upgradable smart contracts. And to do this, we first need to learn about this delegate call function. And it's gonna be really similar to the call function, which we learned much earlier. If you haven't seen that, be sure to go back to our hard hat NFTs. We have a sub lesson in there about EBM opcodes and coding and calling, and we'll give you all the context for delegate call. Like I said in the explainer, it's very similar to call. However, the way that I think about it is one contract says, oh, I really like your function. I'm gonna borrow it myself. And we're gonna be looking at Solidity by example. I'll leave a description in the GitHub and all of the code for this will be in the GitHub associated with this lesson as well. Now we have two contracts. We have this contract B that we're going to be deploying on Remix. And it looks like a real minimalistic, real simple contract. We have a couple of storage variables here. And then we have a function that updates our values. We have a function called set bars and it updates our uint public num. Now, as we learned before, whenever we have some type of contract with storage variables, they get stored in, in this storage data structure that's indexed starting from zero. Right now, our uint public num is at index zero, our senders at index one, our values at index two, et cetera. Now we're gonna deploy a contract A. And now this contract is actually gonna use the delegate call function. Now a contract A, this is going to look a little bit different, but it's still going to have this set bars functions, except it's going to make a delegate call function call to our contract B. Now in our lesson 14 with NFTs, we learned about call, abi.encode with signature, abi.encode, etc. So if you're unfamiliar with function selectors, if you're unfamiliar with if you're unfamiliar with this syntax, be sure to go back to lesson 14 to understand abi.encode with signature and contract.call. The difference here is we're doing contract.delegate call. What this call does is something very similar to call. Normally, if we did contract.call on this contract, we would just call this, we would just be calling this function set bars, which would update contract B's storage. But instead, we're saying, hey, call that set bars function and then pass this as an input parameter, but call it in our contract, call it on contract A. We're kind of borrowing a function for our contract. And so instead, what we're gonna do is we're gonna borrow this set bars and run the set bars function over here. Now, the difference is instead of num equals num, the variables could be named different than the variables on contract A. So instead of num equals num, our contract is gonna say, hey, whatever's at storage of zero, have that equal to whatever we pass as an input parameter. And if that's a little bit confusing, just stay with me. Let's go ahead and let's see this in Remix. So I'm gonna copy paste this code into Remix here, so we can kind of test and see what this looks like. Again, there's a link to this in the GitHub repo associated with this course. Feel free to pause the video to grab this link. It's solidity by examplorg slash delegate call. Or you can just grab the code directly from lesson 16, hardhat upgrades. So let's compile this code and let me show you what I mean. So I'm gonna compile it and we'll go to the run tab. And first let's deploy this contract B. We'll hit deploy. We now have a contract, num, sender, and value are all blank. We'll update the number to something like 777. We'll hit set vars. Set vars will change the storage variable num to 777. And then we're changing the sender and the value. Sender and value is zero. Now let's deploy contract A. So we'll scroll back up. Contract A, deploy. Of course, we're on the JavaScript VM. Now we have this contract A with num, value, and sender are also all blank. But when we call set bars, it's going to borrow this set bars function from contract B and run it in contract A. You can almost think of it as if we're copying set bars and pasting it into our contract A just for one run and then immediately deleting it again. That's what this delegate call function does. So when I call set bars, I'm going to pass it this contract address 
as an input parameter so it knows to call this contract set vars function. When I pass it the address and I pass 987, since we're borrowing the function, we're not going to update this num on contract B, we're going to update the num on contract A. So when I hit set vars, we see num now has 987, we see sender and we see value still being zero here. Because again, we're borrowing this function and running it here. Now, the way that this works uh, is it actually doesn't look at the names of our storage variables. It looks at the storage slots. So when we borrow this function using delegate call, so we could have this these variables be named anything. Instead of num, we could call this first value. Sender, we could call something else. And then value, we could call woo or whatever you want here. And when we borrow this function using delegate call, instead of us grabbing the actual names of the variables, our contract will swap out these variable names with the storage slot. So it says, oh, okay, well, in contract B, you're accessing the num variable, which is which is at storage slot zero. So when we borrow set bars in contract A with delegate call, we'll say storage slot zero is going to equal that underscore num, which for this contract, storage slot zero is first value. So we'll say first value equals underscore num. Something else is going to be storage slot two. So it's going to say, okay, storage slot two. We're going to update storage slot two to mess that sender. Okay. Value here is storage slot three. So whatever's in storage slot three will update with message.value like this. So that's essentially what's going on behind the scenes. So let's go ahead, let's delete those and redeploy, redeploy them. So we'll deploy contract B, we'll deploy contract A. Right now in B, once again, if we do one, two, three for set bars, we have one, two, three. And in contract A, now even though these variables have different names, we could grab contract B's address, paste it in, do 654, hit set bars, and first value is now 654. So delegate call allows us to borrow functions and then just transposes whatever is in here to the storage location equivalents. And the other thing that's interesting is that even if you don't have variables, it'll still save to storage slots. So in contract A, if we didn't have any of those variable names, storage slots 0, 1, and 2 would still get updated. Now here's where things can get really interesting. Let's delete our contract A again, and let's change the type of our contract A's first value to from a uint to a boolean. Let's save that. And now let's deploy contract A. Now when we call set vars on our contract A, it's still going to use the set vars function of contract B, which takes a uint and assigns the first storage slot that number we pass it. But our first storage slot is now a boolean. So what do you think is going to happen now? Well, let's try it out. Let's copy contract B's address, paste it in here. We'll pass, we'll do 222 two, two as our input parameter. We'll hit set vars. Our transaction actually does go through. And now when we look at first value, it says true. Huh, that's really weird. Well, what if we change set vars to zero and hit set vars? And now first value is false. In storage here, when we add a number with set vars, it's going through because it's just setting the storage slot of the boolean to a number. And when Solidity reads it, it goes, oh, well, first value is a boolean. So if it's anything other than zero, it's going to be true. So this is how you can actually get some really weird results if your typings are different or if your storage variables are different. What if we made this an address? So this is where working with delegate call can get really weird and really tricky really fast. All right, now with all this being said, let's turn up the heat and let me show you a small proxy, a minimal proxy example that shows how a contract can be used as a singular address, but the underlying code can actually change. And all the code we're gonna be working with once again in the Hard Hut Upgrades FCC sublesson smallproxy.sol. And you can go ahead, copy paste this code if you want to follow along. So you don't have to code along with me here, but you absolutely can if we want. Now, I will say this is going to be one of the most, if not the most advanced section of the entire course. 
So feel free to go ahead and skip over this sub lesson if you want to just move on to learning how to actually build these proxies without really understanding what's going on behind the scenes. However, it is still really powerful if you do understand what's going on behind the scenes. So I have this minimalistic starting position right here. I have small proxy is proxy, and I'm importing this proxy.soul thing from Open Zeppelin. Open Zeppelin has this minimalistic proxy contract that we can use to actually start working with this delegate call. Now this contract uses a lot of assembly or what's something called Yule, and it's an intermediate language that can be compiled to bytecode for different backends. It's a sort of inline assembly inside Solidity and allows you to write really, really low level code close to the opcodes. Now we're not gonna go over Yule, but I'll leave some links to the Yule documentation if you want to learn more. Even if you're a really advanced user, you really wanna to try to use as little Yule as possible because since it is so much lower level, it is much easier to screw things up. However, like I said, for this example, we are gonna be using a little bit of Yule. Now in this proxy that we're gonna be doing, we have this delegate function, which inside this inline assembly, which is Yule, it does a whole lot of really low level stuff, but the main thing that it does is it goes ahead and it does this delegate call functionality. If we look here, we can see it's using a fallback function and a receive function. So whatever it receives a function it doesn't recognize, it'll call fallback and fallback calls our delegate function. So anytime a proxy contract receives data for a function it doesn't recognize, it sends it over to some implementation, to some implementation contract where it will call it with delegate call. In our minimalistic example here, we have a function called set implementation, which will change where those delegate calls are gonna be sending. This could be equivalent to like upgrading your smart contract. And then we have implementation here to read where that implementation contract is. Now, to work with proxies, we really don't want to have anything in storage because if we do delegate call and that delegate call changes some storage, we're going to screw up our contract's storage. The one caveat though to this, we do still need to store that implementation's address somewhere so we can call it. So EIP1976, it's called the standard proxy storage slot, which is an Ethereum improvement proposal for having certain storage slots specifically used for proxies. And in our minimalistic example here, we set byte 32 private constant implementation slot to that location in storage. And we'll say, okay, whatever is at this storage slot is going to be the location of the implementation address. So the way our proxy is gonna work is any contract that calls this proxy contract, if it's not this set implementation function, it's gonna pass it over to whatever is inside the implementation slot address. That's what we're gonna build here. So we have this small proxy is proxy and we'll create a real minimalistic contract. So we'll say contract implementation A and we'll just give it a unit 256 public value and then function set value unit 256 new value public. We'll say value equals new value. And so this is going to be our implementation. So now anytime somebody calls small proxy or small proxy contract, it's going to delegate call it, it over to our implementation A and then save the storage in our small proxy address. So we're going to call our small proxy with the data to use this set value function selector. So let's make it a little easier just to figure out how to get that data by creating a new helper function. We'll do function get data to transact. And we can get the data using the abi.encode with signature that we learned in an earlier lesson. So function get data to transact. We'll pass it a uint 256 number to update. So we'll give this the number we want to call a new value. We'll have this be a public cure that's going to return a bytes memory. And we'll just say return abi.encode with Signature set value uint256, comma, number to update. So you'll remember this from our call anything section. And if you don't remember how to do that, remember to refer back to our NFT section to learn how to call anything and use abi.encode, abi.encode with a signature, and call anything with its raw bytes. We're going to get the data to transact. 
And we know that when we call implementation A from our small proxy, we're going to update our small proxy's storage. So we'll create a little function in Solidity just to read our storage in small proxy. So we're going to say function read storage. And this will just be a public view. And we'll do returns, returns, you went to 256 value at storage slot zero. And we are going to use a little bit of assembly here since we are doing all this low level stuff. And we're going to call the S load opcode to read the value at storage slot zero. We'll say value at storage slot zero, and we're going to set it. And then in assembly, this is how we set things. We're going to set it equal to S load of storage slot zero, and then it will return this value here. So we're reading directly from storage. Oops. And then we need a little parenthesis here. Sorry. So now. So let's go ahead and deploy our small proxy and let's deploy our implementation A. Now our small proxy has a function called set implementation. So we're saying, okay, anytime we call this proxy contract, we're going to delegate call the functions over to here. So we're going to grab con implementations A's address, paste it into set implementation. Seven, seven, seven. So this is the data of set value UN256 with that number to update encoded in it. So if we call our small proxy with this data, our proxy contract is going to go, Oh, okay, this is a function. Uh, I don't I don't see that function here, we're going to call our fallback, right, which again, is coming from open Zeppelin, and our fallback is going to do this delegate, which is this low level stuff, but it's basically just doing a delegate call, we're going to call our fallback function, and then we're going to get the function in the implementation a we're going to borrow this function and we're going to use it on our on ourself so if i copy this the implementation has been set to being this address down here so all the logic is going to be down here so when i go ahead and i grab this i paste it into call data and i hit transact looks like it went successfully went through if i read storage now we see that it is indeed 777 which is incredibly exciting now, this is incredibly beneficial because now let's say we want to go and update our code, right? We don't like contract implementation anymore. So let's go ahead and copy contract implementation A and we'll make a new one called implementation B. Now let's say whenever somebody calls set value, we do value equals new value plus one or plus two. Let's go ahead, let's save this, let's compile this and let's deploy implementation B We'll grab implementation B's contract address. We'll call it on set implementation in our proxy. And essentially, we have now upgraded from implementation A to implementation B. Now, if we use this same data here, we're still going to call set value with 777. But instead, we're now delegate calling to implementation B instead of implementation A. So if I call, if I put this data into the low level call data, and I hit transact, it looks like it went through. Now I read storage and now is 779 since doing value equals new value plus two. So this is a minimalistic example of how upgrading actually works. Now this is incredibly beneficial because we can always just tell people, hey, make all your function calls to small proxy, and you'll be good to go. But like I said before, this also means that the developers of this protocol can essentially change the underlying logic at any time. This is why it is so important to be sure to read contracts and check to see who has the developer keys and if a contract can be updated. If a contract can be updated and a single person can update it, well, guess what? You have a single centralized point of failure and technically the contract isn't even decentralized. Now, something else I was talking about in the video is function clashes, function selector clashes. Right now, whenever we call set implementation, the proxy function set implementation gets called because we don't trigger the fallback because we can see the function is here. However, if I have a function called set implementation in our implementation, this one can never be called. Whenever we send a function signature of set implementation, it's always going to call the one on the proxy. This is where the transparent proxy that we're going to be working with can help us out here and the up universal upgradable proxy can help us too. And I'm not going to go too much deeper into these now but we've left some links in the GitHub repository to teach you more about these selector clashes and how those two proxy patterns that I just mentioned, the transparent and universal upgradable, can get around these. If you're confused by anything in here, go into this discussion thread and make a new discussion about proxies. Make a new discussion about 
the assembly, about the Yule set implementation. This is a great time to connect with other people taking the course and ask questions here, because I know that this is a really advanced section and requires you haven't gone through a lot of those sub lessons that we've gone before. And if it takes you a couple times of playing around with solidity and playing around with remix, I definitely recommend you do so. This is a section where seeing really is believing. And I want you to jump into remix and I want you to test this and I want you to play around with this and see what you can break and fiddle with. But with all that being said, we finally have all the knowledge that we need to build our hard hat project that deals with upgrades. So let's go ahead and jump into it. If you're in your terminal, we're going to do MKDIR, hard hat, upgrades, FCC, CD hard hat, upgrades, FCC, and then code period or file open folder, this folder here. Now I'm going to grab that same yarn ad we've been grabbing from lesson nine. I'm going to paste it in. We're going to add all of these different parameters. And once again, we're going to copy over our hard hat config from previous sections. We're going to copy over prettier and we're just going to get our basic default set up. At this point, you might have a setup that works best for you and that you like better and feel free to grab that as well. So I'm going to paste the prettiers in here and I'm going to paste the hardhat.config.js that we've been using instead of running yarn hard hat. And now we should be good to go. So let's create a new folder called contracts. And in here, we're going to create a new file called box.soul. And then it's this contract that's going to be our implementation or our logic contract. So we'll say pragma solidity carrot 0.8.7 contract box. We'll say uint 256 internal value. We'll do event value changed uint 256 new value. We'll do function store uint 256 new value. This will be a public function. We'll say value equals new value. So this store function is going to update our variable at storage slot zero internal. And then we'll just emit value changed with that new value. And then we'll just create function retrieve, which will be a public view returns a uint 256. And we'll just do return value. And then we're going to create a new function called version. And this will be a public pure and that returns a UN256. And we're just going to have this return one. So our box contract here is going to be version one. Now we're going to copy all this code, paste it into a box v2.soul, rename it to contract box v2. We're going to update the version to version two here. And we're going to create a new function called increment. And this will be a public function. And we'll say value equals value plus one. And then we will emit a value changed event with value. We're going to have one contract address originally use the logic in box, and then we're going to upgrade it to the logic in box V2. And we're going to learn how to use all the tools that we've been working with here to add this logic and create this logic. And let's just make sure this works. We'll do yarn, hard hat compile. So let's make a readme.md. We'll say, number one, we're going to upgrade box to box v2. So we're going to make a proxy contract that's going to point to box. And then later on, we're going to update it to point to box v2. Right? So we're going to start it up pointing to box. Then we're going to have it point to box v2. And that's how we're going to upgrade it. One of the first things we're going to need to do is deploy a proxy. We can deploy a proxy manually ourselves. And we can build the proxy contracts and do all that stuff. That's our first option. Hard hat deploy also comes built in with deploying and upgrading proxies itself, where we can just specify that we want to use a proxy and we can specify the type of proxy that we want to use. So number two is just saying using hard hat deploys built in proxies. And then number three is open Zeppelin actually has an upgrades plugin which allows you to write some really simple scripts that allows you to have a really simple API like upgrades.deployproxy and then upgrades.upgradeproxy. Now for this section, we're going to be doing the hard hat deploys built in proxies. However, in the GitHub repo associated with this, if you go to scripts, there's other upgrade examples that will show you how to use the open Zeppelin upgrades plugin. 
And we're not going to do deploy a proxy manly, manually because we essentially just showed you how to do that in our sub lesson. So we're going to show you this. We're going to show you the hard hat deploys built in proxies. And if you want to use the open Zeppelin upgrades plugin that is available in the GitHub repo as well. So let's go ahead and do this. So we're going to go ahead. We're going to make a new folder, our deploy folder. And first, we're going to make a new file called 01 deploybox.js. And this is going to look really similar to everything we've been doing so far. So module.exports equals async function. We're going to get get named accounts and deployments. Narrow function. We'll say const deploy comma log equals deployments const deployer equals await get named accounts. We'll do a little logging like this. And then we'll say const box equals await deploy box comma. We'll say from deployer comma args like this. We'll say wait con formations is going to be network dot config dot block confirmations formations. And yep, we got to grab const from hard hat. And then we can add the parameter in here for proxies. And this is where we can add a ton of information. So like I said, we're going to use the transparent upgradable proxy from open Zeppelin, which if we want to use it, we're going to have to add open Zeppelin. So we'll do yarn add dash dash dev at open Zeppelin slash contracts. And we can tell our hard hat to deploy this box contract behind a proxy. We'll say the proxy contract is going to be the open Zeppelin transparent proxy. And we're also going to do a via admin contract. So instead of having an admin address for the proxy contract, we're going to have the proxy contract owned by an admin contract. And doing it this way is considered a best practice for a number of reasons. But we'll name this admin contract box proxy admin. And the artifact for this box proxy admin. So we'll need to create a box proxy admin contract to be the admin of our box. So in our contracts folder, create a new folder called proxy. And in here, a new file called box proxy admin dot soul. And this is going to be the admin contract we're going to have for controlling the proxy of our box. So in box proxy admin dot soul, we'll do SPDX license identifier, MIT, pragma solidity, carrot 0.8.7. We'll say contract box proxy admin like this. Great. And once again, we're going to use one of the open Zeppelin tools in the transparent folder. They have a proxy admin dot soul, which is going to be essentially what our box proxy admin is going to be. It has some functionality. It has some functions in here like change proxy admin, upgrade, upgrade and call for dealing with upgradable contracts. So we're going to import it. We'll do import at open Zeppelin slash contracts slash proxy slash transparent slash proxy admin dot soul. And we'll say our box box proxy admin is proxy admin like this. And to have this box proxy admin work with the hard at deploy plugin, our constructor needs to take an address owner as an input parameter, but we're just going to leave that blank. And then and then we need to do the proxy admin, which is just going to be blank as well. And that's it. That's all we're going to do box proxy admin contract which just has all of the functionalities to do upgrades and change proxy admin and all this stuff. We're going to deploy our box contract behind a proxy, an open Zeppelin transparent proxy that is owned by our box proxy admin contract. In the template Ethereum contracts GitHub repo, there's actually an examples slash open Zeppelin proxies branch that will show you how to work with different types of proxies. And there will be a link to this in the GitHub repo associated with this course. And then we'll do our verification. We'll say chains dot includes. And we'll go ahead. I'm going to copy paste our hard hat helper config from our last project, which has development chains, hard hat and localhost that we export. We'll import this as well. Const development chains 
equals require dot dot slash upper hardhat config. If development chains dot includes network dot name and process dot env dot ether scan API key log verifying dot 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 same as we've done a way to verify. I'm also going to copy over our utils folder. So just copy paste. We now have verify, which we'll import in here. So we'll do const verify equals require dot dot slash utils slash verify await verify box dot address. And then args is going to be blank. So we'll just do blank here and boom. And that's going to be it for our box deployment. So we can test this out by running yarn hardhead deploy. See if everything works here. And that's it done. And then we should do actually we should add log to be true as well. Let's run this again, much better. So you can see we actually deploy a couple of contracts. So we deploy our box proxy admin, which is going to be our admin contract. Then we deploy box implementation. So hardhead deploy went ahead and took our box contract and renamed it to box implementation, and then deployed it. Then it deployed our box proxy here. So anytime we call this address, it actually will point to the logic of our box. Now what we can do is we can write a deploy script to deploy box the box v2 implementation, and then upgrade our box to box v2, create a new deploy script called 02 deploy box v2.js or deploy box 2.js. And we'll do something really similar here, right? So I'm just going to copy pretty much all of this, paste it in here. Now we're going to do const box v2 equals await deploy box v2 comma from deployer log true args blank wait confirmations it's going to be network dot config dot block on formations and then i'm going to copy the verification code copy this paste it here except for this is going to be box v2 dot address okay great so we now have some code where we can deploy box and box v2 now let's go ahead and write a script to actually upgrade these so we'll do a new folder scripts, new file, and we'll call it upgrade box.js. Now we're going to do it the manual way here. And the reason we're going to do it the manual way is because I want to show you exactly the functions that we're calling to do this upgrade process. However, hardhead deploy also comes with an API to make it really easy to actually just upgrade your box contracts. This is going to be a script. So we'll start off with async function main, and then we'll copy paste our traditional script main dot then process exit, blah, 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 that whole thing. We're first going to get the box proxy admin contract. So we'll say box const box proxy admin equals await ethers dot get contract box proxy admin. And we got to import ethers from hardhead. Then we're going to get the actual proxy, which is our transparent proxy. So we'll say const transparent proxy equals await ethers.getContract box underscore proxy. Since hardhat deploy, we'll just name the proxy, the name of the implementation, underscore proxy. And then of course, we're going to need our box v2 contract. So we'll say const box v2 equals await ethers.getContract box v2. Now we can say const upgrade tx equals await box proxy admin that upgrade. And we're going to call the upgrade function on our box proxy admin, which calls it on our transparent proxy, which will change the implementation from box one to box two. So box proxy admin dot upgrade, we're going to upgrade the transparent proxy dot address to our box v2 dot address. If we look in our box proxy, our box proxy has an upgrade function, which calls upgrade to on our transparent upgradable proxy. We'll do await upgrade tx .wait one And now to work with the functions on our box v2, we're going to say const proxy box equals await ethers.getContract 
at box v2. We're going to get the box v2 ABI. However, we're going to load it at the transparent proxy address. This way, Ethers knows, okay, we're going to call all of our functions on the transparent proxy address, but this proxy box is going to have the ABI of box v2, which is what we want. Now we can say const version equals await proxy box dot version. And we'll say console dot log version. And if we want to compare this to its original implementation, before we upgrade, we can do the same thing. We can say const proxy box v1. And let's actually call this proxy box v2. We'll say const proxy box v1 is going to be this exact same thing equals this we'll call box here. And we'll do const version equals await proxy box v1 dot version console dot log version or version v1 version v1 we'll call this version v2 version v2 and proxy box v2 so we'll get our our version v1 we'll upgrade and then we'll see at that same address what the version function now returns so let's open our terminal if i run yarn hardhat node we'll spin up a node we'll have deployed our admin our implementation our proxy, and then our box v2 implementation. I'll make a new terminal, and I'll run yarn, hardhat, run scripts, upgrade box.js, dash dash network, localhost, and we should see that box actually update. And that's exactly what we see. And then let's do, well, it's I forgot to do dot two string in here, but it goes from version one to version two on that exact same address. And with that little code, we have successfully learned how to upgrade our smart contracts programmatically. Now, like I said, in the GitHub repo associated with this lesson, you can also check out the upgrades plugin from Open Zeppelin. So to work with that, you would just do upgrades.deploy proxy, deploy proxy, you would call the prepare upgrade function, and then upgrade, upgrade proxy, just like that. They also have an upgrades tutorial step-by-step -step for hardhat that you can follow along with as well. Now, I know this was an advanced section, and I know we went a little bit quick here, but honestly, if you just finished this section, not only have you completed all these other sections that make you a really powerful smart contract developer, but you've learned some really advanced stuff here. We've gone into low level code like delegate call, we've gone into assembly, we've gone into Yule, we've gone into these proxy patterns, which can really make you a, an incredible standout developer in the smart contract space. So if you just finished this section, you should be so, so proud of yourself because we went really fast and because there's a lot of advanced information here. Now, like I said, 100%, be sure to go into the discussions tab and ask questions and connect and talk to other people in the area. Maybe look at the already running dis discussions and jump in and start asking other students and start asking other people about what they've learned and how their proxies are going and if they made anything really cool. If you're just excited and you wanna to go to the show and tell section, make a show and tell, be like, hey, here's my GitHub repo for doing this upgrade section. Go in here and be excited. With that being said, go take that coffee break, go take that walk, go to the gym, go get excited, go tell your friends, we are almost done. We have two lessons left and then you're home free. All right, welcome back to lesson 17 for hard hat DAOs. You're we're almost done. Now for this section, I've actually already made a video on how to code a DAO with TypeScript and Solidity and JavaScript. In this video. So we're actually just gonna play this video for this section. The reason we're gonna just play this one is because I did a lot of work to make this one look really good and it's still incredibly up to date. So this is gonna be in TypeScript and Solidity. However, we're going to have the JavaScript edition of the code base in this code from the video section. If you want the most up-to-date version of this DAO template code, you can use, you can select this up-to-date code, which goes to this DAO template repo. I'll be updating this repo periodically with new DAO examples and new ways to create DAOs or decentralized autonomous organizations. Now, before we learn how to code a DAO, we should learn what a DAO is. And again, I've already made a video that I put a lot of work into. So we're gonna watch what a DAO is from a high level first, then we're gonna learn how to code a DAO. And then our last section is gonna be security and auditing, and we're gonna finish this out. So buckle in, let's learn what a DAO is, and then let's go ahead and build a DAO. Let's do it.
Now, DAOs or decentralized autonomous organizations is a bit of an overloaded term, but it typically describes any group that is governed by a transparent set of rules found on a blockchain or smart contract. And I say overloaded because some people say Bitcoin is DAO because the miners could choose whether or not to upgrade their software. Other people think that DAOs must use transparent smart contracts, which have the rules ingrained right into them. And then other people think DAO is just a buzzword, so they just slap the name really onto any organization so that they can get some clout. And this makes for Sad Patrick. And this is enough to be confused with the DAO, which was an implementation of a DAO back in 2016, which set the record for the largest hack at that time. So there's a lot of different ways to think about it. And the DAO term is used in a lot of different ways. But in essence, imagine if all of the users of Google were given voting power into what Google should do next. And the rules of the voting was immutable, transparent, and decentralized. This solves an age-old problem of trust, centrality, and transparency, and giving the power to the users of different protocols and applications instead of everything happening behind closed doors. And this voting piece is a cornerstone of how these operate, this decentralized governance, if you will. And it can be summarized by company or organization operated exclusively through code. And to really understand all this, we're gonna look under the hood of the protocol that's setting the precedent for all other DAOs in Compound. Then once we look at Compound, we'll understand what goes into building one of these and all the trade-offs, all the different architectural choices mean for your group. And then in my next video, I'm gonna have a full code along tutorial for developers looking to build one of these themselves. But be absolutely sure to watch the rest of this video because it's gonna give you all the architectural fundamentals so you can make intelligent decisions when you get to that section. And be sure that you and your DAO friends smash the like and subscribe button so that we can keep giving you the best engineer first content on the planet when it comes to smart contracts. Let's get into it. So here we have the Compound Protocol. It's a borrowing and lending application that allows users to borrow and lend their assets. And everything about this application is built in smart contracts. Now, oftentimes they're gonna wanna do a lot of new things. Maybe they wanna add a new token to allow borrowing and lending. Maybe they're gonna wanna change some of the APY parameters. Maybe they're gonna wanna block certain coins. There's a lot of different things that they might wanna do. So that's where we're gonna go ahead to governance. This is where you can find a user interface for a list of all the proposals and all the different ballots that came to be. So here's a list of some of the governance proposals that this protocol has actually been making to improve. And let's look at one of these proposals that's currently actually in process. So if we click on the proposal, we can actually see everything about this proposal who voted for, who voted against, and the proposal history here. Now, the first thing to one of these proposals is somebody has to actually create the proposal in a proposed transaction. And we can actually see that proposed transaction right here. If we click on this and we scroll down, we can actually see the exact parameters they used to make this proposal. Let's go ahead and decode the input data and we can see this is exactly what this proposal looks like. The way that they're typically divided is they have a list of addresses and a list of functions to call on those addresses, and then obviously the parameters to pass those addresses. So this proposal is saying, hey, I would like to call support market on this address, set reserve factor on this address. Here are the parameters we're gonna pass. They're obviously encoded with bytes. And then here's the description string of what this is doing and why we're actually doing this. The reason we have to do this proposal governance process is that these contracts likely have access controls where only the owner of these contracts can actually call these two functions. And the owner of these two contracts is likely gonna be this governance DAO. And values to zero just means that we're not gonna send any ETH along with these transactions. Once a proposal has been created, after a short delay, it becomes active. And this is when people can actually start voting on them. This delay between a proposal and an active vote can be changed or modified depending on your DAO. Then people have some time to start voting on them. And if it passes, which this one overwhelmingly did, it reaches succeeded. If we click on this transaction again, and we go to the compound governance contract, and we scroll down to contract, write as proxy, we can actually see the exact function that the people call to vote, namely cast by vote, cast vote by signature, and cast vote with reason. We'll talk a little bit about the exact differences between these in our next video, but these are the functions that they're actually calling. And if you go to the compound app and we go over to vote, this is a user interface you can actually vote through to make it easier if you're not as tech savvy. So you can vote right through this app.compound.finance, or you can just send the transaction yourself. Once all those votes happen, it reaches this 
queued stage. Now, what does queued mean? Well, before a proposal actually becomes active, there's a minimum delay between a proposal passing and a proposal being executed. So somebody has to call this queued function, and it only can be called if a vote passes, and it says, okay, that proposal ID has been queued, and we're going to execute it soon. Now, if we go to a different proposal, like this one, for example, we can see it has been executed. We can see somebody called this executed function, and they executed proposal 82. So this is going to be a full example of the life cycle of a proposal going through this process. Now, there are a couple that even failed. Whole bunch of people voted against this. And if you scroll down, you can see it was created, it was active, and the majority of people voted against. So that's where it stops. Now, oftentimes, just putting one of these proposals through isn't enough to really garner some votes for it. You generally want a forum or some type of discussion place to talk about these proposals and why you like them or don't like them. Oftentimes, a discourse is one of the main places that people are going to argue for why something is good or why something is bad so people can vote on these changes. And again, Snapshot might be one of these tools that you use to figure out if your community even wants something before it even goes to vote. You could join one of these and with your tokens actually vote on things without them being executed just to get the sentiment. Or like I said before, you could build your protocol in a way that Snapshot actually helps you with the voting process. All right, now you've seen the protocol that has been influencing all the other DAOs on how to vote. Now you know. Now that we know what a DAO looks like, let's talk about the architecture and tools that go into building one of these, and additionally, the trade-offs that they have. And the first thing to talk about here is gonna be the voting mechanism. Now, voting in decentralized governance is critical to these DAOs because sometimes they do need to update and change to keep with the times. Not all protocols need to have a DAO, but those that do need to have a DAO need a way for the participants to engage. This is one of the most important questions to ask and to tell your communities. How do I participate? How do I engage in this DAO? How do I help make decisions? And you'll find this is a bit of a tricky problem to solve. Now, an easy approach to this problem is gonna be using an ERC-20 or an NFT token as voting power, similar to what we saw with Compound. Use the Comp token to vote for different proposals. Seems simple enough, right? Boom, problem solved, hooray! Now, this actually might be the right approach for certain DAOs, but it also runs the risk of actually being less fair. Because when you tokenize the voting power, you're essentially auctioning off this voting power to whoever's got the deepest pockets. Whoever has the most money gets to pick the changes. So if it's only the rich people who get to vote, then it's highly likely that all the changes in the protocol are going to benefit the rich, which doesn't really seem like that great of an improvement over our current world. NFTs are interesting because they have this non-fungible component, but yet even they still run into this issue. Additionally, if you buy a whole bunch of votes, you make a bad decision and then sell all your votes, you as an individual don't really get punished. You just punish the group as a whole. But you being malicious, you can get away with pretty scot-free. Now again, this voting mechanism is going to be correct for some groups, but for other groups, maybe not. It really just depends on what your DAO and community setup is going to look like. Now, the next one we're going to talk about is skin in the game. Now, Vitalik has actually written a lot about this, and I highly recommend you read his article, link in the description, to see that. The skin in the game method means that whenever you make a decision, your vote is recorded. And if that decision leads to a bad outcome, your tokens are axed. So you get punished for making evil or bad decisions for your DAO and your protocol. I like this mentality because even if you buy a ton of tokens and decide to be evil with it, you can be held accountable for your bad decisions. Now, the hardest part about this though is gonna be how do we decide as a community what is a bad outcome? How do we actually punish these people? And that's easy because the answer is, I'm not sure. Now, the third method of this voting mechanism is probably one of the most interesting ones, but also the hardest ones to implement. And this is proof of personhood or participation. Imagine that all users of the compound protocol were given a single vote simply because they used the protocol. And even if they had a thousand wallets that used the protocol, one human being means one vote. This would be amazing and a far more fair implementation where votes couldn't actually just be bought. The issue, however, comes in something known as civil resistance. How can we be sure that it's one vote equals one participant and not one participant pretending to be thousands of different people so they get more votes? This method hasn't really been solved yet, but I'm willing to bet some very clever engineer will do some amazing chain link integration because proof of personhood 
is basically just off-chain data that can be delivered to on-chain, and that's exactly where Chainlink shines. Now, as you can see, all of these methods, and even more that you probably think of, aren't that far-fetched. And we actually see these exact same methods happening in the real world. Proof of personhood or proof of participation might just be the exact same as kind of the regular government voting that we see every day. In the United States, at least, one person gets to vote for one president. You can't go around making a whole bunch of fake people and voting for president. But in companies, the ERC-20 voting standard kind of applies. The more shares of a company you have, maybe the more voting power you have in that company. So we can draw parallels between the real world and how voting and governance is going to work in our smart contracts. And in fact, you should draw parallels and look for inspiration from the Web2 space. Now, when it comes to implementation of the voting, I put them into two categories, on-chain voting and off-chain voting. On-chain voting is exactly what we saw with Compound. There's a smart contract on-chain, you're a voter, you call some function called vote with your MetaMask, your ledger or whatever, send a transaction and boom, you voted. Congrats, you can wear your little sticker now. You call that function and you send a transaction. You send a transaction. Hmm, what do transactions use that are kind of annoying and kind of costly? Uh, oh, that's right, gas. Imagine you have 10,000 people in your community and it costs $100 to vote per person. You're now costing your community $1 million anytime you want to change anything. This is obviously insane and not very sustainable for your community. The pro here is that the architecture is really easy, everything's going to be transparent, everything's going to be on-chain, and that's really good. But yes, the con is that you're going to break the bank account for a lot of people, potentially. Now, there are a lot of variations of this to help solve some of these problems, especially the gas problem. One of the ones that I'm incredibly excited for is this one called Governor C where they use some random sampling to do some quadratic voting to help reduce costs while increasing civil resistance. If you wanna learn more about that one too, be sure to read about it in the description. So on-chain voting is the simplest one here, but let's talk about off-chain voting. How could you possibly vote off-chain in a decentralized context? Relax, relax. You can vote off-chain and still have it be 100% decentralized. You can actually sign a transaction and sign a vote without actually sending to a blockchain and therefore without actually spending any gas. Instead, what you can do is send that signed transaction to a decentralized database like IPFS, count up all the votes in IPFS, and then when time comes, deliver the result of that data through something like an Oracle like Chainlink to the blockchain, all in a single transaction. Alternatively, what you could do is you could replay all these signed transactions in a single transaction to save gas. This can reduce the voting cost by up to 99%. Right now, this is an implementation, and one of the most popular ways to do this is through Snapshot. And I'm just dying for someone to make a Chainlink integration because it's gonna be so much safer, more secure, and better, and blah, blah, blah. Dying for it. This is your call to action. Go build this thing. This off-chain voting mechanism obviously saves a ton of gas to the community and can be a more efficient way to store these transactions anyways. However, it needs to be implemented very carefully. If you run your entire DAO through a centralized oracle, you are essentially reintroducing a centralized intermediary and ruining the decentrality of your application. So don't do that. And if you made it to this point of the video, give yourself a little pat on the back. You're doing fantastic. Learning is fantastic. Like I said, I have a video coming out after this one that's gonna show you end to end how to build one of these from scratch. But let's learn about some of the tools that you can use help get you up to speed quicker. Now, there are a number of no-code solutions that can go into building one of these DAOs. DAO stack, Aragon. Just kidding, this is Aragon. Colony and DAO house are all alternatives that can actually help you with the op side of running a DAO and building a DAO. However, if you want more granular control and you don't wanna to have to pay any of the fees associated with these protocols, you might wanna do it from scratch. Now let's talk about some of the more Cody solutions that you can use. Snapshot is one of the most popular tools out there for both getting the sentiment of a DAO and actually performing that execution. Users can vote through this protocol with their actual tokens. Those transactions get stored in IPFS, but none of it actually gets executed unless the DAO chooses to. So this can be a great way to get the feel for what your DAO wants to do. And optionally, you can send the transactions and execute the votes as well. I highly recommend checking out Zodiac, which is a suite of DAO-based tools for you to implement into your DAOs as well. Tally is another one of these UIs that allow people to see and actually vote and interact with these smart contracts through a user interface. For those of you who don't know about Gnosis Safe, you absolutely should. Gnosis Safe is a multi-sig wallet. And the reason that I put this on the list, even though it adds kind of this centrality component, is that most DAOs in the beginning are probably gonna start with some type of centrality. It's much easier to be fast when you don't have thousands of people to wait for a vote. And in the beginning, any protocol is gonna be centralized to some degree anyways. Using a multi-sig where voting happens through only a 
few key members can be good in the beginning for your DAOs and often emergencies as well. But just keep in mind, when you add one of these, you are adding this level of centrality. And then of course, open Zeppelin contracts. We love open Zeppelin contracts. These are the contracts that we're gonna be basing our DAO code along on. All right, so that's all the tools, that's the architecture. One more thing before I let you go, legality. The future of DAOs is interesting for all these reasons we just talked about, but especially on a legal front. Does it make sense for a DAO to live by the same regulation as another company? How could you even force a DAO to do something? You'd have to force them to all vote a certain way if the government tells you to. It's, it's a little gray. It's hard to nail down who to even keep accountable for these DAOs. In the United States, at least, you can actually form your own DAO and have it legally recognized in the state of Wyoming. This is something I want to do, so we'll just have to see what happens there. Whew. At this point, you have been injected with all the DAO knowledge you need to succeed and thrive with this new amazing technology and these new amazing concepts. And it's time to build, baby! All right, well, you heard him. It's time to build. Like we said, all the code is going to be located in lesson 17 here. Let's jump in. In this video, we're going to show you how to build your own DAO inspired by Compound. Now, this is going to be 100% on-chain voting and on-chain governance. We're going to show you the easiest way to spin up an NFT or an ERC-20 voting type DAO, all using Solidity and Hard Hat. Now, if you haven't watched my last video going over the architecture of DAOs and what goes into one of these, be absolutely sure to watch that video first and then come to this video, because that video explains all the philosophy behind what we're doing here. We're going to be using Open Zeppelin contracts and the Hard Hat framework to build this all in solidity. If you want to see a Brownie or a Pythonic version of doing this, check the link in the description because we did a video over at the Chainlink Hackathon recently. And additionally, additionally, we know that because we're doing this 100% on chain, gas fees are going to be expensive. So I'm really looking forward to somebody doing a Chainlink plus IPFS plus Snapshot integration so that we can do all this off chain. And once that exists, you already know I'm going to make a tutorial on that. And if you like this style of content, be sure to smash the like button, subscribe, and leave a comment in the comment section to let me know what you want to see next. Let me know how you want to supercharge your smart contract developer experience. So let's jump in. All right, so here's what we're going to be building. We're going to have a very basic smart contract here, right? It's called box. And all it can do is store a value and then retrieve a value. But the thing is, it's ownable. And only the owner of this contract can call the store function. And guess who the owner is going to be? The owner is going to be the DAO. So only through a process of governance can anyone store a different function here. And once we're done, we're going to go through the entire process of proposing, voting, queuing, and then executing a transaction in a DAO to update our box contract. And that's one of the beautiful things about these, these DAO setups is that they're completely modular, right? And so when I go through the whole process, I'll do hard to head tests here, which my tests right now are set up to just do everything. We're going to see every single step that this DAO is going to take. So we see box starting value is going to be zero. And then all of this stuff is going through the governance process. These are just some, some notes. Basically, people are voting, queuing and executing. And then at the end, we change the value of the box contract through a voting process. And that's exactly what we're going to show you how to do today. Now, remember, all the code for what we're going to be doing here is in my DAO template GitHub repo. So if you ever get lost, feel free to refer back to this to get started. And additionally, if you want to see the Pythonic version of this, feel free to go back to the DAO mix. The main thing is, though, that all the contracts are going to be the same no matter what. Brownie, hard hat, DAP tools, Foundry, it doesn't matter. So the first part of this section is going to be exactly the same. And here's our agenda here. First, we're going to write the smart contract. So if you're not familiar with hard hat, who cares? We're going to be doing the smart contracts first. Then we are going to write deployment scripts. And this is where your hard hat knowledge is going to come into play. We're going to be writing our deployment scripts in TypeScript here because TypeScript is phenomenal. If you're unfamiliar with TypeScript, I challenge you to rewrite this in JavaScript and make a JavaScript version. And then finally, we're going to write some scripts to interact with our governance, with our deployed contracts. Now, a quick note. This isn't how I originally built this. I didn't just write the smart contracts, write the deployment scripts, write the scripts, and then the tests, and boom, I was done. I had a back and forth between tests, smart contracts, deploy scripts, et cetera. If you're thinking, oh my goodness, that's so easy for him to go through this so seamlessly. When I originally wrote this code, it was a lot of back and forth, and that's how you should be developing. You're gonna be moving between tests and smart contracts and stuff. Additionally, in this tutorial, we are gonna show you some sick hard hat skills. So you are not only gonna learn how to build a DAO, but you're gonna learn some really advanced hard hat skills. So let's jump in, let's do this. 
So the code editor I'm using is Visual Studio Code. So make sure you have a code editor up and ready to go. And you'll need a couple of prerequisites here. Again, the prerequisites are in the GitHub repository. We're going to need Git, Node.js, and Yarn. If you want to just clone this repo and follow the instructions here to get started, you absolutely 100% can. And then you don't even need to build this from scratch. But we're going to want to learn to build this from scratch. So let's just start Git dash dash version. Great, we have Git, Node dash dash version. Great, we have Node and then yarn dash dash version. Great, we have yarn, we can get started. So everything that we're gonna be installing here for packages is gonna be a dev dependency. So the first thing we need to do is do yarn add dash dash dev hard app, if you haven't already. And now in our folder, we're gonna have node modules package.json, readme and a lock, of course. So now that we have that, we can run yarn hard app. We're gonna get the hard hat CLI up and we're going to have all this stuff in here. We're just going to create an empty hardhat.config.js and we're going to turn it to TypeScript. The advanced sample TypeScript project has a bunch of stuff that I don't like. So we're just going to create an empty hardhat.config.js and perfect. We've got a little hardhat.config.js. Now let's go ahead and create a folder, our contracts folder. And this is where we're going to add all of our contracts. So the first thing contract that we're going to need is the contracts we want to have govern, which in our case is going to be box.soul. Now I am actually just going to copy paste my box.soul here because it's not particularly interesting, but you could really code whatever you want here. So feel free to pause the video, copy paste from my GitHub repo, create your own governance contract that you want to play with or do whatever you want here. But for us, we just have a store function and a retrieve function and an event, and then a private value that we're going to be storing and retrieving. And that's it. So of course we want to fix this. We're importing from open Zeppelin contracts. Open Zeppelin is amazing. Um, but we're going to want to add this. So we'll do yarn add dash dash dev at open Zeppelin contracts. And that should get rid of the box.sol. Let's reopen box.sol. And boom, looks like we did indeed get rid of that. Perfect. And for extensions, I'm using the, the Solidity, the Juan uh, Blanco Solidity extension. That's why we get those wonderful linting things here. Great. So now we want to check to see if this compiles. If you're using Remix, you can compile with Remix hard hat. You're going to see how we compile here. Or if you're using, you know, Brownie, we just want to see if this compiles correctly. So run your own hard hat compile. Oh, it looks like we ran into some compilation errors because we need to update this. Let's use 8.8 .8 of Solidity. And we'll try to compile again. And perfect. Looks like we're compiling successfully. Look here, we do indeed have our contract in here. Okay, perfect. Easy part out of the way already. That was so quick. Now let's start creating the next part. Let's create the governance part. So what we're going to be working with to build this governance platform is we're going to be building it off of an ERC 20 standard. So you're going to get an ERC 20 token. And that's going to be the token that you get to vote. So let's create a new file called governance token dot soul governance token.sol. And this is going to be the code for the token that we use to actually vote. Now we're going to create a normal ERC 20 token, and then we're going to extend it to make it governance a bull. And you'll understand what I mean in a second. So let's go ahead and make this SPDX license identifier. It's going to be MIT pragma solidity. We'll do 0.8.8. And then we'll do contract governance token. And then we'll say is ERC 20. I'm just going to go ahead and import open Zeppelin because open Zeppelin has a package where it basically has everything we need for an ERC 20 token. So we're going to say import at open Zeppelin slash contracts slash token slash ERC 20. Actually, we can go to their GitHub, open Zeppelin contracts token ERC 20, and we'll do ERC 20 dot soul. We'll do this for now. Uh, token ERC, ERC 20 dot soul. We're going to change this, but don't worry about that yet. Now we're going to do a uint 256 public storage max supply. This isn't the best practice, but it's fine. We'll give this a max supply of this much, which is going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So it's going to be 1 million. We're going to do 1 million of these tokens. And then we're going to create the constructor, constructor ERC20. We'll give it governance token as a name. And then our symbol is going to be GT. And for those of you who don't know, when you inherit another contract in your constructor, you can use that inherited contracts constructor as well. And in fact, I, I think you have to. So governance token GT, and then we'll even call one of these ERC20 functions called mint, and we'll mint to method.sender. So whoever deploys this ERC20 contract, we'll just mint them everything, the whole max supply. Now, normally, if this was a normal ERC20 token, you'd be all done. 
But this isn't a normal ERC-20 token. See, when we do votes, we need to make sure that it's fair. Imagine this for a second. Someone knows a hot proposal is coming up that they want to vote on. So they just buy a ton of tokens and then they dump it after the vote's over. We want to avoid this. We want to avoid people just buying and selling tokens to get in on governance. So what we do is we actually create a snapshot of how many tokens people have at a certain block. Snapshot of tokens people have at a certain block. And we want to make sure once a proposal goes through, we actually pick a snapshot from the past that we want to use. This kind of incentivizes people to not just jump in when there's a proposal and jump out because once a proposal hits, it uses a block snapshot from the past. So we're actually going to need to change this a little bit. We're going to change this from an ERC-20 to an ERC-20 votes. And we can actually see this in Open Zeppelin in the extensions slash ERC-20 votes.soul contract. If we go back to ERC to their GitHub, we can see ERC-20 votes. They also have a snapshot, which is pretty similar. And some of the main functions are it has these checkpoints. So these checkpoints are basically, hey, like what is this snapshot? There's a number of checkpoints. You can also delegate your tokens to different people. So maybe you're not going to be available to actually vote. So you say, hey, I'm going to give my tokens to somebody else. You can get how many votes somebody has, past votes, get past total supply. It has all these functions that make this token much better as a voting tool, right? Makes it much, much better. So we're going to say our contract governance token is ERC-20 votes, and we just have to add additional constructor, this ERC-20 permit. Oops, sorry, I kind of copy pasted that. So ERC-20 permit, governance token. And great, now we have a governance token that is a little bit more capable of doing actual voting, right? Because it has these snapshot, it has this delegating functionality, it has these checkpoints. It's going to be much better for doing votes in a fair way. The only thing that we need to do, though, is we need to add some overrides, right? And we're just going to say the functions below are overrides required by Solidity. And this part's a little bit boring, so I'm, I am just going to copy paste it. Feel free to copy paste it from my GitHub. Um, but what we're doing is anytime we do this after token transfer, anytime we, we transfer a token, we want to make sure that we call the after token transfer of the ERC-20 votes. And the reason that we do this is because we want to make sure that the snapshots are updated, right? We want to make sure that we know how many people have how many tokens at each block. Same thing with the mint. Same thing with burning. Uh, we want to make sure we always know how many tokens people have at different blocks or excuse me, at different checkpoints, I should say. And that's the most important bit. At which checkpoint are you going to use for your token voting? So cool. Feel free to copy that again from a GitHub. Or if you want, you could even just try the rest of the tutorial without this uh, and see how you fare. But cool. So now we have a governance token an ERC-20 token that we can use for governance. So let's try to compile it. Yarn, hard hat, compile. All right, great. Looks like things are compiling successfully. Perfect. So our governance token looks good. Our box looks good. Let's actually now start creating our governance contracts. Now, we're actually going to make a folder called governance standard because this is going to be the standard governance model this is going to be this on-chain erc20 and i plan on updating this in the future with you know a governance off-chain or something right so for now we're calling it governance standard because this is the quote-unquote standard way to do governance but in here we're going to need two contracts actually we're going to need a governor contract.sol and then we're also going to need a timelock.sol and this will make sense in a second so our governor contract.sol, this is going to be the contract that has all the voting code, all the voting logic that our governance token is going to use. The time lock is actually going to be an additional contract that is actually the owner. So the time lock and the governor contract are sort of one in the same, but the difference is the time lock is actually going to be the owner of the box contract. And this is important because whenever we propose or queue something to a proposal to go through, we want to wait, right? We want to wait for a new vote to be executed. Now, why do we want to do that? Let's say some proposal goes through that's bad. So like, let's say we have our box contract and then a proposal goes through that says, everyone who holds the governance token has to pay five tokens or something like that, right? Or, or whatever, or who knows, right? Maybe that's something that you don't really want to be a part of. So all of these governance contracts give time 
They give time to users to get out if they don't like a governance update. So we always want to have some type of time lock. So once a proposal passes, it won't go in effect right away. It'll have to wait some duration and then go in effect. So that's what the time lock is going to be for. Governor contract is going to have all of our actual code. Now we can cheat a little bit. <laughs> Actually, we can cheat a lot of a, a little bit. So Open Zeppelin has this thing called the contracts wizard, and there will be a link to this uh, in the description as well. And this Open Zeppelin wizard is a way for us to create really basic boilerplate code right in their wizard. So right. So if we go to their wizard contract here, we can see we can make an ERC 20, an NFT, 1155, and then finally this governor thing here. So we can call, give it a name. We're going to call ours governor contract. Do I explain what all this means? You can give it a voting delay, which is the delay since a proposal is created until voting starts. So once you create a proposal, you got to wait a little bit. The voting period, how long votes should go for. And the reason that this part here is important is because they actually do votes and uh, voting period in terms of blocks. So it's an anti pattern to actually do timed based things in smart contract, it's much better to do block based things. So we're saying one week, but it's that's going to be, you know, if if the average block time is 13.2 seconds, we're gonna figure out the week proposal threshold is going to be the minimum number of votes an account must have to create a proposal. So maybe you only want people who have a lot of your governance token to make votes quorum percentage, it's what percentage of people need to vote at all. So we're saying 4% of all token holders need to vote, or we could say, you know, exactly 100 tokens need to vote, whatever we want to do here. We also have some updatable settings. We have Bravo compatible. Bravo is the compound type contract. So if you want to make it integratable with compound, you can do that. Votes, comp like or ERC 20 votes. We're working with this ERC 20 votes. We always want to do a time lock. We're going to do the open Zeppelin implementation of a time lock. You could also do a compound implementation. We aren't going to do upgradability here. However, I have a number of fantastic resources on how to actually do upgradability. And if we did want to do upgradability, it adds all this other stuff. We're not going to do that for now because it will make this a much longer video. And then you can add some stuff like this. But Ooh, so that's pretty much it. And I know this feels like you're cheating, but we're just going to copy this whole thing, right? Copy all that stuff that we put in. Copy the clipboard, and we're going to paste it in. Don't worry, I'm going to explain what's going on, though. So we have our governor contract, and this is governor, governor setting, governor counting simple, governor votes, governor votes quorum, frag, all this stuff. All these are just implementations to make it easier to be a governor. Governor counting simple is a way of counting votes. Governor votes is a way of integrating with that ERC20 contract. Quorum fraction is a, is a way to understand quorum. Time lock obviously is time lock. This is going to be the base contract. This is going to be some settings. Now we're going to talk about this in a minute, but let's go over what are the functions here. So we have voting delay. This is exactly the voting delay, which we're going to do super dot voting delay. We're going to get from this governor settings contract that we're going to set in a minute. We have voting period that we're going to set in our governor settings, which is this one right here. And again, if you want to like look at all these contracts, you absolutely can, right? If we go to contracts, governance, extensions, we have all these in here, right? So if we look at governor settings, we can see it has voting delay, voting period, proposal threshold, and those are right in its constructor. And that's exactly what we're setting. Right, we're setting voting delay, voting period, and then the proposal threshold. And then we're also going to make this customizable as well. And the rest of these, that, that's exactly what they're doing. Calling the quorum from the super, get votes. And then again, the super is those inherited contracts, get the state. And then we have some interesting functions. We have propose. This is what we're actually going to do to propose new governance. We have proposal threshold. And then we have execute, which executes a queued proposal. Cancel. We have executor, which we're is going to be who can actually execute stuff. We're actually going to make it anybody. And then supports interface, uh, you can basically ignore. But let's make this a little bit more customizable. So we have iVotes token. This is going to be our governance token. We have the time lock controller time lock. This is going to be the time lock controller that we make in a minute. And again, we need this because we don't want to let any proposal just go through once it passes. We want to give people time to get out. But let's add a UN 256 voting delay as a parameter here. and. For voting delay, we're going to do this. We're going to set it as our, our governor settings. We're going to do a uint 256 voting period. And we're going to add that right here. And this means 45,000 blocks is approximately one week. And that's what that means. We're going to leave proposal threshold as zero because we don't really want to change it. We want to let anyone make a proposal. And then we're just going to add uint 256 underscore quorum 
percentage to this. So governor votes, quorum percentage, quorum percentage. So now this is completely customizable for voting delay, voting period, quorum percentage for whatever you want it to be. And believe it or not, that's it. Now you have a simple governance contract. Thank you, Open Zeppelin, <laughs> for doing 99% of the work for us. So that's it. So this contract, it's going to have all these functions that we're going to go over for proposing, for executing, and for queuing different proposals. Great. Now we got to make a time lock contract here. And this contract is actually going to be a lot easier. So we're just going to do it from scratch. So we're going to do SPDX, license identifier, MIT, do pragma, solidity, no, let's just do this 0 0.8.0. And then we're going to import from Open Zeppelin a contract called the Time Lock Controller. So if we look at their governance here, they have this Time Lock Controller .soul contract, and this has all this functionality in here for creating roles, who can actually propose, who can execute, who is a Time Lock admin. But it also has these execute stuff in here as well. That's going to work in tandem with our governance contract, right? This is the contract that says that makes sure our governance contract doesn't just push stuff through willy nilly. So we're going to say. We're going to first import that import at open zeppelin slash contracts slash governance slash time lock controller. That's all. And then we're going to say contract time lock is time lock controller like that. And we'll create our little constructor here constructor. And this because this takes a couple different parameters. We're going to take a unit 256 min delay, which are min delay. Min delay is going to be how long you have to wait before executing. So this is, hey, once a proposal passes, great, we got to wait this minimum delay. Then we're going to do a list of proposers, an address array, memory of proposers. And then the proposers is the list of addresses that can propose. For us, we're just going to say everyone's going to be able to propose. And then last, an address array, memory of executors who can execute everything. And we're just going to say executors who can execute when a proposal passes. And again, we're just going to say everybody. And the reason we need these is because we need to pass these to our time lock controller. This constructor is expecting three, three parameters. So we'll just do time lock controller and delay proposers execute force. And that's it. So this is going to be what owns everything. It's the time lock that's going to be owning our box. It's not the governor contract. The governor contract is where we're going to send our votes and stuff. But it's the time lock that actually everything needs to flow through in order for governance to actually happen because we want to make sure we have this min delay, we go through the right process and everything. And believe it or not, that's everything. That is all the code you're going to need as far as the solidity goes to create a governance to create a DAO. So we even do here on hard hat compile. Make sure everything's compiled and ta-da. We've done it. You've done most of the hard work. Now we're going to flip over to actually writing the scripts to deploy and to interact with everything using TypeScript here. At this point, if you're like, oh, I already learned everything that I wanted. I don't use hard hat. I use, you know, some other tool. This is where I challenge you to go out and I challenge you to try something else. Now, if you've reached this point, I just want to give you a huge congrats because you have taken the steps to build your own DAO, build your own governance model. That's all the solidity that you really need. You can take that, deploy that, and you're good to go. But of course, we know that there's more to being a smart contract developer than just the solidity. You got to do the tooling right too. So let's go ahead and we'll jump into writing those TypeScript scripts to actually do this. And again, if you want to see a Python version of this, go check out a link in the description to see the Pythonic version of this. And of course, don't forget to smash that like button, subscribe, leave a comment on how you're doing so far. And of course, give yourself a pat on the back. Great job. You're doing amazing getting this far. Congrats. Let's jump in. All right. So we're back here. We've written our smart contracts already. Check. Wasn't that easy? I mean, this was way easier than you thought it would be. Now we're just going to write our deployment scripts and then we're going to write our scripts to interact with them. Again, my full repo also has tests, but we're just going to write some scripts and then feel free to check out the tests yourself. So let's write those deployment scripts. So we're actually going to be using a package for our deployment called hard hat deploy. It is absolutely phenomenal for hard hat for making your deployments much, much easier. We're going to scroll down to installation and we're actually going to go ahead and install this. So typically you could install it like this. Well, we're going to use yarn, but we're going to do kind of the more safe way, which looks a little wonky, but I'm explaining it, right? So instead of npm install, we're going to do yarn add dash dash dev. And then this whole thing right here. So we're going to do yarn 
add dash dash dev, and then just paste that in here. So this is gonna be at nomic labs slash hardhat hyphen ethers at npm colon hardhat deploy ethers. And what this is doing is we're basically saying hardhat deploy ethers is gonna be overriding this hardhat ethers thing. And we're also gonna add ethers as well. And then once we add this, we can check our package.json and we can see we have hardhat. We have hardhat ethers, which is being overridden by this hardhat deploy ethers. And then additionally, we're gonna to wanna to add hardhat deploy. So we'll do yarn add dash dash dev hardhat hyphen deploy. And what this is gonna allow us to do is instead of having to write scripts and, and do all this stuff that kind of makes it hard to save your deployments and everything, we're going to just create a deploy folder where we're gonna add all of our deploy scripts in here. So I absolutely love this package. It makes deployment really, really easy. So in here, we're gonna create a new file. It's gonna do 01. We're gonna go step-by-step -step deploying everything. We're gonna call this deploy governor token dot TypeScript. That's gonna be the first thing that we're gonna do. Also, we're gonna change this to TypeScript. Ta-da, we now have TypeScript, yay. Now, the one thing that is kind of nice about doing kind of that advanced TypeScript thing that the hard hat kind of gives at the beginning is you don't have to install all the TypeScript stuff yourself, but we do. So we're gonna do yarn add TypeScript, type chain, ts node, at type chain slash ethers v5. No, this is a lot of stuff, don't worry. Type chain slash hard hat, at type slash chai, at type slash node, and then we'll make sure this is all dev, dash dash dev. I know this is a lot of stuff, but this is all the stuff to make it TypeScripty. You can absolutely do this in JavaScript if you want. Um, you just have to do JS files and, and ignore the typing. So, but feel free to do whatever you want to do here. All right, cool. And we should be okay here. Let's go into our governor token here and we'll create a deploy script. So the hard hat deploy GitHub repo has a little demo boilerplate code for you to actually do your deploy script. So feel free to reference here if you get lost or confused. So what we're going to do is we're going to import the hard hat runtime environment from hard hat slash types. And you'll see why we need this in just a second. And then we're also going to import deploy function from hard hat deploy slash types. And these are the two main things you need to create a deploy function with hard hat deploy. So we're going to create our function. We're going to call it const deploy governance token. It's going to be a type deploy function. So in order for these to actually work, we just create a whole bunch of deploy functions that we run with hard hat. And this is going to be an async function. It's going to take the hard hat runtime environment as an input parameter that we're going to call HRE. Okay. So when we run hard hat deploy, which you'll see in a second, we're actually passing our fake hard hat chain that gets spun up in the background for us, right? We can even do like console.log, hello. And if we do yarn hard hat deploy, actually, before we even do that, if we do yarn hard hat dash dash help, you'll see since we imported hard hat deploy, oh, excuse me, we need to add this to our config first. In our config, we're going to need to do top import hard hat deploy top. We're also going to need to import at nomic labs slash hard hat ethers. We're also going to need to import at type chain slash hard hat. And then we'll leave it there for now. We'll have to import more stuff in a second, but we'll just leave it like that. Now, if we do yarn hard hat dash help, we should see a new task in here. And we do, we actually see a, a ton of new tasks, right? Available tasks, check, clean, compile, console, deploy. And this is the new task that we have that actually deploys all of our contract. Anything that's in this deploy folder, hard hat will go ahead and run. So right now in our deploy folder, all we have is this console.log hello. So if we run yarn hard hat deploy, we should see it just print out hello. It'll spin up a new blockchain in the background, pile all of our projects and everything, do some type, type chain stuff. And it says, you'll see this a lot. Deploy script.func is not a function. And that's because we actually need to export this now. So we'll do export default deploy governance token. That's why it's getting mad at us. Now we'll run yarn hat hard hat deploy and boom, we see hello. So this is how we can actually deploy all of our scripts and we can run everything that's in this deploy folder in one go, which is really helpful. So let's go ahead and deploy our governance token first, right? And this will get a lot faster as we go along. Don't worry. So delete this. And first we're going to do, we're going to say const, we need an account to deploy this first. So we'll say const get named accounts, uh, deployments, and network equals HRE. And this is going to be a little bit more advanced. This is hard stuff. This is uh, this is the slick stuff we're doing here. 
We're getting these from our hardhat runtime environment, which is being updated from hardhat deploy. So get named accounts is a way for us to actually import accounts from our hardhat config right into our deploy script. So we're going to go to our hardhat config and we're going to create a new config that's a little bit nicer than this. So first we need to import the hardhat config type. This is reason type scripts. So we're going to import hardhat user config from hardhat slash config. And we're going to create a config. So I'm just going to comment this out for now. We're going to say const config. It's going to be a type hardhat user config equals. And this is where we can add a whole bunch of stuff. So let's say our default network is going to be hardhat, which is kind of our local fake blockchain. And then we're going to say solidity is 0.8.8. .8. Then we're going to do this thing called named accounts, which is what we came here in the first place for. So this is just a list of accounts that we can use. So for accounts, we'll say deployer. This will be the name of our account that does all the deploying. And we'll just say default is going to be zero. So whenever we run on any chain, our zeroth account is going to be named deployer. What other thing that we need to do is we need to add our networks here. And there's actually two networks that we're going to have. We're going to have hardhat with a chain ID of 313337. And we're also going to have local host of chain ID 31337. Now, these look like they're pretty much the same. And uh, I understand that, uh, but they're not. And you'll understand why in a second. But we need them for now just to tell Hardhead, hey, the, here are the, the development fake blockchains that we're working with. Okay. So this is kind of our basic setup here. Okay. I know that was kind of a lot, but now that we have get named accounts, we have network, right? Because anytime you deploy something, it's going to be on a network. And when we deploy something, if you run yarn hardhat node, what hardhat is going to do is going to spin up a fake blockchain in the background. Oh, it's going to get mad at me for a second. Oh, I forgot to add export default config, right? We need to export the config to tell hardhat that we're using this version of Slitty. Now, if we run hardhat node, You'll see why we added these two networks up here, hardhat and localhost. We actually get spun up our own fake blockchain. We get accounts, we get private keys, we get everything, right? This is a hardhat node running in this terminal, right? When you run hardhat node, oddly enough, it's actually the localhost network. It's not the hardhat network. When you're using hardhat deploy, it's going to be the localhost network. Or excuse me, when you use hardhat node, it's actually going to be the localhost network, not the hardhat network. The hardhat network is what it uses when it runs tests. Localhost is when you run this hardhat node and have this kind of fake blockchain running in your terminal. So that's what the localhost is. Cool. We'll control C, we'll kill that. But all right, great. So now the stuff is actually working. So get named account deployments is going to be a whole bunch of stuff from deployments. You'll see in a second. And network is the network that we're on. Okay, great. So now we're going to grab const deploy log equals deployments. So this deployments object comes with this deploy function and this log function. This log function is kind of nice for doing logging. And then we're going to grab const deployer equals await get named accounts. So we're grabbing from our config this deployer account, right? And it's always going to be the zero with index. So it's defaulted to the zero with index for whatever accounts that we're with. Great. So we now have an account to deploy stuff from. We have a deploy function. We have all this stuff. We're looking pretty good. Cool. So sometimes I'll do like a log deploying governance token, dot, 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 and we'll say const governance token equals await deploy, and then the name of the contract, which is governance token, comma, and these are all the parameters that we're going to pass to it. So we're going to say from deployer doesn't take any arguments. So args is just going to be blank. We're going to do log to be true. So we'll get some logs printed out for us. And then I have this wait confirmations attribute set in my GitHub repo. For now, we're going to ignore this. But if you follow along with my repo and you want to auto verify stuff, this is something that you're going to want to use. So you need to wait some amount of blocks for this contract to be deployed before you can actually go ahead and verify, right? Because if you're using ether scanner or something, you're going to need to wait like, yeah, you're going to need to wait a few minutes. So check out my GitHub repo for this wait confirmation stuff. I'm just going to ignore it for now. Additionally, in my GitHub repo, I have this verify function. Right, we check to see if it's on a development chain. And if it is, we don't verify it. But if it's on like Etherscan or something, we go ahead and verify it. So be sure to check the GitHub repo to learn how to just auto verify without having to do anything. Now, if we just do this part, and we can even do deployed governance token to address governance token dot address. And we'll do yarn hardhat 
deploy. Boom. So we spin up on a fake hard hat network. We do deployed governance token to address. Boom. And this is how we deploy a fake past deploying this to our own little network here. Great. So this token's been deployed. We have our deploy script. Yay. Should we zoom out a little bit? Let's zoom out just a little bit. Great, that's the whole thing. Now we're gonna add one more thing here. We're gonna add something called a delegate function. Now, when you actually deploy this contract, nobody has voting power yet. The reason is because nobody has the token delegated to them. So we wanna delegate this token to our deployer. Right? So we're gonna call this delegate function. So we're gonna create a, a new function called const delegate, and it's gonna be an async function. It's gonna take a governance token address as a string. It's gonna take a delegated account also as a string. So we're basically gonna say, who do we want to delegate? Who do we want to be able to vote with our token? Okay, so we're creating this async function called delegate. And how do we do this? Well, we say const governance token equals token equals await ethers dot get contract at, Oop. and it probably poured ethers for us from hardhat, it auto did that which is great. That's what we want. Once it's saw ethers, thank you, VS Code. Um, await ethers that get contract at. And we're going to say we want our governance token, which is at contract governance token address. And I have auto format on saves, which is why it keeps formatting like that. This should be delegated account. Okay, cool. We have our governance token contract. Now we can do const TX or transaction equals await. Governance token dot delegate, delegate this delegated account here. And then we can do await. We'll wait for this transaction to be confirmed by one block. And then we'll just do console.log checkpoints. Await governance token dot num checkpoints delegated account. So what is this doing? So we have this num checkpoints function, which we can go check to see on that ERC20 token, what this is actually doing. But basically what this whole thing is doing, we have this delegate function that we haven't used it, but when somebody calls us, we're saying, hey, you can use my vote. Take my votes and vote however you want. And that's what these this delegate does. Now, if we look at this token, ERC20 extensions, ERC20 votes, when we look at number of checkpoints, we can see how many checkpoints that account actually has. The reason this is so important is because when, again, like I was saying, when people do a vote, they do it based off some checkpoints. And anytime you transfer a token or delegate a token, you basically call this function move voting power, which happens at the back end, which writes the checkpoint and says, hey, at checkpoint X, here's what everybody has for voting powers. And that's where these are so important. And I know I said before, it's every block, but it's actually just every checkpoint. Whenever these checkpoints are updated, that's going to be a lot cheaper on gas than if we just did every single block, right? That'd be kind of insane. <laughs> so the checkpoint for this governance checkpoint, and we'll see what it actually is in just a second. So we'll even do await delegate governance token dot address and deployer. And we'll say log delegated. Now when we run this function, yarn hard hat deploy, we have one checkpoint, which makes sense, right? Because this was just deployed. It was just delegated. This address has one checkpoint. That's it. And the reason I checked for this is because if you see zero checkpoints here, it means you haven't delegated correctly. So be sure to check for checkpoints. But that's it. We have our deploy governance token contract done. Bravo. Let's move on to the next one. So what do we want to do after we deploy our governance token? Well, Let's deploy that time lock, deploy time lock.ts. And we're going to copy a lot of the stuff over from here. So I'm actually going to, oh, and then sometimes you'll get some weird linting errors here. I just do that TS ignore there. And, and sometimes you'll get it here too. Um, oh, actually, we don't even need network. Okay, cool. Yeah, you don't even need network. Whoops. Um, but sometimes you get some weird linting errors. Sometimes VS Code has a hard time telling, understanding like this, this overwrite thing that we did. So just run that TS ignore if it, if it gives you some, uh, some linting errors. Anyways, yes, we have this O2 deploy time lock here. We're going to deploy our time lock contract and we're going to borrow a lot of the things that we did from here. So I'm just going to come back here. Uh, we're actually going to copy paste these two top bits. Again, we're going to do const deploy time lock is going to be a deploy function. It's going to be an async function that takes the hard hat runtime environment as a parameter and cool, nearly exactly the same start. And then we're going to grab these first three lines or first four lines, I guess. Paste those in, we're going to be getting those exact same things here. And we're going to be doing nearly the exact same thing. So 
We'll do log, deploying, time lock, deploying time lock. We'll do const time lock equals await, deploy time lock. We'll add some parameters in here. We'll say from deployer. Now, does this take some arguments? It absolutely does, right? We can take a look at the time lock. Min delay, proposers, and executors. So what do we want our min delay to be? Well, this is a value that we're actually gonna use a lot. So what I usually like to do is I, I create a new file called helper hardhat config.ts. And right at the top, I'll say export const min delay, and I'll have this delay be whatever I want it to be. So let's just go ahead and do 3600, which is gonna be approximately an hour, right? You gotta wait this many seconds. I think that's an hour. I'll whip out the old calculator. There's 60 seconds. 60 minutes great that's going to be one hour so we have 30 minutes and we're going to go ahead and import that here we'll say import min delay Ooh, oh wow it auto completed for me great from helper from you know it's down directory helper hardhat config and that's going to be our first argument here our second argument is going to be a list of proposers now we're going to leave it blank for now and also the list of executors we're also going to leave it blank for now we're going to update this in a minute and you'll see why uh, once we get there we'll do log true uh, this also has a wait confirmations thing in my GitHub, but we're going to skip that for now. It also has an auto verify. We're also going to skip that for now. Then we just need to export default deploy time lock and boom, we should be good. So let's try to run this. We are on hard hat deploy. So now this should run both of these. Great. Deployed governance token, deployed time lock. Perfect. We are cruising. Now what? We want to deploy that governance contract now. So let's go ahead and do that. So we're going to do 03. Deploy governor contract dot TS. And you guess that this is going to look pretty similar uh, to what we just did, right? So in our deploy time lock, let's go ahead and just grab those top two things. We'll paste it in here. We'll do const deploy governor contract, which is going to be the deploy function. It's going to be an async function taking a hard hat runtime environment. Let's even close this for now. And we can even go back and grab these three lines from our O2 deploy time lock, paste that right in here because we're going to need to get the exact same things. And additionally for this, we're going to need to get the governance token and the time lock contract. So we'll do const governance token equals await get, which actually we have this, this get function that comes from these deployments, which literally just goes out and gets uh, these deployments. So we'll say get governance token. And then we also need to get the time lock. So await get time lock. And we need these to pass as parameters for our governor contract, right? Because if we open up the governor contract.sol, we look at the constructor, it takes the token, the time lock, voting delay, voting period, and quorum percentage as input parameters. So we'll do a quick log, deploying governor, hello. And then we'll do const governor contract equals await deploy and we'll deploy the governor contract. I'm not sure if I'm spelling this right always, but that's fine. And we'll do the parameters once again. So it's going to be from employer args are going to be this list of args. What's the first thing that it needs? It needs the token first and then the time lock. So we'll do governance token dot address. Then it's going to need the time lock dot address and it's going to need a voting, voting delay, voting period, and quorum percentage. So these are also values that we're gonna make a lot. So let's open back up that helper hard hat config and let's create those as well. So we'll say export const voting period. And we'll say this is gonna be five blocks. We'll do export const voting delay. This is gonna be just one block, which I know is really quick. And then we're gonna need export const quorum percentage, which we're going to say is four, four percent of voters always need to be voting. Or excuse me, four percent of voters need to have voted for a vote to pass. Great. So we're going to do voting delay, voting percentage, quorum percentage. So we'll import those. So we'll do import voting delay, voting period, or um, quorum percentage from helper hard hat config. And then we have those. Delay period percentage, we can just do comma voting delay, voting period, quorum percentage. And then we'll say 
log is true. And again, this one as well, it has a wait confirmations and an auto verification that we're going to totally ignore. And then we'll export default, Bloit governor contract. Okay, we're getting spicy here. Let's just make sure this works. Yarn hard hat deploy. We should see three contracts deployed here. Nothing to compile. Governance token deployed, time lock deployed, governor contract deployed. Let's go. All right, now we're not done yet. We have two more deploy scripts to do. The first one, we're gonna call setup governance contracts, okay? And this one's really important. But right now, our time lock contract has no proposers and no executors, right? So we wanna change that. We wanna only allow for the proposer to be the governor. The governor contract should be the only one that proposes things to the time lock, and then anybody should be able to execute. The way that this works is we say, hey, the governance contract proposes something to the time lock. Once it's in the time lock and it waits that period, anybody can go ahead and execute it. So governor contract, everybody votes and everything. Once a vote passes, governor says, hey, time lock, can you please propose this? Time lock goes, yeah, sure, but we got to wait this minimum delay. Once this minimum delay happens, anybody can execute it. Now, this would be really cool to do an integration with Chainlink Keepers, by the way, for the Chainlink Keepers to automatically execute. Oh, man, I should build the next. Anyways, so we have to set this up so that these work as such. So we're going to create a new deploy thing called 04 setup governance contracts dot TypeScript. And this is going to be the code that does all this setting up. And this is going to look really similar, once again, to all of our other deploy functions. So we'll go ahead back from 03. We'll paste these two top ones in here. Of course, we're going to do const set up contracts. This is going to be a deploy function. It's going to be an async function. It's going to take HRE, RDA runtime environment as parameters. And then that's the winner right there. Cool. And we're going to be grabbing those same three from the top. As you can see, that gets a little bit easier because it's kind of repetitive, right? We're going to grab that bit right here. And now we're going to get those contracts so that we can interact with them. And this is another reason why a hard hat deploy is so nice because we can just do const time lock equals await ethers dot get and then actually let's go ahead and import ethers from hard hat import ethers from hard hat and we'll even drop a little ts ignore here ethers dot get contract we want that time lock contract and we say we want to attach it to the deployer so whenever we call a function on it it's going to be the deployer calling that function then we want to do const governor equals await ethers dot get contract governor contract. This is also going to be attached to the deployer. Great. Now we're going to do log setting up roles. Dot, dot, dot. And we're going to set up the roles, right? Again, we're setting it up so that only the governor can send things to this time lock because the time lock is going to be, you can almost think of the time lock as like the president, right? So everything goes to the Senate, the House of Representatives, which is the governor. And then the president just says, yeah, sure. We just got to wait this minimum delay. But the president will be the one to actually execute everything, which I'm not actually sure that's how it really works in uh, in politics. But for for now, that's that's what we're pretending. The, the president or the time lock is the only one that can actually do anything here. So the way that this works is we're actually going to get the bytes codes of different roles, right? So if you look at these time locks here, so we'll do opens up on contracts, and we go to the governance here, we go to time lock controller, it has these things called proposal role, executor role, time lock admin, etc. And these are just hashes of these strings here. But these are these are bytes 32 saying, hey, anybody who has this this byte 32 is a proposer. Anybody who has this byte 32 is an executor. Anybody who has this byte 32 is a time lock admin, etc. Right now, our deployer account is the time lock admin. And that's bad. We don't want that. We don't want anyone to be a time lock admin, right? We don't want anyone to have power over this time lock. We don't want any centralized force here. So what we're going to do is we're going to do const. We're going to get those roles. Proposer, proposer role. It's going to be await time lock dot proposer role. And if you're familiar with multi-call, this would be a great time to do multi-call. I'm going to copy paste that whole line. Executor role. Executor role. We're going to copy this whole line. Admin role. And this is going to be time lock admin role. So these are these three roles that we need to, to fix, right? And let's go ahead and fix them. So the first thing we're going to need to do is we're going to need to do const proposer tx equals await time lock dot grant role proposer role to our governor dot address. So saying, okay, governor, you're the only one who can actually do anything. Once you tell the time lock to do something, we'll wait. 
for the time lock period to be over, and then we'll be done. And then we'll just do an await poster tx dot wait one block just to make sure. Now we're gonna do the const executor tx equals await time lock dot grant role executor role to nobody. We're gonna execute this. We're gonna give this to nobody. We're gonna say address zero, which is gonna be something that we're gonna to want to add. If we go to our helper hard add config, we'll say export const address zero equals zero by, and you can just copy paste this if you want. There's a couple other ways you can do this with ethers as well, but we're just gonna do it like this. I like having my const like this, and then we can just import it. We'll say import address zero from dot dot slash helper hard head config. So we're giving the executor role to nobody, which means everybody. <laughs> so once a proposer's thing has gone through, anybody can execute it. So we'll say executor tx dot wait one, we'll wait a block, and then we got one more to do here. We need to revoke role. Right now, our deployer count owns that time lock controller, right? And that's how we can actually do these transactions. We can actually grant role because our deployer account owns it. But now that we've given everybody access and given all the decentralized access we need, we want to revoke that role. So const revoke tx equals await time lock dot revoke role admin role from deployer. And then we'll do wait. Now guess what? Anything that TimeLock wants to do has to go through governance and nobody owns the TimeLock controller. It's currently after this runs, it's impossible anyone to do anything with the TimeLock without governance happening. And then of course we're gonna export default setup contracts. Great, and then the last step that we need to do here is we need to deploy the contract that we actually wanna govern over, right? That box contract that real basic contract. So we're gonna create a new one, 05 deploy box .ts. And we're gonna do some of the same exact stuff we've done, right? So we're gonna grab these two, grab these two here, paste it in. Const deploy box is gonna be a deploy function equals async function, HRE, hardhead runtime environment. We're gonna grab those first three lines, with the TS ignore, just like that. And now we're gonna deploy this box. So log deploying box. And we're gonna do const box equals await deploy box. Let's give us some values from our deployer. Args, does this have any args? Let's open up box.sol. I don't see a constructor. Wow, this is the easiest contract out of all of these though. No constructor. And then we'll just say log, it's gonna be true. And again, if you wanna check out my GitHub repo for that um, confirmations bit, feel free to do so. Use be a comma here. And right now, our deployer has actually deployed this, right? Not our time lock. So we wanna give the boxes ownership over to our governance process. So now we're gonna do, we're gonna say const time lock is gonna be a wait, ethers.getContract, the same thing as before, time lock. We're gonna grab ethers from hardhat, import ethers from hardhat. And we're gonna do a little TS ignore. It's being finicky. And then we're gonna transfer the ownership of our box to this time lock, okay? And now, so this is actually what's known as a box deployment. So before we do that, we have to get the box contract. So this is a box deployment object, which doesn't have contract functions. We wanna get the box contract object. So we do box or const box contract equals await ethers dot get contract at box. And then we'll just do, you know, box dot address. You could also do get contract. Um, actually, both of these pretty much, if you have the address, you can just do box that address. Um, but you could also do get contract here. Either one works. Now that we have the box contract, we do const transfer owner TX equals await box contract dot transfer TX, or excuse me, dot uh, transfer ownership to our time lock dot address, time lock dot address. And then we just do await transfer ownership TX dot wait one, do a log, you done it. And then we'll do export default deploy box. Woo, let's see if this works. So we just did everything. We're deploying the governor token, deploying the time lock, which owns the governance process. We're deployed the governance process. We're setting up the governance process so that it's totally decentralized. And then we deployed and set up our box so that it only can be updated through a governance process. Let's see if it works. Yarn, hard hat, deploy. 
Let's see if it works. Bada boom, you done it. So you've just set up a script to set in this entire governance process up so you can build your own DAO. Oh, are you still here? Well, hell yeah, you are. Congratulations on getting this far. We have one more piece to go. We just got to write those scripts so we can actually interact with this. We can actually do a governance. We can actually see exactly what the governance process looks like. Now, again, if you didn't watch my last video on DAOs, be sure to watch that because that's going to give you all the context for this part here. And if you're still watching, 100% smash the like button, hit the subscribe, leave a comment in the comment section below. It really helps the channel out. So proud of you for getting this far. We're almost there. You're getting there. One more to go and then you're home free on building your DAO. Let's get back into it. All right, so now we're going to make some scripts to actually interact with, propose, queue, and vote on anything that happens in our DAO. And these are the scripts. These are kind of the things that you would do on your front end when you build this, when you build your DAO on the front end. Or you could do an integration with Snapshot or Tally or, or something like that. And again, if you want to see kind of the full functionality, on the GitHub, I have this testflow.ts. It's not the, the greatest test here, but you can also check this out because it also does a, a soup to nuts demonstration of going through this exact process. So let's go ahead and start making some scripts. So we're going to create a new folder called scripts, and this is where we're going to put all of our scripts. Now, the process for this is going to be we're first going to propose something, right? You know, maybe we're going to propose that our box contract stores the value 77 right? Because when it first gets initialized, it's going to start with zero. So maybe we'll, we'll propose it could start at 77. Once proposing is done, we start voting on it, right? Once a proposal is in, we're going to vote on whether or not we want the proposal to go through, right? Yes or no. And then if it passes, we go to queue and execute. We queue first, and then we execute. I'm just putting them both in the same script to make it easier. So let's start with propose here, because this is going to be the first thing that we're going to do. So let's create a new function. We'll call it async function, uh, and then we'll actually export it to export async function propose. And we're going to be in here for a little bit. So let's clear everything out. And okay, cool. So this is where we're actually going to propose on our governor contract, right? So we're going to propose on our governor contract. So the first thing we're going to need, of course, is going to be the governor. So do const governor equals await ethers.get contract governor contract, right? Since we're doing ethers, we're gonna have to do import ethers from hardhat. And then we're still getting that, that fun little thing. We'll do a little at TS ignore here. Cool. So we have the governor contract here. We're going to need the box contract because we're gonna say, hey, we want to propose the box contract changes the store value. So we'll do const box equals await ethers dot get and this is a geth contract. We want get contract get contract say box. And those are the, the two main ones that we're going to need just to start. Now, if we look at the propose function, right, if we go to governance, we go to governor, and we look at that propose function, this is what it looks like. Now I explained this propose function in my last video. So if you haven't seen it, be sure to go back and watch it, right, because it'll give you everything that you need to know here. Uh, but basically, we pick a list of targets, which our list is just going to be just our box contract. These are the targets that we want to call functions on. We do values like how much native ETH we want to send, which we're not going to send anything. We have bytes array call data. So this is going to be our encoded parameters for the function that we want to call and then a description. So that's exactly what we're going to do here. So first, we need to figure out what we're going to do. So if we look at box, we're going to call this store function with uh, this new value here. So we need to encode we need to encode this box here. And we also need to encode what we want to upgrade it to, right? So we have to code all the function parameters. So we'll do const encoded function call equals box. And the way we can get this box.interface.encode function data. And this is what actually turns it to being this bytes call data, right? So we're, we're encoding everything. And this encoded function, you can find this in the uh, ethers documentation, we have to pass it the function to call, and then the arguments we want to pass right. And this is how we actually uh, get that. So let's get these arguments here. So we're going to say args, we're going to make our proposed function a little bit modular. So we're going to say args is going to be an array of anything. And then we're going to say function to call is just going to be a string, right? And then right at the bottom, we're actually going to call this uh, this proposed function. So we're going to say propose. And let's say we want to give it 77. The function is going to be what it's going to be store, store, and that's a string. And this needs to be a list. So we're going to do it like this. Now we're actually going to use this all over the place. So since we're going to be using this all over the place, 
we want to stick them in this hardhat helper config. So what we're going to do is we're going to say export const new store value equals 77. And we're going to do export const func equals store. In our propose, we're just going to import those. So we'll do import new store value, and then also func from helper hardhat.config and it added it in for us, which is great. So we'll just put new store value in here and then we'll put func in here. And I, I know this might look a little confusing, but basically the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna call this propose function, which calls, you know, propose function up here. Now we're gonna do some fun little then process.exit zero. And then we're gonna do a dot catch error, which if there's an error, basically we'll just do console.log error and then process.exit. And this is pretty typical setup for uh, really any script you, you work with in hardhat. So great. So we have const encoded function call, which has this function to call an arg. So we're, we're basically combining these into this bytes thing. And we can even print this out. You can see what this looks like. So we can do console.log. You see that this is like this, this crazy bytes thing here. And the way we can kind of test this, we'll do yarn hardhat node, which will spin up again, our, our fake blockchain, but additionally with hardhead deploy, it'll deploy all of our contracts here, right? We can see time lock governance, you know, everything that we need for testing locally has already been done. So once we have that up, we can then do yarn hardhat run scripts, propose.ts dash dash network localhost. This is important to do again, because when you're working with a node that's running locally, you're going to be working with localhost. We'll see what it prints out here. No contract name governor contracts, governor contract. Let's try that again. And cool. You can see this is what that encoded uh, function call and arguments looks like is this really long byte string. But if you were to decode this using the box interface, you would get the function call and the arguments, which is really exciting. So cool. We've encoded it to bytes. And now what do we want to do? We encoded it to bytes. And now we're going to create that proposal transaction. So we'll do console.log. We'll say proposing. Let's say function to call on box that address with args. And then we also need to pass a proposal description. So we're going to say proposal description. We can do it on new line. Why not? Proposal description, which we don't have yet. Don't worry, we're going to get it. So we also need to pass a proposal description, right? Because we have down here description. So let's add another parameter to our propose here. So we'll say proposal description, and this will be also a string. Down at the bottom, we're going to need a proposal description as well. So we'll create a proposal or export const proposal description, it's just going to be some string. So we'll say proposal number one, store 77 in the box. So that's the description here, comma proposal description, and then we need to import this for our helper config. Okay, perfect. So now we have the new store value, the function, the proposal description, and we can now call that propose bit that we were just looking at. So here's what we're going to do. Const propose TX equals await governor dot propose. And we need to pass those lists. So first is going to be a list of targets, which for us is just a box that address, right? Only one target. And again, these, these little brackets make it a list of values, which is just going to be zero, a list of encoded function calls or our bytes data, basically. And then the proposal description. And then we're going to do propose tx .wait one Now, if you remember from compound, this is going to be the exact same. If we go back to compound, back to governance, this transaction is literally going to be the same as this created thing here, right? And if we scroll down, click more, we can see decode input data that those exact same things on a compound proposal, right? We have targets, values, signatures, well, okay, this is a little bit more, <laughs> this is a little bit more advanced here. It's using signatures, but it's got the same thing, call data and then a, a description here, okay? Now, since we have a voting delay, people actually can't vote until the voting delay passes. Now, with a local blockchain, nobody's actually processing blocks and time doesn't really pass as quick as we want. And uh, so we're, we're just gonna speed things up for our own testing purposes. So the way I normally do this is I create this, this variable called development export const development chains, and I'll add hard hat and local host, because we can actually do things with our own local blockchain, we can actually speed up time, we can speed up blocks, we can do all this, this crazy stuff. So usually I'll actually import this in here. And then I'll do a quick if and I'll say if we're on a development chain, let's just go ahead and speed things up for us, right? 
So I'll say if development chains dot includes network dot name, and then we can import network from from ethers as well. And this is what I was talking about those super sick skills that you're going to learn. If it includes network dot name, then we're going to go ahead and move the blocks forward, right? Because if we're not on a development chain, we can't actually move blocks. So what I'll do here is actually I'll create a new folder called utilities, new folder you or utils. And in here, I'll create a script called move blocks dot ts. And we're just going to create this little function called move blocks, which moves blocks for us. And, and you'll see how we do this. So we're going to import network from hardhat because we want to speed up that voting delay. We'll do export async function. We'll call it move blocks and it'll take an amount, uh, which will be a number. So how many blocks that we actually want to move. And then we'll just do console.log moving blocks. And we'll say for a let index equals zero. Index is less than amount. Index plus plus. What we're going to do is we're going to do await network.provider.request request. And we're going to request method EVM mine. So basically we're mining for our local blockchain, right? So you can find these docs in the hard hat docs and the ethers docs. Um, there's, a, uh, there's a couple different places you can find these, but this is kind of this really cool hack that we can use to actually move blocks forward on our local chain. Now, obviously this won't work on an actual chain because you'd actually have to do the mining, but our, on our local chains, we can absolutely do this. So we've exported this move blocks function and we're actually gonna grab that from our propose. So we're gonna do import move box from utils blocks. And we're gonna say down here, if we're on this development chain, we're gonna do await move blocks and then we'll move blocks by that voting delay that we were talking about, right? Because we need to wait that voting delay in order to move. And it looks like it auto imported for us from our helper hard hat config. I told you we were gonna use that a couple of times, but we're gonna move blocks by that voting delay. Now this proposed transaction does some stuff that we actually want, right? So one of the big things that it wants is it is it has this proposal ID. And if we scroll down to the event that it emits, it ends up emitting this proposal ID. We actually need the proposal ID for later on when we actually go to vote. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to do const propose receipt equals propose tx dot wait. And we're going to get those events from this proposed receipt. So we're going to say const proposal ID equals propose receipt dot events the zero with event because that first event is the only one we care about dot args dot proposal ID. This is how we get this proposal ID from this emit proposal created event. A couple other ways to get proposals to get events in hard hat and I got a video on it on my YouTube if you want to go check that out. Something else that we want to do is maybe we want to see what the deadline is or the snapshot. You can go ahead and check my GitHub to kind of see what the snapshot looks like or the deadline, basically how long we have to vote, you know, what snapshot you're working with and all these different things. But for now, we're just going to stick with the proposal ID. Be sure to check out the GitHub for more stuff. Now we want to save this proposal ID. We want to save it somewhere so that our other scripts, so that our vote and our queue and execute know what this proposal ID is going to be when we run those. So what we're going to do is we're going to create this file called proposals.json and it's going to store all of our proposals. So we're going to say proposals.json. It's going to have all of our proposals in here. So what we're going to do, and we're going to add this to our helper hardhat config, we're going to do export const proposals file equals proposals.json. And we're going to import this at the top as well, this proposals file. And then once we get this proposal ID, what we're going to do is we're going to read all the current proposals. So we're going to say let proposals equals json.parse. And we're going to do fs.read file sync uh, from this proposals file. And we're going to pass it to utf8. Now this fs we don't have yet. So we're going to need to import fs. So we're going to do yarn add fs like that. And if we look in our package.json, oops, I should have saved that as dev, but I didn't. Oh, well. Um, doesn't really matter. Now that we have that, we can actually import this into our TypeScript. So we're just going to say import star as FS from FS. And now we can actually use FS. F is a way to kind of read from files. And now we can get this list of proposals. So if we go to proposals.json right now. We'll just make it a blank JSON. So the first time we run it, it'll just be blank. But later on, it'll have stuff in it. And the way that we're going to save these proposals is we're going to say proposals of network dot config dot chain ID and this little bang to say yes there will be a chain ID dot to string we're going to store them by their chain IDs right so for each network that we have a proposal to we'll uh, we'll store it like that and then we'll do dot push 
proposal id dot to string and then we'll write it back so we'll do fs dot write file sync proposals file json dot string if i proposals and awesome and that's all we need to do so let's go ahead and actually run this and then i have some console dot logs in here saying hey here's what the proposal state is is it open is it voting is it canceled you know etc what the proposal snapshot is that you know again check my github for that but what we can do now this is done, we can do yarn hardhat node. We'll spin up our little node here. And all the contracts are deployed. And then we'll do yarn run scripts propose.ts dash dash network localhost. Scripts propose.ts is not found. Propose yarn hardhat run scripts propose.ts. Oops. Dash dash network localhost. Let's try this again. Now you found it. Yay. Oh, it ran into an issue. Proposal description, movie box. Can I read property zero of undefined? Let's see where it got mad at me. Proposal sheet dot event. It is events, not event. Let's try this again on the local host. There we go, run in. Ran into another issue. Proposal already exists. Okay, so great. So the proposal already exists. Um, let's go ahead and just like kill the node, and restart the node. So you can't have two proposals that are exactly the same, basically, right? So we can't do that. We would need to change the description or something. So we're just gonna kill the node and restart. Now we're gonna run this proposal again. And then hopefully this one uh, should work this time. Can I need property zero of undefined? Propose receipt. This needs to be await because it is a promise. Kill this one more time, rerun it. And once all these get deployed, then we're gonna go ahead and run this. Now you can see how much quicker this is than if you were to actually send this to a test net, right? This would have been a lot of waiting, which is no bueno. And we run into one more. Can I read property push of undefined? That makes a lot of sense too, because proposals.json has nothing for chain IDs. So let's do three, one, three, three, seven, and we'll put a little list in here. Right now it's an empty list. Now we're gonna kill this one more time, kill it. And then once this goes, then we're gonna go ahead and do this. Perfect. Now we're gonna run this and now it should save and everything should be peachy hunky dory. Awesome. Proposal number one store in the box, we move the blocks. And if we look at proposals.json, we now see there's a list of proposals. And this is the proposal ID of that one we just created. Boom. Okay, we made a proposal. Awesome. Nice work. We'll leave that node running. And uh, hopefully we'll just do things right for the voting. <laughs> so let's create this vote script now. Okay, so now that we proposed, it's time to vote. Let's do a little voting. So this is going to look pretty similar to that script we just uh, we just created, right? So we're gonna do async function. We'll call this main proposal index number. And we're calling this main because we're gonna have the vote function be a little bit different. You'll see why. And at the bottom, of course, we're gonna do main index, you know, dot then process dot exit zero dot catch error, arrow function, console dot error, error, and then process dot exit one main index. We're gonna say our index is zero, const index is zero. Do it. We'll do it like this. Us index is here. Proposal index. So we're gonna get we're gonna get that that zero with index, right? The first index in our proposals.json. So whatever is the first one in this list is what we're gonna use, right? And that's what we want. Right now there's only one, so it's easy. So we're gonna get that first one in here. So first thing we're gonna need to do is we're gonna need to grab the list of proposals. So we're gonna do const proposals equals json dot parse fs dot read file sync proposals file utf eight. So of course we're going to need to import a bunch of stuff. <laughs> we're going to import proposals file from dot dot slash upward hardhead config, and then we're going to do import star as fs from fs. Right? We have fs. We can read stuff and we can get those proposals. Okay, cool. So we have a list of proposal IDs. Now let's get our proposal ID. We'll do const proposal ID equals proposals of network dot config, oh, and then. Uh, that's not what we want. We want to actually import network, import network from hardhat network.config.chain ID exclamation mark of proposal index, which for us is going to be zero, right? We're getting that first proposal in the list of proposals. Now we're going to choose how we want to vote. So zero equals against one equals four. And then two is abstain. I don't know why you'd ever abstain. Abstaining costs gas. You could just not vote. But we're going to say const vote way, the way we're going to vote equals one. And we can also do a reason. So if we go back to our governor, there's a couple different functions we can do to vote. There's cast vote, where we just cast a vote, cast vote with reason, 
in cast vote with signature, where we actually do a signature. Here. And I asked this question, hey, what does cast vote by sig do on the opens up on forum? I was like, hey, what's the what is the purpose of this? My hunch was that anyone could then execute this vote on behalf of me if I didn't send the transaction. And that's exactly what it is. This method implements a meta transaction and allows a project to subsidize voting fees. The voters can generate a signature for free and the project can submit those and pay for the gas. So this is incredibly powerful. And this is the function that allows this this um, this cast vote by signature is what allows that snapshot chain link integration that, you know, hopefully one of you build. But for us, for this, since we're not implementing these meta transactions, these off chain stuff, we're just going to do cast vote with reason. Uh, why? Because we want to give it a reason. That's really it. So we're going to say const vote tx response equals await governor dot cast. Oops, excuse me. We need to get the governor contract. So we'll do const governor equals await ethers dot get contract governor contract. And then if we don't have ethers, we should get ethers. Great. Let's get ethers. And we'll ignore that. But now we have the contract. So we'll do await governor dot cast vote with reason. Spell this right with reason. And we'll say proposal ID, vote way, and then the reason, which we don't have a reason here. So let's make a reason. Let's say the reason is cost reason equals I like a do da cha cha. If you know that film, you should definitely comment it in the description. So we have a reason. So we're voting for, we're saying, yes, we want to, we do indeed want to change the box to 77. And the reason is because I like a do da cha cha. Makes perfect sense if you don't think about it. And then we'll do a wait, vote tx response dot wait. So I do some stuff again, checking the state of the proposal where different numbers mean, hey, it's in process, it's voting, et cetera. We could check on that, but we're going to skip that for now. All we're going to do now, now that we've voted, we're going to be the only ones to vote. So we're just going to once again, move the blocks along. Why? Because we want to just get to the end of that voting period. So we're going to do again, if development chains dot includes network dot name, then we're going to do await move blocks voting period plus one. So we need to import a whole bunch of stuff in here. Proposals file development. Oh, looks like those got auto imported. We need to import this move blocks. So import move blocks from utils blocks and then network is in here and then we need voting period from our helper config voting period okay cool and then we'll do console.log voted ready to go now the reason that I, I checked the proposal state is because there's this state function in the governor contract so if we look up state what this does is it tells us what the state of the proposal is in right if it's been executed return that's been executed if it's been canceled return it's been canceled uh, you have the deadline, check to see if it's active, check to see if quorum reached, all this stuff, right? And what you're usually looking for is quorum reached and vote succeeded, right? If both of these happen, the proposal state dot succeeded, right? Otherwise, it's defeated or it's, it's not there yet. I believe this is a one and this is a zero. So if you were to call that function and get the state, right now we should get a zero, or excuse me, we should get a one for this having passed. If you want to do that as a little extra credit, feel free to do so. So let's see if we did this right. Well, actually, I guess we could have changed this just to vote, but I just wrapped everything up into to main. So let's see if this works. Yarn hard hat runs scripts, vote network, localhost. So we should get a little console.log at the bottom that says voted, ready to go. So now we're voting. We even just go into the hard hat console. We could do yarn hard hat console dash dash network localhost. And in here, we can actually just check the state right in here. Why not? So we'll copy this line. Cost governor because await ethers get contract governor contract. Now we can do await governor dot state of if we go to the proposals dot JSON, grab this, paste it in here, and we get a four. The state of this right now is four. I forget what four means. It's like a proposal state. The proposal state is actually in the I governor, so the the interface of the governor. We can see zero is pending, one is active, two canceled, three defeated, and four is succeeded. So we are in a succeeded state, which is really good. That's exactly what we want. So let's go ahead and quit now. Oops, excuse me, control C. Our proposal is now in a succeeded state and we've actually moved the blocks along the voting period. So voting is now over because we cheated. So now let's go ahead and queue and execute this. Let's do the last bit here. So this is gonna look real similar to what we've done already, right? Let's just minimize this. Export async function queue and execute. And then at the bottom, we'll just call Q and execute. And I'm just going to copy paste, but it's that same syntax here. Dot then process exit catch blah, blah, blah. You get the drill.
So in order to queue and execute, we go back to the governor contract, not the I governor. Let's go to the governor. First thing we're going to do is call this queue. Now this queue function is actually in the governor time lock, which is in this extensions here. So we can find the governor time lock controller here. And it does exactly the same as propose. We take everything that we did in the proposal and then we just queue it like so. So we pass the exact same values here and that's how we queue it. So what we're going to do is we're going to need to first get those exact same values, which I told you we're going to use a few times. So we're going to import func new store value proposal description upper hard hat config. Right now that we have all that stuff, we'll say const args equals that new store value. We'll do const box equals await ethers.getContract. Let's get that box contract again. We're going to have to import ethers from our hat. And this is going to be from, we're going to do at TS ignore. Then we're going to once again encode this function call to const encoded function call equals box.interface encode function data. Once again, we're going to do func is the function we want to call and args. This is looking real similar to the, our proposed bit that we did. And then we're going to do const description hash equals ethers.utils.getgack256 ethers.utils.2utf8 bytes. This will make sense in a second. Proposal description. So with our propose, all we did was pass our proposal description. However, it actually gets hashed on chain and that's what our queue and execute is going to be looking for. It's going to be looking for the description hash instead of just the pure description, right? And it's going to be a little bit cheaper gas wise, which is good. So now that we have the description hash, now that we have all the same functions that we did for the propose, it's time to queue them. So we'll do const governor equals await ethers.getContract, governor contract, console.log, we'll say we're queuing, and then we'll do const queue dx equals governor.q. And we're going to pass the exact same parameters we did with the propose, except for with the hash instead of the actual proposal. So box that address zero for ETH and pass that coded function call and then the description hash. Great. And then we're going to do, oops, it's going to be wait here. And then we're going to do await utx dot wait one. We're going to wait a block there and great. Then we're all queued up. Now we still have to wait that minimum delay, right? Remember, on our time lock, it's got this min delay thing. It says, hey, once something gets queued up, you can't just execute it right away. You got to give people time to get out. So we're going to speed up time again. So we're going to say if development chains, development chains dot includes, and then it looks like it auto imported for me. Development chains. Yes, it did. Amazing. Dot includes network dot name. Let's just make sure we import network from hardhead. If it includes network name, then of course we're going to move blocks, but we also actually have to move time here. So the minimum delay is looking for some time. So let's create a new util called move time. Okay, move time.ts. And this util is going to allow us to move time. So you're learning all the cool stuff. So we'll quickly write a script to do this import network from hardhat, export async function move time. How much time will be a number amount? console.log moving time and we'll say await network.provider.send evm increase time and then just by the amount then we'll just say console.log move forward amount seconds it goes forward in seconds cool so now we have this move time function that was pretty quick right so first we're going to move time and we're going to move time by that min delay first plus one just to be safe and then we're also going to move blocks. So we're going to do await move time and then await move blocks. And we'll just move one block. So we got to import move blocks from utils. We got to import move time from those utils as well. Move time. And then we also have to import this min delay, which we get from our helper hardhead config. Great. So we moved all that stuff. Again, if this were a real chain, you just have to wait. But since we're not on a real chain, we can do whatever we want. Yes. Love doing whatever I want. Now that it's all queued up. The vote is passed. We're looking spicy. Let's drive this home. Executing. We'll do a little console.log executing. We'll do const execute tx equals await governor.execute. We're going to pass this the exact same set of things we did for the QTX. So I'm literally going to copy this, paste it down here. And then we're just going to do await 
xqtx.wait. We're going to wait one block. And then the final hour, we'll see if the governance updated our box contract. Const box new value equals await box.retrieve. And then we'll do console.log new box value. Box new value dot two string. Woo! So if we did this right, this new box value should be updated. Let's see if we did it right. Yarn, hard hat, run, grips, queue and execute. Network localhost. Did we do it right? Have we successfully done governance? We didn't. That's okay. We're going to figure out what we did wrong. Did you mean Kachak 256? I spelt some stuff wrong. It needs to be spelt like no CK, just, just K. Okay, let's try again. It failed before it actually did anything. That's good. Queuing, moving time, provider, EVM increase. Oh, because oh, I spelt increase time wrong. Oh no. EVM increase time. Let me just double check. Make sure I'm spelling this right. T is actually capital. So I totally messed up. So it's actually already been queued. Uh, it's been queued right now on our little node, EVM increase team. So we could either delete and kind of restart, or I could just go ahead and uh, I'm just going to comment out a bunch of stuff. We're just going to skip the queuing here. We're going to run this one more time because it's already been queued. And now it should just execute. Oh, we're going to move time again, but that's fine. Oh my goodness, we did it. Right, and then normally you would just do it in one script, but this queue would fail because it, it was already queued, right? You can't queue twice. We we'll move forward in time, we moved blocks, we executed, and we got a new box value completely using our DAO, completely decentralized voting, completely on chain, no third party trust going in on here. There's no voting booth. There's no, you know, spending thousands of dollars on staff. Everything we just voted on happened right in front of our faces. Now, again, highly recommend go to my GitHub repo, you take a look and you see what's going on here. Again, if you want to see JavaScript stuff, feel free to do some JavaScript stuff. But this goes over how to just get clone and get started if you want to do that as well. But if you walked with me here, if you walked through this with me, you have learned an absolute pun. Thank you so much for being here and I'll see you next time. All right. Now, welcome to the final section of our course, the security and auditing section. This one's gonna be a little bit less coding and a little bit more explaining. And most of what we're gonna be learning about here is in this hard hat security FCC section. Throughout this course, we've given you a couple of tips about different security features. One, we, we talked about reentrancy. We talked a little bit about Oracle attacks, and we're gonna talk about those more and some of the tools we can use to make our code more efficient, to look out for bugs, and to make our code more secure. So we're gonna go, go ahead, we're gonna go over to this hard hat security FCC code base and we're gonna walk through it a little bit. So one of the first things that we're gonna talk about is what is an audit? Well, an audit is gonna be a security focused code review looking for issues with your code. So for example, let's say we have some code that looks like this. This should be a little bit familiar because we talked about this in one of our earlier sections with reentrancy. Our code withdraw goes in and sends ether and then updates the balances. This code is clearly vulnerable to a reentrancy attack here. And this is something that an auditor would catch. Since when we deploy our code, that code is immutable and that code will always be there. It's really important to have these security reviews done before we deploy our code to a mainnet and before we go live. So if you're gonna deploy some crazy massive DeFi protocol and you're gonna have billions of dollars of people's money locked into your protocol, you probably wanna make sure that the money is gonna to go to the correct places. So audits are an incredibly important for the life cycle of our projects. And we want people to peer review. We want people to review our code to make sure that everything looks good. Now, when we send our code to audit though, we shouldn't just say, hey, here's our code. Can you check to make sure it's good? That's not gonna give an auditor enough information. They need to be able to very easily know what your code does, how to work with it, and what you're looking for. Because auditors aren't gonna be kind of this, this fail safe where if your code is terrible, they're gonna catch everything. Auditors are human beings too. They can miss things as well. Auditors also don't make sure that your code is bug free. Like I said, audits are security focused peer reviews for your code base. And when you do send your code to audit, you wanna make sure you help out your auditors as much as possible. There's an amazing tweet thread from Tincho who previously was an open Zeppelin auditor with a ton of tips and tricks for working with auditors. I highly recommend you pause the video, you click this link and you read through his tweets because they are fantastic. 
Open Zeppelin has a readiness guide to try to help you make sure that you're even ready for an audit in the first place. And we've got a link to this readiness guide in the GitHub repository. The summary of them are to add comments to your code, use NatSpec, which we learned about to document your functions, document your functions, document your functions, test, be ready to talk to your auditors and be prepared to give them plenty of time. They are literally pouring themselves over your code for weeks on end to make sure there's nothing wrong. If you rush your auditors, you're gonna get a rushed audit and they're going to miss things. So let's talk about the auditing process. An auditing process is gonna look like this. First, they're gonna run your tests. That's the first step an auditor is always gonna take. And right there, they're gonna find, okay, do they have enough code coverage? Is everything passing? What do the tests do? What is the optimal functionality? After an auditor runs tests, they're gonna read specs or run your docs. And then they're gonna run some fast tools like Slither, Linters, and Static Analysis. And that's gonna be one of the first things we're gonna talk about, Slither and Static Analysis. So Static Analysis is the process of just running some program to read over all your code and look for commonly known bugs. One of the most popular Static Analysis tools is gonna to be this tool called Slither. And that's gonna be one of the first things we're gonna do here. So let's go ahead and open up our VS Code now. And we'll make a new directory called hardhat security FCC. We'll cd into it. And we'll do code period. And we'll open this up. Now, what I want you to do instead of starting a new folder and everything is we're going to git clone my hardhat security FCC. So we'll do git clone hardhat security FCC space and then put a period to clone it into this directory and we'll get everything like this. Now in here, this comes with a couple of different contracts for us already that each have a different vulnerability. One of them is going to be bad RNG. This is a contract that picks a random winner of a raffle using block difficulty and message.sender. This isn't truly random as the miners can influence the block difficulty and people can cancel transactions. And there's a ton of ton of different vulnerabilities with creating randomness in this way. We also have this liquid pool as an Oracle. The two most common types of attacks are re-entrancy, which we've learned about, and Oracle manipulation attacks, which luckily for you, we've taught you about decentralized Oracles and working with Chainlink, which should make you a lot safer. And especially for this section, I'm going to harp on these. Please, 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 if you've taken this course, please do not make a protocol that falls victim to one of these. I will feel like I have failed you if you build a protocol where you use some centralized Oracle that gets manipulated or you build a protocol that has a reentrancy attack. The tools that I'm going to show you right here are gonna help you with reentrancy and everything I've taught you about Chainlink should hopefully teach you how to not get Oracle manipulated. So in this contract here, we're using a liquidity pool as an Oracle. And this is kind of some advanced DeFi stuff here. This is a minimalistic decentralized exchange example where people can buy and sell and swap different assets. Now using this singular exchange to get the swap price is a terrible idea because this is a single protocol for a single price. The price from this protocol is a single centralized location and we don't want to get our price from a single centralized exchange. We want to get it from many exchanges. Getting the price of any asset from a single decentralized exchange is not decentralized. If somebody manipulates the market doing some crazy advanced DeFi things, that will ruin the price of your assets. So getting the price of your assets from a centralized location is a terrible idea. We have a metamorphic proxy here. The issue here is that it's initializable and we don't guarantee that the contract has been initialized. We have a classic reentrancy issue here. And then we have, and then we have a vault here where some password is stored on chain and we're crossing our fingers that nobody reads this password to unlock it. So we're gonna run some static analysis on these contracts, see if that static analysis can spot some of the bad things in here. To get started, we're gonna use a tool, like I said, called Slither. The Slither tool was created by this Crytek team, AKA the Trail of Bits team. Now Trail of Bits is one of my absolute favorite auditors in this space, and I absolutely love all the tools that this team puts out. They put out open source security tools for any of us to use, such as Slither. Now to get started with Slither, we actually need to install Python first. So you can also run it with Docker, but I'm gonna show you how to, how to work with Python first. So if you haven't worked with Python before, you can come to python.org slash downloads and download Python right from the website. 
you'll know you've done it right. And you can run Python 3 dash dash version like this. Or if you have an older version of Python, you can run Python dash dash version. Once you install Python, you should also have this tool called pip3 installed. And you can check by running pip3 dash dash version or pip dash dash version. Now we also want to install this sulk select package just in case we're using weird versions of Solidity. To install sulk select, we run pip3 install sulk select like that. And then we can do sulk select use, and then we can choose a version of Solidity for Slither to work with. Once you have those tools, you can just run pip3 install Slither analyzer like so, and you can install Slither into your Python environment. I'm not gonna run it because I already have. You can also learn how to do this all with Docker. But we'll learn how to do this with Docker in a little bit. Now in our package.json, we actually have a command a script in our package.json for running Slither. You'll know you've installed Slither correctly if you can run Slither dash dash help. And you get an output like this. Now we can use Slither to run it on our contracts folder by running this big command here. So we'll say Slither and we want to run it on dot slash contracts. We would need to tell it that it has some sulk remappings and every time it sees open Zeppelin, it should use node modules slash open Zeppelin. And every time it sees chain link, it, sh it should use node modules slash chain link. And I'm just gonna read from our package.json and we're excluding a couple of functions that it runs and excluding build or ignore, but don't worry too much about that. We can actually just run that by first running yarn to install all of our packages. And after we've installed all of our packages, we can run yarn slither, or you can copy paste that slither command and run it directly. Now we'll get this massive output that looks like this with some red and some green. Let's go through what's actually happening here. The way that we can read Slither, it'll list out a number of lines that have an issue and then a reference to that issue. And each one of these is separated by a new line. So that's a section, that's a section, et cetera. So if we get a red here, that means that there is a high impact issue that we definitely should address. And it even comes with a, a reference link that we can copy paste and put into our browser and see what the issue is and more information from the Slither tool about what that issue is and how to correct it. We can see it catches our metamorphic contract issue. It says metamorphic contract is never initialized. It is used here in metamorphic.kill. The reason that this is a massive issue, if we go to our metamorphic contract.soul, is that if we deploy this contract, somebody else could initialize this code, become the owner, and then automatically kill it before we even have a chance. This is actually something that has happened in the past and has caused a ton of issues. So if we see red in the terminal, this means, hey, massive issue, we should absolutely check it out. Now there's gonna be a ton of green in here. These are detectors that are probably low impact and they're probably okay. And in fact, we can see it's even just calling out some open Zeppelin stuff here saying, hey, we see some inline assembly, Inline assembly is kind of scary. Maybe don't use that. So you can think of green as kind of a warning that there's a low likelihood that this will impact anything, but you might want to check it out. We get this different versions of Solidity used, which is just saying, hey, there's a couple different versions of Solidity. That might be something you want to keep in mind. Maybe you should use the same versions of Solidity. We have this allow old versions, and this is actually why throughout this whole course, we've been using 0.8.7 because 0.8.4 and 0.8.7 are considered more stable versions of Solidity. So if you're using versions outside of there, Slither will say, hey, uh, maybe you wanna work with a different version. We have some flags in here about maybe, hey, you should make a variable constant because it never changes, which is great. Uses literal with too many digits saying, hey, this is kind of hard to read. Maybe you screwed up some of the zeros, allowed old versions, and what's this? Reentrancy in etherstore.withdraw. So just by running this Slither tool, we can catch a reentrancy vulnerability in one of our contracts, which is fantastic. So running this static analysis caught at least two huge vulnerabilities in our metamorphic contract and in our reentrancy contract. It didn't catch the issues in vault.sol, liquidity pool, or bad RNG though, which is why we don't only want to rely on Slither because it's not gonna catch everything, but it will catch a lot of major vulnerabilities. So that's how we can use Slither, at least from a minimalistic point, to get started. So great, 
we just learned how to work with Slither. That's one of the first tools that are really fantastic in our audit process. And that's gonna be considered a fast tool for static analysis. Running tests, linters, et cetera, are also types of static analysis. After we run a tool like that, we enter some manual analysis where we walk through the code ourselves manually. And maybe we do it in tangent with running some slower tools like Echidna, Manticore, and other symbolic execution tools. Symbolic execution is where we simulate executing transactions on the blockchain. And one of these symbolic execution tools that we're gonna work with is this Echidna tool. Again, this is a trail of bits tool for doing something called fuzz testing. Now in programming, fuzzing or fuzz testing is an automated software testing technique that involves providing invalid, unexpected, or random data as inputs to a computer program. In a lot of our code, oftentimes we're gonna get people interacting with them in ways that we will never think about. So we want to be able to provide random data and random information to our tests to see if something weird happens that we weren't expecting. So we can actually build our own fuzz tests in our hardhat projects and run these fuzz tests. I've actually created a, a sample fuzz test. We write our fuzz tests in Solidity actually, as opposed to writing our tests in JavaScript. So let's say for example, we've built this vault contract and we think that at first glance, hey, nobody should ever be able to know the password and no one should ever be able to unlock this contract, which obviously we know is ridiculous because we know that anybody can read anything in a storage variable. So we know that this should fail, but it might be hard to write a test to catch that this actually would fail. A good approach to testing this would be to just send a ton of random bytes 32 objects to this unlock function to see if we can unlock it. We can write a fuzz test to do exactly that. So in my, my vault fuzz test.sol, we're importing vault.sol. And so we're saying vault fuzz test is vault. And we have a password of 123 ASD 123. And now we have a function called echidna test find password, where it's gonna send a ton of random data into vault to try to make s locked equal false. So we just say s locked equals true here, and our fuzz test will try to make s locked equals false. Now we could install just Echidna, but at this point, it's a good idea to bring up our the security toolbox from Trail of Bits. So Trail of Bits has a package called the ETH security toolbox, which has all of their security tools in one single container. Echidna, Ethano, Manticore, Slither, Rattle, and not so smart contracts. It has all of these in the same exact package. Now to work with this toolbox, we're gonna need Docker installed. So we're gonna do a little bit of installation here. And again, sometimes this can be the hardest part of the course is just installing these packages. So we've left a link to docs.docker.com, get Docker to install Docker to actually work with these tools. You're just gonna come, you're gonna click whichever one of these is appropriate for you to install Docker. Once we have Docker installed, we can run the eSecurity toolbox by pulling it down from the Docker equivalent of GitHub. And we're gonna use a whole bunch of Docker commands that I'm not gonna explain here because this isn't a Docker course. If you're looking to get into the security stuff, I would definitely recommend reading up on all these commands afterwards. And we're gonna leave a ton of links for you to learn more. And in the package.json associated with this lesson, we even have the command to get set up right in here. So we can just run yarn toolbox, which will run our Docker command like this. So I'm just gonna run yarn toolbox. And if you get something like this saying, cannot connect to the Docker Damien, is the Docker Damien running? Because I need to have my Docker Damien running. Since I installed Docker desktop, I need to have my Docker engine started and running for it to actually be working. Again, to work with this, there's a lot of Docker setup and configuration that needs to happen, which I'm gonna leave a ton of instructions on how to get started with Docker. Once we have Docker set up, now we can run Yarn Toolbox, which will stick us into a new shell to work with any of these tools that Trail of Bits has out of the box. Now, our Vault Fuzz test comes with a config as well. This is in a YAML file with all our arguments for running Echidna. So it has a test limit, which is how many different runs we should do, a time delay, block delay, and then of course, some remappings in here. This Docker shell will already have these security tools already installed, like, Echidna test. So we'll run Echidna test on src slash contracts slash test slash fuzzing slash vault fuzz test dot sol dash dash contract will be vault fuzz test dash dash config 
would be src slash contracts slash test slash buzzing slash config dot yaml. And we'll go ahead and we'll hit enter here and it'll say analyzing contract and it'll give us an output like this. And it'll give us an output that looks like this. What it's saying is it found a use case where it could make s locked equal false. And the use case was 123 ASD 123. So in what seemed like almost seconds, it found the password to unlock our contract. And this is why running a fuzz tester can be so powerful. We thought our contract was secure, but it immediately found the password, which means anybody else could immediately find the password. And this would be an indicator that what we're doing there is not a good setup. So we'll hit Control C to escape and to leave our Docker setup here, we'll just write exit. Now, again, I'm going to leave a ton of links to work with Echidna and work with this fuzz tester in the GitHub repo associated with this lesson so that you can go ahead and learn more. Now, if you take anything away from this whole section, it should be this right here. The two most common attacks are reentrancy and Oracle manipulation. So if you're not going to be an auditor and you just want to deploy things to mainnet, always, always before you deploy anything, the absolute minimum that you should be doing is always running slither and then looking manually for oracle manipulation and reentrancy attacks if you see in your code that you're getting pricing information price is a piece of data that we of humans have assigned to something if you're getting pricing information from a centralized location rethink that scenario rethink what you're doing there if you're getting a random number if you're doing any type of automation from a centralized location rethink it and change your strategy the Chainlink Oracle network has been created for a reason to prevent getting hacked like this. So please keep these in mind before you deploy anything to mainnet with any type of security guarantees. Okay, great. So we've learned about the fast tools. We've learned about some of the slow tools. We didn't look into Manticore or MythX, but these are also tools that you can use. Manticore is going to be another tool from the Trail of Bits team. And MythX is actually a smart contract security service from the consensus team. You basically send a bot that they have running in the cloud, your contracts, and it'll do some automated process to check for security vulnerabilities. This is a paid service, but if you're going to be deploying a protocol that's worth millions of dollars, spending a few thousand dollars, spending a few thousand dollars to make sure it actually does what it says it's going to do correctly is definitely something that you want to invest in. After you run through this whole process, you, the smart contract developers and the audits should discuss their findings. And if there's any issues, repeat the steps, repeat all of these steps again after changes are made. So this audit process and making sure your contracts are secure is a long process. And then afterwards, an auditor will finally write you a report with all security vulnerabilities and everything that they've found in your contracts. Typically, you'll organize reports in a chart that'll look something like this. You'll label issues that have a high chance of happening and have a high impact as critical, things that have a high impact, but a low likelihood as medium, and etc. I'm also going to leave some examples to audits that have been done in the past so that you can take a look at them and you can see what a full audit looks like on certain code. We'll be looking at Open Zeppelin, Sigma Prime, and Trail of Bits because these are three of what I think are some of the best auditors in the space. Now in the GitHub repo, we also have a ton of other tools that you can use, MythX, Mythroll, Ethers Play, and Consensus Security Tools. If you want to learn more about security and auditing, I highly recommend that after this course, you play the Ethernaut game and Damn Vulnerable DeFi. These are two games that will teach you a ton about security and will test the chops and will test everything that you've learned in this course. There's also a couple of security focused blogs that I really like. One of them in particular is Rect.News. They keep a running list of some of the largest hacks that have ever happened in the space and then retrospectives on why those actually happened and they usually make it very entertaining as well. We have some articles in here as well. One of the best places to look at is this known attacks section where they talk about reentrancy, Oracle manipulation, front running, and a ton of other attacks that you should absolutely be aware of when writing your smart contracts. We're not gonna go over them here because they do a great job in these resources explaining them. You should also check out this article because I helped write it, so definitely check that out. And then we've got a, a list to even more sections. So. This is gonna be a living section here. So please feel free, if you find more things in the future, please feel free to make pull requests and update this repository so that other people can learn and know more about security and auditing and have contract examples on what bad code looks like and how to actually catch them. And even though this was one of our quickest sections from a video standpoint, 
This actually is going to be one of the longest sections of your career. Security is something that is always going to be on your mind, and there's always going to be new tools to help with security, and there's always going to be new things to think about. So even though we went through this very quickly, I 100% want you to pause this video and work with and try out some of the tools we tried here, and then maybe even try coming up with your own vulnerabilities as well. Ooh. And with that being said, you have just finished the last section of this massive master course on learning smart contracts, Solidity, Web3, and blockchain development. You should be incredibly proud of yourself. Congratulations. I and the Web3 community as a whole want to congratulate you for completing this absolutely monstrosity of a tutorial. You have done an amazing job to get this far and to watch me talking to you right now. And if you haven't finished the course, go back and finish it before coming here. We have learned so much on this journey. And I can say from the bottom of my soul, that I am so glad to have you in the Web3 space, the smart contract space, the blockchain space, the cryptocurrency space. We are so excited that you're here. I'm really looking forward to seeing you in the Web3, in the blockchain community. Now, a lot of people ask, well, where do I go now? I have all this newfound knowledge. I'm armed with the intelligence of the Web3 developer space. Well, I've left some links in the GitHub repository to lend you to those next steps. But the biggest thing that you can do for yourself right now is go take what you've learned and apply it somewhere. This is going to be probably the most thorough course you will ever go through in this space. And you can go tutorial to tutorial and bootcamp to bootcamp all you want, but at some point you have to make that leap and you have to dive in. And that's where the majority of the growth is gonna be anyways. So if you're here wondering where to go next, Go join a hackathon. Go start jumping onto issues on GitHub repos. Go start applying for grants. Go start applying for jobs and say, I took Patrick's massive course, here's my GitHub repo. Work on a personal project. Work on somebody else's project. Take this knowledge and apply it. The challenges that you'll run into and the challenges that you'll face, really trying to do something without me hand-holding you, is where you're gonna learn 10 times as much as what you've learned here. I've walked you as deep down this rabbit hole as I can take you. Now it's up to you to go out and do something with it. So thank you everybody who helped me create this course. Thank you for taking this course. And I'm so excited to see you in the community and see what you build and see what we can create with this technology.